Data structures and algorithms are an important aspect of every coding interview. This Algorithms and Data Structures course will teach you everything you need to prepare for placements, coding interviews, and logic building. This course walks you through multiple Java algorithms, data structure problems, and their solutions with step-by-step -step visualizations so that you're actually learning instead of blindly memorizing solutions. Dinesh Viriani created this course. He is an experienced cloud engineer at Google. Hello friends. Do you want to learn data structures and algorithms through animations and implementation so that you can crack the coding interview? Hi, my name is Dinesh Viriani and I am your instructor for this course. I have over 10 years of experience as a full stack developer. Through this course and by other means, I have helped over thousands of students just like you to improve on data structures and algorithms. So through this course, you will learn about singly linked list, doubly linked list, circular singly linked list, Arrays, Stacks, Queues, Binary Tree, Binary heaps, graphs, matrix, tries. We will also look into its implementation by coding the algorithm in IDE. And what else? You will get much more than that through this course. So friends, what are you waiting for? You can go to this playlist link provided in the description of the video where you will find all the videos that are part of this course. I update this playlist daily. So the only help I need from you is in case you like any of these videos, then please share this playlist with your friends and colleagues. And please subscribe to my channel. It will only motivate me to add more and more videos into this playlist. So friends, let's move ahead and begin this course. Thanks. Have a nice day. Hello everyone. So in this section, we'll discuss about a basic introduction to data structures. So what is data structures? So if you see, it is a way to organize the data. Now what do we mean by that is when we want to program anything and we have a huge amount of data. So we basically take the help of data structures to organize the data into the memory. So why we organize the data? It's because after organizing the data, it becomes very easy to process it. Now what do we mean by that is, if we have an organized data, we can very much efficiently access and process it. So here let's say if we take an example. Let's say if you go to a library where you find this unorganized books. Now if someone asks you that bring a book related to algorithms from this unorganized books of let's say any particular author. So now here you can see that as books are unorganized, there is a problem 
because in order to find a book related to algorithm for a particular author you need to find that book in this unorganized books so it will take a lot of time to find that book now let's say if this unorganized books are basically organized like this in a particular shelf and now if somebody asks you that go and find a particular book related to algorithms of a particular author so it would be very easy for you you will just go to that particular section where the books related to algorithms are kept and you will just find that book so here you can see that books can be related to the data and when we organize these books you can similarly relate it to the data structures where we are simply organizing the data so that it becomes easy to process it so this is the basic introduction about what is data structures now let us see what are the types of data structures so basically there are two types of data structures linear and non linear now when we talk about linear data structures they have the data elements arranged in a sequential manner and they are arranged sequentially so that each member is connected to its previous and next element and as they are connected sequentially it becomes easy to traverse them and usually the traversal is a single level now these type of data structures are very easy to implement because they are stored sequentially in the memory so some of the examples of the linear data structures are as follows so here if you see array linked list stack and queue so these are the linear data structure where the elements are stored sequentially and mostly they are single level so the other type of data structure is non linear data structure so if you see by this term non linear we mean that the data element inside this data structures are not in sequence they are basically connected to one another through different paths and as in linear data structure they were single level here they are basically stored in multi level and as they are multi level so in order to traverse each and every element in this non linear data structure take some amount of time now as they are multi level in order to traverse each and every element in this non linear data structure is bit difficult and compared to linear data structure they are not easy to implement so some of the example of non linear data structures are tree and graph so here if you see if you take an example of an array the data is arranged sequentially and it is basically in a single level so we can traverse it sequentially so it is very easy to implement but here if you see the non linear data structure are multi level so here it's an example of a tree where the topmost element is the root so here if you see this data elements are connected through multiple paths and they are in multiple levels so here we discussed about the data structures and we also discussed about the types of data structures which is linear and non linear in linear few examples are array linked list stack queue and in non linear we have tree and graph so in our upcoming videos we will discuss more about the array linked list stack queue tree and the graph data structures so i hope you like this video thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in this section we'll discuss about a basic introduction to algorithms so what is an algorithm so if you see the formal definition of algorithm an algorithm is a set of instructions to perform a task or to solve a given problem so what do we mean by set of instruction is that let's say we are given a problem so there would be a sequence of steps or there would be a set of instruction if we follow that our given problem will be solved so let's say for example we are aware of a recipe book so it is nothing but a collection of recipes in which each recipe provides a step by step instruction to prepare the food so let's say if someone asks you that provide me the recipe to prepare a tea so basically the steps inside that recipe would be the first step would be that we need to boil water second would be put tea in the teapot 
the third step would be let put that boil water into the teapot so after adding the hot water the fourth step would be that as we have hot tea so we just put that hot tea into the tea cups so the fifth step would be that do you need sugar so there is a choice if yes then put that sugar into the tea cups and if no then do nothing and the last step would be stir drink and enjoy the tea so here if you see that this recipe of preparing a tea is very much similar to an algorithm which is nothing but set of instructions which help us to solve a given problem so here let's say we take an example that we want to print the average of three numbers so we are given three numbers and we want to print the average of it now let's say you want to write an algorithm to solve this given problem so the steps you would provide would be first you will perform the sum of three numbers store that sum into a variable by name sum divide the value stored in sum by 3 and store the value into a variable average and finally print the value stored in the average so this would be the sequence of step which you would perform to print the average of three given numbers and this set of instructions is nothing but an algorithm so here if we transform this five steps into the code then here we have a method find average where we are given three numbers a b and c so we perform the sum of three numbers here we store it in a variable sum so here we are storing it here then we are dividing the sum by 3 so whatever the value is there in sum we are dividing it by 3 we are storing the value in variable average here and finally we are printing the value stored in average here so this sequence of steps is nothing but an algorithm and usually when we are given any particular problems we derive this sequence of steps and we try to implement it in particular language and write the logic around it and finally after performing all the steps properly the given problem is solved so friend this was the basic introduction to algorithms in our upcoming videos we will discuss the algorithms and data structure in great detail i hope you like this video thanks have a nice day hello everyone So in our previous section we discussed about a basic introduction to algorithms and data structure. Now in this section we'll mostly discuss about the analysis of algorithm. So what do we mean when we say analysis of algorithm? So before that we saw in our previous section that an algorithm is a set of instruction which we use to perform a task or to solve a given problem. So when we talk about analysis of algorithm this set of instructions are very much important and why they are important because in order to solve a given problem there can be several different algorithms so our analysis mostly deals in finding the best algorithm which runs fast and takes in less memory so why we actually do that because let's say we are given a problem and we have two to three algorithms to solve that problem but out of the three algorithms one algorithm let's say takes 1 second the other takes 5 seconds and the third one takes 10 seconds and similar with the memory so we usually do analysis of those three algorithms and we take that algorithm which takes the less time because if we take an algorithm which takes more time then slowly our system will degrade and we have this performance issues so let's say for example we are given a problem to find sum of first n natural numbers so the n natural numbers would be 1 2 3 4 5 6 and so on so to our method we are given a value n and we want to find its sum so let's say if we input n equal to 4 so the output we get is 10 that is 1 plus 2 
प्लस थ्री प्लस फोर सो वन प्लस टू गिव्स थ्री थ्री प्लस थ्री गिव्स सिक्स एंड सिक्स प्लस फोर गिव्स टेन सो दिस इज द सम ऑफ फर्स्ट फोर नेचुरल नंबर्स एंड सिमिलरली लेट्स एफ वी इनपुट टेन इक्वल टू फाइव देन वी गेट आउटपुट एज फिफ्टीन सो वेन वी डू वन प्लस टू वी गेट थ्री थ्री प्लस थ्री वी गेट सिक्स सिक्स प्लस फोर वी गेट टेन एंड टेन प्लस फाइव वी गेट फिफ्टीन सो दिस इज द सम ऑफ फर्स्ट फाइव नेचुरल नंबर्स नॉ लेट्स यू वॉन्ट टू सॉल्व दिस प्रॉब्लम and let's say we have these two programmers who come up with their own algorithms so ramesh comes with one of the algorithm and suresh comes with yet another algorithm so here ramesh is trying to find the sum of first and natural numbers using the mathematical formula which is n into n plus 1 by 2 so here let's say if we input n equal to 5 so it will be 5 into 5 plus 1 by 2 So five plus one is six. Six divided by two is three, and five into three gives fifteen. So this is the mathematical formula which is directly using to find the sum of first and natural numbers. And here Suresh has written one algorithm, which is what we discussed in our previous slide. That one plus two plus three plus four plus five. So what he is actually doing is he is creating a variable sum. Initializing it with zero, and is providing a for loop which starts from one. So here i equal to one, and this i will go till it's less than equal to n. And once this statement gets executed, we are simply incrementing i by one. So let's say if we input value of n as five, so the start sum will be zero. So when this for loop will start execution, i becomes one. and we check that one is less than 5 or not so it is less than 5 then we simply add 0 with 1 because some initial value is 0 so 0 plus 1 becomes 1 and 1 is assigned to sum now after this line we increment i by 1 so i becomes 2 we check whether 2 is less than 5 or not so 2 is less than 5 the value of sum is 1 so we do 1 plus 2 we get 3 we assign 3 to the sum now then we increment i by 1 so i becomes 3 we check whether 3 is less than equal to 5 or not so it is less than equal to 5 so now as the value of sum is 3 we do 3 plus 3 we get 6 we assign 6 to the sum now so sum becomes 6 then we simply increment i by 1 so i becomes 4 Four is less than equal to five, so some value is six. We add four to it, so six plus four gives ten, and ten is assigned back to sum. And then we again increment i by one, so i becomes five. We check whether five is less than equal to five or not, so i is less than or equal to five. So some value is ten. We add five, we get fifteen. We assign fifteen to sum. and then we increment i by 1 so i becomes 6 so now here you can see 6 is not less than equal to 5 so this for loop terminates and the whatever value we have in sum we simply return so the value of sum is 15 so we simply say return 15 so friends here you can see these are the two algorithms which can solve our problem of finding the sum of first and natural numbers but there is no way to figure out that which algorithm is better than other so in order to determine the best algorithm among these two algorithms we usually check two things one is the time complexity that how much time these algorithms are taking to complete and another is the space complexity that how much memory this algorithm is taking to complete so here in this section we discussed about the analysis of algorithm and its formal definition In our upcoming lecture, we'll discuss more on what is time complexity and what is space complexity. I hope you like this video. Thanks. Have a nice day. Hello, everyone. In our previous section, we discussed about the analysis of algorithm, and we also discussed that there are two complexities, 
which decides that how best is the algorithm so one is the time complexity and the other is space complexity so in this video we will discuss about the time complexity of an algorithm so what do we mean by time complexity so in the simplest terms that is the amount of time taken by an algorithm to run so let's say we have written an algorithm and we try to execute so when that algorithm finishes the amount of time taken by algorithm determines our time complexity so here usually an algorithm takes in an input and in order to process that input some amount of time is taken so an efficient algorithm will try to process the input very fast and a non efficient algorithm will take some more time to process the input so this processing of input by an algorithm helps in determining the time complexity so here in our previous example where we have these two programmers ramesh and suresh who have written these two algorithms so here the input is same for both the algorithms but here ramesh is calculating the sum of first and natural numbers using the mathematical formula which is directly putting the values inside this formula and returning the sum of first and natural numbers whereas here if you see that whatever value of n we are providing we are simply running this statement that many times so in for loop it is running from 1 to a value less than equal to n so here let's say if the value of n is very large this statement will run that many times so the time taken by this algorithm will be somewhat more than this algorithm because here we are processing an input based on a for loop where where this line is executing n number of times and here we are simply using the value of n into this formula which is directly returning as the sum of first and natural numbers so definitely this algorithm will be more efficient than this algorithm because the time taken by this algorithm will be less as compared to this and we'll also discuss more about how to calculate this time complexity in much greater detail in our upcoming videos but for time being we just analyze that this algorithm will be much better than this algorithm because here there is only one statement which is a constant statement and here we are iterating in a for loop where this line gets executed for n number of times because this loop goes from 1 to less than equal to n so let's try to execute this code in eclipse and see that how much time these algorithms are taking so friends here you can see that we have written this both the algorithms and inside our main method we are simply calling this find some method now here what we are simply doing is when we run this main method we are storing the current time in this variable then we are executing our find some method and at the last we are again calculating the current time and we are simply subtracting this time so we can get the time taken by this algorithm and if you see it gives the time in milliseconds so if we run this algorithm with a very large value of n you will find it will take almost no time because this is only a single statement where we are providing this value of n into this mathematical formula so if i run this so this is the sum of first n natural numbers of 99999 and here you can see the time taken is almost 0 milliseconds now let's say if i comment this part and i uncomment this so now if i run this algorithm again so now this algorithm will be executed so here you can see the answer is the same but the time taken is almost 2 milliseconds so here you can see that though we have this two algorithms which solves our problem we usually do the analysis of the algorithms to get the best algorithm out of the options and also friend calculating the time taken by algorithm by this is also a not good idea because this depends on machine to machine so it is just giving us a rough estimate about the time taken by these algorithms but when we do analysis of algorithm there are different mathematical tools which can help us determining the time complexity 
of an algorithm so this was all about the time complexity of an algorithm i hope you like this video thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in our previous video we discussed about the time complexity of an algorithm and we will discuss more on this in our upcoming videos so in this video we will discuss about the space complexity of an algorithm so the first thing which comes into our mind is what is space complexity so in simple terms you can say that space complexity is basically the amount of memory or space taken up by an algorithm to run so friend let's say we have this two algorithm written by two different programmers ramesh and suresh now in order to determine that which is the best possible algorithm one constraint is the time complexity which we discussed in our previous video the other is the memory required to process the input by an algorithm basically helps in determining the space complexity so usually we even measure that how much space this algorithm is taking and how much space or memory this algorithm is taking and whichever is taking the less memory we simply choose that algorithm because when we run this algorithms with a system having so many users it may happen that our memory get exhausted so we try to fit in the best possible algorithm which takes less memory so here when we calculate the time and space complexity we never go into the exact numbers there are certain mathematical tools which help us in determining the time and space complexity of an algorithm and we usually term them asymptotic analysis of an algorithm in our upcoming videos we will discuss more about the asymptotic analysis and its notations and we will also discuss that how we can use those mathematical tools to determine the time and space complexity of an algorithm i hope you have liked this video thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in our previous videos we discussed about the time complexity and space complexity of an algorithm we saw how time and space affects the performance of an algorithm but usually we don't go by the exact numbers that how much exact time an algorithm is taking or how much space in numbers an algorithm is taking so usually there are mathematical models which help us in determining the time and space complexity of an algorithm and the analysis which deals with those mathematical models we term it as asymptotic analysis so what do we mean by asymptotic analysis asymptotic analysis helps in evaluating the performance of an algorithm in terms of input size and its increase so let's say we are given an algorithm with certain input size we use this asymptotic analysis and determine the performance of an algorithm so this study also help us in determining let's say when the input size is less then how much time the algorithm is taking and if we increase the input size then how much time or space the algorithm is taking so usually when we do this asymptotic analysis we don't actually measure the actual running time of an algorithm this analysis simply help us in determining that how time and space taken up by algorithm increases with the input size so as we already discussed that if the input size to an algorithm is less then less time and space will be required by the algorithm to process that input and if we slowly increase the size of the input usually the time and space will also increase so this asymptotic analysis help us in determining that increase and also when we perform this analysis there are certain notations which we need to know to perform the asymptotic analysis so we'll discuss about the asymptotic notations in our upcoming videos so in this video we simply discuss about the a basic introduction to asymptotic analysis in our upcoming video we'll discuss about the asymptotic notations and the types of asymptotic notations i hope you like this video thanks have a nice day hello everyone in our previous video we discussed about the asymptotic analysis and we also discussed about its basic introduction 
that asymptotic analysis help us in determining the runtime complexity and space complexity of a given algorithm so usually this asymptotic analysis is being done by asymptotic notations so what do we mean by asymptotic notations so if we see the definition of it asymptotic notations are the mathematical tools used to describe the running time of an algorithm in terms of its input size so here we will discuss more on this mathematical tools that what are those and how it helps in determining the running time of an algorithm so in order to understand about this asymptotic notations we'll take an example Let's say you go to a car showroom where you want to purchase this car. So the mostly you will look into the design of the car, and to the salesman you will ask one most important question: is what is the performance of car in one liter of petrol? That how much this car travels in one liter of petrol? So basically, the salesman will never give you an exact answer. He will simply give you the numbers based on certain conditions the car is running. so he will simply tell you that if you are running this car on highway where the traffic is very minimum this car can give you a mileage of 25 kilometers per liter and if you are running it in a city where the traffic is max it will give you 15 kilometers per liter and let's say if you are running for some amount of time in city and then in highway which means you are encountering an average traffic so it will give you around 20 kilometers per liter so these are the three answers which salesman might give you when you ask about the performance of car in 1 liter of petrol so when we talk about an algorithm this asymptotic notations give us this rough idea that how an algorithm will be performing in certain situations so here the asymptotic notations help us in determining the best case average case and the worst case so you can simply relate this analogy to these conditions that best case would be that if you are driving on a highway the average case would be that you are driving in both city and highway and the worst case would be that you are simply driving in the city so this is how asymptotic notations provide us an in depth description about the running time of an algorithm in terms of its input size So in our upcoming videos we'll discuss that what are the asymptotic notation types and how we can use those types to determine the running time of an algorithm in terms of its input size. I hope you like this video. Thanks have a nice day. Hello everyone. So in our previous video we discussed about asymptotic notations and we also discussed that how asymptotic notations help us in determining the running time of an algorithm in terms of its input size and we also discussed that asymptotic notations help us in determining the best case average case and the worst case and we also saw an example of an car that how the performance of car in 1 liter of petrol differs in different situations so similar analogy is being performed on the algorithms where we determine the best case average case and the worst case so there are types of asymptotic notations which determine these three cases so here you can see that there are three notations for performing the running time analysis of an algorithm the first notation is the omega notation which is being denoted by omega symbol the second is the big o notation and the third one is the theta notation so let's discuss about the omega notation first so if we see the definition of omega notation so this notation basically expresses the lower bound of an algorithm's running time now what do we mean by the lower bound of an algorithm's running time so basically lower bound means that for any given input size this notation determines the best amount of time an algorithm can take to complete so by best amount of time we mean the lower time so therefore we denote it by lower bound and this determines the best case 
of an algorithm because omega notation provides us the best amount of time an algorithm can take to complete so as you already discussed that this is the best case analysis of an algorithm so what do you mean by best case let's say for example if you have written certain algorithm and if we say that algorithm takes 100 second as the best amount of time so what do you mean by that is that 100 seconds will be the lower bound of that algorithm and the algorithm can take more than 100 seconds to complete but it will not take less than 100 seconds to complete so the best case analysis takes the lower time and provides us with the information that a particular algorithm will take minimum let's say 100 seconds but will not take less than 100 seconds it can take more than 100 seconds but as the lower bound is 100 seconds it will be the best case for that algorithm so this notation is very least used because we are not interested in finding the best amount of time algorithm can take but this notation basically provides an information that what's the minimum resources we need to run this algorithm the other notation is big o notation so this notation expresses the upper bound of an algorithm's running time now what do you mean by upper bound upper bound means that for any given input size into an algorithm this notation determines the longest amount of time the algorithm may take to complete now what do we actually mean by the longest amount of time let's say for example that if we say that certain algorithm takes 100 second as the longest amount of time so 100 second will be the upper bound of that algorithm in big o notation the algorithm may take less than 100 second but it will not take more than 100 seconds so this is very opposite of the omega notation so when we say that 100 second is the longest amount of time that algorithm may take to complete then that would be the upper bound the algorithm may take 90 seconds 80 seconds but it won't take more than 100 seconds so this notation is mostly used because we are very much interested in finding the maximum amount of time the algorithm may take to complete so that we can optimize that algorithm to whichever time we want so here the big o notation basically provides us the worst case analysis of an algorithm by worst case we mean that it determines the longest amount of time the algorithm may take to complete moving ahead the third notation is the theta notation now this notation basically expresses both upper bound and the lower bound of an algorithm's running time so what do we mean by both upper bound and lower bound it means that for any given input size to an algorithm this determines the average amount of time so basically the average case analysis is being determined by the theta notation so for example if we say that certain algorithm takes 100 seconds for the first run 120 seconds for the second run and 110 seconds for the third run and so on so theta notation gives an average of running time of that algorithm so it basically determines the average of the upper bound and the lower bound of an algorithm's running time so this notation is also very loosely used because there are very rare use cases where we actually determine the average time taken by algorithm to complete so when in this video we discussed about the three asymptotic notations which are being used to determine the running time of an algorithm and these three notation also determines the best case the average case and the worst case analysis of an algorithm i hope you have liked this video thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in our previous video we discussed about the best average and the worst case analysis of an algorithm and we also discussed about the three notation and we discussed that big o notation is the mostly used notation in analysis of the time and space complexity so in this video we'll look into the analysis of time complexity in big o notation and we'll also see certain rules in computing the big o notation so in our previous videos we discussed that big o notation provides us an upper bound of an algorithm's running time by upper bound we mean the longest amount of time an algorithm can take to complete 
सो लेट्स सी सम रूल्स एंड एजम्पन्स वेन कंप्यूटिंग द रनिंग टाइम ऑफ एन एल्गोरिथम यूजिंग बिग ऑफ नोटेशन सो लेट्स सी वी आर गिवन अ मशीन सो वी एज्यूम दैट इट्स अ सिंगल प्रोसेसर मशीन सो लेट्स सी द एल्गोरिथम वी एव रोड वी आर रनिंग इट ऑन द सिंगल प्रोसेसर एंड दिस प्रोसेसर इज एग्जीक्यूटिंग द एल्गोरिथम सिक्वेंशियली ना इन एन एल्गोरिथम इफ यू सी एन ए असाइनमेंट ऑपरेशन देन वी सिंपली एज्यूम दैट इट कैन टेक वन यूनिट ऑफ टाइम सो दिस वन यूनिट ऑफ टाइम कैन बी एनी थिंग लेट से वन सेकेंड वन मिली सेकेंड वन नैनो सेकेंड वी सिंपली टर्म इट एज वन यूनिट ऑफ टाइम सो इफ यू इंकाउंटर समथिंग लाइक दिस सो वी प्रिटी मच एज्यूम दैट इट मे टेक वन यूनिट ऑफ टाइम If we encounter return statement, we take it as one unit of time. So something like this will be taken as one unit of time. If we encounter arithmetical operation, we take it as one unit of time. So something like x plus y, x minus y, x divided by y, x multiplied by y, and many other operations. we simply take it as one unit of time that these operation will require a single unit of time if we encounter any logical operation we simply take it as one unit of time so something like x and y x or y negation of x negation of y x or operation so everything which deals with logical operation takes one unit of time and basically other small and single operation we simply take it as one unit of time now as we are computing the big o notation of an algorithm based on the input size so we basically assume that we have a very large input size so let's say the time taken by algorithm comes out to be n square plus 3n plus 1 so here n is nothing but the input size so here you can see that time is proportional to n square plus 3n plus 1 so which is a polynomial equation so here what we actually do that in order to calculate the big o of this polynomial equation we assume that we have taken n as very large so if n is very large we can simply drop the lower order terms so the lower order terms would be 3n and 1 because n square contributes more and determining the time taken by algorithm to run so we simply drop this lower order terms and to n square we denote as o of n square which is nothing but denoting it in the form of big o notation we simply say the time complexity comes out to be o of n square so similarly there is one more rule we drop the constant multipliers so for example let's say the time taken by an algorithm comes out to be 3n square plus 6n plus 1 where n is the input size so here you can see that 6n plus 1 is usually dropped because they are lower order terms as we are taking n as very large but here you can see that it also contain the constant multipliers like 3 6 so usually as n is very large we also drop the constant multipliers so here after dropping the lower order terms like 6n and 1 we also drop this 3 and we simply denote it by o of n square so we deduce the time complexity in big o notation by following this simple rules so friends in our upcoming lectures we will apply these rules and we will compute the time complexity of few of the programs so that calculation of vigo notation becomes more clear to you i hope you like this video thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in our previous video we discussed about the rules related to vigo notation so now let's apply those rules and calculate the time complexity of a constant algorithm so here you can see So let's say we are given 
this piece of code where we are getting two integers we are doing the sum of it and we are returning the result so here you can see that these are the line numbers here where second and third line are the statements which get executed and here is a simple table provided with the line number and the operations getting performed on each line and the unit of time taken by each line so here we start with the line number 2 so here we are simply taking in two integers doing its sum and assigning it to the integer variable result so if we apply the rules which we discussed in our previous video so here first we are accessing x so it will be one operation then we are accessing y so it will be the other operation then we are doing the sum of it so this will be one more operation and then we are assigning it to the result so this will be one more operation so here we are simply performing four operations and we also discussed in our previous video that these four operation will take four unit of time because we are providing one unit of time to assignment to arithmetic operation if you are accessing any variables so like that so line number 2 takes four unit of time to execute this statement now let's see for the line number 3 here we are accessing the result so it will be one operation and then we are returning the result so it would be the other operation so there are total two operations and we know that when we are accessing a variable and when we are returning we provide one unit of time to one operation so total it will take two unit of time and when we take the total time taken by this piece of code it will be 4 plus 2 which is 6 and usually if we see 6 is nothing but a constant because here whatever value you take of x and y it will always take a constant amount of time which is 6 so your time taken is nearly equal to a constant amount of time so similarly if we see this piece of code let's say we are passing in an array and we are passing in an index and we want to simply get the value stored at that particular index so here you can see that accessing a value of an array from a particular index takes in a constant amount of time so the time taken by this piece of code will be constant now irrespective of how many elements are there in this array let's say if array has 1 lakh element still it will take the constant amount of time and if the array has 1 element still it will take the same amount of time so therefore this is a constant algorithm so we simply denote the time complexity of such algorithm as o of 1 because this is the constant and usually in big o terms we denote the constant by O of one, and if you see the graph of this constant algorithm, so here you can see the x-axis denotes the volume of data. So here you can think of it as the number of elements in this array, and the y-axis denotes the execution time, which is the time taken. So here we already discussed that irrespective of number of elements or the volume of data inside this array. the time taken will be always constant so we simply denote it as constant algorithm which takes constant amount of time even if the volume of data increases so for in this video we discussed that how we can calculate the big o notation of a constant algorithm i hope you like this video thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in our previous video we discussed that how we can calculate the time complexity of a constant algorithm so in this video we will now discuss how we can calculate the time complexity of a linear algorithm so here let's say we are given this algorithm and this algorithm basically finds some of the first and natural numbers which we also discussed in our previous videos so here we are given a value n so let's say for example if we take value of n as 3 so we want to find the sum of first three natural numbers so we start the sum with a value 0 we then apply a for loop 
where i is equal to 1 and we provide condition that i should be less than equal to 3 so at the first step value of i is 1 so 1 is less than equal to 3 so this condition comes out to be true so in the for loop we do 0 plus 1 and assign 1 to the sum and after this statement gets executed we do i plus plus so now i becomes 2 then we check whether 2 is less than equal to 3 or not so here 2 is less than 3 so then we do 1 plus 2 because value of i is 2 which gives 3 and we assign 3 to the sum now we again increment i by 1 so i becomes 3 and 3 is less than or equal to 3 so now we do sum of 3 plus 3 which is 6 and we assign it to the sum and then we increment i by 1 so i becomes 4 and we check this condition so 4 is not less than equal to 3 therefore this condition comes out to be false and this for loop terminates and we return the sum as 6 so here let's calculate the time complexity of this algorithm so here we have provided a table where we have marked the line numbers which actually gets executed and takes some amount of time so if we start with line number 2 so here you can see that we are creating an integer variable sum and assigning it a value 0 so this will only take one step so the operation will be only 1 and the unit of time would be 1 so now we'll count the operations at line number 3 so here you can see in the for loop we are creating an integer variable i with a value 1 so this would be one operation now here you can see that we are accessing n so this would be one operation we are accessing value i this would be the second operation and then we are comparing them so this would be our third operation so overall for one execution of this for loop this take three operations so we need to calculate how many iterations this for loop will make so that depends on this incrementation here so let's say if value of n is 3 so when i was 1 it took three operations then we incremented i to 2 so when i became 2 it took three more operations and then we incremented i by 1 so when i became 3 it took three more operations and then we again incremented i so i became 4 and here you can see that it took three more operations just to verify that i is less than equal to n or not so in total this statement executed four times we provided a value 3 and it executed four times so therefore when we have provided value n this will get executed n plus one times and as there are three operations in each step so the total operation would be 3 into n plus 1 so then we move to i plus plus so in i plus plus what we actually do we access value i we increment it by 1 and then we again assign it back to i so accessing i takes one operation incrementing it by 1 and assigning it back to i takes three operations so for the one iteration of this for loop this take three operations so now we simply count that how many times this i plus plus will get executed so let's say if we take n equal to 3 the first time it executed it made i plus plus and i became 2 then we executed to make i 2 plus 1 which was 3 and finally we made it 3 plus 1 which is 4 so here you can see that for n equal to 3 this got executed 3 times so if we take value of n this will execute n times and as this take 3 operations per iteration for n times it will take 3n operations so here we are simply adding 1 to 3 into n plus 3 into 1 which is 3 and then we are doing plus 3n so it will become something like this 1 plus 3n plus 3 plus 3n so the total unit of time it will take is 3n plus 3n 6n 1 plus 3 is 4 so 6n plus 4 so now we will see the time taken by the step 4 so here we are accessing i which is one operation we are accessing sum which is two operations we are doing addition which is three operation and we are assigning it back to sum which is four operations 
so for one iteration of this for loop it will take four operations and we know that this for loop will execute n times because i is traveling from 1 to n so this line will get executed n times so here in total it takes four operations multiplied by n so the total unit of time it will be 4n so now we'll calculate the time taken by line number 6 which is accessing sum and then returning the sum which is 1 plus 1 so total time would be 2 so if we add this unit times we get the total time would be 1 plus 6n plus 4 plus 4n plus 2 which will be equal to 10n plus 7 unit times and also in our previous video we discussed that while calculating the big O notation we usually ignore the lower order terms because we assume that value of n is very large so after ignoring the lower order terms and we also discussed that we ignore the constant multipliers so here we ignore 10 also so the time complexity comes out to be O of n which means that time is directly proportional to the value n which is nothing but the input size so if we plot the graph of the execution time on the y-axis and the volume of data which is n on the x-axis we find that time is proportional to n so here you can see that if we plot this graph it will come in a straight line because the execution time is proportional to the number of input size which is nothing but our volume of data so as volume of data will increase the time taken by this algorithm will increase so this comes out to be a straight line so this is how we denote the time complexity of o of n which is a linear algorithm i hope you have liked this video thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in our previous video we discussed that how we can calculate the time complexity of a linear algorithm so in this video we will discuss that how we can calculate the time complexity of a polynomial algorithm so here we are given an algorithm and we are also given an integer n now what we are doing in this method is we have provided a for loop which goes from i equal to 1 to less than equal to n and it gets incremented by 1 for each iteration of this for loop and for each iteration of the outer for loop we have again provided a for loop which starts from j equal to 1 and goes till j is less than equal to n and it also gets incremented by j plus plus and inside this inner for loop we are simply printing the value of i and j on the console and after this inner for loop gets executed we are printing end of inner loop and after this outer for loop gets executed completely we are printing end of outer loop so here you can see if we run this code let's say for value n equal to 3 so here you can see that this get printed on the console so in our previous video we also discussed that this outer for loop will go from i equal to 1 to i less than equal to n which is 3 so it will get executed three times the outer for loop and for its each execution the inner for loop will also get executed exactly three times because j is also starting from one and j is also going till j is less than equal to three so here you can see that what it gets printed on the console so for i equal to one inner for loop gets executed n times so here you can see i equal to 1, i equal to 1 and i equal to 1. So for i equal to 1, the inner for loop will get executed n times where j will go from 1 to 3. So here you can see j equal to 1, j equal to 2 and j equal to 3. And after inner for loop gets executed, end of inner loop gets printed which is here. And once it gets finished, the execution point reaches here, does increment of i by 1. So i becomes 2. And we know that 2 is less than 3. So therefore again the inner for loop will execute from j equal to 1 to j is less than equal to n. And this will get printed 3 times because 
the inner for loop will get executed n times. So for i equal to 2, the inner for loop gets executed from j equal to 1 to 3. Then we print end of inner loop here. And then again, i gets incremented to 3. And for i equal to 3, the inner for loop will again get executed 3 times. And then here, we print end of inner loop. And then we again increment i by 1, so i becomes 4. And 4 is not less than equal to n. So therefore the condition breaks. And finally we print end of outer loop. So here you can see that for each iteration of outer for loop, inner for loop gets executed that many number of times from j equal to 1 to j is less than equal to n. So here in this example as we have taken value of n as 3. So you can simply think that outer for loop gets executed 3 times. An inner for loop will get executed 3 into 3 times, which is 9. So here you can see that this statement gets printed 9 times. For each value of i, inner for loop gets executed from 1, 2, 3. For i equal to 2, it gets executed 1, 2, 3. For i equal to 3, it gets executed 1, 2, 3. So usually this statement at line number 4 gets executed n square times. So let's see how many operations are getting performed on each line. So for line number 2, so in our previous video we already discussed that how many times this for loop will execute. So this assignment integer i equal to 1 will get executed exactly one time. We are accessing i, we are accessing n and then we are comparing. So this will get executed exactly n plus 1 times because so when we are providing value of n as 3, so when i becomes 4, this condition will comes out to be false. So therefore, we provided value n and this will get executed exactly n plus 1 times. This is the same stuff which we discussed in our previous video. And then this i plus plus will also get executed 3 n times. So this for loop will execute n times so it will take 3 n times. And if we do the sum of it, it will take 6n plus 4 unit times. Now let's see about the operation taken by the inner for loop. So here you can see the condition are exactly same. So here we know that it will take 6n plus 4 unit time the inner for loop because j is also getting started from 1 and it will also go till j is less than equal to n and we are simply doing j plus plus. So here line number 4 will get executed 6n plus 4 unit of time but this for loop will also get executed multiple times based on the execution of outer for loop so if outer for loop runs n times the inner for loop will run n times of the outer for loop so which will give us 6 n square plus 4 n unit time of execution moving ahead at line number 4 we are accessing i we are accessing j and we are printing so there are total 3 operations and how many times it will get executed? You can see for value of n equals to 3, it got executed 3 square times which is 9. So here the total operations would be n square times 3 which will give us 3n square. The line number 6 which is the end of inner loop will get exactly printed n times. So here if n was 3, it printed 3 times. And for n times it will get printed n into 1 times which takes n unit of time. And the line number 8 will get executed exactly one time. So if we add all the unit times we get the total time would be 6n plus 4 plus 6n square plus 4n plus 3n square plus n plus 1. And if we add the n square terms and n terms and then the constant it will become 9n square plus 11n plus 5. So here as we assume that we take value of n to be very large, we ignore the lower order terms and we also ignore the constant multipliers. So we remove 9 also. So if you want to represent the time complexity of this algorithm, it would be O of n square because rate of increase of time is getting directly proportional to n square. And if we plot the graph with time versus the input size, it will give us 
a parabolic curve where execution time will increase by n square so here you can see that as volume of data will increase the execution time will increase n square time because time is directly proportional to n square so this is the graph for a polynomial algorithm so here you can see that this is a really bad algorithm because execution time is drastically increasing with the input size so usually we try to avoid the nested for loops because for each outer for loop inner for loop gets executed that many number of times so which you can see by the operation at line number 3 so here you can see based on the condition provided here inner for loop gets executed n times the outer for loop and also friends similarly let's say if we had one more for loop inside the second for loop this would have gone to n cube times based on if the condition here provided are same so it would have taken o of n cube time so which is also a polynomial algorithm and which is also really bad so here in this video we discussed about that how we can calculate the time complexity of a polynomial algorithm i hope you like this video thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in this section we will discuss about the array data structure we'll see a basic introduction to array and then we will discuss that how we can create an array initialize an array and assign some values to an array so friends what is an array so here let's take an example of a chocolate box so you must have seen a chocolate box having these chocolates separated by the partitions and the containers so when we actually see it for the first time we get few things in our mind the number one is we can tell that it's a collection of chocolates or a box of chocolates and all the partitions which are holding this chocolate you can see they are adjacent or we can say they are contiguous because they are very next to each other and here you can also see that each partition has two neighbors except the first and the last one for example the second partition has one neighbor to its left and one neighbor to its right but the first and the last one they have only one neighbor for the first it is the right and for the last it is the left and when we receive this pack of chocolates the size of this box is fixed and cannot be modified so any chocolate making company will first create this box and based on how many chocolate they want to add into this box they will create that many partition and once this box is created it cannot be modified and also we saw that these partitions are very adjacent to each other so therefore they are also indexed and can be determined by its position so looking at the box we can simply number a position and simply can ask that okay i need the third chocolate or fourth chocolate because we know that this chocolates are very adjacent and they are inherently indexed so friends similar analogy can be applied over an array so here you can see that this is an array having four elements so we can say it is a collection of data elements of a particular type and here you can see that all the partitions which are holding this data have contiguous memory locations so they are very next to each other we can also see that those partitions have two neighbors except the first and the last one and we can also deduce that once we create an array we need to provide a size so when we provide a size we are given with an array and once it is created we cannot modify it so if you want a dynamic array there is some complex logic behind it which we will discuss in our upcoming videos so for now you can have an understanding that an array can hold some data elements and the size to hold the data elements is fixed and we cannot modify it and here you can see that these partitions have contiguous memory locations so therefore each partition comes with an index so for an array of four elements usually the index starts with 0 and ends with 
नंबर ऑफ एलिमेंट्स इन सेट दिस एरे माइनस वन सो विच इज द लेंथ ऑफ द एरे माइनस वन सो वेन एवर वी क्रिएट एन एरे बेसिकली वी हैव ए इंडेक्स एसोसिएटेड विथ इट विच स्टार्ट फ्रॉम जीरो एंड फॉर वन डायमेंशनल एरे इट एंड्स विथ द कंप्लीट लेंथ ऑफ दिस एरे माइनस वन सो लेट्स ए लेंथ ऑफ एरे इज फोर बिकॉज वी हैव फोर एलिमेंट्स सो द लास्ट इंडेक्स वुड बी लेंथ माइनस वन विच इज फोर माइनस वन थ्री सो फ्रेंड दिस वॉज द बेसिक इंट्रोडक्शन टू एन एरे डेटा स्ट्रक्चर दैट हाउ इट होल्ड्स द एलिमेंट एंड हाउ दे आर वेरी मच नेक्स्ट टू इच अदर एंड बेसिकली दे आर इंडेक्सड सो दिस इंडेक्सिंग ऑफ एरे ऑल्सो हेल्प अस इन एक्सेसिंग द वैल्यू इन साइट दैट कंटेनर सो वी कैन सिंपली डू एरे ऑफ थ्री एंड वी विल गेट द वैल्यू स्टोर्ड एट द थर्ड इंडेक्स सो दिस इज ऑल्सो वन ऑफ द एडवांटेज ऑफ हैविंग द इंडेक्स डेटा स्ट्रक्चर सो फ्रेन इन दिस वीडियो वी सॉ अ बेसिक इंट्रोडक्शन टू एन एरे डेटा स्ट्रक्चर इन अवर अपकमिंग वीडियो वी विल सी दैट हाउ वी कैन क्रिएट एन एरे इनिशलाइज एन एरे एंड एड वैल्यूज टू एन एरे आई होप यू लाइक दिस वीडियो थैंक्स एव अइस डे हेलो एवरी वन सो इन अवर प्रीवियस वीडियो वी डिस्कस्ड अबाउट अ बेसिक इंट्रोडक्शन टू एन एरे डेटा स्ट्रक्चर सो इन दिस वीडियो वी विल डिस्कस दैट हाउ वी कैन परफॉर्म डिक्लेरेशन एंड इनिशलाइजेशन ऑफ एन एरे सो हियर वेन वी से डिक्लेरेशन ऑफ एन एरे वील फर्स्ट डिस्कस अबाउट द वन डायमेंशनल एरे सो द वन डायमेंशनल एरे कैन बी डिक्लेयर वाई सिंटेक्स वी कैन प्रोवाइड अ डेटा टाइप देन वी कैन प्रोवाइड द वेरिएबल नेम एंड देन वी सिंपली प्रोवाइड द स्क्वायर ब्रैकेट्स सो दैट वी कैन कम टू नो दैट दिस इज एन एरे सो दिस इज द वन वे द अदर वे इज वी कैन प्रोवाइड एनी डेटा टाइप एंड अलॉन्ग विद दैट वी प्रोवाइड दिस स्क्वायर ब्रैकेट्स एंड देन कम्स अवर वेरिएबल नेम so for example let's say if you want to declare an integer array so we can simply provide int and then we can provide our own customized variable name so here i have just given it as my array and then the square brackets and similarly we can do something like this that int square brackets and then we provide the variable name so here when we declare an array in java we can use both these syntaxes the most preferred use syntax is the second one because we can simply deduce that this is an array of integer data type by just looking at the int and the square brackets so this is the mostly used syntax to declare an array moving ahead now let's see how we can initialize an array so by initialization we mean that when we initialize an array we are simply providing a memory to the array elements so that now array can store the collection of data into it so the syntax for the one dimensional array is something like once we declare an array what we saw in our previous slide in the next step we can do we can give the variable name and we can use the new operator to initialize an array and then we need to provide the data type along with a size so we also discussed that when we create an array we need to provide a size because once the array is initialized we cannot modify the size so by this statement we are actually telling that provide us an array of this particular data type whose size is whatever the value you have provided here so once this line get executed we are provided with an array of fixed size and certain memory is associated with this data type so that now we can use this array and store our data elements so for example we can write something as as we have declared my array in our previous slide we can say my array equal to new the data type and in the square bracket we can provide the size so this will initialize an array of size 5 so we can add five element inside this array and also friend usually we perform the declaration and initialization of an array in one go or in one step 
so the syntax for that is we can just combine the declaration and initialization in one step as we simply give the data type then square brackets then variable name equal to new data type for which we want to create an array and then the size and we can also use this syntax data type the variable name with the square brackets and then we can simply provide new data type and the size associated with it so for example we can simply create an integer array something like this so here using new operator this will create an integer array of size 5 so that we can store five integers inside this array so this is the other syntax so the most preferred syntax is the first one so just by looking at the statement we can come to know that this is an integer array because usually the square brackets are alongside with the data type and also friend there is one more way to declare and initialize an array along with its data elements is we can write integer square brackets variable name and we can simply say curly brackets and we can simply provide the actual data along with it so here you can see that if we know that what data we want to store inside is an array beforehand then we can simply use this syntax so it will directly initialize this array with proper values such as 5 4 3 2 6 at index 0 1 2 3 and 4 and here you can see it deduces the size by counting the number of elements we have provided inside this curly bracket so here as we have stored five elements this integer array will now have a size of 5 so friends in this video we saw that how we can declare and initialize an array with various syntaxes in our upcoming video we will discuss that how we can add an element or update an element inside this array using the index position i hope you like this video thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in our previous video we discussed about how we can declare and initialize an array so in this video we'll go a step ahead that after declaration and initialization of an array we will see how we can add or update the elements in an array so friends here you can see let's say we have this method as array demo having few statements so when we execute this statements in java we will see what happens to this array data structure so when we call array demo method so here you can see at the first line what we are doing is we are declaring and initializing an array of integer type having a size of 5 so when this line will get executed you will see that we have this variable name my array which is referencing an array of size 5 so you can see 5 partitions here and this array will also have a proper index starting from 0 and ending at length minus 1 which is 5 minus 1 which gives 4 so here you can see this array object is created inside the heap memory and using my array we have this reference which is pointing to this object so you can consider this reference as a remote control where using my array we can simply control this array inside the memory so using this variable and the indexes we have we can simply store or update the element inside this array so how we can do that let's see its demonstration so let's say at the first position we want to store our integer having value as 5 so how we can store that that we have this variable name and when we do square brackets and we provide this index so we are telling to this array via this remote control that please add 5 to index 0 
so inside this partition here you will get a value as 5 and also friend before that when we initialize or create an array using this new operator you can see that initial values of the integer came out to be 0 so when we initialize an array this object doesn't know that what value this array could hold so it simply assigns the default value so for integer the default value is 0 and similarly let's say for other types such as float double it would be 0, 0.0 for long it will be 0 for boolean it will be false and for a proper object it will be a null value because those are the default values for primitive and non-primitive data types so here after giving the value 5 at index 0 we can access the index 1 via this syntax and we can assign the value 1 so it would look something like this that 1 is being stored here and similarly we can store it at index 2 value 2 at index 3 value 10 at index 4 and now friends you can see that we have assigned all the values inside all the containers now let's say if you want to update any value so we can simply access it a normal way and assign a new value so here at this line we have added 8 at index 2 here so if we again call this with a different value so 9 will override this value and 8 will be gone and 9 will be added splits so this is just an update to an array and friends at the last step what we are doing is so here you can see that this integer array is of size 5 and we know that index starts from 0 so the last index would be 5 minus 1 which would be 4 and now friends here what we are doing is let's say if we access my array and do something like this 5 so here you can see the fifth index is not there and if we try to assign a value 7 to it so once this line get executed at runtime you will get this exception in java which says that array index out of bounds exception and it also gives a message saying index 5 out of bounds for length 5 which means that the length of this array is 5 which is the size and index 5 is basically out of bounds because in an array index starts from 0 so the last index would be the length minus 1 which is 4 so it simply says that index 5 is out of bounds for length 5 so this is the most common exception which we actually get when we try to work with an array data structure because sometimes it might happen that we wrongly access an index which is not present inside an array so friend this was all about adding or updating elements in an array now let's go to eclipse and see the demonstration of this code i hope you like this video thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in our previous video we discussed about how we can create initialize an array and we also discussed that how we can add or update elements inside an array so in this video we will see the demonstration and working of the code which we discussed in our previous video so here we have this class array util and which has one utility method which prints the array on the console so this method we will be discussing in our upcoming videos in great detail so for timing just think that this will print the contents of an array so we have this method array demo so let's see the working of that code which we discussed in our previous video so at the first step what we did was we created an integer array we gave it a name as my array so we can provide any name and let's say we provide a size as 5 so friends here you can see that this will actually create an array which would be of integer type and the values this array will hold 
will be the default values and these default values will be decided based on the data type and here okay let's say if we call array demo method so when this main method will run this line will get executed and this array will be created with default values so let's say if i call print array here and we pass my array to it so here this method will be called and the contents of this array will be printed so if i run the main method now so here you can see it printed 0000000 so because we created an array of size 5 5 times 0 was printed because this integer has default value of 0 so for each partition this array had it stored the value 0 into it so friends in our previous video we also discussed that we have this my array which will be acting as our remote control to modify the array object inside the memory so what we can do is let's say we want to add a value of 5 at index 0 so this would be the syntax and similarly let's say i fill all the values for each and every index so 0 1 2 3 and 4 and let's say i give a different value 5 1 8 2 and 10 and if i call the print error method here after assigning this few values and if i run the code now you can see all the default values which were getting printed as 0 0 0 0 0 Have been updated by five one eight two ten, and let's say after assigning a value eight at index two, which is here, what we can do is let's say I want to update this, and I want to update it by nine. So I can do simply like this, and if I run the code now again, so you can see. that only at index 2 the value was updated from 8 to 9 and also friend let's say if we try to access an index which is not in range of this size so let's say if we try to access an index which is not present inside the array let's say 5 and if we give a value at let's say 26 and if i run the code now so friend here you can see that we got an exception saying array index out of bounds exception giving an index 5 saying that 5 is out of bounds for this array so here if you see when we do my array so the index starts from 0 and ends at size minus 1 which is 4 so here you can see that this array will go from 0 1 2 3 4 so these are the indexes which we are using it here to access a particular container so that we can store these values so this array data structure inherently has this one variable by name length so if you want to know that what is the length of any particular array we can simply use this value my array dot length so let's say if i print this on the console and if i run the code now so here you can see it printed the length of this array as 5 because we have created the integer array of length 
So usually when we get an array and if we want to just know what is the length of that array, we can simply use this variable. We can give the variable name dot length and we'll get the length of that array. And similarly, let's say if you want to access the last element of an array. So what we can do is we can simply say my array and here you can see the last index is actually length minus 1 which is 4 so here we need to give the value as my array dot length minus 1 so here my array dot length will give value as 5 and when we do minus 1 we give we can get the last index of this array and in order to access that element we need to provide the name of the array and then square brackets and inside the square brackets we can provide the actual index for which we want to access a particular value so if I run the code now you can see that it printed 10 because 10 is the value hold by the last index of this array and also friends similar to this what we can do is we can also create an array something like like this where we actually know what this array could hold so we can simply give the values as 5 1 8 and let's say 10 so this array will hold these values at the respective index starting from 0, 1, 2, 3. So the length of this array is 4 and the index goes from 0 to 3. So if I print this array now and if I run the code you can see it printed 5, 1, 8, 10 which are the elements present inside this array. So friend, in this video we saw few operations related to an array that how we can create an array and how we can add or update values inside this array. I hope you like this video. Thanks, have a nice day. Hello everyone. So friend, in this lecture we will discuss how to print elements of an array in Java. So here most of you know how to print elements of an array in Java. The only reason we are discussing this algorithm here is because in our upcoming lectures this algorithm will be mostly used. So let's see the demonstration of algorithm by an animation. So friends here you can see that we have this public method by name print array which takes in an array and to this array will iterate its element one by one using the for loop and will print its content on the console. So let's see the demonstration of this algorithm. So let's suppose we call the print array method by passing in an array. So let's say we pass this array having five elements as 5, 1, 9, 2 and 10. Moving ahead. So in the first step what we do is we take out the length of an array and store it in an integer variable n. So here if you see as the array holds 5 elements so when we will do array dot length the value 5 will be stored in n. So it would look something like this. The value of n is 5. Moving ahead. Now friends in order to print each and every element of an array we need to iterate this array from the first index to the last index and as we know that the index of array starts from 0 so the value of i will be 0 because this is our starting point and we'll iterate in a for loop till i is less than n so here if you see i will start from 0 and it should go to 4 so we want this loop to go from i0 to i4 so therefore we have provided this condition that i should be less than n 
it means for the last index 4 should be less than 5 because when i will be equal to 5 then we know that i has crossed the boundaries of this array therefore we'll get an exception so we'll iterate till i is less than n so here we'll start with i equal to 0 so if we see in this array then i is pointing to the 0th index moving ahead now in order to print the elements on the console we are doing system dot out dot print and in order to access the value at this particular index we do array then we provide this square brackets and inside that we provide the index for which we want the value so on the console it will print 5 because i is pointing to the 0th index and array of 0 will give value as 5 moving ahead now we will increment i by 1 so i becomes 1 and now i will point to the index 1 and here we will check that whether 1 is less than 5 or not so this boolean condition comes out to be true so the for loop executes and then we will simply print the value at first index which is 1 so it would look something like this moving ahead we will now increment the value of i by 1 so i will become 2 and it will point to the second index we will simply print the value at the second index which is 9 so it would look something like this moving ahead we will again increment the value of i by 1 so i will become 3 and it will point to the third index we will print the value at the third index which is 2 so it would look something like this moving ahead will again increment the value of i by 1 so i becomes 4 and it will point to the fourth index now and we know that 4 is less than 5 therefore the condition in for loop comes out to be true and then we'll print the value as index 4 which is 10 so it would look something like this Now we'll increment i by 1. So i will become 5. So friends here we can see that phi is not less than 5. Therefore the condition in for loop comes out to be false. And as we have iterated each and every element and printed it on the console, we'll simply exit this for loop. And at the last step we'll simply do a print line. So which will bring the cursor to print stuffs on the console to the next line. So friends this was a demonstration that how we can print the elements of an array in Java. So here we iterated each and every element using for loop from the start index to end index and we printed the contents of array on the console. So now let's go to Eclipse and see the demonstration of this code. I hope you like this video. Thanks, have a nice day. Hello everyone. So friends, in our last lecture we saw that how we can print the elements of an array in Java and we saw the animation of the algorithm. Now in this lecture we'll code the algorithm and we'll see it's working through main method. So here I will be creating one method as public void and will give the name to it as print array. So this method will take in an array. Let's have integer type. So now our task is to 
print elements inside this array on the console. So what we do is we simply iterate each and every element of this array and print its content on the console. So in the first step what we do is we simply take the length of the array and store it in an integer variable n. So why we do this because in order to iterate this array will provide a for loop. And we know that array starts from the 0th index. So we want to know that what the size or the length of the array so that when we are using the for loop to iterate this array we can give a range that iterates the for loop from start to end. So the value of n is nothing but our end point. So then we'll provide a for loop and inside that for loop we'll start our iteration from index 0 because in an array the storage of elements starts from 0th index and will traverse till i is less than n. So let's say array has n elements so it will be distributed from the range of 0 to n minus 1. So therefore we need to traverse from 0 to n minus 1. So therefore we are providing this condition that i should be less than n and then we'll simply do i plus plus each time in order to print the elements of an array on console we simply provide the system dot out dot print and inside this print method we'll simply take out the value stored at the ith index and print it on the console so I will traverse from 0 to n minus 1. So when it will start from 0th index, it will print the value stored at 0th index. Then we'll do i plus plus. Then it will print the value at first index. And similarly, at the last it will print the value stored at n minus 1th index. And after for loop, we'll simply provide the print line. So friend, this is the code to print the elements of an array on console. So here now let's see the working of this code through main method. So first we'll create the instance of array util class. Now we'll call the print array method by passing in an array so here we'll call print array and we'll simply pass an array so let's say we provide five elements whose value would be five one two nine and let's say ten so friends here we have created a new array and using this curly brackets we have provided that this array should have 5 elements and we are directly passing this array to this print array method. So now let's run this code. So here you can see that it printed 5, 1, 2, 9, 10 by iterating over the array one by one using this for loop. So friend, in this lecture we saw the working of this algorithm that how we can print the array elements on the console. I hope you like this video. Thanks. Have a nice day. Hello everyone. So in this video we are going to discuss that how we can remove even integers from an array. Now here let's suppose we are given an array of integers. We need to return an array with even integers being removed. So for example let's say we are given the array such as 3, 2, 4, 7, 10, 
सिक्स फाइव सो ये टू इज इवन इंटीजर फोर इज इवन इंटीजर टेन एंड सिक्स आर इवन इंटीजर्स नाउ वी नीड टू रिमूव दो इवन इंटीजर्स एंड ओनली रिटर्न द ऑड नंबर विच इज थ्री सेवन एंड फाइव सो लेट सी द डेमोन्स्ट्रेशन ऑफ दिस अलगोरिथम स्टेप बाय स्टेप सो फ्रेंड्स बिफोर वी स्टार्ट इन केस इफ यू आर न्यू टू माई चैनल देन प्लीज सब्सक्राइब टू माई चैनल एंड क्लिक द बेल आइकॉन सो दैट यू नेवर मिस एनी अपडेट सो हियर इज द अलगोरिथम विच विल हेल्प अस रिमूविंग द इवन इंटीजर्स फ्रॉम एन एरे सो द मैथड नेम इज रिमूव इवन इट टेक्स इन एन एरे एंड रिटर्न एन एरे इन विच द इवन इंटीजर्स आर रिमूव्ड सो लेट से वी टेक द एग्जाम्पल ऑफ द एरे हैविंग सेवन एलिमेंट्स थ्री टू फोर सेवन टेन सिक्स फाइव एंड लेट से वेन वी कॉल रिमूव इवन मैथड बाय पासिंग इन द एरे दिस मैथड एक्चुअली स्टार्ट इज एग्जीक्यूशन Now, how we can remove the even integers from the array is first we actually count the number of odd integers in the array, and why we count the number of odd integers is because we need to return an array having only odd integers by removing the even integers from the given array. So at the start, odd count is zero. Now we provide a for loop, and we traverse the array elements one by one. So starting from i equal to zero, which is zero index, we go till i should be less than array dot length. So array dot length is seven, because there are seven elements, and less than seven means up till six. So at the start, i is actually less than array dot length. So friends, how we can find the odd integers inside these arrays? We can take the value at any particular index. If we divide it by two, and if the remainder is not equal to zero, it means it's an odd element. So, friends, we know that even integers are two, four, six, eight. Where if we divide the element by two, let's say two divided by two, so we get the remainder as zero. So the even integers, when divided by two, give remainder as zero. And if we take the odd integers one, three, five, if we divide three by two. We get remainder as one. If we divide five by two, we get remainder as one. So if the remainder is not equal to zero, it means it's an odd integer. So we will take the help of this modulus operator, which will directly provide us the remainder. And if it is not equal to zero, we will increment the odd count. So at the start. We get three. Three divided by two will give remainder as one. One is not equal to zero, so therefore this condition comes out to be true. We will increment odd count because three is an odd integer. So here it becomes one. We will increment i. Now array of five which is two, two divided by two will give remainder as zero. So therefore this condition comes out to be false. So this statement is skipped, and we reach here again. So we do i plus plus. I becomes two. Now four divided by two will give remainder as zero, because four is divisible by two. So this condition comes out to be false. Will increment i again. I becomes three, so this condition comes out to be true. Now seven divided by two will give remainder as one, and one is not equal to zero. Therefore, this condition comes out to be true. We will increment odd count because seven is an odd integer. Will increment i. Ten divided by two will give remainder as zero, so this condition comes out to be false. We will again increment i. Now six, which is area of i, divided by two, will give remainder as zero, so this condition comes out to be false. We will again increment i. 
Now six is equal to six, and it is less than array dot length because array dot length is seven. So this for loop will run one more time. We will take five. Five divided by two will give remainder as one. One is not equal to zero. So therefore, this condition comes out to be true. We will increment odd count. It becomes three. Now, when we'll increment i, it will become seven, and seven is not less than seven. So this condition comes out to be false, and for loop will terminate. So here you can see that when we traverse each and every element in the array, we figured out that three, seven, and five are three elements which are odd, and we need to return these three elements by removing the Even integers from the array. So therefore, the array which we want to return will have only three elements, which will be the odd integers. So we will create the result array. We pass in the odd count because we have calculated the odd count through this for loop. So the result array will have only three elements. Now here we will create one index starting from zero. So this index will help us filling the result array. So it will simply traverse the result array. Now here we will again provide a for loop which will iterate the array like we did here, from i equal to zero to i less than array dot length. So i starts from zero. Now i again we are iterating the array, and here providing the same condition to find out the odd integer is because once we find out the odd integers. we will simply assign that value to the result array at a particular index so at the start 3 divided by 2 will give us a remainder as 1 so 1 is not equal to 0 so therefore this condition comes out to be true so it means we have found one odd integer so we will assign the value in the array at ith index which is the 0th index which is 3 to the result array at the index Zero. So three will come here with this assignment. Now after we have assigned one value to this index, we will increment the index because we need to fill the next value. So index becomes one. We will increment i. Two divided by two will give remainder as zero. Therefore, this condition comes out to be false, and we skip this element. We will again increment i. I becomes two. So value at second index is four. Four divided by two will give remainder as zero. So this condition comes out to be false. We will again increment i. I becomes three. Now the value at third index, which is seven, seven divided by two will give remainder as one. One is not equal to zero. Therefore, this condition comes out to be true. It means we have found our second odd integer, which is seven. So we will assign the value seven to the result array as index one. So seven comes here. We will increment the index. We will increment i. Ten divided by two will give remainder as zero. So this condition comes out to be false. So friends, here you can see that whenever we are encountering a even integer, we are simply skipping that value and we are traversing ahead. So when we increment i, i becomes five, six. Divided by two will give remainder as zero, so this condition comes out to be false. We will increment i. Five divided by two will give remainder as one, so this condition comes out to be true because one is not equal to zero. It means we have found our third odd integer, so we will assign five. 
to the result at this particular index which is second index so phi comes here and we will increment index so as we have filled all the values we will again increment i so when we will increment i i will become 7 which will be going out of the boundaries of this array so this condition comes out to be false because 7 is not less than 7 so this for loop will terminate and at the end we will simply return the result so here you can see that we have removed the even integers from the array and we are returning a new array having only odd integers so friend this was all about this algorithm the main idea behind this algorithm is to figure out the odd integers so we can take the number and when we'll divide it by 2 if the remainder comes out to be 1 it means it's an odd integer and if it comes out to be 0 it means it's an even integer so why we calculate the odd count at the start because we need to find the length of the new result array so that we can create this new array of three values because the odd count is three and then we can perform the same steps again we will figure out the odd integer and we will simply assign that odd integer to the respective indexes one by one and at the end we will simply return the result so friends i hope you must have liked this video in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update. Thanks, have a nice day. Hello everyone. So in our previous video, we saw an animation in which we discussed an algorithm that how we can remove the even integers from an array. So in the problem statement, we were given with an array of integers and our task was to remove the even integers from the array. So in that video, we saw the animation of the algorithm. And in this video, we will actually code the algorithm and we will test its working in the main method. So friends, before we start, in case if you are new to my channel, then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update. So here in our previous videos, we have discussed that how we can print an array. And in this video, let's say if you are given with this array of integers and we want to remove the even integers from the array. So the output would be 2. 4, 10 and 6 will be removed. So it will give us 3, 7 and 5. So here you can see 2 is even integer, 4 is even integer and 10 and 6 are even integers. So we need to remove those elements and return an array having only odd integers. So now let's code the algorithm which we also saw in our previous video. Let's say I provide the method name as remove even so this method will take an array of integers and it will return back an array of integers in which the even integers will be removed so here the basic idea we do is first we count the number of odd integers in the array so for that we create an integer variable odd count and then we simply traverse the array using a for loop so why we are evaluating odd count we will see later so here how we can figure out whether an element is an odd integer or an even integer we simply take that element we divide that element by 2 and if the remainder is 0 it means it's an even integer and if the remainder is not equal to 0, it means it's an odd integer. So here if array of i, if we do mod 2 and it is not equal to 0, it means it's an odd integer. So 3 divided by 2 will give remainder as 1. So 1 is not equal to 0, it means it's an odd integer. So this modulus operator is helpful in determining the remainder so if remainder is not equal to 0 it means it's an odd integer so we'll simply increment odd count and if it is an even integer then we simply skip 
So after knowing the number of odd elements, what we do is, as we need to return an array of integers having only odd integers, we'll create a result array of size odd count because we need to return these three elements. So this odd count after traversing each and every element will have value 3 because there are 3 odd elements 3, 7 and 5. So we need to return this array having 3 elements. So we'll create this result array of 3 elements. So this is the reason we are evaluating odd count here. Now after creating the result array, we need to fill this result array with the respective odd elements. So first we'll create an index variable starting from 0 and then we will again iterate the array and we provide the same condition what we have done here. So here if element at ith index mod 2 if it is not equal to 0 it means it's an odd integer so we need to put this integer into the result array so in order to put the element into result array we need to find the index that where we need to put in the result array so for that we have created this index variable so this index variable starts from 0 so let's say if we encounter 3 so we need to put 3 at the 0. If we have encounter 7, then we have to put in the next index. And if we have encounter 5, then we have to put in the next index. So we will use this index variable to keep the track of these positions. And after placing the odd integer at a proper index, we have to increment the index as well. Because after putting 3, let's say at 0th index, 7 will cover index 1, so we need to increment index as well. And after doing that, we'll simply return the result. So here you can see if the element at the ith index is even, we are doing nothing, we are simply skipping it. And if it is an odd integer, then we are taking that integer, placing into the result array at a proper index and then we are incrementing the index as well. So now let's test its working in the main method. So first we will print the original array. If I run the code now, you can see it has printed the original array. Now we will call remove even method. We will pass the original array and it will return back a result array. Now this result array will have only odd integers. So if I print it again, if I run the code now, so here you can see it printed 375. It has removed the even integers 2, 4, 10 and 6. So friend, this was all about the implementation of this algorithm. I hope you must have liked this video. In case if you are new to my channel, then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update. Thanks, have a nice day. Hello friends, welcome to my new data structures and algorithms in Java tutorial series video. Friends, in this tutorial we will discuss how to reverse an array in Java. So friends, let's suppose we are given an array and our task is to reverse the array. So for example, let's suppose we are given an array of integers having values as 2, 11, 5, 10, 7 and 8. So when we will reverse this array of integers, it would become 8, 7, 10, 5, 11, 2, which you can see below. So friends, let's suppose we are given a numbers array whose length is 6 that is having index from 0 to 5 and we want to reverse this array so here is an algorithm to reverse an array so let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step 
so in order to call the reverse array method we pass in the numbers array which we actually want to reverse we also provide a range in which we want to reverse the array so here as we want to reverse this complete array we give the start position at 0 and the end position numbers dot length minus 1 so here you can see the length of the array is 6 and minus 1 becomes 5 so the end index is 5 because we want to reverse this complete array so when we call this method by passing in the numbers array which we want to reverse the value of start is 0 and the value of end is 5 so friends start and end is nothing but the range between which we want to reverse an array so the idea behind this algorithm is we usually take two pointers one is the start pointer and one is the end pointer so here you can see currently the value of start is 0 so we simply refer to the index 0 and the value of end is 5 so we simply refer to the value of index 5 so the values which start and end hold are nothing but the indices of the array which is nothing but the range so here we actually want to reverse this array from the start position to end position so let's see it's working so in the first step what we do is we actually provide a while loop and the condition we provide in the while loop is we check whether start is less than end or not so here value of start is 0 and value of end is 5 so here in the condition in while block comes out to be true so friends what we actually do we simply swap the value at start index with the value at end index because we want to reverse this array so we actually reverse this array by making swap pairwise between start and the end index so here in order to swap these two values first we will create a temporary variable to store the value at the start index so it would look something like this so the value at start index is nothing but 2 so we are storing it in temporary variable moving ahead now as we have stored this value in the temporary variable we can simply assign the value at end index to the start index so it would look something like this so now value at index 0 is 8 moving ahead and now we will simply assign the value stored in temporary variable to the end index so it would look something like this so the value in the array at the end index now becomes 2 moving ahead so friends here we have swapped these two values which are being referred by the start position and the end position so after we have swapped these two values now we simply increment the start by 1 and we decrement the end by 1 so here we are incrementing the start by 1 so as start is holding the value of 0 it becomes 1 so now it will refer to the index 1 moving ahead and then we will decrement the end by 1 so as end is having value of 5 now it becomes 4 and now it will point to the 4th index in the while loop we will again check whether start is less than end or not so here you can see value of start is 1 and value of end is 4 so therefore the condition in while block comes out to be true and now we will simply swap these two values which are being referred by start position and end position so first we will store the value of array at start index into the temporary variable so now temp becomes 11 and then we will simply assign the value stored in an array at index 4 to index 1 so it would look something like this that the value in array at start index now becomes 7 moving ahead and now we will simply assign the value in temporary variable to the end index of the numbers array so it would become something like this that the value in numbers array at the end index becomes 11 moving ahead now as we have swapped these two values we will simply increment the start by 1 so the value of start is 1 now it becomes 2 
and now simply start will point to the index 2 moving ahead and we'll simply decrement the end by 1 so currently the value of end is 4 so it will become 3 and now end will point to the index 3 moving ahead now again condition in while block comes out to be true because 2 is less than 3 so now we will swap these two values so we will assign the value at index 2 to temporary variable so now temporary variable is having value as 5 and then we will simply assign the value at index 3 to index 2 moving ahead and finally we will assign the value in the temporary variable to the numbers array at the end index so it becomes something like this and finally we will increment the start by 1 so start becomes 3 and now it will point to the third index moving ahead and then we will decrement the end by 1 so end becomes 2 and it will point to the second index so now in while loop we will again check whether start is less than end or not so here you can see the value of start is greater than end so therefore the condition in while block comes out to be false and also friend here you can see that is array is completely reversed so friends the idea behind this reversal algorithm was to actually take the two pointers one would be the start position and one would be the end position and we simply kept on swapping the values and then incrementing the value of start by one and decrementing the end by one so we performed this operation till start was less than end so as soon as start becomes equal to end or greater than end then we have actually reversed the complete array friend here we saw an example with an array of even number of values so we actually swapped in pairs but if we took an array of odd numbers of element then also this algorithm will work fine because because the middle element will always retain its place when we are reversing an array so friends let's go to eclipse and see the working of this algorithm so friends in our previous tutorial we saw the demonstration of how to reverse an array in java so in this tutorial we will actually code the algorithm for reversing an array so here i have created one class by name reverse array and this class has a starting method print array which will actually take an array and print its elements on the console and in the main method i have taken the same array which we discussed in the slide so initially if i run the code now you see it prints the values in the array is 2, 11, 5, 10, 7, 8 and now we will write the code to reverse this array so we will create a static method public static void reverse this method takes in the array which we want to reverse and it also takes the range that from which position to which we want to reverse the array so it actually takes the start position and the end position between which we will reverse the elements of the array so the first step will provide a while loop and will iterate till start is less than end and in this while loop we will simply swap the values at the start index and the end index of the array so first we'll create a temporary variable and to this temporary variable we'll simply assign the value at the start index of array and then we'll simply assign the value at the end index to the value at start index and finally we will assign the value of the temporary variable to the end index of the array 
and then we'll simply increment the start by one and decrement the end by one so friend this is the algorithm to actually reverse an array now let's test it's working in the main method so here I will call reverse method by passing in the numbers array and the start position is 0 and end position is numbers dot length minus 1 so between this range the array will be reversed and finally we will print the array so if I run the code now so friends here you can see initially the array was having values at 2, 11, 5, 10, 7, 8 so after reversing this array it became 8, 7, 10, 5, 11, 2 so friends in this tutorial we actually coded the algorithm to reverse an array in java I hope you like this video thanks have a nice day hello friends welcome to my new data structures and algorithms in java tutorial series video Friends, in this tutorial we will discuss how to find minimum value in array. So friends, let's suppose we are given an array having few elements. So our task is to find the minimum value in array. So friends, below you can see the algorithm to find the minimum value of an array. So the name of the method is find minimum which takes in an integer array and which returns back an integer value which is nothing but the minimum value of the array so friend let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step and we will take the input array which is given in this slide so friends in first step what we'll do we'll create an integer variable and we'll give it the name as min so this min variable will always hold the minimum value of the array so at the start what we do is we simply take the first element of the array and will mark it as the minimum value of the array so here min will have value as 5 and at the start we will treat the first element as the minimum value of the array so friends the basic idea behind this algorithm is now we will provide a for loop which will start from the index 1 and which will go till the last element of an array and inside this for loop we will compare each and every element of the array with the min value and let's suppose if we find any value of array which is less than the min value we will simply update the min with that particular value so we will start this for loop with i equal to 1 so here the value of i basically represent the index of the array and we'll check whether i is less than the length of the array or not so here you can see the length of array is 6 and 1 is less than 6 so the condition in for loop comes out to be true so in the if block now we'll check that whether the value at index 1 is lesser than the min value or not so here you can see 9 is not less than 5 therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false now we'll increment i by 1 so i becomes 2 so now we'll compare the value index 2 which is 3 with the min value which is 5 so here you can see 3 is less than 5 therefore condition in if block comes out to be true so friend inside this array we have found a value which is less than the min value so at this step we will simply update the min with the value which we found as the minimum value so now min will become 3 so after this assignment our new minimum value becomes 3 now we'll again increment i by 1 so i becomes 3 
will compare the value of array at index 3 which is 15 with 3 and we will check whether 15 is less than 3 or not so here you can see 15 is not less than 3 so the condition in if block comes out to be false we will again increment i by 1 so i becomes 4 and then in if block we again compare that value at index 4 which is 1 is less than minimum value or not so here you can see the value at index 4 is 1 and we know that 1 is less than 3 therefore condition in if block comes out to be true and we have found one more element which is less than the minimum value so here in the if block we simply update the minimum value with a value which we found to be the minimum so now min will become 1 so after this assignment our updated minimum value would be 1 now we will simply increment i by 1 so i becomes 5 so now here we will compare the value of index 5 which is nothing but 2 with the minimum value which is 1 so we will check whether 2 is less than 1 or not so here condition in if block comes out to be false because 2 is not less than 1 and then we will simply increment i by 1 so i becomes 6 so when i becomes 6 we know that i has crossed the boundaries of the array so the condition in for loop comes out to be false and the for loop terminates So after the for loop completes, whatever the value min will hold, it would be the smallest value of this array. So at the last step, we will simply return this minimum value which is nothing but 1. So friends, in this tutorial we actually saw the demonstration to how to find a minimum value of an array. Now let's go to Eclipse and see the working of this code. Hello friends, in our previous tutorial we actually discussed how to find a minimum value in an array. We saw the demonstration of the algorithm step by step. Now in this tutorial we will actually code the algorithm and will test its working in the main method. So here I have created one class by name min array with a main method and here I have created one array which we saw in the slide and then I have initialized this min array class. So let's write the code to find the minimum value of an array. So first I will be creating a public method whose return type would be the integer and the name of the method would be find minimum Now this method will take an array and we have to find the minimum value of this array and we will simply return it from this method so friends in the first step what we will do we will simply provide an edge case we will check that whether array is null or not so if array is null or array dot length is 0 we will simply throw an illegal argument exception stating that invalid input so here if the array is not equal to null and error dot length is not equal to 0 then we will create one integer variable we will give it name as min and we will assign the first value of array to it so here min will hold the minimum value of array and here we are simply assigning the value at index 0 
to min and treating it as a minimum value so now we'll provide a for loop and we'll iterate over each and every element of array starting from 1 and we'll iterate till the end of the array so inside this for loop we'll simply provide a if condition and we'll check that value of array the at index is less than min or not so if the value at ith index is less than min we know that inside the input array we have found a value which is less than the current min value so inside this if block we will simply update the min value to be the value at ith index and after iterating over each and every element and checking this if condition when the for loop terminates we simply return the min value so friend this is the algorithm to find the minimum value of an array now let's test it's working in the main method so here after creating an array and initializing this class we'll simply call find minimum method and we'll pass array to it and whatever value this find minimum returns will simply print it on the console so if I run the code now you can see it printed 1 so here you can see 1 is the smallest value inside this array so if I change the value to let's say 0 and if I run the code now you see it printed 0 because 0 is the smallest value inside this array also friend if I pass null and if I run the code now you see it printed illegal argument exception saying that invalid input because we have passed null value for an array if I pass integer array having length is 0 and if I run the code now you can see it again printed invalid input because array length is 0 so friend in this tutorial we actually coded the algorithm to find the minimum value of an array and we also tested its working in the main method I hope you like this video thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in this video we are going to discuss that how we can find the second maximum value in an array so here we are given an array of integers we need to return the second maximum value now we have provided the array with some integers and we need to return the second maximum value and the second maximum value exists so for example we are given an input array 12 34 2 34 33 1 so here if you see the maximum value is 34 here we have duplicate 34 so the second maximum value is 33 we have to return the second maximum value so despite we have duplicates value we need to return the second maximum value which is 33 here and the constraint is the second maximum value exists so we will be given with an array of some elements in such a way that the second maximum value will exist so let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step so friends before we start in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update now here is the algorithm to find the second max so when we will call the method find second max and we pass in the array having six elements 13 34 2 34 33 1 so friends the idea behind this algorithm is we create 
two variables one is the max and another is second max so max will hold the maximum value in the array and the second max will hold the second maximum value in the array and using this for loop we will figure out which is the max and which is the second max and at the end we will simply return the second maximum value so at the start what we do is to max we assign the minimum integer value so that when we will compare max with the actual array value we can compare it safely and here integer dot min value is actually equal to minus two one four seven four eight three six four eight so this is the integers min value which we are assigning to the max so if we have the lowest value and if we compare it with any of the value of the array then we can figure out that whether this max needs to be changed or not and similarly to second max we assign the integers min value so max and second max start from integers min value now we will provide the for loop which will iterate from i equal to 0 to i less than array dot length so i will start from 0 index 0 is less than 6 which is array dot length now we will take the first array value which is at 0th index which is 13 so we will compare that whether 13 is greater than our current max or not so as the current max is the minimum value of the integer 13 is actually greater than max now what it suggests is we need to update max to 13 because we have found one maximum value in this array till this point so this condition comes out to be true it means we have found a maximum value now here we need to update 13 to max because we have found a value which is greater than max so max will become 13 but before updating this part array of i to max when we will update array of i to max max will become 13 but but as max has changed to a new value whatever the max old value was it will become our second max so for example let's say if second max would have been 1 and max would have been 2 and let's say array of i is 13 for example so before assigning 13 to max we need to assign 2 to second max because after this assignment second max will become 2 and max will become 13 so here as max has been updated to 13 whatever the value max had that will become our second max because that value is lesser than the actual max value so therefore we need to be careful while updating the max to array of i before updating max to array of i we need to assign the old max value to second max because this max will now become our second max so currently max value is integers min value and second max is also integer on min value so when we will assign max to second max the value won't change it will be still integer dot min value and now 13 will be assigned to max so this value will be assigned to max so max will become 13 moving ahead we will increment i i becomes 1 1 is less than 6 now 34 is greater than max which means 34 is greater than 13 max value is 13 so 34 is greater than 13 so this condition comes out to be true and we know that when we will update max to 34 we need to assign the old max value which is 13 to second max so here before updating max to 34 we will assign its value which is the old max value to second max so second max will become 13 because this value comes here and max will become 34 
moving ahead we will increment i i becomes 2 2 is less than 6 so friends here you can see that if we would have given an array of these two elements then max would have been 34 and second max would have been 13 so these two steps are critical when we will update max to any actual array value we have to assign that old max value to second max because as max is actually changing its value its old value will become our second max so currently array of i which is 2 it's not greater than 34 which is our max value so therefore this condition comes out to be false and the else part will be executed now why this else if condition is provided because let's say here value would have been 14 for example instead of 2 it would have been 14 so 14 is not greater than 34 and then we have provided else if condition where we are checking that there could be a possibility that 14 is actually greater than 13 which is our second max it means we have to update second max to 14 because if a value is not greater than max but this value can actually be greater than our second max so therefore after this condition we have to provide an else if we need to check whether array of i is actually greater than second max or not so currently 2 is not greater than 13 which is our second max so this condition comes out to be false we will increment i i becomes 3 3 is less than 6 which is array dot length now here you can see this is one critical step array of i is 34 34 is actually equal to max but not greater than max so this condition comes out to be false now in the else part the first if condition 34 is greater than 13 which is true and if it is true but still we can't update 34 to second max because we need to provide yet another condition in the end part which will check whether array of i should not be equal to max it means it is checking for the duplicate max value so let's say our max is 34 and if we have found 34 again so we have to compare this array value to our max and they should not be equal array of i should be greater than second max which is true but 34 should not be greater than the max which is 34 so this is false so therefore the overall condition with this and operator comes out to be false so therefore though 34 is greater than 13 which is this condition still we won't update 34 to second max because 34 is actually our max value which we have figured out here so therefore this overall condition comes out to be false we will increment i i becomes 4 4 is less than 6 now here you can see array of i which is 33 33 is not greater than 34 which is our max so this condition comes out to be false in the else if part 33 is greater than second max which is 13 so 33 is greater than 13 and we need to compare whether 33 should not be equal to max so 33 is not equal to 34 so therefore this condition is also true so therefore now we have found one contender which can be our second max which is 33 so this condition comes out to be true we will update second max to 33 moving ahead we will increment i i becomes 5 5 is less than 6 
so this condition is true area of i which is 1 1 is not greater than 34 so this condition comes out to be false area of i which is 1 1 is not greater than the second max which is 33 so this condition comes out to be false and overall condition comes out to be false we will increment i so it will go out of the array boundaries i will become 6 so 6 is not less than 6 so therefore this for loop will terminate now and at the end we will return the second max which is 33 so friend this was all about how to find the second maximum value in an array I hope you must have liked this video. In case if you are new to my channel, then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update. Thanks have a nice day. Hello everyone. So in this video we will discuss that how we can move all the zeros to end of an array. So here we are given a problem that given an array of integers write a function to move all zeros to end of it while maintaining the relative order of the non-zero elements. So friends for example you can see that we are given with an array of integers 0, 1, 0, 4, 12. Now our task is to move the zeros to the end of the array and we have to move it such a way that we have to maintain the relative order of non-zero elements. So here you can see that the first non-zero element is 1 then it's 4 and then 12 so we have to move this both 0 to the end of the array in such a way that this order is maintained 1 4 12 so the solution would be that when we will move the 0 after that the first non-zero element is 1 then 4 then 12 and both the zeros are at the end so let's move ahead and see the algorithm for it and we'll see the demonstration of the algorithm step by step. So here you can see that we are provided with this algorithm where the method name is move zeros which takes in an integer array and a value n which is nothing but the length of the array. So when we will call move zero method and let's say we provide this array having the elements as 8, 1, 0, 2, 1, 0, 3 going from index 0 to 6 so therefore the value of n will be 7 because there are 7 elements moving ahead so here the idea behind this algorithm is that we usually take two pointers and let's say we provide name to it as i and j so one pointer basically focuses on the non-zero elements and the other pointer focuses on the zero elements and when these two pointers where one is at non-zero element and the other is at zeroth element we simply perform a swap so here you can see that we are starting from j equal to 0 and i equal to 0 and in this algorithm j will basically focus on the zeroth elements and i will focus on non-zero elements so here you can see that value of j is 0 so we are simply representing it as like this but it is basically storing an integer value 0 moving ahead now friends as you want to travel each and every element of this array and try to move zeros to the end of the array we need to traverse complete array so we have provided a for loop where i will start from 0 and this will go till the end of array where we provide this condition as whether i is less than n or not so value of n is 7 so I will travel till 6 and after each iteration of this for loop will simply increment i by 1 and we also discussed that j will focus on 0th elements and i will focus on non-zero elements and we will perform the swapping of elements when j will point to 0th element and i will point to non-zeroth element so let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step so here value of i is 0 and i is also less than 7 so the condition in for loop comes out to be true 
so the first step we check that the value at ith index is non zero or not so here you can see the value of i is zero and the value at zeroth index is eight so therefore this condition is true and we also check whether value at jth condition is equal to zero or not so here you can see value of j is also zero so the value at zeroth index is eight therefore this condition is false and we also know that when this both the condition will be true then only we will perform the swap but currently the second condition comes out to be false because the value at zeroth index is 8 which is not equal to 0 so we simply move ahead the value at jth index is 8 which is non zero so therefore we will simply increment j by 1 So j becomes 1 and why we are traversing j by 1 because we need to find a value at any particular index which is 0 so that j could reach there and we can perform this swap. Moving ahead, now we will increment i by 1 so i becomes 1 and 1 is less than n therefore this condition also comes out to be true. So for loop executes, we check value at ith index is 0 or not. So value at ith index is 1 which is not equal to 0. So this condition is true and we also check value at jth index. So the value at jth index is also 1 but this condition comes out to be false because it is not equal to 0. So therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false and we check whether value at the jth index is 0 or not. So here you can see the value at jth index is non-zero. Therefore this condition comes out to be true and we simply increment j by 1. So j becomes 2. Now we will again increment i by 1. So i becomes 2. And also here you can see the value of i which is 2 is also less than 7. So therefore this condition also comes out to be true. And for loop executes. Now here you can see the value at ith index is basically equal to 0. Therefore this condition comes out to be false and we don't evaluate this condition because of this AND operator. So this if block condition comes out to be false and we are checking the value at jth index is 0 or not. So here you can see the value at jth index is 0. So therefore this condition also comes out to be false because we have encountered 0 and j should focus on 0th elements so that we can perform a swap. So this condition comes out to be false and j stays at the same position. Now we will again increment i by 1. So i becomes 3 and 3 is less than 7. So for loop executes. So here you can see that now we have encountered an interesting situation where j is pointing to 0th element and i is pointing to a non-zero element. So this condition where the value at ith index is not equal to 0. So this condition comes out to be true. And the second condition also comes out to be true because j is pointing to value 2 and the value at second index is 0. So therefore this condition also comes out to be true and overall if condition comes out to be true. So now this if block will execute. and we need to perform this swap so we are creating this temporary variable to store one of the values so we are simply storing the value at ith index into the temporary variable so 2 is stored into this temporary variable because we need to perform the swap so somewhere we need to store this value and now we are storing the value at jth index into the value at ith index so value at jth index is 0 and we are assigning this 0 to value at ith index. 
so it would look something like this that zero will be assigned to the ith index moving ahead and finally we'll assign the value stored in temporary variable to jth index so it would look something like this so here we have simply swapped these two values and after this swapping we again check that value at jth index is equal to 0 or not so here you can see the value at jth index is 2 so we simply traverse j by 1 so j becomes 3 now we'll again increment i by 1 so i becomes 4 and 4 is less than n therefore for loop executes so friends here you can see the value at ith index is 1 which is not equal to 0 so this condition is true and the value at jth index which is 0 is equal to 0 so this both condition comes out to be true and when both condition comes out to be true we know that we have to perform a swap so we will store 1 into the temporary variable we will assign the value at jth index which is 0 and we will simply assign it to the value at ith index so it would look something like this the 0 has been assigned to the 4th index moving ahead and then we'll simply assign the value stored in a temporary variable to the jth index because we need to perform this swap we again check what's the value at jth index so here you can see the value is 1 so 1 is not equal to 0 therefore this condition comes out to be true and we'll increment j by 1 so j becomes 4 so friends the whole idea behind this check is that we need to traverse j so that it reaches to any 0th element so that we can perform a swap so here the value at j index is non-zero therefore we are incrementing j by 1 so j becomes 4 we'll increment i by 1 i becomes 5 and 5 is less than 7 so this condition comes out to be true and now here you can see the value at jth index is 0 so this condition is true but this condition is not true because value at ith index is equal to 0 so this condition comes out to be false and this if block will not get executed and now as j is pointing to the 0th element so this condition also comes out to be false we'll increment i by 1 so i becomes 6 and 6 is also less than 7 so the for loop will execute so in the first condition we'll check whether value at ith index is 0 or not so here you can see the value at ith index is 3 3 is not equal to 0 so this condition comes out to be true and then we will check whether value at jth index is equal to 0 or not so the value at jth index is 0 therefore this condition also comes out to be true so we need to simply perform a swap so we'll store 3 into the temporary variable and then we will swap 0 to this position by assigning value at the jth index to the ith index so this will become 0 and at the last step we will assign the value 3 to the jth index so 3 will come here and here we will simply check whether the value at jth index is 0 or not so value at jth index is non-zero so therefore this condition also comes out to be true so we increment j by 1 so j becomes 5 and here we will increment i by 1 again 
सो आई बिकम सेवन बट नाउ ये रोकन सी सेवन इज नॉट लेस देन सेवन सो द कंडीशन इन फॉलो विल कम्स आउट टू बी फॉल्स एंड दिस फॉर लूप विल एग्जिट सो आफ्टर दिस फॉर लूप विल एग्जिट सो ये रोकन सी दट दिस एरे हैड टू जीरो एलिमेंट्स इन द बिटवीन and we have simply moved them to the end of the array by maintaining the relative order among the non zero elements so when this is one of the simple algorithm to move the zero elements to the end of an array now let's go to intellij and see the working of this code so friends i hope you like this video and in case you have liked this video then please like comment share and subscribe my channel thanks have a nice day Hello everyone. So in this video, we will simply code the algorithm, and we'll see that how we can move the zero elements to the end of an array. So here you can see that I have created one class as move zeros. So this class is one main method, and it calls the array demo method. So where we have created this array, which we also saw in our previous video, and we have this one method print array. Which we already discussed in one of our previous videos. So if I run the main method, so here you can see it simply prints the array on the console as eight one zero two one zero three. So these are nothing but the elements of array, which has two zero elements. So we need to move these two zero elements to the end of the array by maintaining the relative order of the non-zero elements. so let's code the method so we'll create public void we give the method name as move zero and as we discussed in our previous video that this method will take one integer array and one value n which is nothing but the length of the array and we also discussed the idea behind this algorithm is we take two pointers let's say one as j which will focus on zeroth elements and one pointer is i so here i will focus on non zero elements and as you want to iterate each and every element of this array will provide this for loop where i will traverse from 0 and it will go to a value lesser than the length of the array which is nothing but the value n and after each iteration will simply increment the value of i by 1 so in for loop what we do is we provide a if condition and here we'll check the value stored at ith index is not equal to 0 because i will focus on non zero elements and and if the value at jth index is equal to 0 because j will focus on zero the elements so if these two conditions are equal then we'll simply perform a swap by taking a temporary variable so here we are assigning the value at i index to this temporary variable and then we are simply swapping the value at j th index and storing it on the ith index and at the last step we are taking the value of the temporary variable and storing at the jth index so this will simply swap the value of the ith and jth index and after we perform swap we'll provide one more if condition where we simply check that value at jth index is not equal to 0 so if the value at jth index is not equal to 
will simply increment j by 1 because that is not the value that j is focusing on j will only focus on the zeroth elements so this is the condition so friend this is the algorithm to move the zeroth elements to the end of an array now let's see the demonstration of it now after printing the array we'll simply call move zeros we'll pass the array and we'll pass the value of n as array dot length and after moving the zeros to the end of the array we'll simply print the array again and if i run the main method again so friends here you can see that initially array was 8102103 which had two zero elements and after we perform this algorithm where we are moving the zeros to the end of the array the value stored was like this 81213 where both the zeros came to the end of the array and even the relative order of the non zero elements remained the same with 81213 8 1 2 1 and 3 so here we simply coded an algorithm where we moved the zeros to the end of the array so friend this was all about this video in case you have liked this video then please like comment share and subscribe my channel thanks have a nice day hello everyone so friends in this lecture we will discuss how to resize an array in java so friends as you all know that when we initialize an array we provide a size that how many elements this array can hold and this size we have to provide when we are creating an array object but sometimes what happen that we don't know that how many elements can be there in an array at the time of initialization so therefore doing the resize of an array is a very common operation in many algorithms so for example when we use array list inside the array list we create an array of default size and when we add elements to that default size it gets stored in the internal array and as soon as we try to add one more element so internally what happens a new temporary array is created with a size more than that of the original array and then all the elements are copied from the original array to this temporary array and finally the original array points to this temporary array so friends now let's see the demonstration of this algorithm so here is the algorithm and let's say we have this array whose length is 4 because it can store four elements and here you can see that all the elements inside this array are filled so therefore there is no more additional empty space left to add more elements and if suppose if you want to add more elements what we do is we simply call this resize method by passing in an array and we provide a capacity that how much more elements you want when this resize is done so let's say we call this resize method by passing in the array and whatever the length we have let's say 4 we simply want to double the length so we pass the capacity as 8 so now this method will be called with the capacity as 8 and by passing this array moving ahead so friends once we initialize this array we can't add more elements to it so what we do is we create a temporary array for whatever the capacity we provided so here we will create a temporary array whose capacity or size would be 8 so now this temporary array will range from 0 to 7 storing the eight elements which is nothing but the capacity of this array moving ahead now friend as we have created this temporary array our other task would be to copy each and every element of this array to this temporary array 
So in order to do that, what we do is we provide a for loop which starts from 0th index and goes to the array dot length minus 1 index. So here value of i will be 0 when this for loop starts. It will simply point to the 0th index and we know that value of i which is 0 is less than 4. So therefore this for loop will execute. And in the for loop what we'll do, we'll simply copy the value stored at the ith index which is the 0th index to the temporary array at the ith index which is 0. So here what we are simply doing, we are simply copying this value which is 5 to this temporary array at 0th index. So it would look something like this. So 5 is copied here. So now we'll move ahead. Now we'll increment the value of i. So i becomes 1. It simply means that we can use this i to point to the first index. And value of i which is 1 is less than 4. So this for loop executes. And now we'll simply again copy the value at ith index which is the first index to this temporary array at first index. So it would look something like this. Moving ahead, we'll increment the value of i by 1. So i becomes 2. It will point to the second index now. Now we'll copy the value at second index to this temporary array. So it would look something like this. The 3 is copied from the second index to temporary array at second index. Moving ahead, we'll again increment the value of i by 1. So i becomes 3. So it will point to the third index now. And we know that 3 is less than 4. Therefore, the for loop will execute. And finally, we simply copy the value stored at the third index to this temporary array at the third index. So it would look something like this. Moving ahead, we'll increment the value of i by 1. So i becomes 4. And we know that 4 is not less than 4. So this condition comes out to be false. So therefore for loop will terminate. Which actually makes sense because we have copied all the values of our original array to this temporary array. So this for loop will exit. And at the last step what we'll do is, here you can see that this temporary variable is pointing to this array object in a heap. And our array is pointing to this object in heap. So now what we'll do, whatever the value is stored in this temporary array, we'll assign to our original array. So it simply means that we are reassigning this array to this array. So it would look something like this. That now this array will point to this temporary array, which is nothing but pointing to an array object in heap. So friends, after this resize method gets executed, our original array is pointing to an array having size as 8. But here you can see that there is issue with this code. Once the resize method gets executed completely, here you will find this array will also get garbage collected. Because the return type of this method is void and we are not sending the value stored in this array from this method. Therefore, whatever we did here will be garbage collected finally. So instead of keeping this resize method as void, what we should do is, we should keep the return type of resize method as integer array. And here after assigning the temporary variable to array, we should return the value stored in the array variable. So that whatever the value is returned from this method and whoever is calling this method should actually get a reference to this object in the heap memory. 
so this is one step which is very much important and we must do that we should return the array after resizing it and also friend here you can see that we even don't need to do this reassignment here what we can directly do here is as we have copied all the elements from the original array to this temporary array and this temporary array has capacity of what we have passed we can simply return the value stored in this temporary array instead of assigning it to array variable and returning the array variable we can simply return the value stored in this temporary variable so friends this was a demonstration of how to resize an array using this animation now let's go to eclipse and see the working of this code i hope you like this video thanks have a nice day hello everyone so friends in our previous lecture we saw that how we can resize an array through an animation now in this lecture we'll code the algorithm and we'll see it's working inside this main method so in our array util class here i will be creating one method as public void and i will give the name to this method as resize now as we discussed in our previous lecture this resize method will take the array which we want to resize and it will take the capacity to which we want to resize so this is nothing but an integer value so what happens here is let's say our array has size 4 and we want to resize it to 8 10 16 or whatever value we want we simply pass it here so in the first step what we do is as you have already created this array of a particular size we can't directly resize this array to this capacity so what we do is we first create a temporary array having the sizes the capacity we provide now after creating this temporary array what we do is we simply copy all the elements of this array to this temporary array so in order to copy all the elements of our original array to this temporary array what we do is we simply provide a for loop and inside this for loop we simply iterate each and every element of our original array so here you can see this for loop will iterate with a value of i as 0 and it will go till the length of our original array minus 1 and inside this for loop what will do will simply assign the value stored at ith index of our original array to our temporary array at ith index so when this line will execute what it will do is it will go to our original array it will take the value from the ith index and then it will go to our temporary array to ith index and simply copy the value from our original array from the ith index to the temporary array at ith index so this copy will go from the 0th index and it will go to the last index of our original array which is array dot length minus 1 index so after we copy each and every element from our original array to this temporary array what we do is at the last step we simply assign the value stored in the temporary array to our original array so when this line will execute the temporary array which we created here which was pointed by this temp variable now our original array variable will point to this temporary array which has capacity of what we have provided here so after this method gets executed the original array has been resized to this capacity because at the last step we are simply assigning the value stored at the temporary variable to the array variable so initially this temp pointed to an array in an heap which had this capacity now what it means is 
our array will point to this array in heap so friend this piece of code simply resizes the array so let's see the demonstration of it i'll just copy this array initialization and i'll just comment this print array call here we'll create an array we'll give it a name as original and we'll simply paste this part here so our original array has the size of storing five elements so friend let's say if you want to store more elements so we can't store here so then we have to resize this original array so what we do is here i'll simply provide a sysout and here i simply print the size of original array and let's say i provide a value as original dot length so friends if i run the code now so here you can see it printed the size of original array is 5 now friends as we want to resize it what we do is we simply call the resize method we pass in our original array and let's say we want to resize this array to a capacity of let's say 10 so we pass the value of capacity as 10 so friends after resizing the array we'll simply print the size of original array after resize now what happens when i call this again the size of the original array after resize and i simply print original dot length so what it should print it should print 5 or 10 so friends here it looks that we have resized this original array to a capacity of let's say 10 we have even copied the contents so we usually think that when we print original dot length here it should give the answer as 10 but if i run it you will see that it gives answer as 5 because though we have passed this original array here but when this method gets terminated this temporary array and everything will be garbage collected and when our call will reach this point the original array will be still pointing to this so what we do here is we have to return this array from this method and instead of void we have to give return type of the integer array so that here we can get this array as we are returning it from here and we can store it in the original and finally we can print the length of this original array and here if i run the code now you can see that now this original array is actually pointing to this resized array So friend this is one of the most smallest mistakes we usually make because we know that java is pass by value so we are passing the value stored in the original array here we are doing resize on this temporary array and this array variable and if you are not returning it back then this all will be garbage collected and our original will be pointing to this array only so here we are returning this array we are storing it here so now we have actually reassigned it to a different array by this line and when we printed the length of this original array now it gave the value as 10 and also friend what we can do is here instead of assigning it to array we can even return something like this because we have copied the content of this array to this temporary array so instead of assigning the value of this temporary variable to array variable we can directly return something like this and if i run the code now you can see it again printed the size of the original array after resize is 10 so here now you have actually resized this original array so friend this method is used very frequently in many other data structures which involves the array internally so friends i hope you like this video
थैंक्स हैव अ नाइस डे हेलो एवरीवन सो इन दिस वीडियो वी विल बी लुकिंग इनटू अ प्रॉब्लम फाइंड द मिसिंग नंबर इन एन एरे सो हियर लेट्स सपोज वी आर गिवन एन एरे हैविंग एन माइनस वन डिस्टिंग नंबर्स एंड बेसिकली इन द रेंज ऑफ वन टू एन we need to find the missing number in it so it is a very famous interview question where you will see that we are given with numbers from 1 to n so this n could be let's say we are given with this array here you can see that there are seven numbers ranging from index 0 to 6 so it's basically the array dot length which is 7 and here you can see the range is from 1 to n so here you can see in this seven numbers we are given a range from 1 to 8 and one number is missing in this so we need to find that number so for example here you can see one is present two is present three is present four is present five is not present six seven and eight are present so basically we are given n minus 1 distinct numbers which you can see here and 1 to n is the range so here it is from 1 to 8 so here n is 8 and in the array we are provided with n minus 1 which is seven numbers so we need to find one missing number so here the output would be 5 so this is the missing number from range 1 to 8 which we can see in the array so let's see how we can solve this problem so one constant is we need to find it in o of n time complexity so let's see how we can find the missing number in this array so here you can see there is one mathematical formula which can help us in evaluating that what's the missing number in the array so the mathematical formula is something like the sum of first n natural numbers which is 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 till n is given by this formula that we simply do n into n plus 1 by 2 so for example if we want to do sum of first four natural numbers so we can do 4 into 4 plus 1 by 2 so this will give us 4 into 5 by 2 which is 20 by 2 Which will be equal to ten. So here you can see one plus two will give three. Three plus three is six. Six plus four is ten. So this is the formula which help us in evaluating the sum of first and natural numbers. So we will use this formula and find the missing number in the array. So for example, let's suppose we are given with this four numbers. So if we do array dot length. we will get four numbers and as we are getting four numbers the range will be from 1 to 5 so here you can see the four numbers are 1 2 3 and 5 so the missing number is actually 4 so now how we can find the missing number is first the number of elements are four which are present in the array we do plus 1 to it so 5 will be the actual final range so what we will do here is we will use this formula to calculate the sum so we will get 5 into 5 plus 1 by 2 so this will give us 30 by 2 15 so the sum of first five natural number is 15 and in order to find the missing number what we will do is we will iterate this array one by one we'll pick each element and we will simply subtract it from the sum and after subtracting all the elements whatever number will be left that will be our answer because this is the sum of first five natural numbers and if we are subtracting four numbers from it the leftover sum would be our missing number so for example first we encounter one So we do fifteen minus one, we get fourteen. Then we encounter two, so we do fourteen minus two, we get twelve. Then we encounter three, 
so we get 12 minus 3 9 and then we encounter 5 so we do 9 minus 5 which will give us 4 so this 4 will be our answer so here you can see that this formula is very helpful in many coding problems and this is one such problem so here the missing number is 4 which we just evaluated using this mathematical formula now let's move ahead and see the algorithm for it so here you can see the algorithm is very simple so let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step using this array so before we start in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update so let's say we call find missing number method with this array and here you can see the size of this array or the length of this array is 7 ranging from index 0 to 6 so if length is 7 we know that the range would be from 1 to 8 and we need to find one missing number in it so first we evaluate total number of elements present in the range so if we do array dot length we will get the numbers present in this array and if we do plus 1 because this array doesn't have that number which we need to find so we simply add 1 so n will be 8 and now we will use the formula and calculate the sum so it will be 8 into 8 plus 1 by 2 it will give us 8 into 9 by 2 which is 9 into 4 which is 36 so sum will be 36 and now we will iterate the array one by one using this for loop and inside this for loop we will subtract each number from the sum and at the end whatever the sum is left that will be our answer so let's see how first we get number 2 when we subtract 2 from sum sum becomes 34 then number becomes 4 34 minus 4 will give 30 then number will become 1 30 minus 1 will give 29 then number will become 8 29 minus 8 will give 21 we encounter 6 21 minus 6 will give 15 now number becomes 3 15 minus 3 gives 12 and at the last number becomes 7 so 12 minus 7 will give 5 and then this for loop will end and whatever the values left in the sum that will be our missing number so here you can see 1 is there, 2 is there, 3 is there, 4 is there 5 is not there, 6, 7 and 8 are there so at the end we will simply return 5 so this question is frequently asked in the coding interviews and if you come up with this formula n into n plus 1 by 2 which is sum of first n natural numbers then you can easily figure out what's the missing number so friend this was all about this question i hope you must have liked this video in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in our previous video we saw an animation to find the missing number in an array where we were given an array having 
elements from 1 to n and in that one element was missing so our task was to find that missing number so in our previous video we actually saw the demonstration of this algorithm step by step so now in this video we will actually code the algorithm and we will test its working in the main method so here in our array util class here i will be creating one method as public static let's say we give the method name as find missing number so this method takes in an array and it returns the missing number so the return type is int so here assuming the array is proper and it has various elements which are ranging from 1 to n and there is guaranteed one number is missing in the array and we need to find that missing number so at the start we first evaluate the value of n which is the last number of our range from 1 to n so that is evaluated using array dot length so this will give us the length of the array and it has one missing number so we will do plus 1 to get the last number of the range and after knowing the value of n what we will do is we will use the mathematical formula to calculate the sum of first and natural numbers so here int sum we will use the formula as n into n plus 1 by 2 so after evaluating the sum of first and natural numbers what we will do we will iterate the array one by one and as we need to find the missing number what we can do is we can subtract each element from the sum and whatever the sum will be left that will be our final answer because this formula is giving us sum of first and natural numbers and among those first and natural numbers in the array we have n minus 1 numbers so if we subtract n minus 1 from the sum we will be left with the missing number so here we simply do sum equals sum minus number and after this for loop we will simply return the remaining sum which will be our missing number so now let's test its working in the main method here we are given with an array so here you can see the length of the array is 7 but the range is from 1 to 8 and we need to find the missing number so we will call find missing number we pass in the array and if I run the main method so here you can see it actually returned number 5 from this method it means 5 was the number which was actually missing so here you can see 1 is there 2 is there 3 is there 4 is there 5 is not there 6 7 and 8 are there so friend this problem is asked in many coding interviews where we can use one single for loop and this mathematical formula to evaluate the missing number from the range 1 to n i hope you must have liked this video in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update thanks have a nice day hello everyone so friends in this lecture we will discuss that how we can check that a given string is a palindrome or not so friends what is a palindrome string so a palindrome string is a string when we do reverse of it and compare it with the original string they both are same so for example let's say we are given a string madam so if we read this string in forward direction we get m a d a m madam and if we read it from backward we get m a d a m which is the same 
so therefore this string is a palindrome string so let's say we are given a method in which we are passing a string it should return true if the string is palindrome or it should return false if the string is not palindrome so friends in second example you can see that we are given a string that if we read it in forward direction we get t h a t and if we read it from backward direction we get t a h t so here you can see that if we reverse that and if we compare the reverse string with the original string they are not equal therefore this string is not palindrome so friends let's see the demonstration of the algorithm step by step so here you can see that this is the algorithm where we are calling the method is palindrome and we are passing in a string and if the string is palindrome or not we are simply returning a boolean value that if a string is palindrome we return true and if it is not then we return false so let's say we call is palindrome method and we pass a string as madam so by looks of it you can see that madam is a palindrome string because if we reverse madam and compare it with the original string they both are equal so let's see how we can figure it out that whether madam is a palindrome or not so string word will hold the value as madam so friend in this algorithm what we do we take two pointers one we place at the start and other we place at the end and we just compare these two characters and if they are same then we move first pointer ahead and the last pointer backward and then we compare the second character with the second last character and if they are equal then we simply move ahead the first pointer and move backward the last pointer and similarly we keep on checking the value stored at these two pointers and if any time this values are not equal we can come to know that the string is not a palindrome string so friends here in order to compare this string character by character we first convert this string to char array so in java string has this method to char array which returns a character array so it would look something like this the character array will store one one character at each index and it is in form of an array moving ahead so we'll initialize the first pointer we'll give it a name as start and it will start from the 0th index so value of start is 0 and we'll also initialize an end pointer whose value will be word dot length minus 1 so here on a string if we do word dot length we get the length of the string so here we'll get the length of the string as 5 because there are five characters and when we do minus 1 it simply means that this pointer will point to the last index so end value will be 4 5 minus 1 will give 4 so friends we have got our two pointers and one is at start and other is at end now we'll start comparing the character stored at start index and the end index using this while loop so this while loop will run till start is less than end so if the start becomes equal to end or more than end then we know that we have traversed this complete string so currently you can see that start value is 0 and end value is 4 so therefore the condition in while loop comes out to be true so friends we know the palindrome property that if we read the string in forward direction and if we read the string in backward direction both the string should be equal so friends it means the first character should be equal to the last character second character should be equal to second last character and it should go on till we reach a midpoint and if any of these characters are not equal then we can come to know that string is not palindrome string so here we are comparing the character stored at start index and character stored at the end index so which is these two characters 
and we are checking that if that whether they are equal or not so if they are not equal we can straight away return false that string is not palindrome string but here if you see m is equal to m therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false so we have compared the first and the last character now we'll proceed ahead to compare second character with second last character so for that what we need to do is we need to increment start and decrement end by 1 so here we'll increment start by 1 so start will become 1 and then we will decrement end by 1 so end becomes 3 we check whether start is less than end or not so 1 is less than 3 therefore condition in while block comes out to be true and here we simply check that whether character stored at start index and character stored at end index are equal or not so as value of start is 1 it will point to this character and end is 3 so it will point to this character so we are simply comparing this character with this and here we know that these two characters are equal therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false and then we'll simply increment start by 1 and decrement end by 1 so start becomes 2 and end becomes 2 so friends here you can see start and end will point to index 2 which is d and this is the only index left now and if we check whether start is less than end so here you can see 2 is not less than 2 therefore condition in while block comes out to be false and we don't compare this because if even if we compare d with d we know that they, those are equal but as this is the only character left if we read the string from this point or if we read the string from this point this character will be at the same position so therefore we never check for start equal to end we simply do start should be less than end so here condition in while block comes out to be false and while loop terminates and as soon as while loop terminates if our execution point reaches here we know that the string is palindrome because we have compared every character from start to end so we finally return true therefore string madam is a palindrome string so friend now let's see whether that is a palindrome string or not so here we call is palindrome method providing a string as that we will convert this string to character array by calling to char array method so it would look something like this let's set character array having length as 4 storing each character in each of the index of this array moving ahead we again create two pointers one starts from the beginning and other starts from the end so we create two integer variable start we'll give it a value as 0 and we create integer variable end which points to the last index and in order to get the last index we do what dot length minus 1 so what dot length is the length of the string which is 4 if we do minus 1 we get the third index which is this so end becomes 3 moving ahead we see whether start is less than end or not so here you can see 0 is less than 3 so condition in while block comes out to be true so now we compare the value at start index and the value at end index which is these two characters and we check whether they are equal to or not so if they are not equal then we can simply return false because string is not palindrome but here you can see t is equal to t therefore condition in if block comes out to be false so now we move start pointer a step ahead 
and we move end pointer a step backward and then we'll compare these two characters so start becomes 1 and end becomes 2 so we check whether start is less than end or not so here you can see 1 is less than 2 so the condition while block comes out to be true and then we'll simply compare the value stored at the start index with end index so here you can see that h is not equal to a which means the condition in if block comes out to be true and we come to know that string is not a palindrome string because this should have been equal to make it a palindrome string but here h is not equal to a therefore condition in if block comes out to be true so finally we return false from this point that string is not a palindrome string so friend in this lecture we saw that how we can check that whether a given string is a palindrome or not we saw the demonstration of algorithm step by step now let's go to eclipse and see the working of this code i hope you like this video thanks have a nice day hello everyone so friends in our last lecture we saw that how we can check that whether a given string is a palindrome or not we saw the algorithm using an animation so in this lecture we'll actually code the algorithm and we'll test its working in main method so here i will be creating one method as public and as we want to check whether a given string is a palindrome or not the method which we are creating should return a boolean value that whether a given string is palindrome or not we also provide the method name as is palindrome and into this method we provide a string let's say we give the name to it as word so friends here we are not seeing any edge cases so in order to check whether the given string is a palindrome or not what we do is we first convert this string to a character array by using the method provided in string class as to char array so this method returns a character array so whatever the characters are stored in this string it will be now in form of an array where each index will store one character also friends in the last lecture we discussed that we are using two pointers to check whether the string is palindrome or not so one pointer will start from the beginning so to start we are providing a value as 0 and other pointer will start from the end and to this we provide the value as word dot length minus 1 so word dot length minus 1 will give us the last index so friend now we'll start comparing each character at start and end index so we'll provide a while loop and we'll iterate in this while loop till start is less than end so inside this while loop the first step we do is we check that whether character at start index is equal to character at end index so if they are not equal then we can straight away come to know that string is not a palindrome so here we'll simply return false because as we are starting comparing first index with the last index to make string palindrome those two characters should be equal and if they are not then we can simply return false so friend after doing this first comparison what we do is we move start a step ahead and we move end a step backward so that after comparing this 
we compare the second character with the second last character then third character with third last character and similarly till start meets end because we are incrementing start and decrementing end also friends here you can see that when the value of start will be equal to end this while loop will terminate and we know that inside this while loop we never got any chance that character at start is not equal to character at end so therefore once while loop terminates we can come to know that string is palindrome and we we'll simply return true so friend this is the algorithm to check whether a given string is palindrome or not so let's test it's working in main method so here we'll create instance of string util class and here we provide a if condition we simply check by calling is palindrome method and we pass the value as let's say madam and if it comes out to be true then we simply print the string is palindrome or else we print the string is not palindrome so friends if i run the code now so here you can see it printed the string is palindrome because if we reverse madam and if we compare with the original string they both are equal now friends let's say if i provide the string as that which is not a palindrome string because if we reverse the string we get t a h t which is not equal to our original string and if i run the code now you can see it printed the string is not palindrome so friend in this lecture we wrote the code to check whether a given string is a palindrome or not we tested its working in main method I hope you like this video. Thanks have a nice day. Hello friends. Welcome to my new data structures and algorithm in Java tutorial series video. Friends, in this tutorial we will discuss how to create a singly linked list in Java. So friends, here you can see a simple singly linked list. In our previous tutorial we discussed what is a singly linked list. we discuss a singly linked list is a data structure which actually stores collection of data it contains sequence of nodes so here you can see that there are four nodes having data as 10 1 8 11 and you can also see the first node is being referred by the head so this head node actually holds complete linked list and it is also the first node of the singly linked list and you can also see the last node whose next always points to null because it signifies that it is the end of the list we also discuss that node is having two properties one is the data property and one is the reference to the next node in the list so friends let's see a demo to how to create this singly linked list having the data as 10 1 8 and 11 so friends here is the code which can add few nodes in the singly linked list we will also discuss the other ways to insert the nodes into the singly linked list so let's see the demo of the code step by step so friends when we initialize a singly linked list it contains instance variable head which is of type list node and when we initialize the singly linked list usually head points to null because at the initialization of the singly linked list there are no elements into the list so at first head points to null moving ahead Now in this step what we do is we first create a new list node and we pass the data into it 
So here we are creating a new list node and we are passing the data as 10. So it would look something like this. Here you can see the data is 10 and whenever we create a new list node it next points to null. And also here you can see when we are creating this new list node we are assigning its value to the head. So currently head points to null and after this assignment it would look something like this. So now head will point to this first node which is having data as 10 and its next is pointing to null. Moving ahead. And in this step we are again creating a new list node and we are assigning its value to the list node by name second. So it would look something like this. That second is pointing to a list node having data as 10 and whose next is pointing to null. Moving ahead. Now here similarly we are creating third list node having data as 8 and we are naming the variable as third. So it would look something like this. The third is pointing to a node having data as 8 and whose next is pointing to null. Moving ahead. And now we are creating a list node having data as 11 and we are assigning its value to a list node by name fourth. So here you can see the list node fourth is having data as 11 and whose next is pointing to null. So this is how a list node is created. We create a list node by passing into data and whose next always points to null. So friends in order to create a singly linked list what we do is like we connect all these four nodes together and form a chain. So this chain is built something like this. We connect first node to second, second to third, third to fourth like that. So in order to achieve this what we do is here we know that head points to a node having data as 10 and whose next is pointing to null. So in order to connect these two nodes what we do is we assign the value of second to heads next. So here you can see second is pointing to node having data as 1 and head next is pointing to null. So if we assign the value of second to heads next so instead of pointing to null now it will point to second node because second is pointing to this node. Moving ahead. And now in this step what we do is we assign the value of third to seconds next. So here seconds next is pointing to null and third is pointing to a node having data as 8. So whatever value is in the third we assign it to seconds next. So it would look something like this. Moving ahead and in the final step what we do is we assign the value of fourth to thirds next. So this fourth list node is pointing to a node having data as 11 and whose next is pointing to null. So we simply assign the value of fourth to thirds next. So it would look something like this. So now finally the third node is pointing to a node 4. So friends when method ends all these three nodes goes away. And as head is an instance variable of the singly linked list, it is holding this complete list together. So friends, let's go to Eclipse and see the working code. So friends, in our previous tutorial, we created a class by name singly linked list. And to this class, we provided an instance variable of the type list node by name head. So here the instance variable list node by name head will actually hold the linked list for us and friends we also created one static inner class list node in our previous tutorial whose constructor only took the data part so now let's move ahead and create a singly linked list what we actually saw in the slide in the previous tutorial so we'll create a main method So inside this main method first we will initialize the singly linked list. So friends as soon as we initialize the singly linked list the value of head is null. So here we will create the four nodes what we actually saw in the slide in the previous tutorial. So to head will assign 
newly created list node having data as 10 then we'll create a second list node having data as 1 then we'll create a third list node having data as 8 and finally we'll create a fourth list node having data as 11 So friends here we are having four nodes now we will connect them together to form a chain which is nothing but our singly linked list so in order to form a chain we'll first assign the value of second to heads next because currently head next is pointing to null so So this would make structure something like this moving ahead we'll connect second with third by assigning value of third to seconds next so it would make structure something like this And finally, we will assign the value of fourth to thirds next in order to connect third and fourth. So third next will assign the value of fourth to it. So it would make structure something like this. So here you can see that we have connected all these four nodes together so it would look something like this that 10 is pointing to 1, 1 is pointing to 8, 8 is pointing to 11 and finally 11 next is pointing to null because there are no more nodes we have attached to this fourth node so friend this is how we connect the nodes of a singly linked list together in our upcoming tutorial we will discuss a more generic way to insert the node into singly linked list I hope you like this video. Thanks, have a nice day. Hello friends, welcome to my new data structures and algorithm in Java tutorial series video. Friends, in this tutorial we will discuss how to print elements of a singly linked list in Java. So friends, let's suppose we are given this singly linked list having four nodes with the data as 10, 1, 8 and 11. So in this tutorial we will discuss how we can print the data of the elements of this singly linked list. So below you can see the algorithm of it. So currently in the console you will see no output. So let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step. Now in the first step what we do is in order to print the elements of the singly linked list we need to traverse each and every node one by one and we are given with the head node which is the first node of the singly linked list so we actually start traversing from this first node only so in order to start traversing from this head node what we do is we temporarily create a list node which points to this head node so the name of this list node is current and we assign the value of head to it so it would look something like this that we are having a list node by name current and it is pointing to head moving ahead now in this algorithm we encounter a while loop and in while loop we place a condition that whether current is equal to null or not so why we put this condition because once current is equal to null we come to know that we have traversed the list completely so therefore we come to know that there are no more elements left to be traversed so initially now as current is pointing to this first node we know that it is not null 
so therefore condition in while loop comes out to be true and the code inside the while loop executes so in the first step what we do is we simply print the data associated with this current node so it would look something like this the data associated with this current node is 10 moving ahead so friend as we have traversed this node now it's time to move to the next node so in order to move to next node what we do is so friend if we assign the current next value to current what will happen is as current is pointing to this first node having data as 10 now it will point to the second node having data as 1 so here simply what we are doing is current next is pointing to second node and this value we are assigning to current itself so it would look something like this by this assignment we are simply traversing current to its next by assigning current next value to current moving ahead we again check whether current is equal to null or not so here you can see as current is pointing to second node it is not equal to null so the condition in while block comes out to be true and we simply print current data on the console so current's data is nothing but 1 so it would look something like this moving ahead so friends as we have not traversed the second node now we need to move to the third node so the only way to move to third node is current's next because current next is pointing to this third node so if we assign current next value to current current will now point to the node having data as 8 so it would look something like this moving ahead so friends here again current is pointing node having data as 8 so it is not equal to null therefore the condition in while block comes out to be true and then we simply print the data associated with this current node which is nothing but 8 moving ahead now we simply assign the value of current next to current to traverse to the fourth node so it would look something like this moving ahead now again we know that current is not equal to null because it is pointing to a node having data as 11 so therefore the condition in while block comes out to be true we then print the data associated with this current node which is nothing but 11 moving ahead and then we simply traverse current to its next so current is pointing to this fourth node and its next is pointing to null so we simply assign the value of current next which is null to current so it would look something like this moving ahead so friends we already know that the list is traversed completely and we have printed all the nodes of the singly linked list so now the current is pointing to null so in the while we check whether current is equal to null or not so here you can see current is equal to null so the condition in while block comes out to be false and we know that when this condition comes out to be false the list is completely traversed so now the statements in the while loop doesn't execute and in the last step we simply print null so on the console it will print something like 10 is pointing to 1, 1 is pointing to 8, 8 is pointing to 11 and 11 is pointing to null stating that after 11 there are no more nodes. So friend this is the algorithm to demonstrate how to print the elements of a singly linked list. Now let's go to Eclipse and see the working code. Hello friends, in our previous tutorials we have actually created this class by name singly linked list we also created a list node class and in our previous tutorial we also created four nodes and we connected them together 
so here they are connected in the form as 10 is pointing to 1 1 is pointing to 8 8 is pointing to 11 and 11 is pointing to null because here what we have done is head next is pointing to second second next is pointing to third and third next is pointing to fourth so in this way they are connected to each other and in this tutorial we will write the code which will actually demonstrate how to print the elements of a singly linked list on the console so here first we will create a method as public void will give the name of the method as display because it will be printing the elements of a singly linked list on the console so friends in our previous tutorial we actually saw the animation of this algorithm so here now we will code this algorithm so first we will create a temporary node by name current and we will assign the value of head to it and then we actually saw in the animation slide there was a while loop into which condition was that we were checking whether current is equal to null or not so if the current was not equal to null we were printing the current's data on the console and then we are traversing the current to its next so here here we will print current's data on the console and then we will simply traverse current to its next by assigning current next value to current and once the current is pointing to null we know that we have reached to the end of the singly linked list so there are no more nodes left to be traversed so in the final step we will simply print value as null so friends here we have already connected these four nodes together now let's test that whether they are actually connected or not so we will simply call this display method and we'll run the code. So friends, here you can see it printed 10, 1, 8 and 11. Because this head is having data is 10 and it is pointing to second node whose data is 1 and second is pointing to the third node having data is 8 and 8 is pointing to the fourth node having data is 11. And finally, fourth next is null so therefore it printed null over here so friend this is how we actually print the elements of the singly linked list on the console by traversing one node at a time i hope you like this video thanks have a nice day hello friends welcome to my new data structures and algorithms in java tutorial series video friends in this tutorial we will discuss how to find length of a singly linked list in java so friends let's suppose we are given a singly linked list having four nodes with data is 10, 1, 8, 11. Now in this singly linked list head is pointing to the first node and as you can see the last node is pointing to null. And we also know there are four nodes into this singly linked list. So in order to find the length of this singly linked list below is the algorithm for it. So let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step. So in the first step what we'll do, we'll create an integer variable count which will hold the actual count of the number of nodes in the singly linked list. So friends initially the value of count will be 0. So it would look something like this. Moving ahead. So friends now we'll define a list node by name current and which will point to the head. So it would look something like this. That as head is pointing to this first node. Now current will also point to the first node. Moving ahead. So friend, in order to find the length of this singly linked list, we need to traverse each node one by one and we need to increment the count by one. So friend, in order to traverse each node one by one, we will provide a while loop and in while loop we will provide a condition that current is not equal to null. 
so when the current is equal to null we can come to know that list has reached its end and there are no more nodes left to be traversed so here you can see current is pointing to this first node therefore it's not equal to null therefore the condition in while block comes out to be true so in the first step what we'll do we'll increment the value of count by 1 moving ahead so friend as current is pointing to first node so we have already counted this node so now it's the time to move to its next node so here you can see current is pointing to this first node and current's next is pointing to the second node so in order to traverse current to its next node what we'll do we'll simply assign the value of current dot next to current so it would look something like this so friends here we simply assign the value of current next to current so therefore now current is pointing to the second node having data as 1 moving ahead so now we'll again check whether current is equal to null or not so here you can see this current is pointing to the second node having data as 1 therefore it's not equal to null so the condition in while block comes out to be true in the first step we'll simply increment the count by 1 moving ahead and as we have traversed this node now it's time to move to its next node so here you can see current is pointing to the second node and its next is pointing to this third node so in order to make current traverse to this third node what we'll do we'll simply assign the value of current dot next to current so current dot next is pointing to third node therefore we'll assign this value to current so it would look something like this we'll now again check whether current is equal to null or not so as current is pointing to this third node therefore it's not equal to null we'll again increment the count by 1 and then we'll simply move current to its next node by assigning current dot next value to current so it would look something like this now again current is not equal to null therefore condition in while block comes out to be true we'll increment the count by 1 and then we'll simply traverse current to its next node by assigning current dot next value to current so here you can see current is pointing to its last node and its next is pointing to null and as we are assigning current dot next value to current therefore now current will point to null so it would look something like this we'll check whether current is equal to null or not so here you can see now current is equal to null therefore condition in while block comes out to be false and we also know that we have reached to the end of the singly linked list so now there are no more nodes left to be traversed so in the final step we will simply return the value of count which is nothing but 4 and we also know there are 4 nodes 1, 2, 3 and 4 so friends let's go to eclipse and see the working of this algorithm so friends in our previous tutorial we created one class by name singly linked list so this class demonstrated how we can implement a singly linked list in java we also created one display method which actually printed the singly linked list on the console and in the main method we also created few nodes what we actually saw in the slide so if i run the code now so you can see the singly linked list has four nodes with the values 10 1 8 11 and finally it points to null so there are four nodes in a singly linked list so friend in order to find the length of the singly linked list we'll first create a method
and we'll give it a name as length so this length method will return an integer value which will be nothing but the count of the number of nodes in the singly linked list so in the first step what we'll do we'll provide a if condition and here we'll check that if head is equal to null then we'll simply return 0 because in a singly linked list if head is pointing to null then we can come to know that there the singly linked list is empty moving ahead we'll create an integer variable count and we'll assign a value of 0 to it so this count variable will be actually holding the value of number of nodes in the singly linked list moving ahead we'll create a list node by name current and we'll assign the value of head to it so the current is pointing to the head node and then in order to traverse each and every node of a singly linked list we'll provide a while loop and inside this while loop we'll provide a condition that that if current is not equal to null so if current is not equal to null we know that there are nodes in the singly linked list and if current is equal to null then we can come to know that we have reached the end of the singly linked list so in the first step we'll increment the value of count by 1 because as we are in the while loop we are actually traversing a particular node of a singly linked list so we are incrementing the count by 1 and after incrementing the count by 1 we'll simply traverse current to its next node by assigning the value of current dot next to current and finally when current is equal to null we know that we already traversed the singly linked list completely and there are no more nodes left to be traversed so we'll simply return the value of count so friends in the main method let's test the working of this length method so here we'll simply print the value of length we'll call the length method and if I run the code so friends here you can see that we had a singly linked list with the four nodes 10, 1, 8, 11 and finally we printed the length of the singly linked list which is nothing but 4 so friends in this tutorial we saw how we can find the length of a singly linked list in java i hope you like this video thanks have a nice day hello friends welcome to my new data structures and algorithms in java tutorial series video friends in this tutorial we will discuss how to insert node at the beginning of a singly linked list in java so friends here you can see below is the algorithm to insert a node at the beginning of a singly linked list in java Friends, let's suppose initially singly linked list is empty. Therefore, when singly linked list is empty, we know that head points to null because there are no nodes into the singly linked list. So, friends, let's suppose we want to insert a node into a singly linked list whose data is 11. So, we pass in a value to this method, let's say 11. Now, we want to insert this node at the beginning of a singly linked list. So, here is the algorithm for it. So let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step. So when we call this method, we pass in the value as 11. So friend, as we want to insert this node at the beginning of a singly linked list, what we do is first we actually create this new node. And in our previous tutorial, we also saw that how we can create a new list node. We usually create a new list node by passing in the value into the constructor. So here a new list node will be created by name new node whose value will be 11 so it would look something like this so here you can see the new node is pointing to this list node whose data is 11 and whose next is pointing to null so friends now we want to insert this new node to the beginning of this singly linked list where currently head is pointing to null so in the next step so friends as you want to insert this new node to the beginning of this singly linked list we know that head always points to first node and if you want to insert the node to the beginning 
then we are inserting the node just before the head so in the first step what we do is currently new node next points to null we assign the value of head to new nodes next so it would look something like this that as head is pointing to null new node next is also pointing to null and friends here you can see as head is the first node we are inserting it just before that so in order to insert this node just before the head we have to point new node next to head moving ahead so in the last step what we do is as we have inserted this node at the beginning of the singly linked list we know that now head should point to this node because we know that head points to the first node of a singly linked list so we simply assign the value of new node to head so currently head points to null and new node points to this list node so therefore now head will point to this list node so it would look something like this so friend after we have inserted this new list node to the beginning of the singly linked list now our singly linked list has this one node now let's suppose we want to insert one more node having value as 8 so we call this algorithm again in the first step we simply create a new list node by passing in the value as 8 so it would look something like this that new node is pointing to a list node having data as 8 and whose next is pointing to null so friends now we want to insert this new node at the beginning of this singly linked list so by that we mean that we want to insert this node just before the head So in order to insert this new node just before the head there has to be some link between these two so in the next step what we do is as new node next is pointing to null we simply assign the value of head to new nodes next so it would look something like this the new node next now points to head and which also makes sense because we are inserting this new node at the beginning of the singly linked list which is nothing but just before the head moving ahead and the last step what we do is as we have inserted this new node in the beginning head should point to this node so we simply assign the value of new node to head so it would look something like this so friends after we insert this new node having the data as 8 the linked list has now two nodes and here you can also see that whatever the node is inserted it is now at the beginning of this singly linked list so friends let's suppose we insert one more node to this singly linked list with the value as 1 so this algorithm again get executed in the first step we'll create a new list node so it would look something like this the new node is pointing to a list node having data as 1 and whose next is pointing to null moving ahead as we want to insert this new node at the beginning of the singly linked list we have to make a connection from this node to the head node because we want to insert it just before the head so what we do is whatever the value is there in the head we simply assign it to new nodes next so here you can see has head is pointing to a node having data as 8 and new nodes next is pointing to null so now new node next will point to a node having data as 8 moving ahead and as we have inserted this new node at the beginning of this singly linked list we know that head should point to this node now so we simply assign the value of new node which is nothing but the node having data as 1 to head so it would look something like this so friends here we saw the demonstration of this algorithm by inserting three nodes at the beginning of this singly linked list first we inserted 11 which became the first node of the singly linked list then we inserted 8 and then we inserted 1 so friends now let's go to eclipse and see the working of this code so friends in our previous tutorial we created one class by name singly linked list and we implemented the singly linked list into this class we also implemented a display method which was actually printing each and every node of the singly linked list so friends let's write a method which will insert a node into the beginning of the singly linked list so first we'll create a method insert 
fast so we have created our own method by name insert first because we are inserting this node to the beginning of the singly linked list and this method takes in an integer value which we actually want to provide to the list node which we want to add to the beginning of the singly linked list so in the first step what we do is we create this list node and to the constructor of list node we pass in the value so after this step a new node is created having data is whatever the value we have passed so in order to insert this new node to the beginning of the singly linked list what we do is to new nodes next we provide a value which is stored in the head and in the last step what we do is we simply now point head to this new node so friend this is the method which inserts the node to the beginning of the singly linked list now let's test its working so first we'll insert a node having value as 11 and we'll simply print the singly linked list on the console so here you see singly linked list has one node having data as 11 now let's say we insert 8 and we also insert a node having value as 1 and if i run this code now so friends here you can see the singly linked list contains three nodes now first we inserted 11 and then we inserted 8 to the beginning of the singly linked list so 8 came before 11 and finally we inserted a node having data as 1 which came just before the 8 so friends this is how we insert the node to the beginning of a singly linked list in java I hope you like this video. Thanks have a nice day. Hello everyone. Welcome to my new data structures and algorithms in Java tutorial series video. In this tutorial we will discuss how to insert a node at the end of a singly linked list in Java. So friends below you can see the algorithm to insert a node at the end of a singly linked list in Java. So here in this tutorial we will see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step. Here the algorithm basically insert the node to the end of the singly linked list. So let's suppose at that start the singly linked list is empty. So if the singly linked list is empty we know that head will point to null because there are no nodes into the singly linked list. So now let's suppose we want to insert a node having data is 11 so to the method will pass the value as 11 and this code will be executed so in the first step what we do is in order to insert this value into the singly linked list we first actually create a list node by passing in the value to its constructor so it would look something like this that a new list node is created whose data is 11 and whose next is pointing to null so now we will insert this new node into the singly linked list at the end so first here in the algorithm we check that whether head is equal to null or not because if head is equal to null then we know that singly linked list is empty and there are no nodes so therefore currently singly linked list is empty because head is pointing to null so the condition in if block comes out to be true and in the if block we simply assign the value of new node to head so new node is pointing to a node having data as 11 and we want to insert this new node into the singly linked list at the end but here as the singly linked list is empty therefore in the first step what we do is we simply assign the value of new node to head so here as head is pointing to null after this assignment head will point to this node having data as 11 so it would look something like this and we'll simply return from this method so 
so friends here we inserted one node into the singly linked list at the end so initially the singly linked list was empty but now it has one node where head is pointing to this node moving ahead let's say we want to insert one more node having value as 8 so we will pass this value into this method and the first i will simply create a new list node by passing in the value to its constructor so it would look something like this that new node is pointing to the node having data as 8 and whose next is pointing to null now we want to insert this new node to the end of the singly linked list it's nothing but just after the node having data as 11 so friends now we want to insert this new node to the end of the singly linked list and here you can see that singly linked list has only one node therefore this node having the data as 11 is the last node of the singly linked list so now after this node we have to insert this new node so we again check whether head is equal to null or not so currently you can see the head is pointing to the node having data as 11 therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false so here we simply create a temporary node by name current and will assign the value of head to it so it would look something like this that current is now pointing to the node having data as 11 and head is also pointing to this node moving ahead so friends now we actually provide a while loop so why we are providing this while loop is because, because in order to insert a new node to the end of the singly linked list we need to traverse from head to the end node so once we reach the end node we can simply assign the value of the last node next to point to this new node therefore we start from the head node as current is pointing to head and we'll iterate in the while loop till current dot next is null so friends when current dot next will be equal to null therefore we can come to know that that is the last node of the singly linked list so friend in the while loop we provide a condition that current dot next is not equal to null so here if you see current is pointing to the node having data is 11 and its next is pointing to null and we also know that currently in the singly linked list there is only one node having data is 11 and its next is pointing to null so therefore the current is pointing to this last node so therefore the condition in while loop comes out to be false because current dot next is equal to null so as the singly linked list has only one node therefore this node is the first and also the last node of the singly linked list so as we are on the last node of the singly linked list in order to insert this new node to the end of the singly linked list what we do we simply assign the value of new node to currents next so here you can see new node is pointing to the node which we want to insert and currents next is pointing to null so if we assign the value of new node to currents next it would look something like this that currents next is now pointing to a node which we want to insert into a singly linked list at the end so friends when this method gets executed we know that we have inserted this new node to the end of the singly linked list now let's suppose we want to insert one more node having value as 1 so this code will be executed again in the first step we will simply create a new list node by providing in the value as 1 so it would look something like this that new node is pointing to a list node having data as 1 and whose next is pointing to null we check whether head is equal to null or not so here you can see head is pointing to a node having data as 11 therefore it's not equal to null so friends in order to insert this new node to the end of the singly linked list we have to start from the head and we have to reach till the last node of the singly linked list so in order to perform this step we simply create a temporary node by name current and we start it from the head by assigning the value of head to current so it would look something like this that current is pointing to this first node having data as 11 now we will simply provide a while loop 
and traverse this current to the last node of the singly linked list by providing a condition that current dot next is not equal to null. So in the first step we see current is pointing to a node having data as 11 and its next is pointing to a node having data as 8. Therefore current dot next is not equal to null. So the condition in while block comes out to be true. So in the while block we simply traverse current to its next position by assigning current dot next value to current. So here you can see current is pointing to this node having data as 11 and its next is pointing to a node having data as 8. So we'll assign the value of current dot next to current. So it would look something like this. That current has simply traversed to its next node because we have assigned the value of current dot next to current. Moving ahead, we will again check whether current dot next is equal to null or not. So here you can see current dot next is equal to null and here we also know that singly linked list has two nodes so the node having data as 8 is the last node of the singly linked list so we have traversed the current to the last node and now we can simply insert this new node to the end of the singly linked list so here the condition in while block comes out to be false because current dot next is now pointing to null and in the last step we simply assign the value of new node to currents next. So new node is pointing to the node which we want to insert and current next is pointing to null. So if we assign this value to current next it would look something like this. That current next is now pointing to the node having data as 1. So friends once this method gets executed we know that our singly linked list has now 3 nodes. So here we started by inserting a node having data as 11 then we inserted a node having data as 8 and then we inserted a node having data as 1. So you also saw that we are actually inserting this node to the end of the singly linked list. So friends this was a demonstration of the algorithm. Now let's go to Eclipse and see the working of this algorithm. Hello everyone. In our previous tutorial, we actually discussed how we can insert the node at the end of the singly linked list in Java. So in this tutorial, we'll actually write the code and test the working of the code. So friends, in our previous tutorial, we actually created one class by name singly linked list. So friends, in this class, we actually wrote the code for the implementation of the singly linked list. So now let's write the code to insert the node at the end of the singly linked list in Java. So here I will be creating one method as public void insert last because you want to insert the node at the end of the singly linked list. So we'll provide a value to this method. So here in the first step as we discussed in the slide that first we will create a new node and we will pass the value into the constructor of this list node. So after this step a new node is created and now our task is to insert this new node to the end of the singly linked list. So here in the first step we actually make a check that whether head is equal to null or not. So if head is equal to null we know that singly linked list is empty and there are no nodes into the singly linked list. So we simply assign the value of new node to head and we simply return from the method. So here if the singly linked list is empty we simply assign the value of new node to head because after the insertion of this new node this would be the only node into the singly linked list. Moving ahead and if the singly linked list is not empty then we will create a temporary node by name current and we will assign a value of head to it. So here in order to insert this new list node to the end of the singly linked list we need to start from the head and we need to reach to the end of the singly linked list. 
So in order to start from the head and reach to the end of the singly linked list, we create a temporary list node by name current and we start from the head. And then we will provide a while loop. And to this while loop, we will provide a condition as current dot next is not equal to null. And inside this while loop, we will simply iterate current to its next position. So once we reach to the last node of the singly linked list, we know that its next points to null. And as we want to insert this new list node to the end of the singly linked list, after while loop, we simply assign value of new node to current next. So friends, here we started from the head node and we reached to the last node by providing this while loop and we traversed current from first node to the last node of the singly linked list. And once we reach to the last node of the singly linked list, we simply assign the value of new node to currents next. And so the currents next refers to this new node and this new node is part of the singly linked list. So in our main method, let's test its working. So we'll simply call insert last So here we have called insert last three times that first we are inserting the value 11 and then we are inserting a value 8 and then we are inserting a value of 1 and then finally we are displaying the singly linked list on the console. So if I run this code now So friends here you can see first we inserted 11 and then we inserted 8. So 8 came just after 11 and then we inserted 1. So 1 came after 8. So it is nothing but inserting the node at the end of the singly linked list. So friends in this tutorial we actually saw how we can insert a node at the end of a singly linked list in Java. I hope you like this video. Thanks have a nice day. Hello everyone. So in this video we will discuss that how we can insert a node in a singly linked list at a given position. So here you can see that in this problem we want to implement a method which will insert a node in a singly linked list at a given position. And this position we are assuming to be valid and it will start from 1. So for example here you can see that we are given let's say with this singly linked list. And now let's say if you want to insert any node at a given position. So here we are assuming that position to be valid it means that position should lie from 1 to whatever is the length of the singly linked list. And here we are starting it from 1. Which means if you want to insert a node at position 1, it would be the first node. And if you want to insert at position 5, then this would be the last node. And in case if you want to insert in between of these nodes, the position would be the number where we want to insert. So let's say if you want to insert at position 3. And we are given with this singly linked list. So here you can see this is position 1, 2 and 3. So what we are trying to do here is we will insert node here and this node will sh get shifted ahead of the node which we want to insert here. So let's go ahead and see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step. So before we start in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel so that you never miss any update. So now here you can see this is the algorithm to insert a node at a particular position. Now let's suppose if we are given with this singly linked list having only two nodes. So we'll apply this algorithm on this singly linked list. And let's say if you want to insert a value 8 at position 1. So the second parameter is position and this is the value which you want to insert. 
So here you can see that whatever the value we have passed, which is eight year, it's nothing but our data. So in the first step, what we are doing is we are creating a list node having data as eight, because we want to insert this node at position one. So it would look something like this: that node is pointing to a list node having value as eight, and its next is pointing to null. Now here you can see that there are two cases in if and else. So if position is one, it means we want to insert this node at the beginning of singly linked list, which is just before our head. So currently this if block condition comes out to be true. Now as we want to insert this node before head, what we have to do is, as node is pointing to this list node, its next should point to head because we want to insert this node before head so this node's next should point to head so in the first step we are doing that we are assigning the value of head which is this node to node's next so currently node next is pointing to null so after this assignment node's next will point to head so it would look something like this that now node next is pointing to head moving ahead so here you can see that node next is pointing to head but as head is pointing to the node having value as 10 which is our second node we need to reassign this head to this node because because in order to insert a node before head which is the position 1 after insertion head should point to that node or else when this method will get exit this node won't be part of our singly linked list so we need to assign head to this node so that this node comes into the singly linked list. So we are simply assigning the value of node to head. So head is pointing to the second node. Now it will point to the node which we want to insert. And here you saw that after inserting the node at the beginning, this was our position one. Initially at position one was this node which shifted towards right and this node came into position 1. Moving ahead. Now let's suppose if we are given with this 3 nodes and we want to insert a value 7 at position 3. So here you can see this is position 1, this is position 2 and this is position 3. So we want to insert node here and once we insert node here this one will be shifted a node ahead because we want to accommodate 7 between 10 and 1 because this is the third position. So let's see how we can do that. At the first step we'll create the node with the data as 7. We check whether position is equal to 1 or not. So position is not equal to 1. So the else part will be executed. So friends, now idea behind this algorithm is we want to insert a node at position 3. So this is the position 3 which means we want to insert this node between this node and this node so that once this node is inserted our new node is at position 3. So in order to insert this node at position 3 what we have to do is we need to traverse somehow to position 2 and then we can break this link and instead of pointing to node 1, we can point to our node 7 and node 7 will point to 1. And by this way, our node will be inserted between 10 and 1 and will occupy position 3. So let's see how. So here we'll create a list node previous because we want to reach somehow to this node which would be previous to our node after insertion. So we'll start from the head. So previous will point to head and in order to reach to this node we will keep the track using the count variable. So value of count will be 1 at the start which signifies that we are already at this position. And then in order to traverse to a node previous to our position 3 we will provide a condition as count should be less than position minus 1. So position minus 1 will be 2 
and here you can see that we have already taken up this place so count is 1 so currently count is less than position minus 1 which is 1 is less than 2 so this condition comes out to be true so we'll simply traverse previous to its next node by assigning previous dot next to previous so currently previous is pointing to this node its next is pointing to this node so we'll assign previous next value to previous so it would look something like this that now previous will point to its next node moving ahead will increment value of count because we have traversed previous to its next node count becomes 2 now here you can see 2 is not less than 3 minus 1 which is 2 and we also know that we have reached to position 2 and now we can simply use its next pointer to simply insert this node into the singly linked list at position 3. So this while loop condition comes out to be false. Now here what we'll do is as we want to first break this link. So at the first step what we do is we simply create a list node current. We'll assign a value of previous dot next to it. So as we want to break this link. So we can't directly break this link. Because if we break this link, the nodes after that will be removed from the singly linked list because there would be no reference. So at the first step we are simply creating a temporary list node by name current and we are assigning previous dot next to it so that whatever the nodes are after that will be hold by current. So previous next is this node. So now current will point to this node. So friends, now we need to perform two steps in order to insert node between 10 and 1. The first thing we need to do is as node next is pointing to null and we know that after its insertion it should point to this node because that way it will be inserted in between of node 10 and 1. So the first step what we are doing is as current is pointing to this node we will assign the value of current to nodes next. So here node next is pointing to null. So after this assignment there will be a linkage from node next to current. So it would look something like this. Moving ahead. And at the last step what we do is we simply break this link. And we can safely break this link because the rest of the list is being hold by current. So how we can break this link is previous is pointing to this node. It's next is pointing to this node. So if we assign nodes value, which is this value to previous next. So it would look something like this. That now previous next is pointing to node by this assignment. And why we have performed this step is because we want to insert this node in between 10 and 1. So there was one linkage between 10 and 1. So we break that linkage. We assign previous next to node and node next to current. So here you can see that if we stretch this singly linked list ahead, so it would look something like this that 7 will come in between 10 and 1. And here you can see that that is the position 3 where we actually wanted to insert our node. This is position 1, 2, and this would be our 3. So it is nothing but inserting a node somewhere in the middle of the singly linked list. So friend one last case remains is we want to insert node at the last. So that will also be inserted via position. So here you can see let's say we are given with the singly linked list having only two nodes 8 and 10. So this is position 1 and this is position 2. Now if you want to insert a node at the third position so it would be nothing but inserting the node at the end of the singly linked list. And here we are assuming that position should be valid. So if we call insert 7 comma 3, 7 is our data and 3 is our position. At the first step we'll create the list node having data as 7 and its next pointing to null. We check whether we want to insert it position 1 or not. So currently we want to insert it position 3. So this condition comes out to be false. Now in the else part we perform the same steps which we saw in our previous slide. If we want to insert at position 3 
we need to somehow traverse to position 2 so that we can use this link to insert this node. So we start previous from the head and in order to keep the track of the position and where to insert the node will create an integer variable count starting from value 1 because we have already taken up this value. In the while loop we provide the condition as count should be less than position minus 1. Position minus 1 is 2 and as count value is 1 therefore the condition in while loop will come out to be true. In the first step we will simply traverse previous to its next node by assigning previous next value to previous. So it would look something like this. We will increment count so count becomes 2. And now here the condition in while loop comes out to be false because position minus 1 is 3 minus 1 which is 2 and 2 is not less than 2. So this will signify that previous is one step behind our position. So here you can see previous is pointing to position 2 and why we need a previous position is because as it is a singly linked list we need to somehow use previous next pointer to simply accommodate our newly created node inside that. So at the first step what we are doing is we are simply assigning previous next value to a temporary list node current. So previous next is pointing to null. So current will point to null. Now as we want to insert this node what we saw in our previous steps node next should point to current. So after this assignment it would look something like this that node next is pointing to null. So friends here you can see as we are inserting this node at the end of the singly linked list these steps are pretty much generic to accommodate both cases inserting in between and inserting at the end. Now at the last step we are simply assigning value of node to previous next. So previous next is pointing to null. So it means we want to reassign this value to this node because we want to insert this node at position 3. So it would look something like this. So now head is pointing to node 1. Node 1 is pointing to second node and second node is pointing to third node which is our position 3. And this node is pointing to null because we have inserted this node at the end of the singly linked list. So it would look something like this. So here we discuss the cases where we want to insert the node at a particular position of the singly linked list. I hope the information provided in this video is useful to you. And in case if you find this useful then please like this video. And in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel so that you never miss any update. Thanks have a nice day. Hello everyone. So in our previous video we discussed that how we can insert a node at a given position in a singly linked list. So in this video we will code the algorithm and we will test its working. So here in our singly linked list class which has a instance variable head of type list node. Here I will be creating one method public void insert Now this insert method will take two things. One is the position where we want to insert and let's say other is the value which we want to insert for that particular node. Now here we are assuming that this position is valid and it is not crossing the boundaries of our singly linked list. So those edge cases you can handle it by comparing the value of the position that whether it is less than 0 or it is greater than the length of our singly linked list and basically you can assign a default value to position and proceed ahead with the algorithm or you can simply throw an exception. So here we are assuming that position is a valid position and starting from 1. So for example if we are given with the singly linked list let's say 1 having these 3 nodes so 1 would be our position 1 4 would be at position 2 and 5 would be at position 3. So let's say if you want to insert a value 6 
at position 2 so after this method gets executed it would become something like 1 at position 2 it will come 6 then 4 and then 5 so it means we have inserted value 6 between 1 and 4 because 1 is at position 1 and after our insertion 6 should come at position 2 so this method will perform three cases if position is 1 it will insert at the beginning of the singly linked list and it will also insert in between or at the end of the singly linked list so let's see the code for that so assuming the position to be a valid position at the first step we will create the node which we want to insert whose value would be the value which we have passed to our method now after creating this node which we want to insert we will provide a if else part in the if part we will check whether position is 1 or not so if position is 1 it means you want to insert the node at the beginning of the singly linked list so in the if part what we do is as head is pointing to the first node which is also position 1 so now head should point to our newly created node after the node gets inserted so in the first step what we do is as node next is pointing to null we want to point it to head because we want to insert this node before head so node next should point to head and after node next is pointing to head in order to make node part of our singly linked list and to insert it position 1 we need to assign the node's value to head so now head will point to node which would be at position 1 and which would become the part of our singly linked list so this is the case 1 and for the rest of the cases we will see in the else part so in the else part let's say if you take this example and we want to insert a node at position 2 so here you can see that initially the linked list let's say it's 1, 4 and 5 and if you want to insert a node at position 2 so it would become something like this after the insertion so here what we are doing is this linkage we are breaking between 1 and 4 and we are assigning it from 1 to 6 and then 6 to 4 so there are two assignments one is we are reassigning this linkage from 1 to 4 to 1 to 6 and then from 6 to 4 so there are two assignments which we need to do now as it is a singly linked list in order to reassign this value we need to somehow reach to node 1 which is previous to the position where we want to insert the node so let's say if we want to insert node at position 2 we need to somehow reach to position 1 and using its next we need to assign it to our node which we want to insert so in the else part we will create a temporary node at previous because we want to somehow reach to a node previous to this position where we actually want to insert our newly created node so we will start from head and as we have already started from head we will create a integer variable count will assign it a value 1 because this count will help us in traversing to position minus 1 so in a while loop we will provide a condition as count should be less than position minus 1 and inside this while loop till this condition fails we will keep incrementing previous to its next position by assigning previous dot next to previous and we will simply increment count by one one position so when previous will reach to position minus one this while loop will terminate and after this while loop gets terminate what we do is we create a temporary list node by name current and we assign a value as previous dot next to it so here let's say if we have reached here so to current we are assigning previous next which is value 4 because we need to reassign it to 
6. If we break this linkage and reassign it directly, then 4 and 5 will be removed from the singly linked list because there is no reference to them. So at the first step we are simply creating this temporary reference so that the rest of the singly linked list is intact. Now after assigning previous.next value to current, we can simply remove this linkage and assign it to our node which we want to insert. So here what we do is, we do previous dot next and we'll assign a value of node to it. So now this linkage is gone and it will point to 6. Now we need to do one more assignment as this node next should point to 4 because we want to insert node 6 in between 1 and 4 so that it comes to position 2. So for that what we do is we do node dot next and assign a value current to it because we know that current is pointing to previous next which was this node. So now 6 next will point to this node and this way with this three step you can see that we have inserted our node in between node 1 and 4 and after this assignment you can see that 6 is now inserted at position which we wanted which is position 2 in this case. So friend this is the code to insert a node in a singly linked list at a given position. So now let's test its working in the main method. So here in the main method, I will comment this part and let's say after creation of singly linked list, head is pointing to null because here you can see that at the start head is pointing to null. So here what we do is, let's say we insert a node at position 1, value as 3 and then let's say I print it on the console the singly linked list using the display method. So if I run the code now, so here you can see it inserted at position 1 which is the first position having only one node 3 pointing to null. Now let's say what we do is, at position 2 we assign 5. And if you run the code, so here you can see at position 1 was 3, so position 2, we got value 5. And now what we do is, let's at position 1, we insert value 2. So now here you can see, at position 1, 3 is already there, and if we are doing this, it means 2 will come before 3. So if I run the code now, so here you can see 2 came before 3, which was our this case. So now let's see the else part. Let's say I insert a value 4. between 1 and 2. So we'll do 2 and if I run the code now, so here you can see initially singly linked list was 2, 3 and 5 and when we did that, 4 came in between 2 and 3 which is the position 2 which we actually wanted. Now here after this insertion you can see there are 4 nodes, 2, 4, 3, 5. And let's say if you want to insert at the end, so the position would be value 5 because 4 nodes are already there. So here what we do is, at position 5, we want to insert value 7 let's say. If I run the code, so you can see 7 inserted at the end of the singly linked list which is position 5. So friends here we saw different use cases, at the first step the singly linked list became something like this. And when we inserted 
5 at position 2 it became something like this and then we inserted value 2 at position 1 so 3 got shifted ahead and our singly linked list became something like this I will just copy this part so it would be 2 it became something like this because 2 inserted at position 1 and rest of the singly linked list shifted by 1 position and then we inserted 4 at position 2 so it became something like this it was like this so at position 2 4 came and rest of the list nodes were shifted by 1 position and here you can see that we had this 4 nodes already so at the position 5 we inserted 7 so it became something like this I will copy this Seven null. So which is our this case? So friend, this is how we actually insert a node in a singly linked list at a given position. I hope you have find this information useful. And in case if you find this information useful then please like this video and if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel so that you never miss any update. Thanks have a nice day. Hello everyone. So in this video we will discuss that how we can delete the first node of a singly linked list. So let's see the code and its working step by step using an animation. So here you can see that let's say we are given a singly linked list having three nodes with data is 10, 1 and 11 where head is pointing to the first node and let's say in our singly linked list class we have created this head as an instance variable and we have written one of the method in that class which will manipulate this singly linked list. So here you can see that this is the code to delete the first element of the singly linked list. So let's see the demonstration of this method that how it manipulates the singly linked list and deletes the first node. So when we call delete first method you can see it has a return type of list node. So what it will do it will delete the first node and it will return from this method. So when we call delete first the first step we check is whether head is equal to null or not. Because if head is equal to null, it means head is pointing to null and there are no nodes to delete. So we simply return null. So currently you can see that head is pointing to a node having value as 10. So therefore this condition comes out to be false. And the execution point reaches here. Now here what we do is, we create a temporary variable which will also point to the first node of the singly linked list because head is always pointing to the first node. Now why we are creating this temporary variable is because when we delete this node we need to return it from this method. So we are creating this temporary variable of type list node and whatever the reference value head is holding we are simply assigning it to the temporary variable. So as head is pointing to this first node after this assignment there will be a temporary list node which will also point to this node. Moving ahead. Now as the temporary list node is pointing to the first node of the singly linked list. After its deletion, the linked list will have only two nodes and head should point to the second node now because when we delete the first node, the linked list remains with the two nodes and the second node becomes our new head. So we need to traverse this head to the second node. So how we will do that? We will simply assign the value head.next to head. So head is pointing to this node. Its next is pointing to the second node. So once we assign head.next to head, it would look something like this. 
that now Hades simply traverses the second node, and as Hades traverses the second node, we can safely delete this first node. Moving ahead, so here you can see that Hades pointing now to the second node, and this will be our newly singly linked list because we have deleted the first node. But if we return this temporary list node directly from this method. these two nodes will also get written along with this temporary list node because there is still a linkage here so what we do is in order to break this linkage we simply assign null value to temp next so temp is pointing to this node and its next is pointing to the second node so we need to break this linkage so after assigning null it would look something like this you can see we have completely separated the first node from the singly linked list so at the last step we simply return this temporary list node and after deletion of the first node now our linked list has only two nodes with a new head pointing to the second node which has now become the first node of the singly linked list so friends let's say if you want to perform delete first again so we call delete first again on this singly linked list having two nodes so it would look something like this we check whether head is equal to null or not so head is pointing to this node therefore condition in if block comes out to be false we again create a temporary list node which will point to the first node of the singly linked list because we are assigning the value of head to it after assigning this value we simply traverse head from this node to its next because we want to delete this node so by assigning head dot next to head head will not point to the second node of the singly linked list then we'll simply break this linkage here by assigning null value to temps next and finally we'll return the temp so now our singly linked list has only one element so by calling this delete first two times we have deleted two nodes which were at the beginning of the singly linked list so let's say we want to delete this node also so we'll call delete first again we check whether head is equal to null or not so here head is pointing to this node therefore it's not equal to null so this condition comes out to be false we create a temporary list node pointing to head something like this and then we'll simply traverse head to its next because we want to delete this node so by assigning the value head dot next to head what will happen head is pointing to this node and its next is pointing to null because this is the only node left in our singly linked list So now head will points to next which is null. We simply assign null to temp dot next to break this linkage. But as it is already pointing to null, it would look something like this. And we can return this temporary node because we have deleted it completely. So now our singly linked list has no elements. and head is pointing to null so if we call delete first again we first check whether head is equal to null or not so here you can see now head is equal to null so therefore this condition comes out to be true and as there are no nodes left to be deleted we simply return null so friends this was the algorithm to delete the first node of a singly linked list we saw that singly linked list had three elements at the start we call this method delete first four times to delete this all the nodes from the singly linked list so now let's go to eclipse and see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step i hope you like this video thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in this video we'll write the code to delete the first node of a singly linked list so here you can see that we have the singly linked list class having an instance variable head of type list node so this head is responsible for holding 
complete list. In our previous lecture, we also saw the different operations such as length, where we can get to know the length of the singly linked list. And even we can display the data which is being present in the singly linked list. We also discussed about the insert first method and insert last method. So let's say if I run this code now. So here you can see that we have inserted four nodes 11, 8, 1, 10, and then it's null. So here we have inserted these four nodes and we have displayed the singly linked list here. So let's write the code and see that how we can delete the first node of a singly linked list. So here I'll be creating one method as public list node. delete first. So here you can see that after deleting the first node, we'll simply return it from this method. So as we discussed in our previous video, that in delete first, the first condition we check is, we see whether head is equal to null or not. So if head is equal to null, then we simply return null, which means that singly linked list is empty and there are no nodes left to be deleted. We can even throw an exception from here. But for timing, I'm returning null. And then we also discussed that after if condition, we create a temporary variable and we point it to the head. So here you can see that why we have assigned the value of head to temp because after deleting the first node, we have to return this list node from this method. And also head points to the first node of a singly linked list. So for example, let's say we want to delete the first node from the singly linked list. So head points to 11. And once we delete 11, head should point to 8 now because there are three more elements left. So head should point to 8. So here after assigning head to this temporary variable, now we can simply move head to its next position by simply assigning head dot next to head. So here as head was pointing to 11, now it will point to 8. So now after placing head to its correct position, we can simply delete the first node by assigning null value to tem dot next in order to break the linkage between this temporary node and the rest of the list. And finally, we can return the deleted node. So this is the code. Now let's test it's working. So here after display, what we'll do is, we will simply print the deleted node's data. So here what we'll do SSL dot, we will call delete first method. So this will return as the list node which we have deleted and then we can simply print its data and then after deleting the data what we can do is we can again print the singly linked list and if I run the code now so here you can see that we removed the first node which is 11 and we printed its data here and then after deleting the first node the singly linked list was left with 8, 1 and 10. So similarly, let's say if I remove one more node and if I run the code now, so here you can see that when we call delete first for the first time, 11 was removed. Then we called it second time, so 8 was removed, which got printed here. And finally, when we did display, so the linked list was printed as 1 and 10 because we have removed 11 and then 8. So friend, this is how we actually delete the first node of a singly linked list. I hope you like this video. Thanks. Have a nice day. Hello everyone. So in this video, we will discuss about how to delete last node of a singly linked list. So here you can see that this is the algorithm to delete 
the last node of a singly linked list. So let's say we are given a singly linked list having these three nodes and we want to delete the last node of a singly linked list. So here the singly linked list can contain n number of nodes. And here if we take this example where head is pointing to a node having value as 10, 10 is pointing to 1, 1 is pointing to 11 and finally 11 is pointing to null. So there are three nodes. And if we apply this algorithm, when we call delete last, first 11 will be deleted and we will be left with two nodes. And if we again call delete last, then one will be deleted and we will be left with one node. If we again call delete last, then the only node left will be removed and simply returned from this method. So in our previous video, we saw that how we can delete the first node of a singly linked list. So there as head pointed to the first node, it was very easy to delete the first node of the singly linked list. But here, as we want to delete the last node, we need to somehow traverse to the second last node and remove this link to delete the last node from the singly linked list. So in order to achieve that, what we do is we create two pointers, one by name current, which travels to the last node and one pointer by name previous, which travels to the second last node. So as current travels to the last node, previous travels to the second last node. And why we need the second last node? Because in order to free the last node, we need to break this linkage here. So we need to traverse somehow to the second last node, break this link to make this node free. So this is the algorithm for that. Now let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step. So when we call delete last for the first time, we first check whether head is equal to null or not. So head is pointing to this node. So this condition is false. And we also check whether head dot next is equal to null or not. Now why we perform this check is because let's say if the linked list has only one single node. So this node next will point to null and this will be the only node in the singly linked list. So we don't have to delete anything. We simply have to return the head because this is the only node which we want to return from this method. So currently head dot next is also not equal to null. Therefore this both the condition comes out to be false. And now as we discussed, we create two pointers current and previous. So we start current from the head by assigning the value head to it. So it would look something like this. And as head is pointing to the first node, its previous node will simply point to null. Moving ahead. Now friend, as we want to delete the last node, we need to provide a while loop so that we can traverse current to the last node of the singly linked list and previous to the second last node. So here if you see in the while loop, we are providing condition that iterate till current dot next is not equal to null. So here when current will reach to the last node, its next will point to null. So this while loop will terminate when current dot next becomes null. So as current is pointing to this first node and its next is not equal to null. Therefore, this condition comes out to be true and while loop executes. So before moving current to its next node, what we do is we simply assign current's value to previous so that previous is, is one node behind the current when current travels to the second node. So in the first step, we simply assign the value of current to previous. So it would look something like this. Now as current is pointing to the first node, previous will also point to this first node. And in the second step, we simply move current by one position by assigning current's next value to current. So current next is pointing to the second node. So now current will point to the second node. So here you can see we have traversed current to the second node and previous is just one node behind it. So this is all we do in the while loop till current reaches to the last node and previous reaches to the second last node. So let's see how. We again check current dot next is equal to null or not. So current next is not equal to null. This condition comes out to be true. And before moving current to its next position, we make sure previous is at current's position. 
by assigning current value to previous. So it would look something like this. Then we simply move current to its next position by assigning current dot next to current. So current dot next is pointing to this third node. So after this assignment, current will point to this node. Moving ahead. Now friends, here you can see that we have these three nodes, but in singly linked list there can be n number of nodes. So the only idea to delete the last node of the singly linked list is we need a reference to the second last node of the singly linked list so that we can remove this linkage. So now here you can see current has reached to the last node and previous is on the second last node. So here the condition current dot next not equal to null comes out to be false because current next is pointing to null. So this while loop terminates which makes sense because we have traversed till the last node using the current pointer and we also know its second last position using this previous pointer. So after this while loop the next step we do is we assign a null value to previous next. And why we do so? Because we want to break this link so that this last node can be freed up. So previous is pointing to the second last node. Its next is pointing to the last node and we want to delete the last node. So we break this link by assigning null value to previous next. So it would look something like this. And finally we return the current. So after the deletion of the third node we are left with two nodes. So let's say we again call this algorithm. Head is pointing to the first node, so it's not null, and head dot next is pointing to the second node, which is also not null. So this condition comes out to be false. We again create current and previous nodes by assigning head to current and null to previous. So it would look something like this. Current points to the first node and previous points to null. And then we provide a while loop because we want to traverse current to the last node and previous to the second last node. So first we check whether current's or next is equal to null or not. So current's next is this second node. It's not equal to null. So the condition in while loop comes out to be true and while loop starts execution. Before moving current to its next, we assign current's value to previous so that it is just behind the current. So it would look something like this. That now previous is pointing to this node because current is pointing to this node. And now we'll simply traverse current to its next position by assigning current dot next to current. So current is pointing to this node, its next is pointing to the second node. So after this assignment, it would look something like this. And then again in while loop we'll check whether current dot next is equal to null or not. So here you can see that this singly linked list contains only two nodes and current is actually on the last node and previous is on the second last node. And as current next is pointing to null, current will be pointing to the last element of the singly linked list. So this condition comes out to be false and while loop exits. And now we'll simply assign null value to previous next because we want to break this link so that this node can be freed up. So it would look something like this. That null is assigned to previous next. Finally we return current. So now we are left with only one node. So let's call this algorithm again. So here you can see head is pointing to first node which is not null. So this condition is false. But head dot next is pointing to null. Head dot next is pointing to null. Which signifies that singly linked list has only one element. Because head is pointing to the first node and its next is pointing to null. So therefore this list has only one node. And if we want to delete that, we don't have to do anything. We simply return head. So friend, this was the algorithm 
where we discussed that how we can delete the last node of the singly linked list we also discussed that how current and previous pointers help us in deleting the last node because in order to delete the last node we somehow need to travel to the second last node and once we travel to the second last node we simply assign null value to its next so that the last node can be freed up and can be returned from this method so friends now let's go to eclipse and see the demonstration of this algorithm i hope you like this video thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in our previous video we saw the demonstration using an animation and we discussed that how we can delete the last node of a singly linked list so in this video we will see that how we can code a method to delete the last node of a singly linked list and in one of our previous video we also saw that how we can delete the first node so let's say i just comment out the delete first method and if i run the code now you can see we have inserted this four nodes using insert last method and the singly linked list contains 11 8 1 and 10 which are four nodes and which got displayed using the display method now let's say we write the code to delete the last element of a singly linked list so here when we call delete last for the first time 10 will be removed because it is the last element of the singly linked list so here i'll create a method as public list node delete last and after deleting the last node we'll simply return it from this method so in our previous video we discussed that the first thing we do is we simply check that whether head is equal to null or not and we also check that head dot next is equal to null or not now why we do it because this condition head equals equals null will signify that singly linked list is already empty and there are no nodes to be deleted and head dot next why we do it because if head dot next is null it means the singly linked list is only one element so what we do is we simply return head so if the first condition is true null is returned and if the second condition is true the head is returned because this is the only node in the singly linked list so this is the if condition and after that what we do is in order to delete the last node we need to somehow traverse to the second last node and remove the linkage so how we can achieve that in our previous video we discussed that we can create two pointers one is the current which will start from head and other is previous which will be always be previous to current and why we do so because once current reaches to the last node previous is already at the second last node and we can simply remove the linkage by using this previous node and finally return the last node which got deleted so here at the start current points to head and previous points to null and then we need to provide a while loop so that we can reach to the last node of the singly linked list so the condition we provide here is we simply check whether current's next is equal to null or not so if current next is equal to null it signifies that we have reached to the last node of the singly linked list because last node's next points to null so inside this while loop what we do is we move current by one position and before moving current to one position ahead we simply assign current's value to previous so that previous always remains one node behind the current so that when current reaches the last node previous is at the second last node and once we get the location of the second last node 
we can simply remove the last node from the singly linked list by simply putting previous dot next equals null so this breaks the chain of the singly linked list from the last node so here what we do is we do previous and assign the value current to it and after this assignment we simply move current to its next position by assigning current dot next to current and this while loop goes till current reaches the last position and previous reaches the second last position so after this while loop terminates one last step we do is we do previous dot next equals null because this will break the chain between the singly linked list and the last node because previous is pointing to the second last node and its next is pointing to the last node and we want to delete the last node so we simply assign null value to previous next so this will break break the chain and finally we simply return the current because you have deleted this node so we simply return it from this method so now let's test its working so here we have this list of four nodes 11 8 1 10 10 so let's remove the last node of the singly linked list which is 10 so i'll just uncomment this part and instead of delete first i will do delete last because we are removing the last element and then i'll simply print the singly linked list again if i run the code so here you can see that initially the list contained four nodes then we called a delete last which removed the last node and returned from this method and then we simply printed its data which came out to be 10 so here you can see the 10 is the last node of the singly linked list and after that i again printed the singly linked list which came out to be 11 8 and 1 because 10 is already removed so similarly let's say if i remove one more data and if i run the code now so here you can see first 10 got removed by this method and then when we called again delete last one was removed so the singly linked list now has only 11 and 8 10 and 1 are removed So friend in this video we saw that how we can delete the last node of a singly linked list I hope you like this video thanks have a nice day Hello everyone so in this video we will discuss that how we can delete a node from a singly linked list at a given position In our previous videos we saw that how we can insert a node in a singly linked list at a given position So now we'll see that how we can delete a node from a given position in a singly linked list. So here you can see let's say we want to implement a method to delete a node at a given position. So for example let's say if we are given with this singly linked list and we need to write a method delete which will take in a position and we are assuming the position to be valid which means it should lie in the boundaries of the singly linked list. and which should start from 1 so let's say in this singly linked list if you want to delete a node at position 1 then that would be this node which is the first node of a singly linked list so we are assuming that it should start from 1 and let's say if you want to delete a position 3 so this is position 1 position 2 position 3 so this is the node which you want to delete and we are assuming the position to be valid here so let's say if our singly linked list has four nodes and if we pass position as 6 then either we need to throw an exception or we can assign a position to a value which points to the last node of the singly linked list so based on these two assumptions let's see the algorithm so before we start in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel so that you never miss any update so let's say if you are given with this singly linked list having three nodes 
सो देर आर आइज थ्री केसेस वेर वी कैन डिलीट अ नोट फ्रॉम द सिंगली लिंक लिस्ट वन वुड वी इफ यू प्रोवाइड द पोजिशन एज वन देन वी आर टेलिंग दैट वी वॉन्ट टू डिलीट द फर्स्ट नोट ऑफ द सिंगली लिंक लिस्ट एंड लेट्स एफ यू प्रोवाइड पोजिशन टू देन वी आर सेंग दैट वी नीड टू डिलीट द सेकेंड नोट विच इज बिटवीन नोट वन एंड नोट थ्री एंड एज वी आर एज्यूमिंग दैट वी आर स्टार्टिंग फ्रॉम पोजिशन वन विथ फर्स्ट नोट हियर नोट हैविंग डेटा इज एट विल बी पोजिशन वन दिस वुड बी पोजिशन टू एंड वी वॉन्ट टू डिलीट दिस नोट and after this deletion node having value is 8 will not point to this node it will point to node 1 and the third case would be let's say if you want to delete the last node so we'll pass the position as 3 this is position 1 position 2 and position 3 so this node will be deleted and the second last node which is this node will point to null after this deletion so let's see these three cases so let's say if you want to delete the first node so we simply provide a position as 1 so in the code we simply check whether position is equal to 1 or not so if position is equal to 1 then if part will be executed and in order to delete this node which is being referred by head what we simply do is we simply assign value of head dot next to head so head dot next is the second node so we'll simply assign head dot next value to head so now head will point to the second node so it looks like this so as we are deleting the first node head is pointing to that node so we can't directly delete this node because if we directly delete this node then rest of the nodes will also get removed so first we do is we simply assign head dot next value to head so that the rest of the singly linked list is being referred by head because after deleting this node our singly linked list will become 10 1 and null so once this assignment is done this node is being not referred by any other node so this will be garbage collected so it looks something like this that now our singly linked list becomes head is pointing to node having value as 10 and node having value as 10 is pointing to a node having value as 1 moving ahead now let's say if we are given with this singly linked list having four nodes and let's say if i want to delete any node in between of the singly linked list so let's say if we call delete method with value as 3 which means we want to delete the node at position 3 which is this node now friend as it is a singly linked list in order to delete this node we need to somehow traverse to its previous node so how we can traverse to this previous node is let's see the algorithm we check whether position is equal to 1 or not so position is equal to 3 so this condition comes out to be false in the else part as we want to delete the node at position 3 we need to somehow reach to position 2 so what we do is we simply create a temporary list node by name previous we'll assign a value head to it so it will simply start from the first node and our task is to make it reach to a node having value as position minus 1 so here as we have already started with head we will create a count variable having value as 1 because this count variable will help us reaching previous to a node just previous to a position from where we want to delete this node which is this position so we need to provide a while loop and in this while loop we provide a condition as count should be less than position minus 1 so position value is 3 and if we do minus 1 it becomes 2 so 1 is less than 2 so the condition in while loop comes out to be true and inside this while loop we simply traverse previous to its next position by assigning previous dot next to previous so previous next is pointing to this node so after this assignment previous will point to its next node via this reference so it would look something like this and as we have incremented previous to by one position will increment count by one so count becomes 2 now we'll again check whether value of count which is 2 is less than position minus 1 or not so 3 minus 1 is 2 so 2 is not less than 2 
so this condition comes out to be false and while loop will terminate and here you can see that as we want to delete the third portion we have reached to portion 2 via this while loop so after this while loop now our task is to delete the node at portion 3 now as you want to delete this node and after its deletion this node next should point to this node because we don't want to remove this node along with this node we only want to remove this node so our task is to break this link and create a link from this node to a node after the node which we want to delete so at the first step what we do is we can't directly remove this link here because if we remove this link then this complete singly linked list will be garbage collected and in order to reach this node we also need a pointer to this node as well because if we have pointer to this node then we can use its next value to reach this node because we want to somehow assign previous next value which is this value to this node so at the first step what we are doing is we are creating a temporary list node having value as current and we are assigning previous next value which is this node so it would look something like this that current is pointing to previous next and after this it becomes very easy to delete this node as we discussed previous next should not point to this node it should point to this node the node next to our current so what we do is we simply assign value current dot next to previous dot next so here you can see current next is pointing to this node and previous next is pointing to current so we need to break this link and we want this link to point to current's next because if we break this link and we assign it to this node then this node can be freed up easily so when this assignment will be done current next value which is this node will now get referred by previous next so it would look something like this that this link will go away and previous next will now point to current's next so it would look something like this that now previous next is pointing to current's next because we want to free this node from the singly linked list and after this assignment when this method will get complete we know that current was part of this method as a local variable so now current will be simply garbage collected because there won't be any reference to this node after this method gets over so it would look something like this that it would be deleted and now if we rearrange it it would look something like this that now node 10 is pointing to node 1 so this was the case when we deleted a node which was between the singly linked list so now let's say if we are given with this singly linked list and we want to delete the last node which is at position 3 so we'll call delete method we'll pass the position as 3 and the algorithm remains the same at the first step we check whether position is equal to 1 or not so position is equal to 3 so this condition comes out to be false now as we want to delete the node at position 3 we somehow need to traverse to position 2 so for that we create a temporary list node previous which starts from head we create an integer variable count which starts from 1 so now in order to reach to a node which is previous to node which we want to delete we simply provide a while loop so now here you can see this count variable will help this previous to reach to a position which is just before the node which you want to delete so we provide condition as count should be less than position minus one because we have initialized already count by one and previous is already pointing to head so here you can see that value of count is one if we do position minus one we get three minus one which is two so one is less than two so this condition comes out to be true and inside this while loop we simply traverse previous to its next node by assigning previous dot next value to previous so previous is pointing to this node and its next is pointing to this node so after this assignment previous will point to second node via this link
will increment count by one. Count becomes two. And now here you can see this condition comes out to be false because two is not less than two. So this while loop will terminate, and we know that we have reached to a node which is just previous to node which we want to delete, which is at position three. So the first step, what we are doing is we are simply creating a list node current, which will hold the value of previous dot next. So previous dot next is this node, which we want to delete. So current will point to this node. And now using previous and current, we'll simply break this link, and we'll assign this link to current's next, because we want to free this node. So we can only free this node if we break this link. So here, what we do is, we simply assign value of current next, which is null, to previous next. So this link will go away, and previous next will point to current's next. So after this method gets over, here you can see, current was a local variable, so this node won't be referred by any other node. So this will be simply garbage collected. And our singly linked list will become a list having two nodes, eight and ten, and the last node will be removed. So, friends, in this video, we saw that how we can delete a node from a given position in a singly linked list. I hope you have find this information useful. And in case if you have find this information useful, then please like this video. And if you are new to my channel, then please subscribe to my channel so that you never miss any update. Thanks. Have a nice day. Hello everyone. So in our previous video, we discussed about that how we can delete a node from a singly linked list at a given position. So in our last video, we saw the animation of the algorithm step by step. Now in this video, we'll actually code the algorithm and we'll test its working. So in our singly linked list class, which has a head of type list node as an instance variable, here we have coded many methods. Which are part of singly linked list. Now here, I will be coding the method as delete, which will take in a position, and based on that position, that particular node will be deleted from the singly linked list. So let's say I give the method name as public void delete, which takes in a position. So friends here. You can even return the list node which you just deleted via this method, but I am keeping it as void. And here we are assuming that position is valid and starting from one. So let's say, for example, our linked list has few nodes such as three, four. Seven, eight, and let's say nine. Now here you can see the linked list has five nodes: three, four, seven, eight, and nine. So three is at position one, four at position two, seven at position three, eight at position four, and nine at position five. So let's say if you want to delete. The node from position one, so this node will be removed, and then linked list will have this these nodes. If we want to delete a node which is in between, then let's say if we want to delete node as three, so seven will be deleted, and the remaining list will be three, four, eight, and nine. Here four will simply point to eight, and seven will be removed from the singly linked list. And let's say if we want to delete the last node. So here you can see, as there are five nodes, and if we pass the position as five, then nine will be deleted. So let's see the algorithm. So based on our assumptions that position is valid, and starting from one, we provide a else condition. The first step we check whether if position is equal to one, which means if position is equal to one, it means that we are simply removing. The first node of the singly linked list. So here, as head is pointing to the first node, after its removal, 
head should point to the second node so we'll simply assign head dot next value to head so for example here if you see head is pointing to node 3 and if you want to delete the node from position 1 then after node 3 gets deleted our singly linked list will become 4 7 8 9 because head will now point to 4 so we can simply do head equals to head dot next which will assign the next value which is this value to head so this is the first case so in the else part we will see that how we can remove a node from a singly linked list which is in between of these nodes or at the end of the singly linked list so both these cases will be covered in else part so here let's suppose if you want to delete the fourth node which is at position 4 now the idea behind this algorithm is which we also discussed in our previous video when we did for the insert here what we do is in order to remove 8 from the singly linked list we need to break this linkage from 7 to 8 and instead of 7 pointing to 8 7 should now point to 9 and once 7 will point to 9 8 will be removed from the singly linked list so in order to break this linkage we need to first traverse to this node which is just behind this node because we need to use this reference remove this reference link and make sure that 7 now points to 9 so in order to reach the previous node from 8 what we do is we simply create a temporary list node previous and we start it from the head and then we'll provide a while loop so that we can reach to this node so how we can reach to this node is we will create a counter variable and as previous is already pointing to head we'll assign it with one and now using count and position we will reach to this node so in the while loop we provide condition as count should be less than position minus 1 so when count is less than position minus 1 this while loop will keep on iterating and with each iteration will simply traverse previous to its next position by assigning previous dot next to previous and we'll simply increment count by one so friends when previous will reach to node 7 the value of count will become 3 and here you can see we pass the value of position as 4 because we want to delete 8 so 4 minus 1 is 3 so 3 is not less than 3 so after this while loop will terminate in order to assign 7 next to 9 because we want to break this linkage here what we do is we first reach to 8 and how we can reach to 8 is here you can see previous is already pointing to 7 because we have reached to 7 in this while loop so here we will create a temporary node current and we provide the values previous dot next so this is the previous and if we do dot next we will reach here so current will point to node having value as 8 and now as we want to point 7 next to 9 what we simply do here is to previous dot next which is currently pointing to 8 we will assign the value as current dot next because current next is pointing to 9 so now 7 next will point to 9 instead of 8 via this line so after this line this link will be gone and there will be link from 7 to 9 so 8 once this method gets terminated 8 will be garbage collected so this is the code to delete a node from a singly linked list from a given position so in our main method now let's test its working so here in our previous video we discussed about the insert method so let's say if i run the code now 
you see the currently the linked list has five nodes two four three five seven so we'll use the same linked list and we'll delete the first node the node in the middle and the last node so here if i do delete one which is at position one so this is the singly linked list which we saw while running the program so two will be removed so let's run it so here you can see it printed 4357 because two got removed and now let's say let's say now linked list has 4357 and we want to remove node 5 which is at position 3 because 2 is already removed and we are removing 5 which is at position 3 so we'll call delete with position 3 so now it should print 4 3 7 because 5 will be removed so here you see it printed 4 3 7 now we have 4 3 7 and let's say we want to remove the last node which is 7 so 4 is at position 1, 3 is at position 2 and the last node 7 is at position 3. So we'll again call delete with position 3. And if I run it should print 4 and 3. So here you can see it printed 4 and 3. So friend this is how we can delete a node from a singly linked list from a given position. And here we are assuming that position should be valid, that it should lie into the boundaries of our singly linked list. So friends, I hope you have liked this information. And in case if you like this information, then please like this video. And if you are new to my channel, then please subscribe to my channel so that you never miss any update. Thanks. Have a nice day. Hello friends. Welcome to my new data structures and algorithm in Java tutorial series video. Friends, in this tutorial we will discuss how to search an element in a linked list in Java. So friends, in our previous tutorial we discussed how to create a singly linked list and also we discussed about the few of the concepts associated with the linked list. So in this tutorial we will discuss how to search an element in a singly linked list through a Java program. So here you see that there is a simple linked list having say 4 nodes with the data as 10, 8, 1. 11 and we are having a head which is pointing to the first node so let's say suppose we want to search for a key having a data with a value 1 so looking at the linked list we can see that the third node has a data with a value 1 so in order to search this key there is an algorithm for it which can search this key into this singly linked list so let's demonstrate this algorithm quickly so so in order to search this key into the singly linked list what we'll do we'll first create a, a node which will name as current and this current will point to the head so which is the first node over our linked list now moving ahead so idea behind this algorithm is we will traverse the singly linked list completely till the end and we'll check for the data and we'll match it with the search key and if it is if they are equal then we'll return true and if they are not then we'll return false in a while loop, we'll place a condition that whether current is not equal to null. Till then, loop this. So currently, we see this current is pointing to the first node, so it's not null. So we'll, it will go into the while loop. And it will check that whether current.data is equal to the search key. So currently, the current.data points to 10. Because the data inside this first node is 10. So we'll check that whether 1 is equal to 10 or not. So it's not equal to 10. So this condition comes out to be false and we'll go to next step. So we will just traverse the current to its next. So if we, if you see this current points to first and its next points to the second node. So we'll traverse the current to the second node. Moving ahead. So again in while loop we will check whether current is equal to null or not. So here current points to the second node. So it's not null. So it enters the while loop. 
and then we'll check whether current dot data is equal to the search key or not. So here current dot data points to eight, and we'll check there whether one is equal to eight or not. One is not equal to eight, so this condition comes out to be false, and we'll go to the next step. So the next step is, so what we'll do, we'll just traverse the current node to its next. So if you see the current points to the second node and its next, which is this points to the third node. So we'll traverse it to the third node. And then again, we'll execute the condition in while loop. We'll see that current is not equal to null because it's points to the third node and we'll go inside the loop. And here we'll check whether current dot data is equal to search key or not. So current dot data, which is equal to one. Here we see that search key and current dot data are equal. So we have actually found our element. So what we'll do? So we'll just we'll just return true, and we'll print a message as that search key found. So similarly. If we see the negative condition that whether suppose we want to make a search for the key having a value 12. So looking into the list, we see that 12 is not inside this linked list. So we'll see the algorithm of it. So first we'll create a current node, which will point to the head. So below we'll check whether this current is equal to null or not. And similarly, we'll see whether this current dot data is equal to search key or not. So for the first iteration is not equal. So we'll simply traverse the current to the second node. We'll again check whether current is equal to null or not. So we see this current is not equal to null. So this while loop executes and current dot data is also not equal to search key. So We'll just traverse the current to the third node. And similarly, we'll again check whether current is equal to null or not. So as current points to third node, so it's not equal to null. So the while loop executes and we'll check there whether current dot data is equal to search key or not. So one is not equal to 12. So again, this condition fails and we'll just so we'll just traverse the current to its next node, which is the fourth node. And again, we will check whether current is equal to null or not. So it's not equal to null. We'll check current dot data is equal to search key or not. So current dot data is 11 and search key is 12, so they are not equal. So we'll traverse the current to its next. So now here you see that last nodes next point to the null so the current dot next is null so we'll assign null to this current so it will be something like this so now current points to null and if we now execute the while loop so we'll see that whether current is equal to null or not so if current is equal to null so this while loop condition breaks out and we'll simply return false that search key not found so friend, this was all about our demo. Now we'll see how we can code this in Java. So we'll go to our Eclipse. Initially in our previous tutorials, we, we created a singly linked list, which say if I run the program, so this singly linked list was something like this 10, 8, 1 and 11 and then null. So in this tutorial, we'll first code the algorithm. So we'll create a public method public and we'll give a return type as boolean and we'll create a method say find. And to this method, we'll give list node the head and integer say search key. So basically this method takes in a head and a search key. So our first thing will be if say, let's say if head is equals to null. So suppose we have a linked list where head points to null. So we'll just return 
false and then we'll say code whatever we discussed into the slide so we'll create a current node and make it point to head so now we'll give a while loop so inside this while loop we'll say current node equals to null so we'll iterate till current equals null so inside this while loop we'll provide a condition with what we discussed in the slide as when current dot data equals search key then just return true and after if we'll just traverse the current to its next node so current to current will provide current dot next value and if the current reaches the end and the search key is not found we'll just simply return false so into our main method what we'll do we'll create a if condition and let's say here we'll say singly link list dot find and to find we'll provide head and provide a value one so one is into the singly link list so we'll provide a value one and we'll sys out as search key found or we'll say else search key not found so we saw that the link list which we created in our previous tutorial has the value as 10 at 1 and 11 so first we are considering the positive case we know that 1 is in the list so we'll just run the java program So you see it prints the search key found because one is in the singly linked list. Now let's say suppose you want find whether the linked list contains the value 12 or not. So we know that it doesn't contain the value 12. So if I run it, so it prints search key not found. So friends, in this tutorial we discussed how we can search an element in a linked list through a java program hope you like this video please like comment share and subscribe my youtube channel you can also visit my blog the link is provided in the description thanks have a nice day hello friends welcome to my new data structures and algorithm in java tutorial series video friends in this tutorial we will discuss how to reverse a singly linked list in java so friends suppose we have a linked list with nodes say 10, 8, 1, 11 and we provide this linked list as an input so after its reversal the linked list becomes something as 11, 1, 8, 10 so basically it reverses the list so here 10, 8, 1, 11 gets reversed and becomes 11, 11, 1, 8, 10 so let's see this algorithm through a demo so here we see a singly linked list having four nodes say 10, 8, 1, 11 and where head points to the first node. So in order to reverse this singly linked list here is the algorithm. So we'll see how this algorithm makes the singly linked list reverse. So the first step of execution would be we'll create a list node by the name say current and a value of head will be assigned to it. So, so currently head points to the first node so similarly the current will point to the first node which is 10 and moving ahead then we'll create one more node which will point to null so the name of this node would be previous moving ahead we'll create a node by the name next and we'll assign a null value to it so the basic idea of this algorithm is to traverse each node one by one and and apply some logic to reverse the position of the nodes so in order to traverse each node one by one we'll apply a while loop and in while loop we'll place a condition that till current becomes null we'll iterate this while loop so here we'll see this current points to first node and it's not null so this while loop executes and then what we'll do 
here we see this next point to null so we'll assign the current's next node to it so if you see current points to the first node and its next point to the second node so we'll assign current's next value to the next node so then it will become something like this moving ahead here you see the current next which is this pointer it points to the second node and previous points to the null so idea is to break this pointer and provide it a null value so we what we have done is we will do current dot next and we'll assign a null value to it so it will look something like this so moving ahead and to our previous node we'll assign a value which current holds so it will be the first node so it will become something like this moving ahead and then to simply current will assign the value which is in the next so after the first iteration if i rearrange this nodes it would look something like this so this is the condition with the first while loop now we'll again execute the while loop and we'll see that current is equal to null or not so current points to the second node which is not null so this while loop executes then we'll will will perform the same steps so here we'll provide the current's next value to the next node so here current next is the third node we'll assign current next value to the next node and similarly to current next we'll provide the value which is present in the previous so so here if you see that current next pointer points to the third node so we'll remove this link and we'll assign it what the previous holds so here previous points to the first node so we'll do something like this so the currents next now points to the previous which is the first node so moving ahead to this previous now we'll assign the value current so moving ahead now we'll simply assign whatever the value present in the next to the current so the current traverses to the third node we'll again iterate the while loop and we'll check whether current is equal to null or not so here current points to the third node which is not equal to null so this loop executes and similarly now we'll assign current next value to the next so it will look something like this moving ahead and to current next we'll assign to the previous so it becomes something like this moving ahead will make previous point to current and finally will make current to point to the value which next points so it will tell us the fourth node and again we'll check whether current is equal to null or not so it's not equal to null so now next point to current's next so so here current's next points to null therefore the next will be pointing to null moving ahead and to currents next will assign the previous node value so it will look something like this and will traverse previous to point to current so it will look something like this so finally will assign current the value of next which is null so now we'll again execute while loop and we'll see whether current equals null or not so here current equals null so therefore this condition comes out to be false and the while loop breaks out so the last step would be to return the previous so this previous becomes our new head so if you see the initially head pointed to 10 and then 8 1 11 and now as previous becomes our new head so now the linked list is reversed so the first node is 11 second is 1 third is 8 and fourth is 10 and then it points to null so here previous becomes our new head and we ex exit our algorithm so friends let's go to eclipse and see demonstration of this algorithm so friends in our previous tutorial we created one singly linked list so here if i just remove this part and if i run this 
Java program. So you see, we initially we have created a singly linked list having the nodes as 10, 8, 1, 11, and they are interconnected. So let's reverse the singly linked list. So in order to reverse the singly linked, what we'll do? We'll create a method whose return type is the list node and we'll give a method name as reverse so this reverse method will take the head of the singly linked list so we'll say list node head now the first step would be we'll simply check whether head points to null so if it points to null we'll return the head so if head equals null so we'll simply return head and moving ahead we'll code our algorithm so we'll create a list node say current and assign a value of head to it then we'll create a list node previous and assign null value to it will create a list node next and assign a null value to it and now we'll create a while loop so the condition in while loop would be current not equals null so here while loop execute till current becomes null so here to our next we'll assign the value as current dot next and to current dot next will assign value as previous to previous will assign the value which current holds and finally to our current will assign the value which next variable holds and the last step would be to simply return previous because previous becomes our new head so we'll return the previous so this is the algorithm so let's see its demonstration so here I will call the reverse and provide the head and list node So whatever the return from this reverse method will be our head of the reverse list so we'll simply display it now so we run this program now so here you see initially the list was 10 8 1 11 and last node was pointing to null and now it becomes 11 1 8 10 where 10 points to null so it, so this is how we can reverse a singly linked list in java so friends hope you like this video please like comment share and subscribe my youtube channel you can also visit my blog the link is provided in the description thanks have a nice day hello friends welcome to my new data structures and algorithm in java tutorial series video Friends, in this tutorial we will discuss how to find nth node from the end of the linked list in Java. So friends, given a linked list and a value of n, we need to find the nth node from the end of the list. If suppose this is the linked list having the nodes as 10, 8, 1, 11 and 15. So there are total 5 nodes and the given the value of n is equal to 2. So it means we have to find the second node from the end of the list. So if you see the second node from the end of the list is say 1, 2. So 11 is the second node from the end of the list. So if this is the input then you can see the output would be the second node from the end which is 11. Now let's see the demo of the algorithm and it's working. So friends here is the linked list having the nodes as 10, 8, 1, 11 and 15. And suppose we are given the value of n as 2. It means we have to find the second node from the end of the list. Here you can see that this is the algorithm for it. So let's see the demo of the algorithm. So first we'll create a main pointer which will be pointing 
to the head and if you see the head points to the first node therefore there would be a main pointer which will point to the first node moving ahead now we'll create a reference pointer which will also point to the head so this is the reference pointer which will point to the first node we will create an integer variable by name count and we'll assign a value 0 to it so currently count is 0 so friends the idea behind this algorithm is in order to find the nth node from the end of the list what we'll do we have taken these two pointers both of which are pointing to head so if we take the reference pointer we'll make this reference pointer to move n positions so when this reference pointer has traversed the n positions then we'll move main pointer reference pointer together till reference pointer encounters null so when the reference pointer will encounter null the main pointer would be the nth position from the end of the list so let's see how this algorithm works when the value of n is 2 so currently this while loop will work till the value of count is less than n so currently if you see the value of n is 2 and the count is 0 therefore the count is less than n so it will execute the while loop and now we will just traverse the reference pointer to its next position so here we will assign the reference pointer's next value to the reference pointer so reference pointer points to the first node and its next point to the second node therefore we will assign the reference pointer next value to the reference pointer so it will look something like this moving ahead will increment the value of count and now again this while loop will execute because count is less than n and similarly will move the reference pointer to its next that is assigning the reference pointer next value to the reference pointer and then we'll increment the value of count so now count becomes 2 so now the value of count is not less than n if you see the value of n is 2 and count is 2 and 2 is not less than 2 therefore the condition in while loop is comes out to be false therefore the while loop breaks out and our execution reaches the second while loop so at this point the reference pointer has moved the two positions from the head and in this while loop what we'll do we'll move both pointers the reference pointer and the main pointer together till reference pointer encounters the null value so the condition inside it would be this while loop will execute till reference pointer is not equal to null so currently the reference pointer is not equal to null therefore the condition in while loop comes out to be true So first we'll simply traverse the reference pointer to its next value. Moving ahead. And now we'll move the main pointer to its next value. So we'll assign the main pointer's next value to the main pointer. Again the reference pointer is not equal to null. So this while loop will execute, it will traverse the reference pointer to its next value. And similarly we will move the main pointer to its next value. That is by assigning the main pointer's next value to the main pointer. So again this while loop condition will be evaluated and you can see the reference pointer is not equal to null therefore this while loop will execute now reference pointer will move to its next value and similarly the main pointer will move to its next value so now once again the boolean value in the while loop will be evaluated and currently if you see the reference pointer points to the null therefore the condition in while loop comes out to be false and this while loop breaks and finally if you see the main pointer is at the second position from the end of the list 
therefore we'll return this main pointer because this is the second node from the end of the list so friends this was the demonstration of the algorithm let's move to eclipse and see it's working so friends in my previous tutorial i have created this singly linked list class having an instance variable which stores the head and having an inner class which is the list node if you want to see it's working then you can watch my previous tutorials so so in this tutorial we will write a method which will fetch the anet node from the end of the list so first we'll create a method and the return type of it would be list node let's say we give the name of the method at get anet node from and so this method will be taking a value of n now first we'll check if head is null then just return null then we'll check that if let's say value of n is less than equal to 0 so a value of n is less than equal to 0 then we can throw an exception say throw new we can throw illegal illegal argument exception and we'll pass the string as say invalid value and calls moving ahead so first we'll create a list node having name as main pointer and we'll assign the value of head to it similarly we'll create another node which is the reference pointer and we'll assign the value of head to it then we'll create a integer variable count having value as 0 now we'll create the while loop which we saw in the slide so while and we'll give condition as count to be less than n and we'll simply traverse the reference pointer to its next value that is we'll assign the reference pointer next to reference pointer and we'll increment the count by one and here now let's say suppose the link list has three nodes and if we provide the value of n as say five therefore this reference pointer might reach to a null value so before this we can even if we can check that if if reference pointer is null then we can simply throw an exception we can throw an illegal argument exception we can give a string as n is greater than the number of nodes in list so here if suppose reference pointer comes out to be null then the value of n is surely greater than the num total number of nodes in the list moving ahead we'll create another while loop and in this while loop will provide the condition as ref pointer should not be equals to null and we'll simply and here we'll simply assign the reference pointer next value to the reference pointer and we'll traverse the main pointer to its next value And finally we'll just return the main pointer because this will be pointing to the nth node from the end of the list. So if you see that this is the code for getting the nth node from the end of the list and if you go to the main method then here then here there is a list having 5 nodes 
with the value as 10, 8, 1, 11, 15 and if I run this it will print the list so here it's 10, 8, 1, 11, 15 so there are total 5 number of nodes so let's say if I do nth node so I just created a list node by the name nth node from end and if I call this method get nth node from end and if I pass the value as say 2 and if I print and here if I print at nth node from and is dot data so now if I run the program you can see it prints 11 because 11 is the second node from the end of the list and suppose if I provide the value as say negative value say minus 1 then it throws an exception saying that illegal argument exception say invalid value of n which is equals to minus 1 and suppose the total number of nodes are 5 and if I give the value of 6 which and I wanted 6 node from the end of the list and if I run this so you can see it will throw illegal argument exception saying that 6 is greater than that number of nodes in the list so friends this was the working of the algorithm which we saw in the slide hope you like this video please like comment share and subscribe my youtube channel thanks have a nice day hello friends Welcome to my new data structures and algorithm in Java tutorial series video. Friends, in this tutorial, we will discuss how to remove duplicates from sorted linked list in Java. So suppose we are given a sorted linked list. So if you see, then the linked list has 5 nodes, having the data as 1, 1, 2, 3, 3. So this is a sorted linked list. But you can see that there are duplicates into it. So you can see 1 is duplicate and the 3 is duplicate. So in this tutorial we will discuss how to remove these duplicates from the sorted link list and if you see the output then the output would be like 1, 2, 3 and all the duplicates will be removed. So let's move ahead and see the demo of the algorithm. So here if you see we are given with the link list which is sorted and having nodes as 1, 1, 2, 3, 3. And this is the algorithm which will remove the duplicates from this sorted linked list. So let's see working of this algorithm. So in order to remove the duplicates from this sorted linked list, first we'll do, we'll create a list node which will point to the head. Moving ahead. So the basic idea behind this algorithm is, we will traverse the linked list through this current pointer and we'll check whether this data of this current node is equal to data of its next node and if they are equal it means we have encountered a duplicate and we will write the logic to remove that duplicate node so here if you see we will iterate this completely based on this condition so the condition would be the current should not be null and current dot next should not be null so here if suppose the current node reaches this last node so current dot next will be null it means there is no more nodes to traverse therefore this condition is required so let's see how this algorithm works so first this condition will be checked there whether current is equal to null or not so current is not equal to null because it is pointing to the first node and current dot next should not be null so current dot next is also not null because it is pointing to the second node therefore this while loop condition comes out to be true and it will encounter a if statement and here we will check whether current node data is equal to current next data current data is 1 and current next data is also 1 therefore they are equal so this if statement condition comes out to be true and we have encountered a duplicate so here if log will be executed and in order to remove this duplicate what we will do 
will assign current next next to the current next so here if you see current next points to the second node so we have to remove the second node therefore we have to break this point and we have to assign it to the second node so this is the statement for it we'll assign currents next next to currents next so it would be something like this so now current next points to current next next and as this node has no reference therefore this would be garbage collected so moving ahead so now again the condition in while loop will be evaluated so here current is not null and currents next is also not null therefore the condition in while loop comes out to be true and while loop will be executed so now we'll check whether current data is equal to current next data so current data is 1 and current next data is 2 so they are not equal therefore the if block condition comes out to be false and the else will be executed so it means that both the nodes like current and current next are different nodes and they are not duplicate therefore we'll simply traverse the current to its next node and now once again the while loop condition will be evaluated so current is not null and current's next is also not null therefore the while loop will be executed and now we'll check whether current's data is equal to current next data so current data is 2 and current next data is 3 so they are not equal so it means that data and two both the nodes are different so else condition will be executed and we will assign current next to current so we will simply traverse the current to its next node so now once again the while loop condition will be evaluated and here you can see current is not null and current next is also not null therefore the while loop condition comes out to be true and now it will be evaluated whether current data is equal to current next data so current data is 3 and current next data is also 3 so they are equal it means that we have encountered a duplicate here and we have to now remove this node having the value as 3 therefore in order to remove this node we have to first break this pointer and we have to assign this pointer to current next next so current points to 3 and it next points to 3 and its next points to null therefore we'll assign current next next to current next so it would be something like we'll remove this pointer and we'll assign current next to current next next which is null and as this node has no reference to it therefore this would be garbage collected and now once again the while loop condition will be evaluated so current is not null but current dot next is null so if you see current next points to null therefore this while loop condition comes out to be false and it makes sense because we don't have any more node to traverse therefore the while loop condition breaks out and if you see then we have removed the duplicates from the sorted linked list so head points to 1, 1 points to 2 and 2 points to 3 and 3 points to null so the output would be something like this so friend this was the demo of the algorithm now let's go to eclipse and see the working of the code so friends in my previous tutorials i have created a class by name singly linked list so in this class we have this instance variable which holds the head of the linked list and it is private inner class list node which will be holding the nodes in the singly linked list and if you want to see the working of this code then you can watch my previous tutorials so here we have simply created a singly linked list and we have inserted few nodes having the data as 11233 and if i run this class 
so it will print the link list as one one two three three so this is the singly link list which we saw in our slide and it has duplicate as one and three so let's write the code to remove this duplicate from sorted link list public will give return type as void remove duplicates so this is the method where we will write the code to remove the duplicates from sorted link list so first we will provide a if condition say if head is null then simply return from this method and next we will code the algorithm which we saw in the slide so we will create a list node by name current and we will assign the value head to it then we will create a while loop and we will provide the condition as current not equal to null and current dot next not equal to null and inside this value we will provide if block as if current data is equal to current dot next dot data so this is the condition to check whether adjacent nodes are duplicates or not so if they are duplicate then we will simply remove the duplicate node by current dot next and we will assign the value to it as current dot next dot next and we will provide a else block as so suppose the adjacent nodes are not same then we will simply iterate current to its next position by assigning current's next value to current so friends this is the code to remove the duplicates from sorted singly linked list now in the main method i will simply call the remove duplicates and let's again print the linked list so if i run the code now so here you can see initially the linked list was 1 1 2 3 3 and after removing the duplicates it became 1 2 3 so friend this was the code to remove the duplicates from sorted link list i hope you like this video please like comment share and subscribe my youtube channel thanks have a nice day hello friends welcome to my new data structures and algorithm in java tutorial series video friends in this tutorial we will discuss how to insert a node in a sorted singly link list in java so friends let's suppose we are given as sorted singly link list having four nodes say 1 8 10 and 16 and suppose we want to add a node having data as 11 to it friends here we want to insert this node such a way that the sorting order is maintained in the link list therefore in order to insert this new node into this sorted singly linked list the, here is the algorithm for it so currently you see the head points to first node having data as 1 then it goes to 8 10 16 and we want to insert the node having data as 11 and we want to insert in such a way that after insert the sorting order is maintained in the list so let's see the working of this algorithm step by step so in order to insert a new node in a sorted singly linked list first we will create a list node by name current which will point to the head so here if you see the head points to the first node therefore the current will also point to the first node then we will create a temporary node which will point to null So this while loop will execute till current is not equal to null and current data is less than new nodes data. So we will see this algorithm step by step and 
after we complete this while loop you will come to know that why this conditions are needed so here if you see current should not be null so current is pointing to first node and it is not null and current data so current data is 1 here and new node data is 11 so 1 is less than 11 therefore this while loop condition comes out to be true so in first step what we'll do we'll assign the value of current to temp so current points to the first node therefore when we assign the current's value to the temp it it becomes something like this so now temp points to the first node and then we'll traverse the current to its next node by assigning current dot next value to current so current points to first node and next point to the second node therefore we'll simply assign the current's next value to current so it would be something like this so now current points to the second node moving ahead now again current is not equal to null and current data which is 8 is also less than new nodes data which is 11 therefore this while loop condition comes out to be true and we'll assign current value to the temp so it would look something like this and then we'll simply traverse current to its next position by assigning current dot next value to current moving ahead so again current is not equal to null and current dot data which is 10 is also less than new nodes data which is 11 therefore this while loop condition comes out to be true and we'll simply assign current's value to the temp so it would look something like this and then we'll simply traverse current to its next position by assigning current dot next value to current moving ahead so now current is not equal to null and if you see current data so current data is 16 and new node data is 11 therefore current data is not less than new nodes data therefore this while loop condition comes out to be false and this while loop breaks so if you see we have traversed current to the node which is just greater than the value of new node and we have also kept a temporary node which is just behind the current node so the idea behind keeping this temporary node is once this while loop breaks out then we need to insert new node just between 10 and 16 because 11 is the value between 10 and 16 so in order to put the node between 10 and 16 we need this temp node because this pointer will now be pointing to new node and new node next which is pointing currently to null will point to current so in order to insert this new node into sorted singly linked list what we'll do first we'll first make new node next point to current so new node next currently points to null so instead of pointing to null now we want to insert it between 10 and 16 therefore this next should point to 16 and if you see current points to 16 so so we'll simply assign the value of current to new nodes next so this is the step for it so it would look something like this so new node next points to 16 which is also referenced by current moving ahead Now in order to insert the node between 10 and 16 temp next points to 16 therefore we need to break this link and we need to assign this link to new node. So what we'll do we'll assign new nodes value to temp dot next. So temp dot next is currently pointing to current we'll break this link and we'll assign it to new node. So it would look something like this. And finally when we align this link list it will look something like this. 
so you see we have inserted 11 just between 10 and 16 and also after insert the link list has maintained its sorted order therefore we will simply return the head so friend this was the demonstration of the algorithm now let's go to eclipse and see the working code so friends in my previous tutorials I have created a singly linked list class which has an instance variable of type list node which is actually the head of our linked list it also has a say inner class by name list node which helps us in storing the data in the linked list so in order to know more about its working please watch my previous tutorials so in this tutorial we will simply write a method which will insert a node in a sorted singly linked list so I will just create a method public and I will give a return type to it as list node so let's say I give method name as insert in sorted list this method will take an argument of integer by name value so this value will be stored as a part of node into the sorted singly linked list so first we'll create a list node for this value so I'll give the name to it as new node and then we'll give a condition as if head is null then simply return this new node moving ahead we'll create a list node current which we saw in slide and we'll assign a value head to it then we'll create a list node by name temp we'll assign null to it so first we'll create a while loop so in this while loop we'll provide a condition as current not equal to null and current dot data is less than new node dot data so we'll iterate till current is not null and current data is less than new nodes data so in while loop first step would be we'll assign the value of current to temp and we'll simply traverse current to its next value so basically these are the two statements which we'll be providing into the while loop and after while loop gets executed we know that that current now points to a node which is just greater than the new nodes data and temp points to the node which is just lesser than the new nodes data therefore first step would be to new node next we'll assign the value of current and then to temp next we'll assign the value of new node and finally we'll just return head so friend this is the method by which we can insert a node into sorted singly linked list so here if you see in the main method currently there are four nodes by data is 1 8 10 16 so they are the same what we saw in the slide so if I print this singly linked list you can see it print as 1 8 10 16 and null so therefore currently this is in sorted order and let's suppose I call the method insert in sorted list and give the value as 11 so friends once this method is executed it will insert 11 into sorted singly linked list so I will just print it again and if I run the program so currently it was a sorted linked list and after insertion of 11 the sorting order is still maintained so this is the algorithm by which we can insert a node into sorted singly linked list so friends i hope you like this video please like comment share and subscribe my youtube channel thanks have a nice day hello friends 
Welcome to my new data structures and algorithm in Java tutorial series video. Friends, in this tutorial we will discuss how to remove a given key from singly linked list in Java. So here if you are given a singly linked list having 5 nodes say 1, 8, 10, 11 and 16 where head points to the first node and if suppose we want to delete a key having the data is 11. So currently if you see the fourth node has data is 11. Therefore, we need to write an algorithm which could delete this fourth node from the singly linked list. If you see below is the algorithm for it. So let's go over to this algorithm step by step. So first we'll create a list node by the name current and it will point to head. So here current points to the head. Then we'll create a list node by name temp and it will point to null. So this temporary node points to null. Then we will traverse the linked list in a while loop and we will iterate the linked list in such a way that current should not be null and current data is not equal to key. So here current points to first node and it's not null and current data which is 1 is not equal to the key 11. Therefore the condition in while loop comes out to be true. So in first step what we'll do, we'll simply assign the value of current to temp. So current points to first node therefore now temp will point to the first node. And in next step we'll simply traverse current to its next position by assigning current next value to current. So current points to first node and its next points to second node therefore we'll assign current next value to current. Moving ahead, here current is not equal to null and current data. So current data is 8 and it's not equal to 11. Therefore the condition in while loop comes out to be true. So here we'll simply assign the value of current to temp and current points to second node. Therefore the temp will point to the second node now. And we'll simply traverse current to its next position by assigning current dot next value to current. Moving ahead. Now again current is not equal to null. And current data which is 10 is not equal to 11. Therefore the condition in while loop comes out to be true. We'll simply assign current's value to temp. And here if you see current points to third node, therefore temp will now point to the third node. And now we'll simply traverse current to its next position by assigning current dot next value to current. Moving ahead. So if you see current is not equal to null, but current data. So current data is 11, which is equal to key. Therefore condition in while loop comes out to be false because current dot data is equal to key. Therefore the while loop breaks out and and we have traversed the current to the node which we want to delete. So here we will check whether if current is equal to null. And if current is equal to null it means that we have traversed complete linked list and we haven't found the key. Therefore we will simply return from the method. And if you see current is not null therefore the if condition comes out to be false so finally in order to remove this node which is pointed by current and having value as 11 we need to break this link so the temporary node which we have created earlier was used to hold the previous node position so that so once we found the node having the value as key we can simply delete it through the temporary node so currently if you see temp.next point to this current node so we need to simply remove this link but if we remove this link then the node after current will also be removed therefore we need to assign temp's next value to current's next value so if you see temp next points to current and current next point to the node having value 16 therefore we will simply assign 
current next value to temp next so it would look something like this first this link will be removed and when we assign current next to temp next it would look something like this so now you can see temp next points to the current next node and once this method get executed then as current is a list node on the stack it would be garbage collected and finally when we rearrange the linked list it would look something like this so friends this was the demo of the algorithm so let's go to eclipse and see the working code we'll also see few of the edge cases there so friends in my previous linked list tutorials i have created a class by name singly linked list and this class has an instance variable list node by name head which holds the data into our singly linked list and it has also a private inner class by name list node so this class is responsible for holding the data into the singly linked list and if you want to see the working of this code you can watch my previous tutorials so in this tutorial we will simply code the algorithm which we saw in the slide so let's create a method public void delete node so i've just created a method by name delete node and it will take a integer value say key so based on this key we'll remove that node which holds the value of key so in first line we'll just create a list node by name current and we'll assign the value head to it then we'll create a list node by name temp and assign a null value to it we need to code an edge case which we not saw in the slide so that edge case first if suppose head data matched with the key then we need to handle it separately so we can write if so in if condition we can say if let's say current is not equal to null and current dot data equals key so it means that we are handling the case where head data is matching with the key so in that case we need to simply shift the head by one node so to head we'll assign the value as current dot next and we'll simply return from the method so moving ahead we'll now create a while loop which we saw in the slide and the condition would be current should not be equal to null and current dot data should not be equal to key so in first step we'll simply assign temp the value of current because this temporary node will hold the position of the previous node to current and now we'll simply traverse current to its next node and after the while loop we'll give a check whether if current is equal to null that means we haven't found the key in the singly linked list so we'll simply return and suppose if current is not equal to null then then current points to the node having the data equal to key therefore we need to remove that node so the temp node is just the node previous to current so we'll assign current dot next value to temp next so what this will do temp dot next currently points to current but as we need to delete this current node we'll simply assign current next value to temp next now in our main method let's see it's working so i've created a linked list which we saw in the slide and if i run the program now you can see the linked list has five nodes as 1 8 10 11 16 now let's say we'll delete the node having the key as 11 and we'll again print the linked list so if i run the code now 
so here you can see initially there are five nodes and after deleting the node having the key as 11 you can see the link list become as 1 8 10 16 and the node which was in between 10 and 16 was removed so friends this was the tutorial based on deleting a node with a specific key i hope you have liked this video please like comment share and subscribe my youtube channel thanks have a nice day hello friends welcome to my new data structures and algorithm in java tutorial series video friends in this tutorial we will discuss how to detect a loop in a linked list in java let's suppose we are given a linked list having six nodes say one two three four five six and which contains a loop so here if you see the head points to the first node first node points to the second second points to third third points to fourth fourth points to fifth fifth point to sixth and sixth point to third therefore you can see that this linked list contains a loop as three points to four four points to five five points to six and six points to three and again it goes on and if you see below is the algorithm to detect whether a linked list contains a loop or not so let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step now in the first step we are simply creating the reference of list node by name fast pointer which is pointing to head so it looks something like this so here you see as head points to this first node now fast pointer will be referring to this first node moving ahead we'll also create one slow pointer which will refer to the head so it would look something like this moving ahead Now friends, we are encountering here a while loop. So the basic idea behind this algorithm is in order to detect this particular loop in a linked list. So what we are doing here is we know that fast pointer and slow pointer both are pointing to head. So therefore they are at the start position. Now the basic idea behind this algorithm here is we will move slow pointer one step and we will move fast pointer two steps. And if suppose the linked list doesn't contain the loop then we know that the last node should point to null therefore we are traversing fast pointer two steps and slow pointer one step because if linked list contains a loop then there will be a situation as slow pointer is moving slowly and fast pointer is moving fast so the fast pointer will never encounter null value and there will be a situation where fast pointer will meet the slow pointer because of the loop nature so here in while loop we are placing a condition as fast pointer should not be null and fast pointer next should not be null now here we know that as the linked list contains a loop therefore the fast pointer will never be null and we are checking that fast pointer next is not equal to null because as we are traversing fast pointer by two positions we need to make sure that fast pointer next is also not equal to null and in while loop you can see we are assigning a value of fast pointer next next to fast pointer as we are traversing it two steps so we need to make sure that fast pointer next should not be null because if it is null then we will encounter null pointer exception therefore the condition we are placing is fast pointer should not be equal to null and fast pointer next also should not be equal to null so currently if you see fast pointer is pointing to the node first having data as one and its next is also not null therefore the condition in while loop comes out to be true So in the first step what we are doing we are just traversing fast pointer to two steps so here if you see we are assigning fast pointer next next value to fast pointer so here fast pointer is pointing to the first node its next is pointing to the second node and its next is pointing to the third node therefore here we are simply traversing fast pointer by two positions so it would look something like this so we have simply traversed fast pointer by two positions moving ahead now here we are simply traversing slow pointer by one position so we are assigning slow pointer next value to slow pointer so slow pointer is currently pointing the first node and its next is pointing to the second node so we are simply traversing it by one position so it would look something like this
and then we are simply checking that whether slow pointer is equal to fast pointer or not. So we are doing this step is because there will be a situation where fast pointer will traverse all the node and again meet the slow pointer because the linked list contains a loop and there is no end to the linked list. So currently slow pointer is pointing to the node second and fast pointer is pointing to the node third. Therefore they are not equal. So the condition in if block comes out to be false. And now we'll again check that whether fast pointer is equal to null or not and its next is equal to null or not. So fast pointer is pointing to third node. Therefore it's not equal. And fast pointer next is pointing to fourth node. Therefore it's not equal. So the condition in while loop comes out to be true. And then in the first step we are simply traversing fast pointer by two positions. So here if you see fast pointer next is pointing to the fourth node and its next is pointing to fifth node. So we are simply traversing fast pointer from third position to fifth position by assigning fast pointer next next value to fast pointer. So it would look something like this. Moving ahead. Then we are simply traversing slow pointer by one position by assigning slow pointer next value to slow pointer. So it would look something like this. Moving ahead. Now we are again checking whether slow pointer is equal to fast pointer or not. So you can see slow pointer is pointing to third node and fast pointer is pointing to fifth node. Therefore they are not equal. Hence the condition in if block comes out to be false. Now we'll again check the condition in while loop. So fast pointer is currently pointing to fifth node therefore it's not null and fast pointer next which is sixth node is also not null. Therefore condition in while loop comes out to be true. So in the first step we are simply traversing fast pointer by two position and here you can see we are assigning fast pointer next next position to fast pointer. So fast pointer next is six and its next is 3. So we are simply traversing the fast pointer from 5th position to 3rd position. So it would look something like this. Moving ahead. Now here we are simply traversing slow pointer by one position by assigning slow pointer next value to slow pointer. So slow pointer is pointing to 3rd node and its next is pointing to 4th node. So we are simply traversing it by one position. So it would look something like this. Moving ahead. We are again checking whether slow pointer is equal to fast pointer or not. So fast pointer is pointing to third node. Slow pointer is pointing to fourth node. Therefore they are not equal. So the condition in if block comes out to be false. And now we are again checking in the while loop that fast pointer is equal to null or not. So fast pointer is pointing to third node therefore it's not equal. And fast pointer next which is fourth node which is also not null. Therefore the condition in while loop comes out to be true. Now we are simply traversing fast pointer by two positions by assigning fast pointer next next value to fast pointer. So here fast pointer is currently pointing to third node and its next is pointing to fourth node and its next is pointing to fifth node. So we are simply traversing fast pointer from third position to fifth position. So it would look something like this. Moving ahead. Now we are simply traversing slow pointer by one position by assigning the slow pointer next value to slow pointer. So slow pointer is pointing to fourth node and its next is pointing to fifth. Therefore we are simply traversing it by one position. So it would look something like this. Moving ahead. And now we are checking whether slow pointer is equal to fast pointer or not. So friends here slow pointer is equal to fast pointer. Therefore we are very much sure that this linked list contains a loop. So the condition you see in the if block comes out to be true. And we simply return true because we have identified that this linked list contains a loop. So friends here we saw the demonstration of the algorithm. Now let's go to Eclipse and see the working code. 
So friends, in my previous tutorial, I had created one class by name singly linked list. Now this class has a list node by name head, which is an instance variable. And we also created one inner class by name list node. You can watch my previous tutorials in order to understand more about how to implement a singly linked list. So in this tutorial, we will write a code which we saw in the slide and see it's working. So first I will create one method as public boolean and let's say I give method name as contains loop so basically I will write the code inside this method contains loop and it will return me back a boolean value that whether the linked list contains a loop or not so in the first step we'll create a fast pointer reference variable and we'll assign the value of head to it in the second step we'll create a slow pointer and we'll assign the value of head to it moving ahead now we'll create one while loop which we saw in the slide and we'll provide condition as fast pointer should not be equal to null and fast pointer next should not be equal to null and in the while loop will traverse fast pointer by two positions so we are simply assigning fast pointer next to next value to fast pointer so we are simply traversing fast pointer by two positions and then we are simply traversing slow pointer by one position so we are assigning slow pointer next value to slow pointer and then we are providing an if check that if slow pointer is equal to fast pointer then simply return true and it means we have identified that the linked list contains a loop and after the while loop if suppose we haven't found any loop then we simply return false so friend this is the algorithm which detects whether the linked list contains a loop or not now we'll also create one more method which will actually create a linked list having a loop so public void create a loop in linked list so in this method we'll create few nodes we'll assign them in such a way that it will create a loop inside a linked list so friends in the slide we saw an example where the linked list contains six nodes and which was forming a loop so I will simply replicate that example here so for that I will create list node say first equals new list node and I give value as one now I will create five more list nodes so I'll just give them values two three four five six and I'll change the name as second third fourth fifth sixth now as we saw in the slide that head points to the first node therefore we'll simply assign value of first to head and we also know that first next was second second next is third third next is fourth fourth next is fifth fifth next 
is sixth and in order to create a loop the example we saw in the slide was sixth node next refer to the third node so here we simply assign value of third to sixth next so six dot next and we'll assign value of third to it so this will create a linked list containing a loop where first is pointing to second second is pointing to third third is pointing to fourth fourth is pointing to fifth fifth is pointing to sixth and sixth is pointing to third so it will create a loop now in the main method let's test the working of this algorithm so in the first step we have simply created an instance of singly linked list now in the second step i will call this method create a loop in linked list so create so after this method get executed the head will be pointing to a linked list containing a loop so in the third step we'll simply print the output of contains loop on the console so here so here we'll simply call contains loop method and whatever the outcome of contains loop is we'll simply print it on the console so currently you can see the linked list which we have created in this create a loop in linked list method has a loop so the contains loop method should return true so if i run the code so you can see it returned true because the linked list which we have created in this method had a loop now here suppose i don't assign the value of third to six dot next so if i comment this line then we know that this linked list is not containing a loop so if i run the code now you can see it returned false because here we have break the link in the linked list which was actually making a loop so friends this was the algorithm to detect whether a linked list contains a loop or not i hope you like this video thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in our previous video we discussed about that how we can detect a loop in a singly linked list now in this video we will see that how we can find the starting point of that loop so for example so here you can see the let's suppose we are given with the singly linked list which contains six nodes 1 2 3 4 5 and 6 but here you can see that from 3 it goes to 4 and from 4 it goes to 5 from 5 it goes to 6 and from 6 it again goes back to 3 so here you can see that there is a loop in this singly linked list so in our previous video we saw an algorithm where we detected the loop in a singly linked list so this is the code for that now in this video we will see that how we can find the starting point of that loop so currently if we take this example then 3 is the starting point of that loop because from 3 loop starts and ends at 3 only so our task is to find the starting node from where the loop starts so friend this algorithm contains two parts one is the detection of the loop and the second part is to actually find the starting point of the loop so the first part of detecting the loop we discussed in our previous video So in this video we will see that how we can find the starting node of the loop in a singly linked list. So friend let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step. But before we begin in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel so that you never miss any update. So friends here you can see this is the first part which we already discussed in our previous video. where what we did was we created two pointers one was the fast pointer and other was the slow pointer we started both the pointers from the head and in order to detect that whether the singly linked list contains a loop what we did was we moved fast pointer two steps and we moved slow pointer one step so why we actually do that is because in case if the singly linked list doesn't have the loop the fast pointer is moving twice the speed of slow pointer so fast pointer will reach to the end of the singly linked list but if the singly linked list contains the loop then as slow pointer is moving slowly fast pointer will cross over this loop perform n number of cycles 
and it will meet slow pointer in one of these nodes because there is no end to the singly linked list once the point reaches beyond the starting of this loop so in our previous video in this while loop if slow pointer meets fast pointer we actually returned a boolean value true stating that we detected a loop in this singly linked list and we actually return from this method but in this algorithm when we find that slow pointer is meeting to fast pointer inside this loop then we actually call yet another method which provides us the starting node of the loop so this demonstration of detecting the loop and finding the meeting point of slow pointer and fast pointer as we already discussed in our previous video so here i will be quickly demonstrating it so here we will start fast pointer and slow pointer from head and now in while loop we are providing two conditions that fast pointer not equals to null and fast pointer's next is not equal to null so why we are providing this condition is because if fast pointer equals null then it means the singly linked list doesn't have any loop and there is a end to this singly linked list because we are traversing fast pointer inside this while loop and at some point fast pointer is pointing to null it means that we have reached to the end of the singly linked list and the next condition fast pointer's next should also be not equal to null because here if you see in this line we are traversing fast pointer two places by assigning fast pointer's next next so here if fast pointer's next becomes null then we will encounter a null pointer exception here so here we are providing this condition to simply check that whether fast pointer next also should not be equal to null so currently fast pointer is not equal to null its next is also not equal to null so this condition comes out to be true in the first step we are moving fast pointer by two nodes by assigning fast pointer next next value to fast pointer so fast pointer next will make it reach here and its next will make it reach here so it would look something like this moving ahead and as we discussed that we are moving slow pointer by one position so we are simply assigning slow pointer's next value to slow pointer so slow pointer will come here moving ahead currently slow pointer is not pointing to fast pointer because here you can see fast pointer is pointing to 3 slow pointer is pointing to 2 therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false we again reach to the while loop where we'll check whether fast pointer is equal to null or not so fast pointer is not equal to null and its next is also not equal to null so the condition in while loop comes out to be true now we move fast pointer by two steps by assigning fast pointer next next so fast pointer will reach to node 5 and slow pointer will reach to node 3 slow pointer is not equal to fast pointer this condition is false fast pointer is not equal to null and its next is also not equal to null we move fast pointer by two steps by assigning fast pointer next next to fast pointer so fast pointer will reach to node 3 and we'll move slow pointer by one step so it will reach node 4 this condition is false because slow pointer is pointing to 4 and fast pointer is pointing to 3 fast pointer is not equal to null and its next is also not equal to null we move fast pointer by two steps by assigning fast pointer's next next value so fast pointer next is 4 and its next is 5 so it came here we'll move slow pointer by one step so slow pointer will reach here 
so friends now here you can see that slow pointer has met to fast pointer at this node so it means we have detected a cycle inside this singly linked list by using two pointers fast pointer and slow pointer so friend this algorithm is also known as fluid cycle detection algorithm now when we get the meeting point of slow pointer and fast pointer we go into the if condition and here we will call a method as get starting node and will pass the slow pointer there so now it would look something like this that call will reach to this method where we'll still have the reference to slow pointer which is pointing to the meeting point of slow pointer and fast pointer so friends the idea behind this algorithm to find the starting node of the loop is at the first step what we do we again create a temporary list node we start it from the head and we already have reference to the meeting point of slow pointer and fast pointer so now what we do is we simply provide a while loop we move slow pointer by one step and we move temporary node by one step and in the while loop we provide the condition that perform these steps till slow pointer is equal to temp so when slow pointer will be equal to temp this while loop will terminate and when slow pointer will equal to temp at whichever node this condition comes out to be true that will be our starting node of the loop so here we will move slow pointer by one step and we will move temp by one step so currently here you can see slow pointer is not equal to temp because slow pointer is pointing to 5 and temp is pointing to node 1 so this condition comes out to be true now inside this while loop as we discussed we move both the pointers one one step so first we move the temporary node by assigning temp dot next to temp so now temp will come here and then we'll assign slow pointer's next value to slow pointer so slow pointer is pointing to 5 its next is pointing to 6 so now slow pointer will point to 6 we check whether slow pointer is equal to temp or not so slow pointer is not equal to temp because temp is pointing to 2 and slow pointer is pointing to 6 so the condition in the while block comes out to be true we move temp by one step so it will reach 3 we move slow pointer by one step by assigning slow pointers next to slow pointer so it will reach here we check whether slow pointer is equal to temp or not so here you can see that slow pointer is equal to temp because they are pointing to the same node so this condition comes out to be false and at the last you can see that we have actually found the starting node of this loop which is 3 so wherever temp and this slow pointer will meet that node will be our starting node of the loop so from this method we'll simply return this node which is 3 so from this algorithm is floyd's cycle detection algorithm so now one question comes to our mind is that when we found the meeting point of the fast pointer and slow pointer and we created two pointers temp and slow pointer and made them move one one step in this while loop and when they actually met we are simply saying that that is our starting node of the loop but what's the proof that this cycle detection algorithm given by floyd works so friends in our next video we will see that why this algorithm works because currently we have simply demonstrated the algorithm and we have find our starting point of the loop but we don't have any proof that whether this algorithm actually works or not so in our next video we will see that why floyd's cycle detection algorithm works so friends i hope you have liked this video and in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel so that you never miss any update Thanks have a nice day
Hello everyone. So in our previous video, we discussed about the Floyd's cycle detection algorithm, where we saw that how we can detect a loop in a singly linked list, and how we can find the starting node of the loop. So friends, here if you see that in one of our previous video, we saw the algorithm of finding a loop in a singly linked list, where we use these two pointers. Fast pointer and slow pointer, and we made fast pointer move two steps, and slow pointer by one step, and we provided this condition that fast pointer should not be equal to null, and fast pointer next should not be equal to null. So in case if the singly linked list doesn't had this loop, then fast pointer must have reached to the end of the singly linked list. But if the singly linked list contains a loop, then inside this while loop. There will be a point that fast pointer will meet slow pointer because of the loop. So here we returned true if the singly linked list had the loop, or else we returned false. So now in this video, our task is to find the starting node of the loop. So here you can see, I will simply copy this method. And as the algorithm of the first part remains the same, here we need to return back the starting node of the loop. We can give any name, but here I am giving start node in a loop. And here, when the fast pointer will meet slow pointer, so in our previous video where we saw the animation. This meeting point is very important. So let's say if there is no loop, so here we simply return as null. And if there is any loop, because slow pointer is meeting to the fast pointer, then we'll call one method here, which will return as the starting node of the loop, and we'll pass the slow pointer to it because this meeting point is very important. So I will create one method. So friends, now here, in order to get the starting node of the loop, what we do is, as we already have this meeting point, so this becomes our first node, and we also create one temporary node, and we point it to the head. So now here we have two nodes, one is the slow pointer, and other is the Temporary node, where temporary node is pointing to the head of the singly linked list, and slow pointer is pointing to the meeting point of slow pointer and fast pointer, which we saw here, and that point will be inside the loop. So friends, here now what we do is we move slow pointer by one step, and we move temporary node by one step, and that we do in the while loop. So we make them move one one step. Till they meet, and wherever they meet, that node where they meet will be our starting node of the loop. So here, in while loop, we provide the condition that keep on iterating and moving temporary node and the slow pointer by one one step till slow pointer is equal to temp. So if they are not equal to each other. Then we are simply moving ten by one position, and similarly we are moving slow pointer by one position. And when ten and slow pointer value will point to each other, this condition will come out to be false. And at the end, we'll simply return the temporary node. So this temporary node. Will be our starting node of the loop. So this is what Floyd cycle detection algorithm states that wherever this temporary node and slow pointer will meet, that node will be our the starting node of the loop. So friends, why this algorithm works, we will discuss in our upcoming video. But for time being, you just think that this algorithm works. So here now we'll call this method and we'll test its working.
so here you can see that in a one of our previous video we already created a loop using create a loop in linked list method where first point to second second pointed to third third pointed to fourth fourth pointed to fifth fifth pointed to sixth and here you can see sixth pointed to third it means there is a loop and this is the same example which we discussed in our previous slide as well so here we know that there is a loop in a singly linked list if we call create a loop in singly linked list so from head this singly linked list will start and there will be a loop so i'll just comment this part so here i have simply uncommented and we are simply calling create a loop in linked list and let's say we also call the contains loop method so that will return us a boolean value so first i will simply run that part and here you can see that it returned true so it means there is a loop in that singly linked list now what we'll do here we know that the starting point of the loop is list node third having data as 3 so after we figure out that there is a loop what we do is we simply call the method start node in a loop here what we do is we simply print the data of the returning node so here you can see it printed 3 which is the data of the node from where the loop starts so friends here the only idea we need to remember is after finding the meeting point of slow pointer and fast pointer we keep the slow pointer at that position only and we create a temporary pointer which will start from the head and in the while loop we simply move both the pointers by one one step and keep checking that whether temp is equal to slow pointer or not so when temp will equal to slow pointer this while loop will terminate and that node where this both the pointers will meet will be our starting node of the loop so friend currently we haven't seen that why this algorithm works in our next video we will see the mathematical proof that why this algorithm works which is named as floyd cycle detection algorithm So friends I hope you have liked this video and in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel so that you never miss any update thanks have a nice day Hello everyone so in this video we will discuss that why floyd cycle detection algorithm works so friends in our previous video we saw that how we can detect a loop in a singly linked list and we also saw that how we can find the starting node of that loop so the algorithm which we saw it was just a code which usually works but there was no proof that why this algorithm works so in this video we will see that why a floyd cycle detection algorithm works so friend let's suppose we are given with this singly linked list so here you can see the singly linked list contains nine nodes 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 and if you see that from the sixth node the loop starts and the last node points to the sixth node so therefore this loop starts from here so basically in order to detect that whether this singly linked list contains a loop what we do is we simply create two pointers one is the slow pointer and other is the fast pointer and we usually start it from the head now what we do as the name suggest the fast pointer moves two steps and slow pointer moves one step and we perform these steps in iteration that fast pointer moves two steps then slow pointer move one step so friend if this singly linked list doesn't contain loop then fast pointer will reach to the end of the singly linked list where last node next will point to null and if there is a loop then fast pointer will keep on traversing here 
and slowly slow pointer will enter the loop and fast pointer will meet the slow pointer somewhere in the loop so first let's see how it works we moved fast pointer by two steps slow pointer by one step we moved fast pointer by two steps slow pointer by one step fast pointer by two steps slow pointer by one step now here from here fast pointer reached here because this is the first step this is the second step slow pointer by one step fast pointer by two steps so friends here you can see that slow pointer is still completing this tail of the singly linked list but the fast pointer has already completed one circle and based on number of nodes and the size of the loop there can be possibility that when slow pointer will enter the loop fast pointer must have completed x number of cycles so here you can see now we'll move slow pointer then we move fast pointer by two steps so it will reach here slow pointer here now as we started our algorithm with fast pointer so we are moving fast pointer by two steps and then our iteration will end with slow pointer with one step so slow pointer will reach here then we'll again do a while loop and fast pointer will reach here and then our iteration will end when slow pointer will reach here so friends here you can see when our iteration will end with the slow pointer we see that now slow pointer and fast pointer are meeting at this node so friends there could be a possibility that based on number of nodes and the size of loop there could be a possibility that before meeting the slow pointer fast pointer must have completed this cycles x number of times and similarly slow pointer must have completed this cycle let's say y number of times before meeting at this node so the first part of the algorithm is detecting this loop in case if fast pointer meets slow pointer then we know that there is a loop so this is the first part of floyd cycle detection algorithm the other part is to find the starting node of this loop so after finding the meeting point of fast pointer and slow pointer what we do is we keep slow pointer here and we move a temporary pointer from the head and now this time we move slow pointer one step and temp also by one step so what this algorithm will tell us is if we move both the pointers one one step when temp will reach to the start of the node slow pointer also will reach to that particular node and basically in code when they meet to any node that node will be our starting point of the loop so let's see how we move temp by one step we move slow pointer by one step we again move temp by one step slow pointer by one step we move temp by one step slow pointer by one step then again we move temp by one step and slow pointer by one step so friends here you can see that based on number of nodes here in the tail and in the loop you saw that slow pointer started from here and it completed one cycle and reached to the same point here and now if we move temp by one step it will reach here and if we move slow pointer by one step it will reach here so this algorithm tells that at whichever node these two pointers will meet that would be our starting point of the loop or the starting node of the loop so now there are two parts of the algorithm one is of detecting the loop that is the meeting point of the slow pointer and fast pointer and other is the finding of this starting node so here if we draw this singly linked list let's say something like this that this is a tail and this is the loop and let's say they meet at this point so here you can see we are denoting this tail with a value m and fast pointer comes inside the loop it goes and performs few cycles and reach here and slow pointer also performs of lesser number of cycles and finally meet it here or it could be possible that slow pointer doesn't complete any cycle and simply meets here so we are giving this distance as k and the complete length of this loop let's say we are denoting it by n so this is the current picture from where we will start our proof so let's say we are assuming that fast pointer and slow pointer meet here if they meet here then this 
singly linked list must be containing a loop at the start we are simply assuming that let's say they meet here so the distance traveled by fast pointer would be let's say we denote it by df so the fast pointer will start from here it moves m distance and there could be possibility that fast pointer travels this loop let's say x number of times and once it performs the loop it will come to the starting point only and then it goes k distance and meet the slow pointer so we can simply write the distance traveled by fast pointer as m plus the n is the length of this loop and cf is an integer which can be like 1 2 3 4 5 so we are not sure that how many cycles fast pointer will perform so we are denoting it by a constant cf which would be an integer so it it can make one cycle it can make two cycles it can make three cycles so in order to calculate distance we are multiplying n by cf plus k so if the cycle starts from here it will reach back here and then it goes k distance so this is the k distance and similarly distance traveled by slow pointer let's say we denote it ds it would be m plus let's say the slow pointer also performs some of the cycles around this loop and we don't know how many cycles it performs so we denote it by cs so this is also a constant basically an integer value multiplied by the length of the loop plus so if it starts looping from here then it performs one loop or let's say cs loops and then it will travel k distance and meet the fast pointer here so plus k so now as we know that both the pointers are starting at same point and meeting at this point so the time travel by both the pointers will be same and as fast pointer is moving two steps and slow pointer is moving one step so the distance travel by fast pointer will be twice the distance travel by slow pointer so let's say distance travel by slow pointer is x so if the fast pointer is moving twice the speed of slow pointer then the distance travel by fast pointer will be 2x so if we substitute these values in x and 2x it would be something like this x will be equal to m plus n cs plus k and 2x will be m plus n cf plus k so here the constants are different cf and cs which are nothing but the integer values so m plus n into cf plus k now what we do is we simply subtract x from 2x so we simply subtract this equation from this equation so what we get is this x will get cancel out with this x so only one x will remain so here you can see m will cancel out k will cancel out and if we do n into cf minus n into cs taking n common it would look something like this n into cf minus cs so this would be the equation which will be coming out so friends here you can see that based on the what equation came out if we closely observe this equation then here you can see that this x is equal to n into cf minus cs so here you can see n is constant because this length of the loop will remain the same and cf minus cs are nothing but integers so there will be a value for cf and cs when multiplied by n will give us a distance x so here you can see that if we substitute some of the values in the left hand side and in the right hand side let's say for cf and cs and x and n so you will find that this equation is solvable so which proves that this equation is derived when we assume that they will meet at this point and if they are meeting at this point then there will be a loop inside this singly linked list so you can try to substitute many values here and you will see that you will find the solution of these equations so this proves our first point that how we detect that there is a loop in a singly linked list now we'll see that let's say this is the meeting point and if we move the slow pointer by one step and temporary pointer one step then why they actually meet at the starting point of the loop so this will be our second part of the algorithm which we need to prove so here we go via same analogy the distance traveled by fast pointer is df 
एम प्लस एन सी ए प्लस के एंड डिस्टेंस ट्रेवल बाय स्लोप पॉइंटर विल बी एम प्लस एन सी एस प्लस के नाउ यर व्हाट वी डू इज दिस इज आल्सो वी डिस्कस डेट डिस्टेंस ट्रेवल बाय फास्ट पॉइंटर विल बी ट्वाइस द डिस्टेंस ट्रेवल बाय स्लो पॉइंटर सो विच मीन्स डी एफ विल बी ट्वाइस डी एस बिकॉज फास्ट पॉइंटर इज मूविंग ट्वाइस द स्पीड ऑफ स्लो पॉइंटर सो द डिस्टेंस ट्रेवल्ड बाय फास्ट पॉइंटर विल बी ट्वाइस द डिस्टेंस ट्रेवल बाय स्लो पॉइंटर सो फिर सब्सिट्यूट दिज वैल्यूज वी विल गेट एम प्लस एन सी ए प्लस के इक्वल्स टू इन टू एम प्लस एन सी एस प्लस के नाव विल मल्टीप्लाई टू इन साइड दिस एंड वी गेट टू एम प्लस टू एन सी एस प्लस टू के नाउ वॉट वी डू इज विल टेक एम दिस साइड सो इट विल सो इफ इट टेक इट दिस साइड इट विल बिकम माइनस एम एंड माइनस के एंड हियर वी हैव टू एम एंड टू के सो वन वन एम एंड के विल बी सब्ट्रैक्टेड एंड हियर इफ यू टेक टू एन सी एस हियर सो इट विल बी एन सी एफ माइनस टू एन सी एस सो दिस इक्वेशन आफ्टर सॉल्विंग इट विल लुक समथिंग लाइक दिस दैट एन सी एफ माइनस बिकॉज वी आर टेकिंग दिस दिस साइड सो इट विल बिकम माइनस टू एन सी एस दिस एम वी टुक इट हियर इट सो इट बिकेम टू एम माइनस एम सो इट गेव एम एंड के वी टुक इट हियर सो इट बिकेम टू के माइनस के विच गेव एस अ वैल्यू के so friends here you can see that m is the length of the tail of the singly linked list and k is the distance from the starting node to a point where the fast pointer and slow pointer meet and n is the length of the loop so friends here you can see we'll take n common so it would look something like this and here you can see from the starting point till this point this value is k and total value of this loop is n so if we denote this small semicircle s or the arc s let's say r like this so over this equation what we do is we take k this side so it becomes n into cf minus 2 cs minus k so friends to k what we can write is so here you can see that k plus r will be equal to n because k is till this point and r is till this point and if we add them we will get n so what would be the value of k it would be n minus r so if we denote n minus r instead of k it would look something like this n minus r came here now we'll multiply minus into this bracket so it would look something like this minus n plus r and now if we take n common from these two terms we will get something like this cf minus 2 cs minus n so we are taking n common so it will become minus 1 bracket plus r equals m so friends here you can see that this n is the length of the loop and cf minus 2 cs minus 1 here cf is an integer cs is also an integer and minus 1 is a constant so so what is equation denotes so here you can see m which would be the distance by the temp and it will reach the starting point and here you can see that if we are starting slow pointer here then this equation if we travel this much part and into some integer value so that would be the number of loops where n will be multiplied by let's say some integer value or it can come out to be zero so for timing let's suppose this equation comes out to be 1 so it means if you are starting slow pointer here it will perform one loop and will reach to the same point and let's say if this, if this equation comes out to be 0 so it will stay at this point only because this complete part will be 0 and if we take this value that 2 3 4 and if you are starting it from here so it will travel like this but it will always reach to this this point only because it is starting from this point so this part is telling us that if we are starting the slow pointer here and whatever the value this part this equation comes in the bracket it will always make it reach to the this point only and here you can see if we travel plus r after making few cycles by this equation slow pointer will reach here only and if it travels plus r then it will meet the temporary because here you can see m is equal to some 
loops plus r if temp will move m steps the slow pointer will has moved some number of cycles and it it would have reached here and it and then it would have moved plus r so it would have meet temp here so which means that based on our values here from this point if slow pointer travels let's say one cycle two cycles three cycles it will reach here only and meanwhile m would have reached somewhere here because they are moving at same speed one one step and finally when it would have traveled r it would have met it somewhere here which would be the starting node of our loop so this equation tells that m is equals to some loops by the slow pointer plus r so if we are starting from this meeting point the slow pointer it would have performed some loops and it, it would have reached here only and then based on our this length which is r if it would have traveled r then it would have reached the starting point of the node and it would have met temp so this equation is telling that if we are dividing our loop in k and r terms and the total length of this loop is n so we need to simply prove that slow pointer if it is starting from here then whatever distance it travels it should meet the temporary node when temp has performed m steps so here you can see when temp has performed m steps which is this part of the equation that would be equal to n into an integer multiple so it would be it is starting from here it makes few few cycles it reaches to the same point and then it is traveling simply plus r so if it is traveling plus r it would reach to the starting point of the loop and where it will simply meet m because m is equal to this equation so friend this proves that from the meeting point of the slow pointer and fast pointer if we travel slow pointer by one step and temp by one step so wherever they will meet that will be our starting point of the loop so friend this proves that why floyd cycle detection algorithm works in case you have find this information useful then please like this video and if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel so that you never miss any update thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in this video we will discuss that how we can remove a loop from a singly linked list so friends in our previous videos we saw that how we can detect a loop in a singly linked list and after detecting the loop we also saw that how we can find the starting node of the loop and we demonstrated both the algorithms using floyd cycle detection algorithm and we also saw the proof of floyd cycle detection algorithm that why it works so based on similar concept we will see that how we can remove the loop from the singly linked list so before we start in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel so that you never miss any update so friends here you can see let's suppose we are given with the singly linked list which is having a loop starting from node 3 so here 3 is pointing to 4 4 is pointing to node 5 and 5 is pointing to node 6 and node 6 is again pointing to node 3 so here you can see that there is a loop and our task is to remove this loop so the only way in which we can remove this loop is if somehow we reach to this node and we break this link and once we break this link and if we assign it to null then it will become a singly linked list which will not have any loop so friends the idea behind this algorithm is it's very much similar to what we discussed in our previous videos that we create two pointers we name them fast pointer and slow pointer both starting from the head from here and then we provide a while loop so inside this while loop what we do is we move fast pointer by two steps so here you can see we are assigning fast pointer next next so for example if suppose fast pointer is here its next is this node and its next is this node so we are moving fast pointer by two steps and we are moving slow pointer by one step so once they will reach inside this cycle and if the singly linked list contains a cycle there will be a situation when slow pointer 
and fast pointer will point to the same node, which will prove that there is a loop in the singly linked list. So this idea we have already discussed in two of our videos. So the first part is to find that meeting point of slow pointer and fast pointer. So we'll quickly go over the algorithm to find the meeting point of slow pointer and fast pointer. So here we are starting both fast pointer and slow pointer from head. And we are providing a condition in while loop as fast pointer should not be equal to null and fast pointer next should not be equal to null. Because here we are traversing fast pointer by two steps, we have to provide this check. Because if fast pointer next comes out to be null, then here we will get a null pointer exception. So we are providing this safe check here. So currently fast pointer is not equal to null and next is also not equal to null. So we'll quickly go over this demonstration because we have already seen it in our previous videos. We have moved fast pointer by two steps and we will move slow pointer by one step. And after we perform one iteration, we simply check that whether they are pointing to the same node or not. So currently they are not. So after second iteration, this is the situation and still they are not pointing to the same node. Still slow pointer and fast pointer are pointing to different nodes. So friends, now here you can see that both slow pointer and fast pointer are pointing to node 5. It means that there is a loop and our if condition slow pointers equals fast pointer comes out to be true. Now which will signify that there is a loop. So in the second part of the algorithm which is what we want to remove the loop. So here now we will call remove loop method and will pass in the slow pointer. And once this method will end, this loop will be removed and we will simply return from this method. So here as we have passed slow pointer, so it will still point to node 5 because this is the meeting point of the fast pointer and slow pointer. So friends in one of our previous video, we discussed that how we can find the starting node of this loop where what we did was we created a temporary variable we started it from head and then we had moved temp by one step slow pointer by one step and where they would have met that was our starting point of the loop and we also proved the algorithm mathematically that why moving temp by one step and slow pointer by one step in a while loop will make them meet at the starting point of the node. So this algorithm we proved in our previous videos. So you can watch those videos. So here we'll apply the same analogy. We start from the head, which would be our temporary variable and slow pointer from the meeting point of slow pointer and fast pointer. Now here we are providing a while loop. So when we were actually finding the starting node, of the loop, our while loop condition was that perform the iteration till slow pointer meets the temporary node and inside this while loop we were moving both the pointers one one step. But now here you can see that as singly linked list contains a loop and we want to break this link. So we don't have to go till the starting point. We have to go a node before that and we have to remove this link. So the only way to reach node 6 is instead of comparing slow pointer with temp here, we are simply comparing slow pointers next to temp next. Because we know that when slow pointer will reach at node 6, temp will reach at node 2 and the both pointers next will point to the starting node of the loop. 
so therefore we have to break this while loop at that point because we have reached slow pointer to a node which is just before the starting point of the loop so let's see how so currently slow pointers next is not equal to temp next because temp next is pointing to node 2 and slow pointer next is pointing to node 6 so the condition in while block comes out to be true we move temp by one step so temp goes to its next node where we assign temp dot next value to temp and similarly we will move slow pointer by one step by assigning slow pointer next to slow pointer so slow pointer next is node 6 so now slow pointer will point to node 6 now friends here we again check whether slow pointer next is equal to temp next or not so slow pointer next is node 3 and temp next is also node 3 so therefore this condition comes out to be false because slow pointer next is equal to temp next so this is the only minor difference between finding the starting point of the loop and finding a node before the starting point of the loop and why we need a node before the starting point of the loop because we need to break this link and the only way to break this link is if we have reference to this node so therefore here the only difference between the two algorithm is this condition if you want to find the starting point of the loop then this while loop condition becomes slow pointer not equal to temp and if you want to find a node before that then you have to provide this condition that slow pointer next is not equal to temp dot next so here this condition comes out to be false and while loop will terminate so at the end in order to break this link what we'll do is we simply assign null value to slow pointers next so it would look something like this the slow pointer next is pointing to node 3 so this link will go away and now it will point to null so friend after this assignment you can see that our singly linked list which had a loop in between now it will end with a null value so friend this was the demonstration of the algorithm step by step i hope you have find this information useful and in case you have find this information useful then please like this video and if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel so that you never miss any update thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in our previous video we discussed about that how we can remove a loop from a singly linked list we saw an animation of the algorithm so in this video we'll write the code for that and we'll test its working in the main method so here in our singly linked list class which has this instance variable head of type list node so here inside this class i have demonstrated so many algorithms related to singly linked list so here you can see the last algorithm we discussed was how to find the starting node of the loop where we first created the loop then we simply checked that whether there is any loop or not and once we found that there is a loop we wrote the algorithm for finding the starting node of the loop and we printed its data on the console so here you can see that we used a simple example which we also saw in our previous slide that we have created six nodes first second third fourth fifth sixth where all the nodes are connected to each other and the last node is connected to node third so node 6 was connected to node third which created the loop in the singly linked list so head pointed to first node first pointed to second second pointed to third third pointed to fourth fourth pointed to fifth fifth pointed to sixth and six pointed back to third so there was a loop and the starting point of that loop was node third so if i run the code now which we already discussed in our previous videos so here you can see the starting point of that loop was at node 3 where we printed its data on the console so in this video we'll look into algorithm where we'll simply break the loop 
which means that from node six to node third will break this link, and then sixth node will point to null. So let's code the algorithm. So friends, here you can see that this algorithm of removing the loop from the singly linked list has two parts. One is to detect the loop, and part two is to actually remove the loop. So here in our previous videos, we already discussed that how we can detect a loop in a singly linked list using Floyd cycle detection algorithm, and we also saw the proof for that algorithm. So here, when fast pointer will meet the slow pointer, then instead of going and finding the starting node, what we'll do is we will remove the loop. So the first part of algorithm is pretty much the same. I'll paste the code here. And instead of returning the list node, as we are not returning anything, we will make it void. We'll name the method as remove loop, and rest of the part remains same till the cycle is detected, where fast pointer is equal to slow pointer, which we already discussed in our previous videos. We'll remove this return null, and here instead of Going and finding the starting node of the loop. What we'll do? We'll simply create a method as remove loop, and we pass in the slow pointer. And once we remove the loop, we'll simply return from this while loop, or we can break the while loop. So here, I'll be creating one private method as remove loop. Which will take in a list node, slow pointer, which is we are calling this method from here, and inside this method we'll actually write the code to remove the loop. We also discussed that how we can find the starting node of the loop. So the idea of finding the starting node of the loop and to remove the loop is pretty much the same, with only small changes. So I'll copy this part. So here we have the slow pointer, which is nothing but the meeting point of fast pointer and slow pointer, and we pass slow pointer into this method. So we have the slow pointer here, and inside this remove loop method, we are creating this temporary variable, which will start from head. So friends, when we discussed that how we can find the starting node. What we did was, we made slow pointer move one step, and we made temporary pointer move one step inside this while loop. And when they met, so temp became equal to slow pointer. So at whichever node this both pointer met, that node was our starting node of the loop. And we proved this algorithm in our previous videos. So similar concept is applied here. Here the only change we do is. We simply check whether temp dot next should not be equal to slow pointers next. So why we have provided this condition is here this condition will make us reach to the starting point of the loop, but we don't want to go till the starting point of the loop. We have to just go a node before that because as it is a singly linked list, in order to break this chain, we have to go a node before. The starting point of the loop, and once we reach there, we can simply break the chain by assigning something like slow pointer dot next equals null. So, friend, this condition is important. If we remove this dot next from both the sides, then this while loop will make slow pointer and temporary pointer to reach to the starting point of the loop, but we don't want to go to the starting point of the loop. We have to go just before that. So wherever these both the pointers are, we are simply comparing its next value. So if both the pointers' next value becomes equal, then we know that slow pointer is just before the starting point of the loop. And once this condition comes out to be false, we know that slow pointer is just before the starting point of the loop. So friends, here you can see that why this condition is important. If we don't provide dot next value. In both these pointers, then this while loop will make us reach to the starting point of the loop, 
and we don't want to reach to the starting point of the loop because if we reach to the starting point of the loop then we'll won't able to break the cycle so what we do is we simply try to reach a node before the starting point of the loop so here instead of comparing temp with slow pointer we are simply comparing both the pointers next so that when slow pointer will be a node before the starting point of the loop its next will point to the starting point of the loop and temp next will also point to that node so this condition will come out to be false which means our slow pointer will be a node before the starting point of the loop and then at the last step we'll simply assign null value to slow pointers next so this will break the cycle of the loop which is inside the singly linked list so here what we do is in the main method we simply call the remove loop method so this will take this singly linked list which contains the loop and then we'll simply call display method which will print the singly linked list and if the singly linked list will contain a loop then here you can see that display method will keep on running because it won't break because there won't be any null value and this will keep on going but here as we know that we are removing this loop here if i run the code now so here you can see that from third node it pointed to fourth then fifth then sixth and sixth again pointed to node 3 which we saw here six next is pointing to third but when we called remove loop method here the loop was removed and when we printed the singly linked list on the console this step made the sixth next to null instead of pointing to 3 so it simply removed the cycle from the singly linked list and it printed it on the console where the last node was now 6 pointing to null so friend this was all about that how we can remove a loop from a singly linked list i hope you have find this information useful and in case if you find this information useful then please like this video and if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel so that you never miss any update thanks have a nice day Hello everyone. So in this video, we are going to discuss that how we can merge two sorted singly linked list. So let's see what this problem is and how to solve this. So here, if you see that we are given with two sorted singly linked list, the first singly linked list has three nodes: one, four, and eight. And the first node is being referenced by head one. Similarly, the singly linked list two has nodes three, six, and seven. The first node being referenced by head two. Now, if you see both this singly linked list are sorted in ascending order. Now, our task is to merge them in such a way that resulting singly linked list is also sorted. So here you can see that when we merge these two singly linked list, the resulting singly linked list has six nodes, three from list one and three from list two. So total nodes are six. And here, if you see that we have merged it in such a way that the resulting singly linked list is also sorted, and that to an ascending order. So at the start we have one, then three, four, six, seven, eight. So one is added by list one, three from list two, four from list one, six, seven from list two, and finally eight being the largest value from list one. So the resulting singly linked list is also sorted. So let's move ahead and see the demonstration of the algorithm step by step. So here you can see that we are given with two singly linked lists which are sorted. Let's say they are referred by A and B, and we are calling this merge method. And this merge method will return us the head of the merged sorted singly linked list. So here, if we visualize this merge method on the call stack. Let's say we have the stack memory and heap memory. So stack memory usually have the calls to our methods. 
So let's say after certain calls, there is a merge call, and we pass A and B as our list. So here, if you see that whatever the nodes A will hold and B will hold, they will hold in the heap memory. So these are the objects which are of type list node, and A and B are references to these objects. So in heap memory it will look like this, and now we need to merge these two lists in such a way that the resulting singly linked list is also sorted. So just keep this thing in mind because it will be useful later. So here is the algorithm to merge two sorted singly linked list A and B. So friends, before we start, if you want to master data structures and algorithms, you can subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon. So that you never miss any update. Let's say we call this merge method. We pass two list A and B. So here you can see A and B are usually on the stack, and they are, and they are referencing these objects on the heap. And A and B, both the singly linked lists are sorted in ascending order. Now our task is to merge these two sorted singly linked lists such that the resulting singly linked list is also sorted. So at the start, what we do is we first create a dummy node. So this dummy list node will refer a list node on the heap with a value as zero. So this dummy list node can have any value. This value doesn't contribute in our algorithm. So we can provide any value. So it would look something like this: the dummy is on the stack and it is referencing one list node in the heap memory, having value as zero and next pointing to null. So this is a concrete object in the heap. Now, why we are creating this dummy list node, we will see later. So one such use of dummy is when we will compare the values of these two lists. So one by one, we will take out the nodes and add it to this dummy list node. So instead of null, one one value will keep on coming, and at the end, after this while loop will terminate, and this logic will end, all the list node of both the list will be added to. The list being referred by this dummy node. So here, dummy list node will hold our final list, which we will be returning it from this method, merge method. So it will hold our result list, which is merged and sorted. The second point of creating this dummy list node is, it will help us in avoiding errors. Like null pointer exceptions. So we will see this point later that how it helps in preventing null pointer exception. So for timing, you can just think that we have created one dummy list node. Now this list node will keep on adding one one node from both the list such that when the both the list will be exhausted, all the list nodes will become part of this. List referred by this dummy node. Moving ahead. Now here you can see that as we have created this dummy node, this dummy node will refer to this node, and our task is to merge these two sorted singly linked list by taking one one element and adding it after the dummy node. So dummy node stays at this place. What we do is we create a tail list node, and which will point to dummy. So it looks like this. Now this tail will help us in adding the nodes after the dummy node, and after adding one one node, the tail will move ahead, and it will keep on adding till all the nodes are exhausted. So that we will see in the while loop how it does. Now we are providing a while loop where the conditions are a should not be equal to null and b should not be equal to null. So here you can see this and operator tells. That if any of the list is exhausted, or their references A and B reach to the end of the list, we have to break from this while loop. And why we are doing this is because, so here, if I take an example, let's say A is referring to one, four, and then eight, and B to three and six. So if I see the resulting list, it will be like this: one, then three, then four, then six. So once 
six will be placed here. You can see this B list will have its all the nodes in the resulting list. And let's say after eight, we have like nine, eleven, fifteen. So after six, B has got exhausted. So it means that after six, there are no more nodes which can be compared with the rest of the elements. Of a like eight, nine, eleven, and fifteen. So what we do is we simply break from this while loop because one of the list got exhausted. So there would be a point when either of the list can get exhausted. We will see this when we will execute the while loop. So currently a is not equal to null, b is not equal to null. So the condition in while block comes out to be true. So the while block will execute. Now we provide. If and else condition, and here what we are doing is, as we want to merge these two sorted singly linked lists such that the resulting list is also sorted, what we do is we compare the data of A and B, and we check which data is less. So in this if condition, we are checking that A data whether it is less than equal to B's data or not. So here you can see one. Is less than three. We are comparing one with three, so one is less than three. So this condition comes out to be true, which means we are starting from the first node of both the list, and we have found one node whose value is smaller among all the elements in the both the list because they are sorted in ascending order. So your list node, which is data, is one. Being referred by A will be the first node of our resulting sorted singly linked list. One should come at the start. So here you can see now what we do is tail is actually pointing to this dummy node, and our task is to add this much node into the dummy list. Currently here you can see tail's next is pointing to null. So if we assign A to tail's next. It would look something like this: the tail next, which is pointing to null. It will now point to a list node, which is being referred by A. So here, this assignment will add this list node, having data as one, into this list whose head is dummy. So we are taking the help of tail pointer to add this node. So after we add this node. We know that we have used one value of list A, so we simply traverse A to its next node, because the next comparison should be between three and four, because we have compared one and three. One was lesser than three, so we added this list node into this list. So now we simply move A to its next node. So there are two reasons why we are moving it to its next node. One is In the next iteration of while loop, now we will compare four with three. So therefore, we need a reference to this node. And the second point we will see in the next iteration. So after this assignment, a dot next, a next, which is node four, we will assign that value to a. So a will come to this node now, like this. And here in this step, as tail has added one node here, now. The other node will come after one, because this node is added, and we have to add more nodes. And tail will help us in doing that. So we also traverse tail ahead by assigning tail dot next to tail. So tail next is node one. So now tail will reach here, like this, because next node will be added after one now. A is not equal to null. B is not equal to null. So the condition in while block comes out to be true. Now we again compare the data of A and B. So here we are simply comparing in this if block is whether four is less than equal to three or not. So four is actually greater than three. So this condition comes out to be false, and the else block will be executed. I'll just remove this. So in the else block, we know that among four and three, three was the lesser value. So now. We have to add this node after one, and how we can do that is B is referring to this list node, 
and now we have to add this list node after one so we are taking the help of tail we assign b to tails next here if you see tails next is pointing to this node now so we have to break this link and point it to this node so by this assignment the first thing it will happen is this link will go away and as tail next was pointing to this node now tail next will point to b which is node 3 like this and also friends in previous while loop we moved a to its next so one reason was that we are comparing 4 with 3 the other reason is we have removed this reference from here and now it is pointing to this node so as soon as we remove this reference we need something to hold this two list nodes from the stack which is being done by a so therefore this is the another reason we are moving a to its next and now after this assignment we do the same this value is used up and now it is part of this list so here you can see dummy is pointing to list node having value as 0 it is pointing to a node having value as 1 and 1 is pointing to a node having value as 3 so now we have used this value so we move b to its next node so by assigning b dot next to b so b next is this node when we will assign b dot next to b b will come here like this i'll remove this and similarly we also move tail ahead because the next node will be added after 3 now so we have to somehow reach here and we can only reach here is by assigning tails next to tail so tails next which is node 3 we will assign it to tail so tail will come here now like this a is not equal to null b is not equal to null so the condition in while block comes out to be true now a dot data which is 4 b dot data which is 6 so we are comparing 4 and 6 and we are checking whether 4 is less than equal to 6 or not so this condition comes out to be true because 4 is less than 6 and as 4 is less than 6 the next node after 3 would be 4 so in the first step what we are doing is tail is pointing to node 3 tails next is pointing to 6 so first we need to remove this link and how we can remove this link is to tells next we are assigning a so tells next we remove this node and we assign a which is node 4 so it would look something like this after this assignment we have used 4 also so we move a to its next node by assigning a dot next to a a dot next is 8 so a will come to 8 via this reference and as we have added 4 here the next node will come after 4 and we are adding node based on our tail so we have to move tail also one node ahead so we are assigning tail dot next to tail so tail will come here like this via this assignment a is not equal to null b is not equal to null so the condition in while block comes out to be true and now we are comparing a data and b data we are comparing 6 and 8 and here we are checking whether 8 is less than equal to 6 or not in this if block so this condition comes out to be false because 8 is greater than 6 so we execute the else part so here this if condition is telling that between 6 and 8 6 is smaller so 6 should be added first to the sorted singly linked list which we want to merge so therefore that happens in the else block so this if block is dealing with a list and else block is dealing with b list and here we are doing the same thing we need to add this node referred by b after 4 and after 4 means tails next value so we are assigning b to tails next so first we are removing this node like this and after this assignment tails next will point to b like this and then we will move b to its next because we have used 6 also now so b will move to its next and here you can see 
B next was null. So now B is referring to null. We have added six now. So the next node will be added after six. So tail should come here, and tail will only come here when we will assign tails next to tail. So tail is pointing to four. Its next is pointing to six. So when we will assign tail dot next to tail, tail will point to six, like this. So friends, here you can see that when we are traversing this while loop, there will be a moment that one of the list will become empty. Both the list cannot become empty because as we are adding one one node from each of the list, there will be a point when one of the list will become empty. So it could be B or A. Any list can become empty. So if any of the list becomes empty, we break from this while loop like this, and after this while loop. We have this if else block. Now, why we have provided this if else block is B got exhausted, but there could be a chance that in A there could be elements left. So currently here we have only one element. There could be a possibility that its next should point to let's say nine, then ten, twenty like this. So our task is to add this remaining nodes as well after six because tail is pointing to six. And eight should come after six via this tail node. So we check that which list got empty. So here in this if block we are checking that which list got empty, whether it was A or B. So here you can see B is actually pointing to null. It means B got exhausted. A is not equal to null. A is actually referring to a node. So this condition comes out to be false, and the else part will be executed. So here you can see. If A got exhausted, B comes into picture, and we assign all the nodes of B to tails next. If B got exhausted, then we are adding all the nodes of A to tails next. So here B got exhausted, and we need to put, let's say, this node into the list. So at the last step, what we do is we assign A to tails next. Tail is pointing to six. Its next is pointing to null. So if we assign A to it, this will go away, and there will be a link from tails next to A like this via this assignment. And here you can see, as we need to merge these two sorted singly linked list in such a way that the resulting list is also sorted, we don't have to do anything with the rest of the elements of A. Let's say it had nine, ten, twenty like this because they are already sorted. So via this reference. All the nodes will be part of now this complete list. So our task will be done here. So here you can see this dummy list node has built one chain, which is actually our resulting list. So here you can see it goes like this. Like this. So here, one thing to note here is, this dummy list node was created by us. Therefore, we don't have to include this. So therefore, at the end, we are returning dummy dot next. Dummy is pointing to this list node. It was actually a dummy list node which we created here. So at the end, we need to return dummy dot next. So dummy next is this node. So we are returning a list node. Which is holding this list like this from this method. So the method which is calling this merge will get a list node. Let's say if it is called like this. So our head will be pointing to one, and it goes like three, four. Six and eight and so on. So this head will be in the stack and this will be in the heap. All the nodes. So we are returning dummy dot next because we have to discard this dummy because all the nodes which we added using our tail were after the dummy node. So we have to discard this. So here, if you see, if I if we hold this pointer and if we stretch it ahead, this nodes will be stretched out and it will look like this. So dummy was our node which we created. It has no significance. We return dummy dot next. So dummy next is this.
So this is our final sorted singly linked list, which actually has all the elements of A and B. So friends, here you can see that we use dummy list node, and we saw that it helped us in building up this list because this is one concrete node in the heap, and this is on the stack. So dummy is referencing one concrete node on the heap, and then we are simply adding the rest of the nodes after dummy. So this was the one case where we are actually creating this dummy list node. The other thing we saw was that it helped us in avoiding null pointer exceptions. So here, let's say if we are not using this dummy list node. So here we are not using this line. Instead of this dummy list node, we have to create one head which we can return from this method. So we have to do something like this. Like this, instead of this, in this tail, instead of dummy, it should point to head, and instead of dummy dot next, we should return head, because this list node head will be holding our the merged sorted singly linked list. But here you can see that once we execute this line, and we are not creating this dummy list node, so it would look something like this. After this line. Head will point to null, and when we will execute this line, we are assigning value of head to tail because this tail will help us in adding of the nodes in this while loop. So here it would look something like this. Tail will refer to a value which is being held by head via this assignment. So tail will also start from null. Now here you can see in this while block we have provided if and else block. And let's say when we compare one and three for the first time, we know that one is less than three. So this condition would have been true because a data is less than b data. So here you can see when this line would have gone executed. Here we are assigning a to tails next, but when this line will be executed, tail is pointing to null. And if we are doing this dot next, it means we are accessing a variable which is being referred by tail. So there should have been one concrete object in the heap. On that we have to call next. But here tail is pointing to null. So here you can see it will give us a null pointer exception because tail is pointing to null. It doesn't have any object in the heap on which we can call next. Similarly, here also we would have got an error. So we will get null pointer exception. So this is one of the use cases we are creating this dummy list node. Because we need this concrete object, so that we can use tail and add these remaining nodes. So this is one important thing to remember that we usually create this dummy list node to avoid the null pointer exceptions. Now let's say if we are told that we don't have to use this dummy list node, we want to merge these two sorted singly linked lists using the normal nodes. So we can also solve the problem that way. This dummy list node is actually helping us in avoiding these errors and the checks. But what if you want to merge this two list without the dummy nodes? So how we can approach that is now here you can see that head is starting from null. Now what if head start from a concrete list node in the heap and it doesn't start from null? So if I just remove this line, so you can think. Before this assignment of head to tail, we have to write some logic to handle this condition so that these errors are avoided. What we need to do is the things which we are doing in while loop in one shot that we are comparing all the nodes using this if and else condition. What we do is for the first time we just check for one of the nodes. So this check which we are doing in the while block we have to do for the first. Comparison so that we can get one concrete node in the heap. So we have to write some extra logic. So what we do is here you can see before while block and this tail assignment, we have to write some logic like this. Here you can see these conditions are very much similar to this while block. So here what we are doing is as we need one concrete object in the heap, 
and we don't have to use this dummy object what we do is to get one of the concrete objects from this tool list we do the first comparison out of this while block here we do a dot data and check whether it is less than b dot data and if a dot data is less than b dot data so currently one is less than three so what we do is we simply treat this node as our starting node and we directly assign head to it via this assignment and as we have used this node so we simply traverse a to this node by assigning a dot next to a so this if and else block is very much similar conditions here but for getting one of the concrete nodes we do this one check out of this while block and rest of the code is pretty much the same this a not equal to null and b not equal to null a not equal to null will start from this node so when we had created this dummy list node this code we don't have to write and all the logic would have been compared in this while block so first node of a and first node of b would have been checked in the while block but if we don't want to use this dummy list node we somehow need a concrete node so for getting this first node we are doing this check outside the while block here so that we can get a concrete head so rest of the logic is similar once we get head here tail will point to head like this and now in the while block if we do tail dot next we actually have a concrete object here we had a null object but here now we have a concrete object so therefore this error won't come and at the end we can simply return head so friend this is how we actually merge two sorted singly linked list so that resulting list is also sorted you need to be very careful while merging this two list using this dummy node it will make your code easy and simple to write but if you don't want to use this dummy node the first thing you need to do is to identify the actual starting point of the head which is our resulting list so we have to do this comparison first to get our first head and then we can provide this while block and do the similar stuff which we already discussed and at the end instead of doing dummy dot next we are returning head so friends i hope you must have liked this video in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in our previous video we saw an animation in which we discussed that how we can merge two sorted singly linked list so in this video we will actually code the algorithm and we will test its working in the main method so friends before we start in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update so here in our previous videos we have created one class as singly linked list so in the same class we will actually code the algorithm so here let's say i give the method name as public merge so this merge method will take two list node a and b so these two list node represent two sorted singly linked list and now our task is to merge these two sorted singly linked list and return it back from this method so here as we need to merge these two sorted singly linked list the first step we do is we create a dummy list node and we provide a dummy value to it now this dummy list node will actually hold our merged sorted singly linked list and in our previous video we have saw that why we are creating this dummy list node it is actually providing us a concrete object in the heap so that we can avoid the null pointer exceptions now as this dummy list node will hold our merged sorted singly linked list we will create a list node let's say by name tail and this tail will actually point to this dummy list node so the dummy list node will actually hold the complete list 
and we will use this tail list node and we will add one one element from the both the list using this tail pointer we will see that later now after that we will provide a while loop now as we need to merge these two sorted singly linked list we have to compare their respective elements with each other so that we will do in the while loop so the condition we provide is a should not be equal to null and b should not be equal to null so here as we are comparing one one element from both the list with each other there will be a time that either a or b get exhausted so if any of the list get exhausted we will exit from the while loop now inside this while loop as we are merging these two sorted singly linked list and we want the resultant list also sorted let's say if i give an example So here, let's say A has three nodes one, three, five, and B has three nodes two, four, and six. Now, when we will merge these two sorted singly linked list, the resultant list will be like it will also be sorted. So here in this while loop, what we are doing is. we are comparing the elements of both the list first we compare one with two we know that one is less than two so one will be inserted first then after inserting one we move to three and then we compare two with three and we know that two is less than three so the next element comes as two so we move to four and then we compare three with four three is less than four so three will come here and we keep on doing that till one of the list get exhausted so here we provide a if condition because we need to find the smallest element among the both the list for the current iteration so here what we do is we simply compare a data and see whether it is less than or equal to b's data so if a's data is less than or equal to b's data it means two tails next we will assign a and then we will simply move a to its next node so here when we compared one with two one is less than two so we added one to the resultant list via this assignment and then we move to three so we did a equal to a dot next and similarly if b's data is less than a's data what we do is we simply add b two tails next and then we move b to its next node so here one is less than two so we added one and we move to three and in the next iteration we compare two with three so two was less than three so we added two here and then we moved to four so that in the next iteration we compare three with four and why we are doing this comparison because we need to get this list and it should be sorted so in this while loop we are comparing each and every element of a and b and whichever element is less we are simply adding that node into tails next and then we are simply moving the respective references to its next node so that we can compare the next element and here we also need to move tail to its next node so here let's say first we added one so initially tail must have been here so we have used tail dot next and added one so the two will come after one so we have to move tail also ahead so that in the next iteration if we do tail dot next two will come here and then we'll simply move tail to two and we keep on moving tail ahead till there are nodes in a and b so this step is also important that we need to move tail also ahead so that in the next iteration we are adding a different element to tails next so after this while loop there will be two possibilities either a will get exhausted or b will get exhausted so here let's say if i copy this part so let's say instead of 
we have like this and here we have so here you can see in the result list first we will add one then two will come then three four so after four a will get exhausted and as we need to merge this two sorted singly linked list these elements should also become the part of the result list so one property here to notice as both the list are sorted and as one of the list get exhausted we can directly append the rest of the list after four so we can directly do this after the while loop like this and this will actually merge both the list and will also be sorted so here what we do is we simply check if a is equal to null because here in the while loop as we are moving a to its next and b to its next either a will get exhausted first that a will point to null or b will get exhausted that b will point to null so if a is equal to null then here we saw that we have directly appended b to the result list so here what we do is we do b else if b is equal to null we directly append a and after this if else block we know that we have merged both the list so at the end what we do is we need to return the head of this resultant list so we will simply do dummy dot next and we will return it so why we are doing dummy dot next here you can see this dummy is a list node we created and whatever the nodes we added we added after this dummy using tails next we started with dummy node and we used tails next and added the nodes so the actual head would be dummies next because the first node was inserted in tails next and tail was pointing to dummy so at the end we need to return dummies next so friends this is the algorithm to merge two sorted singly linked list now let's test it's working in the main method so in the main method we will create two singly linked list and we will add few nodes to it we do insert last and let's say if we add the nodes in the sorted form so we first add one and let's say we add four and eight so this node should be in sorted form first node will be one then it will be four and then it will be eight now we'll create one more singly linked list and here let's say if i give value as 3 5 8 let's say 9 14 18 so here after 8 this list will get exhausted and we can directly place the remaining list via this if else block so if i do dot display so currently if i run the code so here you can see we have this two singly linked list which are sorted 1 4 8 3 5 8 9 14 like this so now we will call the merge method and as we need to pass the head of a and b what we'll do dot head
so we have passed the head of both the list because this method is taking a list node and this method will return us a list node representing a singly linked list which is merged and sorted so here we will create one more singly linked list we'll give a name as result and let's say whatever list node this merge method will return we will simply add it to results head like this and we will simply do result dot display so when we will merge this to sorted singly linked list this head will actually hold that list and then here we are calling the display method to print the contents of the final list so if i run the code now so here you can see that the resultant list which we got is the combination of this two list and it is also sorted so 1 3 4 5 8 8 8 because we have two eight here then 9 14 18 so after this list got exhausted 8 9 14 and 18 were directly added here so friend this was all about that how we can merge two sorted singly linked list here we have used the idea of dummy pointers which we have discussed in greater detail in our previous video and using a tail we are adding one one node in this while loop after comparing a's data and b's data and at the end if any of the list got exhausted we are simply appending the opposite list to tails next and at the end we are returning dummy dot next because this dummy we actually created to get a concrete object and all the nodes were added just after the dummy node so at the end we simply return dummies next so friends i hope you must have liked this video in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in this video we are going to discuss a problem that how we can add two singly linked list so let's move ahead and see what this problem is and how to solve this so here in this problem we are given with this two singly linked list which are non empty so we have this two singly linked list a and b they actually represent a number which is a positive number the digits are stored in reverse order and each of their nodes contains a single digit so as this is a number each node in the list have a single digit and this complete number is stored in reverse order so if you want to know the number you have to read it from end so here the number is 3 4 3 so 3 4 3 for this list it would be 4 6 5 because they are stored in reverse order now our task is to we need to add these two numbers and return the sum as a linked list like this So here you can see if we add these two numbers using a plain maths, here you will get eight, four and six will give ten. So zero will come here and one will be carried over. Four and three will give seven. Seven plus one eight. So our answer would be eight zero eight. So we need to return eight zero eight, which is the sum of these two numbers in the form of a singly linked list. Here we are given that two numbers does not contain any leading zero. So for example. here we won't have something like this because those are leading zeros the zero can only come so here let's say if we are given a singly linked list like this so this is a valid singly linked list because the complete number is zero so now let's move ahead and see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step so friends before we start in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update so here we are given this method add we pass two singly linked list a and b like this now we need to do the sum of this two numbers and return the sum in the form of singly linked list only where each node will have only one digit so here you can see the numbers are stored in reverse order So the number we are trying to add is nine, four, seven, because the number is stored in reverse order. We are adding sixty-five to it, like this. So seven plus five will give twelve. 
टू विल कम ईयर वन विल बी कैरिड ओवर ईयर सिक्स प्लस फोर विल गिव टेन टेन प्लस वन विल बी इलेवन सो वन विल कम ईयर एंड अनादर वन विल बी कैरिड ओवर नाइन प्लस वन विल गिव टेन सो अवर आंसर इज वन जीरो वन टू सो ईयर दिस वन जीरो वन टू शुड बी रिटर्न इन द फॉर्म ऑफ ए सिंगली लिंक लिस्ट वेर ईच डिजिट शुड बी इन द रिस्पेक्टिव नोट्स सो फॉर द रिजल्ट सिंगली लिंक लिस्ट वी हैव टू फर्स्ट क्रिएट अ डमी लिस्ट नोट विच विल हैव अ डमी वैल्यू जीरो सो फ्रेंड्स इन अवर प्रीवियस वीडियोज वी हैव डिस्कस द आइडिया ऑफ डमी लिस्ट नोट दैट वाई वी एक्चुअली क्रिएट दिस डमी लिस्ट नोट इट बेसिकली हेल्प अस इन अवॉइडिंग द नल पॉइंटर एक्सेप्शन एंड ऑल्सो इट एक्चुअली प्रोवाइड्स अ कॉन्क्रीट ऑब्जेक्ट इन द हीप और एल्स वॉट वी नीड टू डू इज वी नीड टू राइट सम एक्स्ट्रा लॉजिक टू जस्ट इवेल्युएट द फर्स्ट लिस्ट नोट एंड देन प्रोसीड फ्रॉम देयर ऑन सो इन ऑर्डर टू लर्न मोर अबाउट डमी लिस्ट नोट यू कैन वॉच माई प्रीवियस वीडियोज टू इट सो हियर एट द स्टेप वन वी विल क्रिएट अ डमी लिस्ट नोट सो फ्रेंड्स इन दिस एल्गोरिथम वॉट वी आर ट्राइंग टू डू इज वी विल टेक वन वन सिंगल डिजिट फ्रॉम बोथ द लिस्ट वी विल एड देम एंड वॉट एवर विल बी द सम दैट सम वी विल क्रिएट अ लिस्ट नोट एंड एड जस्ट आफ्टर द डमी लिस्ट नोट सो करली डमीज नेक्स्ट इज पॉइंटिंग टू नल बट आफ्टर वी डू द सम ऑफ ईच नोट फ्रॉम बोथ द लिस्ट वॉट एवर देयर सम विल बी वी विल क्रिएट अ लिस्ट नोट एंड वी विल एड टू दिस डमी लिस्ट सो फॉर दैट वी आर क्रिएटिंग अ टेल लिस्ट नोट like this it is referring to dummy list node we will use this tail to add the list node into this singly linked list one by one so that stuff we will be seeing in the while loop moving ahead so here you can see that one list node can have only one digit so the maximum value this list node will have is from 0 to 9 and let's say if you are adding 7 plus 5 so we'll get answer as 12 so we can only store one digit so usually when we do plain maths what we do is we store two here and one is carried over so this one we will be keeping track via carry so at the start carry is zero because we haven't started our addition so carry is zero now we will provide a while loop where the condition are a is not equal to null or b is not equal to null so in this while loop what we are doing is we are taking one one node from both the list and we will do their sum but there could be a chance that one list gets exhausted before the other and as we need to do the sum of this complete to singly linked list the condition we provide is a should not be equal to null or b should not be equal to null so even if b is equal to null let's say b reached here and a reached here so b is equal to null but a is not equal to null so therefore this while loop will run one more time to take the sum of this last digit and add that sum into our result list so even if one list is not empty this while loop will keep on running so at the start a is not equal to null and b is not equal to null so the condition in while loop comes out to be true now here what we are doing is even if one condition comes out to be true the while loop will execute so there could be a chance that a is not equal to null but b is equal to null or a is equal to null but b is not equal to null so we need to take this value 7 plus 5 but before taking those values we need to check whether a and b are actually pointing to null or not so here we have used a ternary operator where we are checking whether a is not equal to null so if a is not equal to null we take a's value but if a is equal to null then we take the value as zero because zero won't affect the sum so this ternary operator condition states that if a is not equal to null so currently a is not equal to null so we will take the value a dot val which is 7 and that will be assigned to x like this similarly we have to take this value because we are adding the first digits so we are first checking whether b is equal to null or not so if b is not equal to null it means there is a digit we need to add so we are simply taking b dot val which is 5 and that will be assigned to y like this so here we have taken out the values in x and y and now what we do is we do the sum so at the start we have a carry as 0 so here carry is 0 we are taking the first digit 7 which is x second digit 5 which is our y and we are doing the sum of this three numbers so 0 plus 7 plus 5 will give 
So sum will become twelve like this. So friends, here you can see we need to store this sum in such a way that only one digit can come in the list node. And when we actually do the maths, we get sum as twelve. We put two here and we carry over one to the next digit. So how we can perform this mathematical addition is we take the help of division and modulus operator. So if we take sum as twelve, the maximum value each node can have is single digit. So if we take sum as twelve. If we divide it by the first two-digit number, which is ten, we'll get one. And if we do twelve mod ten, this will give us remainder, which is two. So here you can see we can use this properties where we take the remainder like this, which is our two, and we can take the carry by dividing it by ten. So here we are first evaluating carry for the next addition. So sum is twelve. If we do divided by ten. Carry will become one because we need to put two here and send one to the next addition. And now, as we are putting two here, this property will help us in taking out two from the sum. So we are doing sum mod ten, which will give us two, and that two will be our single digit. And we need to return this result in the form of a singly linked list. So we will create this list node, and we have to add it. In the dummy list, so we'll take the help of tail. So to tail next, which is null, we'll create a list node, provide a value as two, and add it to tails next. So after executing this line, tail next is pointing to null. So now it will point to a list node having value as two, which is our first value of the addition. Moving ahead. Now after putting two, if we look into the digits, the next digit will come one. So that will come after this two. So in the next iteration, we will be using tail to put one. So for that we have to move tail to the next node so that we can still use this condition tail dot next and add the new list node. So after adding two, we'll move the tail to its next node by assigning tail dot next to tail. So it would look something like this. Because in the next iteration, we are doing the sum of the second digits. And we will put after two using the tails next. So, friends, after we perform the sum of first two digits, we need to move A to its next and B to its next to take the next two digits. So, for that, we have to first check whether A or B are actually pointing to null or not. So, if A is not equal to null, we can safely go towards its next by assigning A dot next to A. So at the first step, it would look something like this. A will now come to its next because A next is pointing to this node. So now A will point to this node. Similarly, we will move B to its next because B is also not equal to null. So it would look something like this. B next is this node. So now B will point to this node. I will remove everything. So here you can see A is not equal to null. A is pointing to the second node. B is not equal to null. B is also pointing to the second node. So the condition in while loop comes out to be true. So first we will evaluate x. We first check whether A is not equal to null. So A is not equal to null. So we simply do A dot val. It means we are taking this value out four and assign to x. So x become four. Then we will evaluate whether b is equal to null or not. So b is not equal to null. So we will take b dot val and assign to y. So we'll assign six to y, like this. And we know that after the first addition, the carry was one. So we will do the sum of carry x and y. So here, if you see nine, four, seven, six, five. If you are adding it, we get two. And one is our carry. Four plus six is ten. Plus one will give eleven. So one will come here, and one will be our carry. Nine plus one will give ten. Zero will come here, and one will be our carry. So the addition will give one zero one two. So we have done with the first addition, which is two, here. One became our carry, and x and y are actually denoting four and six. So we are doing some of these three digits now. One plus four plus six. 
सो कैरी प्लस एक्स प्लस वाई सो सम विल बिकम इलेवन सो इफ यू लुक एट द सम वी कैन ओनली स्टोर वन डिजिट एंड अनादर वन विल बी द कैरी ओवर सो फर्स्ट वी विल इवेल्युएट द कैरी फॉर द नेक्स्ट एडिशन सो इलेवन डिवाइडेड बाय टेन विल गिव द वैल्यू एज वन बिकॉज वेन वी विल डिवाइड इलेवन बाय टेन वी गेट वैल्यू एज वन सो अवर कैरी विल बिकम वन and the digit we want to store here is will be given by the remainder so 11 mod 10 whatever value it gives here it is 1 so that will be stored here and how it can be stored we have to store in the form of a list node so sum mod 10 will give the remainder as 1 so we will create this new list node and we will assign it to tails next so tails next is pointing to null so this will go away and one will come here which is this one moving ahead so now we have to move tail to this node because when we will perform the third addition that node will come after this one so tail should go to this node so we will assign tail dot next to tail so tail next is pointing to this node so now tail will come to this node via this assignment we are done with processing of second nodes so now we have to move a and b to its next node so first we will check whether a is equal to null or not so if a is not equal to null we can safely move to its next node by assigning a dot next to a so a dot next is this node so now a will come to this node b is not equal to null so we will assign b dot next to b so b dot next is pointing to null So now B will point to null. So friends, here you can see the singly linked list B got exhausted, and we have reached to the end of the singly linked list. But as we are performing the sum of these two singly linked lists, we have to take the sum of this nine as well. So here B is equal to null. So this condition comes out to be false, but A is not equal to null because there is one more node left. so this condition comes out to be true and there is a or so therefore the condition in while loop comes out to be true a is not equal to null so we will take a dot well which is 9 we will assign it to x x become 9 here you can see b is actually equal to null so we can't do b dot well because this will give us null pointer exception because b is not pointing to null so therefore what we do is if b is not equal to null we take b dot well if b is equal to null we take the value of y as 0 this because when we will do sum of x plus y plus carry y will be 0 and it won't affect the sum so here if we do 1 plus 9 plus 0 so it won't affect the sum so therefore we need to put this check that if b is equal to null we take the value of y as 0 like this and now we will do sum of carry plus x plus y so carry was 1 x is 9 y is 0 if we do their sum we get sum as 10 now we get the sum as 10 so we put 0 here and 1 will be our carry over which is here so first we will evaluate the carry by doing 10 divided by 10 so the answer will be 1 so carry will become 1 like this and then we have to take this value zero so if we do sum mod 10 which is 10 mod 10 we get remainder as zero so this will become zero we will create a list node and we will add it to tails next like this so via this assignment we are adding this new list node having value as zero this using tails next we will move tail to its next like this and here you can see that with this addition we have used this value and this value so if a is not equal to null we have to move to its next so a is not equal to null here we assign a dot next to a so now a will point to null we check whether b is equal to null or not so actually b is equal to null so we don't perform this b dot next to b because b is already pointing to null 
so now here you can see a is equal to null and b is equal to null so therefore both the condition in while loop comes out to be false because a is equal to null and b is equal to null so this while loop will terminate so friends one thing to note here is we have simply done the sum of first three digits 2 1 and 0 but the actual addition result is 1 0 1 2 so this one which was our carry over so we will check here whether carry is greater than 0 or not so if carry is 0 we do nothing but here value of carry is 1 which is greater than 0 so we have to add one more node to tails next to encounter for this carry also so currently carry is greater than 0 we will create a list node by passing in the value as carry which is 1 and we are simply assigning it to tails next so tails next is pointing to null so now it will point to a node having value as 1 which is the value of our carry so friends here you can see that we have done the sum of these two singly linked list the digits were in reverse order so our sum is also in reverse order so 947 if we add to 65 so 9, 4, 7, if we add to 65, we get answer as 1, 0, 1, 2. So here at the end we simply return dummy dot next because this dummy is pointing to a list node which actually we created. So this is a dummy value. So we'll simply return dummy dot next which is a list starting from this list node. So it would look something like this that we have dummy list like this and we are returning dummy dot next so the method which called this add method will get like this this would be our answer 2101 so friends this was all about that how we can add two singly linked list i hope you must have liked this video in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update thanks have a nice day Hello friends, welcome to my new data structures and algorithm in Java tutorial series video. Friends, in this tutorial we will discuss how to represent doubly linked list in Java. So friends, in my previous tutorials, I discussed about singly linked list. So in this tutorial, I will be discussing about doubly linked list. So friends, when we discussed about singly linked list, so it was a one way linked list it had only two things one was the data and other was the pointer to next list node but if you see in doubly linked list it is actually a two way linked list so if you see a doubly linked list we have this list node which has basically three things one is the actual data which it holds and other is the next pointer so this next pointer points to the node which is just after it and it also has a previous pointer which points to a node just before it so this way it's a two way linked list so in doubly linked list suppose if we are given any particular node then we can use that node to navigate the list in both forward and backward direction if you would have watched my previous tutorial on singly linked list then we saw that we could only move in forward direction in singly linked list so it's not possible to move in backward direction when we are using the singly linked list but with doubly linked list we can move forward and backward in the both the direction and one other difference between singly linked list and doubly linked list is like a node in singly linked list can only be deleted if we have a pointer to its previous node but in doubly linked list we can delete the node even if we don't have a pointer to its previous node so as you saw that singly linked list moves in forward direction so in order to break any chain or any node in between the singly linked list we usually need a pointer to its previous node to delete the node after it but in doubly linked list as we have these two pointers which helps us in traversing forward and backward then we don't need any pointer to its previous node so from doubly linked list implement the, the list node with a slight different way than singly linked list so the list node in singly linked list had data and a pointer to the next list node but in doubly linked list the list node has data a pointer to the next list node and a pointer to the previous list node 
so you can see this is how we represent a list node in doubly linked list so if you want to represent a doubly linked list then it's something like usually we have this head and tail pointers so the head points to the first node and the tail points to the last node so you can see each list node has data a pointer to its next node and a pointer to its previous node so usually the head points to the first node and its previous is null and the tail points to the last node whose next pointer points to null so it's like a two way linked list where each node has one next and one previous so this is how they form a chain where each node refer to other node next to it and a node previous to it so the traversing becomes easier in forward and backward direction so let's say suppose we have a pointer to this third node then if you want to traverse to the forward then we can use this next pointer and traverse forward and if suppose if you want to traverse backwards then we can use this previous pointer to traverse backwards so this is a basically a advantage of doubly linked list over singly linked list so friends in this tutorial we discussed about how to represent a doubly linked list in java and in my next tutorial i will be discussing the way to implement the doubly linked list in java I hope you like this video please like comment share and subscribe my youtube channel thanks have a nice day hello friends welcome to my new data structures and algorithm in java tutorial series video friends in this tutorial we will discuss how to implement doubly linked list in java so friends in my previous tutorial i discussed how to represent a doubly linked list so here if you see a doubly linked list has basically a head and a tail pointer so the head points to the first node and the tail points to the last node so we also discussed that list node has a next pointer which points to the node after it and has a previous pointer which points to the node just before it and we also discussed that a doubly linked list is a two way linked list that is it we can traverse the doubly linked list in both forward and a backward direction so a list node which has a next pointer and previous pointer has help us in traversing in forward and backward direction so this is a basically the advantage of a singly linked list we also saw that how to represent list node in doubly linked list so a list node in singly linked list had only data and an x pointer which points to the node after it but in doubly linked list the list node has data a x pointer which points to the list node just after it and also a previous pointer which points to the list node just before it so friends let's go to eclipse and see how we can implement a doubly linked list so friends in my previous tutorials i discussed about singly linked list so in this tutorial we will see how to implement a doubly linked list in java so here i have just created a class by name doubly linked list so this class will hold the implementation for doubly linked list so in order to implement a doubly linked list we need list node class so we'll create a inner class by name list node so basically this list node class will hold the pointers to next and the previous nodes so as we discussed in the slide that list node contains three things private int data so it contains data and this data can be any generic type as well but here i will be taking it as integer it holds a pointer to the next list node it also holds the pointer to its previous node so the three things are data a pointer to the next node a pointer to the previous node we'll also create one constructor so this constructor will take the data part and we'll simply assign data to this dot data so this is how we represent our list node and we also saw in the slide that doubly linked list had a head pointer and a tail pointer so we'll create two instance variable 
of list node one is head and other one is tail so basically the head will hold the first node of the doubly linked list and the tail will hold the last node of the doubly linked list here we also create a integer variable by name length so this integer variable will hold the length of doubly linked list so it will just return the count of number of nodes in the doubly linked list so we'll also create one constructor for doubly linked list class so here we'll assign the values of this three instance variables so this dot head equals say null this dot tail is null so basically when we initialize doubly linked list the list is empty so the head and tail will point to null and length of the doubly linked list is zero we'll also create one method by name is empty so this method will return us a boolean value which will signify whether our doubly linked list is empty or not so we can simply return length so suppose the length of doubly linked list is 0 therefore the list is empty so it will return true we can also return something like head is null so even if head is null then the list is empty so we can use either of the two statements we'll also create one more method which will return back as the length of doubly linked list so friend this is how we represent a doubly linked list in java so in this tutorial i just created an inner class list node two methods is empty and length so in my upcoming tutorial we will discuss how we can insert the node in doubly linked list and how we can delete the node in a doubly linked list so friends i hope you like this video please like comment share and subscribe my youtube channel thanks have a nice day hello friends welcome to my new data structures and algorithm in java tutorial series video friends in this tutorial we will discuss how to print elements of a doubly linked list in java so let's say we are given a doubly linked list having four nodes say 1 10 15 and 25 and as you can see head points to the first node which is 1 and tail points to the last node which is 25 and each node in doubly linked list has one next and one previous pointer so the next pointer points to the node just after it and previous pointer points to the node just before it so friends in doubly linked list we can traverse the list in forward and as well as in backward direction so below is the algorithm to traverse the doubly linked list in forward direction so let's see demo of its working so first we'll create a list node by name temp and we'll assign the value of head to it so as head points to first node now temp will point to the first node moving ahead so friends the basic idea behind this algorithm is we have this temporary node so using this temporary node we'll visit each and every element of doubly linked list and we'll print the data on the console so this while loop helps us in traversing the doubly linked list and also printing the data so we'll traverse this temporary list node till it becomes null so currently as temp points to the first node and it's not null therefore the condition in while loop comes out to be true we'll print the data associated with this temporary node and then simply we'll move temporary node to its next node by assigning the temp.next value to temp so currently you see temp points to first node and its next point to the second node 
therefore we will assign the temp dot next value to temp so it will look something like this moving ahead now as temp points to second node and it's not null therefore condition in while loop comes out to be true so we'll print the data associated with it and then we simply move temp to its next node by assigning temp dot next value to temp moving ahead now as the temp is pointing to third node and it's not null therefore condition in while loop comes out to be true so we'll simply print the data associated with this list node which is 15 and we'll simply traverse the temp to its next node by assigning temp dot next value to temp now your temp points to the fourth node and it's not null therefore condition in while loop comes out to be true we'll print the data associated with the fourth node which is 25 and we'll simply assign the value of temp.next to temp so temp.next points to null so we'll assign null value to temp so it will look something like this now if you see temp points to null therefore the condition in while loop comes out to be false and therefore the while loop breaks out now as we have reached the end of the list therefore we are simply printing the null so friend this was the algorithm to traverse the doubly linked list in forward direction now let's see how we will traverse this doubly linked list in backward direction so below is the algorithm to traverse the doubly linked list in backward direction now we will create a temporary node but this time it will point to the tail because we need to print the elements in backward direction so now temp points to the last node which is tail we will traverse this temporary node till it becomes null now here we will print the data associated with this temporary node which is 25 so in order to traverse the doubly linked list backward we will assign the value of temp previous nodes to temp so it would look something like this moving ahead now as temp points to third node therefore it's not null so the condition in while loop comes out to be true we'll simply print the data associated with this temporary node and then we'll assign temp dot previous value to temp so we'll move one node backwards now as temp points to the second node therefore it's not null so the condition in while loop comes out to be true we'll print the data associated with this temporary node which is 10 and we'll assign temp dot previous value to temp so we are traversing temp one step backwards so here temp points to first node which is not null therefore condition in while loop comes out to be true we'll print the data associated with this temporary node which is 1 and then we'll simply assign temp previous value to temp so it will look something like this so currently temp points to null therefore this condition in while loop comes out to be false and while loop breaks out 
so in the last step we'll print null because temp is currently pointing to null so friends this was the algorithm to traverse the w linked list backwards so let's move to eclipse and see the working code so friends in my previous tutorial i had created one class by name w linked list and in this w linked list i had created few instance variable one was pointing to the head of the linked list and another was pointing to the tail of the w linked list I also created an integer variable which stored the length of the w linked list and I also created one inner class which was actually list node class which had data a pointer to next node and a pointer to previous node so friends let's write a method which could print the w linked list in forward direction so public public void display forward so here i have created method name is display forward so it will display the w linked list in forward direction so first we'll say if head is null then return so here if suppose the head is null so, so w linked list is empty therefore we'll simply return moving ahead first we'll create a temporary node by name temp and we'll assign the value of head to it then we'll create a while loop and we'll traverse the temporary node in a loop till it becomes null so inside this while loop we'll will print tem dot data and we'll simply traverse temp to its next node by assigning tem dot next value to temp and at last we'll simply print null so friend this is the algorithm to traverse the w linked list in forward direction so now we'll write a method to traverse the w linked list in backward direction so let's create a method public so we'll give a condition as if tail is null then simply return so here if tail is null then we will simply return from this method moving ahead we will create a list node temp which will point to tail then we will create a while loop and we will traverse this temp node till it becomes null So I'll just copy this complete part. And here instead of traversing to the next node, we'll just traverse to previous node. So friend, this is the code to display the W linked list in backward direction. So now let's see it's working. So here in the main method I have created one method which inserts the node into w linked list so this is the method which insert the node into w linked list so this algorithm i will be covering in my next tutorial so for now just think that this method insert the node into w linked list so currently i have inserted four nodes 1 10 15 25 so let's first print this w linked list in forward direction so I'll do dll dot display forward and if I run the code so you can see it prints 1 10 15 25 and null so this is what it displays in forward direction now let's display 
the doubly linked list in backward direction. So we will call display backward and we'll run the code. So here you see it simply prints the doubly linked list in backward direction as 25, 15, 10, 1, and then null. So friends, in this tutorial, we simply discussed how to traverse the doubly linked list in forward and backward direction and print the data in the nodes on the console. So friends, I hope you like this video. Please like, comment, share and subscribe my YouTube channel. Thanks. Have a nice day. Hello friends. Welcome to my new data structures and algorithm in Java tutorial series video. Friends, in this tutorial, we will discuss how to insert node at the beginning of a doubly linked list in Java. So friends, let's suppose we are given a doubly linked list having four nodes, say 1, 10, 15 and 65. So here you see head points to the first node and tail points to the last node. And if we want to insert a node at the beginning of doubly linked list, we usually manipulate the head pointer. And in that case, tail pointer doesn't play any much role. The only case where tail points comes into picture when the list is empty. So when the list is empty, usually head and tail both points to null and when we want to insert a node at the beginning of doubly linked list therefore after its insertion the doubly linked list has only one node so therefore head and tail both points to that node so we need to consider that case so in the algorithm if you see if the list is empty then the tail pointer comes into picture so we'll see the demonstration of this algorithm in next slide so friends, below is the algorithm to insert a node into a doubly linked list at the beginning. So let's see the demo of this algorithm. So currently if you see, then in doubly linked list, we have this head node and tail node. So the head points to the first node and the tail points to the last node. So currently the list is empty, therefore head and tail points to null. And let's say we want to insert a node having a value 1. So first we'll create a new node and we'll assign the value to it. The new node variable will point to a node which has data as 1 and whose next and previous points to null. Moving ahead, we'll check whether doubly linked list is empty or not. So currently as head and tail points to null, so list is empty. Therefore the condition and if statement comes out to be true. And in order to insert this new node at the beginning of a doubly linked list, we'll first assign the value of new node to tail. So currently tail points to null. So after this statement, it will point to the node to which the new node points. So here if you see new node next points to null. Therefore, we'll assign the value of head to new node's next pointer. So here head points to null. Therefore, new node next will also point to null. Moving ahead. And then we'll simply assign new node's value to head. So as head points to null, we'll simply now make it point to the new node. So here as list was empty, so after insertion of this new node, both tail and head will point to it because this is the only node in the doubly linked list. Now let's say we want to insert a node having a value 10 into a doubly linked list having the first node as 1. So here first we'll create a new list node having the value as 10. So this would look something like this that new node points to a list node having the data as 10. Now we'll check whether doubly linked list is empty or not. So currently it's not empty because head and tail is pointing to the list node having data as 1. Therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false and the else part will be executed. So as we want to insert this new node at the beginning of this doubly linked list. So in order to insert this new node into the beginning of doubly linked list, we will assign the value of new node to head's previous. 
so if you see the head points to the node having value as 1 and it previous points to null therefore we'll simply break this pointer and we'll assign this previous pointer to the new node so it would look something like this so in the first step we assigned head previous to the new node and in order to make it a two way linked list or a doubly linked list we need to assign new nodes next to the head so here we assign the value of head to new nodes next because in doubly linked list the nodes refer to each other so the node which comes first refer to other through the next pointer and the node which comes after refer to first one through the previous pointer so here in the else part we saw that head dot previous refer to new node and here we saw that new nodes next refer to now the head so moving ahead so in the last step we'll simply assign the value of new node to head so here currently head points to a list node having data as one but as we have inserted as new node into the beginning therefore now head should point to this new node so friend this was the algorithm to insert a node into the beginning of doubly linked list so friends let's move to eclipse and see the working code so friends in my previous tutorial i created one class by name doubly linked list head of type list node which points to the first node of a doubly linked list and tail which points to the last node of a doubly linked list and a length which which returns back the actual size of the doubly linked list then we also created one inner class by name list node which had the data a pointer to next node and a pointer to the previous node and in my last tutorial i discussed how to print the elements of this doubly linked list in forward and backward direction so in this tutorial we will write the code to insert a node at the beginning of a doubly linked list so public void insert first so this method takes in a integer value so this integer value will be a part of the new node which we want to insert into doubly linked list so first we'll create a list node by name new node and we'll simply assign the value to it moving ahead we'll create a if block and here we'll provide a condition as is empty so here we are checking whether the doubly linked list is empty or not so currently when we initialize the doubly linked list head and tail points to null and the length is zero so is empty method returns us a boolean value and checks whether the doubly linked list is empty or not so if the doubly linked list is empty then first step we'll do is we assign new node value to tail and in the else part and if suppose the list is not empty then we'll assign the new node's value to head's previous so head previous and then we'll simply point the new node's next pointer to head and as the node is inserted now head will point to the new node so we'll simply assign the value of new node to head after we insert the node into the beginning of this doubly linked list we'll simply increment the length by 1 now in main method let's run this code so first i have created an instance of doubly linked list so initially head and tail points to null and length is 0 so if i call insert first and i pass value as 1 and then i simply say display it forward and display it backward and so if i run the code node is inserted with a value of 1 and we have printed it 
both forward and backward so it prints out the same because head and tail points to the first node and if suppose I insert one more node as insert first and provide a value as 10 and now I run the code so you see initially there was one node having data as one so when we inserted the new node at the beginning of a W linked list so now it printed out 10 and 1 in the forward direction so you see the currently head is pointing to 10 and tail is pointing to 1 so friends in this tutorial we saw how to insert a node into a beginning of a W linked list I hope you like this video please like comment share and subscribe my youtube channel thanks have a nice day hello friends welcome to my new data structures and algorithm in java tutorial series video friends in this tutorial we will discuss how to insert node at the end of a w linked list in java so friends suppose we are given a w linked list having four nodes say 1 10 15 and 65 so usually in W linked list head points to the first node and tail points to the last node. So if you want to insert a node at the end of W linked list usually we do the manipulation with the tail pointer and in that case head pointer doesn't play any much role. The only case in which head pointer comes into picture is when the list is empty. So if the list is empty then head and tail both points to null and after we insert a node at the end of W linked list so the list contains only one node therefore the head and tail both needs to point to that particular node so here in this algorithm we need to cover that case when the list is empty so when the list is empty then head pointer comes into picture so we'll see the demonstration of this algorithm in next slide so friends below is the algorithm to insert a node at the end of a W linked list so let's see a demo of this algorithm step by step. So let's say currently the W linked list is empty. Therefore head and tail both will be pointing to null. And let's say we want to insert a list node into this W linked list having a value of 1. So in step 1 we'll first create a list node and we'll provide value to it. So here if you see the new node will point to this list node having data as 1 and the pointers to next and previous node will point to null moving ahead then we'll provide a if statement and in, and in this if we'll check whether the list is empty or not so currently the list is empty because head and tail both are pointing to null therefore the condition in if block comes out to be true and this if statement will be executed So as we want to insert this new node at the end of a W linked list and currently this W linked list is empty therefore when we will insert this new node so this would be the only node in the W linked list and we know that head points to the first node so therefore we will assign new nodes value to head so you will see that now head points to new node moving ahead So as this W linked list currently has one node and we also know that head points to the first node and tail points to the last node but this W linked list has only one node therefore head and tail will point to this node so the last statement would be we need to assign new nodes value to tail so currently tail is pointing to null and after this statement tail will point to this new node so friends after the insert of this list node at the end of the W linked list we see head and tail both point to this node because this is the only node in the W linked list. Now let's say we want to insert one more node having the value as 10. So this algorithm will be executed again. So in order to do that we need to first create a list node having the value as 10. So it would look something like this that new node points to a list node having the data as 10 and the next and previous pointers pointing to null moving ahead and in this if block we will check whether this w linked list is empty or not so if you see head and tail points to this 
not having the data as one so list is not empty therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false and the else part will be executed so in order to insert this new node at the end of the doubly linked list we know that doubly linked list has currently one node and if we want to insert this new node it would come just after this first node therefore in order to insert this new node into doubly linked list first we need to point tell next pointer to this new node and then we need to point new nodes previous to tell node because the adjacent nodes in doubly linked list refer each other so therefore in the first step what we do we assign new nodes value to tell next so currently new node points to the node which we want to insert and tell dot next points to null therefore when we assign new node value to tell next it would look something like this so now tell dot next will point to this new node moving ahead and after this step we need to point new nodes previous to the tell node so in this step we'll assign the value of tail to new nodes previous so it would look something like this so currently the adjacent nodes in doubly linked list are referring to each other such that the first node is pointing to the node which we wanted to insert and the node which we wanted to insert is referring it back so moving ahead so the final step is we need to assign new nodes value to tail so if you see in a doubly linked list the head points to the first node and the tail points to the last node so initially there was only one node therefore head and tail pointed to the same node but after the insertion of this new node tail should point to this new node so in order to do that we need to assign new nodes value to tail and it would look something like this so friends this was the demonstration of inserting a list node at the end of doubly linked list now let's go to eclipse and see the working code so friends in my previous tutorial i had created this doubly linked list class and in the last tutorial we saw how to insert the node at the beginning of a doubly linked list so in this tutorial we will code how to insert a node at the end of a doubly linked list so for this first i will create a method public void insert last and this method will take an integer value now in the first step we'll create this new node based on the value we are passing to the method and the first step will be will provide a if check that whether the list is empty or not and if the list is empty we need to assign new node value to the head so friends if the list is not empty then we need to insert this new node at the end of doubly linked list so we know that the tail points to the last node in the doubly linked list so in order to insert this node we need to use tell dot next pointer and to tell dot next will assign value of new node therefore a tell node next will point to now new node and similarly to new node previous we will assign the value of tail so in the else part we are doing this because this new node and the tail will refer each other and once they refer each other the new node is a part of doubly linked list and finally in the last step we'll reassign tail to point this new node so it would be tail will now point to new node and at the last we'll increment the length of doubly linked list by 1 so friend this is the code for inserting a list node at the end of doubly linked list so let's test this method in the main method so here i have created one instance of doubly linked list class now let's say i insert say one and then i print the doubly linked list say in the forward direction and if i run the program so you will see as the initially the doubly linked list was empty 
therefore when we inserted a new node it by default became the first node and got inserted at, at the very beginning of w linked list now let's say if i insert value 10 now when i run this program so when we'll print this w linked list so this 10 should insert after the node having data is 1 so you see the 10 got inserted at the last position so, so initially there was node having data as 1 but when we inserted 10 it got inserted at the end of w linked list so friends if suppose i insert one more node say having value as 15 and if i now run the program so you see the 15 got inserted at the end of w linked list so initially there was node having data as 1 then we inserted 10 and then we inserted 15 so friends this was a tutorial to demonstrate how to insert a list node at the end of w linked list i hope you like this video please like comment share and subscribe my youtube channel thanks have a nice day hello friends Welcome to my new data structures and algorithm in Java tutorial series video. Friends, in this tutorial we will discuss how to delete first node in a doubly linked list in Java. So friends, let's suppose we are given a doubly linked list having three nodes say 1, 10, 15. And if you see below is the algorithm to delete the first node in a doubly linked list. So friends, as you know that in doubly linked list, head points to the first node and tail points to the last node. So in order to delete the first node in a doubly linked list, we usually manipulate the head pointer. And if you see as tail points to the last node in a doubly linked list, therefore tail node doesn't play any much role in deletion of the first node. But there is a case where tail nodes comes into picture when there is only a single node. So if a doubly linked list contains only one node, then head and tail node both point to that particular node. Therefore the tail node comes into picture because we need to delete that particular single node. So the only place where tail node comes into picture when head is equal to tail. That is the doubly linked list has only one node and both head and tail points to it. So we'll see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step. So suppose we need to delete the first node. So in the algorithm first step would be we need to check whether the list is empty or not. So if the list is empty it means there is no node to delete therefore we may throw an no such element exception. So if we take above example then this w linked list has three nodes. Therefore the w linked list is not empty. So the condition in if statement comes out to be false. So the first step would be we need to create a temporary node which will point to head. As we want to delete the first node, then we will create a temporary node which will point to the head. Moving ahead. Now we'll check whether head is equal to tail or not. So currently head points to the first node and the tail points to the third node. Therefore they are not equal. So the condition comes out to be false. And the if part will be executed. So friends, we need to remove this first node now. So in order to delete this first node from the w linked list, we need to do two things. First, first we need to break this next pointer which, which is pointed by the temporary node. So if you see temp next points to the second node. So we need to remove this and if you see second node points back to temporary node and we need to break this link. So these two links we need to break. So in the else part, we will first break the link which is pointed by the second node to the temporary node. So in order to break this link, we know that head points to this first node which we want to remove and its next points to the second node. So here what we'll do, we'll say head dot next. So when we do head dot next, we reach to the second node and if we do dot previous, then this is the link. So currently this previous points to the first node and when we assign null, so this link breaks up. So, so it would be something like this. So what we are doing in this line is we are traversing from head to its next and then to its previous. So from head we traverse to its next node and then we traverse back to previous. 
so we broke this link here and we assigned a null value to it so we removed one link moving ahead so friends now we know the temporary node points to the head which is the first node which we want to delete therefore when the first node is removed head will be pointing to the second node because after its removal second node will become our new head therefore we need to traverse this head to its next node so to head will assign the value of head dot next so currently head points to the node which we want to delete and head next point to the second node and once this node is removed we know that now head will point to the second node because second node becomes the head of the doubly linked list so in order to do that we need to traverse head to its next position by assigning head dot next value to head so it would look something like this moving ahead and we know that temporary node refers to second node so we need to break this link as well so to break this link we'll simply do temp dot next equals null so temp dot next point to second node and we'll assign a null value to it so it would look something like this so now as you see temporary node is an individual node where previous points to null and next points to null so, so in the last step we'll simply return the temp because this is the first node which we deleted so friends now w link list contains two nodes where head points to the first node and tail points to the second node now suppose if we again call this algorithm to delete the first node then it would be something like first we will check whether list is empty so list is not empty so friends will create one temporary variable which will point to head and as we know that head points to the first node of a doubly linked list therefore in order to delete this first node we'll point the temporary node to the head moving ahead we'll check whether head is equal to tail or not so head is not equal to tail because head points to first node tail points to the second node so the else part will be executed now here we'll do the same thing we'll first break this previous link which is pointed by the second node to the first node so in order to reach this node we'll use head dot next and to assign null value to previous we'll use head dot next dot previous so when we'll do head dot next we reach here and we'll we'll do dot previous this is the link and we'll assign a null value to it so it would look something like this now we have removed one link moving ahead and now we'll simply traverse head to its next node now once this node is removed we know that head should point to the next node in the doubly linked list because because now that node will become our new head so we'll simply traverse head to its next position by assigning head dot next value to head moving ahead and we'll simply assign a null value to temp dot next because we need to remove this link as well so so now temp dot next points to null and in the last step we'll simply return the deleted node so friends now you see w linked list has only one node where head and tail both points to that particular node so when we will call this below algorithm again to delete the first node then first it will be checked that whether the list is empty or not so currently list has one node therefore it's not empty then we'll create a temporary node which will be pointing to head because head points to the first node in the w linked list moving ahead we will check whether head is equal to tail or not so currently if you see head and tail both points to that particular node therefore they are equal so the condition in if statement comes out to be true therefore if block will be executed so friend this is the only node left in the w linked list and we want to remove that therefore we need to remove this both pointers head and tail because they are referring to this node so in the first step we'll assign a null value to tail so it would look something like this so now tail would be pointing to null and then we'll simply assign head dot next value to head so it, it simply means we are assigning null value to head 
सो नो हेड विल बी पॉइंटिंग टू नल एंड विल सिंपली असाइन नल वैल्यू टू टेम डॉट नेक्स्ट बट इफ यू सी टेम डॉट नेक्स्ट इज पॉइंटिंग टू नल वैल्यू ओनली देर फॉर वी जस्ट सिंपली रिटर्न द टेम्परी नॉट इन द लास्ट स्टेप सो फ्रेंड्स यू सॉ देर वॉज ओनली वन नोट रिमेनिंग एंड वी रिमूव डेट नोट एज वेल नाउ इफ यू सी टेल एंड हेड बोट पॉइंट टू नल सो इफ यू कॉल दिस अलगोरिथम अगेन so it will be checked whether list is empty or not so if you see head and tail both points to null therefore the doubly linked list is empty therefore if you call this algorithm then an exception will be thrown so we can throw an exception saying that there is no such element left so friends this was the demonstration of the algorithm now let's go to eclipse and see the working code so friends in my previous tutorial i created one class by name doubly linked list and we implemented the doubly linked list into that class so this class has basically an head node and a tail node and an integer variable by name length which stores the size of the doubly linked list you can watch my previous tutorials to understand those concepts so in this tutorial we'll just code a method which will delete the first node in a doubly linked list so i'll create a method as public list node delete first now this method will return us back the deleted node so the return type is list node so first we'll provide a if check and in if block we'll provide a condition as whether doubly linked list is empty or not so if doubly linked list is empty will throw an exception moving ahead then we'll create a list node by name temp and we'll assign a value of head to it as head points to the first node of a doubly linked list therefore we'll assign value of head to this temporary node and then we'll check if head is equal to tail or not so when head is equal to tail it means doubly linked list has only one node so in that case we'll assign null to tail because we need to break the reference of tail pointing to that particular node which we want to delete and if head is not equal to tail then in else block we'll write head dot next dot previous and we'll assign a null value to it we are assigning a null value to head dot next dot previous because we need to break the previous link which is coming from the second node and then we'll simply assign head dot next value to head now we also need to break the next link which temporary node is pointing to the second node therefore we'll do tem dot next and assign a null value to it and finally this temporary node is removed therefore therefore we know that size of length is reduced by 1 therefore we'll do length so here we are decrementing the length by 1 because we have removed one node and in the last step we'll simply return the temporary node because this temporary node is pointing to the first node of doubly linked list so friend this is the algorithm to remove the first node in a doubly linked list now let's test its working so friend in my previous tutorial we saw how to insert the nodes in doubly linked list so here i have added three nodes by data as 1 10 and 15 and if i print the doubly linked list in the forward direction so you can see 1 points to 10 10 points to 15 and 15 points to null so totally there are three nodes now let's delete the first node in the doubly linked list so we'll call delete first and let's display the doubly linked list again so i'll call display forward and if i run the code 
so you see initially doubly linked list had nodes as 1 10 and 15 and the node having data as 1 was the first node so when we call delete first the node at first base got removed and the doubly linked list became 10 15 now let's say I again call delete first and if I run the program so you see when delete first was called first time one was removed and when we call delete first again so 10 was removed because 10 became our new head and finally if I call delete first again and I run the program so you see all the nodes are removed and nothing got printed because because in display forward we have kept a condition if head is null then simply return so when all the three nodes got removed head pointed to null and nothing was printed but if I call delete first again as head and tail both are pointing to null and if I call delete first again So you can see we are getting an exception as no such element exception because list is empty and there is no element left to be removed. So friends this was the tutorial to remove the first node in a doubly linked list. I hope you like this video. Please like, comment, share and subscribe my youtube channel. Thanks have a nice day. Hello friends. Welcome to my new data structures and algorithm in java tutorial series video. Friends, in this tutorial we will discuss how to delete last node in a doubly linked list in Java. So friends, let's suppose we are given a doubly linked list having three nodes with data as 1, 10 and 15. So here you see below is the algorithm to delete the last node in a doubly linked list. So friends, the basic idea behind this algorithm is as we want to delete the last node in a doubly linked list. We will use basically this tail pointer to remove the last node in a doubly linked list because in a doubly linked list head points to the first node and the tail points to the last node and we want to remove the last node in a doubly linked list therefore we will manipulate and play with this tail pointer to remove the last node from the doubly linked list. So head pointer doesn't play much role in deleting the last node from a doubly linked list. The only case where head pointer comes into picture is when there is only one node in a doubly linked list because if there is only one node in a doubly linked list then head and tail both will point to that particular node and if you want to remove that single node from a doubly linked list we need to manipulate head pointer as well. So friends let's see the demonstration of this algorithm. So in the first step we will check whether the list doubly linked list is empty or not. So if doubly linked list is empty, we will throw an exception saying that there are no more elements left to be removed. So currently doubly linked list has 3 nodes, therefore the list is not empty. So the condition in if block comes out to be false. Now as you want to remove the last node from a doubly linked list, we will create one temporary node which will be pointing to the tail. So now temp points to a tail because when we remove the last node from a doubly linked list, it will be removed using this temporary node moving ahead so here in the vlog we will check whether head is equal to tail or not so currently head points to the first node and tail points to the third node therefore they are not equal so the condition comes out to be false and the else part will be executed now friends in order to remove this last node from a doubly linked list we need to remove these two pointers because once we remove these two pointers this, this node will be freed and it will be removed from the doubly linked list. So first we will remove this next pointer because this last node is being referred by the second last node. So we need to remove this link. So in order to remove this link we need to traverse to the second last node and then assign a null value to its next node. So in order to traverse to the second last node we will use this tail pointer we will first go to its previous by calling tail dot previous and then to its next we will assign a value of null so in this line what we are doing we are assigning a null value to tail dot previous dot next 
so it simply means we are first traversing to the previous and to the next we are assigning the value as null so it would look something like this so this link will be removed and then it will point to the null value moving ahead so friends once we remove the last node of a doubly linked list we see tail points to that node so after its removal tail should point to the second last node because that second last node upon removal becomes the last node of the doubly linked list therefore we need to traverse tail to its second last node so we'll simply assign tail dot previous value to tail so it would look something like this moving ahead and then we'll simply break this link and we'll assign a null value to it so we know that temporary node is pointing to this last node and we need to assign a null to its previous therefore we'll simply assign a null value to temp previous so it would look something like this so in the final step we know that the last node which is pointed by temporary node has been removed from doubly linked list we'll simply return this temporary node so friends after removal of this last node only two nodes are left so head is pointing to the first node and tail is pointing to the last node now if you want to again remove the last node from this doubly linked list we call this algorithm again we check whether list is empty or not so list is not empty and as we want to remove this last node we'll create one temporary node and we'll assign the value of tail to it moving ahead we will check whether head is equal to tail or not so head is not equal to tail because head points to first node and tail is pointing to the second node therefore the else part will be executed and in the else part we'll do the same as we need to remove this link so we will traverse a node back and we'll assign a null value to its next so we'll simply do tail dot previous dot next and assign a null value to it so tail points to the second node and when we do tail dot previous we are reaching to the first node and then to its next we are assigning the null value so it would look something like this so the link which was referring to this node we have removed it moving ahead and as as we know that this is the last node of the doubly linked list because once the last node is removed the tail should point to its previous node because that becomes the last node in a doubly linked list therefore we'll simply assign tail dot previous to tail so it would look something like this so now head and tail both are pointing to the first node moving ahead and we need to break this link and that link is referred by temps previous so we'll simply assign null value to temps previous so it would look something like this so as we know that this node is freed therefore we'll simply return this temporary node so friends now in doubly linked list only one node is left where head and tail both are pointing to that particular node so let's call this algorithm again so first we will check whether list is empty or not so list has one node therefore it's not empty then as we know that there is only one node left and we want to delete the last node therefore this is the only node that needs to be removed so we'll simply create one temporary node and we'll assign the value of tail to it moving ahead now here is the case where head is equal to tail because both are pointing to this first node therefore in order to remove this node we need to break this both links because head is pointing to this node and tail is also pointing to this node and we need to break this both link so that this node can become free to be removed so in the if part we'll simply assign a null value to head so we have removed one link moving ahead and then we'll simply traverse tail to its previous node 
by assigning tail dot previous to tail. So you see tail previous is pointing to null. Therefore, we are simply assigning a null value to tail. So it would look something like this. So now tail will point to null. And now we'll simply assign a null value to temp previous. So you see temp previous is already pointing to null. Therefore, we do nothing. And simply in the last step, we'll return this temporary node. So you see now head and tail both are pointing to null and there are no nodes left in the list. Therefore, the list is empty. So if you call this algorithm again, then first I will check whether list is empty or not. So we know that list is empty and there are no nodes left to be removed. Therefore, we can therefore we can throw a no such element exception because there are no nodes left to be removed. So friends, this was the demonstration of the algorithm. Now let's go to Eclipse and see the working code. So friends, in my previous tutorial, I had created one class by name W linked list and we implemented a W linked list into that class. So this class has head and a tail node and it also has a integer variable by name length, which stores the size of the W linked list. So if you want to understand the working of W linked list, you can watch my previous tutorials. So in this tutorial, we will discuss how to delete the last node of a W linked list. So first I will create the method as public list node delete last. So this method will remove the last element and will simply return it back. Therefore the return type is of list node. So first we'll provide a if check as if the w linked list is empty or not. So if it is empty, then we'll simply throw a exception, say no such element, no such element exception. Moving ahead, we'll create a list node by name temp and we'll assign a value of tail to it because we need to remove the last node from the W linked list. Therefore, we are using this tail pointer to remove that last node. Then we'll provide an if check. If head is equals tail, then we'll simply assign null value to head. Because when head is equal to tail, there is only one node left in the W linked list. So we need to break both the reference head and tail in order to free that node. So we'll simply assign a null value to head and in the else part we'll do tail dot previous dot next and assign null value to it. Moving ahead then we'll simply traverse tail to its previous node because once the last node is removed now tail will point to the node just before it. and we'll assign null to temp.previous because we need to break that link as well and finally as we delete this node we need to reduce the length of w linked list by 1 therefore we decrement the length by 1 and last we'll simply return the temp so friends we saw the algorithm to remove the last node of a w linked list now let's test it working in main method. So in my previous tutorial we just discussed how to remove the first node of a W linked list. So here I will just call delete last. So here if you see we have inserted three nodes by data as 1, 10 and 15. And first we are removing the last node. So if I run the code. You see first it printed 1, 10, 15 and null. So when we call delete last, so it printed 1, 10 15, and 15 got removed. And if I call this method again 
and then I run the program. So you see we called delete last two times. So in the first time 15 got removed and the second time 10 got removed. And if I call it again. So if I called it again, so one was also removed and nothing got printed because in display forward. We have kept in condition that if head is null then simply return and we know that we inserted three nodes and we removed three nodes so list got empty and head pointed to null therefore display forward printed nothing and if I call delete last one more time then as we know that list is empty and there are no nodes left to be removed therefore you see an exception was thrown because because there was no node left to be removed so friends in this tutorial we discussed how to remove the last node of a doubly linked list i hope you like this video please like comment share and subscribe my youtube channel thanks have a nice day hello friends welcome to my new data structures and algorithm in java tutorial series video friends in this tutorial we will discuss how to represent a circular singly linked list in java so friends what is a circular singly linked list so if you see this is how we represent singly linked list and this is how we represent a circular singly linked list so the structure wise circular singly linked list is very much similar to singly linked list and here you can see in singly linked list we have these nodes which form a chain and we keep a head node which points to the first node and the last node next point to the null. So the only difference between singly linked list and circular singly linked list is that in circular singly linked list the last node points to the first node and not null. So here if you see in singly linked list the last node next is pointing to null but in circular singly linked list the last node next is pointing to the first node again and not null so therefore this property makes circular singly linked list circular in nature where if you see 1 points to 8 8 points to 10 10 points to 16 and 16 again points to 1 so therefore it's a circular in nature and one more difference is like in singly linked list we keep the track of the head node which is pointing to the first node but in circular singly linked list we keep the track of the last node so in circular singly linked list we keep the track of the last node because it helps us in insertion and deletion of the nodes in constant time. So here if you see as head points to the first node and suppose if we want to insert a node in the singly linked list at the end. So we need to traverse each and every node in the singly linked list to reach the last node and then add the particular node. But here in circular singly linked list we are keeping the track of the last node and if suppose we want to insert a node at the end so we can directly use this last pointer and add the node at the end and suppose if we want to insert a node at the beginning then we know that a circular singly linked list is circular in nature therefore when we do last dot next we reach to the first node so we can directly add node at the beginning in constant time so friend this is how we represent a circular singly linked list where we keep the track of the last node and last node next points to the first node. So friends, let's see a demonstration of circular singly linked list. Below you can see that circular singly linked list has three nodes having data as 1, 8 and 10 and the node having data as 10 has been referred by the last node and you can see it's a last node in a circular singly linked list where its next is pointing to the first node. So let's see a small demo how we can create this circular singly linked list. So suppose we initialize a circular singly linked list. So we know that the list is empty. So therefore the last will point to null. So when the list is empty, the last node is pointing to null. Now let's suppose we are inserting this node having the data as 1. So it's a simple node having data as 1 and next is pointing to null so if you want to insert this node into the circular singly linked list 
and as the list is empty we'll simply assign the value of temp into last so that last points to this node so it would look something like this so now the last node is pointing to the node having data as one and we also know that circular singly linked list has property that last next points to the first node of a circular singly linked list but here if you see there is only one node so basically this node is the last node of a circular singly linked list and also the first node so last next should point to this node only so it would look something like this so when we insert a node into a empty circular singly linked list last points to that particular node and, and its next points to the node itself now let's suppose you want to add one more node having data as 8 so here you can see the temp is pointing to this node having data as 8 and its next is pointing to null so in order to insert this node into the circular singly linked list having data as 1 and last is pointing to 1 so what we do is when we insert this node with a value 8 we know that its next should point to the first node so therefore what we do is we simply break this link and we point it to the first node so it would look something like this as time next is pointing to the first node and here if you see the first node is pointing to the second node therefore we need to break this link and we need to point it to the second node so it would look something like this so now you can see that node 1 is pointing to node 8 and node 8 is again pointing to node 1 so they are circular in nature and one last step we need to do is as we have inserted is node 8 and we know that this is the last node therefore we'll simply assign the value of temp to last so it would look something like this so after the insertion of node having data as 8 the circular singly linked list looks like this where node having data as 8 is pointed by the last node and its next points to the first node therefore it maintain a circular property and let's suppose we want to add one more node having data as 10 so here if you see the node next is pointing to this first node so in the first step what we'll do we'll simply remove this link and we'll point it to the first node so it would look something like this so now temp next is pointing to the first node and here you can see that second node is pointing to the third node so but here second node is pointing to the first node so we need to simply break this link and we need to point it to the third node so it would look something like this and one last step we need to do is when we have inserted this node having data as 10 we know this is the last node therefore we simply need to refer the value of temp to the last so it would look something like this so friends here if you see we inserted three nodes and we knew that node 1 is the first node and node having data as 10 is the last node and here the last node is pointing back to this first node so therefore we saw how circular singly linked list is created and and how they maintain a circular property so friends in this tutorial we discuss how we can represent a circular singly linked list in java in my next tutorial we will see how we can implement circular singly linked list in java i hope you like this video please like comment share and subscribe my youtube channel thanks have a nice day hello friends welcome to my new data structures and algorithm in java tutorial series video friends in this tutorial we will discuss how to implement a circular singly linked list in java so friends in my previous tutorial we discussed how we can represent a circular singly linked list we discussed that it's very similar to singly linked list with a slight difference that in singly linked list the last node points to null but in circular singly linked list the last node points to the first node which makes this data structure circular in nature we also discussed that we use head node to keep the track of singly linked list but in circular singly linked list 
we usually keep the track of the last node so friends in my previous tutorial we discussed about the circular singly linked list representation so in this tutorial we will discuss how we can implement a circular singly linked list in java so let's go to eclipse and see the working code so friends in order to implement a circular singly linked list i have created one class by name circular singly linked list so in this class we will write the code for circular singly linked list implementation now here we will first create few instance variable so private so here we have created an instance variable of type list node by name last so this list node will help us in keeping the track of the last node of a circular singly linked list we will also create one more instance variable so here we have created an integer variable by name length so this length variable will hold the size of this circular singly linked list and inside this circular singly linked list will create a private class of list node so as this is very similar to singly linked list which we saw in our previous slide so i will just code what's required in list node so private list node next so here list node contains the data part and a reference to the next list node we'll create one constructor now this constructor will take the data part moving ahead we'll create a constructor for this circular singly linked list class so friends when we initialize circular singly linked list we know that last points to null and as the list is empty therefore length would be zero so here we also create one more method public int length so when we call this method it should return us back the size of circular singly linked list so we simply return length we'll also create one boolean method by name is empty now this method will return us back whether the circular singly linked list is empty or not so we'll simply return that when length is 0 then return true and when length is not 0 then simply return false so let's say in our main method i create the instance of circular singly linked list so friends here we will write one more method which can create the circular singly linked list so we'll simply create one method as public void create circular linked list so here we'll first create few nodes say first let's say i give data as 1 i'll copy this let's say i give data as 5 10 15 and i will change the name as second third so friends we have created this four nodes 
now we'll interconnect them so first should point to second so we'll do first dot next and assign a value of second to it and similarly second dot next and assign a value of third to it and similarly third dot next and assign a value of fourth to it now friends here you see first points to second second points to third and third points to fourth but fourth is pointing to null therefore in order to make this linked list circular we'll simply do fourth dot next and assign first to it so therefore now fourth node will point to first node again so it will make it in circular in nature and in last what we'll do the instance variable which we created last it should point to the last node therefore we'll assign the value of fourth to last so friend this is how we represent a circular singly linked list in java and if you if you want to call this method we can simply do csll dot create so this will create a circular singly linked list of four nodes where first will point to second second will point to third third will point to fourth and fourth will again point to first and we can track those changes using the last list node so friend this is how we implement a circular singly linked list in java i hope you like this video Please like, comment, share and subscribe my YouTube channel. Thanks, have a nice day. Hello friends. Welcome to my new data structures and algorithm in Java tutorial series video. Friends, in this tutorial we will discuss how to traverse and print a circular singly linked list in Java. So friends, in my previous tutorial we discussed how we can represent a circular singly linked list and we also saw how we can implement the circular singly linked list in java so in this tutorial we will discuss how we can traverse and print the elements of a circular singly linked list in java so here you see below is the algorithm to traverse the circular singly linked list and print the elements data so here let's see an example when the circular singly linked list is completely empty and last is pointing to null so friends we know that when the circular singly linked list is empty therefore there are no elements and last will point to null so here when the last points to null we know that there are no nodes inside the circular singly linked list to traverse therefore we are keeping one condition as when the last points to null then simply return so here we know that last is pointing to null so we will simply return from it so friends let's see the demonstration of the algorithm with the circular singly linked list having four nodes say 1 8 10 and 16 where 16 is the last node and its next is pointing to this first node now let's see how we can traverse each element inside this circular singly linked list and print the data with the respective node so here first we'll check whether last is null or not so as last is pointing to this fourth node therefore it's not null so the condition in if block comes out to be false so we move ahead now friends as we know that we are keeping the track of this last node which is the fourth node and suppose if we want to traverse each and every node and, and print the data so we need to start with the first node and then we can print the data accordingly but as here we are only keeping the track of the last node so therefore in order to reach this first node we know that the last node next points to the first node and we need to travel circular singly linked list from the first to the last node so therefore we'll create this first node and we'll assign the value of last dot next to it so it would look something like this moving ahead so friends we know that circular singly linked list is basically circular in nature where first node points to second, second points to third, third points to fourth and fourth points to the first again. So we need to provide a while loop to traverse each and every node and we need to take a special care while placing the condition in while loop because if we 
place some wrong condition then we know that as it is circular in nature therefore this while loop may enter into an infinite loop so here as we want to traverse each and every node and, and print the data into the respective node so we'll traverse till we have reached the last node so the condition in while loop will put as will iterate till first is not equal to last because when first is equal to last we know that we have traversed each and every node so currently first is pointing to this first node and last is pointing to this fourth node therefore first is not equal to last so the condition in while loop comes out to be true so in the first step we'll simply print the data associated with this first node moving ahead so friends as we have traversed this node now we need to just move to its next node so in order to move this first node to its next we'll simply assign the value of first dot next to first so here if you see first is pointing to this first node and its next is pointing to the second node therefore we are simply assigning the value of first dot next to first so it would look something like this so it simply traverses first to its next position by this statement moving ahead now again first is not equal to last therefore condition in while loop comes out to be true so we'll simply print the data associated with the first node moving ahead now as we have traversed the second node so we'll move to the next node so in order to move this first to its next we'll simply assign first dot next value to first so first dot next points to the third node so after this statement it would look something like this moving ahead now again first is not equal to last therefore the condition in while loop comes out to be true so in first step we'll simply print the data associated with this third node and in the second step we'll simply traverse first to its next by assigning first dot next value to first so it would look something like this moving ahead so friends now here you see first and last both are pointing to this fourth node therefore first is equal to last so the condition in while loop comes out to be false so therefore the while loop breaks out so friends here you can see that we had this pointer to this last node and we started traversing and printing of the elements from the first node so here if you see the circular singly linked list has four nodes and we have traversed three nodes by printing 1 8 and 10 and then in the while loop when we traverse to the last node we know that condition in while loop came out to be false as first is equal to last therefore we have reached to this node but we haven't printed the data for this last element so therefore in the last i will simply print the data associated with this fourth node so when we print the data associated with fourth node we are sure that we have traversed all the nodes and we have print the data associated with the respective nodes so friends we saw the demonstration of the algorithm now let's move to eclipse and see the working of the code so friends in my previous tutorial i created one class by name circular singly linked list and we saw the implementation of circular singly linked list in that tutorial we basically created few instance variable by name length and last so this last node was used to keep the track of the last node in circular singly linked list we also saw how we can create a circular singly linked list and we added this four nodes 1 5 10 and 15 and we made this linked list circular by assigning this fourth node again to the first so friends in this tutorial we will write the code to traverse and print the elements of a circular singly linked list so we'll create a method as public void 
we give the name as display so this method will simply traverse each and every element in a circular singly linked list and print the data with the respective node so here first we'll provide a condition as if last equals null so it means that if circular singly linked list is empty or not so if circular singly linked list is empty then we'll simply return and do nothing moving ahead we'll create a list node by name first and we'll assign the value of last dot next to it so this thing we are doing because we need to traverse the circular singly linked list from first position to the last position and we know that last dot next points to first so we are simply creating a list node by name first and we are assigning the value of last dot next to it and then we'll create a while loop so inside this while loop we will traverse each and every node of circular singly linked list using this first node so the condition we provide in while loop is we will traverse this first till it becomes last and in the while loop we'll simply first print the data associated with the first node and in the next step we'll simply traverse first to its next node by assigning first dot next value to first so here in this while loop what we are doing is we are printing the data associated with the first node and then we are simply traversing first to its next node by assigning first dot next value to first so when we are reaching to the last node we need to print the data associated with the last node as well so we'll simply print first dot data now in main method let's see the demonstration of this display method so here first we'll create the instance of circular singly linked list and then we'll create the circular singly linked list by calling create circular linked list method so in this method we are simply creating four nodes where first is pointing to second second is pointing to third and third is pointing to fourth and as fourth is the last node therefore fourth will point again back to the first node and in the last step we are simply assigning the value of fourth to last because we are holding this circular singly linked list through this last instance variable now let's say we are calling this display method and if i run the code so friends here you see it prints 1 5 10 15 15 which are actually the four nodes in our circular singly linked list so friends in this tutorial we discussed how we can traverse a circular singly linked list and print the data associated with respect to nodes i hope you like this video please like comment share and subscribe my youtube channel thanks have a nice day hello friends welcome to my new data structures and algorithm in java tutorial series video friends in this tutorial we will discuss how to insert node at the beginning of a circular singly linked list in java so friends in my previous tutorial we discussed about circular singly linked list so here if you see below is the algorithm to insert a node at the beginning of a circular singly linked list so here if you see when the circular singly linked list is empty the last node points to null because there are no nodes inside the circular singly linked list and you see the length is zero so friends let's see the demonstration of this algorithm let's suppose we want to insert a node at the beginning of a circular singly linked list so in the first step what we are doing is we are creating a list node by name temp and we are passing in the data which we actually want to insert so it looks something like this so your temp variable is pointing to this list node having data as 1 and whose next is pointing to null moving ahead now in the second statement we usually check whether this circular singly linked list is empty or not so we provide a condition that whether last is equal to null or not so here if you see last is pointing to null therefore the circular singly linked list is empty so the condition comes out to be true
So in order to insert this temporary node into the circular singly linked list at the beginning, the first step we do is we assign the value of temp to last. So it looks something like this. And after this step, temp and last both point to this particular node. As this circular singly linked list is empty and we want to insert this node at the beginning. So when we insert this particular node, we know that the circular singly linked list has only one node. The last node points to that particular node. So therefore, we have assigned the value of temp to last. Moving ahead. Now after the if else block, what we do is we simply assign the value of temp to last.next. Now why we are doing this step is because here we know that we are basically inserting a node at the beginning of a circular singly linked list. And we also know that circular singly linked list has property that the last node usually refers to the first node. And as we are inserting a node at the beginning, we know that the last next should point to this particular node. And here if you see when we are inserting a node into an empty circular singly linked list, we know that after an insertion, there is only one node which is the first and the last node both. And we want to make the last dot next point to first node. So in order to do that, what we are doing is we are assigning last dot next value to the node itself. And here we know that temp is pointing to this particular node. So it looks something like this. So this link is gone and then it will refer to itself because temp is pointing to this node only. So after this step, last next will point to the node itself. And here if you see, it is also fulfilling the property of circular singly linked list as last node is pointing to the first node. And since this is the only node in the circular singly linked list, therefore last node and the first node is the node itself. Therefore here it is referring to itself. Moving ahead. So after we insert the node into circular singly linked list, we usually increment the length by one because we know that now circular singly linked list has size one. So now the value stored in the length will be one. So when the method gets executed, circular singly linked list looks like this. So friends, let's insert one more node into the circular singly linked list having the length as one. So usually in the first step we create this temporary list node having the data which we want to pass. So let's say we are taking a node having data as 8 and the temporary node is pointing to it and its next is pointing to null. So this node we want to insert at the beginning of this circular singly linked list. Therefore we need to insert the node just before the node having the data as 1. So let's see the demonstration step by step. So in the first step, we usually check whether, whether the circular singly linked list is empty or not. So we make an if check that whether last is pointing to null or not. So here last is pointing to this node. Therefore the circular singly linked list is not empty. So the condition comes out to be false. So therefore the else block will be executed. So in the else block, what we do is we assign the value of last dot next to Tem dot next. So here if you see last dot next is pointing to the node itself and tem dot next is pointing to null. So why we are doing this step is because we want to insert the node at the beginning. So therefore this node should come just before this. So when this node will be inserted, this would be the first node and this would be the last node. And as this would be the first node, its next should point to this node. So in order to do that, we need to break this link and we need to assign this link to last.next. So here if you see last.next is pointing to the last node itself. And we want to insert this node just before this. Therefore we need to assign the value of last.next to tem.next. So it looks something like this. So now tem.next is pointing to last.next. Moving ahead. And then what we do is we simply assign the value of temp to last.next. 
so friends in this step what we are doing is once we insert this node this node would be the part of circular singly linked list and this would be the first node and we also know that circular singly linked list has property that last node will always point to the first node therefore last next should point to this node because that is the circular singly linked list property so in order to do that we are simply assigning the value of temp to last dot next so it would look something like this and as we want to insert this node at the beginning of a circular singly linked list we know that last dot next should point to this node because after an insertion this node will become our first node we increment the length by 1 so after the method is executed we know that circular singly linked list has two nodes and length is 2 now friends let's suppose we want to insert one more node so in the first step we will create the list node by name temp so here it would look something like this the temp is pointing to the node having data as 10 and its next is pointing to null now this node we want to insert at the beginning therefore we know that this node should come just before it and once this node is inserted this node will become our first node so let's see the demonstration of algorithm so first we'll check whether list is empty or not so as last is pointing to the node having data as 1 therefore the list is not empty so in the else block we are simply assigning value of last dot next to temp next so friends as we want to insert this temporary node at the beginning of a circular singly linked list and the first node is having the data as 8 therefore when we want to insert this temporary node just before that then we need to make this pointer point to this particular node and in order to reach this particular node we know that we are keeping the track of the last node and when we do last dot next we are reaching to the first node therefore we are simply assigning the value of last dot next to temp next so it would look something like this now here temp dot next is pointing to the first node of a circular singly linked list moving ahead and the last step we do is as we want to insert this temporary node so once this node is inserted we know that this would become our first node and we know that circular singly linked list has property that last node next should point to the first node therefore here we are simply assigning the value of temp to last dot next so it would look something like this and the final step we are incrementing the length by 1 currently the circular singly linked list has 3 nodes where first node has data is 10 second node has data is 8 and the last node has data is 1 and last next is pointing to the first node so after the method gets executed the circular singly linked list looks like this so friends here we inserted three nodes having data as 1 8 and 10 at the beginning of a circular singly linked list now let's go to eclipse and see the working code so friends in my previous tutorial we discussed about circular singly linked list and its implementation we created one class by name circular singly linked list so in this tutorial we will write a method which will insert the node at the beginning of a circular singly linked list so let's say i give the name of method as public void insert first so here i have created one method by name insert first so this method will take the data part which is of integer type so in the first step we'll create a list node by name temp and here we pass the data into the constructor so therefore in this step we are simply creating a list node of the data which we have passed into the method now in the next step we are providing a if check 
that last is equal to null or not so if the circular singly linked list is empty therefore in the if statement we are simply assigning the value of temp to last so last equals temp moving ahead and if the circular singly linked list is not empty then we are simply assigning value of last dot next to temp dot next and after the if else block we are assigning the value of temp to last dot next so last dot next equals temp and then we are simply incrementing the size of circular linked list by one so friend this is the code for insertion of a node into the beginning of a circular singly linked list so here we first create the list node then we check whether the list is empty or not so if the circular singly linked list is empty then we simply assign the value of this temporary node to last and if the circular singly linked list is not empty then we simply assign the value of last dot next to temp dot next which we saw in the slide and the last step we usually assign the value of temp to last dot next and then we increment the length by one now in the main method let's test the working of this insert first method so in my previous tutorial in the main method we created the instance of circular singly linked list and let's say using that instance we call insert first and we provide the data as 10 and finally we call the display method so if I run the code so you see it printed value as 10 now let's say I call this method again and provide data as 15 and if I run the program so you see it printed 15 and then 10 so here when the circular singly linked list was empty we called insert first and passed value as 10 so the node having data as 10 was the only node into the circular singly linked list and when we inserted 15 so here we are inserting 15 at the beginning of a circular singly linked list so this circular singly linked list had only node having data as 10 so when we inserted 15 it got inserted just before the node having data as 10 so if you want to insert one more node say of data 25 so this 25 will be inserted just before the node having data is 15 so if I run the code so you see it printed 25 15 and then 10 so friends in this tutorial we discussed how to insert a node at the beginning of a circular singly linked list in Java I hope you like this video Please like, comment, share and subscribe my YouTube channel. Thanks, have a nice day. Hello friends. Welcome to my new data structures and algorithm in Java tutorial series video. Friends, in this tutorial we will discuss how to insert node at the end of a circular singly linked list in Java. So friends, let's suppose we are given an empty circular singly linked list. So when the circular singly linked list is empty, we know that the last node points to null and in order to understand what this last node is you need to watch my previous tutorials so in this tutorial we will be discussing how to insert a node at the end of a circular singly linked list in java so let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step so we also know that when the circular singly linked is empty length is zero now in order to insert a node in a circular singly linked list at the end the first step we do is we basically create a node and we'll pass the data so here we have created one node having the data as one and which is being referred by this temp node and whose next is pointing to null now we want to insert this node at the end of a circular singly linked list so moving ahead so the first step we check is whether the last is equal to null or not so if the last is equal to null then we know that circular singly linked is empty so therefore the condition in if log comes out to be true so here the first step we do is we simply assign the value of temp to last 
now as the circular singly linked list is empty so therefore there are no nodes and as we want to insert this temporary node at the end of the circular singly linked list so when we insert this temporary node into the empty list we know that after its insertion this would be the only node in the circular singly linked list therefore last should point to this node so in the first step we are simply assigning value of temp to last so it would look something like this moving ahead now in the second step we are assigning value of last to last dot next so why we are doing this step is we need to fulfill circular singly linked list property that last next should point to first node and as we know that this is the only node in the circular singly linked list therefore the last and the first node is the node itself so we are assigning value of last to last dot next so it would look something like this so this link is gone and now this last dot next will refer to the node itself so it would look something like this and in the last step we'll simply increment the length by 1 because we have successfully inserted the node at the end of a circular singly linked list so friends once this algorithm is executed we know that initially circular singly linked list was empty and now it contains only one node so it is referred by last because this is the only node and its next is pointing to the first node which is the node itself so now if we call this algorithm again and we want to insert one more node so let's see the demonstration of the algorithm now in the first step we'll simply create the list node and provide the data which we have passed into the method so it would look something like this the temp is pointing to the node having data as 8 and whose next is pointing to null now let's say we want to insert this node at the end of a circular singly linked list so let's see the demonstration step by step so we check whether last is equal to null or not so now the last is pointing to one node therefore it's not equal to null therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false so the else part will be executed so in the else block the first step we do is we assign the value of last dot next to temp dot next so here why we are doing this step is as we want to insert this temporary node at the end of a circular singly linked list we know that after its insertion that the node which is referred by temp would be the last node so if it is a last node then its next should point to the first node and how to reach the first node we know that currently the node which is referred by last its next is the first node therefore we are simply assigning last dot next value to temp dot next so it would look something like this so this link will be removed and it would refer to the first node and in order to reach the first node we know that last next refers to the first node therefore temp next will now refer to the node having data as 1 so it would look something like this so currently you see we have two nodes where temporary next is pointing to this first node so moving ahead and in the second step we are assigning value of temp to last dot next now here you can see last dot next is referring to itself and we know that when we insert this node last next should refer to this node because then it will form a chain so we are simply assigning value of temp to last dot next so it would look something like this so now this link will be gone and now it should refer to this temp node so moving ahead and in the last step we are simply assigning value of temp to last now we are doing this step is because we have inserted the node at the end of a circular singly linked list and we know that we are keeping track of this last pointer so after this temporary node is inserted into circular singly linked list we know that this becomes the last node therefore we need to assign the value of temp to last so that last refers to the last node of a circular singly linked list so it would look something like this so in the final step we'll simply increment the length by 1 the circular singly linked list has two nodes and we can also see that the last next is 
referring to this first node. Now friends, let's suppose we want to insert one more node into this circular singly linked list. So we'll execute this algorithm again and we'll pass the data into the method. So let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step. So in the first step we'll simply create a list node and we'll refer it to by temporary variable. So here you can see we have simply created a temporary node having data as 10 and whose next is pointing to null. And now we want to insert this node at the end of the circular singly linked list. So let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step. Now the first step will check whether last is equal to null or not. So currently last is pointing to the second node. Therefore it's not null. So the condition in if block comes out to be false. So the else part will be executed. So the first step in else part we do is we simply assign the value of last dot next to temp dot next. So here you can see last dot next is pointing to this first node and temp dot next is pointing to null. And as we want to insert this node at the end of a circular singly linked list, we know that after its insertion, this temporary node becomes the last node. Therefore, its next should point to the first node. And in order to reach this first node, we know that last next is referring to it. Therefore, we'll simply assign value of last dot next to temp dot next. So it would look something like this. So now you can see temp next is pointing to this first node. Moving ahead. In the second step, we simply assign value of temp to last dot next. So here, in order to insert this node at the end of a circular singly linked list, we know that initially this list contains two nodes. And in order to insert this third node, we need to break temp dot next link, which is referring to first node. And we need to assign it to the temp node because then this third node will be a part of a chain. So in this step, we are simply assigning value of temp to last dot next. So it would look something like this. So this link is broken and now it will point to this temporary node. Moving ahead. In the final step, we know that as we have inserted this node, which is at the last position, we'll simply assign value of temp to last. So it would look something like this. And now in the last step, we'll simply increment the length by one. So friends, here you can see the length of the circular singly linked list is of size three. As we have three nodes with data is one, eight and 10. And the last node next is pointing to the first node. So friends, this was the demonstration of the algorithm. Now let's go to Eclipse and see the working code. So friends, in my previous tutorial, I created one class by name circular singly linked list and we implemented circular singly linked list into the class. So in this tutorial, we will simply write a method which would insert a node at the end of a circular singly linked list. So I'll create one method as public void insert last and to this method I will pass an integer value which will actually hold the data of the list node so in the first step we will simply create the list node by name temp and we will pass the data into the constructor and then we will provide an if else block so in the if we will provide a condition as whether list is empty or not. So we'll simply check whether last is equal to null or not. Or we can also call is empty method, which we have discussed in my previous tutorials. So friends, if the list is empty, then we'll simply assign value of temp to last. And in the second step, we'll simply assign value of last to last dot next which we discussed in the slide and in the else part so in the first step what we do is we assign the value of last dot next to temp dot next 
in the second step we assign the value of temp to last dot next and finally we assign the value of temp to last and as we discussed in the slide once we insert the node at the end of the circular singly linked list we increment the length by one so length plus plus so friend this is the code to insert the node at the end of a circular singly linked list now let's test this method into the main method so in the main method i have created an instance of circular singly linked list so let's add few node at the end of the circular singly linked list so here we will add the nodes which we saw in the slide so insert last and let's say I provide data as 1 and if I print the circular singly linked list by calling display method you can see when I run the code it prints 1 because initially circular singly linked list is empty and when we insert one node at the end of the circular singly linked list we only get this one node now let's insert one more node and I provide data as 8 and when I run this code you can see it printed 1 and then 8 so therefore it inserted 8 at the end of the circular singly linked list now let's say I insert one more node having data as 10 and if I run this code you can see it printed 10 so friends here we inserted three nodes at the end of the circular singly linked list so first we inserted 1 and then we inserted 8 so 8 was inserted at the last position and finally we inserted 10 so you can see the 10 is inserted just after 8 and which is the last node so friends in this tutorial we discussed how to insert a node at the end of a circular singly linked list. I hope you like this video. Please like, comment, share and subscribe my YouTube channel. Thanks have a nice day. Hello friends. Welcome to my new data structures and algorithm in Java tutorial series video. Friends in this tutorial we will discuss how to remove first node from a circular singly linked list in Java. So friends let's suppose we are given a circular singly linked list having three nodes say 1, 8 and 10 whose length is 3. So friends in our previous tutorial we discussed that we are keeping the track of the last node of the circular singly linked list through the last instance variable. So friends below is the algorithm to remove the first node from a circular singly linked list in Java. So let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step. So the first thing we here we do is we check whether the circular singly linked list is empty or not. So if you see circular singly linked list has three nodes and length is three therefore it's not empty. So the condition in if block comes out to be false. Moving ahead. Now in order to remove the first node from a circular singly linked list we know that we are keeping the track of the last node and in the circular singly linked list last node next points to the first node. So therefore here we are creating a temp node and we are assigning the value of last dot next to it. So this temp will point to the first node because in the circular singly linked list last next points to the first node. So it would look something like this. Moving ahead. So here we are providing an if else block and in the if block we are checking that whether last dot next is equal to last or not. So this condition comes into picture when the circular singly linked list has only one node left. So in this case last next points to the last because the circular singly linked list has only one element where first and the last node is the node itself. So here you can see last next is pointing to this first node and therefore it's not equal to last. So the condition in if block comes out to be false and the else part will be executed. So in the else part the first step we do is we assign the value of temp dot next to last dot next. Now friends as we want to remove this first node we need to do two things. First we need to break this link which is being referred by last dot next to the first node. So in order to remove this link what we are doing we are simply assigning the value of temp dot next to last dot next. So friends here if you see when we remove this first node from the circular singly linked list 
the node having the data as 8 becomes the first node because this node is removed and we also know that circular singly linked list has property that last next points to the first node so in this step we are simply assigning the value of temp next to last dot next now why we are doing this step is because once the first node is removed the second node becomes the first node so therefore last dot next should point to the second node so when this step is executed it looks something like this that last dot next is removed and we will assign the value of temp dot next to last dot next so it would look something like this so we are breaking the link of last dot next to the first node and then we are assigning it to the second node because when the first node is removed the second node becomes our new first node moving ahead and after the if else block we simply assign the value of null to temp dot next so friends as we are removing this first node and returning it from the method therefore we need to break this link as well so in order to break this link we are simply assigning null value to temp dot next so it would look something like this moving ahead and then we are decrementing the length by 1 because we know that we have removed this node from the circular singly linked list so initially the length was 3 so now it will become 2 moving ahead and then we are simply returning this temp node because we have already removed it from the circular singly linked list so it would look something like this so friends as soon as we have removed this link we know that we are currently left with two nodes and here you can see the node having the data as 8 becomes our new first node and you can also see the last next is pointing to this node therefore if we again call this algorithm and we want to remove the first node of a circular singly linked list the algorithm goes as follows so again first we check whether the circular singly linked is empty or not so here you can see circular singly linked list has two nodes therefore it's not empty so the condition in if block comes out to be false and the first step we are simply creating the temp node and assigning the value of last dot next to it so friends here as we track the last node of the circular singly linked list and we want to remove the first node therefore in order to reach the first node what we do we simply do last dot next so this value we are assigning to a temp node and it would look something like this so here you can see last dot next is pointing to this first node and we are assigning that value to temp so now temp will point to the node having data as 8 moving ahead and then in the if block we are checking that whether last dot next is equal to last or not so currently last dot next is pointing to this first node therefore last dot next is not equal to last so the condition in if block comes out to be false and the else part will be executed So friends, in the else part what we are doing, we are simply assigning the value of temp.next to last.next. So in order to remove the node having data as 8, we need to first break this link which is being referred by last.next. And we also know that when we remove this particular node from the circular singly linked list, we are left with only one node. So therefore last.next should point to that particular node. So friends, here we are assigning the value of temp.next to last.next. So we know that we have to remove this link and when we remove this particular node having data as 8 we know that now 10 will become our first and the last node both therefore we are simply assigning the value of temp next which is the node having data as 10 to last next so it would look something like this so here you can see the link is removed and then we are assigning temp next to last next so it would look something like this so friends here we have removed the link which is referring to this particular node which we want to remove moving ahead and then we are simply assigning the value of null to temp dot next because as we are returning this complete node we need to break this link so it would look something like this so now temp dot next instead of pointing to the node having data as 10 it is now pointing to null and as we have removed this node from the circular singly linked list we will decrement the length so now length is 1 because we have only one node left and in the final step we are simply returning the temp so it would look something like this 
so friends after the method gets executed we are left with only one node which is the first and the last node both because we are keeping the track of the last node and when the circular serial linked list has only one element left we know that that particular node is the last node and if it traverses to its next then it will refer to itself because this is the first node and the last node both and if we call this algorithm again in order to remove this last node from the circular singly linked list so the demonstration of the algorithm is as follow so first we check whether the list is empty or not so currently circular singly linked list has one node therefore it's not empty so the condition in if block comes out to be false and as we want to remove the first node of the circular singly linked list we assign the value of last dot next to temp but here you can see we are only left with one node therefore the last dot next is pointing to that particular node only so after this line gets executed it would look something like this so here you can see temp is pointing to last dot next which is the node itself moving ahead and now we are checking whether last dot next is equal to last or not so as we discussed earlier this condition will come only into picture when we are left with one node so currently here you can see last next is pointing to the last node itself therefore the condition in if block comes out to be true so the if block will be executed so friend in this step we are assigning null to last because in order to remove this node we have to break this link if we break this link then this node will be freed up so when this statement will be executed it would look something like this that now last will point to null and as we have broke this link now this node can be removed easily so after the if statement the last step we do is we simply assign the value of null to temp dot next so currently here you see temp next is pointing to temp itself therefore we need to break this link so here temp next is pointing to null moving ahead and then we are simply decrementing the length by 1 because we have successfully removed the node so now length becomes zero and as here you can see last is now pointing to null and in the final step we are simply returning the temp so it would look something like this so friends after we remove all the elements now if you again call this algorithm so in the first step we will check whether the circular singly linked is empty or not so here you can see the length is zero and last is pointing to null therefore the circular singly linked list is empty so the condition in if block comes out to be true and as we know that when the circular singly linked list is empty there are no nodes left to be removed so therefore we can throw a no such element exception because there are no nodes left to be removed so friends here we saw the demonstration of the algorithm now let's go to eclipse and see the working code so friends in my previous tutorial we created one class by name circular singly linked list and we implemented the code for the circular singly linked list into that particular class so in order to understand the working of circular singly linked list you can watch my previous tutorials and here you can see we are keeping the track of the last node through the instance variable list node so in this tutorial we will write the code to remove the first node from the circular singly linked list so here let's suppose we give the method name is public list node remove first so friends here i have given the method name is remove first and whose return type is of list node so this method will remove the first node from the circular singly linked list and will return it back to us so in the first step as we saw in the slide we are checking that whether circular singly linked list is empty or not so is empty so if the circular singly linked list is empty we will throw no such element exception and here we provide a string as circular singly linked list is already 
एम टी एंड इफ द सर्कुलर सिंगली लिंक इज नॉट एम टी देन द फर्स्ट स्टेप वी डू इज वी क्रिएट अ टेम्प प्लेस नोट एंड विल असाइन द वैल्यू ऑफ लास्ट डॉट नेक्स्ट टू इट एंड देन विल प्रोवाइड एन एफ एल्स ब्लॉक सो इन द एफ ब्लॉक वी प्रोवाइड अ कंडीशन एस दैट वेदर लास्ट डॉट नेक्स्ट इज इक्वल टू लास्ट और नॉट सो इफ द लास्ट डॉट नेक्स्ट इज इक्वल टू लास्ट देन विल सिंपली असाइन नल वैल्यू टू लास्ट बिकॉज वी नो दैट दिस कंडीशन कम्स इन टू पिक्चर वेन देर इज ओनली वन नोट लेफ्ट इन टू द सर्कल सिंगली लिंक लिस्ट एंड इन डेट केस इफ यू वॉन्ट टू रिमूव दैट पर्टिकुलर नोट वी नीड टू सिंपली असाइन द नल वैल्यू टू लास्ट बिकॉज दिस लास्ट इज रेफरिंग टू डेट पर्टिकुलर नोट एंड इन द एल्स पार्ट वी आर सिंपली असाइनिंग टेम्प नेक्स्ट वैल्यू to last dot next and after if else block we are simply assigning null value to temp next and then we are reducing the length by 1 and in the final step we are simply returning the temp node so friends this is the algorithm to remove the first node from the circular singly linked list now let's test its working in the main method so friends in my previous tutorial we discussed how we can insert the node into the circular singly linked list so we inserted three nodes in my previous tutorial with the data as 1 8 and 10 and we also created one display method which could display the entire circular singly linked list so if i run the code now you can see it printed 1 8 and 10 because there are three nodes in the circular singly linked list 1 8 and 10 now let's say we are removing the first node from the circular singly linked list and we are calling the display method again now if i run the code again so here you can see initially it printed 1 8 and 10 because we have three nodes in the circular singly linked list and when we removed the first node so one got removed and it printed 8 and 10 now let's say again call remove first method and if i run the code now so you can see it removed 1 and then it removed 8 and it finally printed 10 and if i call again remove first and if i run the code so you can see in the second line it printed nothing because it removed all the nodes from the circular singly linked list and when we call display so here you can see in display method we are initially keeping a condition whether last is equal to null and if last is equal to null then we are simply returning from the method so therefore it printed nothing because when we have removed all the nodes from the circular singly linked list we know that last point to the null and now if i call again remove first and if i run the code so you can see it gave an exception as no such element exception and it printed message as circular singly linked list is already empty so friends in this tutorial we discussed how to remove the first node from the circular singly linked list in java so friends usually we never return the list node from a method and we actually return the data part of the node which we want to remove so here if you are calling remove first so it should remove the node but it should return us back the data part of it so the code is similar what we need to do is we need to change the return type to int because the data is of integer type and here after pointing the first node by going through last dot next we create a integer variable which stores the data of the first node so we simply assign temp dot data to result integer variable so initially we were making temp dot next point to null we were doing this step because we are only returning back the list node so now when we are returning back the data part of it we don't require this step because this node will be automatically garbage collected by java and in the last step we are simply returning back the result so friends initially we removed the first node from the circular singly linked list and we returned it back 
and after some modification we are returning back the integer value so let's test the working of this method so here we'll just print the data which this remove first will return us back so here we will call remove first so here you can see there are three nodes 1 8 and 10 and then we are removing the first node so therefore it should print the value as 1 because 1 is the first node of the circular singly linked list and if I run the code so here you can see initially it printed the three nodes with data as 1 8 and 10 and then it removed the first node which is 1 and it printed it on the console and when we did display again there were two nodes left which is 8 and 10 so friends in this tutorial we discussed how to remove the first node from the circular singly linked list in java i hope you like this video please like comment share and subscribe my youtube channel thanks have a nice day hello friends welcome to my new data structures and algorithm in java tutorial series video friends in this tutorial we will discuss how to represent a stack in java so friends what is a stack so stack is a linear data structure used for storing the data we call it a linear data structure because it can be represented by a linked list or an array in which the nodes are adjacent to each other therefore it's a linear data structure so the basic property of a stack is that it's an ordered list in which we insert and delete the node at one end which is called a stop so here if you see if suppose we are given a list and the first node is pointed by top so we make this list restrictive in nature in the way that we can insert and delete the node at one end which is represented by top and if you see this restrictive property makes it a LIFO data structure so what is a LIFO data structure the last element inserted is the first one to be deleted so here if you see when we insert a node in the stack at the beginning so that element becomes the first candidate to be deleted because we are only allowed to remove and add the nodes at one end which is represented by the top moving ahead so friends let's see a demo of how stacks looks and how the elements are stored and removed so initially if you see when the stack is empty so the top node points to null and usually we use push and pop operation to add and remove the elements from the stack so suppose if you want to push an element having the data as 10 so it would look something like this and once we push the element into the stack the top node points to that particular node inserted so suppose we want to push now node 15 so when the node is pushed into the stack the top points to that particular node and now suppose we want to push 20 so when the node is inserted top points to the last node inserted if you see the stack is basically a one way list so here you can think that we are inserting node at the one end and the other end is blocked so there is only one end to push the elements and pop the elements so basically if you see when we inserted 20 the top pointed to that element so now if you want to pop an element we know that there is only one end where this nodes will be removed so as we pop 20 so now top will point to the node just before it and let's say if we want to again pop an element So now top will point to the node just before it and finally if we again pop an element so you can see the 10 got removed and now top points to again null so friend this is how the stack works as you saw it's a last in first out data structure 
so you saw the element which was inserted the last was the first one to be removed so friends this is how we actually represent the stack i hope you like this video please like comment share and subscribe my youtube channel thanks have a nice day hello friends welcome to my new data structures and algorithm in java tutorial series video friends in this tutorial we will discuss how to implement a stack in java so friends in my previous tutorial i discussed how to represent a stack we saw that it is a lifo data structure which means that element which got inserted last would be the first one to be removed and we also discussed that the elements are inserted and removed at the one end which is represented by top so friends in this tutorial we will discuss how to implement a stack in java we will discuss few of the methods which it implements such as push which actually inserts an element into the stack and we will also discuss pop method which removes the last node inserted from the stack so friends in this tutorial we will implement a stack using a linked list so friends as you know that linked list is represented by a list node where it contains two things one is the data and other is the pointer to the next list node so when we implement a stack class we usually keep two instance variables one is top and another one is length so in our previous tutorial we discussed that this top node is used to insert and remove the elements from the stack and here the instance variable length which represents the size of the stack so friends let's see the demonstration of this algorithm so friends when we initialize a stack first top points to null and the length is 0 so here you can see top is pointing to null and as the stack is empty the length is 0 now suppose we want to add an element having data as 10 so we'll call this push method and pass the data into it so when we call push and pass data as 10 we know that data is 10 so let's see the execution of this method step by step so in order to push an element into a stack we first create a temporary list node having a data which we have passed as an argument so it would look something like this that we have created a list node having data as 10 and its next pointing to null and you see the name of the list node is temp and it's pointing to that particular node moving ahead now in order to insert this node into the stack the first step we do is we assign the value of top to temp dot next so friends here you see temp points to this node and its next points to null and when the stack is empty we know that the top is also pointing to null so in the first step we are simply assigning a null value to temp next so it would look something like this so after this step temp next is pointing to null and top is also pointing to null moving ahead and then we'll assign the value of temp to top so here you see top points to null and when we'll assign the value of temp so temp is pointing to this node so after this step top will point to the temporary node so it would look something like this and in the final step as we know that we have inserted this temporary node will increment the length of the stack by 1 so here you see when this method gets executed the stack looks something like this the top is pointing to a node having the data which we passed into the push method and its next is pointing to null and therefore the stack has one element therefore the length is 1 now suppose we again call push method and pass data as 15 So let's see execution of this method step by step when length is 1 and top is already pointing to a node. 
so here when we have called push 15 so the data is 15 so here we will create a temporary node and this temporary node will hold the data which we pass into this push method so here you see we have created this temporary node having data as 15 and its next pointing to null moving ahead so friends the next step is we will assign the value of top to temp.next so currently temp.next is pointing to null so in order to insert this node into the stack we are assigning the value of top to temp.next so we are doing something like this we are removing this link and we are pointing it to top so in this step we are assigning the value of top to temp.next so now temp.next is pointing to top moving ahead so as this node is now inserted now top should point to this node so therefore we are assigning the value of temp to top so it would look something like this so now top is pointing to the temporary node moving ahead and we'll simply increment the length by one because now the stack has two elements so friends after this method gets executed the stack looks something like this so here you see the top is pointing to the node which we inserted last so friends this is how we insert an element into the stack now let's see the pop operation in which we remove the last inserted element so so we'll take the previous example we know that first we inserted 10 and then we inserted 15 so in the pop the last element inserted will be the first one to be removed so let's see how this pop method works so in order to remove the last inserted node so what we'll do we'll simply capture top dot data into integer variable by name result so we are storing the data inside this node into the integer variable result moving ahead now as we want to remove this last inserted node we, we need to break this link so once this node is removed top should point to its next element so for that we will simply assign top dot next value to top so it would look something like this and as this node is not referred by top it would be garbage collected moving ahead now we have removed the node from the stack so we need to decrement the length by 1 so now length becomes 1 so we will simply return the value 15 from this method now you see the stack contains only one element and the length is 1 now if we again call the pop method so first we will store the data inside this list node which is being pointed by the top so we are simply assigning top dot data into an integer variable result and as we need to remove this node we will simply break this link and assign top to its next so we are simply assigning top dot next value to top so top dot next is pointing to null so we are simply assigning a null value to top so it would look something like this and as this list node is not referred by top so it would be removed we will decrement the length by 1 because the node is now removed from the stack and finally we will return the result so friends here you can see when the stack is empty the length is 0 and top points to null so friends here we saw the demonstration of how to implement a stack in java so let's go to eclipse and see the working code so friends in order to implement a stack in java i have just created one class by name stack so in this class we will implement the stack functionality 
so as we saw in the slide that stack contains few instance variables so we'll create one instance variable of type list node by name top so private list node top and we'll also create an integer variable by name length which will store the size of the stack so private int length so friend as you can see we are implementing a stack using a linked list which is represented by list node so we'll create a inner class of type list node so friends in our previous tutorial we discussed how we can represent a list node in java so a list node contains two things one is the data so private int data and other is pointer to next list node so private list node next we'll also create one constructor so this constructor takes the data part so friends here we are implementing the stack using a linked list so we have created a list node now once we initialize the stack we know that top points to null and length is zero so we'll create one constructor for this stack class the public stack and here we'll assign a null value to top and length as zero friends we'll also create one method by name length which will return us back the length of the stack so public int length return length we'll create one boolean method by name is empty which will return us a boolean value whether the stack is empty or not so public boolean is empty so here we'll simply return a boolean value which will represent whether the stack is empty or not so in order to know that the stack is empty we'll simply check whether length is zero or not so if the length is zero we'll simply return true that stack is empty and if the length is not zero then we'll simply return a value of false that stack is not empty so we'll simply return length equals zero moving ahead so friends first we'll code the push method so public void push and in this push method we'll pass the data so this data will be inserted into the stack so in order to insert this data into the stack we'll first create a list node and we'll give name as temp and we'll create this list node and inside the constructor we'll pass the data moving ahead now on the next step we'll simply assign value of top to temp.next and then we'll simply assign the value of temp to top so top equal temp and finally as the data is inserted we'll increment the length by one so friend this is the push method now we'll implement the pop method so public int pop so friend this method will return us back the value of last inserted node into the stack so here first we'll put an if check and the check would be is empty so friends if suppose the stack is empty then we can't pop an element from the stack so if the stack is empty we'll throw an exception (coughs) 
will throw empty stack exception because we know that stack is empty and we cannot pop an element from an empty stack. So friends, if the stack is not empty, then the first step we'll do, we'll create an integer variable by name result and we'll assign the value of data stored in the top list node. So we'll do top dot data. And as we have stored the data inside the top, we can simply traverse to next node by assigning top dot next value to top. And finally the top has moved to its next node. So that node will be garbage collected. And we can simply reduce the length of the stack by one. And finally we'll return the result. So friend, this is how we pop an element from a stack. The stack also contains one more method by name peak. So what this peak method does is it simply returns us back the value which top holds. So it is nothing but returning a value of a last inserted node into the stack. So we'll create a method by name peak. So public int peak. peak. So we'll also provide a if check here that if the stack is empty, we will throw empty stack exception. And if the stack is not empty, then we can return top dot data because we know that top points to the last inserted node into the stack. And if we do top dot data, we'll get the value stored in that particular list node. So friends, this is how we implement a stack in Java. Now let's see the demonstration of these methods. So in the main method, first we'll create a stack. So when we do new stack, we know that top is pointing to null and length is zero. So let's say we push few elements into the stack. So stack dot push. And let's say we give data as 10. Fifteen and twenty. So friends here in stack we have pushed 10, 15 and 20 and we know that initially top pointed to null and as we inserted the data 10 it pointed to 10. Then as we pushed few nodes at 10, 15 and 20 so we know that top points to last inserted node. So, so if we print stack.peak so if you are printing the peak value of the stack, we know that it prints the value of last inserted node. So if I run the program, you see it prints 20 because 20 is the element which we last inserted. And suppose I want to pop an element. So, so I will do stack dot pop. So we know the top points to the last inserted node. So when we do a pop, 20 will be removed. And if I print stack.peak and run the code. So you can see it prints 15 the next time. When we do stack.pop, the last inserted element is the first element to be removed. So the 20 is removed and stack contains 10 and 15. And 15 is at the peak position, so it printed 15. And if I simply copy paste this and run the code, so you can see the third time it printed 10 because we removed 15 as well. So here, if you see, we have implemented push and pop in such a way that it is resembling a LIFO data structure, which is the element inserted last is the first to be removed. So friends in this tutorial we saw how we can implement a stack in Java. I hope you like this video.
प्लीज़ लाइक कमेंट शेयर एंड सब्सक्राइब माई यूट्यूब चैनल थैंक्स एव ए नाइस डे Hello everyone. So in this video we are going to discuss that how we can implement a stack with an array. In our previous video we saw how we can represent a stack and we also saw that how we can implement a stack using a linked list. So in this video we will see that how we can implement a stack with an array. So friends before we start in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update. So in our previous videos, we saw that stack is a LIFO data structure, which means last in, first out. Now, if this is a stack, then here in this data structure, there is only one end where the elements are inserted via push method, and from the same end, the elements are popped out using pop method. So therefore, the element which is last inserted, it's first one to be removed. So for example, if we insert three. Then two, and then one. So first we inserted three, then we inserted two, and then we inserted one. So the last element which got inserted was one. So this would become the first element to be popped out. So in this video we will see the implementation of push, pop, and peek method with the help of an array, and we will see that how we can implement the stack using an array. So, if we are implementing a stack using an array, we need to provide the capacity to it. So, as the internal data structure is array, this capacity will tell that we need an array of three elements, which also signifies that stack at the start can only hold three elements. So, internally, it would look something like this: that an array will be created of three elements having a default value of zero. So, currently, it's an int array. Therefore, the default values are zero. If it is an integer array, then the default values would be null. In our previous videos, we also discussed that values are inserted into the stack using the top variable. So here, top is an integer variable which will traverse this array and basically insert the elements based on the indexes. So at the start, top is actually pointing to minus one. It means The stack is empty. So now let's see how we can perform push and pop operation. So let's suppose we want to push element eight. So usually what happens is we can insert eight into this array at zeroth index, first index, and second index. Now at the start top is pointing to minus one. Now whenever we do push, we first increment top by one. So currently value of top is minus one. When we increment it by one. It becomes zero, and as it is pointing to zeroth index, what we do is we simply assign value eight like this. So eight comes here, and if we see the visual representation of stack, it looks something like this: that this is a stack, the element is pushed into the stack, and top is pointing to this element. Now similarly, let's say if we push four, so the first thing we do is We increment top by one, so top becomes one, and four is inserted at index one, like this. So four comes here, and here it looks something like this: that four is pushed into the stack, and now top is pointing to four. So basically, when we perform push, we do top plus plus, and then we perform array of top. And we assign the value, which is our data, which we have passed into our push method. So we perform these two steps in the push operation. Now let's say if we want to push three, so first we increment top. It becomes two, and at array of two, we assign three. So three comes here, and in the stack it looks something like this: that three is pushed, and top is pointing to this three. Now let's say if we push one more element with the data as one, so here you can see that initially when we created stack, we provided a capacity of three. It means the stack can hold only three elements. Now if we want to insert one more element, we know that there is no more place into the stack. 
so usually before this two steps we perform a check that whether stack is full or not so if stack is full we throw an exception so usually how we check whether stack is full or not we do array dot length and we compare it with the size of the stack so there is a method size now here if you see array dot length will be 3 and if we calculate the size of the stack the size of the stack is nothing but number of elements into the stack so we know that number of elements are 3 and array dot length is also 3 so how we evaluate the size function is whatever the value is hold by top which is 2 we do something like top plus 1 so usually this size method will return top plus 1 so here value of top is 2 if we do plus 1 we get 3 so array dot length is 3 and size is also 3 so it means the stack is full and we can't insert more elements to it so we throw an exception now let's suppose our stack has 3 elements 8 4 3 and now we want to pop it so we know that we pushed elements like this and we know that the last inserted element will be first to be removed via pop method so when the pop method is called to whichever index top is pointing that element was last inserted so now this will be the first one to be removed so we store this value into a temporary variable and at the end we return this value and what we do is we simply decrement top so we do top minus minus so it looks something like this that initial value of top was 2 now it becomes 1 now here either we can provide a value 0 or we can left this element as it is because whatever the insertion and deletion we are doing into this array is based on top so either we assign this value to 0 or if it is an integer array then we can also assign a value of null to it and here in the stack it looks like 3 is popped out and now top is pointing to 4 now let's say if we again call pop so now top is pointing to index 1 and the value is 4 so now this 4 will be removed so we first store this 4 into a temporary variable and then we simply decrement top so top comes here and it looks like 4 is popped out and top is pointing to 8 and similarly if we call pop again then 8 will be removed and we will decrement top so now top will become minus 1 and 8 will be popped out so here you can see if the value of top is less than 0 it means stack is empty and if we again call pop method then we also check at the start whether value of top is less than 0 or not if it is less than 0 then we throw an exception that stack is empty and there are no more elements to be popped out so now let's move ahead and see the implementation of stack using an array step by step so this is the code we have a class stack and as we discussed we have two variables top and the integer array and via this integer array we are implementing stack we have a constructor which takes in a capacity and this capacity is assigned to initialize our integer array and usually if we don't provide any value to our stack constructor then the by default capacity is 10 so let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step so we will create a new stack we pass in the value as 3 which would be our capacity so the constructor will be called capacity is 3 and we know that at the start when the stack is empty top is pointing to minus 1 so value of top is minus 1 and we will initialize the array with our capacity of 3 so it looks something like this that it has capacity to hold 3 elements with index 0, 1 and 2 and if we visualize the stack it looks something like this so when we initialize stack at the start the stack looks something like this now let's discuss the push method so let's suppose we call push method and we need to push a value 8 so the data is 8 which we need to push into the stack 
Now before pushing it into the stack, we first check whether our stack is full or not. So by full we mean that internally it's an array and let's say the capacity of array is 3. So we check whether this array already contains 3 elements or not. Because if the array has 3 elements, then we can't push 8 into the array. So how we check whether stack is full or not? We call is full method. Now is full method returns a boolean value which is true or false which says that the stack is full or not. And inside this method, how we check whether stack is full or not? We simply compare array's length which is 3. So array dot length is 3 because the array contains a capacity of holding 3 elements. So array dot length is 3. And in the implementation of stack, we also provide a size method. Now this size method will actually give us an information that how many elements are currently into the stack. So when we will call the size method, it actually returns an integer value and what we actually return is top plus 1. We are returning top plus 1 because let's suppose we have filled all the elements into the array. So top will be here and if top is at this index, so the value of top will be 2. But if we see the size of the stack is it is actually holding 3 elements. So we simply return top plus 1 which actually tells what is the size of the stack. So we simply return top plus 1 which says that how many elements are currently into the stack. So currently value of top is minus 1. If we add plus 1 the value is 0. It means currently in the stack there are no elements. So it returns 0. So 3 is not equal to 0. It means this condition will be false and false will be written from this method. So the condition in if block comes out to be false that stack is not full. So now we can push this data into the stack. Now the first thing we do is as top is pointing to minus 1 and we are inserting the elements into the stack using an array. So the first place to insert is at 0th index. So at the start first we will increment top. So value of top will become 0. Top will point to the 0th index. And then using array of top, we will assign the data. So here array of 0, we will assign a value 8. So 8 will come here like this. And if we visualize the stack, it looks that 8 is pushed into the stack and top is pointing to it. Now let's say if you again push a value 4. So the data is 4. We check whether stack is full or not. So array dot length is 3 and then we will evaluate the size. And currently we know that stack has one element which is 8. So when we will do top plus 1, value of top is 0. So 0 plus 1 will give 1. It states that the size of the stack currently is 1 because there is one element. So 3 is not equal to 1. So false value will be returned from here. And the if block won't get executed because is full will return false value. Now we will increment top because the next value we need to insert is here. Current value of top is 0. So when we will increment, it will become 1. And now to array of top, we assign the data. So array of 1, we assign the value as 4. So 4 will come here. And if we visualize the stack, it would look something like this. That 4 is pushed into the stack and top is pointing to 4 now. Now let's say if you want to push a value 3. So data is 3. We check whether stack is full or not. So array dot length is 3. And size of the stack is 2 which is top plus 1. So value of top is 1. 1 plus 1 is 2 which states that stack has 2 elements. So this method will return 2. And 3 is not equal to 2. 
so this method will return a false value so this if block won't get execute now the next value should come here because this space is occupied so we increment top top becomes 2 and at the second index we insert data which is 3 so 3 comes here so if we visualize stack it looks that 3 is pushed like this and top is pointing to it so now let's push one more element with the data as 1 so the push method will be called with the data as 1 now here you can see the initial capacity of the array was 3 and stack has 3 elements it means the array is completely occupied so when we will call is full method to check whether stack is full or not array.length is 3 and when we will call size method we know that current size of the stack is 3 it simply returns top plus 1 so value of top is 2 so it returned 2 plus 1 which is 3 so the size method will return 3 and here we are comparing 3 with 3 so via this comparison we come to know that the stack has 3 elements and the capacity of our array is also 3 it means that stack is full so from is full method true will be written which signifies that stack is full so we can't push 1 into the stack and this if log will be executed so we simply throw an exception that stack is full like this and we can't push 1 into the stack so now let's look into the implementation of pop method now let's suppose our current stack has 3 values 8, 4, 3 the demonstration we saw in our previous slide so value of top is 2 so when we will call pop method usually with the help of top we actually push into the array and with the help of top we actually pop the elements from the array so in the stack it looks like that we are inserting element from one end and we are removing it from the same end and whatever the element was inserted last will be the first one to be removed so basically top is actually helping us in maintaining LIFO property that the element inserted last is first one to be removed so 3 was inserted last because top is pointing to 3 so when we will call pop the first thing we check is whether stack is empty or not because if stack is empty there are no elements which we can pop so how we check whether stack is empty or not we call is empty method and we simply check whether top is less than 0 or not so when we saw that initially when top is pointing to minus 1 the stack was empty the array actually had 3 values to be inserted because the capacity of array was 3 so currently value of top is 2 and it is not less than 0 so therefore is empty method will return false that stack is not empty so this if block won't get executed and now as we need to pop 3 from the stack because 3 was the last element inserted into the stack what we do is we create a temporary variable by name result and we assign value of array top which means that we are assigning it a value which is being hold by second index because value of top is 2 so we are assigning value 3 to result and after assigning this value now we can simply decrement top so top becomes 1 and it looks like the 3 is popped out from the stack and top is pointing to the element previous to it which is 4 and at the end we simply return result so value 3 is returned from this method now if we again call pop so now 4 will be removed we check whether stack is empty or not so value of top is 1 1 is not less than 0 so the stack is not empty so a false value will be returned and this if block won't get executed first we will hold the value from the array at index 1 because value of top is 1 so 4 is assigned to result then we will decrement top and top becomes 0 so it looks like this 
and if you visualize the stack it looks like 4 is popped out and top is pointing to 8 now which is index 0 and we simply return value 4 that 4 is popped out from the stack. Let's say if we again call pop. Now 8 will be removed. We check whether stack is empty or not. So value of top is 0. 0 is not less than 0. So false value will be returned. So this if block won't get executed. We first hold the value of the 0th index which is 8 because top is pointing to 0. So result will have value 8. We decrement top. Top becomes minus 1 like this and it looks like 8 is popped out from the stack and top is actually pointing to minus 1 and simply at the end we return result as 8 that 8 is popped out from the stack. Now your stack is empty so if we again call pop method we first check whether stack is empty or not. So here you can see value of top is minus 1 so top is actually less than 0 which signifies that stack is empty so true will be returned and this if block will get executed and we simply throw a runtime exception that stack is empty which signifies that there are no more elements to be popped from the stack. So we actually saw pop method which actually removed the element from the stack but there is one more method peak. Now what this method does is whatever the values hold by top which actually is our last element inserted into the stack. So if we don't want to remove this element and we just want to see what is the peak element or what is the last element inserted into the stack we usually call peak method. So when we call stack.peak so let's say current condition of the stack is like this that there are two elements 8 and 4 and 4 was last element inserted into the stack. So when we will call peak the first thing we check whether stack is empty or not. So value of top is 1 and 1 is not less than 0. So false will be returned. That stack has two elements. So this if block won't get execute. So here instead of removing the element from the stack we are just returning the value stored at the top index which is at index 1 and the value is 4. So this peak method will give us information that which element was inserted last. So value 4 will be returned from this peak method and the element will stay in the stack it won't get removed. It is just giving us an information that which is the last element inserted into the stack which is our peak element. So friend this was all about implementation of stack using an array. I hope you must have liked this video. Thanks have a nice day. Hello friends. Welcome to my new data structures and algorithms in Java tutorial series video. Friends in this tutorial we will discuss how to reverse a string using a stack in Java. So friends below you can see an algorithm which would reverse a string using a stack in Java. So friends let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step. So friends let's suppose we are given a string whose value is a, b, c, d. So here we will see the demonstration of the algorithm which would reverse this string using a stack in Java. So in the first step what we do is we actually create a stack. Now this stack will hold only the character values. So an empty stack is created moving ahead. Now as we are given with this string ABCD we'll first convert it into an character array. So in the string class there is a method to care array which returns back a character array. So it would look something like this that we are now having a character array whose length is 4 and whose values are a, b, c and d. Moving ahead. So friends here we know that a stack is a LIFO data structure which means last in first out and we also discussed in our previous tutorial that how we can represent a stack and we also discussed the push and the pop methods of the stack. 
सो द जनरल आइडिया बिहेंड द वर्किंग ऑफ स्टैक इज द एलिमेंट विच गोज इन टू द स्टैक लास्ट बिकम इज द फर्स्ट वन टू बी रिमूव सो इन दिस स्टेप वॉट वी आर एक्चुअली डूइंग वी आर प्रोवाइडिंग ए फॉर लूप विच विल इटरेट ओवर ईच एंड एवरी कैरेक्टर ऑफ दिस कैर एरे एंड देन इट विल सिंपली पुश इट इन टू द स्टैक सो द फर्स्ट इटरेशन द वैल्यू ऑफ सी विल बिकम ए and then we'll simply push the character a into the stack so it would look something like this that now a is into the stack and similarly now c becomes b we will push b into the stack moving ahead now c becomes the character c and we'll simply push the c into the stack and finally c becomes the last value which is d and we will push it into the stack so now as you have traversed each and every character of this char array there are no more elements left to be traversed so friends here now in the stack we have four elements the first element which we inserted was a then we inserted b then we inserted c and the last element we inserted is the d so friends now we'll again provide a for loop which will iterate from the value i equal to 0 to a value lesser than string dot length so initially value of i is 0 and here we can see that the length of the string is 4 so currently i is less than 4 so now what we do is we'll pop the elements from the stack and then we'll simply assign it to the respective index from 0 to 3 so friends as soon as we call stack dot pop the element which is last inserted which is nothing but d will be popped out so it would look something like this so now d is popped out and the value will be assigned to the char array at index 0 which is this position so now it becomes d moving ahead now we'll increment the i so i becomes 1 and still the value of i is less than 4 now we'll again pop the element from the stack which is nothing but value c and we'll assign it to the char array at index 1 so the value at index 1 becomes c moving ahead now value of i becomes 2 2 is less than 4 we now pop an element from the stack and this value we will assign to the character array at index 2 so now at index 2 we will assign the value b moving ahead we will now increment the i so i becomes 3 and 3 is less than 4 so we'll pop an element from the stack so now value a is popped out and it will be assigned to this char array at index 3 because value of i is 3 so value of this char array at index 3 becomes a moving ahead now i becomes 4 and so 4 is not less than 4 so therefore the condition in for loop comes out to be false and also friends here you can see that using this stack we have actually reversed this character array and the last step will simply return this string by passing in the character array so now it will return a string having a value as d c b a so friends in this tutorial we saw how we can reverse a string using a stack in java Now let's go to Eclipse and see the working of this code. So friends in our previous tutorial we actually saw the demonstration of the algorithm to reverse a string using a stack. Now in this tutorial we will actually code the algorithm and test the working of it. So here I have created one class by name string reverse and inside this class I will create one static method which will return a string and whose name would be reverse. 
Now this reverse method will take in a string which we actually want to reverse. So friends in our previous tutorial we discussed how we can reverse a string using a stack. So here we will create an instance of stack and this stack will hold the character type elements. We will name it as stack. And we will import it from java.util package. In the next step what we do is as we are given this string we will first convert it into character array. We will give name as cares and we will call to care array method of string class which will actually convert this string into a character array and we will assign it to this cares array. Now we will simply iterate over this care array one by one and then we will simply push the character into the stack. So stack dot push. So whatever the string we have passed this for loop will iterate each and every character of this string and it will push it onto the stack. So in the next step we will again create a for loop. Now this for loop will iterate from value i equal to 0 to i less than strings length and inside this for loop what we will simply do is we will pop the elements from stack and we will assign it to char serif at the respective index from 0 to string length minus 1. So friends as we know that stack is a leafo data structure so the element which is inserted last will be the first to be popped out. So as we have inserted all the character elements one by one into the stack so now when we will pop it out it will be coming out in the reverse order and then we are simply storing it into the cares array and finally we will simply return a new string by providing this cares array into its constructor. So after this method gets executed whatever the string we have passed the character inside this string gets reversed. So in the main method let's test the working of this code. So first we'll create a string. We'll give it a value as a b c d which we actually discussed in the slide. And then we'll simply print this string on the console. So this would be before reverse. And then we'll print the string after reverse. So we'll simply call the reverse method and pass the string to it. So whatever the value will be returned from this reverse method, it will be printed on the console. So let's run this code. So friends here you can see before reversing the string it was ABCD and after reversing the string it became DCBA. So friends in this tutorial we saw the algorithm to reverse a string using a stack in Java. I hope you like this video. Thanks have a nice day. Hello everyone. So in this video we are going to discuss a problem. Next greater element. So let's see what this problem is and how to solve this. So in this problem we are given an array of integers and for each element in the array we need to find its next greater element in that array. So the next greater element is the first element towards right which is greater than the current element. So let's see it via an example. Let's suppose we are given an array of integers 4, 7, 3, 4, 8, 1. Now for each element we need to find its next greater element and the next greater element is the first element towards its right which is greater than the current element. So here for element 4 
it will see in the right direction and it will see which is the first element in right which is greater than 4. So here it sees that 7 is the first greater element than 4. So in the output array we are storing 7 here for index 0. For index 1 we have 7. So 7 sees in this direction and it checks which is the first greater element whose value is greater than 7. So 3 is not greater, 4 is not greater but 8 is greater. So we store 8 here. Now for 3, it will look in this direction and it will see that 4 is greater than 3 and it's the first greater element. So we simply store 4 here. Here we are storing it in the respect to indexes. Now 4 will see in this direction and it will see that 8 is the first element which is greater than 4. So we store 8 here. It will see in this direction and here it will find that no element is greater than 8 in the remaining array. So we simply store minus 1. And similarly with 1, there are no elements left. So therefore we directly store minus 1. So here for each index, we are taking that particular value and we are finding the first element in the right direction which is greater than the current element. So we are looking for the first element towards right. So for example, so for element 4, the first element which is greater than 4 is 7, 8 is also greater than 4 but the first element is 7 so we store 7 here which corresponds to this particular index. And similarly for 3, 4 is the first element which is greater than 3. 8 is also greater but 4 is the first greater element. So the problem is actually to find the next greater element in the array for any particular index. And that should be the first element towards right which is greater than the current element. So let's move ahead and see the demonstration of the algorithm step by step. So friends before we start in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update. And I would request you to watch this video till the end. So here is the algorithm where the method name is next greater element. It takes in an array and it returns an array. So the array which is written stores the next greater element of each and every element in the array. So let's say we call the next greater element, we pass in the array and let's say we pass the array having 6 elements 4, 7, 3, 4, 8, 1. Now at the first step we create the result array. We need to return this result array. So we are creating a new result array of the same length as of the given array. So we call new int, we pass array dot length. So the result array also has 6 elements. So friends in order to solve this problem of finding the next greater element towards right, we take the help of stack data structure. So we initialize a stack like this. Now this is the LIFO data structure. The element inserted last will be the first one to be removed. So we will see that how we can use the stack data structure and find the next greater element for each and every element in the array. So friend in this problem we need to iterate each and every element but we will iterate the array from the last index and go till the zeroth index. So here we are traversing the array in this direction because this direction will help us in finding out the next greater element towards right. So at the start the value of i will be array dot length minus 1. So array dot length is 6 because there are 6 elements. If we do minus 1 we are starting from the fifth index. So i will start from the fifth index. So friends here you can see that as we are starting from the last index there is no greater element towards its right. So therefore we first check 
whether our stack is empty or not because in the stack we will store some elements which will figure out that which is the greater element towards the right and which is the first greater element towards the right so at the first step we are checking whether stack is empty or not so you will understand this step more clear when we reach to the middle of the array so at the start stack is empty so this condition comes out to be false because stack is empty and then we provide a if else we check whether stack is empty so stack is empty which signifies that there is no greater element for this index to its right so for one there is no element towards its right which is greater than 1 so we directly store minus 1 into the result array at index i which is this index so minus 1 comes here and at the end we just push 1 onto the stack so why we are pushing 1 onto the stack is because let's say at index 4 there could have been value as 0 so for 0 1 would have been its next greater element so we can't discard this 1 directly we need to push it on the stack for the rest of the elements to compare so we simply push array of i which is 1 into the stack so 1 comes into the stack we will decrement i so i becomes 4 4 is greater than equal to 0 so this condition is true now here we are checking whether stack is empty or not so stack is not empty so this condition comes out to be true so if stack is not empty that on the stack there could be an element which is greater than the current element we will see how so if this condition is true in the if block we are providing a while loop and in the while loop we are providing two condition with an and that stack should not be empty which is true so here stack dot peak is 1 and the current element at array of i is 8 so 1 is less than equal to 8 and stack is not empty so therefore this condition comes out to be true so the while loop will execute so here this condition signifies that for 8 it will see that there is no element in the stack which is greater than 8 so therefore it simply removes one from the stack it does stack dot pop and why it does stack dot pop because it sees that in the stack whichever element is present it is actually lesser than the current element which is 8 so it discards one because for the rest of the array eight would be the next greater element but one cannot be the next greater element so let's say for four seven is the next greater element for seven eight could be the next greater element but for any of the element one cannot be the next greater element because we have found one element which is actually greater than one which is eight so therefore it discards the element 1 by popping it out so one gets popped out as it's a while loop it again checks whether stack is empty or not so stack is empty so this condition comes out to be false and this while loop will terminate and for element 8 we first check whether stack is empty so yes stack is empty which signifies that for the value 8 there is no next greater element towards its right so therefore this condition is true and into the result array at index i we store minus 1 because for 8 there is no greater element towards its right and then we will simply push 8 on to the stack because 8 could be the next greater element for the remaining array we will decrement i i becomes 3 3 is greater than equal to 0 
सो फॉर एलिमेंट एट इंडेक्स थ्री विच इज फोर वी चेक दैट वेदर स्टैक इज एम टी और नॉट सो इफ स्टैक इज नॉट एम टी इट मीन्स देर कुड बी ए चांस दैट द नेक्स्ट रेटर एलिमेंट विल लाई इन द स्टैक सो दिस कंडीशन कम्स आउट टू बी ट्रू स्टैक इज नॉट एम टी एंड देन वी विल प्रोवाइड अ वाइल्ड लू वी फर्स्ट चेक वेदर स्टैक इज एम टी और नॉट सो स्टैक इज नॉट एम टी सो दिस कंडीशन इज ट्रू एंड वी विल डू स्टैक डॉट पी विच विल रिटर्न एज द वैल्यू एट बिकॉज एट इज द टॉप मोस्ट एलिमेंट सो स्टैक डॉट पी रिटर्न एट वी विल चेक वेदर इट इज लेस देन और इक्वल टू द करंट एलिमेंट विच इज फोर सो दिस कंडीशन कम्स आउट टू बी फॉल्स बिकॉज एट इज नॉट लेस देन इक्वल टू फोर सो दिस वाइल्ड लू विल टर्मिनेट सो इफ द वाइल्ड लू टर्मिनेट एट दिस कंडीशन it signifies that there is one element on the stack left and stack is not empty so this if condition also comes out to be false because there is element on the stack which means that 4 was not able to pop out 8 and it was able to find an element which is the first greater element towards its right so whatever is at the top of the stack we will directly store into the result array so at i at index of result array we will store stack dot p which is 8 so 8 comes here directly so for value 4 8 is the first next greater element towards its right moving ahead we will keep 8 as it is on the stack we will not touch it because 4 was not able to remove it because if we remove it then for 7 we will not able to find which is the first next greater element towards its right so we will keep 8 on the stack and we will push 4 on the stack like this and why we are putting 4 on the stack is because let's say for 3 though 8 is the next greater element towards its right but 4 is the first next greater element towards its right so therefore we need to still put 4 on the stack and we don't have to discard it we will decrement i i becomes 2 2 is greater than equal to 0 we check whether stack is empty or not so stack is not empty so this condition comes out to be true we provide a while loop the first condition is stack should not be empty so stack is not empty so this condition is true and stack dot peak which is 4 we will check whether 4 is less than equal to the current element which is 3 so this condition comes out to be false so therefore this while loop will terminate so this signifies that 3 could not pop 4 out of the stack this signifies that if stack is not empty then whatever is at the top will be the first next greater element for this index which is 2 so we directly store stack dot peak at index 2 which is 4 so as 3 was not able to pop 4 out so this is the topmost element if we do stack dot peak we will get 4 and we directly store 4 here so for 3 4 is the first greater element towards its right and then we push 3 on the stack because let's say if instead of 7 if the value would have been 2 so for 2 3 would have been the first greater element towards its right so we can't discard 3 so we simply push it on the stack we'll decrement i i becomes 1 1 is greater than or equal to 0 stack is not empty in the while loop the first condition is stack is not empty which is true 
stack has three elements stack dot peak which is three we check whether it is less than or equal to the current element seven so yes this condition is also true so what seven is actually doing it is actually popping out the elements which are lesser than it so that it reaches to an element which is actually greater than it so this while loop does that this both condition comes out to be true so first it pops out 3 because 3 is lesser than 7 and for 7 it could not be the first greater element towards its right so it pops it out stack is not empty and stack dot peak which is 4 now is less than equal to 7 so this condition is also true so for 7 it will pop 4 also out of the stack because 4 cannot be the next greater element of 7 towards its right so 4 gets popped out stack is still not empty and stack dot peak which is 8 is less than equal to 7 so this condition is false now because 8 is greater than 7 so this while loop will terminate leaving only 8 into the stack and if there is some element on the stack stack is still not empty which means that for index 1 and element 7 we have found one next greater element towards its right which is stack dot peak which is 8 so we directly put 8 here into the result array like this using this assignment operator so friends here you saw that 7 actually popped out 3 and 4 from the stack because if we go beyond 7 whatever element we encounter for those elements 7 could be the next greater element 3 and 4 cannot be the next greater element 8 could be a possibility which is already in the stack which we have stored it here but 3 and 4 cannot be the possibility for the remaining elements towards its left so we directly discard 3 and 4 and we simply push 7 on the stack because 7 can be a possibility for the remaining elements that it can become the next greater element for the remaining elements we will decrement i i becomes 0 and 0 is equal to 0 so this condition is still true stack is not empty so this condition is true we provide a while loop stack is not empty and stack dot peak which is 7 is less than equal to 4 so this condition is false because 7 is not less than or equal to 4 so this while loop will terminate and if stack would have been empty it means for 4 there would have been no element on its right which would have been greater than 4 but stack has two elements so therefore whichever element is on the top which is 7 we will simply assign it to the result array at i index so for 4 7 is the first greater element towards its right 8 is also greater than 4 but 7 is the first element which this stack help us to figure out so we directly assign 7 here and then we simply push 4 on the stack as there are no more elements left for i to travel but still we push 4 on the stack we will decrement i so when we will decrement i i will become minus 1 it will reach here so minus 1 is not greater than or equal to 0 so this for loop will terminate because this condition comes out to be false and at the end we will simply return the result array
So friends, here you saw that how we can solve the next greater element problem using a stack. Now as stack is last in first out, it actually help us in finding out the next greater element towards right for any particular index. So friends, I hope you must have liked this video. In case if you are new to my channel, then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update. Also please like this video and share it with your friends and colleagues. Thanks have a nice day. Hello everyone. So in this video we are going to discuss a problem of valid parenthesis. So in this problem we are given a string as now this string only contains the brackets which are opening and closing brackets. So we can have round, square and curly brackets. We need to determine whether the input string is valid or not. So an input string is valid if open brackets must be closed by same type of brackets. Open brackets must be closed in correct order. So let's say we are given with an input string like this. And we need to find out whether this input string is valid or not. So the input string is valid if open brackets must be closed by same type of brackets. So here you can see this is opening curly bracket. This is opening round bracket. Open brackets must be closed in correct order. So here we have opening curly bracket and then we have opening round bracket. So if we go ahead we have a closing round bracket. So this much part is valid because this opening round bracket is closed by same type of bracket and this is also in correct order and at the end we have one curly bracket. So this opening curly bracket is being closed by the same type of bracket and that too in proper order. So this complete string is valid. Now let's say we are given an input string like this. This is opening curly bracket but it is closed by a different type of bracket which is the square bracket. So this is not a valid string. Now let's say if you have input string like this. We have a opening curly bracket. It is followed by a opening round bracket. And then we have a closing round bracket. So this much part is valid because this closing round bracket is being matched with the opening round bracket. But after that we don't have any character. So we are left with one opening curly bracket. It doesn't have its closing bracket of same type. So therefore this is an invalid string. Now let's say if we have string like this. So at the start only we have a closing curly bracket. So therefore we can directly say that it's an invalid string because our input string is valid where open brackets must be closed by the same type of brackets and these open bracket must be in correct order. So this is an invalid because at the start only we have a closing curly bracket. So how we can solve this problem is we can use a stack data structure. Now let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step using a stack. So friends before we start in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update. So here we have a method is valid which takes the input string and returns a boolean value true or false which states that this string is valid or not. So first we will see the negative scenarios where we are actually returning false one is here, here and here if stack is not empty. So if we call is valid method with passing in one closing curly bracket followed by a opening curly bracket. So as will be this string. We will first create a stack. So your stack is LIFO data structure where element which goes last will be the first one to be removed. So you can watch my stack tutorial to understand more about this data structure. So here the main idea is to iterate each and every character of this string. So first we will convert this string into character array and then we will iterate it through the variable c. So when we will call to char array method we get something like this. We get a character array where each character is stored at a particular index. Now this for loop will start with the closing curly bracket. So c becomes the closing curly bracket. So here as we know that the string is valid, we must have a opening brackets at the beginning. 
and whenever we encounter any opening brackets, we simply push it on the stack. So currently here you can see that we have a closing curly bracket. So this if block conditions comes out to be false because C is not equal to any of this opening bracket. So the else part will be executed. Now in the else part, the first thing we simply check is whether stack is empty or not. So why we are checking whether stack is empty because it simply signifies that there is no character in the stack which is opening bracket and we have reached to the else block and we have found that stack is empty. It means whatever value C will have, it must be the closing bracket. So therefore we can directly return false and which is actually true because C value is closing curly bracket. Because if we have an opening bracket, then that must be pushed on the stack and stack must have some elements in it. But if C is not equal to the opening bracket, so in the else part, the first step we check is whether stack is empty or not. Because if stack is empty, then we have one closing bracket and there is no element on the stack which we can pop out and match it with the closing bracket. So we can return false. You can understand more on this in our upcoming examples. So currently we return false because the input string is not valid. It is actually getting started from the closing bracket. Now let's say if we are given with this string. So as becomes the opening curly bracket and a closing square bracket. We create the stack. We create the char array. So for the first iteration C value will be the opening curly bracket. So here you can see that for the first step till zero index, the condition holds good because we have a opening bracket. So C is actually equal to a opening curly bracket. So we simply push C on the stack. So this opening curly bracket comes on the stack. Now C moves to the next character, which is closing square bracket. C is not equal to any of this opening brackets. So the else part will be executed. Now stack is not empty. So this condition comes out to be false and the else part will be executed. So friends, the main idea behind pushing the opening bracket onto the stack is in the else part, we will first peek the topmost element. So when we will call stack dot peak, whichever element is on the top of the stack, that value will be returned from this method. So currently top will point to the opening curly bracket like this. And why we are actually looking into the topmost element on the stack is because we need to check whether this opening bracket is actually closed by the same type of bracket or not. So here you can see now we provide three conditions here separated by or. So if any of the condition comes out to be true, then this if block will be executed. So here simply the condition is if on the top of the stack, we have a round bracket and the currently visiting element, which is C is closing round bracket. It means it's a match and similarly with the other two brackets. So therefore we are looking for the topmost element in the stack because we have to match the brackets of the same type in correct order. So here you can see top is equal to the opening curly bracket, but C is equal to closing square bracket. So therefore no condition comes out to be true. So this overall if condition comes out to be false. So the else part will be executed and we can return false because for this opening curly bracket, the element which is next to it is closing square bracket, which makes it a invalid string. So therefore we can return false directly. Moving ahead. Let's say we are given with this string. So S holds this string. We will create a stack. We will generate the char array like this. So the first C value will be the opening curly bracket. In the first if condition, we are checking that if we have an opening bracket, then we simply push it on the stack. 
so c is actually equal to the opening curly bracket so we push it on the stack now we have pushed something on the stack so in the next iteration c will become the opening round bracket now c is equal to opening round bracket so we know that we need to push it on the stack so this opening round bracket comes like this now c moves to the third character which is the closing round bracket so c is not equal to any of the opening bracket so this if condition comes out to be false in the else part we first check whether stack is empty or not so if stack is empty it means we are straight away getting one closing bracket and it is not having any of its opening bracket before that so we can directly return false if the stack is empty so currently on the stack we have two elements so the else part will be executed first we will check out for the top element by calling stack dot peak so if we see the top of the stack we will have a opening round bracket so top will be equal to opening round bracket now here you can see that top is equal to opening round bracket and c is equal to closing round bracket so therefore it's a match here you can see it's a match so the element on the stack which is top is this and the current element c is this so it means we have found one matching brackets which are opening and closing and are in correct order so therefore the first if condition comes out to be true and the overall if condition comes out to be true because we have a or operator here so it means we have found one match which is the correct match so we can simply pop this element out because it's matching pair we have already found so it gets popped out so now here you can see that we have visited all the elements of this char array so this for loop will terminate and here you can see at the end what we return is we check whether if stack is empty or not because if stack is empty it means we have found all the proper matching brackets and the string is valid but here you can see in the stack we are left with one opening curly bracket for which we didn't find its same type of bracket so therefore stack is not empty so stack dot empty returns false so we can directly return false stating that this input string is not valid now here we will see one more example which is a proper valid string so as becomes this we create a stack we create the char array like this and in the for loop c will point to the opening curly bracket first so this condition is true so we can push c on the stack so this opening curly bracket is on the stack the next element is the opening round bracket so c becomes opening round bracket c is equal to opening round bracket so we can push it on the stack like this now we'll move to the next character so c becomes the closing round bracket so this overall condition is false because c is not equal to any of the opening bracket stack is not empty so this condition comes out to be false now first we will see the topmost element on the stack by calling stack dot peak so top will become equal to closing round bracket like this and then we will provide a if condition we will check whether top is equal to any of the opening bracket so currently it's opening round bracket and the current element which is c whether it's the same type of closing bracket so here c is equal to closing round bracket like this so this much string is valid so the first condition comes out to be true so we simply pop this element out because its matching bracket has been found 
मूविंग टू द नेक्स्ट कैरेक्टर नो सी बिकम्स द क्लोजिंग करली ब्रैकेट दिस कंडीशन इज फॉल्स बिकॉज वी हैव ए क्लोजिंग ब्रैकेट स्टैक इज नॉट एम टी वी विल फर्स्ट सी द टॉप मोस्ट एलिमेंट ऑन द स्टैक बाय कॉलिंग स्टैक डॉट पीक सो टॉप विल बी इक्वल टू द ओपनिंग करली ब्रैकेट लाइक दिस so the first condition is false because top is not equal to opening round bracket and c is not equal to closing round bracket the second condition comes out to be true because top is equal to the opening curly bracket here and c is equal to closing curly bracket so it looks something like this this is our top and this is our currently element which is c so it's a match of the same type of brackets so this much part is valid so this condition comes out to be true so the overall if condition comes out to be true so we will simply pop this element out now we have visited all the elements in this char array so this for loop will terminate and here you can see at the end stack is empty so stack dot is empty method will return true so therefore it means that this is actually a valid string so friend this was all about the problem valid parenthesis where we can figure out that whether brackets are actually balanced or not that is the opening brackets is being matched with the closing bracket of the same type and also in the correct order so friends i hope you must have liked this video In case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update thanks have a nice day hello friends welcome to my new data structures and algorithm in java tutorial series video friends in this tutorial we will discuss how to represent a queue in java so friends what is a queue so here q is a data structure which is used for storing the data and it's an ordered list in which insertion are done at one end called as rear and deletion are done at other end which is called as front so friends if you see an example below then this is a linked list where the first node is referred by the front variable and the last node is referred by the rear variable so here q follows a basic structure where insertion are done at one end which is called as rear so whatever we insert in the queue we insert at the end which is referred by the rear and whatever the deletions are done we use the front variable to make the delete so basically is a type of linked list where we keep two pointers one is front and one is rear and usually the front points to the first node and rear points to the last node and this linked list follows a certain pattern in which whenever we want to insert an element we basically insert at the end and whenever we want to delete any element we usually use the front end so friends queue is also called as fifo list which is first in first out list so here what we do is the first element inserted is the first one to be deleted so friends queue is a list which follows certain restrictions that whenever we want to insert an element we will use the rear end and whenever we want to remove an element we will use the front end so therefore we can see it's a first node so it means this node was inserted first and if you see whatever the nodes coming after that follow a sequence of removal therefore it's termed as fifo which is first in first out so the node inserted first will be the first one to be removed so let's quickly see the demonstration how q works so friends q is a list which follows certain restrictions that we will enter the nodes from one end and we will exit the node from other end so therefore so therefore it forms a fifo list where the element inserted first would be the first to be removed so let's see a quick demonstration so initially if you see q is empty and there are no nodes so when a q is empty front points to null and the rear points to null now if you want to insert any element into a queue we basically use an enqueue operation now let's say we use an enqueue operation and we want to insert a node having data as 20 
so here if you want to insert this node having data as 20 then we know that there is only one end where we can insert so it looks something like this and once this node is inserted the front and the rear both points to this particular node and as in previous slide we discussed front points to the first node and the rear points to the last node so friends currently the queue is only one node therefore front and rear are both pointing to this particular node because this is the first and the last element both now let's suppose we want to insert one more element having data as 10 so it would look something like this that elements are inserted at one end and we basically use the rear end to insert the element so when we insert an element now rear will point to the node which was last inserted moving ahead now let's say we want to insert a node having data as 15 so it would look something like this so when the node is inserted now rear points to that particular node so friends here currently q is 3 nodes 20 10 and 15 where 20 is the first node therefore it's being referred by front node and 15 is the last node therefore it is being referred by the rear node now let's say we want to remove an element so in order to remove an element we use the dq operation so friends as we know that q follows a basic restrictions that the nodes are inserted at one end and they are removed from the other end so in order to achieve that what we do whenever we insert any element we usually insert it using the rear end and whenever we remove an element we use the front end so let's see when we call this dq operation so the node which is referred by the front will be removed first so it would look something like this and once the node is removed now front will point to the node just after it and suppose we again call dq operation so it would look something like this and now front will point to the node 15 and we again call a dq operation so it would look something like this and now as there are no element into the queue therefore front and real both will point to null so friends here we saw that when we inserted three nodes 20 was the first node so therefore 20 became the first node to be removed so therefore it follows a FIFO structure that the node which was inserted first was the first one to be removed so basically queue follows this restrictions that that whenever a node is inserted first it becomes the first one to be removed so friends this is how we represent a queue so in my next tutorial we will see how we can implement a queue in java i hope you like this video please like comment share and subscribe my youtube channel thanks have a nice day hello friends welcome to my new data structures and algorithm in java tutorial series video friends in this tutorial we will discuss how to implement a queue in java so friends in my previous tutorial we discussed what is a queue and we know that it's a linear data structure used for storing the data and here we also saw that it's an ordered list in which insertion are done at one end which is called as rear and deletion are done at other end which is called as front so in my previous tutorial we discussed how we can use this front and rear end to insert and remove the elements from a queue and we also discussed that queue is a FIFO list which is first in first out that a node inserted first will be the first one to be deleted so friends in this tutorial we will discuss how we can implement a queue so basically when we implement a queue we usually keep two list nodes by the name front and rear we insert using the rear list node and we remove using the front list node so friends let's go to eclipse and see the implementation of a queue so friends 
here i have created one class by name q having an empty main method so in this class we will implement how a queue works so friends in order to implement a queue we need to create few instance variables so as we discussed in slide so queue contains a front node and a rear node so those two nodes are basically of type list node so here we'll create one list node and we'll give name it as front we'll also create one more list node and we'll give it a name as rear and we'll also create one integer variable now this integer variable will store the size of the queue so friend as we discussed in slide that queue is basically a list therefore internally it uses list nodes so here we will create one inner class of type list node so private class list node and friends as we discussed in our previous tutorials how we can represent a list node so in a list node we basically keep two things one is the data part and other is the reference to the next list node so private int data and other is the reference to next list node we will also create one constructor public list node now this constructor will take in a data part so int data and we'll simply assign this data to this dot data and this dot next will have null value so friends here we saw a queue has two list nodes one is represented by front and other is represented by rear below we'll create one method as public int length now this method will return us back the length of the queue we'll also create one boolean method public boolean and we will give it a name as is empty so friend this method will return us a boolean value that whether a queue is empty or not so we'll simply return length is equal equal 0 so if length is 0 then this method will return us true and if length is greater than 0 then this method will return us false so friend this is how we implement a queue using the front and rear list node In my next tutorial I will demonstrate how we can insert an element into a queue and how we can remove an element from a queue. So friends, I hope you like this video. Please like, comment, share and subscribe my YouTube channel. Thanks have a nice day. Hello friends. Welcome to my new data structures and algorithm in Java tutorial series video. Friends, in this tutorial we will continue with the implementation of a queue in Java. and in this tutorial we will discuss how to insert an element in a queue in java so friends in this tutorial we will discuss how to insert an element into a queue and if you see below is the algorithm to insert an element into a queue in our previous tutorials we discussed that queue is a type of a linked list which has some restrictions that it is considered as fifo list which is first in first out list so by first in first out we mean the element inserted first would be the first one to be removed and in this tutorial we will discuss how to insert an element into a queue so let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step so friends when we initialize a queue we know that the queue is empty and there are no elements so when a queue is empty and there are no elements so in this situation the front node and the rear node both points to null 
so here you can see currently q is empty so therefore front is pointing to null and rear is pointing to null and we also know that as q is empty and there are no nodes so the length is also zero so friends let's suppose you want to insert an element having the data as 10 so we will call enqueue function so let's see the demonstration how this method works now as we call the enqueue method and we pass the value of 10 into it we know that the data is equal to 10 so currently data is pointing to 10 moving ahead now in order to insert an element into a queue what we do we first create a temporary list node having the data which we have passed into the method so it would look something like this now here you can see that it is a basically list node having data as 10 where temp is pointing to this node and its next is pointing to null so this is the node that we want to insert into a queue moving ahead now in the first step we check whether the queue is empty or not so currently if you see front is pointing to null and rear is also pointing to null and length is 0 so therefore the queue is empty so the condition in if block comes out to be true Now in the if block what we do, in order to insert this temporary node into the queue, we simply assign the value of temp to front. So it would look something like this. So now front is pointing to this node having data as 10. So friends in our previous tutorial we discussed that when a queue is empty and if we want to insert an element, then after an insertion we know that the queue has only one element. Therefore, front and rear both point to that particular node. So here we simply check that whether Q is empty and if it is empty, then we'll simply assign the value of temp to front. So you can see now front is pointing to this particular node. Moving ahead. Now after the if else block, we simply assign the value of temp to rear. So friends here we know that after the insertion of this node, Q has one element. So if the Q is one element, then we know that front and rear both point to that particular node because the Q contains the only node which is first and the last node both. So therefore in this step, it would look something like this. That rear is pointing to the node having data as 10 and front is also pointing to the node having data as 10. Moving ahead. Now in the last step. As we have inserted this node into the queue, we know that length of this queue is 1. So therefore we will increment the length by 1. Because this queue contains now one element. Moving ahead. So when this method gets executed, the queue looks something like this. The front and rear both point to this particular node and whose next is pointing to null. And we also know that length is 1. Now suppose if you want to insert one more node having data as 15. So let's see the algorithm once again. So in the first step we know that data is 15. Moving ahead. So friends in order to insert the node having data as 15. First we will create a temporary list node which has data as 15 and whose next will point to null. So it would look something like this. So here you can see temp is pointing to this list node whose data is 15 and whose next is null. Moving ahead. Now in the if block we will check whether q is empty or not. So currently q has one node therefore it's not empty. So the else part will be executed. So in the else part what we do we simply assign the value of temp to rear.next. Now friends in our previous tutorial we know that whatever the nodes we want to insert into a queue we always use the rear end of it. This is because queue follows some restrictions that the nodes are inserted at one end and they are removed from the other end. So in this case if we are inserting a node then we are always using the rear end. So therefore we are assigning the value of temp to rear dot next. So currently if you see rear next is pointing to null. And if you want to insert this node having data as 15, we need to remove this link 
and we need to point this link to this temp node therefore we are assigning temp value to rear dot next so it would look something like this now first this link will be removed and then we'll create one link from first node to second node so it is nothing but we are assigning value of temp to rear next moving ahead so friends we know that we are inserting an element at the rear end and this rear node will point to the last element of the queue so currently we have inserted this node into the queue but we are not pointing rear to this node because this is the last node so in order to do that we are simply assigning value of temp to rear so it would look something like this so now as you can see front is pointing to the first node and rear is pointing to the last node and this is the property which Q follows moving ahead now as we have inserted this node into the queue we know that the queue has now two elements therefore we'll increment the length by one so now length becomes two and finally when this method gets executed the queue looks something like this that front is pointing to the first node and rear is pointing to the last node and we have inserted this node using the rear end moving ahead now let's suppose we want to insert one more element having data as 20 so in the first step we know that data is 20 moving ahead now in order to insert data is 20 we will first create a temporary list node so now this temp node is pointing to a list node having data is 20 and whose next is pointing to null moving ahead so in the if block we will check whether q is empty or not so currently q is not empty because length is 2 and we have two nodes already in the queue so the else part will be executed so in the else part what we do we simply assign the value of temp to rear dot next so we are doing this step is because we want to insert this node into the queue and we know that the elements are inserted into queue at one end which is called as rear end so therefore we are assigning value of temp to rear next so currently rear next is pointing to null and in order to insert this node into the queue we'll, we have to remove this link and we have to assign this link to temp node so therefore we are simply assigning value of temp to rear dot next so it would look something like this so first this link will be gone and then we'll assign the value of temp to rear next so it would look something like this moving ahead and now as we have inserted the node into the queue we know that the node with the data 20 is the last node so therefore we'll simply assign the value of temp to rear because we know that rear points to the last node in the queue so it would look something like this moving ahead and in the final step we'll increment the length by one because now we have three nodes so the length becomes three and once this method gets executed Q looks something like this that front points to the first node and rear points to the last node and we also know that length is three because we have three nodes into the queue so friends this was the demonstration of how to insert an element into a queue now let's go to Eclipse and see the working code. So friends, in my previous tutorial, I had created one class by name Q. And into that Q, we created two list nodes, one by name front and one by name rear. And we also created one integer instance variable by name length. So basically list node front will point to the first element into the queue. And list node rear will point to the last element into the queue. And as we are discussing the in queue operation, we know that we are inserting the element from the rear end. And we have also discussed that queue has few methods by name length, which was actually returning the length of the queue. And one boolean method is empty, which was returning true if the list is empty and false if the list is not empty. So in this tutorial, we will simply see how we can insert an element into a queue. So we'll create one method as public 
void in q and this method takes in a integer data now friends in the first step we'll create the temporary list node and we'll pass the data into the constructor so in the first step we are creating the temporary node which we discussed in the slide moving ahead we'll provide an if else block so in the if we'll check that is q empty or not so if the q is empty we are simply assigning the value of temp to front and if the q, and if the q is not empty then we are simply assigning the value of temp to rear dot next moving ahead after if else block we are simply assigning the value of temp to rear as we discussed in the slide and in the last step we are incrementing the length by 1 so friend this is the in queue operation which we discussed in the slide and in this class I will also create one constructor for the queue so public queue so when we initialize any queue we know that front is pointing to null and rear is also pointing to null and length is 0 so friends in order to demonstrate how in queue operation works I will create one more method which will actually print the elements of the queue so here I create one method as public void print and in the print method we will check if if q is empty it means it has no node to print so therefore we will simply return from the method and if the q is not empty then we will traverse each element into the queue and we will print it on the console so in order to print the elements on the console we will first create a list node current and we will assign the value of front to it so here as we know that we are implementing a queue with a linked list therefore we are printing the element from the first node to the last node so therefore in order to traverse each and every node we are first initializing the current with the value of front and then we are providing a while loop and inside this while loop we are traversing the current till it becomes null so in the first step we are simply printing the elements on the console so current dot data and then we are simply incrementing current to its next position by assigning current dot next to current and after the current encounters a null value then we are simply printing null so friends let's test the working of inq method in the main method so here first i will create an instance of q and when we create an instance of q we know that q is empty therefore front and rear both points to null so friends let's insert few elements into the queue so we'll call in queue method and we'll pass the value as 10 and let's say I print the queue on the console so if I run the code now so you can see it printed 10 and null so as the queue was empty when we inserted node having data as 10 so this was the only node so therefore it printed 10 and null now let's insert one more node and if I give the data as 15 and if I run the code now so you see it printed 10 then 15 and then null 
so here you see q has two nodes where the first node is pointing 10 and second node is pointing 15 and here you can see we are inserting the node at the one end which is the rear end so therefore first 10 was inserted and then 15 got inserted so if I insert one more node say 20 and if I run the code now so you can see that using the rear end we are inserting the element at the end so friends currently q has three elements with the data is 10 15 and 20 and in this tutorial we discuss how to insert an element into a queue so friends in my next tutorial i will discuss how we can remove an element from the queue and we'll discuss the dq operation i hope you like this video please like comment share and subscribe my youtube channel thanks have a nice day Hello friends, welcome to my new data structures and algorithm in Java tutorial series video. Friends, in this tutorial we will continue with the implementation of the queue. In our previous tutorial we discussed how to add an element in a queue in Java. So in this tutorial we will discuss how we can remove an element from a queue in Java. So friends, in my previous tutorial I added three elements into the queue by data is 10, 15, and 20 so in this tutorial we will discuss how we can remove an element from a queue which is nothing but a dq operation so here i will take the same example and you can see that queue has three elements where front is pointing to the first node and rear is pointing to the last node and length is 3 so here you can see this is the algorithm for a dq operation now let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step Now in the first step we will check that whether Q is empty or not. So currently if you see length is 3 and we know that the Q contains 3 nodes therefore Q is not empty. So the condition in if block comes out to be false. Now friends as we want to remove an element from a Q. So here you can see the return type of DQ method is integer type. We are actually removing an element from the Q and we are sending back the data part of it. So in order to store the data somewhere we are creating an integer variable by name result and we are storing front dot data into it. So friends in my previous tutorial we discussed that queue is a list with few restrictions where the elements are inserted at one end which is the rear end and elements are removed at one end which is the front end. So friends the restriction which we impose on a list makes it a queue and therefore the queue is called as FIFO list which is first in first out so here you can see by first in first out we mean the element inserted first would be the first one to be removed so in my previous tutorial we discussed when we inserted the elements into the queue we inserted first 10 then we inserted 15 and then we inserted 20 using the rear end now in order to remove an element we know that 10 was inserted first so now 10 would be removed first so this is nothing but a FIFO property first in first out so let's see how we can use the front end to remove the nodes which are inserted first so here after this line gets executed results hold the value of 10 because the node 10 was the node first inserted into the queue therefore this node will be removed first moving ahead now friends in order to remove this node from the queue we know that it is being referred by this front node and if you break the link from front to this node then this node can be removed easily. So in order to do that what we are doing we are simply assigning the value of front dot next to front. So here we are simply assigning front next value to front so that once this node is removed 15 becomes our new front. So therefore we are simply assigning the value of front dot next to front. So it would look something like this. Moving ahead. Then we are checking whether the front is equal to null or not. So currently you can see front is pointing to the second node therefore it's not null. So the condition in if block comes out to be false. Moving ahead. So friends as we have removed the reference of front from this node therefore 
this node will be garbage collected and you can see once this node is removed we will decrement the length by 1 so currently the length is 3 and after the removal of this node length becomes 2 so we simply decrement the length by 1 moving ahead and in the final step we will simply return the value stored in the result So friends, when the DQ method is executed, the Q has two elements and length is two. Now friends, let's suppose we call DQ method once again. So here first we check whether the Q is empty or not. So currently Q has two nodes, therefore it's not empty. And then we'll simply store front dot data into the result. So it would look something like this that we are storing the data into the list node which is being pointed by the front so now result contains the value as 15 moving ahead now in order to remove this node from a queue we have to break this link because if front is referring to this node then this node would not be removed so in order to break this link we are simply assigning front dot next value to front so it would look something like this moving ahead then we are checking whether front is equal to null or not so front is pointing to this third node therefore it's not equal so the condition in if block comes out to be false and here as we have removed the link of front to this node so now this node has no reference to it therefore it will be removed easily we know that now q has only one element therefore we will decrement the length by one moving ahead and in the final step, we'll simply return the value stored in the result, which is 15. So friends, when the DQ method is executed, Q has only one element where front and rear both point to that particular element because this is the only element left. Now if we suppose call DQ again, so first we'll check whether Q is empty or not so currently Q has length 1 that means it has one node therefore it's not empty so the condition in if block comes out to be false then we'll simply store the value of front dot data into result because we want to return this value so now result will hold the value as 20 moving ahead now friends we need to take an special care when we remove the last element from a queue because if the queue contains only one element and if we want to remove that particular element then we need to break two links one is of front and other is of rear because if any of the link is referring to this node then this node would not be removed so therefore here we are simply assigning the value of front dot next to front so it would look something like this so now front is assigned with its next value which is null moving ahead now we'll check whether front is pointing to null or not so currently if you see front is pointing to null therefore the condition in if block comes out to be true and as we discussed that we need to break both the links in order to free this node so therefore we'll simply assign the value of null to rear so now this link will be removed so it would look something like this so now front and rear both are pointing to null so friends as this node is having no reference therefore this node will be freed easily so once this node is removed we'll decrement the length by one because we know there are no elements left so we'll simply decrement the value of length by one so now length becomes zero because we have removed all the nodes so in the final step we'll simply return the value 20 so friends once this method gets executed this node gets freed up and as we know that now front and rear both pointing to null therefore the list is empty and length is zero so friends if we again call dq method then the first step will check whether q is empty or not so here you can see front is pointing to null rear is pointing to null 
and we also know that length is zero therefore q is empty so there are no elements left to be removed so the condition in if block comes out to be true and we'll simply throw in no such element exception because there are no elements left to be removed So friends, in this slide we discussed the demonstration of the DQ method. Now let's go to Eclipse and see the working code. So friends, in my previous tutorial, I created one class by name Q. We created few instance variable of type list node, one of which was front, another was rear. We also created an integer variable, which actually store the length of the Q. And then we have created few methods. One was length is empty and in queue. So basically, we created in queue method which could insert the elements into the queue. And here, if you see, and we also saw that we have added three elements. And when we printed the queue, it printed something like 10, 15, 20. So, so I will take the same list and will perform DQ operation on it. So first let's write the dq method. So public, we know that the return type of it would be integer. So int dq. Now the first step we do is we check whether the queue is empty or not. So is empty. Now if the queue is empty, we know that there are no more elements left to be removed. Therefore, we throw an exception as no such element exception. And we pass a string as q is already empty. Moving ahead. Now we know that when we remove an element from a queue, we are returning the data part of it. So therefore we'll create an integer variable by name result and we'll store front data to it. Moving ahead. Now as we have got the data of the front node, we'll simply traverse front to its next value by assigning front next to front. And then we simply check whether front is equal to null or not so if front is equal to null we know that we have to make rear also null which we saw in the slide moving ahead now as we have removed the node from a queue we have to decrement the length by one and finally we are returning the result so friend this is the code for dq method whose demonstration we saw in the slide. Now let's test the working of this method. So initially we have inserted three nodes. Now let's say I dq1 node and then I print the q again. So if I run the code so you can see when we inserted three nodes, first 10 was inserted, then 15 got inserted, then 20 got inserted. So the insertion was at the rear end. Now when we are doing a DQ, 10 was removed because we are removing a node from the other end which is the front end. So thus Q is a FIFO list where we insert the node at one end which is the rear end and where we remove the node from the other end which is the front end. So now as you can see, 10 was the first element to be inserted therefore it got removed first now if I call dq again so here you can see 15 also got removed and if I call dq once again so here you can see nothing got printed because we have removed all the elements from the queue and when we printed the list, we can see when the list is empty, we are simply returning from the print method. So therefore nothing got printed. And now as list is empty, if I call dq one more time 
and if i run the code we get an exception saying no such element exception as q is already empty so friend this was the working of dq method so friends apart from this in q and dq method q also has two more methods by name first and last so when we call the first method we get the value stored at the node which is being referred by front and when we call the last method we get the value stored in the list node which is being referred by the rear so here we simply create public int first so here first we simply check that whether q is empty because if q is empty then we know that front and rear both points to null therefore we check whether q is empty or not and after this check we simply return value stored in the front so we simply return front dot data and we also write one more method say last which is very similar we'll first check whether the queue is empty or not and if the queue is not empty then we'll simply return rear dot data so friends let's test the working of first and last method so here i will just remove this thing so we have inserted three nodes by value as 10 15 and 20 so if i run the code so you can see front is pointing to a node having data as 10 and rear is pointing to a node having data as 20 as so if i simply print q dot first and q dot last and if i run the code so you see it printed 10 and 20 because 10 is being referred by front and 20 is being referred by rear so friends in this tutorial we discussed about the dequeue operation we discussed about the few of the methods like first and last so this was basically all about the implementation of queue i hope you like this video please like comment share and subscribe my youtube channel thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in this video we are going to see a problem that how we can generate binary numbers from 1 to n so here you can see that the question is generate binary numbers from 1 to n using a queue so binary numbers can be generated by various ways but here we will take a queue data structure and we will generate the binary numbers from 1 to n where n will be the value provided to us so let's say value of n is 3 so the output would be a resultant array of string type and the binary numbers from 1 to n will be 1 1011 1, 1. so binary number 1 corresponds to 1 1 0 corresponds to 2 1 1 corresponds to 3 and similarly if n is 5 then we need to return like 1 2 3 4 and 5 so from 1 to n so these are the values in decimal number system and its corresponding binary numbers are 1 1011100101 so here first we will see the conceptual overview that how we can generate the binary numbers from 1 to n so let's say we are provided with the value of n as 5 So the binary numbers we need to return is one, one zero, one one, one zero zero, one zero one. So this value corresponds to one. This to two. This is three. This is four, and this is five. So you can watch the videos and understand how this conversion happens from a binary number to a decimal number. So here let's take one example. let's say we are given with this binary number 1 01 so this is at zeroth spot this is at 1 and this is at 2 so what we do is this is binary number which is having 0 and 1 which is 
numbers. So we simply take this digits value, multiply it by two, and do their sum, and we will get the decimal number. So to convert this number into a decimal number, what we do is we take this digit value, which is one, with multiplied with two to the power this value. We do sum. We take zero. Multiply it with two to the power one. We take one. Multiply it with two to the power two. So this gives us four. This gives us zero. And two to the power zero is one. So one into one gives one. So this gives value as five. So you can Google the stuff. or watch the videos where there are programs where we can convert from one number system to another number system so currently our problem is that we are given with a value of n and we need to generate the numbers from 1 to 5 so we need to generate something like this 1 1011 1001 so how we can do is So here you can see that at the start we directly have one number one, and its binary representation is also one. So the first number is we already know it's it would be one. Now here as we need to return the generated binary number in the form of string, what we do is if I append zero to it, and if I append one to it, I will get one zero here. And one one here. So if you see closely, if we are appending zero, we will get our next number. If we are appending one, we will get our third number. So the first number we know that it will be one. If we append zero, we will get the second number. If we append one, we will get the third number. Now what about this fourth and fifth? So here we do the same steps. If we append zero, and if we append one. So, to one zero it becomes one zero zero, and if we append one, we'll get one zero one. Now let's say if we would have have n equal to seven, so the next numbers would have been one one zero for six, one 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 for seven. So how this numbers would have come? We would have taken one one, appended zero, appended one. So this would have given one one zero. One one one. So this is how the binary numbers are generated. But the main problem is, for the first digit we know that this is one. We can append zero and one, and we get one zero one one. But how about other numbers? How we will get this one zero and one one in sequence, so that we can append zero and one to one zero and get the next elements, and then append one one. With zero and one to get the rest of the elements that also in sequence, and this chain can go on like this. So we need to maintain a certain order, like this should come first, then one zero should come, then one one should come, and then when we are doing one zero, we should append like this, then we pick one one, we append like this. and here also we'll go in this direction only we take 100 we'll append 0 and 1 we take 101 we'll append 0 and 1 to get the next binary numbers so this similar kind of structure or the sequence can be maintained via a queue so here in a queue which is first in first out so the element which is inserted first will be first one to be removed so here we are directly putting one and then we remove one so when we remove one we have that element we can append zero and one we will get one zero and one one so first we will put one zero then we will put one one so in the next iteration we will take one zero out we will append zero and one and into the queue we'll put 
वन जीरो जीरो फर्स्ट लाइक दिस एंड देन वन जीरो वन एंड देन इन द नेक्स्ट इटरेशन विल पुल आउट वन वन सो वाइल पुलिंग आउट वन वन वी आर एक्चुअली गेटिंग द जनरेटेड नंबर बट फॉर द रेस्ट ऑफ द नंबर वी विल अपेंड जीरो विल गेट वन वन जीरो विल पुट इट इन टू द क्यू विल अपेंड वन टू वन वन एंड वी विल पुट वन 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 इन टू द क्यू सो दिस चेन गोज ऑन एंड द नंबर आर जनरेटेड सो लेट सी द डेमोन्स्ट्रेशन ऑफ दिस अलगोरिथम स्टेप बाय स्टेप सो हियर इज द अलगोरिथम लेट से वी कॉल जनरेट बाइनरी नंबर विच इज दिस मेथड वी पास इन द वैल्यू ऑफ एन एस फोर सो वी नीड टू जनरेट फोर नंबर फ्रॉम वन टू फोर सो द फर्स्ट नंबर विल बी वन देन इट विल बी वन जीरो देन वन वन एंड देन वन जीरो जीरो सो लेट सी द डेमोन्स्ट्रेशन ऑफ दिस अलगोरिथम दैट हाउ वी कैन जनरेट दिस फोर नंबर सो एन इज फोर फर्स्ट वी विल क्रिएट अ रिजल्ट एरे बिकॉज दिस इज द रिजल्ट एरे विच वी नीड टू रिटर्न फ्रॉम दिस मेथड एंड दिस इज ऑफ स्ट्रिंग टाइप सो द लेंथ ऑफ दिस एरे वुड बी एन सो रिजल्ट एरे विल हैव फोर एलिमेंट्स बिकॉज वी नीड टू रिटर्न दिस फोर जनरेटेड बाइनरी नंबर वी नो दैट वी नीड टू यूज क्यू सो वी विल इनिशियलाइज क्यू सो क्यू इज एन इंटरफेस एंड इट्स कॉन्क्रीट टाइप इज ए लिंक लिस्ट सो इट लुक समथिंग लाइक दिस सो फॉर द फर्स्ट नंबर वी कैन डायरेक्टली ऑफर वन इन टू द क्यू बिकॉज वी नीड टू जनरेट द बाइनरी नंबर फ्रॉम वन टू एन सो वी डायरेक्टली पुट अ स्ट्रिंग वन इन टू द क्यू बिकॉज दिस क्यू इज ऑफ स्ट्रिंग टाइप सो वन कम्स इन टू द क्यू लाइक दिस एंड नाउ इन ऑर्डर टू फिल द रिजल्ट एरे वी आर प्रोवाइडिंग अ फॉर लू विच विल गो फ्रॉम जीरो इंडेक्स टू अ इंडेक्स एन माइनस वन विच इज वैल्यू ऑफ एन इज फोर फोर माइनस वन विच इज थ्री विच इज द लास्ट इंडेक्स विच इज थर्ड इंडेक्स सो आई विल स्टार्ट फ्रॉम द जीरो इंडेक्स एंड एज वी डिस्कस वी ऑलरेडी नो द फर्स्ट एलिमेंट सो वी सिंपली पोल द एलिमेंट फ्रॉम द क्यू एंड प्रोवाइडेड इन टू द रिजल्ट एरे लाइक दिस एट इंडेक्स आई सो वेन वी विल पोल द क्यू इट ओनली हैज वन एलिमेंट सो वन वॉज एंटर्ड फर्स्ट सो दिस विल बी द ओनली एलिमेंट टू गेट एग्जिट फर्स्ट बिकॉज क्यू इज फी फॉर डेटा स्ट्रक्चर फर्स्ट इन फर्स्ट आउट द एलिमेंट विच एंटर्स फर्स्ट विल बी फर्स्ट टू बी रिमूव सो वन विल बी पोल्ड आउट एंड सिंपली प्रोवाइडेड टू द रिजल्ट एरे एट जीरो इंडेक्स बिकॉज आई इज पॉइंटिंग टू जीरो सो दिस गेट्स पोल्ड आउट एंड वन कम्स हियर सो दिस इज नथिंग बट अ स्ट्रिंग लाइक दिस बिकॉज वी हैव क्रिएटेड एन एरे रिजल्ट ऑफ स्ट्रिंग टाइप सो फॉर टाइमिंग आई एम जस्ट डेमोन्स्ट्रेटिंग इट लाइक दिस विदाउट डबल कोर्ट्स and we know that once we get our first element like this we can append 0 and we can append 1 to get the next two elements which is our n1 and n2 so string n1 can be generated by appending 0 so n1 becomes 10 1 appending 0 will give 10 and 1 appending 1 will give 11 so n1 becomes 10 and n2 becomes 11 1 appending with 1 will give 11 so n2 becomes 11 and we know that after generating n1 and n2 we will put them into the queue in the respective sequence n1 will go first and then n2 will go so first we will offer n1 so 10 will go Into the queue, and then we offer n two, which is one one. So now our queue has two elements, one zero and one one. So after placing the first element at its correct position in the result array, we will increment i. I becomes one, which points to index one. Now in order to fill the result array. at particular index which is 
we know that we need to pull the element out because we know that the next element is 1 0 which we need to put it into the result array so whatever elements we are putting into the queue they are in proper sequence so the next element will be 1 0 so this number will be generated 1 0 we will pull that out and put it into the result array at index 1 1 0 comes out we get string 1 0 here and so here you can see that after we are getting this string out we know what that string is so now for the next elements we can append 0 and 1 so we get 1 0 0 and 1 0 1 and we can put this two element directly into the queue so first we will generate n1 and n2 so result of i will give 1 0 we will append 0 so n1 will become 1 0 0 and n2 will become 1 0 plus 1 will give 1 0 1 like this and then we will simply offer n1 and n2 into the queue because we need to put them in proper sequence so that this binary number generation is done in proper order so 1 0 0 which is n1 it will go into the queue and then we will offer n2 which is 1 0 1 so this will go into the queue now this element is generated properly so we will increment i now i will point to 2 which is the second index to fill this value we will first pull the element from the queue which is 1 1 and assign it to the result array at index 2 so 1 1 will come out and 1 1 will come here so here in order to create space we will simply shift this ahead so these are still in queue but we have just shifted it ahead so that space is created here for the other elements to go in so we have identified one element 1 1 here so we got 1 1 we know that to generate the further elements we will append 0 and append 1 so it will give 1 1 0 and this will give 1 1 1 we will generate both of these numbers n1 and n2 so n1 becomes 1 1 plus 0 which will give 1 1 0 and n2 will become 1 1 plus 1 1 1 1 and then we will offer both the elements into the queue so first 1 1 0 will go and then 1 1 1 will go we have filled this position so we will increment i so i will now point to the third index and how we can fill this we will simply pull the element from the queue which is the first element which got entered first so 1 0 0 got entered first before this rest of the three elements so 1 0 0 will be pulled out and it will be assigned to the result array here at the third index like this so friends here the algorithm is actually ended because we have generated the integers from 1 to n so this is 1 this is 2 this is 3 and this is 4 1 to 4 because value of n is 4 but in order to demonstrate how these further numbers are generated we will simply see the rest of the algorithm so whatever the number we just pulled out which is 1 0 0 it will help us in generating the further elements so 1 0 0 which is this part I am showing it here we will append 0 we will append 1 so n1 becomes 1 0 0 plus 0 so 1 0 0 0 like this and n2 becomes 1 0 0 plus 1 which will give us 1 0 0 1 and here we have got 1 0 0 0 like this and similarly we will offer both the elements into the queue 
सो वन जीरो 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 विल बी अवर एन वन एंड देन वी विल ऑफर एन टू विच इज वन जीरो 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 वन लाइक दिस सो दिस बाइनरी नंबर एडिशन विल गो ऑन लाइक दिस बट हियर नाउ वेन यू विल इंक्रीमेंट आई आई विल बिकम फोर एंड फोर इज नॉट लेस देन फोर सो दिस फॉर लुक विल टर्मिनेट then though we have elements in the queue but we have figured out all the elements from 1 to n so we will simply return the result so this result will be a string array having 1 1 0 1 1 1 0 the four elements from 1 to n which is 4 so friend this was all about the algorithm that how we can generate binary numbers from 1 to n using a queue so your queue plays a very significant role because this data structure is first in first out the element which got inserted first will be the first to be removed so this property makes us easy to generate these binary numbers by just appending 0 and 1 so friends i hope you must have liked this video in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update thanks have a nice day hello friends Welcome to my new data structures and algorithm in Java tutorial series video. Friends, in this tutorial we will discuss how to represent a binary tree in Java. So friends, first we will discuss what is a tree data structure. So here you can see that we are given a tree. A tree is a non-linear data structure which is used for storing the data and it is made up of nodes and edges without having any cycle. So here you can see that we represent a tree through nodes and edges so here you can see the nodes are connected to other nodes through edges so friends tree is basically a non linear data structure without having any cycle so you can see that nodes are connected to each other but they never form a cycle so here if suppose 6 is pointing to 9 so therefore you can see that it will form a cycle so therefore this representation is not a tree because in a tree you will find nodes having edges to other nodes but you will never find a cycle and you can always think of a tree in the form of a hierarchical structure and also you can see that each node in a tree can point to n number of nodes in a tree so here you can see the node having data as 1 is pointing to the three nodes by data as 2 9 and 3 so there can be n number of nodes in a tree which can be referred by any node so usually a tree is we are representing the hierarchical structure where the parent node is called as root so whenever we represent a tree usually the first node which is the parent of all other nodes is generally referred as root and you can see that it has many levels of additional nodes so so friends in the tree you can see that one is the parent of all the nodes below it and it's generally referred by the root because this is the root of the tree and whatever the edges are coming out from this root it's pointing to the other nodes and here you can see that this structure can go to many levels and also a node who is not pointing to any other node is generally called as leaf so here you can see that node 1 is a parent of 2 9 and 3 node 2 is parent of 4 and 5 and node 4 has no child therefore this is called as leaf node similarly 5 is a leaf node 6 is a leaf node Seven is a leaf node. Nine is a leaf node because they don't have any children. Moving ahead. So friends, what is a binary tree? So friends, a binary tree is a special kind of a tree where each node has zero, one, or two children, and not more than that. Can have zero children, one children, or at max two children. So here in the below diagram, you can see as root is the parent of all the nodes. it's having two children with data 2 and 3 the node 2 which is parent to 4 and 5 has two children 4 and 5 and at the last you can see node 4 which is a leaf node has zero children so friends similarly a node can have one children and the other children can point to null so friends a binary tree is basically represented by a tree node so here you can see a tree node consists of three things one is the data part which actually holds the data as you can see the data is like 1 2 3 6 7 4 5 
and it has a pointer to the left node and a pointer to the right node so these pointers are basically of type tree node itself so here you can see the node having data as one is a basically a tree node and whose left is pointing to the node 2 and whose right is pointing to the node 3 so therefore a binary tree having a tree node consists of only three things one is the data part one is the pointer to the left tree node and one is the pointer to the right tree node so basically the way we represent a binary tree in the graphical form is something like this that it contains the data which you can see here and two edges coming out of it so here you can see this is the left edge and this is the right edge and we represent this edge through the left and right pointers moving ahead so as we discussed in our previous slide that a binary tree is basically represented internally through a tree node so friends the structure of tree node is something like it contains data it contains pointer to the right tree node and a pointer to the left tree node in an actual tree and below you can see the java code for representing a tree node so it contains the data and here i have taken this data in the form of integer and which can be any generic type and it contains a tree node left which actually points to the node which is just left to this particular node and one tree node right which actually points to a tree node which is just right to it and basically it has one constructor which takes in a data part so whenever we initialize a tree node we usually pass the data which we want to store into it so usually when a node tree node is created so data which we pass into the constructor is stored in the data variable and left and right at the time of initialization usually points to null and later on we make them refer to the other tree nodes moving ahead so let's quickly see a demo how we can create a binary tree so when we initialize a binary tree the root is actually pointing to null and this root is also a type of tree node now let's say we have created one tree node having data as one and whose left and right is both pointing to null and which is referred by this temporary variable so let's say we want to insert this temp into the binary tree so what we do we simply assign the value of temp to the root so it looks something like this so when we insert one tree node usually root points to that particular node because this is the only node into the tree now let's say we create one more node having data as 2 and whose left and right both pointing to null which is referred by this temporary node and if we want to insert this node into the tree we know that root is already pointing to the node having data as 1 so one thing we can do here is we can either point root left to this particular node or root right to this particular node so either way we can do so let's say we assign temporary node value to root left so it would look something like this so now here you can see this is a binary tree having two nodes where root is pointing to the node having data as 1 and whose left is pointing to a node who having data as 2 and here you can also see that root right is pointing to null and left and right of root 2 is pointing to null now let's say we want to insert one more node having data as 3 now here we can insert this node into a binary tree at three places one is at the roots right and other two places are nodes 2 left and right so basically we can place this node 3 into this three places which is pointing to null so let's say we insert it at roots right so it would look something like this so now here you can see root is having data as 1 and whose left and right both are pointing to a node having data as 2 and 3 and suppose we want to insert one more node then we can insert it into at the four places now so those four places would be 2's left, 2's right then 3's left and 3's right because those four positions are pointing to null so friends in this tutorial we discussed how to represent a binary tree in java and we also discussed the structure of tree node so friends in my next tutorial i will be discussing how to implement a binary tree in java i hope you like this video please like comment share and subscribe my youtube channel thanks have a nice day hello friends welcome to my new data structures and algorithm in java tutorial series video friends in this tutorial we will discuss how to implement a binary tree in java 
सो फ्रेंड्स इन माई प्रीवियस टूटोरियल वी डिस्कस्ड हाउ वी कैन रिप्रेजेंट अ बाइनरी ट्री इन जावा एंड वी ऑल्सो डिस्कस द स्ट्रक्चर ऑफ ट्री नोड इन अ बाइनरी ट्री सो फ्रेंड्स इन माई प्रीवियस टूटोरियल वी डिस्कस डेट बाइनरी ट्री कंसिस्ट ऑफ ए रूट नोट विच इज ऑफ टाइप ट्री नोड एंड यूजली दिस रूट नोट कीप द होल्ड ऑफ ऑल द नोट्स इन अ बाइनरी ट्री वी ऑल्सो डिस्कस दैट अ ट्री नोड कंसिस्ट ऑफ अ डेटा पार्ट एंड इट कंटेन्स टू पॉइंटर्स वन इज लेफ्ट पॉइंटर एंड वन इज राइट पॉइंटर सो दिस लेफ्ट पॉइंटर इज पॉइंटिंग टू द लेफ्ट ट्री नोड एंड द राइट पॉइंटर इज पॉइंटिंग टू द राइट ट्री नोड सो फ्रेंड दिस इज हाउ वी स्टोर द डेटा इन टू ट्री नोड एंड वी यूजली यूज लेफ्ट पॉइंटर एंड द राइट पॉइंटर टू होल्ड द लेफ्ट ट्री नोड एंड द राइट ट्री नोड एंड बिलो यू कैन सी द जावा कोड टू रिप्रेजेंट अ ट्री नोड सो हियर यू कैन सी इट हैज थ्री थिंग्स वन इज द डेटा पार्ट वन इज द पॉइंटर टू द लेफ्ट ट्री नोड एंड वन इज द पॉइंटर टू द राइट ट्री नोड एंड हियर यू कैन सी वी कैन स्टोर any generic type of data into a tree node and below is the constructor of tree node where we actually pass the data so this data part whenever we initialize a tree node gets stored into the data variable so friends let's go to eclipse and see the implementation of a binary tree in java so friends here i have created one class by name binary tree which is having a main method so let's implement a binary tree into this class so friends in our previous slide we discussed that a binary tree consists of a root node which is of type tree node so first we'll create a instance variable of type tree node and we'll give name to it as root because this root node will hold all the other nodes of a binary tree and in order to represent this tree node we'll create an inner class by name tree node so private class tree node so as we discussed in our previous tutorial that as it is a binary tree therefore it will have two pointers one is pointing to the left tree node and another is pointing to the right tree node so therefore we'll create two pointers of type tree node as left and right and this tree node along with holding the left tree node and the right tree node it will also hold the data so we are creating an integer type and which will actually store the data so this can be any generic type not supposingly of integer type we can store any data into this tree node so in this tutorial i am taking the integer data moving ahead now below we will also provide one constructor and this constructor will take in the data part which we want to store so when we initialize a tree node we usually store the data into the data variable moving ahead we will create one method as public void and we'll create a binary tree into it create binary tree so in order to create a binary tree first we'll create few nodes so let's say we are giving the nodes name as first and let's say i give the value to data as 1 and i will just create few nodes let's say i give the name as second third fourth fifth and let's say i provide data as 2 3 4 and 5 now when we call this create binary tree it will first create this five tree nodes now in order to store this five nodes into the binary tree first thing we do is we assign the value of first to root so now root will be holding the tree node having data as one and let's say to first left we are assigning the value of second and to first right we are assigning the value of third so friends here root will point to the node having data as 
and its left will point to a node having data as 2 and one's right will point to the node having data as 3. So here we have simply assigned the value of first to root and then we are assigning the value of second to first left and value of third node to first right. So after these three statements here you can see root will point to first and then after these two statements it would look something like this second So here first left will point to the second and first right is pointing to third. Moving ahead. Now let's say we assign the value of fourth to second left. So we assign value fourth to second left and we assign value fifth to second right. So friend this is how we create a binary tree with the few nodes and after this 4 or 5 statements the binary tree looks like this. So friends the binary tree which we created after those 4 or 5 lines of execution the binary tree will look something like this that we initially created 5 nodes with the data as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and then we have assigned the value of first to root so therefore now root is pointing to the node having data as 1 and then we assign the value of second to first left so now first left is pointing to the node having data as 2 and we assign third node to the first right therefore first right is pointing to the node having data as 3 we also assign the value of fourth and fifth node to two's left and two's right so therefore it looks something like this so this is how we actually implement a binary tree where we insert the node using the left and the right pointers of a tree node. So friends in this tutorial we discussed how to implement a binary tree in Java and in my next tutorial we will discuss how we can traverse each and every node of a binary tree in Java. I hope you like this video. Please like, comment, share and subscribe my YouTube channel. Thanks have a nice day. Hello friends. Welcome to my new data structures and algorithm in Java tutorial series video. Friends, in this tutorial we will discuss recursive pre-order traversal of a binary tree in Java. So friends, what is a pre-order binary tree traversal? So friends, in order to traverse each and every node of a binary tree, we apply these three steps on the each node of a binary tree. So what we do is, we visit that particular node and then we traverse its left subtree and then we traverse its right subtree. So here if you take an example of this tree then we start with the root node and we apply these three steps on the root node. So what we do we first traverse this node and then we traverse its complete left subtree and then we traverse its complete right subtree. So once we process this node we first go to its left subtree and there we encounter a node having data as 2. So on this node we again apply these three steps that we visit this node and then we visit its left subtree and then we visit its right subtree. So after we process the node having data as 2 we then go to its left subtree and then we encounter a node having data as 4. So we apply these three steps on the node 4. We first visit this node and then we traverse to its left subtree and then to its right subtree. So here you can see node 4 has no left subtree and no right subtree therefore therefore we are done with the processing of this node and then we return back to the node having data as 2. So we have processed this node 2 we have processed the node 4 so now in the third step we visit the right subtree so we go to the node 5 and then we apply these three steps on the node 5. We first visit this node, then we visit his left subtree, and then we visit his right subtree. So as node 5 is having no left subtree and right subtree, therefore we are done with the processing of the node 5. And once we are done with the node 5, then we are sure that we have processed the right subtree of the node 2. 
so therefore we have processed two then four and then we have processed five so we are done with the left sub tree and then we again go back to the root node one and as we have visited the left sub tree of that we now will visit the right sub tree for the node one so then we go to the right sub tree of the node one and when we reach to the node three we apply these three steps now for the node three so first we visit this node and then we visit its left sub tree and then we visit its right sub tree so after processing the node three we go to six and we apply these three steps we visit this node we then go to its left sub tree and then go to its right sub tree now as node six is having no left sub tree and no right sub tree then we are done with the processing of this node and then we return back to the node three so once we return back to the node three we have processed its left sub tree and now the step remains to process its right sub tree so when we reach to the node seven we first process this node and then we traverse the left sub tree of it and the right sub tree of it so as node seven has no left sub tree and no right sub tree therefore we are done with the processing of the node seven and then we reach to the node three and since we already process this node then we reach to the node one so friends in pre order traversal we first process the node and then we process it left sub tree and then we process it right sub tree and this we do recursively for each and every node so let's see the demonstration of pre order binary tree traversal so friends suppose we want to traverse a tree whose root is 9 and whose left is a node having data as 2 and its left is having data as 4 and the right of node having data as 2 is null and the root 9 also has a right subtree having the data as 3 and whose left and right subtrees are both pointing to null so let's see the demonstration of this algorithm that how we can process the nodes of a binary tree in pre order traversal so here you can see that below is the algorithm for it and as we are applying this pre order traversal to each and every node recursively so here we know that the method name is pre order and inside this method we are again calling this method to process the left and the right sub tree so friends when we are doing a pre order traversal we are calling this method recursively and in order to un understand this method recursively here we are maintaining a call stack which has method call line number and the root so in the method call we will just keep the track of the method that which method is being called and we'll also keep the information of the root that which current node is being processed and we'll come to know about line number when we are demonstrating the algorithm so let's call the pre order method and we'll pass the root as 9 so when the execution point comes to pre order we know that the call stack will now execute this pre order method and we are keeping the track of the root so currently the root is being pointed by the data is 9 so then we check that whether root is equal to null or not so friends why we are providing this condition is because this is considered as our base case and as we are calling this pre order method recursively we need a point to exit this recursion is that when root is equal to null then we simply return from that method so currently you can see root is pointing to 9 here so therefore it's not equal to null so the condition in if block comes out to be false and then as we discussed in our previous slide that first we visit the node and then we visit its left sub tree and then we visit its right sub tree so we'll first visit the node and we'll print the data associated with that node so the output is 9 so we have processed this node moving ahead So now we are calling the pre-order method to traverse the left sub tree for this root. So the value we are passing to this pre-order is root left. So currently you see root left is pointing to the node having data as two. And as we are maintaining this call stack, so when we call this pre-order method, we'll keep the track of this line numbers, so that once we return it back, we know that from which line we need to execute the method. so currently from line 6 we are calling this pre order therefore we will keep the track of this line number so here we have stored the number is 
and now we will again call preorder method and will pass the root dot left to it which is nothing but the node 2 so now root will be the node 2 and here preorder is again called with a root as node 2 so now we are again executing preorder with a root as 2 so we'll check whether root is equal to null or not so currently root is not equal to null so as we discussed in our previous slide that once we reach to the left subtree we process this node and then we go to its left subtree and then to its right subtree so now we are processing the node 2 so the output would be 2 because we are just printing the data part of it moving ahead and now we'll again call preorder method recursively and then we'll pass root left to it so currently root is pointing to the node having data as 2 and its left is pointing to the node having data as 4 so as we are calling this preorder again we'll keep the track of the line number so we are placing the line number as 6 because we know that we are leaving this preorder at line 6 and we are again calling this preorder so the point of execution again reaches to preorder and this time the root is roots left so which is 4 so one new root becomes the node having data is 4 and as we are again executing this preorder we know that in the call stack this method will be called again and this time the root is being 4 so we'll again execute this preorder recursively we'll first check whether root is equal to null or not so currently root is pointing to 4 therefore it's not null and here we'll simply process this node so the output would be 4 and after we process this node we know that now we have to traverse its left subtree and then its right subtree so first we are processing its left subtree so we are simply calling preorder again and we are passing roots left so currently here you can see root left is pointing to null so therefore we will now call this preorder by passing a value null and as we are leaving this preorder now here we will keep the track of the line number so we are calling this preorder again and now the root would be null because we are traversing root left so currently root is pointing to 4 and its left is pointing to null so therefore our new root becomes null and there will be one more method on the stack with the name preorder and the root would be null so we'll again execute the preorder method so we'll check whether root is equal to null so currently if you see root is equal to null so we have reached our base case so this base case will help us in exiting the recursion and as we know that we are left with no more nodes in the left subtree to traverse therefore we'll simply return from this method so when we return this method gets executed so it gets removed from the call stack and now as this method is removed from the call stack call goes to the preorder method which was executed just before it so we'll now start executing this preorder and as we know that we have left this preorder at the line number 6 so we'll now start from the line number 6 and we also know that when we left this preorder method at that moment the root was 4 so once the call reaches to this preorder root will be pointing to 4 so friends here we have first traversed the node 4 then we process it left subtree and now we'll go to its right subtree so that thing we'll do recursively so in the line 7 now we'll simply go to its right subtree so as root is 4 and as right is pointing to null therefore we'll call preorder with a null value and as we are calling this preorder method with a value as null we are leaving this preorder method so we'll update the line number that from line number 7 we have again called this preorder method so now this preorder will be called with a value of null so it's nothing but roots right so one new root becomes roots right so now root will be pointing to null and we also know there will be one more method on the stack with a root value of null moving ahead 
सो विल चेक वेदर रूट इज इक्वल टू नल और नॉट सो करंटली रूट इज इक्वल टू नल देर फोर विल सिंपली रिटर्न फ्रॉम दिस मैथड सो दिस मैथड गेट्स रिमूव फ्रॉम द कॉल स्टैक एंड द एग्जीक्यूशन पॉइंट गोज टू द मैथड विच कॉल्ड इट सो नाउ विल अगेन स्टार्ट एग्जीक्यूटिंग दिस प्री ऑर्डर मैथड फ्रॉम द लाइन नंबर सेवन एंड वी ऑल्सो नो दैट वी हैव लेफ्ट दिस प्री ऑर्डर वेन द रूट वॉज पॉइंटिंग टू नोट फोर सो वी सिंपली ट्रेवर्स टू द नोट फोर and this would become our root and then we'll start again executing from the line 7 so once we reach the line 8 we know that we are done with the processing of this pre order method and whose root is 4 so therefore this method will be removed from the stack and the execution point will go to a method which called this method so here the execution reaches the pre order for the root node 2 and we also know that we have left this pre order from the line number 6 so we'll start executing from the line number 6 and we also know that when we left this pre order at that moment root node was 2 so here the root will now point to the node 2 moving ahead and from the line 7 we'll now call the pre order and we'll pass the roots right because we are applying this pre order traversal to each and every node that we are first traversing the node then we are processing its left subtree and then we are processing its right subtree so as here you can see we have processed this node 2 and we have also processed its left subtree which is node 4 so now we are left with the processing of the right subtree so therefore we are again calling this pre order and we are passing the value of roots right so here roots right is null so therefore we again call this pre order method and will pass the null value to it and as we are leaving this pre order method and we are calling the new pre order method so we'll just keep the track of the line number so it signifies that we are leaving this pre order from the line number 7 so here now we are calling pre order with a value as null so therefore we know that there would be one more method on the call stack whose current root would be null so therefore now root will point to null and we'll start executing this pre order method so then we'll check whether root is equal to null or not so currently root is equal to null therefore we have reached our base case condition and we'll simply return from this method so when we return from this method this method will be removed from the call stack and the execution point will now reach to a method which called this method and as we have reached to this pre order method we know that we had left this method from the line number 7 so therefore the execution will start from the line number 7 and we also know that when we left this pre order method at that time root was pointing to the node 2 so therefore this root will now point to 2 and then we'll simply start executing this pre order method so once we reach the line number 8 so therefore this method will be removed from the stack and the execution point will reach to a method previous to it and we also know that we had left this method from the line number 6 therefore we'll start executing from the line number 6 and we also know that we had left this pre order method at that moment root was 9 so therefore now root will reach to 9 so friends for the root 9 we have processed the left subtree completely so now it's the time to process the right subtree so therefore we start the execution from the line number 6 and here we know that we will again call pre order method and this time we'll pass roots right which is the node 3 and as we are leaving this pre order method we'll keep the track of the line number so now pre order will be called with the root pointing to the node 3 and we also know that there will be now one more method on the stack so now pre order will start executing with a root having data as 3 so therefore now root will point to the node having data as 3 moving ahead we'll check whether root is equal to null or not so currently root is not equal to null 
so therefore we'll simply process this node and then we'll start processing its left subtree and the right subtree so we'll simply print the data for this root node which is 3 and then we'll process the left subtree of it so we are again calling this preorder method and this time we are passing roots left so it's nothing but we are passing roots left which is null and as we are leaving this preorder method we'll keep the track of the line number which is 6 so now the execution point reaches to preorder and this time the root is null so therefore root will point to null and we also know that there will be one more method on the call stack and the root will be null so we'll execute preorder with a root as null so we'll check whether root is equal to null or not so currently root is equal to null so we have reached our base case so we'll simply return from this method now as we return from this method the preorder method on the call stack with the root as null will be removed from the call stack and the execution point will reach to a method which had called this method so we'll again start executing preorder method and we know that we had left this preorder from the line number 6 therefore the execution point will start from the line number 6 and we also know that when we had left this preorder method at that time root was pointing to 3 so now root will point to 3 moving ahead from the line 7 we'll now again call roots right because we have traversed the left subtree for the root 3 now we'll process its right subtree so we'll again call preorder method and we'll pass roots right which is null so when we are leaving this preorder we'll keep the track of the line number so when we call this preorder method we had passed roots right which is null so therefore for this preorder now root will point to null and we also know that there will be one more method on the call stack with a root as null so then we'll check whether root is equal to null or not so currently root is equal to null therefore we have reached our base case so we'll simply return out from this method so when we return from this method this method will be removed from the call stack and and the execution point will reach to a method which called this method So now we will again start executing this preorder method and we know that we had left this method from the line number 7 so we'll start from the line number 7 and we also know that when we had left this preorder method root was pointing to 3 so therefore root will reach to 3 moving ahead now once we have executed all the statements from this preorder this preorder will be removed from the stack and the execution point will go to a method which called this method and the point which we have left this preorder was at line number 7 so therefore the execution point will start from the line number 7 and we also know that at that moment the root was 9 so therefore now the root will point to the 9 and finally we are done with this preorder therefore this method will be removed from the stack so friends in this slide we saw the demonstration of how preorder traversal works that it first visits the node and then it recursively calls preorder to process the left subtree and then to process the right subtree and this goes on for each and every node so here you can see the output as 9 2 4 3 so we have visited 9 then we visited 2 then we visited 4 and then we finally visited 3 so friends here we saw the demonstration of the algorithm now let's go to eclipse and see the working code so friends in my previous tutorial we discussed how to implement a binary tree in java so i had created one class binary tree and we have implemented the binary tree in java so here we had created an instance variable of type tree node which was actually root because this root will hold all the nodes of a binary tree and we had also discussed how we can create a binary tree by creating the few nodes 
Now here let's write a code for pre-order traversal of a binary tree. So public void will give the method name as pre-order. Now this method as we know will take in a root which we saw in the slide and as we are going to call this pre-order method recursively we'll first provide a base case so the base case would be if root is equal to null then simply return from this method and if root is not equal to null then simply visit the node So we'll print root dot data, and once the processing of node is done, we will again call preorder method, and we'll pass root left, and in the last line we'll again call preorder method, and we'll pass root dot right to it. So here, after processing of a node, we are recursively processing. the left subtree and the right subtree in a preorder fashion so friend this is the code for preordered binary tree traversal now let's test is working in main method so first we'll create a binary tree which we actually saw in the slide so here in my previous tutorial i had created few nodes so i'll just remove one of the node and i give the data which we saw in the slide as 9 2 3 and 4 so we also saw that root was pointing to 9 9 left was second and 9 right was holding a node having the data as 3 and we also know that node 2 left pointed to node 4 and we'll just simply remove this line so here we have created a binary tree which we discussed in the slide where root is pointing to 9 and whose left is pointing to 2 and whose right is pointing to 3 and then again Two's left is pointing to four. Now, after creating this binary tree, let's test the working of this pre-order method. So, in the main method, we'll first create the instance of binary tree. And then we'll simply call create binary tree. Now, once we call this create binary tree. the binary tree will be created and the root will hold the actual binary tree for us and then we'll simply call preorder and we'll pass the root of the binary tree so when i run this code so here you can see it printed 9243 which we actually discussed in the slide So friends in this tutorial we discussed the pre-order binary tree traversal I hope you like this video please like comment share and subscribe my youtube channel thanks have a nice day Hello friends welcome to my new data structures and algorithm in java tutorial series video Friends in this tutorial we will discuss iterative pre-order traversal of a binary tree in java So friends in my previous tutorial we discussed what is a pre-order binary tree traversal So in pre-order tree traversal we perform the three steps for each and every node of a binary tree that we first visit that particular node and then we visit its left subtree and then we visit its right subtree and this we do for each and every node So in my previous tutorial we discussed the recursive pre-order binary tree traversal and in this tutorial we will discuss iterative pre-order binary tree traversal we also discussed that we apply these three steps to each and every node of a binary tree that we visit that particular node and then we visit its left subtree and then we visit its right subtree so friends in my previous tutorial we used the recursion in order to traverse the binary tree now in this tutorial as we are not using the recursion and we are using the iterative way therefore we need to use an additional data structure which could hold the information of the nodes so friends when we use recursion and we call the method recursively so it internally used 
a stack. So in the iterative way, we will use the stack data structure. So friends, below is the algorithm for iterative pre-order traversal of a binary tree. And as we are using the iterative version of this algorithm, we are creating a stack which could hold the additional information for us so that when we backtrack to a particular node, we can fetch it from the stack easily. And we also know that stack is a LIFO data structure, which means the last in first out. So the node inserted last would be the first node to be removed. And if you want to know more about stack data structures, you can watch my previous tutorial. So in this tutorial, let's take this example that we want to traverse the nodes of this binary tree. So let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step. So basically when we execute this algorithm, we start with the root. And the first step we check is whether root is equal to null or not. So currently you see root is pointing to the node having data as one. Therefore it's not null. And then we'll create a stack which could hold the tree nodes for us. So here you can see we have created one stack. Now this stack will hold the tree nodes for us. So on the first step we'll simply push the root node moving ahead. So friend, as this is an iterative version of the algorithm, we are using a while loop and we are placing a condition that iterate till the stack is empty. So currently you can see stack is not empty because we have pushed one node. Therefore the condition in while block comes out to be true and while loop executes. So in this line, as we know that stack has only one element, so therefore this element will be popped out and we'll assign this pop node to a temporary node. So it would look something like this. So first the node will be popped out. So as the three node with the data as one was popped out, now this stamp will point to that particular node. Moving ahead. So friends, in pre-order tree traversal, we first process a node and then we process its left subtree and then we process its right subtree. So in the first step, we'll simply print this node. So the output would be one. Moving ahead. So friends, we have processed this node and now we will process its left subtree and then its right subtree. So in order to do that, we are first putting the right node on the stack and then we are putting the left node on the stack because when we pop it out, we'll first pop out the left node and then we'll pop out the right node. And in order to do that, we are first checking that whether temp right is equal to null or not. So currently temp right is not equal to null. Therefore we'll push the node having data as three on the stack. So you can see three is now on the stack. And then we'll check whether temp left is equal to null or not. So currently temp left is not equal to null. Therefore we'll push the node having data as two on the stack. So friends, as stack is a LIFO data structure, it means the node inserted last would be the first one to be removed. And we also know that in pre-order tree traversal, we first visit the node and then we visit the left subtree. So basically in order to traverse the left subtree first, we push the right node on the stack and then we push the left node. Therefore, when we pop it out, we'll pop out the node having data as two. Now we'll again check in the while loop whether stack is empty or not. So currently stack is not empty. Therefore condition in while loop comes out to be true. And then we'll simply pop an element from the stack and we'll assign it to the temporary node. So the node is popped out. So it means now temp will point to the node having data as two. And in the next step we'll simply print the data for the temporary node. So two is printed and hence we have processed this node and now we want to process its left subtree first and then its right subtree. So on the stack we'll first put the node which is pointed by temp right and then we'll put the node which is pointed by temp left. We'll check whether temp right is equal to null or not. So currently temp right is pointing to the node having data as five. Therefore it's not null. Therefore, we simply push the node having data as five on the stack. And then we'll check whether temp left is equal to null or not. So 
so here you can see temp left is pointing to the node having data as 4 therefore we'll push the node 4 on the stack and then we'll again execute the while loop and we'll check whether stack is empty or not so currently stack is not empty therefore the while loop executes and now in the first step we'll simply pop an element which is on the top of the stack so here we know that 4 is on the top of the stack so it will be popped out and now temp will point to the node 4 moving ahead and then we'll simply print the data associated with this node which is 4 and then we'll simply check whether temp write is equal to null or not so currently temp write is equal to null therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false and then we'll check whether temp left is equal to null or not so here you can see temp left is also equal to null therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false and then again in while loop we'll check whether stack is empty or not so currently you see stack has two nodes therefore it's not empty so the while loop executes and the first step will simply pop the top element and will assign its value to the temporary node so currently you see node having data is 5 is the top element therefore we'll pop it out and now the temp will point to the node having data is 5 moving ahead now we'll simply print the data associated with this temporary node which is 5 moving ahead we check whether temp write is equal to null or not so currently temp write is equal to null therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false we then check whether temp left is equal to null or not so here you can see temp left is also null therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false and then we'll again execute the while loop with the condition that stack is empty or not so currently stack has one node therefore it's not empty So in the first step we'll simply pop an element from the stack and we'll assign its value to the temporary node. So here you can see when we do stack.pop the node 3 will pop out and then the temp will point to that particular node. So it would look something like this. So now temp is pointing to the node having data as 3. Moving ahead. Now we'll simply print the data associated with this temporary node. So the output we see 3 and then we check whether temp write is equal to null or not. So currently temp write is not equal to null. Therefore the condition in if block comes out to be true. So in the if block we simply push temp write which is the node 7 on the stack. And then we'll check whether temp left is equal to null or not. So temp left is pointing to 6 which is not null. Therefore, the condition in if block comes out to be true. And we'll simply push temp left on the stack, which is 6. And then in while loop, we'll again check the condition whether stack is empty or not. So currently, stack has two elements, therefore, it's not empty. So in the first step, we'll simply pop an element from the stack. So the top element is a node having data as 6. So, th so this node will be popped out and its value will be assigned to the temp so currently temp is pointing to the node having data as 3 and after this step temp will point to the node 6 because because when we do stack.pop 6 will be popped out so it would look something like this so now temp is pointing to 6 we'll simply print its data on the console which is 6 and then we'll check whether temp write is equal to null or not so currently temp write is pointing to null therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false and then we'll check whether temp left is equal to null or not so temp left is equal to null therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false and then in while loop we'll again check whether stack is empty or not so currently stack is not empty because there is one node And in the first step we'll simply pop 
the element from the stack and then assign its value to temp. So when we pop an element from stack, we know that 7 will be popped out. So therefore temp will now point to 7. So it would look something like this. And then we'll simply print the data associated with this node on the console, which is 7. And then we'll check whether temp write is equal to null or not. So currently temp write is equal to null. Therefore condition in if block comes out to be false. And then we'll again check whether temp left is equal to null or not. So temp left is also equal to null. So therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false. And finally we'll check whether stack is empty or not. So currently you see as we have processed all the nodes of a binary tree. So the stack is empty. Therefore the condition in while block comes out to be false. So friends using an stack we saw how we can perform pre-order traversal of a binary tree. So here we discussed about the demonstration of the algorithm. Now let's go to Eclipse and see the working code. So friends in my previous tutorial we created one class by name binary tree and we implemented binary tree into it. Now this class has an instance variable of type tree node which is the actual root of our binary tree. We also discuss about the recursive pre-order tree traversal and in this tutorial we will see the iterative version of it. So therefore I will just comment this code and below I will create a method as public void pre-order and in this method we will write a code which would perform the iterative pre-order tree traversal. So in the first step we will check whether root is equal to null or not. So if the root is equal to null so it means there are no nodes into the binary tree. So therefore we will simply return from the method and in the first step we will simply create a stack. So here we will import the stack from java.util package and as we discussed in slide we will just push the root on the stack and after that we will provide a while loop and inside this while loop we will check whether stack is empty or not so if the stack is not empty then the while loop will be executed and in the first step we'll create a temporary node and we'll pop the element from the stack and we'll assign it to the temporary node and as we have popped an element from the stack we'll simply print its data on the console and in the next step we'll check that whether temp write is equal to null or not. So if temp write is not equal to null then we'll simply then we'll simply push temp write on the stack and we will do this step for the temp left as well. So here if temp left is not equal to null then we'll simply push temp left on the stack. So friend this is the iterative version of pre-order tree traversal. Now let's test is working on the main method. So in the main method we have created this binary tree and then we have called create binary tree. So it will create a binary tree with few nodes which we discussed in our previous tutorial. And the last I will simply call the pre-order method. And when I run this code, so you can see it printed 9243. And it printed the same what we discussed in our previous tutorials when we had called the recursive version of the pre-order tree traversal. 
सो फ्रेंड्स इन दिस टूटोरियल वी डिस्कस अबाउट द एट्रेटिव वर्जन ऑफ प्री ऑर्डर ट्री ट्रेवर्सल आई होप यू लाइक दिस वीडियो प्लीज लाइक कमेंट शेयर एंड सब्सक्राइब माई यूट्यूब चैनल थैंक्स एव ए नाइस डे हेलो फ्रेंड्स वेलकम टू माई न्यू डेटा स्ट्रक्चर्स एंड अलगोर तम इन जावा टूटोरियल सीरीज वीडियो फ्रेंड्स इन दिस टूटोरियल वी विल डिस्कस रिकर्सिव इन ऑर्डर ट्रेवर्सल ऑफ ए बाइनरी ट्री इन जावा सो फ्रेंड्स वॉट इज इन ऑर्डर बाइनरी ट्री ट्रेवर्सल सो हियर यू कैन सी दैट इन ऑर्डर बाइनरी ट्री ट्रेवर्सल हैज बेसिकली थ्री स्टेप्स एंड वी अप्लाई दिस थ्री स्टेप्स टू ईच एंड एवरी नोड ऑफ द बाइनरी ट्री सो द बेसिक स्टेप इन्वॉल्व इन इन ऑर्डर बाइनरी ट्री ट्रेवर्सल इज वी फर्स्ट विजिट द लेफ्ट सब ट्री फॉर अ पर्टिकुलर नोड and then we visit the node and after visiting that node we go to its right sub tree and this three steps we apply on each and every node of the binary tree so let's take an example of the below binary tree now let's suppose we want to visit each and every node of this binary tree so we start with the root so here you can see root is pointing to node 1 now we apply these three steps on the node 1 so here you can see basically the step 2 is involved in the processing of the node which we are currently pointing to so here before processing the node one what we do we first traverse its left sub tree so here you can see this is the complete left sub tree which we want to traverse before we process this node and after we process this complete left sub tree we then visit this node and after visiting this node we go to its right sub tree so here when we are at node one then before processing this node we go to its left sub tree now as we go to its left sub tree we encounter the node 2 so when we encounter the node 2 we apply this three steps over the node 2 and before processing the node 2 we first traverse its left sub tree then we process the node and then we go to its right sub tree so here before processing the node 2 we go to its left sub tree first so once we reach the node 4 we apply this three steps on the node 4 so before processing the node 4 we traverse to its left sub tree then we process the node and then we go to its right sub tree so here you can see node 4 has no left sub tree therefore we are done with the processing of the left sub tree and after we are done with the processing of left sub tree we actually visit the node so the first element we visit is the node 4 and after we are done with the node 4 we go to its right sub tree and we know that node 4 has no right sub tree therefore we are done with the processing of the node 4 completely so the call returns back to the node 2 and from the node 2 perspective we have actually visited its complete left sub tree so now is the chance to visit the node 2 so we actually visit a node 2 and then we go to its right sub tree so when we reach to the node 5 we actually apply these three steps now on node 5 we traverse its left sub tree then we visit the node and then we go to its right sub tree so here you can see node 5 has no left sub tree therefore we are done with the processing of the left sub tree so then we process the node 5 and after we process the node 5 we go to its right sub tree and we know that node 5 has no right sub tree therefore we are done with the processing of the node 5 so friends after the node 5 is processed the call returns back to the node 1 and from the node one's perspective we have completely traversed the left sub tree now so now is the chance to visit the node one so we visit the node one and then we go to its right sub tree so once we reach to the node three we apply these three steps over the node three so before processing of the node three we first go to its left sub tree then we visit the node and then we go to its right sub tree so when we reach to its left sub tree we encounter a node having data as six so we apply this three steps now over node 6 we visit its left sub tree then we process the node and then we visit the right sub tree so here as node 6 has no left sub tree therefore we are done with the processing of the left sub tree and then we actually visit the node and after visiting the node we go to its right sub tree and as node 6 has no right sub tree therefore we are done with the processing of the node 6 completely then our call goes back to the node 3 and we know that we have completely visited its left sub tree so now we can visit the node 3 so once we visit the node 3 the third step is involved 
is we go to its right subtree. So as we go to its right subtree, we encounter a node having data as seven. So on this node seven, we now apply these three steps. We first visit the left subtree of it, then we visit the node, and then we visit the right subtree. So friend, as we know that node seven has no left subtree. Therefore, we are done with the processing of the left subtree for the node seven, and then we actually visit the node seven, and then we go to its right subtree. So here we can see node seven has no right subtree. Therefore, we are done with the processing of the node seven. So here we have visited each and every node, and to each and every node we applied these three steps. That before processing the node, we actually visited its complete left subtree, then we visited the node, and then we Went to its right subtree. So, friend, these are the steps involved in in-order binary tree traversal. Now, let's go ahead and see the demonstration of the algorithm. So, friend, let's suppose you want to traverse this binary tree, where root is pointing to the node nine, whose left is pointing to node two, and whose left is pointing to node four. And node four has no left and right subtree, therefore they are pointing to null. Node two has no right subtree, therefore is pointing to null. And here, node nine right is pointing to the node three, which have no left subtree and the right subtree. So, friends, below you can see the algorithm for the in-order binary tree traversal. And here you can see the method name is in-order, which takes in a root. And in the method, we are actually again calling the in-order method. Therefore, these calls are recursive in nature. So, in order to understand its recursion, we are using this call stack. Where we are keeping the information for the current executing method, and we are also keeping the track of the root node, which is getting executed in the particular method call, and we are also keeping the track of the line number, whose significance we will see once we demonstrate the algorithm. So let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step. Now, when we call in order method and we pass the root, so currently you see root is pointing to the node nine. So we know that this method will be part of our call stack. So it would look something like this: that now this method will be part of our call stack, and this method will be executed with the root as nine, because currently root is pointing to nine. We move ahead and we check whether root is equal to null or not. So friends, why we are providing this condition? As this is the base case for our recursion, because in the in order method we are again calling the in order method recursively. So friends, in order to break this recursion, we need to provide a base case, and if we don't provide this base case, then this method will call each other recursively. So in order to stop this, we are providing this base case. So currently, you see, root is pointing to the node nine, therefore it's not null. So the condition in if block comes out to be false. So in the first step, what we do is, so what we discuss in the slide that before processing of a node. We will first traverse the left subtree. So we again call the in-order method, and this time we are passing roots left because we want to process the left subtree now. So here you can see root left is the node two. Therefore, this in-order method will call the in-order method again with the root as two. So friends, here we are leaving this method, and now we are entering to this method again. So we'll keep the track of the line number. That at the line five we left this method, so that once this method is processed, we again return back to this method, and we'll start executing from the line five. So therefore, we we'll keep the information for the line number whenever we leave any particular method. So here we keep the track of the line number, which is five. That we are leaving this in order method at the line five, and we are calling this in order method again with the root two. So friends, this method will be called again, and this time the root will be the node two. So here now root instead of pointing to nine, it will point to two. And we also know that we have left this method in order method, so there will be one more method on the stack. So now this in order method will start executing with the root as two. So let's see the working. We'll first check whether root is equal to null or not. So currently, root is pointing to the node two, therefore it's not null. So friends, as we discussed in the slide, 
before processing any node we have to process its left subtree first so in order to visit the node 2 we will first have to visit its left subtree so here we again call in order method and we pass roots left so here you can see root is pointing to the node 2 and we will call in order method and will pass the root dot left which is node 4 and as we are leaving this method we will keep the track of the line number so here now in order method will start executing with the root as 4 so currently root is pointing to the node 2 so now it will point to node 4 and here you can see there would be one more method coming on the stack now this in order method will be start executing with the root as 4 moving ahead we'll check whether the root is equal to null or not so currently root is pointing to the node 4 therefore it's not null and here before processing the node 4 we have to first process its left subtree therefore we are again calling the in order method and we are passing root left so currently root is pointing to the node 4 so now we are calling this in order method and we are passing the null value to it and here we will keep the track of the line number that as we are leaving this method and we are calling this method so we are keeping the track of the line number so friends now in order method will be called again and this time the root will point to null so here you can see currently root is pointing to 4 and as we discussed that we are going to roots left so now root will point to null and we also know that once this method gets start executing there will be one more method on the call stack now here you can see this in order method has root as null moving ahead we'll check whether root is equal to null or not so currently you see root is equal to null therefore we have reached our base case which makes sense because when we encounter a null value it means there are no nodes to be traversed so we simply return from this method and once we return from this method we know that this method will be removed from the call stack and the execution point will go to the method which called this method so now execution point reaches here so friends we know that at line 5 we left this method so we'll start executing from the line 5 itself so our execution point will now start from the line 5 because we have processed this information earlier and we also know that when this method was getting executed root was pointing to 4 so when step of execution reaches here root will point to 4 moving ahead so friends here you can see for the node 4 we have processed left subtree now is the time to process the actual node so therefore we simply print roots data on the console so on the output you can see 4 will be printed because roots data is 4 moving ahead and we also saw in the slide that after we process the node we then go to its right subtree so in order to go its right subtree we again call the in order method and this time we pass roots right so currently root is pointing to the node 4 and its right is pointing to null therefore we'll again call the in order method and we'll pass the null value to it and here as we are leaving this method on the line 7 we'll keep the track of the line number so now it will be 7 and we also know that once we call this method so now in order method will be called again and this time with roots right which is null so friend currently root is pointing to node 4 and when we call this in order method with a null value therefore now root will point to null and we also know that there will be one more method on this call stack with a root as null so let's execute this method in the first step we'll check whether root is equal to null or not so currently root is equal to null therefore the condition comes out to be true and we'll simply return from this method 
so once we return from this method we know that this method will be removed from the call stack and the method which called it the execution point will go there so now the execution point reaches to this method and we also know that we left this method from the line number 7 so therefore the execution point will start from the line 7 and we also know that when we left this method root was pointing to node 4 so therefore now root will point to node 4 again and then we'll start executing from the line 7 so when we reach to line 8 we know that we have completely processed this in order method so therefore this method will be removed from the call stack and the call will go to the method which had called this method so now call will go to this in order method and we know that we had left this method from the line number 5 therefore the execution point will start executing after the line 5 and we also know that when we are executing this in order method at that time root was pointing to node 2 so therefore now root will point to the node 2 and will start executing after line 5 so here we can see that before processing the node 2 we have completely visited its left subtree so now is the time to process the node itself therefore we simply print its data on the console so you can see two gates printed on the console and after we process the node we know that now we have to go to its right subtree so we again call in order method and we pass the root right value which is null and we also know that as we are calling this in order method we will update the line number here so now the execution point reaches to this in order method and we know that there will be one more method on the call stack with a root as null so here you can see root is pointing to node 2 so now this root will point to null and we'll start executing this in order method so in the first step we check whether root is equal to null so here you can see root is equal to null therefore we'll simply return from this method and we are returning from this method that because we have already processed its right subtree so once we return from this method we know that now this in order method will be removed from the call stack completely and now the execution point will reach to this in order method and we'll now start executing this in order method from the line number 7 so we'll start executing from the line number 7 and as we know that when we were executing this in order method root was pointing to 2 so now root will point to 2 and then we we'll simply execute this in order method so once we reach to the end of this method we know that now this method will be removed from the call stack and the execution point will reach here so we'll start from the line number 5 and we also know that when we are executing this method root was pointing to 9 so therefore now root will point to 9 and then we'll simply execute the steps so friends here you can see before we processed node 9 we completely traversed its left subtree and after we traverse its left subtree completely now we are visiting the node so we are simply printing its data on the console moving ahead and once we are done with the process of this node we have to process its right subtree so therefore we are again calling in order method and we are passing the value roots right to it so here you can see roots right is the node 3 and as we are calling this new method we are updating the line number so point of execution reaches to the in order method with a root as 3 so now root is pointing to 3 and we also know that as this is a new method on the stack there will be one entry on the call stack so here now this in order method will start executing with a root as 3 
so we first check whether root is equal to null or not so currently root is pointing to 3 therefore it's not null and then for the root 3 we apply the in order traversal again we first visit its left subtree so in order to visit its left subtree we are calling in order method and we are passing root left value to it so here you can see root left is pointing to null therefore we are calling this in order method with the value as null and as we are leaving this method and we are calling this new method we will update the line number so then execution point will reach to this in order method with a root as null so we know that there will be one more method on the call stack with a root as null and now root will point to null moving ahead we check whether root is equal to null or not so currently root is equal to null therefore we will simply return from this method and this method will be completely removed from the call stack and as this method is removed from the call stack the execution point reaches to this in order method which actually called the in order method with a null value and from which line we have to start we have to start the execution from the line number 5 and we also know that when we were executing this in order method root was pointing to 3 so now root will point to 3 so friends now in this step as we have processed the left subtree completely then now we will process the node itself so we are simply printing the data on the console and then as we have to process its right subtree now so we are calling in order method and we are and we are part passing roots right which is the null value and before calling this new method we are updating the line number so when the point of execution reaches the in order method root is null so there will be one more method on the stack with a root as null so now this root will point to null and we'll start executing this method so in the first step we'll check whether root is equal to null or not so currently root is equal to null therefore we'll simply return from this method and when we return we know that this method will be removed completely from the call stack and the point of execution reaches here so we know that we'll execute this method from the line number 7 and we also know that at that moment root was pointing to 3 so now root will point to node 3 and then we'll start executing from the line 7 so when we reach to the line 8 we know that we have completely executed this in order method so this will be removed from the call stack so friends now the execution point reaches to this in order method and we'll start executing from the line 7 and we also know that when we are executing this method root was pointing to 9 therefore we'll simply traverse root to 9 and then we simply process all the step for this in order method so now this will be removed from the stack so friend as we know there are no method on left on the call stack therefore we have successfully executed the in order binary tree traversal and the output you can see it's 4293 so friend this was the demonstration of the algorithm now let's go to eclipse and see the working code so friends in my previous tutorial I had created one class by name binary tree and I have implemented binary tree into that class you can watch my previous tutorial in order to understand its working so in this tutorial we will simply write the code for in order binary tree traversal so let's say I give the method name as public void in order and as we discussed in the slide this in order method takes in a root now in the first step we check if root is equal to null 
then we'll simply return from this method because this is the base condition as we are as we are calling this in order method recursively we have to provide a base case so that we can get exit from this recursion and as we discussed in our slide that before visiting any node we'll first visit its left subtree so we'll call in order method and we'll pass root left to it and after we process its left subtree we will visit the node so we simply print roots data on the console and in the last step we will again call in order method and we will process roots right subtree by calling roots right in the in order method so friend this is the algorithm for the in order binary tree traversal now let's test is working now in my previous tutorial i had created one binary tree and this is the same tree which we discussed in the slide use this create binary tree method so here in the main method we will call create binary tree and then we will call the in order method and here we will pass the root now if I run the code so here you can see it printed 4293 which is the same output which we saw in the slide so friends in this tutorial we discussed the recursive way of in order binary tree traversal i hope you like this video please like comment share and subscribe my youtube channel thanks have a nice day hello friends welcome to my new data structures and algorithm in java tutorial series video friends in this tutorial we will discuss iterative in order traversal of a binary tree in java so friends in my previous tutorial we discussed about the recursive in order tree traversal so steps involved in in order tree traversal are as follows that before visiting any particular node we first visit its left subtree then we actually visit the node and then we visit its right subtree and this steps is applied over each and every node so friends if we apply in order tree traversal over this tree then what we need to do is before visiting the node 1 we have to actually traverse its left subtree then we have to visit the node and after visiting the node we have to traverse its right subtree so when we start with the node 1 we have to go to its left subtree first because as we go to its left subtree there is no way we can reach to the node 1 again therefore we need an additional data structure which can hold this node so that once we complete the visiting of left subtree we we can pull the element out of that additional data structure and we can visit it and after visiting it we can go to its right subtree so the additional data structure that we use here is stack so here you can see we are using stack which is a LIFO data structure which means the element inserted last into the stack would be the first one to be removed in order to know more about the stack you can watch my previous tutorials before visiting this node we actually put it on the stack and then we go to its left subtree and this we do for each and every node and once we actually visit the left subtree of any node then we pop the element out of the stack we visit that node and then we go to its right subtree so let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step so let's suppose we are given with a binary tree having six nodes and where root is pointing to the node 1 so let's apply this algorithm over this binary tree and let's see how we can traverse each and every node of a binary tree using the in order tree traversal so basically in the first step we check whether root is equal to null or not so if root is equal to null we simply return because there are no nodes in the tree to be traversed so currently you see root is pointing to node 1 therefore it's not null so the condition in if block comes out to be false so after the if block what we actually do is we actually create a stack now this stack will hold the tree nodes for us 
so it would look something like this moving ahead so in the next step what we do is we create a temporary tree node and we assign the value of root to it so now the temp will point to root so it would look something like this that is temporary node is pointing to root moving ahead so friends in order to traverse this binary tree using in order tree traversal we actually use a while loop and inside this while loop we are actually placing two conditions so we are iterating this while loop till stack is empty and temp becomes null so currently you can see stack is empty so the condition comes out to be false but you can also see the temp is actually pointing to a node therefore it's not null so the second condition comes out to be true and as there is a or operator between these two conditions therefore the overall condition comes out to be true so the while loop executes so in the while loop we actually encounter an if else block so in the if block we check whether temp is equal to null or not so currently you can see temp is pointing to the node 1 therefore it's not null so the condition in if block comes out to be true so in the if block the first step we do is we actually push the temporary node on the stack which makes sense because before visiting this node we have to first visit its left subtree so therefore we are actually pushing this temporary node on the stack so that once we are done with the left subtree then we can pop this element out and then we can visit this node and after visiting this node we can go to its right subtree so when we push the temporary node on the stack it looks something like this that now node 1 is on the stack moving ahead and in the next step we simply traverse the temp to its left because we have to first visit the left subtree therefore we need to traverse temp to its left so we are assigning the value of temp dot left to temp so here temp left is the node 2 therefore now temp will point to the node 2 so it would look something like this the temp is now pointing to the node 2 moving ahead In the while loop, we'll again check whether stack is empty or not, and then we'll check whether temp is pointing to null or not. So currently, you can see stack is not empty, and temp is pointing to the node two. Therefore, it's not null. So the condition in while block comes out to be true. And then in the if block, we'll check whether temp is equal to null or not. So here you can see temp is pointing to the node two. Therefore, it's not null. So the condition in if block comes out to be true. and then we'll simply push that node 2 on the stack because before visiting the node 2 we have to first visit its left subtree completely therefore we'll push the node 2 on the stack so it would look something like this that now node 2 is on the stack and then we'll simply traverse temp node to its left which is the node 4 so it would look something like this now temp is pointing to the node 4 And then again in the while block we'll check whether stack is empty or not and temp is equal to null or not. So currently stack is not empty and temp is pointing to the node 4. So therefore the condition in while block comes out to be true. And then in if block we'll check whether temp is equal to null or not. So currently temp is pointing to node 4 therefore it's not equal to null. So the condition in if block comes out to be true. So then in the first step what we do is we simply push the temp on the stack because before visiting the node 4 we have to first traverse its left subtree completely therefore we are pushing the node 4 on the stack so it would look something like this now node 4 is on the stack moving ahead and the next step will simply traverse temp by assigning temp dot left value to temp which makes sense because before visiting this node we have to first visit the left subtree therefore now temp has to move to its left subtree so now temp will point to a node which is left to node 4 and here you can see it is pointing to null so therefore now temp will point to null 
moving ahead we'll again check whether stack is empty or not and temp is equal to null or not so currently you can see temp is equal to null but stack is not empty therefore the condition in while block comes out to be true and then in the if block we'll check whether temp is equal to null or not so here you can see temp is equal to null therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false so the else block will be executed and here we can see that node 4 left is pointing to null therefore there is no node to be visited so therefore we have visited its left subtree completely so now is the turn that we can visit the node 4 so in order to do that we will simply pop the first element from the stack and we will assign the temp to that node so here you can see as stack is a leaf data structure so the last element inserted is the first one to be removed so when we do a pop the node 4 will be popped out and value of node 4 will be assigned to temp so therefore once the node 4 is popped out temp will now point to the node 4 so it would look something like this that now node 4 is popped out and whatever the value it holds it will be assigned to temp so now temp will point to the node 4 so it would look something like this moving ahead So here for the node 4 we have visited its left subtree completely. So now is the time to visit the node 4. So on the console we are simply printing the data associated with the temporary node. So here node 4 becomes the first node to be traversed. So on the output 4 will be printed. Moving ahead. And as we have visited a node 4, now we will simply traverse to its right subtree. So we are simply assigning value of temp dot write to temp. So here temp dot write is pointing to null. So therefore now temp will point to null. Moving ahead. So in the while block we will check whether stack is empty or not. So currently stack is not empty. And temp is equal to null or not. So currently temp is equal to null but stack is not empty. Therefore the condition in while block comes out to be true. And we'll check whether temp is equal to null or not. So currently temp is equal to null. Therefore condition in if block comes out to be false. And the else block will be executed. So here you can see for the node 4 as its left is pointing to null and its right is pointing to null. It means there are no nodes on the left and the right side for the node 4 to be traversed. Therefore, for the node 2, we have completely visited its left subtree because we have printed the output 4, which means we have traversed this node. So here what we are doing is we are again popping the element from the stack and we are assigning it to temp. So when we pop an element from the stack, we, we know that it's node 2. So it would look something like this. That node 2 is popped out and its value will be assigned to temp. So it means now temp will point to node 2. And which makes sense because we have completely traversed the left subtree for the node 2. So now it's the time to traverse the node 2. So in the next step, we'll simply print the data associated with the temporary node, which is 2. So on the console, we simply print 2. And, and then we'll simply traverse time to its right. So here as we have visited the left subtree for the node 2 and we also visited the node 2. Now is the time we go to its right subtree. Therefore we are simply assigning temp.write value to temp. So it would look something like this. So now temp is pointing to the node 5 because it is on the right of the node 2. Moving ahead. Now in the while loop we will check whether stack is empty or not. So currently stack is not empty. And temp is also pointing to node 5. Therefore the condition in while block comes out to be true. And then in if block we will check whether temp is equal to null or not. So currently temp is not equal to null because it is pointing to the node 5. Therefore the condition in if block comes out to be true. So what we do is we simply push the node 5 on the stack. Because we cannot visit this node till we visit its left subtree completely. 
therefore we need a way to store this element on the stack so we are simply pushing the temporary node on the stack so now node 5 is on the stack and then we simply go to its left because we need to traverse its left first so now temp is pointing to null in the while block we will check whether stack is empty or not so stack is not empty but temp is pointing to null so the overall condition comes out to be true so the while block executes in the if block we will check whether temp is equal to null or not so temp is equal to null therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false and the else block will be executed so as node 5 has no left subtree therefore it simply means that we have visited its left part now we will actually visit the node so we simply pop the element from the stack so when we pop the element from the stack we know so we know that 5 was inserted last therefore it would be first one to be removed and when we remove the node 5 we assign its value to temp so now temp will point to the node 5 so it would look something like this so now temp is pointing to the node 5 and then we'll simply visit the node 5 so on the console we print the data associated with the temporary node which is 5 moving ahead and once we have visited this node now it's the time to go to its right subtree so now temp will point to null moving ahead in the while block we'll check whether stack is empty or not so currently stack is not empty but temp is pointing to null so the overall condition comes out to be true because stack is not empty so the while block executes in the if block we'll check whether temp is equal to null or not so temp is equal to null therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false and the else block will be executed so here you can see we have completely visited the node 5 and this node 5 is actually right to the node 2 therefore we have completely visited a left subtree for the node 1 so when we pop an element from the stack one gets popped out and now temp will actually point to the node 1 so node 1 is popped out and its value will be assigned to temp so now temp will point to node 1 moving ahead so friends here you can see for the node 1 you have completely visited its left subtree by printing 4, 2 and 5 so now we can actually visit this node so therefore we simply print the data associated with this temporary node which is 1 so 1 gets printed on the console therefore we have visited this node and the next step as we have visited this node now we will simply go to its right subtree therefore we simply assign temp right to temp so here you can see temp right is pointing to the node 3 therefore now temp will point to the node 3 again in the while block we will check whether stack is empty or not so here you can see stack is empty so the first condition comes out to be false but here you can see temp is pointing to the node 3 therefore it's not equal to null so the second condition comes out to be true so here the overall condition comes out to be true and the while block executes so here we will check whether temp is equal to null or not so currently temp is pointing to the node 3 therefore it's not equal to null so the condition in if block comes out to be true and here before visiting the node 3 we have to first visit its left subtree completely therefore we need a way to store this element on the stack so we simply push the temporary node on the stack so it would look something like this now 3 is on the stack and then we'll simply go to its left subtree because this left subtree we need to visit first before actually visiting the node 3 
so we are simply assigning temp dot left value to temp so here you can see temp left is pointing to the node 6 so therefore now temp will point to the node 6 in the while block we will again check whether stack is empty or not so currently stack is not empty so the first condition comes out to be true and temp is actually pointing to the node 6 therefore the second condition also comes out to be true so the overall condition comes out to be true and while block executes so in the first step we will check whether temp is equal to null or not so currently temp is pointing to node 6 therefore it's not equal to null so the condition in if block comes out to be true and then we'll simply push the node 6 on the stack because we can't visit this node till we process its left subtree completely therefore we are storing the node 6 on the stack so after pushing the node 6 on the stack we simply go to its left subtree so now temp will point to the left of the node 6 which is null moving ahead now currently stack is not empty but temp is pointing to null therefore the overall condition comes out to be true we check whether temp is equal to null or not so temp is equal to null therefore condition in if block comes out to be false and the else block will be executed so here as node 6 has no left subtree therefore we are done with the processing of the left subtree for the node 6 so now is the time that we can visit the node 6 so what we do is we simply pop the element from the stack because we know that we have actually stored this element on the stack so we pop this element from the stack and we'll assign it to temp so it would look something like this so now temp is pointing to the node 6 moving ahead and then we are simply printing the data associated with node 6 so 6 gets printed on the console and as we have visited this node now is the time to go to his right subtree so therefore now temp will point to null so in the while block we will check whether stack is empty or not so currently stack is not empty so this condition comes out to be true but temp is pointing to null so the overall condition comes out to be true so the while block executes we check whether temp is equal to null or not so here temp is equal to null therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false so the else block will be executed so friends here you can see for the node 6 we have actually visited its left subtree we have visited the node and we have visited his right subtree so therefore we have completely visited his node 6 and here you can see node 6 is to the left of node 3 so now you actually traverse the left subtree for the node 3 so therefore now we can visit the node 3 so in order to reach to node 3 we know that we have already stored this node on the stack so we simply pop this element from the stack and will assign it to temporary node so it would look something like this that node 3 gets popped out and its value is assigned to temp so therefore now temp will point to node 3 and then we'll simply print the value associated with this temporary node which is actually 3 so 3 gets printed on the console and as you have visited the node 3 completely now we need to visit his right subtree therefore we are simply assigning temp right to temp so now temp will actually point to null so now again we'll check the condition in while loop so first we check whether stack is empty or not so currently stack is empty so the first condition comes out to be false and then we'll check whether temp is equal to null or not so here you can see temp is equal to null therefore the second condition comes out to be false so overall both the conditions are coming out to be false 
so the while loop terminates and here you can see we have actually visited all the nodes of this binary tree and we have printed the data associated with those nodes which is 4, 2, 5, 1, 6, 3 so friend this was the demonstration of the algorithm now let's go to Eclipse and see the working code so friends in my previous tutorial we actually created one class by name binary tree and we actually implemented the binary tree into this class so friends in order to understand binary tree more you can watch my previous tutorials so in my last tutorial we actually discussed the recursive version of the in order tree traversal but in this tutorial we will discuss the iterative way for the in order tree traversal so here I will just comment this code and below I will create the method as in order now this in order method will take in a root so let's code the algorithm which we saw in the slide so in the first step we'll check that whether root is equal to null or not so if root is equal to null we'll simply return from this method because there are no nodes in the binary tree to be traversed and the first step will create a stack which will hold the tree nodes for us and as we discussed in the slide we'll create a temporary node and we'll start it from the root so tree node temp and we'll simply assign the value of root to it and now we'll simply provide a while loop and we also saw that we have placed two condition on that that whether stack is empty or not so the first condition is we are checking whether stack is empty or not and then we are providing an or and the second condition we provide is temp should not be equal to null so in the while loop we will simply provide an if else block so in the if block we will first provide a condition that temp should not be equal to null and if temp is not equal to null then we simply push the temp on the stack and then we traverse temp to its left and if temp is equal to null then we simply pop an element from the stack and we will assign its value to the temporary node once we pop the element from the stack we will simply print it on the console so temp dot data and as we have printed the data on the console then we will simply traverse temp to its right so friend this is the code for iterative in order tree traversal now let's test is working in the main method so here first we have initialized the binary tree and then we have created a binary tree with few nodes so here in create binary tree we have actually created few nodes which we also discussed in our previous tutorials you can watch my previous tutorial in order to understand how this binary tree is created and after creating the binary tree with few nodes we will simply call the in order method and we will pass the root to that method so if I run this code now so here you can see it prints 4293 because in the create binary tree the root is 9 and root left is second which is 2 and roots right which is 3 so so here 9 left is 2 and 9 right is 3 
and here you can see second left is fourth now the fourth node is pointing to the second left so 9 is at the root its left is 2 and its left is 4 so therefore so on the console it printed 4 then it printed 2 and then 9 and then 3 because as 9 is on the root in order to process this node we have to first visit its left subtree so on its left is the node 2 and before processing the node 2 we have to go to its left subtree so which is 4 so 4 gets printed first then we print the node 2 and then we actually print the root node and then we go to its right subtree so we simply print 3 so so friends in this tutorial we discuss the iterative version of the in order tree traversal i hope you like this video please like comment share and subscribe my youtube channel thanks have a nice day hello friends welcome to my new data structures and algorithm in java tutorial series video friends in this tutorial we will discuss recursive post order traversal of a binary tree in java so friends what is post order binary tree traversal basically there are three steps involved in doing the post order binary tree traversal and all these three steps are applied over each and every node of a binary tree so if we take an example of a binary tree shown in the slide then basically we start with the root node and we apply these three steps over the root node so what actually we do is in order to visit this particular node first we actually visit its left subtree completely then we visit its right subtree completely and then we actually visit the node so here if we want to visit the node 1 then we have to first visit its left subtree completely and then we have to visit its right subtree completely and then we can visit the node and these three steps are applied over each and every node so suppose we are on node 2 so in order to visit this node what we have to do first we have to visit its left subtree completely then we need to visit its right subtree completely and then we can visit the node so therefore here before visiting the node 2 we have to first visit the node 4 then we have to visit the node 5 and then we can visit the node 2 so here basically these three steps are applied on each and every node of a binary tree in order to do post order binary tree traversal so friends in this tutorial we are discussing the recursive post order binary tree traversal below you can see the algorithm for the post order binary tree traversal so we will demonstrate this algorithm using this binary tree here and we will see how we can apply this algorithm on this binary tree and whatever the output comes out it will be displayed here so friends as this algorithm is recursive in nature here you can see post order method is again internally calling the post order method therefore this is a recursive nature algorithm so in order to understand the recursive nature of this post order method we will maintain a call stack so that we come to know that which method is currently being executed and what is the route that is being processed we will come to know about line number when we will actually discuss the post order method so friends let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step so friends here you can see the root is pointing to the node 9 and when we call this post order we actually pass the root node so to this post order we are actually passing the root node as 9 so friends when the point of execution reaches this post order method we know that on the call stack there will be one method by the name post order and we also know that we have passed the root as 9 so therefore on the call stack there will be one method by name post order which will start its execution moving ahead so friends the first step we actually check whether root is equal to null or not so if root is equal to null we simply return from that method and here you can see that this condition will act as our base case because as we are calling this post order method and internally again calls the post order method we need to provide a base case to stop the execution of this post order method because if we don't provide the base case post order method will again call post order method and it will go on calling each other infinitely so this is the base case which is required in order to break the recursion and we will see its significance later in that demonstration so currently as you can see root is pointing to 9 therefore it's not equal to null so therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false 
and at the line number 5 we see it calls post order method again and this time we are passing roots left which is the node 2 so friends as we discussed in our previous slide that in order to visit a particular node we have to first visit its left subtree completely then we have to visit its right subtree completely and then we can visit the node so therefore before visiting the node 9 we have to first visit its left subtree completely so we are again calling the post order method and we are parsing root dot left to it which is nothing but the node 2 so here you can see when we had called this post order method there was one method on the call stack and inside this we are calling this post order method again so when we call this post order method we are leaving this post order method so in order to keep the track of this post order method we will update the line number here so it would look something like this that from line number 5 we are leaving this post order method and we are again calling the post order method with a root as 2 so once this line gets executed we know that post order method will be called again and this time this post order method will be called with a root as 2 so therefore the line of execution reaches to the post order method again and we know that root will now point to the node 2 so now this method starts execution with a root as 2 therefore we know that there will be one more method on the call stack so here now this post order method will start its execution with a root as 2 moving ahead we will check whether root is equal to null or not so here root is pointing to the node 2 therefore it's not null so the condition in if block comes out to be false and at the line number 5 we are again calling the post order method and this time we are passing root dot left so here root left is nothing but the node 4 so why we are doing this step is because because in order to process this node 2 we know that we have to first visit its left subtree completely then we have to visit its right subtree completely and then only we can visit this node and we also discussed in our previous slide that all the three steps are applied to each and every node of the binary tree so therefore before traversing the node 2 we have to first visit its left subtree completely so therefore we are calling this post order method again with a root as 4 and we also know that we are leaving this post order method so we will update the line number here which is nothing but 5 so now point of execution reaches to this post order method with the root as 4 and we also know that now root will point to the node 4 and as this method will start its execution there will be one more method on the call stack with the root as 4 so here now this post order method will start its execution with the root as 4 so in the first step we will check whether root is equal to null or not so currently root is pointing to the node 4 therefore it's not null so the condition in if block comes out to be false and then on the line number 5 we are again calling post order method with the value as root dot left so friends in order to process the node 4 we have to first visit its left subtree completely then we have to visit its right subtree completely and then only we can visit the node 4 therefore we are again calling the post order method and this time we are passing the value as root dot left so here root is pointing to node 4 and its left is pointing to null therefore now we are calling this post order method with a null value and we also know that we are leaving this method from the line number 5 therefore we will update the line number here as 5 so the point of execution will reach to this post order method with a root as null so therefore now root will point to null and we also know that there will be one more method on the call stack by the name post order and whose root will be null so now this post order method will start its execution with a root as null so here first we will check whether root is equal to null or not so currently you can see root is pointing to null therefore the condition in if block comes out to be true so therefore we have reached our base case so we'll simply return from this method so friends as we return from this method we know that this post order method 
is executed completely therefore this method will be removed from the call stack so friends when this method is removed from the call stack the call goes to its previous method which actually called this method with a root as null and we also know that we had left this post order method from the line number 5 so the point of execution reaches to this node and we'll start our execution from the line number 5 because at this line number we have actually left this method so therefore we'll start our execution from this line and we also know that when we had left this method at that moment root was pointing to node 4 so therefore now root will point to node 4 moving ahead so friends at the line number 6 we are again calling the post order method but this time we are passing it a value as root dot write which actually makes sense because in order to traverse this node 4 we have to first visit this left subtree completely then we have to visit the right subtree completely and then we can visit the node so therefore on the line number 5 we have completely visited the left subtree for the node 4 so now is the time to visit its right subtree so therefore we are again calling the post order method and we are passing the value as root dot right so here root is pointing to node 4 and its right is pointing to null therefore we know that now we will call this post order method with a null value and we also know that as we are leaving this post order method from the line number 6 we need to update the line number here so the line number becomes 6 so friends point of execution reaches to this post order method and this time the root will be null and we also know that once this method starts its execution there will be one more method on the call stack with the root as null so it would look something like this so we know that root is null so therefore now root will point to the null moving ahead we will check in the if block whether root is equal to null or not so currently you can see root is equal to null so therefore we will simply return from this method and as we return from this method we know that this method is executed completely so this would be removed from the call stack and the point of execution reaches to the post order which actually called this method and we also know that we had left this post order method from the line number 6 therefore the execution will start from the line number 6 and we also know that when we had left this method root was pointing to the node 4 so therefore now root will point to node 4 moving ahead so friends on line number 7 we will simply print the data associated with this root so friends in order to process the node 4 what we have actually done is we have first visited its left subtree completely then we visited its right subtree completely so after doing this stuff we are actually visiting the node 4 so we are simply printing its data on the console which is 4 moving ahead so friends at the line number 8 this post order method on the call stack will complete its execution so this would be removed from the call stack completely and the point of execution will reach here and we also know that we had left this post order method from the line number 5 so the point of execution reaches to the line number 5 and we also know that at that time root was pointing to node 2 so here now root will point to node 2 and we'll start our execution with this post order method so friend in the line number 6 we are again calling the post order method and this time we are passing root dot write to it so here you can see root is pointing to node 2 so we'll pass root dot write which is null to this post order method so friends here you can see we are calling this post order method again with the root as null because root dot write is nothing but null value and we also know that we are leaving this method so we'll update the line number here and we know that line number is 6 so now line number changes to 6 so root is pointing to the node 2 
therefore now it will point to its right which is null now this method will start its execution so therefore there will be one more entry on the call stack with a root as null moving ahead we'll check whether root is equal to null or not so currently root is equal to null so therefore we'll simply return from this method so when we return from this method we know that this post order method is executed completely so therefore it will be removed from the call stack and once it's removed from the call stack the point of execution reaches to this post order method and we also know that we have left this method the line number 6 so we'll start its execution from the line number 6 and we also know that when we had left this method root was pointing to node 2 so here root is pointing to null so now it will point to node 2 moving ahead and at the step 7 we'll simply print the data associated with the root which is nothing but 2 So friends here you can see before processing of the node 2 we first completely visited its left subtree and we printed node 4 and then we visited its complete right subtree which was actually null and then we actually visited the node 2 so it printed something like this 4 and then 2 moving ahead so at line number 8 we know that this post order method is been executed completely so therefore this would be removed from the call stack and the point of execution reaches to this post order method and we also know that when we had left this post order method from the call stack the line number was actually 5 so we'll start our execution from the line number 5 and we also know that root at that time pointed to the node 9 so therefore now root will point to node 9 and our execution starts from line number 5 So friends here you can see that we are on node 9 and in order to visit this node we have to first visit its left subtree completely which you have actually done and then we have to visit its right subtree completely so now we'll start to move to its right and then we can process this node 9 so we are again calling the post order method and this time we are passing the value as root dot right because we have to now visit its right subtree completely so therefore you can see roots right is nothing but node 3 so we will be again calling this post order method with a root as 3 and we also know that we are leaving this method post order from the line number 6 so therefore we'll update the line number here so now point of execution again starts post order method and this time with the root as 3 So now root is pointing to the node three, and we also know that there will be one more method on the call stack with the root as three. So friends, now let's start the execution of this post order method with the root as three. In the first step, we'll check whether root is equal to null or not. So currently, root is pointing to node three, therefore it's not null. And at the line number five, we will again call post order method. and this time we are passing roots left which is nothing but the null value so here before processing of node 3 we know that we have to first process its left subtree and then we have to process its right subtree so in order to process its left subtree we are calling this post order method again with roots left which is nothing but the null value so friends we are leaving this post order method at line number 5 so we will update the line number here and then point of execution will call this post order method again with root as null so now root will point to null and we also know that there will be one more method on the call stack with a root as null so now let's execute this post order method with a root as null so here we check whether root is equal to null or not so currently root is equal to null therefore we'll simply return from this method so once we return from this method we know that this method is executed completely 
so it will be removed from the call stack and point of execution will reach to this post order method and we know that we had left this post order method from the line number 5 so therefore we'll again start our execution from the line number 5 with a root as 3 so currently root is pointing to null so now it will point to 3 so we are starting from line number 5 and our root will point to node 3 moving ahead so at the line number 6 we will call post order method again and we'll pass the value as root dot write because in order to traverse this node we have to traverse this left subtree first which we have already done so now is the time to traverse this right subtree and after traversing right subtree we can actually visit this node 3 so in order to visit this right subtree we are calling this post order method again and we are passing the null value to it and we also know that we are leaving this method at line number 6 so we will update the line number here So now point of execution will start the execution of this new post order method with the root as null. So root is pointing to node 3. Now it will point to null. And we also know that there will be one more method on the call stack with the root as null. So let's start the execution of this post order method with the root as null. So we'll check whether root is equal to null or not. So currently root is equal to null. Therefore, we have actually visited the right subtree for the node 3. So we'll simply return from this method. And as we return from this method, this post order method will be removed from the call stack and point of execution will reach to this post order method. And we know that we have left this post order method from the line number 6 with the root as 3. So we'll start the execution from the line number 6 and we know that at that time root was pointing to 3 so now root will point to node 3 so friends we have visited the left subtree for the node 3 and we also visited the right subtree for the node 3 so now we can actually visit the node 3 so on the line number 7 we will simply print the data associated with this root which is nothing but 3 moving ahead and once we reach the line number 8, we know that we have successfully executed this post order method. So this method will be removed from the call stack. And the point of execution will reach to this post order method. And we also know that we had left this post order method from the line number 6. And at that time the root was actually 9. So we are starting from the line number 6. And we know that we had left this method when the root was pointing to 9 so therefore now root will point to 9 moving ahead so friends here you can see for the node 9 we have completely visited its left subtree and we have printed 4 and 2 then we actually visited the right subtree completely and we printed 3 so now is the time to visit the node 9 so we are simply printing the data on the console for the root which is pointing to node 9. So now 9 will be printed on the console. And from the line number 8 we know that we have completely executed this post order method. So this would be removed from the call stack. And once this is removed from the call stack we know that there are no more methods left to be traversed. So here we have actually successfully executed this recursive post order traversal to this binary tree and we have printed its each and every node on the console as 4, 2, 3, 9. So friends this was the demonstration of the algorithm. Now let's go to Eclipse and see the working code. So friends in my previous tutorial I had created one class by name binary tree and we actually implemented the binary tree into this class. So in order to understand the implementation of this binary tree, you can watch my previous tutorials. So in this tutorial, we will actually code recursive post order traversal of a binary tree. So here I will create one method as public void post order. 
so this is the same method which we discussed in the slide so this method takes in a root which is of type tree node so first we'll provide the base case which is we will check whether root is equal to null or not so if root is equal to null then we'll simply return from this method so this is nothing but the base case because we are calling this post order method recursively so friends as we discussed in our slide that in post order tree traversal before visiting any node we will first visit his left subtree and then we will visit his right subtree and then we can visit the actual node so first we will visit the left subtree by calling root.left and then we will visit its right subtree by calling root dot right and after visiting the left subtree and the right subtree we will actually visit the node so we will simply print root dot data on the console so friend this is the code for recursive post order binary tree traversal so now let's test it's working on the main method so here in the main method we'll first initialize this binary tree class and then we'll create the binary tree so in create binary tree method we are actually creating the binary tree with few nodes and these are the same nodes which you discussed in the slide and we also discussed this method in my previous tutorials so you can watch my previous tutorials in order to understand how we have created this binary tree with a few nodes. So after creating this binary tree, we'll actually call the post order method and we'll also pass the root into it. So if I run the code now, so you can see it printed 4, 2, 3, 9 which is the same output which we discussed in the slide so friend in this tutorial we discussed about the recursive post order binary tree traversal i hope you like this video please like comment share and subscribe my youtube channel thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in this video we will discuss about the iterative post order traversal of a binary tree so in our previous videos we discussed about the recursive post order traversal of a binary tree and in this lecture we will see the iterative approach to traverse the binary tree using the post order. So here you can see let's say we are given with this binary tree and we want to traverse this binary tree using the iterative post order traversal. So in our previous video when we discussed about the recursive approach to traverse the binary tree we discussed that in order to traverse a binary tree using post order what we do is before visiting the root we visit all its element on the left subtree then we visit all its element on the right subtree and then we actually visit the root and usually these three steps we perform on each and every node of a binary tree when we do the traversal in a recursive way so in case you want to learn more about that, you can watch my previous video. So the only thing we need to remember here is when we do post order traversal on every node, we need to first traverse all its elements on the left side. Then we need to visit all its elements on the right side and then we can actually visit the node. So for example, if we are on node two, then we can't directly visit the node two. We need to visit first the node 4 then we need to visit node 5 and then only we can visit the node when we are performing the post order traversal so in this video we will discuss the iterative approach where we are not performing any recursion so when we perform post order traversal using the iterative way we usually take the help of a stack so stack is nothing but a LIFO data structure which means last in first out where the last element inserted will be the first one to be removed. So we will use the stack data structure 
to traverse this binary tree using the post order traversal so let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step so at the first step what we do is we create a tree node current we simply points to the root and in the middle of this algorithm we are also creating one temporary tree node we will see their advantages later in the algorithm so in the first step we are simply creating the current and pointing it to root then we are actually creating the stack data structure so this is our stack data structure and we are using the stack class present in java so as we want to perform this post order traversal we need to visit each and every node of this binary tree and as we are following a iterative approach we are providing a while loop where we are providing the two conditions first is the current is not equal to null or stack is not empty so here you can see current is pointing to a node having value as 1 therefore this condition comes out to be true because current is not equal to null so the overall condition of this while loop comes out to be true because any of this condition if comes out to be true this while loop will execute so here you can see in the first step what we are checking is that if current is not equal to null then we simply go inside this if block or else we perform this logic so why we are providing this condition here is let's say current is pointing to a node having data as 1 and let's suppose we want to visit this node so if the current is not equal to null then we can't directly visit this node we need to first visit all the elements of its left subtree and then we need to visit all the nodes of its right subtree and then only we can visit this node so current will be null at this location and when current will be null then we can simply decide that now can we visit the node or not so here as current is not equal to null so there can be a possibility that this node has a left subtree so what we do is we simply push node 1 into the stack and then we simply traverse to its left by assigning current's left to current so current is pointing to node 1 its left is pointing to node 2 so now current will point to node 2 we again check where current is equal to null or not so current is not equal to null so the first condition comes out to be true and we don't evaluate the second condition because of this or operator so this while loop will execute we check whether current is equal to null or not so current is not equal to null so this condition also comes out to be true because there can be a possibility that node 2 has a left subtree so what we do is we simply push the current on the stack so 2 will be on the stack and then we simply visit current to its left so current will now point to 2's left which is 4 and similarly current is not equal to null so this condition comes out to be true here current is not equal to null because it is pointing to node 4 so we simply push current onto the stack because there can be a possibility that there is a left subtree or a right subtree so 4 is on the stack and we go to its left by assigning current's left to current so current will point to its left which is null value so friends here you can see now current is actually pointing to null now if the current is pointing to null so this null can be on the left side of this node or on the right side of its node so if the current is on the left side of the node then we know that we need to visit the right side also before visiting this node but if the current is on the right side of the node then we know that we have already visited left we have already visited right now we can visit this node so in the post order we discussed that in order to visit any node we need to visit all its left children then we need to visit all its right children 
so if current is pointing to a null then there can be two possibilities that this null value can be on the left side and this null can be on the right side so if the null is on the left side we need to visit the right subtree for this node and if the current is on the right side then we know that we have already visited left and we have already visited right then we can simply visit the node so here current is equal to null so this condition comes out to be false but our second condition the stack is not empty so this condition comes out to be true and overall condition comes out to be true so while loop will execute this if check will fail because current is actually pointing to null so now we'll go to the else part so in the first step what we do is we create a temporary variable and we assign a value stack dot peak dot right so here you can see in the stack whichever is the last element inserted is the peak of the stack so when we do stack dot peak we are simply pointing to this node four and if we do dot right then we are actually pointing to nodes right so here this is four and right will be null so we will see why we are creating this temporary variable so for timing you can see that temp is pointing to null now here we are given two conditions that whether temp is equal to null or temp is not equal to null so why we have provided this condition is because let's say if current is pointing to null then we need to somehow check that whether this null value is on the left side of node 4 or on the right side of the node 4 so in order to verify that thing we created this temporary node so as current is pointing to null so this can be any left or right child of a node and we also know that this node will be already present on the stack and if you want to know that whether we are on the left side or on the right side what we do is we simply go to this node and go to its right so here temporary variable is doing that for us so here why we are providing this check here is if temp is equal to null so this will signify that whatever the value was on the stack its right is actually pointing to null and there are no nodes left to be traversed on the right side of this node so what we can simply do here is pull this element out because we are now sure that as current is pointing to null and temporary is pointing to null which means that we have traversed the left subtree and the right subtree for this node so now we can simply pull this node out and we can simply visit it so we'll pull this element out and now temp will point to 4 and in the next step we'll simply visit the temp so we are simply printing the data of the temp which is 4 here so friends why we actually do all this stuff is when current actually reaches to any null value then we need to be sure that whether it's on the left side or on the right side so we simply create a temporary variable to simply peak the right side of a node present in the stack and if the temp is equal to null then it simply signifies that there are no nodes on the right side and we have already visited the left side so now it's turn to visit the actual node so we have visited 4 here moving ahead so friend now here we provide a while loop and why we have provided a while loop because the first thing we are checking is stack is not empty so as we have recently pulled an element out of it so there can be a chance that stack becomes empty so stack should not be empty and the second condition is very important which is the core of this algorithm is we are simply checking whether temp is stack dot peaks right so here you can see so as we have recently visited this node here so there can be a possibility and we need to be sure that whether this node is on the left of 2 or on the right of the 2 because if it is on the left of 2 then we can't directly visit 2 we need to go to its right and visit node 5 but if it is on the right side then we can simply visit the node 2 so here stack peak is node 2 this and its right 
which is this value is node 5 so we are simply checking whether this node which we visited just now its value is equal to its parents right or not so if this value comes out to be true then we know that that parent right is actually the node which we just now visited so we can simply visit the parent now but here you can see temp is pointing to 4 and stack peak which is the node 2 is pointing to right therefore they are not equal which means that whatever the node we have visited just now it's on the left side not on the right side of node 2 so this while loop will terminate and our call will reach to this while loop again so friends here why we have provided this while loop it will be clear when we reach here so for timing you can just think that we have provided a while loop here so moving ahead here you can see current is pointing to null but stack is not empty so the overall condition comes out to be true current is equal to null so we go in the else now in the first step what we do is we simply assign the stack peaks right value so stack peak is node 2 this node and its right is node 5 so temp will point to 5 so friends why we are assigning this value now here is as current is pointing to null and we have recently visited node 4 and we also verified here that node is at the left of 2 so there can be a possibility that node 2 might have a right subtree and in post order traversal after visiting the left part we need to visit the right part and then only we can visit the parent so here we are simply assigning the value of stack dot peak dot right so 2's right is 5 so temp will point to 5 and here we will check whether temp is equal to null or not so here temp is not equal to null which signifies that the right part there is a node which also can have left and right children so and we can't directly visit this node because there might be a possibility that it contains left and right children so here if the if this condition comes out to be false and we go in the else part where we'll assign the current to the temp so why we are assigning current to temp because this 5 can be treated like any other node which can have the left and right children so as we started by pointing current to root it is similar to that step that this node can have a left or a right children so we need to perform all those steps again on this node so here current is not equal to null so this condition comes out to be true and if the current is not equal to null so this is the same case which we discussed here that current is not equal to null there can be a chance that this node have a left children so what we do is we first push the 5 on the stack and then we go to its left by assigning current's left to current so current will point to null so as current is pointing to null so this condition is false but our second condition is true because stack is not empty and here you can see current is equal to null so this condition also comes out to be false and we go into the else part in the first step we are assigning stack peaks right value to temp so stack peak is node 5 this node and its right is this value so we are assigning null to temp and then we are simply providing this check because if temp is null then we know that current is already pointing to null which is the left part and temp is also pointing to null which is the right part so if it signifies that its parent has no child left and right children so we can simply visit the parent now so in the first step what we do is we pull the topmost element which is the which is the node 5 and we'll assign it to temp so first this will pull out and temp will point to 5 so we can safely visit this node because we have already visited its left and right children so 5 will be visited here and then we are providing this while loop which we will discuss when we reach here 
so just for timing thing that we are providing this value to check whether the node which we have visited is on the left or on the right side of its parent so currently stack dot peak is 2 which is parent to 5 and if we see here dot right is this value only and temp is also pointing to this node so this condition temp equal equal stack dot peak dot right is actually true because we are on the right side of the parent and we have already visited this node so now we can simply pull this element out and we can simply visit because we have already visited its left part and the right part so this while loop condition will come out to be true we are pulling two out and temp will point to node 2 and then we are simply printing the data of this node by visiting it so 2 will be printed so as it is a while loop we are again checking that whatever node we visited just now is it on the left side or on the right side of its parent so the first condition is stack should not be empty because we have recently pulled an element out so there can be a possibility the stack is empty so here stack is not empty and the second check verifies that whatever the value we have here which is the parent to this node so here we are simply verifying that this temp is on its left or on its right side so temp is actually on the left side so this condition comes out to be false so our execution point reaches to this while loop where here you can see current is equal to null but stack is not empty so here current is equal to null so this condition comes out to be false in the else part we will assign stack dot peak dot write value to temp so stack dot peak is 1 and its write is node 3 so temp will now point to node 3 moving ahead we check whether temp is equal to null or not so temp is not equal to null so this condition comes out to be false so if this condition would have come out to be true and temp would have point to null then we could have visited this node directly but as temp is not equal to null so there can be a possibility that this node can have left or right children so we simply go to the else part and we assign the value of temp to current so now current will point to this node because we have figured out that there can be a possibility that 3 can have left or right children so current will point to 3 so now this is the same situation which we saw in the start that current is not equal to null and if current is not equal to null there can be a possibility that there could be a left children of it so we are simply pushing the current onto the stack so 3 will be on the stack and then we go to its left by assigning current's left to current so current will now point to null so as current is equal to null but stack is not empty this overall condition comes out to be true so we check whether current is equal to null or not so current is equal to null so in the else part we will assign stack's peak right value to temp so stack peak is node 3 and its right is 6 so now temp will point to 6 and here we check whether temp is equal to null or not but here you can see temp is not equal to null so there can be a possibility 6 can also have left or right children so in the else part we simply assign current to 6 current is not equal to null and in the if check also current is not equal to null and there can be a possibility that 6 can have left children so we push 6 on the stack and we go to its left by assigning current left to current so current will point to null now which is the left of 6 
करंट इज इक्वल टू नल बट स्टैक इज नॉट एम्प्टी सो दिस कंडीशन कम्स आउट टू बी ट्रू एंड ओवरऑल कंडीशन कम्स आउट टू बी ट्रू बिकॉज ऑफ दिस ऑर ऑपरेटर ये द इफ कंडीशन कम्स आउट टू बी फॉल्स बिकॉज करंट इज पॉइंटिंग टू नल एंड देन वी सिंपली असाइन स्टैक डॉट पीक डॉट राइट टू टैम्प सो स्टैक पीक इज नोट सिक्स दिस नोट एंड इट्स राइट इज दिस नोट सो टैम्प विल नाउ पॉइंट टू नल एंड यर वी आर प्रोवाइडिंग दिस चेक दैट इफ टैम्प इज इक्वल टू नल विच मीन्स दैट करंट इज पॉइंटिंग टू नल एंड वॉट एवर इट्स पेरेंट इज इट्स राइट इज ऑल्सो पॉइंटिंग टू नल सो वी कैन सेफली विजिट दिस नोट विच इज द पेरेंट सो हाउ वी कैन सेफली विजिट दैट नोट इज फर्स्ट विल पोल दैट एलिमेंट आउट ऑफ द स्टैक सो सिक्स विल बी पोल्ड आउट एंड टेन विल पॉइंट टू सिक्स we will visit this node so 6 will be visited now friends here we encountered a while loop and we discussed that why we are providing this while loop is because the first check is stack should not be empty so stack has two nodes therefore it's not empty now as we have recently visited this node so after visiting this node we need to be very much sure that whether this node was at left or was it right to its parent which is 3 we can access 3 by stack speak which is by getting this value and if we call dot write if we call dot write then we'll reach here only so if temp is equal to this value only then we know that we are actually on the right side of temp's parent which signifies that we have already visited the left part we have completely visited the right part and now we can simply visit the parent so here we pull the parent out and temp will point to 3 we visit 3 and we again encounter the while loop so friends here you can see that this while loop is provided because if this is the condition here then here you can see the stack is not empty and as we have visited 3 so this 3 can also be the right child of its parent so therefore we are providing this while loop let's say if this chain goes on like this and there are no left nodes so this while loop will simply make us traverse back because all these nodes are on the right side of its parent which we have already visited so that's why we are providing this while loop so here again we are simply checking whether temp is pointing to its parents right or not so here stack dot peak will give us one its right will give us node 3 and temp is also pointing to node 3 so this while loop condition will come out to be true and we can simply pull one out because we have visited all the left sub tree of the node 1 and we have recently visited all the nodes on the right sub tree of 1 so we can simply pull the one out tam will point to 1 and we can simply visit node 1 now so node 1 will be visited here and finally we again check whether stack is empty or not so here you can see we have recently pulled one element out so stack is empty so this condition comes out to be false and the while loop will terminate and once the while loop will terminate our call will go reach here so here you can see current is equal to null this condition is false and our stack is also empty which signifies that we have completely visited this binary tree using the post order traversal so this whole condition will come out to be false so friends here you can see that using a stack we visited all the nodes of this binary tree using the post order traversal so this was the sequence first four was visited then five got visited because before visiting two we need to visit its left part then we need to visit the right part and then we can actually visit the node so two was visited after that 
now we can't directly visit one because we need to traverse all the nodes of its right subtree so we reached here we saw that three didn't have any left part so we can't visit three directly we went to its right we saw that six left and right both are null so we simply visited six then after we visited six which was on the right side we safely visited three and three was also on the right side so we safely visited one so this is the post order traversal of a binary tree so friend this was all about this video and in case you have liked this video then please like comment share and subscribe my channel thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in our previous lecture we discussed that how we can do post order traversal of a binary tree using the iterative approach so in this video we will code the algorithm and we'll test its working so here you can see in intellij i have created one class as binary tree so this class we created in our previous videos which has a root of type tree node so this is the private class inside this binary tree which simply has left and right children we discussed other traversal algorithms such as pre order in order and we also saw recursive and iterative approaches so in this video we'll see the post order traversal of a binary tree using the iterative approach so here i will be creating one method as public void i will give a name as post order so here when we discussed post order traversal using the recursive approach we saw that before visiting the nodes data we need to visit first its left subtree then we need to visit its right subtree and then only we can visit the nodes data so this was a recursive approach which got implied on each and every node of the binary tree so when we perform the iterative approach we usually use the while loop and we traverse each and every node of the binary tree keeping the post order traversal in mind and the data structure will help us doing this is the stack data structure which is the leafo data structure which is also known as the last in first out so the last element inserted inside that data structure will be the first one to be removed so we discussed this algorithm step by step in our previous video using an animation so now let's code the algorithm and test its working so in post order method the first thing we do is we create a tree node current which starts from the root of the binary tree whose traversal we need to do in the second step we create a stack which will hold our tree nodes we give it a name as stack and we are using java.utils stack class we can also use our stack which we discussed in our previous videos but here i will be using the java.util stack now in order to perform the post order traversal we need to provide a while loop and inside that while loop we provide a condition as current should not be equal to null or stack should not be empty so here you can see that current is pointing to root and we need to go inside this while loop to traverse each and every node of the binary tree using post order so the first condition we provide is current should not be equal to null and when current is equal to null then the logic we apply will see later in the algorithm and the other thing is the stack should not be empty so here you can see in this while loop we provide a condition as current not equals to null so if current is not equal to null then it signifies that we can't visit the current directly we need to first go to its left subtree and visit that 
then we have to go to its right subtree and visit that and then only we can visit that particular node so if current is not equal to null so there is a possibility that current might have a left subtree so the first step we do is we simply offer or you can say push the current on the stack and after pushing current on the stack we simply go to its left by assigning current's left value to current and if current is equal to null then we provide else part where what we do is we create a temporary node and we assign the stacks peak values right to it so friends here if the current is pointing to null then we need to follow these steps to identify that whether that current is actually the left child of the parent or at the right child of the parent because if it is the left child of the parent then we can't visit parent directly we need to go to its right first but if it is the right child of the parent then we can simply visit the parent so if the current is equal to null in order to identify that the first thing we do is we take its parent which is on the stack and we'll simply assign the right value to temp so here after getting this temp there are basically two conditions one is what if the temp is also null so this check basically signifies that if temp is pointing to null and as we have moved to parents right and temp is pointing to null it means that there are no right children of the parent so we can simply visit the parent because when we do post order traversal in order to visit the parent we first visit its left subtree and then we visit its right subtree and then only we can visit the parent and as we are on the right part and that is coming as null it means that we have visited the right part and now we can safely visit the parent so here what we do is we simply pop the element from the stack and assign it to the temp so once the temp is pointing to parent what we do is we simply visit the parent by printing its data on the console and after visiting the node we again provide a while loop and inside that while loop we provide the condition a stack should not be empty because we have recently popped an element from the stack so stack can be empty so here we are providing this one condition that stack should not be empty till this point and so here as we have visited this node now this node can be a children of its parent and it can be on the left side or on the right side so there are also now two conditions coming up here if the temp is on the left side then we know that we need to go to the parents right now because we have visited the temp here but if the temp is on the right side then we know that we have once we have visited the right side we can simply visit the parent so here we need to provide one more condition as if temp is equal to stack dot peak dot right so this condition signifies that whatever the peak values are on the stack it would be parent to temp and if its right value is equal to temp it means the temp is on the right side so if it is on the right side then we can simply again pull the element from the stack assign it to temp and we can simply visit that and also friends as here we are popping out an element and visiting it we need to provide this in while loop because there can be a chance that whatever we are visiting it's actually coming out to be the right of the parent so once this condition comes out to be true and we pop the parent from the stack there can also be a chance that whatever we 
visited here will also be on its right of its parent so we need to provide this while loop because whenever we are visiting any element by printing it on the console here or here we need to simply perform this check that what we visited was at the right of its parent or was it at the left of its parent so if it is on the right of its parent which is this condition then we'll simply keep on popping the element out and simply printing its data because in the post order traversal this is the main step that once the right children of any node is visited then only we can visit the parent so here this condition is signifying that only so this was the part in the if condition and let's say if the temp is not equal to null it means that when we peek the parent element and we went to its right that was not null so before visiting right directly there can be a possibility that right also has left or right children so therefore this two checks are important if temp is null then we are sure that right is already visited we pop the element out we print its data and then we again check it for its parent but if the temp is not equal to null then we know that we need to visit the right part also and once we go to its right part the right part can also have its own left and right children so here now our condition becomes something like this what we did here so here what we do is we simply assign the value of temp because it is not equal to null to current so friend this was all about this algorithm now let's test its working in the main method so friends here you can see that in our previous videos we created one binary tree with this hard coded values so where root was pointing to 1 one, one had two childrens left and right as second and third this two second had two childrens left and right as fourth and fifth this two and third node had left and right as sixth and seventh so these two nodes so here one is at the root second and third are its left and right children four and five are left and right children of two and six and seven are left and right children of three so this was the hard coded binary tree so here after creating this binary tree what we can do is we can simply call the post order and we can run the program So friends, here you can see it printed four, five, two, six, seven, three, one. Here in this binary tree, before visiting one, which was the root, we need to visit two and three. So two was at left. So when we reach to two, we can't visit two directly because two also has left and right children, which is four and five. So when we reach to four. we found it four didn't have any left and right children so the first thing we visited was four because this was the left of two and then we visited five because five was right of two and after visiting the left and right children we visited two here and once we visited two we know that we have visited all the left children of the actual root so now it was time to go to its right binary tree so when we went to one's right we found 3 so we can't visit 3 directly because 3 has a left and right children which is 6 and 7 so when we went to 6 we found that 6 didn't have any left and right children so we safely visited 6 and then we safely visited 7 because 7 was right to 3 so after visiting 6 and 7 which was the left and right children of 3 now we can safely visit 3 and once we visited 3 we were pretty much sure that we have visited all the nodes of the right subtree of the actual root which was 1 so finally we visited 1 so friend this was all about the post order traversal and in this video we demonstrated about the iterative approach using the stack data structure
सो हियर इन केस यू फाइंड एनी डिफिकल्टी यू कैन वॉच माई प्रीवियस वीडियो टू दिस विच हैड ऑल द थिंग्स इन एनिमेशन सो दैट इट बिकम्स मोर क्लियर टू यू एंड इन केस यू हैव लाइक दिस वीडियो देन प्लीज लाइक कमेंट शेयर एंड सब्सक्राइब माई चैनल थैंक्स एव अस डे हेलो फ्रेंड्स वेलकम टू माई न्यू डेटा स्ट्रक्चर्स एंड एलगोरेथम इन जावा ट्यूटोरियल सीरीज वीडियो फ्रेंड्स इन दिस ट्यूटोरियल वी विल डिस्कस लेवल ऑर्डर ट्रेवर्सल ऑफ ए बाइनरी ट्री इन जावा सो फ्रेंड्स व्हाट इज द लेवल ऑर्डर ट्रेवर्सल सो हियर वी यूज दिस ट्रेवर्सल टेक्निक टू विजिट द नोट्स ऑफ ए बाइनरी ट्री लेवल बाय लेवल सो हियर यू कैन सी द रूट इज एट लेवल जीरो टू एंड थ्री आर एट लेवल वन फोर फाइव सिक्स आर एट लेवल टू सो इन दिस ट्रेवर्सल टेक्निक वी फर्स्ट विजिट द लेवल जीरो देन वी विजिट the level 1 and then we visit the level 2 so when we actually visit the node and print its data on the console so it will be like first one will be printed then two then three then four five and six so here when we do a level order traversal of a particular level then we actually store the elements of its next level on a additional data structure which is nothing but the queue so here suppose we are visiting the node 1 then on the queue we put the node 2 and node 3 so that after visiting the node 1 we can pull the node 2 and node 3 and we can visit them and while we are visiting the node 2 we put 4 and 5 on the queue and when we are visiting the node 3 we put node 6 on the queue so therefore it goes level by level and the additional data structure which we use to store this element is a queue so basically in this traversal we are using queue because it is a fifo data structure which is nothing but first in first out so the element inserted first will be the first to be removed we will see its significance when we demonstrate the algorithm so let's start execution of this algorithm step by step so let's suppose we are given this binary tree where root is pointing to the node 1 So when this algorithm starts we first check whether root is equal to null or not. So if root is equal to null then we simply return from the method because because there are no nodes in the binary tree to be traversed. And here you can see as root is pointing to the node 1 therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false. And in next step what we do we first initialize the queue data structure. So here you can see the queue data structure where nodes are entered from one end and they are removed from the other end so this property makes q a fifo data structure that is the element inserted first is the first one to be removed and in order to know more about the queues you can watch my previous tutorials on the queue data structure and in this tutorial we will use the java implementation of the queue which is nothing but a linked list so we will initialize the queue by creating the instance of the linked list so after creating the queue what we first do is we offer the root node to the queue here offer is nothing but the enqueue operation where we add the element to the queue so in the first step what we do is we offer the root node to the queue so it would look something like this as root is pointing to node 1 therefore in the first step what we do is we basically add node 1 into the queue so it would look something like this that is the node 1 is in the queue moving ahead so friends in order to traverse this binary tree using the level order traversal we basically use a while loop and inside this while loop we place a condition as that we will iterate this while loop till queue is empty so currently you can see queue is having one node which is node 1 therefore it's not empty so the condition in while block comes out to be true So in the first step what we do is we actually pull the element from the queue and we assign it to the temporary node So here you can see queue is having one tree node having data as one So when we perform a pull operation on the queue node 1 will be removed and its value will be assigned to temp so it would look something like this So node 1 is removed from the queue and temp is now pointing to the node 1 
so whatever the value we pulled from the queue we simply assigned it to the temporary node moving ahead so after pulling the node from the queue we simply print its data on the console so one got printed on the console it means we have visited the node one and as we discussed earlier that when we visit any particular level we store the elements of its next level on the queue so here we first check that whether temp dot left is equal to null or not so temp is pointing to node one and its left is pointing to node two therefore the condition in if block comes out to be true because temp dot left is not equal to null so in the if block we simply offer temp dot left element to the queue which is nothing but the node two so it would look something like this that now node two is on the queue moving ahead we then check whether tam dot right is equal to null or not so here you can see tam dot right is pointing to node three therefore it's not equal to null so the condition in if block comes out to be true and here we simply offer tam dot right which is the node three on the queue so now node three is also on the queue moving ahead now in the while loop we check whether queue is empty or not so currently queue has two nodes therefore it's not empty so the condition in while block comes out to be true and then we simply pull an element from the queue and we'll assign it to temp node so here you can see when we do a pull on the queue the element which was inserted first would be the first to be removed so therefore now two will be removed first and temp will point to the node two so it would look something like this that node 2 is removed from the queue and its value will be assigned to the temp so it means that temp is pointing to the node 2 moving ahead and then we will simply print the data associated with the temporary node which is nothing but the 2 so 2 will be printed on the console moving ahead and when we are visiting the node 2 of any particular level then, then we have to add its left and right element on the queue so here first we will check whether temp dot left is equal to null or not so currently temp dot left is pointing to node 4 therefore it's not null so the condition in if block comes out to be true and then we will offer temp dot left to the queue which is nothing but the node 4 so now node 4 will be part of the queue moving ahead and then we will check whether temp dot right is equal to null or not so temp dot right is nothing but the node 5 and it's not equal to null so the condition in if block comes out to be true and we'll simply add the node 5 on the queue moving ahead we again check whether queue is empty or not so currently queue has three nodes therefore it's not empty so the condition in while block comes out to be true and then we'll simply pull the element from the queue so when we perform a pull operation the element which was inserted first is first to be removed so here you can see node 3 is the first element so now it will be removed from the queue and its value will be assigned to the temporary node so it would look something like this So node 3 is removed and its value is assigned to the temporary node. So now temp is pointing to the node 3. Moving ahead. And then we'll simply print the data associated with the temporary node, which is nothing but 3. So 3 gets printed on the console. And then we'll simply check whether temp.left is equal to null or not. So here you can see temp.left is nothing but node 6, therefore it's not equal to null so the condition in if block comes out to be true and then we'll simply store the node 6 on the queue moving ahead 
and then we will check whether tam dot right is equal to null or not. So here you can see tam dot right is equal to null. So therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false because we are not storing the null value on the queue. We again check whether queue is empty or not. So currently queue has three nodes, therefore it's not empty. And the first step we simply pull the element from the queue and we'll assign it to the temporary node. So here node 4 will be removed from the queue and temp will now point to the node 4. So it would look something like this. So now temp is pointing to the node 4. And now we'll simply print the data associated with the temporary node which is nothing but 4. So 4 will be printed on the console. And then we'll simply check whether temp left is equal to null or not. So temp left is equal to null. Therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false. And we'll check whether temp right is equal to null or not. So temp right is also equal to null. Therefore condition in if block comes out to be false. And then again in while loop we'll check whether queue is empty or not. So currently queue has two nodes. Therefore it's not empty. So the condition of while block comes out to be true. And in the first step we'll simply pull the first element from the queue which is nothing but node 5 and we'll assign it to the temporary node. So it would look something like this. So now temp will point to the node 5. Moving ahead. Then we'll simply print the data associated with the temporary node which is nothing but 5. So now 5 will be printed on the console. Moving ahead. And then we will check whether temp left is equal to null or not. So currently you can see temp left is equal to null. Therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false. And then we will check whether temp right is equal to null or not. So here temp right is equal to null. Therefore the condition in the if block comes out to be false. And then we go to while loop and we'll check whether Q is empty or not. So currently Q has one node left. Therefore it's not empty. So the condition in while block comes out to be true. So we'll simply pull the element from the queue which is nothing but the node 6 and we'll assign it to temporary node. So it would look something like this. So the node 6 is removed and now temp will point to the node 6. Moving ahead. So finally we will print the data associated with the temporary node which is nothing but 6. So we have printed the data associated with the node 6. Moving ahead. We will check whether temp left is equal to null or not. So currently temp left is equal to null. Therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false. And then we will check whether temp right is equal to null or not. So temp right is equal to null. Therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false. And finally we will again check whether queue is empty or not. So currently here you can see queue is empty. So therefore the condition in while block comes out to be false. Because queue is empty. So there are no more nodes left to be traversed. So therefore this while loop terminates. And we know that we have visited all the nodes of this binary tree level by level. So here you can see we first traversed node 1, then we visited node 2, then 3, then 4, then 5, then 6. So friend this is the algorithm for the level order traversal of a binary tree. Now let's go to Eclipse and see its working code. So friends in my previous tutorial I had created one class by name binary tree and we implemented the binary tree into this class. So you can watch my previous tutorial to know more about how we have implemented the binary tree. So in this tutorial I will be coding the algorithm for level order traversal of a binary tree. So here I will be creating one method as public void and I will give the name to its level order. So in this method we will be coding the level order traversal 
of a binary tree so in the first step we'll check whether root is equal to null or not so if root is equal to null then we'll simply return from this method because there are no nodes in the binary tree to be traversed and then we'll initialize a queue which will hold the tree nodes for us and here we are using the java implementation of the queue so we'll import it from the java.util package so after we create the instance of this queue we'll simply offer the root node Now we'll create a while loop and inside this while loop we'll place a condition s that we iterate this while loop till q is empty. So inside this while loop we'll first create a tree node by name temp and to this temporary node we'll pull the element from q and we'll assign its value to the temporary node. and after polling the element from q we'll simply print its data on the console so we'll do temp.data so after printing the data associated with the temp node we will store its left and right node on the queue so we'll first check that whether temp left is equal to null or not so if it is not equal to null then we'll simply offer it to the queue and similarly we'll do this for the temp right so I'll just copy it and I will make it to temp right So friend this is the algorithm for the level order traversal of a binary tree. Now let's test is working in the main method. So in the main method we will first create the instance of this binary tree class and then we will actually create the binary tree. So here you can see I have created this binary tree with the few nodes. So this is the binary tree which we discussed in the slide. And in order to know more about this create binary tree method, you can watch my previous tutorials. So after creating this binary tree, we will then call the method level order. And if I run the code now, so here you can see it printed 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 which we actually discussed in the slide that it prints level by level. So friends in this tutorial we discussed about the level order traversal of a binary tree. I hope you like this video. Please like, comment, share and subscribe my youtube channel. Thanks have a nice day. Hello everyone. So in this video we will discuss that how we can find the maximum value in a binary tree and we'll discuss an algorithm which is recursive in nature so here you can see let's say we are given with this binary tree having nodes as 4 3 7 5 and 8 and 4 is at the root so let's say we want to find the maximum value inside this binary tree so looking at this binary tree we know that 8 is the maximum value but how to find whether 8 is the maximum value in this binary tree is using this algorithm which is recursive in nature because here you can see the method name is findmax which takes in a root and inside that it again calls findmax. So here findmax method is calling itself at two places at line number 6 and line number 7. 
so therefore this algorithm is recursive in nature so here the idea behind finding the maximum value in a binary tree is let's say we know the value of root and we know what's the maximum value in the left sub tree and what's the maximum value in the right sub tree so we can simply compare the maximum value of the left sub tree with the roots value and then we can compare with the maximum value of the right sub tree and we can come to know what's the maximum value among these three values so this idea can be applied on each and every node recursively so for example if you want to find the maximum value of this binary tree having three nodes as 3 5 and 8 we can simply take the roots value then we need to calculate the maximum value of the left sub tree and the maximum value of right sub tree and we need to simply compare these three values and we will get the maximum value till this node so this algorithm is recursive we need to apply these three steps on each and every node and using this algorithm we will also traverse each and every node because in order to find which is the maximum value among this binary tree we need to traverse each and every node so let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step so that the idea of finding the maximum value inside this binary tree will be more clear to you also here you can see as this algorithm is recursive in nature when find max will get executed it will internally call again the find max so in order to keep the track of these methods we will create a table which will be nothing but our call stack so let's see how this algorithm and this call stack works together so at the first step we are calling the find max method and we are passing in the root of the binary tree whose maximum value we need to calculate so on the call stack you will find one find max method whose root is pointing to a node having value as 4 so here you can see that this table has five values line number root result left and right so as the algorithm is recursive in nature when we will leave this find max method and we'll again call find max we'll simply keep the track of the line number here we'll keep the track of the root result left and right which we will see later how they are important moving ahead so here as the algorithm is recursive in nature we need to provide a base case so that we can exit from the algorithm if we don't provide this base case then this find max will again call find max and it will go on because there will be no end so we need to provide this base case that if the root is null here then we can simply return the minimum value from here so for example if the root is pointing to null so we will simply return the minimum integer value because null can signify that this is the minimal value as the return type is integer we need to return a value so we simply return the minimum value of the integer because the minimum value of integer won't affect the maximum value of this binary tree so here currently we are providing a check that if root is equal to null then simply return the integer's minimum value so currently root is pointing to 4 therefore this condition comes out to be false also friends we discussed the idea that how we can find the maximum value of any node and its left and right children is finding the maximum value of this left sub tree finding the maximum value of its right sub tree and comparing it with the roots value so here this three line will do that in the result we are simply storing the roots value so here in the result it will be coming as 4 moving ahead so now we'll traverse to the left of this binary tree in order to find the maximum value of the left sub tree so we are simply again calling the find max method but this time we are passing in roots dot left so root is pointing to 4 and its left is pointing to 3 so 3 will be our new node and here you can see we are leaving this find max method at line number 6 so we'll simply keep the track of line number here so that when this find max will end we know that where to start this find max 
so we'll simply store the line number which is six, and we will again call the find max method passing in roots left node. So on the call stack, it would look that find max method is called. We have left this find max method here at line number six, and we are again called find max, and this time the root is roots left, which is three. So now root will point to three. Moving ahead, root is not equal to null. Again, we will apply the algorithm recursively on this node. So first, we will store the roots data, so which is three. Now, in order to find the maximum value till this node is, we need to find the maximum value of its left subtree. We need to find the maximum value of its right subtree. And we need to compare those value with the roots value. So first we'll go to the left of this root. So we will call find max again, and this time we'll pass roots left, which is five. But we are leaving this find max method, so we'll keep simply keep the track of this line number. So which is six. So now find max will be called again with roots left, which is five. So our new root will become five. Root is not equal to null, so this condition comes out to be false. And now we'll apply our algorithm recursively to this node. We will first store the roots data in the result, which is five, and then we will again call find max method. To simply calculate what's the maximum value of its left subtree, and we are leaving this find max method at line number six, so we'll simply store line number six here. So there will be one more method on the call stack, but this time the root value will be null because five's left is null. Here we are calling roots left, so roots left is null. So now root will point to null. Here we will check whether root is equal to null or not. So here you can see that we have encountered a base case that root is equal to null. So here we will simply return the minimum value of the integer because as root left is null, so there are no more nodes to traverse, and we will simply return the least value of the integers, which is Integers min value, whose value is this, because this value is negative in number, therefore it won't affect the maximum value of this binary tree. And as the left child is null, so we can simply return the minimum value of the integer. So we are returning the integers min value. So here you can see that we are leaving this find max method here, and once we leave this find max method here, this call will go to this method. Because this find max method had called this find max method, and we also know that we had left at line number six, so we'll start our execution from line number six. And as we are returning the integers min value, so this find max method will get that value. So it would look something like this. This method will be removed from the call stack. Execution point will reach here. We will start our execution from line number six because we had left this method at line number six, and here you can see whatever the value this find max method returned, we will simply store in this integer variable left. So which was the integer's min value? So in the left, we will simply store the minimum value of the integer. So I am simply denoting it by I M V here, and when we were executing this find max method. Here you can see root was pointing to five, so again root will point to five, and we will proceed ahead with this method. So here you can see we have this roots value which is five. We have calculated the maximum value of the left. Now we will calculate the maximum value of the right. So we will again call the find max method, but this time we will pass the roots right value. 
so here you can see that we will again have to leave this method at line number seven this time, and we will call find max method again, passing in roots right, which is null. So it would look something like this. Line number is updated here. Find max method will be called, and there will be one more method on the call stack with root as null. So now root will point to null. And why this root is pointing to null? Because we have called find max method by passing roots right, which is roots right is null. So here now root is equal to null. So we'll simply return the minimum value, and this method will be removed from the call stack, and the execution point will reach again on this method, and we'll start our execution from line number seven. So this method returned the integer minimum value, which will be stored in the right here. And when we have left this find max method, root was pointing to five. So now root will again point to five, and the execution will continue from here. So here you can see now we have got all the three values to compare. The roots value. The maximum value of its left subtree and the maximum value of its right subtree. So now we can simply perform this comparison for this node. So here we'll check whether left is greater than result or not. So left value is the minimum value of the integer. So therefore, this condition comes out to be false because value of left is integer's minimum value and result value is five. So five is greater than left. So this condition will come out to be false. We'll check whether writes is greater than result or not. So writes value is also integer minimum value. So this condition also comes out to be false. And here you can see that among this node, the maximum value is of the root, which is five. So we'll simply return five from this find max method. So now here you can see this find max method will be removed from the call stack, and the return value will be five. So this method will be removed from the call stack. The execution point will reach here, and we know that we have left this find max method at line number six. So we'll start execution from line number six. This find max return the value as five. So this five will be stored in the left variable here. And when we left this find max method, root was pointing to three. So now root will point to three. Moving ahead. So friends, for root three, we have already calculated the maximum value of its left subtree, which is five here. Now we need to simply calculate it for right subtree. So we'll again call find max method, and this time we'll pass roots right. Which is eight. So we will be leaving this method at line number seven here, and there will be one more method on the call stack with now new root as eight. So root will point to eight now. We check whether root is equal to null or not. So root is not equal to null. We will store roots data, which is eight. And now similarly, we'll perform this recursive algorithm for the root eight now. So here you can see, friends, these three steps we need to perform on each and every node. So what we did for five, now we'll again do it for eight. So we'll simply go fast here. Because we already seen what happens when the nulls are encountered. So first we'll update the line number, which is six, and there will be a find max method in the call stack because now we are going to roots left. So roots left is null. So this find max will be called with null value. Root will point to null. And root is equal to null, so we'll simply return the integer's minimum value, and this method will be removed from the call stack, and integer's min value will be returned to this find max method.
so it would look something like this we'll start execution from line number 6 where root will now point to 8 and the integer's minimum value which was written from this find vex method will be stored in the left here and similarly now we'll go to roots right so we'll update the line number here so find max method will be called again with the root as null root will be pointing to null and here root is equal to null so we'll simply return the minimum value of the integer so this method will be removed from the call stack and this method will start execution from line number 7 now where root will now point to 8 because when we left this find vex method root was pointing to 8 so root will point to 8 now and the integer's minimum value which was written from this find vex method will be stored in the right now and now as we have got this three values to compare we will check whether left is greater than 8 or not because we need to find the maximum value so left is not greater than 8 so this condition comes out to be false right is also not greater than result because right is storing the integer's minimum value and 8 is greater than this value so this condition also comes out to be false and we'll simply return 8 from this method because we have found the maximum value of this right subtree which is 8 so we'll simply return 8 from this find vex method so this method will be removed from the call stack and the execution point will reach to this method where we had left at line number 7 so we'll start from here and here root value was 3 so now root will point to 3 and we know that from the right we returned the value which is maximum as 8 so 8 will be stored in the right here so friends here you can see for this small binary tree we got the three values 5 was the maximum in the left subtree 8 was the maximum in the right subtree and we'll simply compare it with the root which is the result value so here we'll perform the comparison so we'll check whether left is greater than result or not so this condition comes out to be true because left value is 5 which is greater than 3 so we'll simply update the value of result with the maximum value which is 5 so this will become 5 we'll check whether right value is greater than result or not so value of right is 8 which is greater than result which is 5 so this condition also comes out to be true so we'll simply update the maximum value which is 8 into the result so this will become 8 and then we'll simply return 8 so from this find vex method we are returning 8 which is the maximum value among these three nodes so this method will be removed from the call stack and this method will start execution from line number 6 where root was pointing to 4 so root will now point to 4 and the value which this find max method return which was 8 will be stored in the left so here you can see that for the actual root of the binary tree we figured out what's the maximum value in the left subtree which is 8 so now we need to simply find the same for the right subtree we'll start our execution from line number 6 again and now we'll simply go to its right subtree by calling the find max method and passing in the roots right value which is 7 so this method will be removed from the call stack and we'll simply store the line number 7 because we need to keep the track of this recursive nature algorithm so line number will be updated as 7 there will be one more method find max having the root 
0.27 because we have left from line number 7 passing in root's right value so root was 4 and its right value is 7 so 7 will be our new root for this find max method and friends similarly we will apply this algorithm recursively on this node now what we seen with 5 and 8 so we'll simply quickly go over this algorithm root is not equal to null we'll store the roots value in the result field which is 7 we'll recursively go to the left subtree now here by passing in roots left as we are leaving at line number 6 we'll store line number 6 there will be new method on call stack with root pointing to null now because we are going to its left now so this root will be null and we'll simply return the integer minimum value from this find max method we we'll start our execution from where we left at line number 6 where root was pointing to 7 and the value which this find max return was integer's minimum value so we'll simply store in the left and similarly for the right it will perform the same we update the line number here we leave this method we again call find max with roots right which is null so there will be one more method on the call stack having value of root as null so root will point to null will simply return the integers minimum value because root is equal to null so this method will again come on the call stack and will start execution from line number 7 now so here root will now again point to 7 and this method had written integers minimum value which will simply store in the right here and now we'll simply compare these three values 7 left and right and we know that 7 is the maximum value so these two conditions will come out to be false because left is not greater than result and right is also not greater than result so this both the condition will come out as false and will simply return 7 from this find max method because 7 is the maximum value of the right subtree for the actual root so this method will return 7 execution point will reach here we had left at line number 7 so we'll start executing from line number 7 where root was actually pointing to 4 so root will point to 4 and the find max method which got executed before this find max method returned value as 7 so 7 will be stored in the right so here you can see for this complete binary tree now we have actually got all the three values the roots value, the maximum value of the left subtree, and the maximum value of the right subtree. So we'll simply compare these three values and get the maximum value of this binary tree complete. So we'll check whether left is greater than result or not. So value of left is 8, it is greater than result, which is 4. So we'll simply update the value of left into result. So result becomes 8 now. We compare whether value of right is greater than result or not. So right value is 7 which is not greater than 8. So this condition comes out to be false. And finally we will return the value 8 which is the maximum value among this binary tree. So this method will terminate here. And on the call stack this will get removed returning the maximum value of this binary tree which is 8 so friends here you saw a very long demonstration of this algorithm where we applied this algorithm recursively on each and every node to find what's the maximum value of the binary tree so friends the complexity is involved in this recursive nature which we demonstrated using the call stack and once you understand how this call stack works you can simply 
code the algorithm related to binary tree recursively now let's go to intelligence see the working of this code so friends i hope you have liked this video and in case you have liked this video then please like comment share and subscribe my channel thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in this video we will see the demonstration of the algorithm that how we can find the maximum value in a binary tree so in our previous video we saw the demonstration of the algorithm step by step so in this video we will simply code the algorithm and see its working so here you can see in our previous videos we created one class as binary tree which had a root as an instance variable of type tree node so this is the class of tree node which we created in our previous videos and we saw different algorithms so here let's say we are given this binary tree and let's say we provide a maximum value in this binary tree as 8 and rest of the value we keep as it is now we want to write an algorithm where we can find the maximum value of this binary tree so friends here in case if you find any difficulty you can watch my previous videos where we have demonstrated each and every line of this code step by step and we have demonstrated all these algorithms step by step so let's code the algorithm to find the maximum value of a binary tree so here we have created one method that find max whose return type is integer because we want to return the maximum value of a binary tree so here we'll simply return find max will pass in the root because we need to pass a root to find the maximum value of a particular binary tree which we also saw in our previous video so here we'll create a method as public whose return type will be integer find max and this is the method which will take the root of the binary tree and will simply return the maximum value of this binary tree so here this is our binary tree whose maximum value is 8 so let's see the code to find the maximum value of this binary tree so as we discussed in our previous video that this algorithm is recursive in nature the first thing we provide is the base case we simply check whether root is equal to null or not so if root is equal to null we'll simply return the minimum value because as root is null it simply signifies that we can simply return the minimum value of the integer so here we need to find the maximum value of this binary tree and if root is coming out as null then we need to return an integer value so we can safely return the minimum value of the integer because beyond that there won't be any minimum value and our task is to find the maximum value so this minimum value won't affect the maximum value of this binary tree so after providing this if check for the base case the first step is to store the roots value so we are creating an integer value result and we are storing the roots value into this result and also we discuss the basic idea behind this algorithm is in order to find the maximum value of a binary tree we simply compare the roots value to the maximum value of its left subtree and also we'll compare this value with the maximum value of its right subtree so when we compare these three values we come to know what's the maximum value of a binary tree so this algorithm is very recursive in nature and this is applied on each and every node of the binary tree so where we simply store the roots value then we go to its left subtree to find the maximum value of the left subtree once we get that value then we go to its right subtree and we find the maximum value of the right subtree and after we get these three values we compare them with each other and we get the maximum value of the complete binary tree
so here after getting the roots value we simply try to get the maximum value of the left subtree by calling the find max method recursively providing roots left value so here we are simply providing the roots left which is the left subtree of this root and whatever the value this find max method will return will simply store in the left variable and similarly we do it for the right subtree we call find max recursively providing roots right value so in order to see how this recursive nature works you can watch my previous tutorial where we demonstrated this recursive nature with an animation so you can watch that and here after finding all these three values we'll simply compare it with each other so the first step will compare whether left value is greater than result or not so if left is greater than result we simply update the result with the left because at the last we need to send the result and which should be the maximum value so first we are comparing left with result and then we are comparing right with result so if the value of right is greater than result we are simply updating the value of right to result and at the last we are simply returning result so here you can see that we are comparing all these three values here if left is greater than result we are storing the greater value in the result and then we are again comparing whether right is greater than result or not and if right is greater than result then we are storing the value of right into result and finally we are returning result because this will be the maximum value among these three values so here you can see this is the algorithm to find the maximum value of a binary tree so let's test its working in the main method so first we are creating this binary tree with these values where we know that 8 is the maximum value and here we are simply printing the maximum value by calling the find max method which internally will call this find max method providing in the root which is this root and this root is being created here with this create binary tree method so after we create this binary tree with this hard coded values and when we will call the find max method we will get the maximum value of this binary tree so here you can see it printed 8 because 8 was the maximum value of this binary tree now let's say if i update any value to 10 and if i run the code again you can see answer came as 10 because 10 is the maximum value of this binary tree so friends here we saw the algorithm to find the maximum value of any binary tree which was basically recursive in nature where we compared the three values one was the root value we compared it with the maximum value of its left subtree and we compared it with the maximum value of its right subtree here and finally we returned the result which was the maximum value of the complete binary tree and this algorithm we applied on each and every node of the binary tree because this is recursive in nature and in order to see the complete animation of this recursive nature you can watch my previous video so friend this was all about this video i hope you have liked this video and in case you have liked this video then please like comment share and subscribe my channel thanks have a nice day hello friends welcome to my new data structures and algorithms in java tutorial series video friends in this tutorial we will discuss how to represent a binary search tree in java
in our previous tutorial we actually discussed about the binary tree we saw that each and every node in the binary tree had two children one was the left child and one was the right child so a binary search tree is a special type of binary tree in which the data is organized in an ordered manner which helps us in faster search and insertion of the data so how binary search tree helps us in faster search and insertion of data we'll see later first we will discuss the three properties which makes it a binary search tree so here in the diagram you can see a binary search tree which satisfies these three properties so the property one says the left sub tree of a node contains only nodes with values lesser than the node's value so what does it mean let's suppose if we take a node having data as 6 so all the nodes to its left like 4 2 they have values lesser than 6 so if you see there are three nodes to the left of 6 and if you compare the values of these three nodes with 6 you will find that 4 is less than 6 2 is less than 6 and 5 is less than 6 so all the nodes to left of a particular node should have values lesser than the node's value and similarly if we go to right of any particular node then all the values should be greater than the node's value so if we take the example of node having value as 6 and if we go to its right we see there are three nodes having data as 8 7 and 9 all the values are greater than the node's value so here in the binary search tree we are keeping the data in ordered form that from a particular node if we go to its left we will only find the values lesser than the node's value and if we go to its right we will only find the nodes having values greater than the than the particular node so from the third property says the left and the right sub tree each must also be a binary search tree so friends here we saw that node 6 is following these two properties that all the values to its left are lesser than the node's value and all the values to its right are greater than the node's value and in a binary search tree these two properties should be true for each and every node of the binary search tree so for example if we take a node having value as 4 then we can see that to its left there is only one node and its value is 2 which is less than 4 and if we go to its right then there is only one node whose value is 5 which is greater than 4 so 4 also satisfies this two properties and similarly if you are on node 2 then it doesn't have any left and right child therefore it also satisfies this two property and if these two properties are satisfied by all the nodes of a tree then that tree is called as binary search tree so here in this diagram you can see that it is a binary search tree so if suppose if i change a value here and i make it a value as 8 so here you can see that node with the value as 4 if we go to its left we are getting a value lesser than the node's value and if we are going to its right then we are getting a value greater than node's value so 4 satisfies this two property but if we go to the parent of 4 here you can see the value is 6 and we know that all the nodes of a left sub tree should be lesser than the node's value so here you can see 4 2 8 should all be less than the node's value but 8 is greater than 6 therefore this is not a binary search tree because this two properties should be true for each and every node and if you are on a particular node then we take all the nodes of its left sub tree and right sub tree and we compare it with the node's value so here you can see 4 and 2 are lesser than 6 but 8 is not lesser than 6 therefore it is not a binary search tree and similarly if i take a value of 5 here then you can see that if we are at node 8 then if we go to its left we see that value of 5 is lesser than 8 and if we go to its right 
then we have node 9 and value of 9 is greater than 8 so 8 satisfies these two properties but if we go to the parent of 8 which is nothing but 6 so here you can see that it is not a binary search tree because from property 2 the right subtree of a node contains only the nodes with values greater than the nodes value so if we see the right subtree from the node 6 we see it has 3 nodes and all these 3 nodes should have values greater than 6 but here you can see 8 and 9 have values greater than 6 but 5 is lesser than 6 therefore this tree is not a binary search tree so friends all these 3 properties if satisfied by each and every node of a binary tree then it becomes a binary search tree below these three properties makes the search and insertion of data faster because let's suppose if you want to search for a value 5 in this binary search tree then we simply check the value 5 with the root of the tree so here you can see that 5 is not equal to 6 and as it is a binary search tree we know that 5 must be lying somewhere to the left of this tree because it satisfies the three properties and we know that the left subtree of a node contains only values lesser than the node's value so we know that 5 must be lying somewhere to the left of node 6 so from node 6 we traverse left and we, we reach to 4 and also here you can see when we are traversing to node 4 we are simply discarding all the nodes of the right subtree because we also know that 5 can never lie to the right of 6 so let's suppose if we had a binary search tree having many nodes then we could have simply discard half of the nodes and we would have continued our search to either right or to left of the search tree so friends if we compare 5 to 4 then we know that 5 is greater than 4 so 5 must be lying somewhere to the right to 4 and then we simply traverse to its right and we discard the left subtree of the node 4 and finally we found the node having data is 5 so friends when we want to insert a data into binary search tree we usually follow these three properties only so let's say if you want to insert a node having data as 10 then we simply start from the root node we check the value of root to the data which we want to insert so here if we compare the value 6 with 10 then we know that 10 is greater than 6 therefore it should be inserted to its right so we traverse to its right and we see there is one more node so we compare this value with the value which we want to insert so here 10 is greater than 8 therefore we know that 10 must be inserted to its right so we simply traverse to its right and we find there is one more node having data as 9 so we check that whether 10 is greater than 9 or not so here 10 is greater than 9 so we go to its right and we find that there is no node because 9 right is pointing to null so we simply insert node at that place so friend this is how search and insertion of data gets faster in binary search tree because in each iteration we discard half of the tree as we know that we either want to traverse to right or to left so friend this is the usefulness of binary search tree moving ahead so friend if we see the structure of tree node in a binary search tree then it is very similar to binary tree that this tree node is nothing but the inner class of binary search tree which has basically the three properties one is the data property to hold the data and other two properties are nothing but the references to the left subtree and the right subtree we also provide a constructor to this three node class which takes in a data part so whenever we want to create a new tree node we simply pass in the data property and left and right property actually points to null so friends let's go to eclipse and see the implementation of binary search tree hello friends in this section we will discuss how we can implement a binary search tree 
so friends here i have created one class by name binary search tree which is having a main method and we also discussed in our previous tutorial that binary search tree is nothing but a binary tree so friends the initial implementation of binary search tree is very similar to binary tree in binary search tree class we will create an instance variable of type tree node which would be nothing but the root of the binary search tree so here we can see the type is of tree node so we'll create an inner class we'll give it a name as tree node so friends here binary search tree is a type of binary tree therefore the implementation which we saw in the binary tree is very much similar to binary search tree that we have created one inner class by name tree node also friends in our previous tutorial we discussed that a tree node consists of three parts one is the data part so private int data so this property will hold the data of the tree node here i have taken the type of this data as integer so it can be any generic type as well also friends we know that binary search tree is a type of a binary tree where each tree node has two children one is the left children and one is the right children so we'll create a tree node and we'll give it a name as left and we'll create one more tree node and we give it a name as right so basically a tree node has two children one is the left and one is the right inside this tree node class we'll also provide a constructor so public tree node and this constructor will take the data part so we'll initialize the data of this tree node with a value which you have passed into the constructor and also friend whenever the new tree node is created the left and right points to null so friend this is how we actually represent a binary search tree in java in our upcoming tutorial we will actually see how we can insert and how we can search a node into a binary search tree so friends i hope you like this video thanks have a nice day Hello friends welcome to my new data structures and algorithms in java tutorial series video friends in this tutorial we will discuss how to insert a value in a binary search tree in java and also friend in this tutorial we will discuss the recursive approach to insert a value in a binary search tree so friends below you can see the code to insert a node into a binary search tree so here the insert method takes in a root node and the value which we want to insert also friends here you can see insert method internally calls insert again therefore it's nothing but a recursive call so in order to keep the track of this recursion we will use the call stack and based on this call stack we will see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step so friends let's suppose currently binary search tree has no nodes and when the binary search tree is empty we know that root will point to null now let's suppose we want to insert a value phi into this binary search tree so here you can see on the call stack there will be one insert method and currently as root is pointing to null therefore here we can keep the track of the root which is pointing to null and we can also keep the track of its left and right tree node which are also null and the last column will have the value which we want to insert moving ahead so friend in first step we'll see that whether root is equal to null or not because as we are going into this recursion here we have to provide a base case so that we can come out of this recursion so our base case condition would be to check whether root is equal to null or not so currently here you can see binary search tree is empty therefore root is equal to null 
so the condition in if block comes out to be true and inside this if block as you want to insert this value 5 therefore first we will create a tree node and provide the value as 5 so it would look something like this friends in our previous tutorial we also discussed that when we create a new tree node we actually pass the value into the constructor of tree node so in this tree node the data is the actual value which is 5 and as it is a new tree node therefore left and right are pointing to null and also friends as we are creating this tree node we are assigning it to the root so it would look something like this the root will point to a tree node having data as 5 and also friends here will provide the value as 5 that root is now pointing to 5 moving ahead and then we'll simply return the root so your insert button will come to an end and it will be removed from the call stack so friends when binary search tree was empty we have inserted one node having data is 5 now let's suppose we want to insert one more value the value which we are inserting is 3 and here we also know that root is now pointing to a node having data as 5 so on the call stack it would look something like this that root is 5 its left and right are null and the value which you want to insert is 3 so the first step will check whether root is equal to null or not so here you can see root is not equal to null therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false so friends in our previous tutorial we actually discussed what is the binary search tree we discussed the three properties which binary search tree follows property one was let's suppose if you are on a particular node which has some value and if you traverse to its left then all the nodes value to its left would have values lesser than the nodes value and if you go to its right then all the nodes value would be greater than the node value and these two properties should be true for each and every node of the binary search tree so friends when we insert a new node we actually check for these two properties so here you can see we have provided an if block and inside this if block we have provided a condition as that whether value is less than root dot data value so here you can see root dot data is nothing but 5 and the value which we want to insert is 3 so here you can see the value is actually less than root dot data value so here if you want to insert a new tree node having value as 3 then we can only insert into the left subtree of the root because value is less than root dot data so therefore the condition in if block comes out to be true so friends here you can see we are again calling the insert method and we are passing the value as root dot left and the value which we want to insert so on the call stack there will be a new insert method and as there would be a new insert method we will be leaving this insert method and we will again calling the insert method so we need to keep the track of the previous insert method so we know that we have given the line numbers here and we know that we are leaving this insert method at line number 7 so we will simply put a value of 7 in the line number column and we will call the insert method and this time we will pass root dot left as a new root so it would look something like this that there would be a new insert method on the call stack and here we know that root left is null therefore for this insert method root will be null and left and right would be null and the value which we want to insert is 3 so here root will be pointing to null now and we will again check whether root is equal to null or not so here you can see root is equal to null and then we will create a new tree node and we will pass the value into its constructor and we will assign it to the root so it would look something like this a new tree node is created 
having the value as 3 and left and right are pointing to null so now root will point to this tree node moving ahead so here now root is pointing to 3 and finally we will simply return from this insert method so friend as soon as we return from this method this insert method will be removed from the call stack and the execution point will reach to the insert method which was executed just before that and we also know that we have left at line number 7 so we'll start the execution from line number 7 so it would look something like this so now we are starting again this insert method from line number 7 and when we had left this insert method root was pointing to 5 so here root is now pointing to 5 and as we had written root which was nothing but 3 it will be assigned to roots left so here you can see root is pointing to 5 and roots left is pointing to null therefore whatever we return from previous insert method it will be assigned to roots left so it would look something like this moving ahead now root left is 3 and then finally we will simply return the root so the execution of this insert method will be complete and it will be removed from the call stack so friends here we have inserted two nodes now let's suppose we want to insert a value 7 so it would look something like this first insert method will be created on the call stack having root as 5 whose left is 3 and whose right is null and the value which you want to insert is 7 we'll check whether root is equal to null or not so here you can see root is pointing to a node having data as 5 therefore it's not null and using the binary search tree properties we'll check that whether value which we want to insert is less than root dot data or not so here you can see root dot data is nothing but a value 5 and here we are inserting a value 7 therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false we are inserting a value 7 which is greater than the roots value therefore it must be inserted to the right subtree of the root so now else block will be executed now here we want to insert the value to roots right therefore we are again calling the insert method and this time we are passing in a value as root dot right so here you can see root is pointing to a node having data as 5 and its right is pointing to null and as you want to insert a new node to its right therefore we are simply calling the insert method and we are passing root dot right with a value which you want to insert and also here we are again calling the insert method we are leaving this previous insert at line number 9 so we will simply put a value of 9 into the line number column that we are leaving this insert method at line number 9 so now on the call stack there would be a new insert method and as we have passed in root dot right so here you can see root dot right is null so we are executing this insert method with root as null and left and right are null and the value which you want to insert is 7 and friends as this insert method is getting executed root is pointing to null so root is pointing to null we are checking whether root is equal to null or not so here root is equal to null and as you want to insert this new tree node having value as 7 we'll simply create a new tree node and pass a value 7 to its constructor and then we'll assign it to the root so it would look something like this that root will now point to a tree node having data as 7 and whose left and right are pointing to null so here root becomes 7 and finally we simply return the root so when we return the root 
execution of this insert method gets completed so it would be removed from the call stack and the execution point reaches to an insert method which was getting executed just before this insert method and we know that we had left this insert method at line number 9 so we'll start our execution from that point so friends here once the insert method gets executed we had written the value 7 and once the execution starts from line number 9 we know that at that point root was pointing to 5 so root will point to 5 and we also know that we have written node 7 from the insert method so therefore we'll simply assign whatever you return from the insert method to root dot write. So here root is pointing to node 5 and its write is pointing to null. Therefore node 7 will now point to root's write. So it would look something like this. So here now write will become 7. And then we'll simply return from this insert method. So this insert method will be removed from the call stack. So friends here we inserted three nodes. Now let's suppose you want to insert one more node having value as one. So in the first I will call the insert method providing in the root and the value is one. So here root is pointing to five and left is pointing to three and right is pointing to seven and the value which you want to insert is 1 in the first step we are checking whether root is equal to null or not so root is not equal to null so friend as it is a binary search tree we are checking there whether value which you want to insert is less than roots value or not so here you can see 1 is less than 5 therefore we are sure that the value 1 will be inserted somewhere to its left subtree so therefore the condition in if block comes out to be true because 1 is less than 5. And here we are again calling the insert method by passing in root dot left and the value. So here root dot left is nothing but 3. And as we are leaving this insert method we will keep the track of the line number. So we are providing value as 7. So now the insert method will be called with root dot left which is nothing but node 3. So for this insert our root will become 3. So here you can see there will be a new insert method where root will be 3 and left and right are null and the value which you want to insert is 1. So here now root will point to 3. We'll check whether root is equal to null or not. So root is not equal to null. And then we'll check whether value which we want to insert is less than root dot data or not. So here 1 is less than 3. So we know that 1 should lie to the left subtree of the root having value as 3. Therefore we are again calling insert method by passing into the value as root dot left. So here root dot left is nothing but null and as we are leaving this insert method we will keep the track of the line number which is nothing but 7. So here a new insert method will be on the call stack having root as null because here we are passing root dot left so root dot left is nothing but null. So now root will point to null. Moving ahead, we'll check whether root is equal to null or not. So here you can see root is equal to null. And then we'll create a new tree node by providing it the value as 1. And that tree node will assign to the root. So it would look something like this. That now root is pointing to a node having data as 1 and whose left and right are pointing to null. So now root is pointing to 1. and then we'll simply return the root so we are simply returning the tree node having data as 1 so when we return this tree node 
we know that this insert method is completed execution point reaches here and we'll start our execution from line number 7 so at line number 7 when we had left this insert method root was pointing to 3 so now root will point to 3 and we know that to roots left we have assigned the value which we had written from the insert method so root left is null and the value which we returned from the insert method was nothing but 1 so therefore now root dot left will point to the tree node having data as 1 so here left will now become 1 and it would look something like this and finally we will simply return root so when we return root this insert method will be completed and it will be removed from the call stack and the execution point reaches to the insert method and we'll again start execution from the line number 7 and at that point root was pointing to 5 so therefore now root will point to 5 and as you have written tree node having value is 3 that would be assigned to roots left so here root is pointing to a node having data as 5 we'll simply assign the value 3 to roots left so it would look same and finally we'll simply return the root so the insert method will be completed and it will be removed from the call stack so friends here we inserted four nodes into binary search tree by applying the properties of binary search tree that suppose if you are on a particular node then all the values of the nodes to its left would be lesser than the nodes value and all the values to its right subtree would be greater than the nodes value so here you can see 3 and 1 are lesser than 5 therefore they lie on the left subtree of this node and here you can see 7 is greater than 5 therefore it is lying on the right subtree now friends let's go to eclipse and see the working of this code hello friends in our previous tutorial we actually discussed how we can insert a node into a binary search tree so in this tutorial we will actually code how to insert a node into a binary search tree so first we will create an insert method so public void insert and to this insert method we will actually pass the value which we want to insert and inside the insert method we'll simply call the insert method which we actually discussed in the slide so we'll pass root and the value which we want to insert and here we'll create a method as public whose return type would be tree node name would be insert taking in parameters as root and the value which we want to insert friends in our previous tutorial we actually discussed the recursive way to insert a node into a binary search tree so here we'll first provide a base case that if root is equal to null then we'll simply create a new tree node by passing in the value and then we'll simply return the root so this would be our base case and if root is not equal to null then we provide the condition which binary tree satisfies that if value which you want to insert is less than roots value then we simply traverse to its left
and we'll again call insert method by passing in root left and the value which we want to insert and if value is greater than roots value then in the else part we simply traverse to the right subtree by calling insert and providing the values root dot right and the value which you want to insert so whatever the insert method will return will simply assign it to the roots left and in the else part whatever the insert method will return will simply assign to roots right and finally will simply return root so friends in our previous tutorial we actually saw how this insert method works step by step now let's test is working into the main method so first we'll create the instance of binary search tree and then we'll insert few nodes which we actually saw into the slide so with the value is 5 3 7 and 1 so friends after inserting this 4 nodes we'll simply print it on the console that whether they are inserted in the right order or not so friends in order to print the nodes on the console I will code the algorithm for in order tree traversal which we actually discussed in our previous tutorial when we discussed about the binary tree so in order so here it simply will call in order by passing in the root so here we'll provide in order method which will have the root so we had also discussed that we'll first so friends we also discussed that in in order traversal we first check whether root is equal to null or not so if root is equal to null we'll simply return and in this traversal we also discussed that first we visit the left subtree of the root then we actually visit the root and finally we visit the right subtree also friends here you can see that first we are going to the left of the root then we are actually printing the roots data and then we are going to its right so friends binary search tree also follows one property that if we do the in order traversal of a binary search tree then the nodes will be printed in sorted form so let's see how so we'll simply call in order which will internally call the in order and will pass root into it so if I run the code now so friends here you can see it printed 1 3 5 7 and also you can see the numbers are in sorted order because if you perform in order traversal on the binary search tree we get the traversal in sorted order so friends which actually proves that whatever we inserted into the binary search tree followed these three properties friends I hope you like this video thanks have a nice day
Hello friends, welcome to my new data structures and algorithms in Java tutorial series video. Friends, in this tutorial we will discuss how to search a given key in a binary search tree. Also in this tutorial we will see how we can search a given key in a binary search tree using recursion. So friends, let's suppose we are given a binary search tree and we want to search a particular value inside this binary search tree. So below you can see the algorithm to search a given key in a binary search tree. Also friends the method which we are going to call is search method. And here inside this search we are again calling search method. Therefore in this algorithm we are basically using recursion. So friends in order to keep the track of this recursion we are basically maintaining a call stack whose significance we will see while demonstrating the algorithm step by step. Friends, let's suppose we want to search a key 5 into this binary search tree. So in the first step we will simply call this search method by providing it a root which is the root of the binary search tree and the key which we want to search. So friends, when the search method will start its execution, on the call stack it would look something like this. That there would be a search method on the call stack. And as we are passing the root which is nothing but 6 and the key which we want to search is 5. So here we are simply keeping the track of these values. Moving ahead. So friends, as we are searching a particular key using this recursion, we have to provide a base case so that we can come out of the recursion. So here the base case would be, we are simply checking in the if block that whether root is equal to null or root dot data is equal to key or not. So currently you can see root is not equal to null, it is pointing to a node having data as 6. And we also know that root dot data which is value 6 is not equal to key which is 5 therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false so friends in our previous tutorial we actually discussed what is a binary search tree so friends a binary search tree is nothing but a binary tree which follows some properties so the first property says that let's suppose we are on a particular node and if we traverse through its left subtree, we'll find the nodes having values lesser than the node value. So let's suppose we are on node 6. If we traverse through its left subtree, we are seeing the nodes having values 4, 2 and 5. So these all three values are lesser than 6. And similarly for any node if we go to its right subtree, we'll find the values greater than the node value. So let's suppose if we take an example of node 6. If you go to its right subtree, we are finding there are 3 nodes having values 8, 7 and 9. So all these 3 values are greater than 6. Also friend, these 2 properties should be true for each and every node of the binary search tree. And using these 3 properties, we are actually searching a particular key in the binary search tree. So here in the if block we are simply checking that whether value of key is less than root dot data or not. So here you can see root dot data is nothing but value 6 and the key which we are searching is 5. So by the binary search tree property we know that 5 must be lying somewhere to the left subtree of node 6. So here the condition in if block comes out to be true. So friends here we know that 5 must be lying to the left subtree of node 6. Therefore we are calling search method again by passing in the value as root.left and the key which we want to search. Also friends when we call this search method we are actually leaving this search method and we are again calling the search method. So therefore in order to keep the track of the previous search we will store the line numbers. So it means that we are leaving this search method at line number 6 and we are again calling search by providing 
root dot left and the key which we want to search so friends this search method will be called again and this time the root will become root dot left which is nothing but 4 so here on the call stack there would be one more search method so as we call this search method by passing root dot left which was nothing but value 4 so root became 4 so here root will now point to 4 moving ahead we'll again check whether root is equal to null or not so here you can see root is not equal to null because root is referring to a node having value as 4 we'll also check whether root dot data is equal to key or not so here you can see root dot data which has value 4 is not equal to key which is 5 therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false and then we'll again check whether key is less than root dot data or not so here you can see root dot data is 4 and the key which we are searching is 5 so therefore 5 is greater than 4 so the condition in if block comes out to be false so the else part will be executed so friends as here key is greater than root dot data we know that 5 must be lying somewhere to the right subtree of the node 4 so therefore in the else block we will simply call the search method again by passing in root dot right and the key which we want to search and also friend as we are leaving this search method we have to keep the track of the previous search method so first we will store the line number so it would look something like this that we are leaving this search method at line number 8 and we are calling this search method again by passing root dot right as the new root and the key which we want to search so it would look something like this on the call stack there would be one more search method and as we are calling it by root dot right we know that root dot right is nothing but node having data is 5 so here root is 5 so root will now point to 5 then we'll check whether root is equal to null so here you can see root is pointing to node having data is 5 therefore it's not equal to null and we'll again check whether root dot data is equal to key or not so here you can see key is nothing but 5 and root dot data is also 5 therefore root dot data is equal to key so the condition in if block comes out to be true so friend it means that we have found our key so in the line number 3 we are simply returning the root which is nothing but the key which we found so this is the tree node which we actually found and we are returning this tree node from this search method so friends after this line gets executed this search method will be removed from the call stack and the execution point will go to its previous search method and we also know that we had left the previous search method at line number 8 so we'll start our execution from that point also friends when we had left this search method we know that root was pointing to 4 therefore now root will point to 4 and from the line number 8 we'll simply return whatever the value we got from this search method which was nothing but a tree node having data is 5 so therefore this search method will be executed completely and it will be removed from the call stack and the execution point will reach to this search method and we know that we left this search method at line number 6 so we'll start our execution from line number 6 and also friends when we had left this search method that time root was pointing to 6 therefore now root will point to 6 and finally we will return what we actually got from the previous search which was nothing but the tree node having data is 5 
so we'll simply return 5 and this search method will remove from the call stack so friend this is how we actually search for a particular value in a binary search tree now let's suppose if you want to search one more value which is not in the binary search tree so let's say we want to search a key having value as 10 so we know that 10 is not in the binary search tree so let's see how this algorithm works in the first step we'll call the search method by passing in the root and the key which you want to search so on the call stack it would look something like this that root is 6 and the key which you want to search is 10 moving ahead we check whether root is equal to null or not so root is pointing to 6 therefore it's not equal to null we'll also check whether root dot data is equal to key or not so here you can see root dot data which is 6 is not equal to 10 therefore condition in if block comes out to be false and then using the three properties of binary search tree we will see whether 10 is lying into this binary search tree or not so in the first step we will check whether key is less than root dot data or not so here you can see 10 is not less than 6 therefore we know that 10 might lie somewhere to its right subtree so the condition in if block comes out to be false and the else part will be executed so here as we know that 10 might lie somewhere to the right subtree of 6 therefore we we'll again call search method by passing in root dot write so root is pointing to 6 and root dot write is pointing to 8 and as we are leaving this search method we'll keep the track of the line number which is 8 and then we'll simply call the search method by passing in root dot write and the key which you want to search so on the call stack there would be one more search method and this time root will become 8 so root will point to 8 moving ahead we'll check whether root is equal to null or not so root is not equal to null because it is pointing to a node having value as 8 we also check whether root dot data is equal to key or not so root dot data is 8 and key which we want to search is 10 therefore 8 is not equal to 10 so the condition in if block comes out to be false we again check whether key is less than root dot data or not so root dot data is 8 and the key which we want to search is 10 so 10 is not less than 8 therefore we know that 10 might lie to the right subtree of 8 so the condition in if block comes out to be false and the else part will be executed so here we'll again call the search method by passing in root dot write so here root is pointing to 8 and its write is 9 and as we are leaving this search method we'll keep the track of the line number so on the call stack there would be a new search method and this time root will become 9 because we are passing root dot right as root is pointing to 8 its right is pointing to 9 so here our new root will become 9 we will again check whether root is equal to null so here root is not equal to null because root is pointing to a node having value as 9 we will also check whether root dot data is equal to key or not so root dot data is 9 and the key which you want to search is 10 therefore root dot data is not equal to key so the condition in if block comes out to be false we will again check whether key is less than root dot data or not so here 10 is not less than 9 therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false and the else part will be executed because we know that 10 must be lying somewhere to the right subtree of 9 so here you can see we are again calling search method and we are leaving this search method at line number 8 
so we'll keep the track of the line number and we'll call the search method by passing in root dot right so here you can see root is pointing to 9 and its right is pointing to null because there is no right child to node 9 so on the call stack there would be one more search method so value of root will be null so root will point to null moving ahead we'll again check whether root is equal to null or not so here you can see root is equal to null therefore condition in if block comes out to be true so friends condition in this if block is nothing but our base case because after 9 there are no nodes into this binary search tree therefore by some way we need to exit this recursion so friends here we know that 10 is not lying into this binary search tree and also root is pointing to null therefore in the if block we we'll simply return root which would be nothing but null and as we are returning null it signifies that key was not found into this binary search tree so here this search method is executed completely so it will be removed from the call stack and the execution point will reach to this search method and we know that we had left this search method line number 8 so we'll start our execution from line number 8 and when we had left this search method root was pointing to 9 so therefore root will point to 9 also from what we had returned from his previous search which was nothing but null will simply return null from this search method so it will be removed from the call stack and the execution point will reach to this search method and we will start our execution from line number 8 and when we had left this search method root was pointing to 8 so now root will point to 8 and also friends from this search method we will simply return the null value so this search method will be removed from the call stack and then the execution point will reach to this search method and we will start our execution from line number 8 and when we had left this search method root was pointing to 6 so now root will point to 6 and also friends on this line we will simply return the value which we got from its previous search which was nothing but null so this method will be removed from the call stack and at last we'll simply return null which would signify that value was not found into the binary search tree so from in this tutorial we saw the demonstration of how to search a particular key into the binary search tree now let's go to eclipse and see the working of this code hello friends in our previous tutorial we actually saw the demonstration of how to search a particular key into a binary search tree in this tutorial we will actually code the search algorithm and we will test its working so friends in our previous lectures we actually created a class by name binary search tree we also saw how we can insert a value into a binary search tree so friends in this tutorial we will actually code how to search a given key in a binary search tree using recursion so here first we will create a method whose return type would be the tree node and we will give the name as search this search method will take in the key which we want to search and inside this search method we will simply call search by passing in the root which holds the complete binary search tree and the key which we want to search and we will again create one more method whose demonstration which we actually saw in our previous tutorial so the name of the method is search it 
it will have two parameters one would be the root of the binary search tree and other would be the key which you want to search so in this search method as we are using the recursion we have to first provide a base case so our base case would be if root is equal to null or root dot data is equal to key then we'll simply return the root from this method so here this would be our base case because this case will help us in getting exit from this recursion and if root is not equal to null or root dot data is not equal to key then we simply check that whether key is less than root dot data or not so if key is less than root dot data we know that key must be lying somewhere to the left subtree of the root therefore we we'll simply call the search method by passing in root dot left and the key which you want to search and also whatever is returned from this search method will simply return here and in else part if key is greater than root dot data then we know that key must be lying to the right sub tree of the root so therefore we'll call the search method recursively by passing root dot right and the key which you want to search and whatever will be written from this method will simply return here so friends here we are calling this search method recursively by using the binary search tree properties so there can be a two case where we are actually finding our key then we are simply returning the root and if you are not finding the key then we are simply returning null so the null signifies that key was not found in the binary search tree also friends we saw the demonstration of this algorithm step by step in our previous tutorial now in the main method let's test its working so here in the main method we have created one binary search tree by inserting few values as 5 3 7 1 and then we are simply printing this binary search tree so if i run the code now you can see it's printing the value of binary search tree using this in order tree traversal and it prints 1357 so friend in this binary search tree we know that it has four values 5 3 7 1 so let's suppose we search for value 3 so we'll provide a if block and we'll call the search method by passing in the value as 3 so if this search method doesn't return null then we know that we have found our value so we'll simply print on the console as key found So if I run the code now, you see it prints key found because three is present into this binary search tree. Now let's say if you want to search any value which is not present into this binary search tree, so here we'll simply call search method by providing as value as let's say ten, and we know that ten is not present into this binary search tree. So we'll simply print. key not found if i run the code now you see it printed key not found so friends in this tutorial we actually saw how we can code a algorithm to find a key into a binary search tree and we also tested its working 
आई होप यू लाइक दिस वीडियो थैंक्स एवन आइस डे हेलो एवरी वन सो इन दिस वीडियो वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस ए प्रॉब्लम वेलिडेट बाइनरी सर्च ट्री सो लेट सी वॉट दिस प्रॉब्लम इज एंड हाउ टू सॉल्व दिस सो इन दिस प्रॉब्लम वी आर गिवन अ रूट ऑफ ए बाइनरी ट्री ना अवर टास्क इज टू डिटरमाइन वेदर इट इज अ वैलिड बाइनरी सर्च ट्री और नॉट और बी एस टी सो ए बाइनरी सर्च ट्री इफ इट फॉलोज दिस थ्री प्रॉपर्टीज देन इट्स अ वैलिड बी एस टी सो द प्रॉपर्टीज आर लेट से इफ यू आर ऑन एनी पर्टिकुलर नोड द लेफ्ट सब ट्री ऑफ ए नोड कंटेन्स ओनली नोट विथ कीज लेस देन द नोट्स की सो इट मीन्स हियर नोट की इज फोर एंड इफ यू लुक टूवर्ड्स इट्स लेफ्ट देन ऑल द नोट्स विच आर ऑन इट्स लेफ्ट शुड हैव वैल्यू लेसर देन फोर सो फॉर एग्जाम्पल इफ यू टेक सिक्स इफ यू लुक टूवर्ड्स इट्स लेफ्ट इट हैज थ्री एलिमेंट्स सो द लेफ्ट सब ट्री विच इज फोर टू फाइव शुड कंटेन्स ओनली द नोट्स विथ कीज लेस देन द नोट्स की सो फोर इज लेस देन सिक्स टू इज लेस देन सिक्स फाइव इज लेस देन सिक्स एंड सिमिलरली द राइट सब ट्री ऑफ ए नोड विच इज ऑन दिस साइड शुड कंटेन्स ओनली नोट्स विथ कीज ग्रेटर देन द नोट्स की सो एट शुड बी ग्रेटर देन सिक्स सेवन शुड बी ग्रेटर देन सिक्स एंड नाइन शुड बी ग्रेटर देन सिक्स सो फॉर सिक्स द लेफ्ट शुड बी लेसर and the right should be greater and this two properties should be true for all the nodes so here both the left and right sub trees must also be binary search trees so what we saw on 6 the same property should hold for 4 8 2 5 7 and 9 that if we go towards its left all the nodes towards left of a node should be less than the nodes value and if we go towards right all the nodes which are towards the right should have value greater than the nodes value so this property makes a valid bst moving ahead so here let's say we are given with this binary tree and we need to find whether it's a valid bst or not so here you can see if from 6 we look in this direction the left sub tree has three nodes 4 2 and 8 and we know that the nodes in the left sub tree should be less than the nodes value 4 is less than 6 2 is less than 6 but here you can see 8 is not less than 6 so therefore it is not a valid bst so here you can see that for node 4 in the left sub tree we have only one node and it is less than 4 in the right sub tree we have only one node which is 8 and 8 is greater than 4 So for four, it is a valid BST node. But if we check all these conditions at this node, eight is greater than six, and we know that all the nodes of the left hand side should be lesser than the node's value. So therefore, it's not a valid BST. Till this much point, it was a valid BST because left nodes were lesser than the node's value, and the right nodes were greater than the node's value. But if we look from here, then it is not a valid BST. because eight is greater than 6 it should be less than 6 so friends how we can solve this problem is that when we are at node 8 its parent is 4 and 8 lies towards its right so 8 is greater than 4 so this part is valid but but here if you see the parent of 4 is 6 so therefore 8 should lie between 4 and 6 so this thing you can consider as a range that eight should lie between 4 and 6 but how we can propagate this information to eight is with each node we assign a min or a max value now this min and max value will tell that that particular node value should lie between min and max so now let's assign these values to these nodes so if you see for 6 as it is a root node the minimum range should be minus infinity and maximum range should be infinity because for 6 there are no constraints so it should be like this that 6 should be greater than minus infinity and lesser than infinity so this is the range for 6 so if we go towards the left 
let's say we are on node 4 so what could be the possible range for 4 so for this node having value as 4 to be a valid bst node it should be less than 6 because 4 if it is lying on the left side the maximum value for 4 would be it should be less than 6 and the minimum value would be minus infinity only because 4 can be greater than minus infinity the only constraint is for the max value that it should be less than 6 so for 4 the range would be minus infinity to 6 so this was for this node let's say if you are going in right and we encounter 8 so we know that in a valid BST if we are going towards right all the nodes value should be greater than nodes value so 8 should be greater than 6 so it means the minimum value 8 can go is just greater than 6 and the maximum value it can be like 100, 200, anything. So here when it is going in the right, the min value for 8 would be 6 and the max can be anything. So friends if you closely observe, if you are going on left, the min remains same and max changes because of the BST constraint. And if you are going on the right, max remains the same but min changes. So we need to keep the range in such a way that if you go towards left subtree, min remains same. So here min was same. So we are propagating such a value that whatever min we have here, we are just transferring it as it is and max changes to parent value. So we pass 6 here. If you go towards right subtree, here you can see max remains the same. So whatever max was here, it must be same here but min changes to parent value. So min changed to the parent value which was 6. So these two properties we need to keep in mind while assigning the ranges. So now let's see the ranges of the rest of the elements. So for 2, we are going towards left. So min remains same and max changes to parent value. So min remains same which is minus infinity and max changes to 4 which is true as well because 2 should be less than 4. So this is the range and let's say if we are going in this direction which is on the right side. So if we go towards right subtree, max remains same. So this infinity will remain same because this is the max value and min changes to parent value. So for 9 min will become 8 which makes sense because 9 should be greater than 8 because it lies on the right subtree. So min changes to parent value. So 8 comes here and infinity remains the same which is our max. So friends one tricky part comes in this direction. Let's say we are going in this direction. Now if you see we are going in the right side. So if you go towards right subtree, max remains same. So for 4 if you look max is 6. So we know that for 8 the max will remain the same which is 6 and min changes to parent value. So min would be parent's value which is 4. So it should be like this. From 4 we are going on the right subtree and if we are going on the right side, max remains the same. So here max was 6. So we pass 6 as it is. Min changes to parent value and min changed to 4. So here why this range is important. Here you can see we have transferred 6 towards 8 so that we can validate whether 8 is lying between 4 and 6 or not. So currently 8 though it is greater than 4 but it is greater than 6 as well. It should lie between 4 and 6. Therefore we can directly return a false value saying that this is not a valid BST. So we will see the code for this but to understand we are simply passing down the ranges and we are checking whether that particular node is actually lying between these ranges or not. So for any range it should be like this. But here 8 is greater than 4 but this condition is false because 8 is not less than 6 it is greater than 6. So therefore this node makes this binary tree an invalid binary search tree. And now for 7 we are going towards left. So min remains same. Here if you see min is 6 and max changes to parent value. So parent value is 8. So max becomes 8. So for 7 
it would be like six comma eight and here you can see seven is lying between six and eight so friends now let's go ahead and see the demonstration of the algorithm that how we can figure out whether a binary tree is a valid bst or not so here you can see that this is the algorithm so friends before we start if you want to master data structures and algorithms then you can subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update so here you can see that this is valid method is returning a boolean value stating that whether this tree node which is being referred by root whether it is a valid bst or not and here you can see this is valid method is getting called here and here recursively so in order to demonstrate the recursion we are maintaining a call stack here where we denote the method call and we store the state of the elements like root min max left right so when any particular method will leave the call stack we store the state of that method and when it comes back we start our execution by applying those values back to the variables and then we proceed ahead so friends here you can see we discussed about the min and max value and here you can see that when we are going towards left here we are calling is valid method again we are going towards left so min remains the same and max changes to roots value which is the parent value and when we are going towards right we are calling is valid with root dot right here you can see max remains the same but min changes to the parent value which is root dot val so these two properties we need to keep in mind and in this if block we are basically checking that whether this root or the node value whether it is lying between those values or not so if it is less than equal to min we know that it should be greater than min so we can directly return false or if root dot val becomes greater than max then we can return false because root dot val should be less than max so this root dot val should be like this min max and here if root dot val is less than or equal to min we can return false because it should be greater than min and if root dot val is greater than equal to max we can return false because it should be less than max and as we are calling this method recursively we are providing a base case that if root reaches to null let's say here so this null doesn't change the bst property for one so we can directly return true from here so now let's call this valid method we pass in the root so for root we know that it should lie like this from minus infinity to infinity so for an integer value we are providing here a long min and long max so we call is valid method with longs min value and longs max value because these two values will be like minus infinity and infinity to 5 because 5 is an integer and long is a data type which is greater than integer and we are taking longs extreme values min value and max value because the root doesn't have any constraint so we can provide the minimum and the maximum value of long so is valid method will be called and there will be one method on the call stack root as 5 min as min which is long dot min value i have written it like this max would be long dot max value like this and left and right would be the boolean values which we will be receiving from here and here and we will see that later moving ahead root is not equal to null so this condition comes out to be false so here you can see 5 is not less than equal to min and 5 is not greater than equal to max so here min is the long min value which is in the negative infinity so 5 is actually between this so the both the condition comes out to be false so for 5 this range is valid and now we are going towards the left of 5 so we are going in this direction now to node 2 so here you can see this is valid method will be removed from the call stack and we are leaving this is valid method at line number 8 so first we update line number 8 here and then we are calling is valid method 
here you can see we are passing root dot left because we want to go in this direction and when we are going on the left side we know that min remains the same and max changes to parent value so for 2 min will be minus infinity and max would be the parents value which is 5 so now we'll call this is valid method with the respective values so there will be one more method on the call stack like this we have passed root dot left so root will point to node 2 we know that min remains the same and max changes to parents value which is 5 root is not equal to null so this condition comes out to be false so here root dot well which is 2 it is not less than equal to min it is actually greater than min so this condition is false root dot well which is 2 is it greater than max which is 5 so this condition is also false therefore overall condition comes out to be false which signifies that 2 is between minus infinity and 5 so therefore this if block condition comes out to be false and for 2 also these conditions are true so now we go towards its left so we are again leaving this is valid method at line number 8 so we'll update line number 8 here we pass root dot left which is 1 now min remains the same which is minus infinity but max changes to parents value which is the current roots value which is 2 so there will be one more method on the call stack now root becomes 1 so root will come here min remains same and max changes to parents value which is 2 root is not equal to null so this condition comes out to be false root dot well which is 1 so it lies between minus infinity to 2 because max is 2 so this condition is true therefore here root dot well which is 1 it is not equal to minus infinity and 1 it is not greater than equal to 2 so therefore both this condition comes out to be false and we reach here so here if I just put the ranges for 2 it would be like this and for 1 it would be like this so till this point everything is fine now we'll go towards its left so we are going to call is valid method again passing in root dot left so root dot left is null now min remains same and max changes to 1 so we are leaving this is valid method at line number 8 now and there will be one more method on the call stack here now root will be null so root is pointing to null so whenever we encounter this null cases we know that it is our base case so we directly return true so root is equal to null so we return true so now here you can see this is valid method will be removed from the call stack and execution point will reach here with a value as true so this got removed from the call stack execution point reached here and we had left is valid method at line number 8 so we start from line number 8 and this is valid method return true so that true will be assigned to left so left will have true like this and when we left is valid method root was pointing to 1 so root will come back to 1 like this I'll remove this thing so now here you can see if from the left side we would have got a false value there is no point in going towards the right we can directly return false because if any of the value states that this is not a valid BST then overall tree would be not a valid BST so first we check whether left is true or not so if left is true then only we go towards the right so currently left is true so for this node we are done with the left part now we go towards its right so there will be one more method on the call stack which is is valid we pass root dot right and here you can see one change is when we are going towards the right max remains the same but min changes to roots value so here first we will update the line number here because we are leaving this method so 10 comes here now when we will call is valid method max remains the same 
it means two remains the same and min changes to parent's value so currently parent value is 1 so we will see how it looks there is a is valid method on the call stack with root will be now null because we have went towards its right now by calling it with root dot right here you can see when we go towards right max remains the same this values are same and min changes to parents value so if we move ahead root is pointing to null so this is our base case so we directly return true from here so this method will be removed from the call stack and execution point will reach here and it starts the execution at line number 10 with root as 1 so this is valid method returned a value of true so we can assign it to right now like this and when we had left is valid method root was at 1 so root comes back to 1 so friends here you can see that for this one node from left we got true and from right also we got true it means this particular node is a valid BST node so we can directly return the value of right because left is we have checked it is already true so now this is valid method will be removed from the call stack and execution point will reach here we will start from line number 8 like this and this is valid method returned the value of true and this method we received the value true from here so that will be assigned to the left so left will become true and in this is valid method root is at node 2 so root will come back to node 2 we check whether the left side of 2 returned a true or not so which is true so this condition is true so therefore now 2 decides to go towards its right to do the same steps so here now we'll again call is valid method we pass root dot right so root dot right is 7 when we are going to the right max remains the same which is 5 but min changes to root value so currently root value is 2 so therefore first we update the line number here because we are leaving this is valid method at line number 10 so 10 comes here now is valid method will be executed again root will become 7 because we are going towards the right max remains the same and min changes to roots value because we are going to the right root is not equal to null so this condition comes out to be false root dot well is not less than min so here you can see root dot well is 7 and min is 2 so 7 is greater than 2 and 7 should be lesser than 5 because 5 is max so this condition is false because 7 is greater than 5 so here you can see root dot well 7 min is 2 so here 7 is not less than equal to 2 so this condition is false but here you can see 7 should be greater than equal to max which is 5 so this condition became true so therefore this overall condition came out to be true and we know that 7 is not in this range from 2 to 5 and this condition came out to be true because root dot well which is 7 we are checking whether it is greater than 5 or not so it has overpassed the max value which shouldn't be the case so we directly return false now because 7 should be less than 5 but here we found that 7 is greater than max so this condition came out to be true so we return false so this method will be removed from the call stack by returning a false value execution point reaches here we start from line number 10 here and this method returned a false value so to write we assign false like this and when we left this is valid method root was at 2 so root will come back to 2 like this so from here we received true and from here we received false so when we will proceed ahead from left we received true and from right we are receiving false so therefore if any of the value came out to be false we directly return false stating that this binary tree is not a valid BST so we return false so this is valid method will be removed from the call stack by returning false 
एंड एग्जीक्यूशन पॉइंट विल रीच हियर वी एड लेफ्ट एड लाइन नंबर एट हियर एंड द प्रीवियस इज वैलिड मेथड रिटर्न द फॉल्स सो वी रिटर्न फॉल्स टू रूट फाइव सो टू द लेफ्ट वी असाइन फॉल्स एंड रूट विल कम बैक टू फाइव फ्रॉम हियर सो वी फर्स्ट चेक वेदर फ्रॉम लेफ्ट ओनली वी रिसीव फॉल्स और नॉट सो फॉर नोट फाइव द लेफ्ट सब ट्री रिटर्न द फॉल्स वैल्यू सो इट शुड नॉट गो टू दट्स इट्स राइट इट शुड डायरेक्टली रिटर्न फॉल्स बिकॉज लेफ्ट वी रिसीव फॉल्स सो वी डायरेक्टली रिटर्न फॉल्स स्टेटिंग दैट दिस बाइनरी ट्री इज नॉट ए वैलिड बी एस टी सो वेन वी विल रिटर्न फॉल्स दिस मैथड विल ऑल्सो बी रिमूव फ्रॉम द कॉल स्टैक लाइक दिस सो अवर एल्गोरिथम विल एंड एंड वी सिंपली रिटर्न फॉल्स वैल्यू सो नॉ लेट से इंस्टीट ऑफ सेवन वी हैड थ्री लाइक दिस एंड रूट वॉज हियर सो दिस वॉज द प्रीवियस स्टेट विच वी ऑलरेडी डिस्कस्ड लेट से वेन वी आर ऑन दिस पार्ट रूट इज एट थ्री द मेन वैल्यू शुड बी टू एंड द मैक्स वैल्यू शुड बी फाइव सो फॉर सेवन वी हैड द सेम कंडीशन रूट इज नॉट इक्वल टू नल सो वी चेक विद रूट डॉट वेल विच इज थ्री इज इट लेस देन मेन सो दिस विल बी फॉल्स बिकॉज थ्री इज ग्रेटर देन मेन वी चेक विद रूट डॉट वेल इज इट ग्रेटर देन मैक्स सो दिस कंडीशन इज ऑल्सो फॉल्स बिकॉज थ्री इज नॉट ग्रेटर देन मैक्स विच इज फाइव प्रीवियस टू दैट हियर इट वॉज सेवन सो देर फॉर वी हेड रिटर्न फॉल्स बट नाउ वी हेव थ्री एंड थ्री लाइज बिटवीन टू एंड फाइव सो देर फॉर दिस बोथ द कंडीशन केम आउट टू बी फॉल्स सो वाई एम डेमोन्स्ट्रेटिंग इट विथ थ्री इज जस्ट टू कंप्लीट द एल्गोरिथम फॉर ए पॉजिटिव बी एस टी सो दिस ट्री इज एक्चुअली अ वैलिड बी एस टी सो नाउ वी गो टूवर्ड्स द लेफ्ट ऑफ दिस रूट विच इज थ्री एंड दिस इज अवर बेस केस सो विल गो क्विकली ओवर दिस वी फर्स्ट अपडेट द लाइन नंबर हियर बिकॉज वी आर लिविंग दिस इज वैलिड मेथड रूट विल कम टू नल एंड मिन मैक्स विल बी टू एंड थ्री रूट इज इक्वल टू नल सो वी रिटर्न ट्रू सो दिस मेथड विल रिटर्न ट्रू एंड इट विल बी रिमूव फ्रॉम द कॉल स्टैक एग्जीक्यूशन पॉइंट विल रीच हियर वी स्टार्ट फ्रॉम लाइन नंबर एट दिस मेथड रिटर्न ट्रू सो टू लेफ्ट वी असाइन ट्रू एंड रूट केम बैक टू थ्री लेफ्ट इज ट्रू सो वी गो टूवर्ड्स इट्स राइट विच इज ऑल्सो अवर बेस केस so we first update the line number here 10 and is valid method will be on call stack with new root as null because we are going towards the right so root comes here root is equal to null so we return true directly we start from line number 10 and this is valid method return a true value so true comes here and root goes back to 3 and whatever the value right has we directly return that value because if you are going towards right it means left is already true so if right would have been false we would have written false if right would have been true we are returning true so this is valid method will be removed from the call stack and will return true so we reach here we start this is valid method from line number 10 here and here this is valid method return true so we update true here and at that moment root was at 2 so root comes back to 2 so here from this null we got true from here we got true so both came out to be true so we returned a true value which we stored here so now this is valid method will be removed from the call stack returning the value of right which is true so 2 will return true and this is valid method will be executed from line number 8 because five word call is valid and passing in root dot left which was this and this is valid method return true so we assign true to left root comes back to 5 left value is true so for this node it sees that its left sub tree complete left sub tree returned value is true so now it checks by going towards the right so it will call is valid again passing in root dot right 
when we are going to the right max remains the same and min changes to parents value which is root dot val so here when we go towards the right we reach 6 so for 6 max remains the same which would be long dot max value but min will change to the parent value which is root value which is 5 which makes sense because 6 should be greater than 5 and it can be lesser than any of the max value so max remains the same and min changes to root dot well so first we update line number here which is 10 and we will go quickly over this three nodes now so root comes here root is not equal to null 6 is between 5 and max so both the condition comes out to be false now we go to the left of 6 by calling is valid method passing in root dot left when we are going to the left main remains the same which is 5 but max changes to root dot well so it should be 6 now so there will be one more method on the call stack with root as null we know that we have went to the left so min remains the same and max changes to roots value which is 6 root is equal to null so we return true directly we start from line number 8 so left will receive true root comes back to 6 left is true so now we go to the right of 6 we update line number here which is 10 there will be one more is valid method on the call stack with root as null because we have went to root dot right now and as we are going to the right we know that max remains the same and min becomes the roots value like this so root is equal to null so it is our base case so we return true directly execution point will reach here it will start from line number 10 so this method returned a value true we stored in the right and root came back to 6 and now we can directly return whatever the value right will hold so currently it is true so we will pass true to this is valid method and this method will be removed from the call stack so now this is valid method will be starting from 10 because we had left at line number 10 and this method returned a value of true so right will have true root will come back to 5 and then here you can see from the left we received true from the right also we received true like this so for 5 as it is a root of this binary tree it sees that from its left side it received true and from the right it received true and 5 being the root node it is also in the boundaries of long dot min value and long dot max value so therefore it directly returns true which is stored in the right so this method will be removed from the call stack stating that this is a valid BST. So friends I hope you must have liked this video. In case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update. Thanks have a nice day. Hello everyone. Welcome to my new data structures and algorithms in Java tutorial series video. In this tutorial we will discuss an interview coding problem, search in a row and column wise sorted matrix. So friends in an interview we are given a problem that given a row and column wise n cross and sorted matrix, write a program to search a key in a given matrix. So what do we mean by row and column wise sorted matrix? So here you can see we are given a 4 cross 4 matrix. So by 4 cross 4 matrix we mean that it has 4 rows and 4 columns and here you can see that each row is sorted and each column is sorted. 
so for an example the row at 0th index you can see the values as 10 20 30 40 and the last row we have values as 32 33 39 51 and all these rows are sorted in ascending order and similarly if you see the columns then those are also sorted so for example 0th index column has value as 10, 15, 27, 32 and similarly if we take 2nd index column the values are 30, 35, 37, 39 so this is the matrix in which each row is sorted and each column is sorted in ascending order and we are given a value and we need to write a program to search that value inside this matrix so friend let's suppose we are given this 4 cross 4 matrix which is sorted row wise and column wise so here as the matrix is 4 cross 4 the value of n is 4 and let's suppose we want to search for a key as 32 now this key is present into the matrix and we want we want to write a program which could search this key into this sorted matrix so friends here you can see the algorithm for it now let's see the working of this algorithm step by step friends there is an inefficient solution that is using two for loops and what we do is we compare 32 with each and every value of this matrix and see whether the element is present in the matrix or not so friend this is an inefficient approach because because the time complexity of this solution is O of n square and here as we are given this matrix is sorted row wise and column wise we can use that property to write an efficient code so let's see a demo of this algorithm so here we are simply calling this search method by passing in the 4 cross 4 matrix the value of n and the key which we want to search so friends here we know that this matrix is sorted row wise and column wise therefore we start our searching from the top right corner of the matrix let's say we start from 0, 0,3 having a value of 40 so what we do is we compare 32 with 40 and see that whether 32 is equal to 40 or not so if it is equal to 40 we simply print that we have found our element at 0, 0,3 and here as 32 is less than 40 so the idea behind this algorithm is if we go to the left of 40 we will find all the numbers lesser than 40 and if we go below 40 then we will find the numbers greater than 40 so friend as this is a row wise and column wise sorted matrix so for each and every element in this matrix this property holds true that if we go a step left we get the number lesser than the current number and if we go one step below then we will get a number greater than the current number so let's suppose if we are at index 2 comma 1 so value is 29 if we go one step left we will get the values lesser than 29 and if we go one step down we will get the values greater than 29 and this property is true for each and every value in the matrix so we will use this idea and search for the particular key in the matrix so in step 1 we will create an integer value i which will be pointing to 0 so this value i will be pointing towards a particular row of a matrix at a particular index so currently it is referring to 0th index row moving ahead and then we will create one more integer variable by name j and we will assign the value of n-1 which is, which is nothing but 4-1 minus so friends j will point to the columns index so friends we will start our search from the top right corner of the matrix so therefore we have initialized i to 0 and j to 3 and we will start our search from the index 0 comma 3 having a value of 40 so friends as we want to search for value 32 inside this matrix we are providing a while loop and in this while loop we are providing the boundary conditions of the matrix so that value of i and j do not cross over the matrix boundary so as i started from value 0 we will iterate it to a value lesser than n 
and we are also providing a boundary condition for j that it is started from 3 it should go till index 0 so currently you see i is less than 4 and j is greater than 0 so the condition in while block comes out to be true so here we have provided an if block and inside this if block we are checking that value at matrix i comma j is equal to x or not so value at i comma j which is nothing but 40 we are checking whether it's equal to 32 or not so the condition in if block comes out to be false and then we are again providing an if block and we are simply checking that whether value at i comma j is greater than x or not so here you can see 40 is greater than 32 therefore the condition in if block comes out to be true so friends as this matrix is sorted row wise and column wise so friends when we compare 40 with 32 we know that 40 is greater than 32 therefore we also know that 32 must be lying one step left to 40 so we are simply decrementing the value of j so it would become something like this the value of j becomes 2 moving ahead then we are again checking that whether i is less than n and j is greater than or equal to 0 or not so here you can see i is less than n because the value of i is 0 so it is less than 4 and j is greater than or equal to 0 because value of j is 2 and 2 is greater than 0 so the condition in while block comes out to be true we will again compare the value at i comma j index with x so here you can see the value at 0 comma 2 is 30 so we will simply compare the value of 30 with 32 so the matrix value at 0 comma 2 which is 30 is not equal to 32 therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false and then we will simply check that whether value at i comma j is greater than x or not so here you can see the value at i comma j is less than x because 30 is less than 32 therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false and else part will be executed so friends 32 is greater than 30 therefore it must be lying somewhere below 30 so we simply increment i by 1 to go one step down so value of i is 0 so now it will become 1 moving ahead we again check whether i is less than n and j is greater than 0 or not so i is holding value 1 and it is less than 4 and j is holding value 2 which is greater than 0 therefore condition in while block comes out to be true in the first if block we check whether the value at matrix i comma j is equal to x or not so here the value at i comma j which is nothing but 35 is not equal to x which is 32 therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false we then check that whether value at matrix i comma j is greater than x or not so here you can see the value at i comma j which is 35 is greater than 32 therefore the condition in if block comes out to be true and as 35 is greater than 32 we know that 32 must be lying somewhere to the left of 35 therefore we simply go one step left to 35 which is nothing but decrementing the j by 1 so it would look something like this that value of j becomes 1 moving ahead now again we will check in the while loop there whether value of i is less than n and j is greater than or equal to 0 or not so here you can see the value of i which is 1 is less than 4 and value of j which is 1 is greater than 0 therefore the condition in while block comes out to be true 
we again check in the if block that whether value at i comma j is equal to x or not so here you can see value at i comma j which is 25 so 25 is not equal to 32 therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false and then we'll again check that whether the value at i comma j is greater than x or not so currently 25 is not greater than x so the condition in if block comes out to be false and else part will be executed so friends as 32 is greater than 25 we know that this value might lie somewhere below 25 so we'll simply move one step down by incrementing the value of i so i becomes 2 moving ahead we'll again check whether i is less than n and j is greater than or equal to 0 or not so here you can see 2 is less than 4 and 1 is greater than 0 therefore the condition in while block comes out to be true we check the value of matrix at i comma j is equal to x or not so here you can see the value at i comma j which is nothing but 29 is not equal to 32 therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false and then we simply check that whether value at matrix i comma j is greater than x or not so here you can see value at i comma j which is 29 is less than x which is 32 therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false and else part will be executed so friends we will go one step down because 32 is greater than 29 so here as this matrix is row and column wise sorted matrix we know that 32 might lie below 29 so we simply go one step down by incrementing the value of i so i becomes 3 moving ahead in the while loop we will again check whether i is less than n or not so here you can see value of i is 3 and it is less than 4 and we also check whether j is greater than or equal to 0 or not so here you can see j is greater than 0 so the condition in while block comes out to be true then in the if block we check that whether value at matrix i comma j is equal to x or not so the value at i comma j is nothing but 33 and we know that it's not equal to 32 therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false then we simply check that whether value at matrix i comma j is greater than x or not so here you can see the value at i comma j which is 33 is greater than 32 therefore condition in if block comes out to be true Now as this value 33 is greater than 32 we know that value must be lying to the left of 33 so we simply go one step left by decrementing the value of j so j becomes 0 and then again in while we check whether i is less than n and j is greater than or equal to 0 so here you can see value of i is 3 and it is less than 4 and value of j is 0 which is equal to 0 therefore condition in while block comes out to be true now we simply check that whether value at matrix i comma j is equal to x or not so here you can see the value of matrix at 3 comma 0 which is 32 is actually equal to 32 therefore condition in if block comes out to be true so friends here we know that we have found our value so therefore we will simply print on the console that x is found at 3 comma 0 so in the console we are simply printing that x is found at 3 comma 0 and then we will simply return from this method so friends in this tutorial we saw the demonstration of the algorithm now let's go to eclipse and see the working of this code hello everyone so friends in our previous tutorial we saw the demonstration of the algorithm to search for a value in row and column wise sorted matrix 
Now in this tutorial, we'll actually write that code and test its working. So here I've created one class by name sorted matrix. And inside this class, I've created one main method. And here I've initialized the matrix, which we discussed in our previous tutorial, which is row and column wise sorted matrix. Now let's write a program to search for a key in this row and column wise sorted matrix. So I'll give the name of this method as public void search and this method takes in three arguments one is the matrix one is the value of n as it is a 4 cross 4 matrix therefore value of n will be 4 and one will be the value which we want to search we are denoting it by x so in order to search in a row and column by sorted matrix we are using two pointers i comma j so we are initializing i to 0 and j to n minus 1 because we are simply starting our search from the top right corner of the matrix so here value of i will be iterating over the indexes of the rows and value of j will be iterating over the indexes of the columns. Moving ahead, we'll provide a while loop and inside this while loop, we have to iterate over the matrix using the values of i and j. Therefore we are simply providing the boundary condition so that i and j do not cross over the matrix boundary. So here i should be less than n and j should be greater than equal to 0 which we actually discussed in our previous tutorial. In the first step we are providing an if block and inside this if block we are simply checking that value of matrix at i comma j is equal to x or not so if the value at matrix i comma j is equal to x then we know that we have found our element so we simply print x found at i comma j and then we'll simply return from this method because we have found our element and if the value at i comma j is not equal to x then we simply check that whether that value is greater than x or less than x so matrix i is greater than x or not so here if the value at matrix i comma j is greater than x and as it is a row and column by sorted matrix we have to go one step left so in order to go one step left we simply decrement the value of j by 1 and if the value at matrix i comma j is less than x which is the else part then we know that we have to traverse one step down because value of x will be lying somewhere down to the value of matrix i comma j so we will simply increment the value of i by 1 also friend if you don't find any value then after this while block will simply print value not found so friend this is the code to search a value in a row and column by sorted matrix now let's test it's working so in the main method we have already created a matrix which is row and column by sorted matrix so first we will create the instance of the sorted matrix class And then we'll simply call the search method by passing in the matrix the value of n which is matrix dot length and let's say we want to search for a value 32 which we discussed in our previous tutorial so if I run the code now so here you can see that it prints that x is found at 3 comma 0 
so we have simply printed the indices of the matrix where we have found this value now let's suppose if we search for a value which is not present in the matrix say we give value is 100 and if I run the code now so you can see in the second line it printed that value not found so friends in this tutorial we actually coded an algorithm to search for a key in a row and column wise sorted matrix so friends I hope you like this video thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in this video we will be discussing a famous interview problem print a given matrix in spiral form so here you can see that we are given with a matrix now let's say we are given with an integer matrix having the values as 1 2 3 4 and so on now we need to print this matrix in a spiral form now what is the spiral form so the spiral form is something like this so here you can see that it basically traverse in clockwise direction and it goes something like this so we need to print this matrix in this form so first we need to print it from left to right then from top to bottom then from right to left and then from bottom to top and once we are done with the outer matrix here you can see the spiral curve goes inside so then we'll go to the inner matrix so here will first traverse it like this left to right then top to bottom then right to left and then from bottom to top and after traversing it like this we will traverse the inner matrix like this and we keep on doing this till there are no more elements left to be traversed and this matrix can be of any length and can have any inner boxes so if we print this matrix it would look something like this 1 2 3 4 8 12 16 15 14 13 9 5 6 7 11 and 10 now let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step now here you can see this is the algorithm to traverse the matrix in spiral form so if you see this algorithm looks quite complex but once you get an idea it becomes very easy so before we start in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update so here let's say we call the spiral print method we pass in the matrix which we saw in our previous slide so that matrix was 4 cross 4 it has 4 rows and 4 columns so we are passing that information as well so here it would look something like this that we have this 4 cross 4 matrix having row index from 0 to 3 and column index from 0 to 3 so this value r is 4 is denoting that it is 4 rows and c equal to 4 is denoting its 4 columns so for timing you can think it's something like this here that it's in outer boundaries of this matrix and it is basically denoting the number of rows and number of columns but here these numbers are denoting the indexes from 0 to 3 moving ahead now we'll create three pointers i k and l so here i if you see it will be our normal iterator which will help us in printing the matrix in a spiral form so this is the generic iterator k will basically help us in traversing the rows and l will help us in traversing the columns so we'll see its significance later so for timing we are starting from 0th row and 0th column so therefore these two variables will help us in traversing rows and columns from 0 so k is 0 and l is 0 so this 0 is basically the index so k is pointing to 0th row so this is the row and l is pointing to 0th column so this is the column so now we'll see how these two variables help us in traversing the matrix in spiral form 
So friends, in our previous slide, we saw that how we can traverse the matrix in spiral form. First, we need to traverse the outer matrix. Then we need to traverse the inner matrix and we need to go on like this till there are no more elements left to be traversed. We provide a while loop and these are the boundary checks that K should be less than R because K could travel from 0 to 3. So therefore it should be less than R which is 4 and L should be less than C. So L should be less than C because this is the boundary of the column and this is the boundary of row. Once this condition comes out to be true, you can see that we have one for loop, second for loop, third for loop and fourth for loop. Now why this four for loops? So it's very simple. The first for loop signifies that we need to go from left to right. The second for loop will help us in traversing top to bottom. The third for loop will help us in traversing from right to left and the last for loop will help us in traversing from bottom to top. So we need to print the matrix in spiral form. So it's like going from left to right, top to bottom, right to left and bottom to top. So this will help us in traversing the outer matrix. So this while loop will help us go to the inner matrix and perform these steps again. And it will go on till these conditions are satisfied. And once these conditions are not satisfied, we know that we have traversed the matrix in spiral form. So let's see the demonstration of this four for loops along with the outer while loop. So initially both these conditions are true. Now our task is to print first row. So here you can see this is the first row we need to print. So if you see this first row is being referred by or pointed by K and once we print 1, 2, 3, 4, we are going to this direction. So when we go to this direction, you can see the row remains same and what changes is the column. So if you want to print 1, we need 0, 0. If you want to print 2, 0, 1, 0, 2 for 3. 0, 3 for 4. So here you can see the column is actually changing. So when we go this side, column changes. So this for loop, you can see as we want to print from the first element or from the first column to the last column with row remains the same. So the column varies and this column will vary from L equal to 0 to the last value of the column. So here L will help us in starting that from which column we need to print. So currently this matrix we are printing is from the start. So this is the outer matrix. But once we traverse this matrix once, we need to go to the inner matrix. So at that time this L will help us to start from 6. And we need to perform this logic again. So here this L help us in keeping the traverse of which column is actually printed and this k will help us in traversing that which row is actually printed. So we'll see their advantage later. So here you can see that we are starting from L which is 0 and we'll go till i is less than c. So i is less than c we need to go till this point. So here now it's very simple that i is starting from 0 from here and we need to print from left to right keeping the row constant and varying the column based on the i. So after providing the valid range for i, here you can see that we are keeping the k constant because row is the same. What varies is the i. So we'll quickly go over this for loop and we'll print the first four elements because i is traveling from 0 to less than c. So currently c is 4. So I will go from 0 to 3. So let's see how. So 1 will be printed. I will get incremented. Two will be printed. I will get incremented. 
थ्री विल बी प्रिंटेड आई बिकम्स थ्री एंड देन फोर विल बी प्रिंटेड सो नाउ यू यू कैन सी वेन विल डू आई प्लस प्लस आई विल बिकम फोर सो फोर इज नॉट लेस देन फोर विच इज द वैल्यू ऑफ सी यू कैन सी सो इट मीन्स वी आर डन विथ प्रिंटिंग द फर्स्ट पार्ट गोइंग फ्रॉम लेफ्ट टू राइट सो दिस थिंग इज डन वी हैव प्रिंटेड वन टू थ्री फोर नाउ हियर यू कैन सी दैट एज दिस रो इज ऑलरेडी प्रिंटेड वी डोंट हैव टू प्रिंट दिस रो अगेन वी नीड टू गो टू दिस साइड फ्रॉम सिक्स टू सेवन सो वॉट वी नीड टू डू इज we need to now increment k by 1 position because we are done with this row so k becomes 1 and now it signifies that this is our range to print because we have already printed the first row and here you can see that this k also help us in starting of the top to bottom it won't print 4 again because here you can see that when we go top to bottom we are starting from k so i will start from this k equals to 1 and here you can see that when we go from top to bottom you can see that we need to print 8 12 16 so here you can see the column remains the same now what varies is the row so here i will simply write r so basically you need to think that if you are going from left to right column varies if you are going from top to bottom row varies so this i will start from k because we need to print 8 and we don't have to print 4 so we have already printed 4 so we have incremented k by 1 so now i will start from k equal to 1 and it will go till i is less than r so here you can see i is less than r because now row varies and here you can see the column remains the same so in order to print this column its value is 3 which is c minus 1 so let's see how it goes so i starts from k so here i is 1 so now here you can see the row is actually varying here column was varying here row is varying and column here remains the constant so we need to print the last column so how we can get the last column is we simply do c minus 1 so this will help us in getting the last column so now i starting from 1 so we are first printing 1 comma 3 because c minus 1 is 3 then we will print 2 comma 3 then 3 comma 3 so we'll see it how it goes so now 8 will be printed value of i is 1 and c minus 1 is 3 so 1 comma 3 will be printed which is 8 will increment i i becomes 2 so it means it has now reached here then we will print 12 which is 2 comma 3 will increment i i becomes 3 and at the end we'll simply print 16 will increment i so i will become 4 so here you can see once i becomes 4 4 is not less than 4 so this for loop will exit and here you can see that we have printed now this part left to right is printed top to bottom is printed and after printing here you can see that we have completed with this column so in the next iteration of while loop we need to start from here so for example we need to start from this column not from this column so we need to decrement c now because c is pointing to 4 now we need to decrement it because once everything will be finished and this while loop will again come here you can see we are printing c minus 1 so if c remains at the 4 3 will be again printed so c becomes 3 now and here you can see now we are simply providing one check 
that if k is less than r then only go from right to left so here yeah, this condition we will look into later so for timing just think that we have only this for loop so currently k is actually less than r but we will see the importance of this condition later so for timing just think that k is less than r because k value is 1 and r is 4 now here you can see we are done from left to right top to bottom now we need to go from right to left and we know that what varies in this direction is the column so here we need to print now 15 then 14 then 13 so here you can see the column is actually varying from 2 then 1 then 0 and what is constant here is the row so when we traverse from left to right or from right to left the row remains the same column varies and if we go from top to bottom or bottom to top the row varies and columns remains the same so here now we are going from right to left so column is actually varying from 2 then 1 then 0 and here you can see the row is same which is 3 so here now our i will start from c minus 1 because we need to print this part not this so i will start from c minus 1 which is 2 2 it means this column and row is constant and here you can see this i will traverse till i is less than equal to l so here you can see if l would have been here it means that we are printing this smaller part of the matrix because this l will help us in providing the range that which column we need to print so currently why we are going till i is greater than equal to l because we need to print all the column values corresponding to this row and here you can see that after each iteration we are decrementing i because we are printing 2 then 1 then 0 index so we are going from right to left so row remains constant so how we can get this value is we simply do r minus 1 so this is the row which we need to print and column varies from 2 to 0 which is provided by l so we'll simply print 15 now will decrement i i becomes 1 will now print 3 comma 1 which is 14 will decrement i i becomes 0 will print 3 comma 0 now which is 13 will decrement i it will become minus 1 it means i has gone out of the boundaries of the matrix so this condition comes out to be false because l is 0 and i should be greater than equal to l so here you can see after this for loop completes we are done with this part 15 14 13 and here we are done with this row so now we'll simply decrement r because in the next iteration of these four loops we will simply go to the inner matrix so this row is already printed so we'll simply do r minus minus so r becomes 3 and this is the similar condition what we provided here we'll discuss this both condition later so for timing think that l is less than c because l is 0 and c is pointing to 3 so this condition is true now here we need to go from bottom to top so we know that row will vary and column will remain the same so we need to print this column and friends here you can see that how this k is helping to prevent traversing this one again because we need to print this column which is 9 and 5 so here like we did here provided a range here you can see so we are starting i from r minus 1 which is 2 because we need to print this now 9 and it will go till k so this k will help us to only print 5 and it won't allow us to go beyond that to print 1 so this is the advantage of these conditions here 
so i will start from 2 because r minus 1 is 3 minus 1 which is 2 so here i is starting from the second index row and here you can see that we know that column is constant and this column is being denoted by l and the row varies so row is actually varying by this iterator i so first we will print 2 comma 0 which is 9 then we'll decrement i by 1 i will become 1 so i has become 1 now we'll print 1 comma 0 because value of l is 0 so 5 will be printed so here you can see now i become 0 here so we don't need to print this so therefore this k will help us in not going to this row because i should be greater than or equal to k but here i is not greater than or equal to k its value is zero so this for loop will exit and once this for loop will exit you can see that now we have printed this part so after this four for loops we are done with the outer matrix so now we need to go to inner matrix so this while loop will help us going to the inner matrix but before going that as we have printed this column now we need to simply shift l by one position because we need to start again from here now so we need to shift l by one position by doing l plus plus so l will become one so here you can see that how this l and k are helping us in traversing this matrix in spiral form we are done with this column so now when this while loop will come again into picture we will simply start from inner matrix and this complete matrix will not be touched based on these conditions so let's see how so here you can see k is still less than r so this condition is true and l is less than c so this condition is also true so now here you can see that initially we started k equal to 0 and l equal to 0 r was pointing to 4 and c was pointing to 4 and we printed the outer matrix like this so now here you can see after the previous complete iteration we shifted everything by one position we shifted k by one position we shifted l by one position we reduced r by one position and we reduce c by one position so so now here you can see that as we have reduced the dimensions of k r l c it means that we are telling that we are done with the outer matrix and we are now starting from the inner matrix so here you can see k is pointing to one it means it is starting from here now l is starting from this column because we need to print this and similarly r and c so now at the start we need to print now 6 and 7 so here we know that column varies so from which column we need to start this will help us we need to start from the first column because we need to print 6 and row remains the same so i starting from l so here you can see the advantage that this l is actually providing us the range and it will go till less than c so this i will go and print 6 and 7 because it is going till less than c so less than c is 2 it means 6 and 7 will be printed because column is varying and row is constant which is k so this is the similar thing now so the only idea is we need to keep the track of the ranges rest everything is very much same so we'll simply print now 6 then we'll increment i i becomes 2 so now we'll simply print 1 comma 2 here 1 comma 2 so 7 will be printed we'll increment i so i becomes 3 so 3 is not less than 3 so this condition comes out to be false now and for loop will terminate 
because and our condition is we need to only print six seven not the eight so yes c is helping us to keep within the boundaries of inner matrix so we are done with this part and here you can see rest everything is same we are done printing this row now so we'll simply increment k by one which means we need to print now this row now we'll go from top to bottom so row varies and k is pointing to 2 so i will start from 2 because we need to print 11 now so i is starting from 2 here and here you can see the column remains the same so this is the only column or only element inside this column we need to print because rest everything is printed so we simply print c minus 1 which is the second column and i is traveling from k to less than r so after printing 11 when we will increment i it will reach to 3 which will make us equal to r so therefore i will be equal to r and we need and we will break from this for loop so this only 11 will be printed here now so here we'll print 2 comma 2 so 11 will be printed will increment i so i will become 3 but here you can see this condition is not getting satisfied which makes sense because we don't have to print now 15 we are done with the printing of the inner matrix so this part is done and as we have printed this column so we'll simply shift c by one position here we do c minus minus And this condition k is less than r still holds true because k is less than r. We will discuss this later. And now here you can see we need to go to from right to left. So column varies. So here you can see this column will vary from c minus 1 which is this part. c minus 1 which is 1 and it will go till l because l will help us to stop going beyond the particular column so it will help us only print 10 now because our i is starting from c minus 1 which is 1 and we need to only print this simple value which is 10 so i is 1 and it is greater than or equal to 1 so this is the part and here we know that when we go from right to left only column varies row remains the same so here we are simply printing r minus 1 comma i so r minus 1 will give us this row and i is actually pointing to 1 so we are simply printing 2 comma 1 now which is 10 will decrement i i will become 0 so here you can see now this condition comes out to be false because i is not greater than or equal to l so here you can see we have printed 10 and this part is completed so now we'll do r minus minus because we are done with this row so r becomes 2 so here k and r both are pointing to 2 and here you can see l is less than c we'll see this both conditions later now here you can see we have completely traversed the matrix so this for loop will won't start because i equals to r minus 1. So if we do r minus 1, i will start from 1, which is this. But we are actually done with printing this complete row. So here this condition help us in exiting from this for loop because this is the actual range of the rows i should be greater than or equal to k but here you can see value of i is 1 and value of k is 2 so this condition comes out to be false because 1 is not greater than or equal to 2 so we'll simply increment l now so l becomes 2 and this inner four for loops will end and this while loop will now exit because here you can see k is equal to r and c is also equal to l 
it means we have completely traversed this matrix in spiral form so friends now we need to see why we are providing this conditions i will demonstrate one condition and rest will be pretty much same for the column so let's suppose we are given with a matrix like this that it has only one row and two columns okay so we'll simply quickly go over this k is 0 l is 0 this both condition comes out to be true now we need to print 1 and then 2 because at the start we need to go from left to right and column varies so i starts from l and goes till less than c so this is pretty much normal step one will be printed and then two will be printed so this is actually printed and we are done with the problem but here if we do k plus plus so k is pointing to zero so now k is pointing to one here we will start from i equal to 1 because we are done with printing this row now we need to start from the next row and we need to go from top to bottom so here r varies and i starts from k and goes till r minus 1 so this for loop won't get executed because k and r are pretty much same pointing to 1 so what we do is we do c minus minus because we are done with printing the last row because it is already printed so we simply go c minus minus so c comes here so friend let's suppose if this condition wouldn't have been provided here you can see k is equal to r now okay and if we don't provide this condition let's say this for loop starts executing then we need to go from right to left okay so when we go from right to left we start from c minus 1 so c minus 1 is i will start from 0 and it will go till i is greater than or equal to l so here you can see l is pointing to 0 so this condition comes out to be true so this is where this problem starts if this condition comes out to be true then it will simply print r minus 1 which is r pointing to 1 if we do minus 1 we get 0 and i value is 0 so it will actually print 1 which is we don't want that because why we don't want that is because we are already done with this row so therefore when we go from right to left it is very much important that we need to think that okay is the matrix completely traversed because here you can see matrix is completely traversed so here this condition will help us preventing to print one again after printing one and two we should simply exit and these two condition will help us doing that because there could be a possibility that we are given with this matrix only so these are the few edge cases which we need to provide so this condition is also pretty much same let's say if we are given a matrix like this here it was one row two column here it will be two row one column so this condition will help us in preventing let's say one two so like one two one again similar to that stuff so friend this was all about traversing a matrix in a spiral form it is a very complex question but if you understand this figure c varies r varies c varies r varies and they vary from range k l r and c so if you understand these two points you can traverse the matrix in spiral form pretty much easily using this simple for loops i hope you must have liked this video and in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update thanks have a nice day
Hello friends, welcome to my new data structures and algorithms in Java tutorial series video. Friends, in this tutorial we will discuss about the introduction to priority queue and binary heap in Java. So friends, what is a priority queue? So here you can see priority queue is a data structure that allows us to find minimum or maximum element among a collection of elements in constant time. So here priority queue data structure holds the collection of elements and it helps us in finding the minimum or the maximum element in a constant time. That means from the collection of elements we can find the minimum or the maximum element very fast in constant time. So usually priority queue supports this three operation. One is the insertion operation where we actually insert a particular key into the priority queue. So the second operation is delete max or delete min so here you can see whenever we call delete max or delete min what it does is if we call delete max it return and remove the largest key from the priority queue and whenever we call delete min it removes the smallest key from the priority queue and return it back also friend if you don't want to remove the largest and the smallest key from the priority queue then we use the third operation which is the get max and get min so it simply returns the largest and the smallest key without actually removing it from the priority queue. And also friends we will discuss more about the priority queue in our upcoming tutorials. Moving ahead. So friends in our last slide we saw about the priority queue. So now we will discuss about the binary heap. So here you can see the binary heap is a data structure that helps us in implementing the priority queue operations efficiently. So whatever the three operations we discussed in our last slide about the insertion of key, delete max or min and get max or get min, those operations are efficiently implemented with the help of binary heap. Also friends, a binary heap is a complete binary tree in which each node value is greater than or less than the values of its children. So why it is a complete binary tree, we will discuss later. Below you can see that there are two binary heaps. One is the min heap and other is the max heap. And why we call it is a min heap because each node value is less than equal to the values of its children. So here you can see if we take an example of node having value 0 then its children which is 7 and 3 have values greater than the parent. So here in the min heap the parent value is less than or equal to the value of its children. Also here you can see if we take a node having value of 7 then both its children which is 9 and 8 have values greater than 7 and if we take an example of 3 then both its children having values 5 and 6 have values greater than its parent. So here this property is true for each and every node of the binary heap and here you can see in the max heap each node value is greater than or equal to the values of its children. So here if we take the node having value as 9 then its children have values lesser than the parent and similarly if we take the node having value as 3 then its both children is having values lesser than the parent. Similarly 6 which is the parent to 5 and 4 its value is greater than both 5 and 4. Therefore by this definition a binary heap is a complete binary tree in which each node value is greater than equal to which is the max heap or less than equal to which is the min heap than the values of its children. So here you can see the binary heap has two types which is the min heap and the max heap. So in the min heap each node value is less than or equal to than the values of its children and in the max heap each node value is greater than or equal to than the values of its children. Moving ahead. So friends as we discussed in our previous slide that binary heap is a complete binary tree. So what do we mean by complete binary tree? So here as per the definition a complete binary tree is a binary tree where all levels are completely filled except last level and last level has nodes in such a way that left side is never empty. So what do we mean by this definition is 
below you can see a binary tree so here at the level 1 we have a node having value as 0 so this node will be having a left child and a right child so at the level 2 we have these two nodes which is 7 and 3 and till level 2 you can see it is completely filled because a node can have only two children but as soon as we go to level 3 here we see that 7 has one left child and one right child similarly 3 has only left child and there is no right child so here you can see a binary tree is completely filled except the last level so this is the last level so here you can see all the levels are completely filled except the last level so here we can see there is no node therefore it's not completely filled and also it has one more property that the last level has node in such a way that left side is never empty so here you can see the whatever the nodes the last level is having they are in such a way that left side is never empty so by the left side we mean that in example 2 you can see that level 1 is complete level 2 is complete but level 3 is not complete and also and the last level is not completely filled but here you can see by the second property it says that last level has nodes in such a way that left side is never empty so here you can see one left side is empty so therefore it's not a complete binary tree so we call it an incomplete binary tree those last level is not completely filled but there is one missing left node and similarly here you can see that all the levels are completely filled and the last level is not completely filled but it has nodes in such a way that the left side is never empty so friends here you can imagine complete binary in such a way that if we go from left to right then we always get a node so here at the level 1 there is one node so level 1 is completely filled as we go to level 2 there can be at most two nodes so here you can see if you go from left to right we are getting 7 and 3 so those are completely filled if you go to third level if you go from left to right then we are always getting a node though there is no right child of 3 but still it's a complete binary tree because because there are no gaps if you are traversing from left to right and similarly if you talk about incomplete binary tree and if you go from left to right then here we can see that 3 has no left child therefore the first node is null so it doesn't satisfy the property of complete binary tree also friends in our upcoming tutorial we will also discuss more about the complete binary tree because this is the main property which helps us in creating a binary heap hello friends welcome to my new data structures and algorithms in java tutorial series video friends in this tutorial we will discuss how to represent a binary heap in java so friends in our previous tutorial we actually discussed about the introduction to binary heap so in this tutorial we will actually see how we can actually represent a binary heap in java so friends in our previous tutorial we actually discussed that binary heaps are nothing but complete binary tree and we also discussed that there are two types of binary heap one is the main heap and other is the max heap so friends diagrammatically we represent a binary heap in the form of a binary tree that there is one parent who has two children and similarly the other levels have their own children but when it comes to storing these elements binary heaps usually are implemented using the array so here you can see a max heap in which each node value is greater than or equal to the value of its children so 9 is greater than 3 and 6 3 is greater than 2 and 1 6 is greater than 5 and 4 so in order to represent the binary heap we basically implement it through the arrays also here you can see the max heap is having 7 element as 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 so we usually store these elements into an array so in order to store these 7 elements into this array we usually create an array of 7 plus 1 elements 
because the first entry of array we always take it as empty so here you can see that we never store any element at the zeroth index and here you can see that we start storing these elements from index 1 so usually we keep the first entry of this array as empty also friends we store these elements into an array by traversing this binary tree level by level from left to right so here you can see at level 1 if we are traversing from left to right we have only encounter one node which is 9 so we store 9 into an array at the first index moving ahead then we go to level 2 and at level 2 from left to right we first encounter 3 so we store 3 at index 2 and similarly then we encounter 6 so we store it at index 3 and similarly if we go to level 3 from left to right first we encounter 2 so 2 we store at index 4 and similarly the other elements also friends in the last tutorial we discussed that binary heaps are complete binary tree that all the levels are filled and if all levels are not filled then only the last level is the level which is not filled and the elements are arranged in such a way that the left side is not empty so here you can see why we are taking it as bin complete binary tree so let's suppose if 2 is not present so when we store these elements from left to right in an array so you can see that here in an array we will get an empty hole which will store a null value so whenever we are representing a binary heap using an array we don't want that any value inside this binary heap to be an empty or null so therefore the binary heap are nothing but complete binary tree where each level is filled completely and if all the levels are not complete then it is the only last level which is not complete and all the nodes are as left as possible so friends binary heap has these two properties one is that it should be complete binary tree and second it should follow the heap order property so the heap order property is what we discussed that each node should have values greater than or less than the values of its children and if the values are greater than its children then it's a max heap and if the values is less than its children then it's a min heap which we already discussed in our previous tutorial also friend if we represent this indexes here then it would look something like this that we have filled this array from left to right level by level moving ahead also friends in our previous slide we discussed that how we can represent a binary heap in the form of an array so here you can see this max heap is represented in the form of an array so whenever you perform any calculation over this array we are basically provided a particular index and we need to calculate basically its parent or its child using some formula so here you can see if we are at node having value as 9 so in the array it is at first index and if we look for its children then it has two children one is having value as 3 and other is having value 6 and they are at index 2 and 3 so one has one children at index 2 and one has other children at index 3 Similarly, if we take a node having value as 3, then here we can see that it is at index 2. And if we look for its children, then they are at index 4 and 5, which means that index 4, which has value 2, and index 5, which has value 1, are children of index 2, whose value is 3. So here you can see 3 is parent to 2 and 1 in which 3 is at index 2, 2 is index 4 and 1 is at index 5. So here value at index 2 
is parent to value at index 4 and also value at index 5. Similarly, if you take the node having value as 6, then here you can see 5 and 4 are children to 6. If you take this representation into an array, then 5 is one children of 6 and 4 is the other children. So friends, here you can see that how this binary heap is represented into this array and how we can represent this parent-child relationship into this array but in order to calculate this parent and child of a particular index there is a formula so we always have the children of first index is 2 and 3 we saw the children of second index which is this node is 4 and 5 and we also saw the children of third index which is this has children at 6 and 7 so if we are given any particular index let's say kth index and we want to find its children then the children of kth index would be 2 times k and 2 times k plus 1 so here children of 1 is 2 into 1 and 2 into 1 plus 1 children of second index is 2 into 2 which is 4 and 2 into 2 plus 1 which is 5 children of third index is 3 into 2 which is 6 and 3 into 2 plus 1 which is 7 so friend this is the formula which we use in order to find the children of any particular index we simply substitute that particular index value here and we get the values of its children so friend, this was the formula to calculate the children of any particular index. Now let's say if we are given any particular index and we want to find its parent index. Then here you can see the parent of 7th index is 3. So here the parent to the 7th index is 3. Parent of 6th index is 3. So parent of 6th index is also 3. Parent of 5th index is 2. So this is the 5th index and its parent is at 2 so friends in order to find the parent of kth index the formula would be simply k by 2 so here you can see that if you are at 7 index and we want to go to its parent then what we simply do is we do 7 by 2 which gives us a value of 3.5 and as we are dealing with the integer values this integer value is rounded off to 3 so 7 by 2 gives 3.5 and if we take the integer value of it, it round off to 3. Similarly, the parent of 6 index is 3, which is evaluated as 6 by 2, which is 3. And parent of 5th index is 2, is being evaluated as 5 by 2, which gives us a value of 2.5. And if we round it off, we get 2. So friends, in this slide we discussed that whenever we represent a binary heap in the form of an array and if we are at any particular index then we can traverse to its parent or to its child using these formulas. If we want to traverse to its child we simply multiply it by 2 which will traverse it to the left child and if we add a 1 to it we simply go to its right child. And similarly if we are at any particular index and if we want to go to its parent we simply divide that index by 2 and we will reach to its parent index. So friends in this tutorial we actually discussed about the representation of a binary heap and we also discussed that we are actually representing a binary heap in the form of an array where this first element of the array is left as empty and we start our insertion of these elements from the index 1. And we also discussed that how we can actually calculate the children of any particular index and also the parent of any particular index. I hope you like this video. Thanks. Have a nice day. Hello friends. Welcome to my new data structures and algorithms in Java tutorial series video. Friends in this tutorial we will discuss 
हाउ टू इम्प्लीमेंट मैक सीप इन जावा सो फ्रेंड्स इन आर प्रीवियस ट्यूटोरियल वी एक्चुअली डिस्कस दैट बाइनरी हीप्स आर ऑफ बेसिकली टू टाइप्स वन इज द मेन बाइनरी हीप एंड अदर इज द मैक्स बाइनरी हीप सो हियर यू कैन सी अ मैक्स हीप इज अ कंप्लीट बाइनरी ट्री इन विच ईच नोट वैल्यू इज ग्रेटर देन और इक्वल टू द वैल्यूज ऑफ इट्स चिल्ड्रन सो हियर इफ यू टेक एनी पर्टिकुलर नोड लेट से नाइन so its value will be always greater than or equal to the values of its children so here you can see 9 is greater than 3 and 6 so this property should hold true for each and every node of this max binary heap so if we take an example of node having value as 3 then 3 is greater than 2 and 1 and similarly if we take a example of 6 then 6 is greater than 5 and 4 and also in a binary tree the last level has the leaf nodes so therefore the property holds true for them as well also friends in a max heap you can see that the maximum value is always at the top which we also call as the root of the binary tree so here in the max heap the root always has the maximum value and if we represent this max heap in a form of an array then it would look something like this that as this max heap has seven elements we will first create an array of length 8 because the first element we always keep it as empty and we start insertion from the index 1 we also discussed in our previous tutorial that how we actually insert this value inside an heap so we go level by level from left to right so at level 1 we have only the root node which is 9 so 9 is placed at the index 1 similarly at level 2 we have 3 and 6 so 3 is placed at index 2 and 6 is placed at index 3 and at level 3 we have four nodes 2 1 5 and 4 so 2 is placed at index 4 1 is placed at index 5 5 is placed at index 6 and 4 is placed at index 7 so friends here you can see the maximum value of this binary tree is at the root which is 9 and if we represent this max heap in an array then here you can see at index 1 we will always get the maximum value moving ahead so friends here you can see the code for the implementation of the max priority queue so this is the initial implementation and there are many more methods which we will discuss in our upcoming tutorials and here you can see this max priority queue is nothing but our max heap where it has the integer array which we discussed in our previous slide so we give it as a name of heap and we actually store the size of this max priority queue in the integer variable n so friends here you can see in the main method the first step we do is we basically create an instance of max priority queue and to its constructor we are actually passing the capacity that how many elements this max priority queue will hold so here you can see in the constructor the value which we are passing is nothing but the capacity of the max priority queue so this is nothing but the initial capacity of the max priority queue so when this line get executed the call reaches to this point and we know that we have passed the value as 3 so the capacity is 3 now as we have this instance variable which is an integer array by name heap and the integer variable n which holds the size of this max priority queue and also friends here you can see that this integer array can be any generic type array but for the simplicity of understanding i am using here as an integer array so here in the constructor the first step we do is we actually create an array having length as capacity plus 1 
so it would look something like this now capacity is 3 and we have initialized this array with a length of capacity plus 1 which is 4 so why we actually do capacity plus 1 is because we discussed in our previous tutorial that that the first element in an array we always keep it as empty so we actually don't use the index 0 we always keep it as empty and we place our elements starting from index 1 so here you can see as we are not using this 0th index now the array can hold a capacity of 3 so therefore we are initializing this integer array with a length of capacity plus 1 moving ahead now as we have initialized this max priority queue here the initial value of n would be 0 because there are no elements currently into this heap so n is 0 and also friends here we have provided two methods one is the is empty method which returns a boolean value which tells that whether priority queue is empty or not so here you can see if the value of n is equal to 0 then we know that there are no elements into this heap and max priority queue is empty so we simply return true if value of n is 0 or else we return false and the second method we provide is size we simply return the value of n so here if we call the size method it will print 0 because currently the value of n is 0 and then if we simply call is empty method to check whether priority queue is empty or not it simply return true because n is equal to 0 so friend this is a basic and a initial implementation of a max priority queue there are more other methods which we will discuss in our upcoming tutorial so the only understanding we need to see is that a max priority queue basically implemented through an array which we give your name as heap and we simply create an integer value n which keeps a track of the number of elements currently into this heap array so friends this was the demonstration of this few methods now let's go to eclipse and see the working of this code hello friends in our previous tutorial we actually discussed how we can implement a max priority queue in java and in our previous tutorial we actually saw an animation to basically implement a max priority queue and in that tutorial we actually implemented the max priority queue at a very basic level and which we will enhance in our upcoming tutorial so friend let's see the code to implement a max priority queue in java at a very basic level so friend in this tutorial i have created one class by name max pq which is nothing but max priority queue which has a main method so friends in our previous tutorials we also discussed that we represent a max priority queue in a form of an array so first we'll create an integer array and we'll give it as a name as heap and the second instance variable we'll give it as integer variable by name n so this will store the size of the max heap moving ahead we also discussed that we will provide a constructor so this constructor will take the initial capacity of the heap so inside this constructor we also saw that first we will create an integer array whose size will be capacity plus 1 so why we are taking is capacity plus 1 is because index 0 is kept as empty and we simply initialize the value of n to be 0 because when we initialize this max priority queue there are no elements into this heap so the value of n is 0 we will also provide a method 
विच विल रिटर्न ए बुलियन वैल्यू एंड द नेम ऑफ द मेथड वुड बी इज एम टी विच विल रिटर्न ए बुलियन वैल्यू दैट वेदर दिस मैक्स प्रायोरिटी क्यू इज एम टी और नॉट सो वी सिंपली रिटर्न एन इक्वल इक्वल जीरो सो ऑफ द वैल्यू ऑफ एन इज जीरो इट विल रिटर्न ट्रू एंड ऑफ वैल्यू ऑफ एन इज नॉट जीरो then we know that there are elements into this heap array also we'll provide one more method whose return type would be an integer value which would be nothing but the size of this max priority queue so we'll simply return the value of n so whenever we call this size method it will return us back the size of this max heap that how many elements currently this max heap has so friend in the main method we'll first initialize this priority queue let's say with capacity 3 and then we'll print its size and we'll also check that whether is currently empty or not so here you can see when we initialize this max priority queue the value of n is 0 so the size return is 0 so it will print 0 and if you check whether this max priority queue is empty or not so n is equal to 0 so it would return true if i run this code now so here you can see it printed 0 and true so friends in this tutorial we actually discussed the basic and a very initial implementation of this max priority queue in our upcoming tutorial we will see the operation a priority queue supports such as insertion get max and delete max i hope you like this video thanks have a nice day Hello friends welcome to my new data structures and algorithms in java tutorial series video friends in this tutorial we will discuss bottom up reepify in maxheap so friends in our previous tutorial we saw the initial implementation of a maxheap in java now in this tutorial we will actually discuss what happens when we insert a particular element into this max heap so here you can see that a max heap is a complete binary tree in which each node value is greater than or equal to the values of its children so here you can see the node having value as 9 has two children 3 and 6 so 9 has a value greater than both 3 and 6 and similarly if we take a node having value as 3 it has two children 2 and 1 so both these values 2 and 1 are less than 3 so here you can see in max heap each node is having value greater than the values of its children so friend this property is called as heap order property of a max heap that each node value is greater than or equal to the values of its children So friend let's suppose we are given a particular max heap having this seven elements now let's suppose if we insert any particular element into this heap so after inserting that particular element into this max heap it may not satisfy this above property so friend let's suppose we are given any particular max heap having this few elements so in this max heap we know that the maximum value is always at root So friend let's suppose if we insert an element into this max heap having value greater than 9 So friend as we discussed that heap is a complete binary tree and here you can see all the levels are filled so when we insert a new node it will be inserted into this level 4 to the left of 2 and let's suppose we insert a value of 15 So once we insert this value as 15 
the heap order property which we discussed that each node value should be greater than or equal to the value of its children will break because 2 will be parent to 15 but its value is lesser than 15 so it will break the heap order property of this max heap so friends what we do is after inserting that particular value we perform bottom up reheap 5 technique so in this technique what we do we simply adjust the location of elements so that it satisfied this heap property so friends let's see a demo that how we can perform bottom up reheap 5 in a max heap so let's say we are given this max heap having 7 elements and let's say we insert 10 so here you can see all the levels are filled completely and as heap is a complete binary tree the value 10 will be inserted to the left of 2 at level 4 so it would look something like this because in a complete binary tree all the levels are filled completely except the last level and the last level is filled in such a way that leftmost side is not empty so 10 will be inserted to the left of 2 so friend as it is a max binary heap we know that the maximum element always lies at the root of this binary tree but here you can see as we have inserted a value 10 which is greater than 9 therefore the heap order property is not being satisfied because as we discussed that each node in a max heap should have values greater than the values of its children but here you can see if we compare 2 and 10 then the value 2 is less than 10 therefore it is breaking the heap order property of max heap so friends in order to satisfy the heap order property of this max heap what we do is we simply adjust the locations of these nodes such that heap order property is satisfied so here you can see as 10 is greater than 2 so what we do is we simply shift up the value 10 and we swap it with the 2 so it would look something like this the 10 is swapped with 2 so friends once we swap this value we know that 10 is now greater than 2 so at this position 10 is satisfying the heap order property of this max heap but here you can see after this swap we simply traverse to this node and then we again see that whether it has any parent or not so here you can see 10 has a parent whose value is 3 so then we compare these two values because here you can see 3 is less than 10 so still the heap order property is not being satisfied so what we do is we simply shift up 10 and we swap it with the 3 so it would look something like this so value 10 is being swapped with 3 so once we perform this swap we again traverse to 10 and we check that whether it has any parent or not so it has a parent then we compare the parent to its children so here we will simply compare 9 and 10 so here you can see the value of 9 is less than 10 so still the heap order property of this heap is not being satisfied so what we do we simply perform a shift up and we will simply swap these two values so friends once this swap is done we simply traverse to 10 and we again check whether it is any parent or not so here you can see that 10 doesn't have any parent then we also see that heap order property is satisfied because the root has the maximum value among the other nodes now friend let's suppose you want to insert a value as 8 so as it is a complete binary tree the other value will be inserted to the right of 3 so we simply insert 8 to the right of 3 so after we insert this value 8 we simply compare it with its parent and here we see that 3 is less than 8 therefore the heap order property is not being satisfied so what we do we simply perform a shift up and we simply swap these two values 
and once we perform this swap we simply reach to it and then we again compare it with its parent so here 9 is greater than 8 therefore the heap order property is satisfied because in max heap the value of parent should be greater than the value of its children so 9 is greater than 8 so therefore the value 8 is at its correct position moving ahead friends in our upcoming tutorial we will see that how we can insert a value in max heap and we will see the demonstration of the code step by step so the example we will take in our upcoming tutorial will be like this now let's suppose the max heap is empty so first we are inserting 4 so as 4 is the only element into this max heap therefore the heap order property is maintained then we insert 5 so as level 1 is filled completely 5 will be inserted at level 2 to the left of 4 because we know that max heap is nothing but a complete binary tree so 5 will be inserted to the left of 4 so once we insert 5 we will simply check its value to its parent and as it is a max heap we know that each node is having value greater than the value of its children so here we simply compare 4 and 5 and we know that 4 is less than 5 therefore the heap order property is not maintained so we will simply shift up 5 and we will swap it with the 4 so now 5 is at correct position and we know that among these two values 5 is the largest value which is at the root of this binary tree moving ahead let's say we insert 2 so 2 will be inserted to the right of 5 because left is already occupied by 4 so once we insert 2 we will simply compare the value 2 with its parent and as 5 is greater than 2 therefore it is satisfying the heap order property now let's say we insert 6 so here you can see the level 2 is filled completely so now 6 will be inserted at level 3 to the left of 4 and then we will compare these two values and as 4 is less than 6 therefore we will perform a shift up and we will simply swap 6 and 4 so once we perform this swap will reach to this node and then we'll again compare it with its parent so here now we'll compare 5 and 6 and we know that 5 is less than 6 so we'll perform a shift up and we'll simply swap these two values so friends here you can see 6 is at its correct position because it is the largest value among the other three values now let's say we insert 1 so 1 will be inserted to the right of 5 and then we'll compare it with parent and here we can see that 5 is greater than 1 so no swap will be done and let's say we insert 3 so now 3 will be inserted to the left of 2 we will compare 3 with its parent whose value is 2 and we know that 2 is less than 3 therefore we will perform a shift up and we will simply swap these two values and also friends then we will compare 3 with 6 and we know that 3 is at its correct position therefore no swap will be done So friend this is how we perform bottom up re -EP5 in order to maintain the heap order property of min or max heap. So friend usually in most of the cases whenever we insert any new value in an heap the heap order property breaks. So after inserting a new element we simply perform a bottom up re -EP5 technique in which we simply change the locations of the element 
so that they maintain a heap order property and we also give different names to this technique we call it bottom up reapify we also call it shift up we can also call it swim because the elements usually swim from bottom to top when we insert a new element so in our upcoming tutorial we'll actually see the code to insert an element into a max heap and we'll look the demonstration of that code step by step i hope you like this video thanks have a nice day hello friends welcome to my new data structures and algorithms in java tutorial series video friends in this tutorial we will discuss how to insert in a max heap in java so friends in our previous tutorial we actually discussed about what is a max heap that it is a complete binary tree in which each node value is greater than or equal to values of its children and we also discussed that the maximum value of this max binary heap is at root and if we look into its array representation we also discussed that how we actually place these values inside this heap array so we simply put these values level by level from left to right so here you can see in this heap array if we return the value at index 1 we will always get the maximum value of this heap also friends we discussed in a previous tutorial that priority queue helps us in getting the maximum value among the collection of elements in constant time so if we simply return the value at index 1 we get the maximum value of this max binary heap and similarly for the min binary heap if we return the value at index 1 will get the smallest value among the collection of elements so let's see how we can insert a value in max heap so friends in our previous tutorial we actually discussed the basic implementation of the max priority queue so in this tutorial we will actually see how we can insert a value into this max priority queue through this insert method so in our previous tutorial we also discussed that when we call this max priority queue and let's say we provide a capacity of 3 so it would create an integer array having length 4 because, because we are initializing this heap array with length as capacity plus 1 as we are not using the 0th index of this heap array and we start inserting from index 1 therefore here you can see the initial capacity of this heap array is 3 so here heap dot length is 4 so here you can see currently there are no elements into this heap array so the value of n is 0 which we already discussed in our previous tutorial also friends in our previous tutorial we actually saw a demonstration of how we can insert few elements in max heap so friends we will insert the same elements into this heap array and we will see the demonstration of this code step by step so let's say first we insert a value as 4 so the insert method will be called and the value which we want to insert is 4 so x will become 4 moving ahead so friends then we provide a if check that whether n is equal to heap dot length minus 1 or not so here you can see heap dot length is 4 and if we do a minus 1 we get 3 so here we are simply checking that value of n is equal to 3 or not because if value of n is equal to 3 then we know that we have utilized all the capacity of this heap array and there is no more additional space left to insert the value 4 so here you can see currently value of n is 0 and it is not equal to heap dot length minus 1 which is 3 so the condition in if block comes out to be false in the next step as we are inserting 4 into this heap array 
फर्स्ट विल इंक्रीमेंट द साइज ऑफ दिस मैक्स प्रायोरिटी क्यूब बाय वन डेट वी आर अबाउट टू इंसर्ट वन एलिमेंट इन टू दिस मैक्स प्रायोरिटी क्यूब ऑल्सो फ्रेंड एज वी आर नॉट यूटिलाइजिंग द इंडेक्स जीरो सो वॉट विल डू विल सिंपली इंसर्ट एक्स एट इंडेक्स वन सो इट वुड लुक समथिंग लाइक दिस सो वी आर सिंपली असाइनिंग द वैल्यू ऑफ एक्स टू हीप एट इंडेक्स वन बिकॉज वैल्यू ऑफ एन इज वन सो फोर इज इंसर्टेड ऑल्सो फ्रेंड्स वी डिस्कस डेट वेन एवर वी इंसर्ट एनी वैल्यू इन ए मैक्स हीप वी देन परफॉर्म अ बॉटम ऑफ री ईपी फाइव which we also called as swim so here now we'll actually call a method swim by passing in the value stored in n which is 1 so here swim method will be called and here you can see that as we are passing the value of n as 1 so k will become 1 so friends then in swim method we actually provide a while loop so what we do in this while loop we simply check the newly inserted value with its parent and as it is a max priority queue we simply check that its value is lesser than or greater than to its parent and if it is greater than its parent then we simply swap them and if it is lesser than its parent then we do nothing so this is the condition we actually provide into this while loop so the first condition we provide is k should be greater than 1 because here you can see k value is 1 and here you can see that as there is only one element into this heap array there is no parent to index 1 because it is the root of the heap so the condition in while block comes out to be false so 4 is inserted into this heap array and it is placed at its correct position now let's say we insert 5 so x becomes 5 we check that whether n is equal to heap dot length minus 1 or not so n is not equal to 3 because heap dot length is 4 and 4 minus 1 is 3 so the condition in if block comes out to be false now as we are inserting 5 will first increment the value of n by 1 so n becomes 2 so as you incremented n by 1 will simply insert 5 at index 2 by simply assigning the value of x to heap at index 2 moving ahead so friend as you inserted 5 now we simply perform the bottom of re if i by calling this swim method and inside this swim we'll simply pass the value of n so value of k becomes 2 because n is 2 now friends here you can see as we discussed in our previous tutorial that 4 is at root and one of its left child is 5 So, friends, as we have inserted five, in while loop we'll simply check that whether value of k is greater than one or not. So here you can see k is greater than one because value of k is two. And in our previous tutorial we also discussed that in order to calculate the parent of any index, we simply do k by two. And why we are doing this k by two? Because we need to compare this newly inserted value with its parent. So here you can see. Value of k is two. If we do k by two, we'll get one, which signifies that four is parent to five. And then we'll simply check that whether value at parent is less than its children or not. So, for an as it is a max priority queue, k by two is nothing but one, and the value at index one is four, which is parent to five. so we'll simply compare these two values and we'll simply check that parent is less than its children or not so here you can see 4 is less than 5 therefore it is breaking the heap order property so the condition in while block comes out to be true 
and in order to maintain this heap order property we'll simply swap these two values so it would look something like this that first we will assign 5 to this temporary variable and then we'll simply assign the value at index k by 2 to k which is nothing but value at index 1 to value at index 2 so it would look something like this moving ahead and then we'll simply assign the value of 5 to the index k by 2 which is 1 so it would look something like this and as we have swapped these two values now we will traverse to 5 again in order to check that whether it's at its correct position or not because then we again compare with its parent so in order to reach to this index again we simply assign the value of k by 2 to k which is nothing but traversing k to its parent by assigning k by 2 to k so here you can see the value of k by 2 is 1 so k will become 1 and then again in while loop we'll check whether k is greater than 1 or not so here you can see that 5 is at its correct position because among these two values 5 is the largest value and it is placed at the top of this heap which is nothing but at index 1 therefore the condition in while loop comes out to be false now let's say we insert 2 so x becomes 2 we check whether 2 is equal to heap dot length minus 1 or not so heap dot length is 4 and heap dot length minus 1 becomes 3 so n is not equal to 3 so the condition in if block comes out to be false and as we are inserting 2 we will simply increment the value of n by 1 so n becomes 3 and to the third index of this heap array we will simply assign the value as 2 and then we will simply perform the bottom up re p5 at this index which is nothing but 3 so k becomes 3 now k is greater than 1 which is true now we have to compare 2 with its parent so we simply do k by 2 so if we do k by 2 it becomes 1 because 3 by 2 will give us 1.5 and as we are using it as integer it will be round off to 1 so here parent is at index 1 and child is at index k which is 3 so we will simply compare these two values and we will simply check that parent value is less than the child value or not so here you can see 5 is greater than 2 therefore the condition in this while block comes out to be false so now let's say we insert 6 so x becomes 6 and now here you can see value of n is 3 and heap dot length is 4 if we do minus 1 it becomes 3 and here you can see 3 is equal to 3 so friends here it signifies that this heap array is filled completely and there are no more space left to insert 6 so the condition in if block comes out to be true so what we do is so we will simply call the resize method by passing in a value which is twice of heap dot length which is nothing but 8 so friends in our array section we actually discussed how we can resize an array in java so you can watch that tutorial to understand more about this resize method so what this method actually does is it will resize this heap array to a size double of its current length so once this method gets executed it will look something like this that heap array has now length of 8 which is double of its previous length so we actually perform this resize method because we want to insert more elements into this heap array so then we'll simply increment n by 1 
and now we'll simply insert the value x at index 4 so it would look something like this and then we'll simply perform bottom up reep phi at index 4 so k becomes 4 now here in the while block k is greater than 1 which is true and now we have to compare this newly inserted value with its parent that whether it is satisfying the heap order property or not so in order to know the parent of 6 we take its index which is at 4 and we divide it by 2 so k by 2 becomes 2 so here the value at index 2 which is 4 is actually parent to value at index 4 which is 6 so now we'll simply compare these two values and we'll check that whether value at parent is less than the value at child or not so here you can see 4 is less than 6 therefore it is not satisfying the heap order property so the condition in while block comes out to be true so friends now we know that we have to swap these two values so we'll simply perform swap we'll assign 6 to a temporary variable and then we'll assign the value at index k by 2 to k which is nothing but assigning value 4 at index 4 so it would look something like this and finally whatever the value is stored in temp we are simply assigning it to heap at index 2 and also friends in our previous tutorial we discussed that whenever we insert a new value in a heap we keep shifting it up till it reaches to its correct position so here you can see that we have swapped 6 and 4 and 6 is at index 2 so friends after we perform this swap 6 is at index 2 so friends after we perform this swap we simply traverse to this index by assigning a value of k by 2 to k so here you can see k by 2 is 2 and if you assign it to k it becomes 2 and also here you can see k is 2 which is greater than 1 which means that there is a parent to 6 so we need to compare it with its parent so here its parent is at k by 2 if we do k by 2 we get the value 1 so the value at index 1 is parent to 6 so we'll simply compare 5 with 6 and we'll check whether 5 is less than 6 or not so here you can see 5 is less than 6 so the condition in while block comes out to be true and as we are inside this while loop we'll simply swap these two values using this temporary variable so at first step we'll simply assign the value at index 2 to temp and then we'll assign the value at index 1 to index 2 so it becomes 5 and finally we'll assign the value stored in this temporary variable to index 1 and after we perform this swap we'll simply traverse to its parent by assigning k by 2 to k so k by 2 is 1 so k will become 1 now as k is equal to 1 it is not greater than 1 so therefore we know that 6 is now at its correct position because among these 4 values 6 is the largest value and we know that in max heap the value at index 1 is the maximum among the other values so the condition in while block comes out to be false now let's say we insert 1 so x becomes 1 so here value of n is 4 and it is not equal to heap dot length minus 1 which is 7 so the condition in if block comes out to be false now as we are inserting 1 we will first increment the value of n by 1 and at index 5 
we'll simply assign the value which we want to insert so it looks something like this and then we'll simply perform the bottom up repify at index 5 so k becomes 5 and here k is greater than 1 so here as we have inserted 1 now we'll compare this value with its parent so we know that this value is at index 5 so if we do k by 2 we will reach to its parent so 5 by 2 will give us 2.5 and as we are taking it as integer it will round off to 2 so k by 2 becomes 2 so if you see the value at index k by 2 which is 2 is 5 so here we are simply comparing 5 with 1 because we know that 1 is child of 5 so here we are simply checking that whether value at parent is less than child or not so 5 is greater than 1 therefore condition in while block comes out to be false and by this we mean that 1 is at its correct position because it is child to 5 and 5 value is greater than 1 which satisfies the heap order property now let's say we want to insert 3 so x becomes 3 the condition in if block comes out to be false because 5 is not equal to 7 we'll increment the value of n by 1 as we are inserting 3 now so n becomes 6 so at index 6 we'll simply insert 3 and then we'll simply perform the bottom up reepify at index 6 so we'll call swim method and pass the value as 6 so value of k will become 6 now here whatever the value we inserted at index 6 we'll simply compare it with its parent that whether it is less than its parent or not so here k is greater than 1 because value of k is 6 so first we'll evaluate the parent of 3 so we'll take its index we'll divide it by 2 so k by 2 becomes 3 so the value at third index is 2 so 2 is parent of 3 so we'll simply compare these two values and we'll check whether parent value is less than child or not so here you can see 2 is less than 3 so the condition in while block comes out to be true so once the condition comes out to be true in the while block we simply swap these two values so it would look something like this we'll assign 3 to this temporary variable then we simply assign the value at index 3 to value at index 6 by simply assigning the value at index k by 2 to k so it becomes 2 and finally we simply assign the value 3 to value at index 3 so it becomes 3 so friend as the value of k was 6 and we swapped 3 and 2 so 3 reached to its parent so now we'll simply assign the value of k by 2 to k because we need to again compare 3 with its parent so once we do k by 2 to k k becomes 3 and in while block we again check whether k is greater than 1 or not so k is greater than 1 and we'll simply compare 3 with its parent so first we'll evaluate its parent by taking its index which is 3 dividing it by 2 which will give us 1.5 and as we are taking it as integer it will round off to 1 so the value of heap at index k by 2 is nothing but value at index 1 because 6 is parent to 3 and we'll simply check that whether 6 is less than 3 or not so here you can see 6 is greater than 3 so the condition in while block comes out to be false which means that 6 is at its correct position and also the 3 which is at its correct position so friends here we saw the demonstration of how to insert a value in a max heap 
and we saw the demonstration step by step we also saw that how we can perform bottom up re epify in case the heap order property is not being satisfied by inserting a new element so friends in our next tutorial we'll code this insert method and we'll test its working i hope you like this video thanks have a nice day hello friends in our previous tutorial we actually discussed that how we can insert a value in max priority queue so in this tutorial we'll actually code the insert method which will perform the insertion into this max priority queue so friends in our previous tutorial we actually created one class by name max pq which had an integer array which was nothing but our heap and we provided a constructor which took the initial capacity of this max priority queue we also provided two methods is empty and size so is empty tells us whether max priority queue is empty or not and size method will tell us that how many elements are there into this max priority queue so in this tutorial we will actually code about the insertion in this max priority queue so we'll create a method as public void insert so this insert method will take in a value which we want to insert so here i'm taking the argument as x so inside the insert method first we will check that whether this heap array can accommodate a new value or not so we'll simply check that whether value of n is equal to heap dot length minus 1 or not so if the value of n which is the size of this max priority queue is equal to heap dot length minus 1 it means the integer array is filled completely and there is no space to insert the new element so if this condition comes out to be true we simply resize this array dynamically and as initial length is heap dot length we'll simply resize this array to twice of its current length so we'll simply pass 2 into heap dot length so then we'll create a method resize so this resize method will take the new capacity of the array so here if the if condition comes out to be true it means that heap array is filled completely so into the resize method what we do we first create a new array with whatever the capacity we pass to this resize method after creating this new array we simply copy each and every element from this heap to this temporary array and then we finally reassign this heap to this newly created array so here first we'll create a new temporary array whose length would be the capacity which we have passed after creating this temporary integer array we will copy each and every element from this heap to this temporary array so we'll start from 0 and we'll traverse till heap dot length and inside this for loop we'll simply copy the value at particular index i to this temporary array and after copying the contents of this integer array we'll simply reassign temp to heap so now heap will point to an array which is of length twice of its current length so after the resize method gets executed the integer array heap 
will now have more spaces to insert new elements so here after if block the first thing we do is as we are inserting a new element will increment the size of this max priority queue by 1 and then we'll simply insert the value x into this heap array so we'll simply assign the value of x at index n and after this insertion we know that now we have to perform bottom of heapify by creating a new method swim and by passing it the value n because now we have to perform the bottom of heapify at index n so here we'll create a new private method swim which will take the argument where this new index have been inserted so inside this swim method will provide a while loop because in this while loop we'll simply compare this newly inserted value to its parent and we'll check that whether parent is less than this newly inserted value or not so the first condition we provide is whether k is greater than 1 or not because if k is equal to 1 then we know that currently heap has only one element and if value of k is greater than 1 then we know that there are more than one elements into this heap so then we'll compare the value at parent index which is k by 2 with value at kth index and if both the condition comes out to be true we simply swap these two values so here so using this temporary variable we will swap these two values and after we perform this swap we'll simply traverse to its parent by assigning k by 2 to k because we need to continue shifting up till new value inserted is at correct position that means whatever the value we inserted is at its correct position so that the heap order property of heap is satisfied so friend this is how we actually insert a new value into the max priority queue now in the main method let's test its working so I will just remove this so let's say the initial capacity of this max priority queue is 3 so here we will insert few values which we discussed in our previous slide so first we'll insert 4 then we'll insert 5 then we'll insert 6 then we'll insert 1 and then we'll insert 3 and then we'll simply print the size of the priority queue if I run the code now So here you can see the size it printed is 6 because we have inserted 6 elements and also friend if you print this heap array so here I will create one method as print max heap
so inside this print max if method i am just excluding the edge cases so i am simply providing a for loop which will iterate from i equal to 1 because into this heap array the value at zeroth index is empty so we are starting from 1 and will simply traverse i to a value n which is nothing but the size of the max priority queue and inside this for loop we'll simply print the value at i index of this heap and in the main method we'll simply call print max heap and if i run the code now you see it printed 653412 which is the same output which we discussed in our previous tutorial and here you can see that as it is a max priority queue the value six which is largest among the other values is at index 1 So friends in this tutorial we actually discussed how we can insert a value into this max priority queue In our upcoming tutorial we will see how we can delete a particular element from the max priority queue I hope you like this video thanks have a nice day Hello everyone So in this video we are going to discuss top down reify in max heap So this technique is also called as sync So in this technique we are simply doing the reify in one of our previous video we saw the bottom up reify and in this video we will be looking into top down reify so when we are inserting an element in a binary heap we usually do bottom up reify and when we are deleting the max element from the heap we usually do top down reify So friends here you can see that we are given with a max binary heap now a max binary heap as we already discussed in our previous videos that it's a complete binary tree in which each node value is greater than equal to the values of its children so for example 9 is greater than 3 and 6 3 is greater than 2 and 1 6 is greater than 5 and 4 so this is the one of the property which max binary heap satisfies the other thing is it should be complete binary tree as we already discussed that a complete binary tree is a binary tree where all levels are completely filled so for example here you can see there are three levels 1 2 3 <laughs> so here all the levels are completely filled except the last level and last level has nodes in such a way that left side is never empty so here all the levels of a complete binary tree should be filled so here you can see this level is filled in the second level it can have only two children so this level is also filled and in the last level this side is not filled so except the last level all the level should be filled and the node should be filled in such a way that left side is never empty so here this is the complete binary tree because the elements are filled from the left side like this but here you can see that this is a incomplete binary tree because all the levels are filled except the last level but this is not a complete binary tree because the left side is empty because there could be one element coming up here so the insertion of nodes or the element should be such a way that it should be from the left side and the left side is never empty so if suppose here could have been one more element let's say 6 so this is also a complete binary tree because all the levels are filled and now next element would be inserted from here from the left side and if any of the element is not filled from the left side then this would be incomplete binary tree so here you can see when do we actually require top down reify so when we delete an element from heap there may be a case that it may not satisfy the heap properties 
सो डिलीटिंग एन एलिमेंट वी मीन डिलीट मैक्स फ्रॉम द मैक्स बाइनरी हिप एंड डिलीट मिन फ्रॉम द मिन बाइनरी हिप सो वेन वी डिलीट द मैक्स एलिमेंट फ्रॉम हिप लेट से वी वॉन्ट टू रिमूव द मैक्स एलिमेंट विच इज एट द रूट एट इंडेक्स वन सो इफ यू वॉन्ट टू रिमूव दिस एलिमेंट आफ्टर इट्स रिमूवल देर आर आइज ए प्रॉब्लम दैट दिस मैक्स हिप मे नॉट सेटिस्फाई द हिप प्रॉपर्टीज दस वी परफॉर्म टॉप डाउन रीपीफा टेक्निक इन विच वी एडजस्ट द लोकेशन ऑफ द एलिमेंट टू सेटिस्फाई द हिप प्रॉपर्टी सो नाउ लेट्स मूव अर्ड एंड सी हाउ वी कैन परफॉर्म दिस टेक्निक so let's say we are given with this max binary heap where the elements are stored in an array starting from index 1 which we have already discussed in our previous videos now let's say when we call delete max so we want to remove this element 9 but if we directly remove this element 9 the heap property of this max heap will not get satisfy so what do we do is before removing 9 we simply store its value in some variable let's say max now after storing the value because we need to return this value from the delete max so we are storing it in a max variable now after getting its value what we do is we simply take the last element which is filled in the max heap and we simply swap both the elements so here 9 will be swapped by 4 so 4 comes here and 9 comes here now after this swap we can easily remove 9 because this is the last element so 9 gets removed but as we swapped it with the 4 the heap order property is not getting satisfied because in the max heap the root element should be greater than or equal to the values of its children so 4 is greater than 3 but it is not greater than 6 so therefore heap order property is breaking here so now the third step we apply is we do top down reapify now in this technique what we do is as the root element or the parent element should be greater than or equal to the values of its children the heap order property is not getting satisfied at this location so the children of index 1 which is 2 and 3 we will first compare 3 and 6 together and we will find which is the max element among these two values so we will compare 3 and 6 so 6 is greater than 3 it means now we need to compare the parent value with 6 as parent value should be greater than both the values of its children we are simply comparing the parent element with the max of the values of its children so here we are not comparing 4 with 3 because we have already compared 3 with 6 and as 6 is greater than 3 now we'll simply compare 4 with 6 So here you can see six is greater than four. It means parent value is smaller than the value of its children. Therefore, what we do is we simply perform a shift down, which is top down, or we can also call sink. What do we do in this technique? Is now we simply swap six with four. So six comes here. and 4 goes here so here you can see now the parent value is greater than both of its children so after doing this what we do is as we performed the shift down the parent element is at its correct position and then we simply traverse to this position and then we perform the same steps again because there could be a possibility that 4 may not still satisfy the heap order property so what do we do is 
when reaching four, we see that it has only one children. Therefore, it doesn't have the other children. So we can directly compare four with five. So here five is greater than four. It means the heap order property currently is not getting satisfied. So we simply do a shift down. So five comes here and four comes here. And after performing shift down, we reach here. And now here you can see it doesn't have any children. It means five is placed at its correct position. Six is placed at its correct position and four is also placed at its correct position. So now here you can see that max e property is getting satisfied and all the elements are at its correct position. And at the end, we simply return the value nine. Now let's see one more example. Let's say we are given with this max heap where all the levels are filled completely except the last level and it is also getting filled from the left hand side. Now let's say we call delete max. So the first step we do is we simply store value 10 in the max variable. The second step we do is we take the last element of the max heap and we simply swap it with the root element. So 3 comes here, 10 comes here. So after we perform this swap, we can now easily remove this element. And as 10 is removed, one problem it has created is like the heap order property may or may not get satisfied. So after we perform this swap, we are at this position and we need to place the maximum value among these three values because three is the parent, nine and six are its children and whichever value is the greater among these three should come here. So here we have to compare three with nine and three with six or what we do is we simply compare both the children's value which is 9 and 6 and whichever value is greater. So here 9 is greater. So we simply compare 9 with 3 because if let's say here would have been 11 for example. So if 11 is greater than 9, it will also be greater than 6 because we have compared these two values already. So currently it's 3. So now 9 is greater than 3. Therefore what we do is we do a shift down. 9 comes at this position and 3 comes at this position. So we are doing a swap and after doing the swap we reach here and then we try to compare this index value which is 3 with its children. So here you can see now we simply compare 1 and 2 and whichever value is greater among these two which is 2 we simply compare it with 3. So here you can see 3 is greater than 2. Therefore there won't be any shift down because 3 is now at its correct position because it is greater than both of its children. So we don't do anything and the process ends here and this max value will be returned. So why we are comparing these two children is because we need to compare parent with a greater value among these two because if 3 is greater than 2 then 3 will also be greater than 1. So that's why first we compare both the children's value and whichever value is greater among both the children, we simply compare that value with the parent's value. And if the parent's value in max heap, if it is less, then we do a shift down. And if it is more like the current scenario, then we don't do anything because 3 is at its correct position. Now let's see one last example. Let's say we are given with this max heap. Currently all the heap properties are getting satisfied. Let's say we call delete max. So first we store the value 9. Then we swap this value with the last value of the max heap. So 0 will come here and 9 will come here. like this 
and after doing this swap we can safely remove this element with value 9 so now here you can see after this swap we are starting from the very root node and there might be a case that heap order property is not getting satisfied so what do we do is first we compare both its children which is 3 and 6 and we figure out which is the max element so if we compare 3 and 6 so 6 is greater than 3 so now we compare 6 with its parent value so 6 is greater than 0 it means that whatever value is at index 1 is not satisfying the heap order property because in the max heap the parent's value should be greater than both of its children so we do shift down so 6 comes here and 0 comes here and then we reach here now again there could be a possibility that after this swap this value 0 is still not satisfying the heap order property so what do we do is we simply compare both the children's first and whichever is the max in this case it is 5 so we compare 0 with 5 as 5 is greater than 0 therefore the value of children is greater than the parent so it is not satisfying the heap order property so we do a shift down 5 comes here and 0 comes here and then finally we reach here and here we see that it doesn't have any children so therefore now 0 is at its correct position 5 is at its correct position and 6 is at its correct position so here 6 is greater than 3 and 5 5 is greater than 0 and 4 and at the end we simply return 9 so friends in this video we saw that when we perform a delete max operation in a binary heap there could be a possibility that heap order property is not getting satisfied in a binary heap therefore we do top down reheapify which is also known as sync or shift down where we are simply shifting down the elements till it reaches at its correct position so friend this was all about top down reheapify when we perform delete max in our next video we'll actually see the implementation of the algorithm step by step i hope you must have liked this video in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update. Thanks, have a nice day. Hello everyone. So in this video, we are going to discuss that how to delete the maximum element in a max heap. In our previous video, we saw the top down re technique when we actually deleted the maximum element from a binary max heap. And in our previous video, we also saw that a max heap is a complete binary tree in which each node is greater than or equal to the values of its children. So here you can see that 9 being parent to 3 and 6 has values greater than both of its children. 3 is having value greater than both of its children. 6 is having value greater than both of its children. So it's a max binary heap. And when we want to delete the maximum element from the max heap, the maximum value is usually at the top, which is also the root of our binary tree. So here max heap is usually demonstrated in the form of a binary tree, but the data is actually stored in the form of an array where index 0 is empty. We usually take index 0 as empty because it help us in evaluating the children of any parent we also saw the formula for evaluating the children of any parent given at index i which is 2i and 2i plus 1 
सो दिस इज चाइल्ड वन एंड दिस इज चाइल्ड टू सो दिस इज वॉट वी एक्चुअली डिस्कस इन अवर प्रीवियस वीडियोज एज वेल सो यूजली वी फिल दिस एरे फ्रॉम लेफ्ट टू राइट लेवल बाय लेवल सो दिस इज लेवल वन सो नाइन कम्स हियर देन वी गो टू लेवल टू द फर्स्ट एलिमेंट वी सी इज थ्री सो थ्री कम्स हियर सिक्स कम्स हियर then we go to level 3 2 1 5 and 4 so this is what we actually discussed in our previous videos as well so if you mark this indexes at each element it would look something like this 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 Now, in order to access the maximum value in this max heap, we simply take the value stored at index one, which is heap of one, and then we perform delete operation on the top of it. And after we perform delete operation, we also do the top down reheapify. So let's see it via an example which we already discussed in our previous video. Let's suppose we are given with this max heap, and we want to delete the max. So first thing we do is we simply store the maximum value which is at heap of index 1 into max and then we actually pick the last element and we swap it with the the element which we want to delete so 9 and 4 are swapped 4 comes here 9 comes here and then we can safely remove 9 but here you can see when 4 reaches here it doesn't satisfy the heap order property the value of 4 should be greater than both of its children but here you can see 4 is greater than 3 but 4 is not greater than 6 so therefore here what we do is we compare 4 with its children either we compare 4 with both of its children or we can first compare both the children's and take the maximum value out of them and then compare that maximum value with the parents value so first we compare both the children's value so 6 is greater than 3 so as 6 is greater than 3 now we compare the parents value with 6 so 6 is greater than 4 it means that heap order property is not satisfied and we perform a swap we take 6 here and 4 here by doing shift down or top down reheapify so 6 comes here 4 comes here and after we do swap 6 is at its correct position then we actually go to its one of the children from which we did the swap and we again perform these steps as 4 doesn't have the right child so we directly compare 4 with its left child value 5 so 5 is greater than 4 so therefore we do a shift down 5 comes here and 4 comes here and here you can see after we do this swap 5 is at its correct position then we simply traverse to 4 and perform the same steps again but here you can see 4 doesn't have a left or a right child therefore 4 is also at its correct position so therefore now heap order property is satisfied by all the values of this max heap and at the end we simply return 9 so now let's see the implementation of this algorithm step by step so this binary tree now we'll see the implementation in the form of an array so let's say we have this binary heap and we know that it is starting from index 1 which has the maximum value in this binary max heap the value of n which is the total number of elements is 7 we have already discussed this in our previous videos so value of n is 7 now we call delete max so the first step we do is we simply store the value 9 in max because at the end we need to return this value and as we are going to delete the max we first store it in the max variable which is 
सो नाइन इज स्टोर्ड इन मैक्स एंड वी ऑल्सो डिस्कस डेट आफ्टर वी स्टोर द वैल्यू इन मैक्स वेरिएबल वी परफॉर्म स्वैप विद द लास्ट एलिमेंट एंड द रूट एलिमेंट विच वी आर ट्राइंग टू डिलीट सो वी पास वन एंड एन सो इन द स्वैप मैथड वी आर यूजिंग दिस टेम्पररी वेरिएबल एंड देन वी सिंपली परफॉर्म अ नॉर्मल स्वैप सो विल गो ओवर दिस क्विकली सो ए इज वन एंड बी इज सेवन we are swapping 9 and 4 using the temp variable so first we are storing 9 in temp then we are storing 4 into heap of a which is 1 and at the end we are storing temp value at heap of b which is 7 so 9 comes here so after this method gets end 9 is here and 4 is here so now we can decrement the value of n because we need to remove 9 completely so total number of elements should become 6 now so n comes here and then here you can see we are having 4 here so 4 is not actually satisfying the heap order property if we see the children of 4 it is at index 2 into i And two into i plus one, which is at index two and index three. Four is greater than three, but four is not greater than six. And in the max heap, parent should be greater than both of its children. So this formulas we have already discussed in our previous video that how we can evaluate the children of a parent. so now we actually do this top down reapify using this sync method we pass the value of the index from where we need to do this reapify so currently the index value is 1 so we will call sync method now so the call will reach the sync method so this is the sync method where we have passed the value as 1 so k will become 1 which is the index from where we need to start our top down reapify now here we need to perform this top down reapify till the heap order property is satisfied or there are elements left such that we compare the parent with its respective children so this is the condition for that we are doing 2 into k less than equal to n so k is at index 1 its children will be at 2k index which is 2 and total number of element is 6 so 2 is less than 6 it means that element 4 has some children so this while loop will execute and this condition comes out to be true so at the first step what we do is the j represent one of the children of k which is given by formula 2 into k where k is the index of parent which you can see here if we do 2 into k we get index 2 so value of j will become 2 because j is one of the child of k so friends when we saw the animation we first compared both of the children of the parent and whichever was the max we took that particular children and compared it with the parents value so here so first we check whether the parent has actually a right child or not because by this condition parent does have a left child because 2k value is less than equal to the number of elements we have here j less than n denotes that there is also a right child of this parent so how we can understand this is let's say let's say if we take this example here so currently this element will be removed because n is pointing to 
so one two three four five six so this is the present condition so for example here k value is one which is the parent index let's say k points to here at three if we do two into k we will reach to one of its children so two into three we reach here which is the child one so this condition tells us that there is one child to this parent and here you can see value of j is 2k which is 6 if 6 is less than 6 which is total number of elements it means there is also one right child currently 6 is not less than 6 therefore we are sure that there is no right child here if we take k value as 3 so therefore this condition tells us that whether we have a right child or not because we need to compare both the left child value we, we have to take one of the maximum value among those and then we have to compare it with the parents value so currently value of k is 1 the index of its first child is at 2 and index of its next child is at 3 so 3 is less than 6 therefore we know that for k equal to 1 it has both left and the right children so this condition is very important so currently this condition comes out to be true then we check whether heap of j which is value 3 is less than heap of j plus 1 or not it means we are now comparing 3 and 6 which are actually children of 4 present at index 1 this and this we are comparing so 3 is less than 6 therefore this condition comes out to be true now why we are incrementing j is because j is actually telling the position of the element which is the maximum child to which we need to compare with the parent so j points to 3 which tells that 6 is the maximum value among these two children and now whatever you want to compare we need to compare parent with this value at j you will understand more this in next iteration so now we calculate whether the parent value is greater than or equal to the child value or not so here 4 is compared with 6 heap of k is compared with heap of j so 4 is not greater than or equal to 6 so this condition comes out to be false and if this condition comes out to be false it signifies that heap order property is not getting satisfied so then we perform a swap between 4 and 6 so we'll quickly go over this method 6 will come here and 4 will come here So 6 has come here and 4 has come here. So now 6 is at its correct position. It is parent to 3 and 4 and its value is greater than both of its children. Now when we discuss that after we do shift down in our previous example, we actually reach to the position which actually did the swap. So our next k value, we assign the value j. So k becomes 3. Now when we did this swap, 6 came here and 4 came here and then we moved to 4 because this 4 we still need to figure out whether this might or might not satisfy the heap order property because there are more elements left in the heap. So we first check whether k has any left child or not. So if 2 into k is less than or equal to n, which is 3 into 2, 6, it is less than or equal to n, which is 6. So therefore it must have a left child. And what would be the index of that left child would be 2 into k. 
which is 6. So j points to index 6. Now we actually check with this condition whether k also have a right child or not. So 2 into k plus 1 will give us the right child 6 plus 1 7. But here you can see 2 into k which is j and if we do plus 1 we will get the right child 7 is not less than 6 therefore it doesn't have a right child 3 only has a left child which is 5 and it doesn't have a right child so this condition is important so this overall condition will come out to be false because j is not less than n j is actually equal to n now we compare the parent value with the child value because j is pointing to the only child of index 3 so 4 is less than 5 this condition comes out to be false and then we perform a swap between 4 and 5 so a is 3 and b is 6 we are swapping 4 and 5 5 comes here and 4 comes here Now after this swap, we take k to its one of the child from which we compared. So we are simply assigning j value to k. So k will become 6. Now here you can see 2 into k is not less than n because if we do 2 into k which is 2 into 6 which will give us 12 and value of n is 6. Therefore, this condition comes out to be false, which also signifies that we have completely performed the top down re -EP5. 6 is at its correct position, 5 is at its correct position, and 4 is also at its correct position because it doesn't have any left or right children. So, the sync method will end, and call will reach here. And this is our array when we perform the sync operation. And after we perform sync operation, we can simply delete this element by assigning a null value to heap n plus 1. n is pointing to this index which is 6. So n plus 1 will point to here. So we are making it null now. And here, as we are doing delete max, there will be a time when most of the elements will be deleted from this heap array so we are simply comparing whether n is greater than 0 and if n is equal to heap dot length minus 1 by 4 which is like 1 fourth of the heap dot length if n is equal to that then we simply resize the array by half of it so we will see the demonstration of this resize later so currently n is greater than 0 but n is not equal to heap dot length which is 9 minus 1 by 4 8 by 4 2 value of n is 6 and it is not equal to 2 therefore this condition comes out to be false and we return the maximum value which is 9 and we have also removed 9 from this heap so friend let's suppose we keep on deleting the elements like this. So this array will have more and more null values. And let's say we call delete max and we want to remove 3. So we have performed these steps and we need to remove 3. And let's say we have also performed sync. So this will be the array. And now if we assign null to the heap of n plus 1 as we want to remove 3, this will become null. So in this case we are simply seeing the condition that this if block comes out to be true. Let's say we keep on removing the elements. 
so there will be null values in the array so n is greater than 0 and n is actually equal to heap dot length minus 1 divided by 4 so heap dot length is 9 minus 1 by 4 which will give us 8 by 4 2 and value of n is equal to 2 this means both the conditions are true so now here what we do is we call the resize method which we have already seen in one of our previous video where we are simply providing the new length of our heap where we are simply saying create a new heap of half of its current length which is 9 by 2 which gives out to be 4 so we are removing this additional space which we have occupied we are freeing it up and we are creating a new array which has the size half of the current heap's length so when this method will get executed our heap array will become something like this that we have resized the heap to heap dot length by 2 which is 4 so we have removed the unwanted occupied space so this resize method we have already discussed in one of our previous video you can watch that video and at the end we simply return 3 so friend this was all about that how we can delete the maximum element in a max heap using delete max method we saw the implementation of delete max and also the top down reapify method which is sync i hope you must have liked this video in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update thanks have a nice day hello friends welcome to my new data structures and algorithms in java tutorial series video friends in this tutorial we will discuss linear search algorithm in java so friends here we are given an array of let's say n elements and we are given an element x which we want to search into this array so below you can see the algorithm to search for an element x into this array so this search method takes in the array into which we want to search an element here we also pass the value of n which is nothing but the number of elements in an array and we also pass the value of x which we want to search into this array so let's suppose if we are given this array which has 7 elements and we want to search an element x having the value as 10 so let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step so here you can see the number of element into this array is 7 and the value which you want to search is denoted by x which is 10 moving ahead so friends how this algorithm works is is we start from the leftmost element of the array and one by one we'll compare x with each and every element of array so here if x matches to any of the element then we simply return the index of array and if x doesn't match with any of the element in the array we simply return minus 1 so here in order to compare x with each and every element of this array we provide a for loop which basically start from the leftmost element and traverse till the last index of the array so here in this for loop we are iterating i from 0 to a value less than n which is nothing but 7 so i will travel from 0 to less than n which is 6 and then we will compare each and every element of array with x so at the start of for loop i becomes 0 so this i is nothing but the index value of the array so we will start from the leftmost element in the for loop we will provide a condition that value at index i is equal to x or not so here you can see the value at index 0 is 5 and 5 is not equal to 10 therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false so here we are incrementing i by 1 
सो आई बिकम्स वन सो नाउ इन द इफ लॉक वी आर अगेन कंपेयरिंग दैट वैल्यू एट आई एट इंडेक्स इज इक्वल टू एक्स और नॉट सो वैल्यू ऑफ आई इज वन एंड इफ यू टेक द वैल्यू एट इंडेक्स वन इज वन एंड इफ यू कंपेयर इट विद एक्स देन वन इज नॉट इक्वल टू टेन सो द कंडीशन इन इफ ब्लॉक कम्स आउट टू बी फॉल्स सो आफ्टर द इंक्रीमेंट नाउ आई विल बिकम टू and we will use this i to point to the second index of the array in the if block we will again check that the value of array at i at index is equal to x or not so here you can see the value of array at second index is 9 and 9 is not equal to 10 therefore condition in if block comes out to be false will then increment i by 1 so i becomes 3 moving ahead so here in the block we again check that whether value at i at index is equal to x or not so value of i is 3 so value of array at third index is 2 and 2 is not equal to 10 therefore condition in if block comes out to be false and after increment i becomes 4 now in the if block we again check that value of array at ith index is equal to x or not so here you can see the value of array at fourth index is 10 and if we compare it with x then both values are equal so the condition in if block comes out to be true and here we have found our element at index 4 so the if block will execute and will simply return the value of index where we have found the element which is nothing but 4 so friend this is how the linear search algorithm works in java also friend if you had search any value which was not given in this array then after this for loop we would have simply returned minus 1 because we haven't found the value into this array So friend this was a demonstration of the algorithm now let's go to eclipse and see the working of this code Hello friends in our previous tutorial we actually saw the demonstration of the linear search algorithm So now in this tutorial we will actually code the linear search algorithm and we'll test its working So here first we'll create a search method so public whose return type would be the integer because we are returning the index where we have found our search so i'll give the name as search now this search method will take the array into which we want to search for a particular element it takes the value of n which is nothing but the number of elements of this array and integer x which is nothing but the value which we want to search so friends here this search method will return back as an integer value which is nothing but the index where we have found our search and if we haven't found our search then it will return back as minus 1 so here we'll provide a for loop which will iterate over each and every element of this array and inside that for loop we'll compare each and every element with the x and if it is equal then we'll simply return the index so we'll provide a for loop which will start from 0 and which will go to a value lesser than n so inside this for loop we'll simply provide a if condition we'll compare value at i index with x and if the condition in if block comes out to be true we'll simply return the index value where we have found our element and if the for loop executes completely and we haven't found our element then we'll simply return minus 
which indicate that we haven't found our element. So friend, this is the code whose demonstration we saw in our previous tutorial. Now in the main method, let's test its working. So here we have actually created an array with few elements. So first we'll create the instance of linear search class. And then we'll simply call the search method. We'll pass in the array. And the number of elements would be the length of the array. And let's say we want to search for a value 10. So we'll pass 10. So whatever the integer value it returns, we'll simply print it on the console. If I run the code now, so here you can see it printed 4, which means we have found our element at index 4. Now let's suppose if we want to search a value which is not present in this array. So if I search for value as 50, and if I run the code now, So here you can see it returned minus 1 which states that we haven't found our element into this array. So friends here in this tutorial we actually coded the linear search algorithm and we tested its working. I hope you like this video. Thanks have a nice day. Hello friends. Welcome to my new data structures and algorithm in Java tutorial series video. Friends in this tutorial we will discuss binary search in Java. So friends, what is a binary search? Binary search is a divide and conquer algorithm. So here if you see that suppose if we are given an array which is sorted. So here you can see the numbers are sorted in ascending order. So friends, let's suppose we want to search an element in a sorted array. So what we can do is either we can perform a linear search that we can compare the elements with an array with an element we want to search. So this linear search will go on with the each and every element that we first check with the number at 0 index then 1 then 2 then 3 and it goes on till the end of the array. But here if the array is sorted then instead of doing a linear search we can do a binary search. So what we can do is we can repeatedly divide an array into half and with the each division we know that we are dividing the array into two halves. So we usually compare the element we want to search with the middle element. And if suppose the element we want to search is less than the middle element then we can ignore the other half and we can search in the first half. And if the element we want to search is greater than the middle element then we can ignore the first half and we can search in the last half. So below you can see the algorithm for the binary search. Now let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step. So suppose we are given an array having 9 elements and, and here you can see the array is sorted. So suppose we want to search a key having the value of 65. Now we know that 65 is in the array and we want to search it using the binary search. So what we can do is, so the first step what we do is we create an integer variable by name low and we assign a value of 0 to it. So here you can see low is having value of 0. So here it means that we are pointing at the first element of an array at the index 0. Moving ahead. And then we create an integer variable by name high and we assign it a value of say numbers dot length minus 1. So here what we are actually doing in the first step we created an integer variable low and we are pointing it to the first index. And then we are creating an integer variable high which will point to the last index of an array which is 8. So here if you see there are total 9 elements in an array and when we do numbers dot length we get 9 and when we do minus 1 we get the 8. So it just means that high is having value as 8 and it is pointing to the last element of an array. So friend as the array is sorted and we are applying binary search over it. So we are using this while loop and inside this while loop 
In each iteration, we will divide the array into two halves and we will search for the key 65. So the condition we are placing in the while loop is we will iterate till low is less than or equal to high. So currently you can see low is pointing to the 0th index and high is pointing to the 8th index. Therefore low is less than high. So the condition in while block comes out to be true. So in the first step what we are actually doing is we are actually finding the middle element of the an array. So in order to find the middle element the formula we are using here is we are doing high plus low and we are dividing it by 2. So currently high is having a value as 8 and low is having a value of 0. So when we will do 8 plus 0 by 2 we get mid as 4. So here mid will point to the index 4 which is nothing but the middle element of this array. Moving ahead. So friends here you can see as mid is pointing to the middle element of an array. We know that array is divided into two parts from low to middle and from middle to high. So first we will check whether the value at mid position is equal to key or not. So if the element is equal to key then we have found our key and we will simply return the value of index. So currently you can see the value at mid is 59 and if we compare it with the key then 59 is not equal to 65. Therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false. And then we will check that whether key 65 is less than 59 or not. So here you can see 65 is not less than 59. Therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false. And the else block will be executed. So friends here you can see as array is sorted. And we have identified that key 65 is greater than the middle value. Therefore we know that 65 would be somewhere in the last half. So now we can ignore the first half. And we can directly search into the last half. So this is how this algorithm works. We actually divide the using this middle element and we compare it with the middle value. And if the value is greater than the middle value, we search in the last half. And if it is less than the middle value, then we search in the first half. So now the overhead of searching in first half is gone and we can directly perform our search in the last half. So what here actually we do is currently low was pointing to the zeroth index. And now we know that that our key will be lying between the index 4 and 8. So therefore to the low we are assigning the value as mid plus 1. So it would look something like this. That now low will be having value as 5. And it will point to the 5th index. Moving ahead. Now in while loop we will check whether low is less than or equal to high or not. So currently low is having value as 5 and high is having value as 8. Therefore 5 is less than 8. So the condition in while block comes out to be true. So now in the first step we will again find the middle index. So we apply the formula as high plus low divided by 2. So currently you can see high is 8 and low is 5. So when we do 8 plus 5 we get 13 and when we divide it by 2 we get 6.5 and when we take it as integer variable the value is rounded off to 6 so now mid will hold the value as 6 so friends here you can see we have again divided the array into two halves using this middle index so in the first step we will check whether the value at mid is equal to key or not. So currently here you can see that value at mid which is 75 is not equal to our key which is 65. Therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false. And then we check whether our key is less than this middle value or not. So if key is less than this middle value then we know that we have to search into the first half. And if key is greater than the middle value then we know that we have to search in the last half. 
so currently key which is 65 is less than 75 therefore the condition in if block comes out to be true so friends here we know that as key 65 is less than 75 so therefore it must be lying somewhere between the low index and the middle index which is nothing but the first half so now our high will become mid minus 1 because we have to search in the first half so therefore here you can see mid is 6 so when we do mid minus 1 high will store the value as 5 so friends here the key 65 was less than the mid value therefore we knew that it must be lying somewhere between the low index and the middle index so therefore we assign the value of mid minus 1 to high so that now we can search in the first half of an array moving ahead we will again check whether low is less than equal to high or not so currently low is having value as 5 and high is also having value as 5 so therefore the condition in while block comes out to be true and we will again find the middle index by the formula high plus low and then we'll divide it by 2 so here you can see high is having value 5 and low is also having value as 5 So when we do high plus low, we get value as ten, and when we divide it by two, we get value as five. So now value of five will be assigned to the mid here, and now mid will point to the fifth index. So friends, in the if block, we will check that whether the middle value is equal to key or not. So here you can see. the middle value which is 65 is equal to the key 65 therefore the condition in if block comes out to be true so it means that we have found our key so we can simply return the index position which is nothing but the fifth index and if we don't find any value in an array till low is less than or equal to high then we can come to know that it element is not in the array and then we can simply return the index as minus 1 So friends let's go to eclipse and see the working code So friends here i have created one class by name binary search So inside this class i will be creating the method which can actually perform the binary search So let's create a method as public int So this method will return us back an integer value and i will name it as binary search and this method will take two things one is the integer array which is actually sorted array and other would be the key which we want to search in the sorted array so in the first step what we do is we create an integer variable by name low and we'll assign a value of 0 to it which is nothing but the zeroth index of an array and we'll also create an integer variable by name high and we'll assign it a value of last index of an array so we'll simply do nums dot length minus 1 so now high will be pointing to the last index of an array and then we'll provide a while loop and in the while loop we'll provide a condition as low should be less than equal to high so we'll iterate in the while loop till low is less than equal to high so in the first step what we do is we actually divide the array and we find the middle index so we'll create an integer variable by name mid and we will assign it a mid value by applying the formula as high plus low divided by 2 so this formula will return us back the middle index of an array after finding the middle index we that we will simply check that value stored at the middle index is equal to our key or not so if the mid value is equal to key then we know that we have found our key and we can simply return the mid index and if suppose the value at middle index is not equal to our key then we can provide an if else block
so in the if block we will provide the condition as that if key is not equal to the middle value then it must be less than mid value or greater than mid value so if key is less than the mid value then we know that key lies in the first half of an array so we'll simply assign the value mid minus 1 to high and in the else block we'll simply assign mid plus 1 value to low because we know that if key is greater than the middle value then we can ignore the first half and we can start searching in the last half so at that time low will become mid plus 1 so in the while loop if we find our key then we can simply return the mid index and if we didn't find our key then we can simply return minus 1 which is nothing but the negative index so friend this is the code for binary search now let's test it's working in the main method so here first we have initialized the binary search class and then I have created one sorted array which we discussed in the slide so friends let's search for a key having value as 65 so here I will be providing system.out.println statement and here we will print the index so we'll use this binary search instance and we'll call binary search method and inside this method we'll pass this sorted array and let's say we want to search for the key as 65 so friends here we know that 65 is in the sorted array so if I run the code now you can see it returned 5 which means that we have found our key at the fifth index so here you can see 0 1 2 3 4 and fifth index so it is actually returning the fifth index where we have actually found our key and let's say if I provide the value as say 100 and we know that 100 is not in this sorted array so if I run the code now so here you can see it returned minus 1 which is the negative index because it didn't find 100 in this sorted array so it finally returned minus 1 so friends in this tutorial we discussed about the binary search in java i hope you like this video please like comment share and subscribe my youtube channel thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in this video we are going to discuss search insert position problem so let's see what this problem is and how to solve this so here in this problem we are given a sorted array of distinct integers so the array is sorted and we don't have duplicates we are given a target value and we need to return an index if the target is found if target is not found in the array so as the array is sorted then we have to return the index where it would be if it were inserted in order so here this problem is a search and insert problem so we are given with a sorted array which doesn't have duplicates and we are given with a target value we need to first search the target value in the array and if the target is found we need to return that index and if the target is not found then we need to return that particular index where the target value should lie so for example if we are given an input array is 1 3 5 7 so this is sorted array in ascending order and the target value is given as 5 so if I put indexes on top of the number you can see 5 lies at index 2 so we return 2 now let's say if you are given with the same array and target value is 2 so 2 is not found in the array but if you see as the array is sorted and if we would have wanted to place 2 somewhere in the between so that the array is still sorted you can see it can lie between 0 and 1 so 1 is at 0 index after that 2 would have come so 2 would have come at this place and 3 would have shifted ahead so 2 would have come at first index so we would return output as 1 now let's say if we are given with this input array these are the indexes and target is 8 so here you can see 8 is not found in this array so the probable position for inserting 8 would be after 7 so this sorted array goes from 0 to 3 third is the last index and we can only insert 8 after 7 
which is the fourth index so we return the value as 4 similarly so this was the extreme case where we need to put 8 outside the boundaries of the array in this direction now let's say if we are given with this array and target is 0 so here you can see 0 is not found in this array and 0 can only lie before 1 but before 1 we have index minus 1 so this minus 1 is not a valid index in an array so our target would lie at 0 index only and the rest of the elements will get shifted in this direction why we not add at 0 at minus 1 index because minus 1 index doesn't belong the array should start from 0 index so the only place to put target is at 0 index so we return the output as 0 and the rest of the elements can shift here but here when the target was 8 though index 4 was not in the array but 4 is a valid index an array can have a size where index 4 can belong but an array cannot have an index minus 1 so therefore these two are some of the cases we need to handle and we need to run the algorithm in log of n time because we can directly search in the array in o of n time and we can place the element at that particular index because the array is sorted so we need to use an algorithm which runs in log of n time so let's move ahead and see that so friends before we start in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update so here yeah, this is the algorithm where the method name is search insert it takes in an array and a target and returns the index that where this target should belong so here as we need to run the algorithm in log of n time we basically take the help of binary search and try to figure out the proper index for this target now why we are applying this binary search is first the given array is sorted and second we need to find the target in the array and return that index so one is the search part which we need to do in log of n time so here why the search is in log of n time is because when we try to run the binary search on a sorted array what happens is each time if the value is not found half of the array is discarded because as the array is sorted we keep on discarding the half of the array with every iteration of while loop so we will see that later and if you see the time complexity of binary search it is log of n so we will see that how we can apply the binary search and try to figure out the index for the target so most of the algorithm is pretty much same as our binary search but there are some things to understand that how we can figure out the index of a target if it is not found in the array so let's say we call search insert we pass in the array and we pass the value of target as 66 so target becomes 66 now our task is to find 66 in this sorted array if we found that index here then we simply return the index of the array where we found the target and if not then we need to find that particular index where this target would lie so at the start as we need to apply this binary search on complete array we take two pointers low and high low starts from zero index and high starts from the last index which is array dot length minus one which is eight so if we do array dot length we get nine and if we do minus one we get eight so high starts from eighth index so now we apply the binary search and we provide a while loop where the condition we provide is low should be less than equal to high so once low crosses high we need to stop this algorithm so currently value of low is 0 and high is 8 so this condition comes out to be true so friends how this binary search works you can also watch my videos on binary search but here i will explain that as the array is sorted we don't directly search each and every element of the array because that would take o of n 
time complexity because we are comparing target with each and every value. And as array is sorted, we can use that property. What we can do is we can try to find a mid element and we simply compare that mid element with target. So let's see how. So in order to find the mid index, we use this formula. We do low plus high minus low by 2. So here in binary search, we also do something like low plus high by 2. But here we are using this type of approach because this formula will actually avoid the integer overflow condition. So let's say if you are given with a very huge array which actually touches the boundaries of integer range. So if we do the addition of low and high, there could be a possibility that the range of integer is overflowed. So we will get undesired value. And so this part where we are doing low plus high would fail and our binary search will not work properly. So therefore what we do is we apply this part where we are doing high minus low. So here high would be a very large number and low would be a number which is lesser than high. So when we are doing subtract, we are going back into the integers range only. And when we are dividing it by 2, we are going further down. And then we can safely add it with low to get the value of mid index. So if we do low which is 0 plus high which is 8 minus 0 by 2. So 8 by 2 will give 4 which would be our mid index. So mid value would be 4 this. Now the significance of taking the mid index is we directly see what value is at mid. So here it is 59. We check whether it is equal to our target or not. So here you can see 59 is not equal to 66 which is our target. So therefore this if condition comes out to be false. And then we check whether target is less than the value at mid index. So here 69 is not less than 59. So this condition also comes out to be false. So here you can see the basic idea is after calculating mid, we take the value at mid index and there could be three possibilities that this value is equal to target, this value is less than target or this value is greater than target. So here we know that the array is sorted. So if target is less than array of mid and as array is sorted, we know that the target might lie in this range and here target is greater than array of mid. Here you can see 66 is greater than 59. So we are sure that 66 might lie in this range because the array is sorted. 66 can't lie in this direction because array is sorted all the numbers before 59 will be lesser than 59 and all the numbers in this direction will be greater than 59. So our chance is that 66 might lie in this direction. So therefore what we do is as 66 is greater than 59, we know that it might lie in this direction. So here in binary search, we can safely discard this much array. Because with this comparison, we are sure that target will never lie in this indexes. It can only be found in this indexes because it is actually greater than the mid value. So therefore, we bring this low to this point. Because if array of mid is not equal to target, we then perform our search from 5th to 8th index. So high will be at the same position. We bring low to this direction. So what we do is the new value of low would be mid plus 1. So mid is 4 and if we do plus 1 we reach 5th index. So low becomes 5. It will point to 5th index. So now our search will continue from index 5 to 8 and we will discard this much array. So at every step, when we evaluate mid and perform this check, after that we actually discard half of the array. So therefore this algorithm runs in log of n time. Because at every step, we are discarding half of array. 
because the possibility of target could be either in this direction of mid or in this direction of mid if it is not equal to mid so therefore the algorithm runs in log of n time moving ahead now we are trying to search 66 in this range so low is less than equal to high we first evaluate the mid index so low would be 5 plus high would be 8 minus 5 by 2 so this will give 3 by 2 and this would give 1 so mid would be 6th index like this so it will point to the 6th index so friends if array of mid here it is 75 if it would have been 66 then we would have found our target and problem states that if we are finding our target then we should return the index of that spot where the target belongs but here you can see that array of mid is 75 it is not equal to our target which is 66 so therefore this condition comes out to be false and now we check whether target is less than the value at mid index so if we compare 66 we get it is less than 75 which is our value at mid index which is 75 so this condition comes out to be true so here as the array is sorted and 66 is less than 75 we know that it must lie somewhere in this direction if 66 would have been greater than 75 we would have discarded this part and we would have searched in this part but as 66 is less than 75 now we can safely discard this part so how we can discard this part is as high is pointing to 8 now in the next search high should go from mid minus 1 so therefore we assign mid minus 1 to high so high becomes 5 which is at fifth index and here you can see by doing this we have discarded half of the array and now we are searching in this part moving ahead low is actually equal to high so therefore this condition in while loop comes out to be true so first we will evaluate the mid index so low and high both are pointing to fifth index so phi plus phi minus 5 by 2 and the answer would be 5 so mid will become 5 which will point to the fifth index like this now first we check whether value in the array at mid index whether it is equal to target or not so 65 is not equal to 66 so therefore this condition comes out to be false and then we check whether target is less than the value of array at mid index or not so our target is 66 and the value of array at mid index is 65 so therefore 66 is greater than 65 so this condition comes out to be false so it means the new value of low would be mid plus 1 because this value is less than target so we need to search in this direction so the new value of low would become mid plus 1 which is 6 because value of mid is 5 so low will point to the 6 index now So friend now here you can see value of low is greater than high high is at fifth index and low is at sixth index so therefore this while loop will terminate and here you can see that one critical step is if we have found the target we simply return the mid index but if we haven't found the target and the binary search ends here at whatever index low will be that will be our actual index to insert the target so here 66 was greater than 65 and as there are distinct integers the probable index for inserting 66 would be this which is being pointed by low and then rest of the elements can shift ahead so we simply return the index that it is the value which is being assigned to low when the binary search ends 
सो वाई वी आर ओनली रिटर्निंग लो बट नॉट हाई सो विल सी इट वाई एन एग्जाम्पल सो फॉर दिस दिस स्टेप इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट डेट वी ऑलवेज रिटर्न द इंडेक्स वैल्यू ऑफ लो एंड डेट वुड बी अवर एक्चुअल वैल्यू वेयर दिस टारगेट माइट लाए सो नाउ वी विल सी दैट वाई वी आर एक्चुअली ओनली रिटर्निंग लो एंड नॉट हाई सो फ्रेंड लेट्स एफ यू आर गिवन विथ ओनली वन एलिमेंट लेट्स ए द वैल्यू वुड हैव बीन फोर इट वुड हैव बीन एट जीरो इंडेक्स एंड लेट्स ए द टारगेट वैल्यू वुड हैव बीन फाइव सो वी नो दैट आंसर वुड हैव बीन वन because at 0 we have 4 so 5 will lie at index 1 so at the start low will point to 0 and high will also point to 0 because array dot length is 1 1 minus 1 will give 0 and low is actually equal to high so this condition is true the mid would have been 0 plus 0 minus 0 by 2 which is 0 so this would have been our mid this condition would have been false because 4 is not equal to 5 so target which is 5 is not less than 4 so this condition would have been false so here you can see then the else part would have been executed it must lie in this direction so therefore we do low equal to mid plus 1 so when we do mid plus 1 low becomes 1 which is at first index so therefore after this statement in the while loop low value is 1 and high value is 0 so this while loop will terminate and we know that we have to return 1 because 5 will lie after 4 so this is the one case so let's say now our target is 3 so we know that 3 will lie before 4 here somewhere But here you can see index of four is already zero, and three can't lie in minus one index because this index is not an array. So our answer would have been zero only because three will lie here and four will shift ahead. So here low is and high is at zero index. low is equal to high so this condition is true the mid would be 0 plus 0 minus 0 by 2 which is 0 so mid comes at 0th index only the value at mid index which is 4 is not equal to target because 4 is greater than target so here you can see target is actually less than array of mid 3 is less than 4 so therefore this condition would have been true now and high would have become mid minus 1 so it means as the array sorted 3 must lie in this direction so therefore high will become mid minus 1 so mid is 0 and if we do minus 1 high will reach at a value minus 1 so in the next iteration of while loop this condition comes out to be false because value of high is less than low because low is referring to zero index and high is referring to minus 1 this condition would have been false and here you can see at the end we are actually returning the value of low which is our answer that 3 will lie at zero index only so therefore we need to keep a note that low will be the answer that where this target might lie if it is not found in the sorted array and this is pretty much similar to the binary search algorithm but this step is very critical to understand so friend this was all about the search insert problem i hope you must have liked this video in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update thanks have a nice day hello everyone so friend in this section of course we will be discussing about various sorting algorithms and in this lecture we will discuss what is bubble sort algorithm so we will be looking into the demonstration of bubble sort algorithm and later we will look into its implementation so here what is bubble sort 
So if you see, bubble sort is also called as sinking sort. Now what do we mean by sinking sort? So here let's say we are given an unsorted array which has some random numbers and if we apply the algorithm on those random numbers so usually the algorithm works in various iterations and with each iteration the largest element tends to sink at the end of the array and when they sink to the end of the array they are usually placed at the correct position and after every element is placed at its particular position at the end we get a sorted array so how does this algorithm work is as we are given few numbers which are unsorted so usually this algorithm it repeatedly compares the pair of adjacent elements and swap them if they are in wrong order so when the few numbers are given which are unsorted we start with the first two numbers and we compare them to check whether they are in correct or wrong order and if they are in wrong order we simply swap them and then we move to the next two numbers so let's look into an example where we are given an unsorted array so here inside this array there are six numbers which are unsorted and now let's say we want to sort them in ascending order so now what do we do is we compare the adjacent elements repeatedly so in the first pass we compare the first two numbers and as we want to sort this array in ascending order we simply compare that the number on the left is greater than the number on the right or not so if the number on the left is greater than the number on the right then we know that they are in wrong order so here 3 is greater than 1 so we know that they are in wrong order so what do we do is we perform a swap so after performing the swap between these two numbers 1 comes to the left and 3 goes to the right and after performing the swap we simply move to the next adjacent elements we compare 3 with 5 and 3 is less than 5 so therefore they are in correct order so we perform no swap and then we simply move ahead with the next two numbers now here you can see 5 is greater than 2 so therefore they are in wrong order so we perform a swap and after we perform swap 2 goes to the left and 5 goes to the right and then we move to compare the next two adjacent elements here we see 5 is less than 6 so therefore they are in correct order so we do no swap and at the last 6 is greater than 4 so therefore we perform a swap because they are in wrong order so 4 goes to the left and 6 goes to the right So after the first pass completes, you can see that 6 which is the largest element among the array tends to sink at the end of the array. And here you can see being the largest element, 6 is actually at its correct position. So now with the first pass, the first number got its correct position. Now we again perform the steps with the second pass. But this time, as 6 is at its correct position, we don't include 6 in our comparison. So now our new array is from index 0 to 4. So initially it was from 0 to 5. As we got one of the number correctly sorted, for the second pass, our array becomes from 0 to 4. So we start comparing the first two elements. Now 1 is less than 3. Therefore, we perform no swap. Now 3 is greater than 2. So it means they are in wrong order. So we simply perform a swap here. So 2 goes to the left and 3 goes to the right. 
moving ahead we compare 3 with 5 3 is less than 5 therefore no swapping is done and then we compare 5 with 4 so 5 is greater than 4 therefore we perform a swap because they are in wrong order so 4 goes to the left and 5 goes to the right and as we don't include this element after completion of the second pass you can see the second largest element among this list which is 5 is correctly placed at the second last position just before the 6 so friend here you can see that this algorithm tends to make the largest element sink at the end of the array so similarly this algorithm continues but here you can see the numbers are now in 1 2 3 4 <laughs> so by looking at the array the numbers are already sorted but there is no way for the algorithm to know that the numbers are sorted because the algorithm has to make the comparisons so in order to make the algorithm know that the array is sorted what we do is we simply keep the track of the swapping So let's see how we can do it in the third pass. So we compare the first two elements. One is less than two, so therefore they are in correct order. So no swapping is done. So here we perform no swap. Two is less than three. So therefore there is no swap. Three is less than four. so therefore there is no swap so friends here you can see in the third pass we didn't perform any swap so at the end of the third pass we simply check that whether we had performed any swap or not so if we haven't performed any swap we can come to know that array is already sorted so friend usually with each iteration or with each pass we simply keep the track of swapping and if in any particular pass no swapping is done then we can directly come to know that the array is already sorted and we simply break from the algorithm so friends this is the demonstration of the bubble sort algorithm in our next lecture we'll see the demonstration of the code through animation and then we'll write the implementation of it in eclipse and see it's working I hope you like this video. Thanks have a nice day. Hello everyone. So in our previous lecture we discussed about what is bubble sort and we saw its demonstration with an example. So in this lecture we'll see the demonstration of the code using an animation. So here let's say we are given an unsorted array having five elements as 5 1 9 2 10 10 now we want to sort this array in ascending order by applying the bubble sort algorithm so here you can see that this is the bubble sort algorithm so friends in our previous lecture we saw the demonstration of the algorithm where we discussed that we start comparing the adjacent elements and if they are in wrong order we simply swap them and usually when we complete a one particular iteration the largest element tend to sink at the bottom of the array or at the end of the array and we also discussed that with each iteration we keep the track of the swapping and if no swap is done in any particular iteration we simply come to know that the array is already sorted So let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step. So here the number of elements are 5 with an index from 0 to 4. So at the first step what we do is we simply create a boolean variable we give it a name as is swapped. Now this boolean variable will keep the track of the swapping in each iteration that whether the swap is done or not. so here you can see at the last step what we simply check 
दैट इज द स्वैप इज नॉट डन देन वी कम टू नो दैट द एर इज ऑलरेडी सॉर्टेड सो वी सिंपली ब्रेक फ्रॉम दिस एल्गोरिथम सो विल सी इट्स यूसेज इन साइड दिस एल्गोरिथम सो यर वी हैव क्रिएटेड द बुलियन वेरिएबल इज स्वैप्ड सो फ्रेंड हियर यू कैन सी देर आर टू फॉर लूप्स वन इज द आउटर फॉर लूप एंड अदर इज द इनर फॉर लूप सो यूजली द आउटर फॉर लूप बेसिकली कीप द ट्रैक ऑफ ईच एंड एवरी इटरेशन एंड द इनर फॉर लूप विल सिंपली हेल्प अस इन परफॉर्मिंग द कंपेरिजन विद द एजेस एंड एलिमेंट्स सो लेट्स सी द यूसेज ऑफ दिस टू फॉर लूप्स सो विद द आउटर फॉर लूप वी स्टार्ट विद आई इक्वल टू जीरो and this for loop will loop till i is less than n minus 1 so here you can see 5 minus 1 which gives 4 so this for loop will travel four times as it is starting from 0 it will go from 0 1 2 3 so with total four iterations so usually this outer for loop what it tracks is here you can see there are five numbers and we also discussed that with each iteration the largest element tend to go to its correct position by sinking at the end of the array and once it sinks to the end of the array we simply don't include that element in the next iteration so here as the outer for loop will traverse four times with each time we get a number sorted at its correct place so here there are five numbers so with four iterations we will get the four numbers sorted correctly at their position and as the fifth number is only number left it will be already sorted to its correct position so therefore we iterate this for loop from 0 to less than n minus 1 so currently value of i is 0 and it is less than 4 which is n minus 1 so the condition in for loop comes out to be true and as you want to track that whether any swap has been performed with each and every iteration with this iteration we start with is swapped as false and moving ahead now we encounter the inner for loop which simply compares the edges and elements and perform the swap so here you can see the inner for loop starts from j equal to 0 and here it goes till j is less than n minus 1 minus i now here you can see that the outer for loop is controlling the inner for loop now why we are doing it is because with each iteration the largest element will sink to the end of the array and once those elements are sinking to the end of the array we don't have to include those elements so as the outer for loop is incrementing one by one the j will traverse only to those positions which are still unsorted so let's see it via demonstration so currently j is less than 5 minus 1 minus 0 because i is 0 so the condition in for loop comes out to be true and for loop executes and here inside this for loop we are simply providing an if block where we are simply comparing the edges and elements j and j plus 1 and as we are sorting this in ascending order we are simply checking that the value at jth index is greater than value at j plus 1th index or not so it means we are simply comparing these two elements now here you can see 5 is greater than 1 so therefore they are in wrong order so we simply perform a swap so here the condition in if block comes out to be true and we here inside the if block we are performing the swap so usually how we perform a swap is we create a temporary variable and we store one of the values inside the temporary variable so here we are storing the value at jth index 
to the temporary variable because in the next step we'll override this value and we actually need this value in the later computation. So as we want to swap these two elements, now we are taking the value at j plus 1th index and we are assigning it to the jth index. So it becomes 1 and at the last step, as we have stored this value into the temporary variable 5, we simply assign the temp to the array at the j plus 1th index. So here you can see, we have swapped both the numbers using the temporary variable. And then we mark is swapped variable with a value true because we have performed one swap in this iteration. So it becomes true. Moving ahead. Now we'll increment j by 1. So j becomes 1. And 1 is less than 5 minus 1 minus 0 which is 4. So the condition in for loop comes out to be true. And here as j is 1, so it will simply point to the first index and j plus will point to the second index because now we want to compare these two elements. And here as 5 is less than 9, therefore they are in correct order. So we perform no swap. As the condition in if block comes out to be false, there is no swapping. will increment j by 1. So j becomes 2 and 2 is less than 4. So the for loop executes. Now the value of j is 2. Therefore, now we will compare 9 with 2. So here you can see as 9 is greater than 2, Therefore, they are in wrong order. So here we need a swap. So the condition in if block comes out to be true because 9 is greater than 2. So now we'll simply swap using the temporary variable which we saw in our previous steps. So we store 9 in the temporary variable. Then we store 2 at the place of 9. And then we store the value stored in a temporary variable at the third index on the place of 2. So here we have simply performed a swap between these two elements. And we assign value true to a swapped variable which is already true. We'll increment j by 1. So j becomes 3 and 3 is less than 4. Now we are simply comparing the jth index with j plus 1th index which is the third index with fourth index. Comparing 9 with 10. So here you can see 9 is less than 10. So therefore no swapping is done. And the condition in if block comes out to be false. So we simply skip this part. We'll increment j by 1. So j becomes 4. So now here you can see value of j is 4 and 4 is not less than 4. Therefore the condition in for loop comes out to be false. And this for loop exits. And just after the for loop, we have completed our one iteration completely. So we simply check that whether in this iteration we performed any swap or not. Because if we haven't performed any swap in this iteration, then the algorithm comes to know that the array is already sorted. 
but here you can see the value of is swapped is true so therefore this if condition comes out to be false so friends here you can see the outer for loop has performed its one iteration completely with a value of i equal to 0 so after the first iteration of the for loop you can see the largest element which is the 10 has basically sync to the end of the array and here now you can see 10 being the largest element is at its correct position so now we'll increment i by 1 and 1 is less than 4 therefore the condition in for loop comes out to be true so friend now next pass starts so we simply assign the value false to the is swapped variable and now the second pass starts so we start comparing it from the first two elements with j equal to 0 so friend here you can see the value of i is 1 and value of i is basically controlling the inner for loop and why it is controlling because with the first iteration we have found our one element which is sorted and it is at its correct position so therefore when we are starting our next pass we don't want to include this element so our array has now become from 0 to the third index so therefore we are subtracting 1 from this condition because value of i is 1 so it means the inner for loop will simply compare these elements from 0, 1, 2, 3 and it will not touch the fourth element using this condition so currently you can see j is 0 and j is less than 5 minus 1 which is 4 minus 1 which is 3 so 0 is less than 3 and we simply perform the comparison what we did in our previous steps we compare the value at jth and j plus 1th index so here as 1 is less than 5 therefore they are in correct order so no swap is done and the condition in if block comes out to be false now we'll increment j by 1 so j becomes 1 1 is less than 3 now we simply compare the elements at index 1 and 2 because value of j is 1 here 5 is greater than 2 so therefore they are in wrong order so we simply perform a swap because condition in if block comes out to be true so we simply store 5 into the temporary variable and then we migrate this value which is stored at the j plus 1th index we simply assign it to the jth index so it becomes 2 using this step and at the last we simply assign the value stored to the temporary variable to array at j plus 1th index so it becomes 5 so we have performed a swap here so as we have performed the swap we simply assign the value true to a swapped variable we'll increment j by 1 so j becomes 2 2 is less than 3 now we compare the second index with the third index using array of j and array of j plus 1 so 5 is less than 9 therefore they are in correct order so no swap is done will increment j by 1 so j becomes 3 
Now here you can see three is not less than three. Therefore, the condition in for loop comes out to be false, and for loop exits. And here we simply check whether is swapped is equal to false or not. But here is swapped is true because we had perform one swap here. So therefore, the condition in if loop comes out to be false. And friends, here you can see with the completion of the second iteration of the outer for loop. The second largest element, which is nine, is at its correct position, which is the second last position. So here, bubble sort makes the largest element tend to sing at the end of the array. The second largest element tend to sing at the second last position, and similarly, it goes on like this. So now we'll again execute for loop with i equal to two by incrementing the value of i. So i becomes two. Two is less than four. We assign false to a swapped variable because with this inner for loop we are starting our new iteration. So here you can see as these two elements are basically sorted. So we are using the value of i, which is two, to control the inner for loop. In this condition here, so j is starting from zero, and it will go till which is five minus one, which gives four, minus two, which gives two. So zero is less than two. So now we'll again start comparing these two elements, and as one is less than two, therefore they are at correct order. So no swapping is done, and also friend here you can see the importance of this boolean variable, because if you see, the array is already sorted, but the algorithm doesn't knows this. So here when the j was equal to zero, we didn't perform any swap, and its swapped value remained false. Now we'll increment j by one, so j becomes one. One is less than two. So we simply compare the elements at index one and two. So two is less than five, therefore they are in correct order. So no swapping is done. So this boolean variable still remains false. We'll increment j by one, so j becomes two. And here you can see two is not less than two. So therefore, this for loop will terminate because the condition in for loop comes out to be false. And friends, here you can see at the last step we are simply comparing that whether is swapped is false or not. So here is swapped value is false, which tells us that array is already sorted, and we don't want to continue this algorithm further because we were keeping the track of the swapping. So in this step, the condition in if block comes out to be true, and we simply break this for loop. So friends, here we saw the demonstration of the bubble sort algorithm. So now next lecture we'll see the demonstration of this algorithm in Eclipse. I hope you like this video. Thanks, have a nice day. Hello everyone. So friend, in this lecture we'll code the bubble sort algorithm, and we'll simply test its working. So in Eclipse, I have created one class as bubble sort, and inside that I have created one method print array. So this method will simply take the array, and will simply print its content on the console. So we have already discussed this algorithm in our previous lectures when we discussed about the arrays. So I'll be using this print array method to simply demonstrate that whether our array is sorted or not. So inside this class, I have provided a main method where I have created an unsorted array, which we already discussed in our previous slide. And at the first step, what we are doing is 
we are simply calling the print array method and providing this array to simply see the contents of this array before performing the sort so here you can see the array is not sorted so let's write an algorithm to sort this array so in this lecture we'll see about the bubble sort algorithm so we'll create a method as public void we'll give it a name as sort and to this sort method we'll pass the integer array which is the unsorted array so when inside this method the first step we do is we simply calculate the value of n which is the number of elements inside this array so we simply do array dot length and as per the algorithm which we discussed in our previous lecture we'll first create a boolean variable is swapped so we have created this variable to keep the track that in any particular iteration we performed any swap or not so if you have performed any swap then we are unsure that array is sorted or not also in any of the iteration if we haven't performed any swap then we can come to know that the array is already sorted moving ahead we first provide a for loop which starts from 0 and goes till n minus 1 and also friend we discussed that value of i will basically control the inner for loop because as we are comparing the adjacent elements we need to stop at a point where we don't want to compare further so here with the start of any iteration we simply provide a value false to its swapped variable and now we'll provide the inner for loop where j will start from 0 and j will traverse till n minus 1 Minus i, j plus plus. So, friend, we already discussed that why we are providing this condition here is because we need to control the inner for loop by the outer for loop value, which is the i. So, we are simply providing i here. Now, inside the inner for loop, our basic comparison will start. So, we simply start with. comparing the adjacent elements that if the value at index j if it is greater than value at index j plus 1 then we know that they are in wrong order so we simply perform a swap so inside is if block in order to perform swap we create a temporary variable and we simply store the value at the jth index so that we can use this value to perform the proper swap so after we take out the value at the jth index what we do is now we can simply store the value at j plus 1th index to the jth index because we need to perform a swap and the final step we simply store the value present in the temporary variable to the array at j plus 1th index so in this three steps we are simply performing the swap of the values present in the jth and the j plus 1th index because they are in wrong order as value at the jth index is greater than value at j plus 1th index 
सो आफ्टर वी परफॉर्म स्वैप वी सिंपली असाइन अ वैल्यू ट्रू टू स्वैप्ड वेरिएबल टू कीप द ट्रैक दट इन साइड दिस फॉर लूप वेन वी कंपेयर द एडजस्ट इन एलिमेंट्स वी डिड परफॉर्म ए स्वैप सो आफ्टर एवरी इटरेशन हियर वॉट वी डू इज वी सिंपली चेक दैट वेदर वी परफॉर्म एनी स्वैप और नॉट सो इफ यू डिडेंट परफॉर्म द स्वैप वी नो दैट एरे इज ऑलरेडी सॉर्टेड बिकॉज ऑल द एडजस्ट एंड एलिमेंट्स आर एट इट्स करेक्ट पोजिशन सो वी सिंपली ब्रेक from this algorithm and if we had performed any swap then the value would have been true so we are unsure till this point that whether array is sorted or not but if the value it hold is false then we are sure that array is already sorted so friend this is the bubble sort algorithm which we already discussed in our previous lecture and in this lecture we have simply provided the code for it so now let's test it's working so here what we do is we simply call the sort method we provide the array and after we have performed the sorting we simply print the array again so if i run the code now so friend here you can see initially the array was 5 1 2 9 10 which is the content of array before sorting and then we performed the sort on this array and after performing the sort we simply printed the array again and we found that array is sorted with the all elements to its correct position 1 2 5 9 10 so the array is sorted in ascending order in this tutorial we saw the demonstration of the bubble sort algorithm we tested its working in the main method so friends i hope you like this video thanks have a nice day hello everyone so friends in our previous lecture we discussed about the bubble sort algorithm so in this lecture we will discuss about the insertion sort algorithm so let's discuss this algorithm in detail so here if you see insertion sort is a simple sorting algorithm that works the way we sort playing cards in our hands so when we play with the deck of cards usually most of the games are involved where we keep few cards in our hand and what we generally do is we keep them in proper order so how do we manage to keep them in proper order is we use the insertion sort algorithm so let's say we have this deck of cards which is lying in front of us and let's say we pick few random cards from the top of the deck so usually what we do is when we pick up the first card we simply keep it in our hand because it is already sorted and when we pick the second card the card which we have picked we simply compare it with the card which we have in our hand and based on the comparison we either keep that card before or after the first card the deck of cards which is lying in front of us are basically in random order or you can say they are basically unsorted form and the cards which we have in our hand are basically kept in sorted form so when we pick up the third card from the random cards now the card which we have picked we simply compare it with the cards which we have in our hand so we compare the third card with second and then with the first card and based on the order which we are following we simply place the third card either after the second card or in between first and second card or just before the first card so similarly let's say we have this unsorted array so using the insertion sort algorithm we divide the given array into two parts one is the sorted part 
and the other is unsorted part so how the algorithm works is from the unsorted part we take the first element and place at its correct position in the sorted array so here we are simply picking one element from the unsorted array and based on some logic we are simply putting that element into the sorted array at its correct position so this is done by shifting all the elements which are larger than the first element by one position so here let's say we are sorting the array in ascending order so the first element which we pick from the unsorted part we simply compare the element with each and every element in the sorted array and all the elements which are larger than the first element we simply shift them by one position and as soon as we encounter any element which is smaller than the first element we simply store this first element just after that and this process is repeated till unsorted array is not empty so friend let's see the demonstration of insertion sort algorithm with an example we'll take an unsorted array we apply the algorithm mentioned here and we'll see that how we can sort the array so friends here you can see that we have this array from index 0 to 5 so basically there are six elements with a value as 3 1 5 2 6 4 now let's say we want to sort this array in ascending order so how do we start this algorithm is we simply pick the first element so here it is 3 and as we have picked the element 3 we know that there is only one element so it's already sorted so basically this algorithm starts from the second element because the first element is already sorted so friends in our previous slide we discussed that we divide the array in two parts one is the sorted part and other is the unsorted part so when we start our algorithm from the second element so the elements to the left are basically sorted and the elements to the right are basically unsorted so now what we do is from the unsorted part we simply pick the first element which is 1 and what do we do is we simply store this element let's say to a temporary variable so as soon as we store this element to a temporary variable what do we do is we simply provide a hole here that this part is empty so after providing this empty space what do we do is we simply compare one with the element in the sorted array now as we are sorting this array in ascending order we simply compare that whether one is less than 3 or not so here one is less than 3 so therefore one should come before 3 here you can see there is no space so what do we do is as we discussed in our previous slide we simply shift the elements which are larger than 1 by one position so here we'll simply shift 3 to this empty space so after we perform this shift did are there any other elements in the sorted array or not so here you can see there was only one element 3 there are no other elements so we simply place one at its correct position so after placing one at its correct position you can see that now our sorted array has two elements 1 and 3 in sorted form so now we simply pick the first element from the unsorted array so we simply pick 5 we store it into a temporary variable and we create a empty space here now what do we do is we compare 5 with 3 and we know that 3 is smaller than 5 therefore 5 has to be placed after 3 which is this spot only so there is no shift because the element to which we are comparing 
in the sorted array is already small from the element which we picked from the unsorted array so the position of 5 will not change 5 will be stored at its own position and here you can see that as 3 was less than 5 we didn't compare 1 with 5 because as this is a sorted array 1 will be by default smaller than 5 so after placing 5 at index 2 now our sorted array has 3 elements 1 3 5 and from the unsorted array we simply pick the first element which is 2 we store this 2 into a temporary variable and we create an empty space here now what we do is we compare 2 with 5 so 2 is less than 5 so we know that 2 must be lying somewhere before 5 but here you can see in sorted array there is no space left so what do we do is we simply shift the larger element by one position and as here is the empty space we can simply shift it here so 5 comes here and the empty space comes here so friends here we are not sure that whether this is the correct position of 2 or not so what do we do is we simply compare 2 with this element which is 3 so here you can see 3 is also greater than 2 so we know that 2 must be lying somewhere before 3 so what do we do is we simply shift 3 by a position and as here is an empty space 3 comes here and the empty space goes here so friend we are still not sure whether 2 must be placed here or not so we simply compare 2 with 1 and here you can see that 1 is smaller than 2 so therefore we are sure that 2 must be lying after 1 and the position after 1 is empty so we simply store 2 at this empty position so friends after this step now we have 4 sorted elements and 2 unsorted elements so we simply pick the first element from the unsorted part which is 6 we store 6 into a temporary variable we create an empty space here and we compare 6 with 5 so as 6 is greater than 5 we know that it must be lying after 5 so after 5 we have this empty space so 6 will be stored at its own position So now our sorted part is 5 elements 1, 2, 3, 5 and 6 which are sorted and in our unsorted part we have now only one element left so we simply pick the first element which is 4 we store it into a temporary variable and we create an empty space here now we compare 4 with 6 so 4 is smaller than 6 so it must be lying before 6 but there is no space left here so we simply shift 6 by 1 position here so 6 comes here and we have empty spot here so now we are not sure whether we simply put 4 here or not so we simply compare 4 with the element just before the empty spot which is 5 so that we are sure that whether 4 can be placed here or not so as 5 is greater than 4 therefore we know that 4 must be lying before this element but here there is no space so we simply shift 5 by 1 position to this empty spot and the empty spot reaches here now we are still not sure whether we need to place 4 here or not so we simply compare 4 with 3 now as 4 is greater than 3 
we know that it must be lying after 3 and here you can see after 3 we have this empty space so we simply store 4 to this empty space so when after this step you can see the complete array is sorted so here we saw the insertion sort technique where we divided the array into two parts one was the sorted part and other was the unsorted part and with each step we simply picked the first element of the unsorted part and we simply placed it into its correct position in the sorted part and this we did till the complete array was sorted so friend in this lecture we saw the basic demonstration of insertion sort technique in our next lecture we'll see the working of the code step by step using an animation i hope you like this video thanks have a nice day hello everyone so friends in our previous lecture we discussed about the insertion sort and we saw the demonstration of the sorting algorithm now in this lecture we will see the demonstration of insertion sort algorithm step by step so friends here you can see that this is the algorithm to perform insertion sort so let's say we are given an array having five elements which contains values as 5 1 9 2 10 so here you can see the values are in unsorted form so let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step to sort this array in ascending order so here the number of elements inside this array are 5 which are ranging from index 0 to 4 so friends while performing the insertion sort the first thing we encounter is the for loop so here you can see this for loop goes from i equal to 1 and it goes till i is less than n. So friends in our previous lecture we discussed that when we perform insertion sort we usually divide the array into two parts. One is the sorted part and the other is unsorted part. So here you can see that when we start sorting this array all the elements are in unsorted part and no element is in sorted part so what we do is we simply pick one element which is the first element of the unsorted part so let's say we pick 5 and as soon as we pick 5 as 5 is the only element which we want to sort therefore we directly place 5 to the sorted part because we don't have to compare 5 with any element so instead of doing this stuff we directly start from i equal to 1 which is this position because 5 is already sorted into its correct position so usually this algorithm starts from i equal to 1 so here you can see that 5 is in sorted part and all other elements are in unsorted part so we always start from i equal to 1 and as i having value as 1 is less than 5 therefore the condition in for loop comes out to be true so friends here when we perform insertion sort one rule of thumb is we always pick the first element of the unsorted part and we try to put it in sorted part by comparing one with all the elements in the sorted part and placing it into its correct position so when we perform this comparison in the sorted part all the elements which are larger than this first element we simply shift them by one position so that there is an empty space where we can simply put this element so here you can see the space are already occupied with some numbers so when we perform a shift there can be a chance that some numbers can be overridden so what we do is we simply store this value which we want to compare with the elements in the sorted part we simply store it into a temporary variable here moving ahead so friends now we want to compare this element 
with the elements present in the sorted part. So here you can see, as we have picked the first element of the unsorted part, if we go one position back, we'll get the elements of the sorted part. So we simply do i minus one, and to access the elements of the sorted part, we simply store it in the j variable. So here j becomes zero. So usually the elements of the unsorted part are accessed via i, and the elements of the sorted part are accessed via j. So friends, now we provide a while loop because we want to compare this element with each and every element in the sorted part, and all the elements which are greater than this element, we simply shift it by one position. So that there can be a space where we can simply put this element, and as we are sorting this in ascending order, so here the condition we provide in while loop is that j should be greater than equal to zero, because inside this while loop we are decrementing j by one. So we have to provide this condition that j should be greater than equal to zero, because we don't want to go outside of this array. And also, why we are decrementing j by one is we need to compare this element with each and every element in the sorted part, so that we can put this element into its correct position. So the first condition is j should be greater than equal to zero. So here j is equal to zero. Therefore, this condition comes out to be true. And then we provide one more condition as the element at jth index is greater than Temp or not? So here you can see the value of j is zero. So the element at index zero is five, and here you can see five is greater than one. So we know that as we are sorting this array in ascending order, one should be placed before five. So therefore, this condition in while loop comes out to be true, and we want to find out the correct position of one. So what do we do is In the first step, as five is greater than one, and as we discussed in our previous slide, that all the elements which are greater than one, we have to shift by one position. So how we perform shift is, as we have already stored one into this temporary variable, therefore it's like a hole here, and we can shift five here. So we simply assign the value stored at jth index. Which is five. Two value at j plus one at the index. So j is zero and j plus one is one. So we are simply storing five to this place. So here now five has been shifted to this position. And after this shift, we simply decrement j by one. Because now we want to compare one. With an element just before five, so we simply decrement j by one. So as j is zero, j becomes minus one. So here it means that now j is pointing to minus one, which is an index which is out of this array. So friends, as here you can see that in our sorted part there was only one element five. So we compare that element with one, and there are no more elements to compare. So therefore, this condition where j is greater than equal to zero comes out to be false because j is equal to minus one. So the condition in while loop comes out to be false, and while loop exits. And at the end, we have found a position where we need to store one. So that position is j plus one. Because as j is pointing to minus one, so it means j had traveled till minus one position to basically shift the largest elements by one position. So when we do j plus one here, we are simply storing the value one at index zero. Because as j is minus one, j plus one becomes zero. So we are simply storing one at zero index.
So friend, after performing this all steps, now here you can see that one and five are basically two elements which are sorted. So therefore, with each for loop iteration, we will get one element which will be now part of the sorted array. So here, now one and five are part of sorted array, and rest of the elements are part of unsorted array. So here now we'll increment i by one. So i becomes two. So friends, as we already discussed, that we simply pick the first element of the unsorted part in order to make this element to be placed in its correct position in the sorted array. So we simply start with storing the value at i at index into a temporary variable. And why we are storing into this temporary variable is because we want to create a whole year. So moving ahead, now in order to access the sorted array, we simply do i minus one. So the value of j is one. In while loop, we simply check whether j is greater than or equal to zero or not. So j is greater than zero. So this condition comes out to be true, and then we simply check that the value stored at jth index is greater than temp or not. So here you can see value of j is one. So the value at first index is five, and five is not greater than nine. So therefore, this condition comes out to be false, and the while loop exits. So here you can see that as we are sorting this array in ascending order, we want a correct position for nine in the sorted array. So as there are only two elements which are sorted, one and five, when we compared nine with five, we found that five was not greater than nine. So therefore, the correct position of nine would be after five. So here this while loop exits. And at the end, we simply store the value nine in the array at j plus one at index. So value of j is one. When we do plus one, we get two. So we simply store the value nine at index two. So now here you can see the three elements one, five, nine are properly sorted. So therefore, nine will be now part of this sorted array. We increment i by one. I becomes three. And now we simply pick the first element of the unsorted array. So we simply store the value two into a temporary variable. Because now we want to place this two into its correct position in the sorted array. So when we'll perform these steps, we need to shift some of the elements by one position so that we can place two to its correct position. So when we'll shift these elements by one position, we need to create a space here. So what do we do is we simply store this value somewhere into the temporary variable because we need to refer this. while comparing it with the elements in the sorted array so in order to access the sorted array we simply do i minus 1 so j will keep the track of the sorted array so now we'll perform the comparison we'll see that j is greater than or equal to 0 so value of j is 2 therefore this condition is true so now we'll compare this two stored in this temporary variable with the element stored at jth index which is 9 so here you can see 9 is greater than 2 therefore the condition in while loop comes out to be true and as 9 is greater than 2 we know that 2 must come before 9 So for two coming before nine, we need to create a space here. So what do we do is 
we simply shift this value by one position by storing the value at jth index into j plus 1th index. So j is 2. So this value 9 we are storing in j plus 1th index which is the third index. So 9 comes here with a shift. And as we have already stored this value at temporary variable, we can override this part. So 9 goes to the third index. So now we have compared it with 9. So we simply decrement j by one position. Because there can be more elements which can be greater than 2. So j becomes 1. And as j is greater than 0, this condition comes out to be true. And the value stored at jth index, which is 5, is also greater than 2. Therefore, the condition in while loop comes out to be true. And we simply shift 5 by 1 position by assigning the value at jth index to value at j plus 1th index. So we are simply shifting 5 by 1 position because value of j is 1. So this value, we are assigning it to j plus 1 which is the second index. And then we'll decrement j by 1 because there can be more elements which can be greater than 2. So j becomes 0. Now whereas j is greater than or equal to 0, this condition comes out to be true. But the value stored at jth index which is 1 is not greater than 2. Therefore we know that this value 2 will be stored somewhere after 1. And as we have already shifted 5 to its correct position, this position is actually a space where we can store 2. So here this condition comes out to be false. And at the last step, as j is pointing to 0, we know that we need to store 2 after 1. So we simply store this temp value to j plus 1th index, which is the first index. So 2 comes here, which is actually 2's correct position. Now after this for loop ends, 1, 2, 5, 9 will become part of the sorted array. We'll simply increment i by 1. So i becomes 4. And now we simply want to put 10 to its correct position in sorted array. So we simply store 10 into this temporary variable. Moving ahead. So now as we want to compare the value stored at temporary variable with the elements in sorted array, we need to access the sorted array. So we simply do i minus 1 and we store it into j. So j becomes 3 which is the last element of the sorted array. So as j is greater than or equal to 0, this condition comes out to be true. But the value stored at jth index, which is 9, is not greater than 10. So therefore this condition comes out to be false. And we simply store this value 10 in this array at j plus 1th index. Because 9 is at its correct position and as it is less than 10, therefore 10 should be stored just after that. So we simply store 10 to j plus 1th index. So friends here you can see that now 10 will also be part of the sorted array. And as there are no more elements left to be compared, because when we increment i by 1, i becomes 5 
and as 5 is not less than 5 therefore the condition in for loop comes out to be false and this for loop exits so friends here you can see we have sorted this array into ascending order storing in the form as 1 2 5 9 10 so friend in this lecture we discussed about the insertion sort algorithm by demonstrating the algorithm step by step where we actually divided the array into two parts the sorted part and the unsorted part and with each iteration we picked the first element of the unsorted part and we compare this element with each and every element in the sorted part to place the element into its correct position and how we place the element in its correct position is is by shifting all the larger elements which was greater than this first element of the unsorted array so friend this is the demonstration of the algorithm step by step now let's go to eclipse and see the implementation of this algorithm and it's working i hope you like this video thanks have a nice day hello everyone so friends in our previous lecture we saw the demonstration of the insertion sort algorithm step by step so in this lecture we'll code the algorithm and we'll test its working so here i have created one class as insertion sort this class has method as print array which simply prints the contents of this array on the console which we already discussed in our previous lecture so here let's say we want to sort this array having five elements as 5 1 2 9 and 10 so when we'll print these elements on the console let's say if i run the code so here you can see it printed 5 1 2 9 and 10 so here the array you can see is not in sorted form so let's write the code to sort this array using the insertion sort so here i will be creating one method as public void let's say i give the name of the method as sort so this method will take the array which we want to sort in the first step what we do is we simply compute the number of elements inside the array by storing the length of the array to the integer variable n and then as we discussed in our previous lecture that we start our algorithm with a for loop where value of i will be starting from 1 and not from 0 because the first element inside this array when we pick to sort we know that it's already sorted so we simply start from the second element so i starts from 1 and it goes till i is less than n so friends we also discussed that when we perform insertion sort we usually divide the array into two parts one is the sorted part and the other is unsorted part so here the value which is tracked by i is usually the unsorted part and the value which j tracks which we'll see later is usually the sorted part so here by providing this for loop with each iteration we simply pick one element and we place that element into its correct position by applying the insertion sort so we simply store the first element of the unsorted part into the temporary variable and after we store this now we simply access the sorted part so here you can see 
that has i starting from 1 so the element which is stored at the zeroth index is already sorted and we can access it via j so now j will basically keep the track of the sorted part we provide a while loop where we provide two conditions that j should be greater than or equal to 0 and as you want to compare the value stored into the temporary variable with each and every element stored in the sorted part we provide another condition as the element stored at the jth index is greater than temp or not so if this is true inside this while loop what we do is we simply shift all the larger elements which are greater than temp by one position and how do we do it we simply take the value stored at jth index and we transfer it to the j plus 1th index so here we are simply shifting larger elements to temp by one position and after shifting the elements we simply decrement the value of j by 1 because inside this while loop we need to compare the temporary variable with each and every value of the sorted part so friend why we are shifting all the larger elements by one position which are actually larger than value stored into this temporary variable is because we need to find the correct position of the value stored into this temporary variable so after we perform the shift by one position we decrement the value of j by 1 and then we again compare it with the value stored into the temporary variable and this loop goes on till j is greater than or equal to 0 so this is basically a boundary check that we don't go to the out of the boundaries of the array and after this while loop we simply store the value stored into this temporary variable into its correct position which is at j plus 1th index because here we will exit the while loop with these two conditions and as we have already decremented j by 1 we know that the correct position for the value stored into this temporary variable would be at j plus 1th index so friend after this for loop completes for one iteration our sorted part increases by one value and with each iteration the sorted part increases and the unsorted part decreases and finally when this for loop exits all the elements of the unsorted part now becomes part of the sorted part so friend this is the insertion sort algorithm we discussed this algorithm in greater detail in our previous lecture and in this lecture we have simply coded this algorithm so now we'll test its working so here we'll call the sort method we pass in the array and after the sort happens we'll simply print the array again so this print array will be called before sort and this print array will be called after sort so if i run the main method now so here you can see the array is already sorted initially it printed 5 1 2 9 10 which was the unsorted array and then it printed 1 2 5 9 10 which is the sorting of the array in ascending order So friend in this lecture we saw the code for the insertion sort and we tested its working in main method. I hope you like this video. Thanks have a nice day.
Hello everyone. So in this video we will discuss about the selection sort algorithm. We will first understand what is selection sort and we will see a small demonstration of selection sort algorithm. So here as we are performing selection sort, we are basically sorting the elements of an array into ascending order. So let's say we are given with this array with five elements as 3, 1, 5, 2, 6. We know these elements are unsorted and we want to sort them in ascending order using selection sort algorithm. So in this algorithm what we do is we first divide this array into two parts. One is the sorted part and other is the unsorted part. So here you can see at the start all the elements are unsorted. So our sorted part an unsorted part looks like this that all the elements currently are unsorted and there are no elements in the sorted part. Now what we do inside this algorithm is let's say we are given with this boundary. What we do is we start with this boundary and we find which is the minimum element among these all the elements in the unsorted part. So once you find out which is the minimum element among these elements we simply swap it with the the leftmost element of this boundary and as soon as we swap them we know that the minimum element which we found is at its correct position so for example here you can see when we pick the minimum element and swap it with the leftmost element of the unsorted part which is this boundary after swap the element now becomes part of the sorted array. So for example, among these five elements, if we find out which is the minimum element, we can find that one is the minimum element. So what we do is, we see which is the leftmost element which is 3 here and we simply swap these two values. So it would look something like this, that these elements are swapped and we also know that as one was the minimum element among these all the elements, one is at its correct position if we actually sort this array completely. It simply signifies that now one is the part of the sorted array and these four elements are part of the unsorted array. So this finding of minimum element in the unsorted part and swapping it with the leftmost element of the unsorted part is repeated till all the elements are part of the sorted array and there are no elements left in the unsorted part. So the idea behind this algorithm is very simple. We divide the array into two parts, sorted part and unsorted part. From the unsorted part, we pick the minimum element and we swap it with the leftmost element of the unsorted part. So the element which is next to this boundary, we simply swap the minimum element with this. And after we perform this swap, we know that the minimum element which we figured from this array is at its correct position. So at the each pass, one one element from the unsorted part becomes the element of the sorted part. And at the last we only get the sorted part. So let's see the demonstration of this algorithm with a small example. So let's suppose we are given with this array having 6 elements indexed from 0 to 5 and they are unsorted. So let's say if you want to sort them in ascending order. Here length of this array is 6. So the first step we do is we divide this array into two parts sorted and unsorted part. So initially all the elements are unsorted. So therefore the sorted part has no elements and the unsorted part has all the elements. Now let's see what happens when we perform the first pass. So here what we do is we simply start from the unsorted part and we find that there is one element 3. So let's say we are assuming that 3 is the minimum element of this complete array. Now what we do is We go to its next element and we compare 3 with 1. 
and we check that whether one is less than three or not. So here one is less than three. So which means that our assumption is wrong and one will become our new minimum. So one becomes our new minimum and simply we go on like this. We check whether five is less than minimum. So five is not less than minimum. We move ahead. We check whether two is less than minimum. So two is not less than one. So we move ahead. And four is also not less than one. Six is also not less than one. So here you can see after we completed the first pass, we found that one is the minimum element among this all the elements. So now what we do is we simply swap this one with the leftmost element of the unsorted part. So the element next to this boundary, we simply swap it with that. So here we'll simply swap three and one. So one comes here and three comes here. And after first pass, one is at its correct position. So therefore, now our sorted part has one element and unsorted part has the rest of the elements. Now we'll simply do the second pass and we perform the same steps. At first we consider three is the minimum element. We compare it with each and every element next to it. So five is not less than three. We move ahead. So here two is less than three. So two will become our new minimum. We move ahead. Six is not less than two. And four is also not less than two. So after second pass, we found that two is the minimum element among the unsorted part. Now after we found out that two is the minimum element, what we do is we simply swap it with the leftmost element of the unsorted part. So we'll simply swap it with three. So two comes here and three goes here. And we also know that two is at its correct position now. So therefore, now our sorted part has two elements and unsorted part has rest of the elements. So we'll go with the third pass now. We assume five is the minimum element and we compare it with the rest of the elements. We check whether three is less than five. So yes, three is less than five. So therefore three will become our new minimum. We compare whether six is less than three. So it is not. So we move ahead. We check whether four is less than three. So four is not less than three. So after the third pass, we came to know that three is the minimum element among these elements which are part of the unsorted array. So after finding this minimum element, we simply swap it with the leftmost element of the unsorted part. So leftmost element is the five. So we'll simply swap three with five. And now our sorted part has three elements and unsorted part has the rest of the elements. We'll continue with the fourth pass. We'll assume five is the minimum element among the elements in the unsorted part. We compare it with the rest of the elements. Six is not less than five. So we move ahead. Four is less than five. So four will become our new minimum. So after this pass, among these three elements in the unsorted part, we came to know that four is the minimum element and we will simply swap it with the leftmost element of the unsorted part. So we'll simply swap five and four. We 
now our sorted part has four elements and unsorted part has rest of the elements so our fifth pass will start we assume 6 is the minimum element and we compare it with the rest of the elements so there is only one element which is 5 so we check whether 5 is less than 6 so yes 5 is less than 6 so 5 will become our new minimum and after the fifth pass we found that among these two elements 5 was the minimum so we'll simply swap 5 with the leftmost element of the unsorted part so 5 will come at this place and 6 will go at this place after the swap and once we perform the swap the minimum element which we swapped becomes part of the sorted array so friends here you can see that after the fifth pass 5 came to its correct position and we are left only with one element so by default this element at its correct position so we don't have to perform these steps on the last element because it is already at its correct position so the only thing to consider here is if the length of array is 6 then there are at least five passes which is n minus 1 which is the length minus 1 So if there are six elements, we have to perform five passes to get the array in sorted form. So this was the basic idea behind the selection sort algorithm. We usually do three steps. First, we divide the array into two parts, sorted and unsorted. At the start, all the elements are in unsorted part, and then we apply the selection sort. in different passes so with each pass what we do is we simply find the minimum element of the unsorted part and simply swap it with the leftmost element of the unsorted part and after this swap the minimum element which we just found becomes part of the sorted array and this process is repeated till all the elements are part of the sorted array So friend this was the basic demonstration of the selection sort algorithm In our next video we will see the complete animation of the selection sort algorithm step by step I hope you have liked this video and in case you have liked this video then please like comment share and subscribe my channel thanks have a nice day Hello everyone So in our previous video we saw a basic introduction to selection sort and we also saw a demonstration that how selection sort is applied on an array having unsorted elements and once the algorithm is applied all the elements become sorted So here let's suppose we are given with this array where the elements are unsorted So in selection sort what we actually do is we divide the array into two parts one is the sorted part and other is the unsorted part so at the start all the elements are part of unsorted part and we have this boundary here so what we actually do we simply find out the minimum element in the unsorted part So here let's say the minimum element among all these element is 1. So what we do is we pick 1 and we simply swap it with the leftmost element of the unsorted part. And once we swap them so it would look something like this. And we know that 1 is at its correct position because we want to sort the elements in ascending order. So after the swap is done the element now becomes part of the sorted array so the boundary goes here that we have now one element in the sorted part and rest of the elements in unsorted part so this process is repeated for each and every element on the unsorted part till this boundary reaches to the end of the array so when all the elements are sorted the unsorted part has zero elements and all the elements are in sorted part so in our previous video we saw step by step demonstration of the algorithm 
Now we'll see the step by step demonstration of the actual code. So here you can see this is the algorithm to perform the selection sort on an array. And this algorithm will sort the elements into ascending order. So let's say when we call sort method and pass in an array. So let's suppose this is our array having five elements 5, 1, 10, 2, and 9. Now here you can see they are indexed from 0 to 4. Moving ahead. In the first step, what we do is we simply store the length of the array in an integer variable n. So value of n is 5 because we have 5 elements. Moving ahead. Also friends, in our previous video we discussed that we divide this array into two parts, the unsorted part and the sorted part. So when we start the algorithm, the sorted part has zero elements and unsorted part has all the elements. So here basically what we do, we find the minimum element in the unsorted part. And once we find that out, we simply swipe it with the leftmost element of the unsorted part. And once the element is swapped, now that element becomes part of the sorted array and this boundary will get shift by one position. So here you can see this outer for loop goes from i equal to 0 to a value i less than n minus 1. So here basically i will keep the track of this boundary and here you can see it will start from 0 and it will go to less than n minus 1 which is 4. So it will go till 3 here. So why we traverse i to less than n minus 1 because when we are on the last pass, the last element goes to its correct position and we don't perform this algorithm on the last element because we know that that element is at its correct position. So we will see the demonstration of the algorithm and it will be more clear to you. So currently we'll start with i equal to 0 and 0 is less than 4. So the condition in for loop will be true and the for loop will execute. So here whatever the value i is holding it will be simply the indexes of this array. So it can be symbolically represented like this. So in selection sort our first task is to find the minimum element among the unsorted part. So here you can see we first assume that let's say whatever the value i is holding we treat it as the minimum value. So here we create an integer variable and we store the value of i. So min will also become 0 which signifies that we are assuming that value 5 is the minimum element among these all the elements. And now we provide the inner for loop. Now this inner for loop is for actually finding the minimum value. So here this is our assumption and in order to find the minimum value among all these elements we need to compare this minimum value with all the elements of this array and once we find any value which is less than the minimum value our min will point to that value. So let's see how. So here this for loop will start from i plus 1 because here you can see we are assuming that 5 is our minimum value and i is pointing to it. So we start this inner for loop will j equal to i plus 1. So here you can see value of j will become 1 which is 0 plus 1. So this signifies that we are starting from this value because we need to compare now 5 with each and every value of this array. So j starts from i plus 1 and it will go till j is less than n. So less than n will becomes 4 because we want to compare it with each and every element. So last index of j would be 4. So let's move ahead and see how it works. So in the first step we are simply comparing that whatever we assume to be the minimum value is the value at jth index less than the index value which min is holding. So here you can see the value at array of min would be 5 and array of j would be 1. So now we'll simply compare these two values 
एंड यर वी आर चेकिंग दैट वेदर वन इज लेस देन फाइव आर नॉट सो यर यू कैन सी दिस कंडीशन कम्स आउट टू बी ट्रू सो एज वी हैव फाउंड अ मिनिमम वैल्यू ना वॉट विल डू विल सिंपली अपडेट द मिनिमम टू दिस वैल्यू सो वॉट एवर द वैल्यू जे इज होल्डिंग विच इज वन नाउ मेन विल पॉइंट टू दिस वैल्यू होल्डिंग अ वैल्यू एज वन सो मेन बिकम्स वन एंड सिम्बोलिकली इट विल पॉइंट टू एन इंडेक्स वन मूविंग अहेड विल इंक्रीमेंट जे बाय वन बिकॉज नाउ वी नीड टू कंपेयर दिस वन विथ रेस्ट ऑफ द एलिमेंट्स सो जे बिकम्स टू Now we'll compare these two values, and we check whether ten is less than one or not. So ten is not less than one. So this condition comes out to be false. We'll increment j by one. So j becomes three. Now we'll compare these two elements. That value of array at min index is one, and value of array at jth index is two. So we'll now compare these two values. So here you can see two is not less than one. So this condition comes out to be false. We'll increment j by one, so j becomes four. And now we'll simply compare one with nine. and we'll simply check here whether 9 is less than 1 or not so 9 is not less than 1 so therefore this condition comes out to be false and now we'll increment j by 1 so j will become 5 which means that j is now out of this boundaries and this condition here you can see j should be less than n so j value is 5 and 5 is not less than 5 so therefore this for loop will terminate and we simply reach here so here you can see that we have found out the minimum value among this elements which is 1 and in selection sort what we do is we simply swap it with the leftmost element of the unsorted part which is being held by the value i so here we are performing this swap using this temporary variable so in the first step we are storing the value 1 into the temporary variable so temp becomes 1 and then we are simply swapping the value at i at index which is 5 into this index so 5 will come here and at the last step we are simply assigning value stored at temp into the ith index which is this so we have simply swapped these elements and after we perform this swap we know that one is at its correct position because we need to sort all the elements in ascending order so now this one will go into the sorted part and rest of the elements will be still in the unsorted part so the call will reach here in the outer for loop will increment i by 1 so i will become 1 so now i will point to this index which is 1 in the first step we are assuming that let's say this is our minimum value among all the elements so we are simply assigning value of i to min moving ahead now as we need to find the minimum element from the unsorted part we need to provide this inner for loop which will start from j equals to i plus 1 so i is pointing to index 1 so j will start with index 2 and the value of j which is 2 is less than 5 so this condition comes out to be true So now we are again we are simply performing this check that whether ten is less than five or not. 
by taking in the value at jth index and the value at min index. So min is pointing to index 1 and j is pointing to index 2. So we are taking these two values and we are comparing that whether 10 is less than 5 or not. So this condition comes out to be false because 10 is not less than 5. We'll increment j by 1. So j becomes 3. So still you can see 3 is less than 5. So this condition comes out to be true. Now we'll compare these two values. We check whether 2 is less than 5 or not. So yes, 2 is less than 5. So this condition comes out to be true. And as this condition comes out to be true and we need to find the minimum element among these elements. So now our min will point to this index because we have found a minimum value. Moving ahead, we'll increment j by 1. So j becomes 4. And 4 is less than 5. So this condition comes out to be true. Now here we check that whether 9 is less than 2 or not. So 9 is not less than 2. So this condition comes out to be false. J becomes 5. So now this condition 5 is not less than 5. So this for loop will terminate. And we have found our minimum element which is 2. So we'll simply swap it with the leftmost element of the unsorted part which is being tracked by the value i. So we are simply swapping 5 with 2 using these 3 steps. So we'll quickly go over these 3 steps. 10th will have value 2 with this statement. We will transfer 5 to this position by assigning the array value at i at index to the array value at min index. So this becomes 5 and at last we'll store the value of temp into the ith index. So this becomes 2. So friends here you can see after we perform this swap now 2 will also become part of the sorted part. With each pass the sorted array is increasing and the unsorted part is decreasing. So now we'll increment i by 1. So i becomes 2. And 2 is less than 4. So this condition comes out to be true. So now we need to find the minimum element among this unsorted part. So we are assuming that whatever the value i is holding currently, it's the minimum value. So we are simply assigning value of i to min. So value of min will become 2. And now we need to compare 10 with rest of the elements. So for that we need to provide this inner for loop. Where j will start from i plus 1 because we need to compare this with other elements. So i is already pointing to this element. So we'll start j by i plus 1. So j becomes 3. Now we'll simply compare these two values. And here we are finding that whether 5 is less than 10 or not. So this condition comes out to be true. So we have found our minimum element after this comparison. So we'll simply update min to this value 3. And we continue with our for loop. We'll increment j by 1 j becomes 4 and 4 is less than 5 so this condition comes out to be true now we simply check whether 9 is less than 5 or not so 9 is not less than 5 so this condition comes out to be false we'll increment j by 1 so j becomes 5 which is out of bounds of this array and here 5 is not less than 5. So this condition comes out to be false and our for loop will terminate. So here you can see we have found our minimum element which is 5. 
now we'll simply swap it with the leftmost element of the unsorted part which is being tracked by value i so we are simply performing this swap where 5 will come to this position and 10 will come to this position so here after we perform swap now 5 is at its correct position and now this will become part of the sorted array will increment i by 1 so i becomes 3 and 3 is also less than 4 so this condition comes out to be true now at the first step we assume that 10 is the minimum value so we simply assign the value of i to min which is 3 so it will point to the third index and now we need to find the minimum element from the unsorted part so only two elements are left so we'll start our inner for loop with j equal to i plus 1 so j will start with 4 4 is less than 5 so this condition comes out to be true and here we'll simply compare that value at j th index which is 9 is less than value at min index which is 10 or not so 9 is less than 10 so this condition comes out to be true and we have found our minimum element among these two elements so min will be updated to 4 by assigning the value of j which is 4 to min will increment j by 1 so j becomes 5 which means that 5 is not less than 5 so this condition comes out to be false and then as we have found our minimum element we'll simply perform a swap with the leftmost element of the unsorted part which is being tracked by i so 9 will come to this position and 10 will come to this position using this temporary variable so first 10 will come here and then whatever the value is stored here which is 9 will come here so after this swap we know that 9 is at its correct position so this will be part of the sorted array so friends here you can see that at the end there were only two elements and as we sorted the second last element the unsorted part was left with one element so this algorithm should not be applied to this element because this is already sorted because this is at its correct position only now so therefore we provided this condition that i should go to less than n minus 1 so here if we increment now i by 1 i becomes 4 so i will come to this point but here you can see 4 is not less than 4 which makes sense because now i is pointing to the last element and if it is the only element left then we are sure that the last element is actually sorted so friends here we saw the demonstration of the selection sort algorithm step by step and once this algorithm gets finished we found all the elements sorted into the ascending order so now let's go to IntelliJ and code this algorithm and test its working. So friends, I hope you have liked this video. And in case you have liked this video, then I would request you to please like, comment, share and subscribe my channel. Thanks, have a nice day. Hello everyone. So in our previous video, we discussed about the selection sort algorithm. And we saw the demonstration of the algorithm step by step using an animation now in this video we'll code the algorithm into this sort method where we simply pass in the array which we want to sort and we'll simply apply the selection sort and test its working in the main method so currently we are given with this array 5 1 2 9 10 and if i run the main method 
so here you will see that we are simply printing the array now using this print array method so 5 1 2 9 10 got printed now let's code the algorithm in this sort method so in the first step what we do is we create an integer variable n which will hold the length of the array because we will use this value of n in the algorithm while we provide the for loops now at the first step we provide a for loop which starts from integer i equal to 0 to a value less than n minus 1 i plus plus so in our previous video we discussed that we are actually dividing the array into two parts the sorted part and the unsorted part so basically this i will keep the track of the sorted and the unsorted part so at the start all the elements are part of the unsorted part so therefore the value of i will be 0 and the value of i will go to less than n minus 1 so here you can see we have this 5 elements so the value of n will be 5 and if we do minus 1 it will be 4 so i will go from 0 to 3 now why this i will go from 0 to 3 is because if we see the indexes it starts from 0 and 3 will come to this point so when we compare these last two elements and we sort them then we know that both the elements will be at its correct position so this algorithm should not go further ahead because if i will come to this point then we know that this is already sorted so we are keeping track of the i till less than n minus 1 and which we already discussed in our previous video in great detail so you can watch that video now inside this for loop as we want to find the minimum element in the unsorted part so what we do is we assume that that min is pointing to index 0 at the start and we are assuming that the first element is the minimum element and after that we need to provide a for loop now this for loop will start with j equals to i plus 1 and this will go till less than n j plus plus so here you can see that we are assuming the value hold by an array at the add index is the minimum value so this is our assumption and in order to find the minimum element among the unsorted part we need to provide this for loop where we will compare all the elements with the value hold by the min index and as the min is pointing to the ith index we are starting this inner for loop with j is i plus 1 and j will go till less than n because we need to compare this minimum value with each and every element of the array so j will go till the last index and inside this for loop will provide a condition as if value at jth index is less than value at min index then we know that we have found one more element which is less than the value at min index so what we do is we simply update the min value to point to j because we have found a new minimum value so now min will point to the jth index and this for loop will go on till all the elements are compared with the min value and after this for loop will terminate we know that we have found our minimum value whose index is being hold by the min integer so after the for loop we'll simply swap this minimum value with the leftmost element of the unsorted part which is being hold by the value i because we already discussed that we divide the array into two parts the sorted part and the unsorted part and i will keep the track of that boundary so at the start i will point to zero which would be the leftmost element of the unsorted part so we'll simply swap this minimum value with the value stored at the ith index 
and we'll use this temporary variable. So we first store the value at minimum index, which would be our minimum value into the temp. And then we will assign the value at add index to value at min index. And at the last, whatever the value stored in temp will assign to add index. So here you can see after we perform this swap, one element reaches to the sorted part. And then we increment the i by one. So i becomes 1 and the rest of the algorithm is repeatedly performed on an array till we get all the elements into the sorted part. So in order to understand the selection sort using an animation you can watch my previous video. So this is the code for the selection sort. Now let's test its working. So after printing the array we will call the sort method. We pass in the array and once this method gets executed we will simply print the array again. If I run the main method. So here you can see initially array was 5, 1, 2, 9, 10. And after we perform the selection sort it became 1, 2, 5, 9, 10. Which is in ascending order. So friends this was all about the selection sort algorithm. I hope you have liked this video. And in case you have liked this video then please like, share, comment and subscribe my channel. Thanks have a nice day. Hello everyone. So in this video we will discuss that how we can merge two sorted arrays in Java. So usually in this problem we are given with two sorted arrays and both the arrays are sorted in ascending order. And our task is to merge these two arrays in such a way that the resultant array is also sorted. So let's go ahead and see that how we can merge two sorted arrays in Java. So before we start, in case if you are new to my channel, then please subscribe to my channel so that you don't miss any update. So here, let's suppose we are given with these two arrays, array 1 and array 2. And here if you see, both these arrays are sorted in ascending order. So array 1 has 4 elements 2, 3, 5, 10 and they are sorted in ascending order and same with array 2 having elements as 4, 6, 11 and 15. Now our task is to merge these two array in such a way that the resultant array is also sorted. So the idea behind this algorithm is we create a resultant array whose length is the length of array 1 plus the length of array 2. So in this case array 1 has length 4 and array 2 has length 4. So our resultant array will have length 8 because we need to merge all the elements of array 1 and array 2 into this result array. So in this algorithm as this both the arrays are sorted in ascending order. What we do is we simply compare the elements of array 1 with array 2 and whichever the element is smaller we simply put it into the result array. So how do we perform this algorithm is we take three pointers. One pointer will start from array 1. Second pointer will start from array 2. And there will be third pointer which will start from our result array. So the three pointers we create is i which will point to the zeroth index of array 1. j which will point to the zeroth index of array 2 and k which will point to the zeroth index of result array. So here as both the arrays are sorted, we simply compare the elements stored at the ith index of array 1 with the elements stored at the jth index of array 2 and whichever of them is smaller, we simply put it into the kth index of result array. So here in first step, we compare 2 with 4 because i and j are pointing to an index having value as 2 and 4. 
so here we see 2 is less than 4 so therefore we simply update this value to kth index of the result array so it would look something like this 2 will come to this position now here as we have filled this value here so we simply increment i by 1 and as we have filled this position we also increment k by 1 so now we'll again compare the value at ith index with the value at jth index of both the arrays so we'll compare now 3 with 4 so here you can see 3 is less than 4 so we simply update the value 3 into this position and as we have used the value 3 we simply increment i by 1 and we have filled this position so we increment k also by 1 so now we will again perform this comparison we compare 5 with 4 so now here you can see 4 is less than 5 so therefore we put this value 4 into this kth index because our task is to merge these two sorted arrays and the result array should also be sorted so therefore we perform this check and whichever is the minimum value we simply put it into the result array so now we have used the value stored at jth index so we will simply increment j by 1 and we have filled this value so we will increment k also by 1 so here you can see wherever we are finding any lowest value in array 1 or in array 2 we are simply incrementing that pointer and why we are not incrementing the other pointer is because that value still needs to be filled inside this array so now as we have incremented j by 1 we will compare 5 and 6 because those values are referred by i and j th index and here we know that 5 is less than 6 so we will simply update 5 value at the k th index and as we have used this value, we will increment i by 1. We have occupied with this position, so we will increment k also by 1. Now we will compare 10 with 6. So here you can see 6 is smaller than 10. So 6 value will be updated here. And as we have used this value 6, we will increment j by 1. And we have filled this position, so we will also increment k by 1. Now we will compare 10 with 11. So here you can see 10 is less than 11. So value 10 will be updated here. We will increment i by 1. So here you can see, now as we are incrementing i by 1, i will be crossing the boundaries of array 1. So now there is no more element left in the array 1 to be compared with the elements in the array 2. It means all the elements of array 1 are filled into the result array and we are only left with the elements of array 2 which are already sorted. So now our task is to simply put these values into its respective positions here because we don't have to compare these values with any other value because these are already sorted in ascending order. So as we incremented i by 1, after filling the value 10 here, we will increment k also by 1. And now we will simply copy the remaining elements of array 2 into this result array using the jth pointer. So the first step we will simply copy 11 here. Then we will increment j by 1 and we will also increment k by 1. And we will simply copy 15 into this kth index will increment j by 1 so j has reached out of these boundaries now for array 2 and we'll also increment k by 1 so k has also reached to its end so which signifies that both these array elements are now part of this result array and as both the arrays were sorted in ascending order you can see the result array is also sorted in ascending order
सो ये दिस इज द आइडिया ऑफ हाउ वी कैन मर्च टू सॉर्टेड एरेज बाय सिंपली यूजिंग थ्री पॉइंटर्स आई जे एन के आई विल ट्रेवर्स एरे वन जे विल ट्रेवर्स एरे टू एंड के विल ट्रेवर्स अवर रिजल्ट एरे वी विल सिंपली कंपेयर द वैल्यूज स्टोर्ड एड आई एथ एंड जे एथ इंडेक्स ऑफ देयर रिस्पेक्टिव एरेज एंड विच एवर द वैल्यू इज स्मॉल विल सिंपली अपडेटेड इन टू द रिजल्ट एरे एट द के एथ इंडेक्स एंड आफ्टर वी अपडेट दिस वैल्यूज विच एवर वैल्यू वी टुक इधर फ्रॉम एरे वन और फ्रॉम एरे टू विल सिंपली इंक्रीमेंट दैट रिस्पेक्टिव पॉइंटर्स एंड एज वी आर फिलिंग अप द पोजिशन इन द रिजल्ट एरे वी विल ऑल्सो इंक्रीमेंट द के एथ पॉइंटर सो फ्रेंड दिस वॉज ऑल अबाउट द डेमोन्स्ट्रेशन ऑफ हाउ वी कैन मर्ज टू सॉर्टेड एरेज एंड क्रिएट अ रिजल्टेंट एरे विच इज ऑल्सो सॉर्टेड इन अवर नेक्स्ट वीडियो वी विल लुक इन टू द एनिमेशन ऑफ द एक्चुअल अल्गोरिथम विच इज इन्वॉल्व इन मर्जिंग दिस टू एरेज सो फ्रेंड इन केस यू फाइंड दिस वीडियो इन्फॉर्मेटिव देन प्लीज लाइक कमेंट शेयर एंड सब्सक्राइब माई चैनल थैंक्स एवर नाइस डे Hello everyone. So in our last video, we discussed about that how we can merge two sorted arrays in Java. We discussed about the idea that how we can merge two sorted arrays. So in this video, we'll see the step by step demonstration of the algorithm. But before we start, in case if you are new to my channel, then please subscribe to my channel so that you never miss an update. So here you can see that this is the algorithm. to merge two sorted arrays array 1 and array 2 into a result array and simply return the result array from this method merge so let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step so initially when we call this merge method we pass in the two sorted arrays array 1 and array 2 and we also pass the length of these two arrays with a variable as n and m so n will correspond to the length of array 1 and value m will correspond to the length of array 2 so when we call merge method here you can see that for this example we are taking two arrays which are sorted in ascending order having length as 3 so let's say we are providing this two sorted arrays having length as 3 and here you can see the elements are sorted in ascending order in both the arrays and now our task is to merge these two arrays into a result array and return that result array from this method so the length of this arrays are denoted by n and m having values as 3 so in the first step as we want to merge these two arrays all the elements should be part of the result array so first we create that array by name result and the length of that array would be n plus m because we need to merge these two sorted arrays and our result array should contain all the elements of both these arrays so after this line gets executed we are provided with this array whose length is 6 moving ahead and as we discussed in our last video the idea behind this algorithm is we create three pointers i j and k will initialize it with zero value now what these pointers are the pointer i will traverse array 1 starting from zeroth index so we have provided value zero pointer j will traverse array 2 starting from zeroth index and pointer k will traverse the result array starting from zeroth index so here you can see the purpose of these three pointers are different so in this algorithm at any instant we are comparing the value stored at ith index with the value stored at jth index and whichever the value is smaller we are simply updating into the result array at kth index so these two pointers are used for comparison and this pointer is used to fill this array and the filling of this array is sequential where we place in elements one by one and will increment k one by one and similarly this comparison also sequential we are finding the minimum value at each iteration and we are simply updating into the result array
so here at the start of this algorithm we are providing this while loop now why we have provided this while loop is because we need to compare the value stored at ith index and value stored at jth index so it simply means i will traverse the array 1 and j will traverse array 2 so in order to perform this traversal and comparison we are providing this while loop and inside this while loop we have provided two conditions one is i should be less than the length of array 1 and j should be less than m which is length of array 2 now why we have provided this condition is because as we are comparing and incrementing values of i and j which you can see here so there can be a chance that j goes out of bounds for array 2 and i goes out of bounds for array 1 so when any of this pointer will exhaust its respective arrays will simply exit this while loop because there are no more elements left to be compared between these two arrays because one array is already exhausted so therefore we have provided these two condition so at the start i is pointing to 0 j is also pointing to 0 i is less than 3 and j is also less than 3 so therefore this while loop condition comes out to be true Now in the while loop we are comparing that whether value at ith index for array 1 is less than value stored at jth index for array 2 or not. So here you can see. So we are comparing 2 with 3. So here you can see 2 is less than 3. So this condition comes out to be true. So therefore if block will be executed. Now as we have found a minimum value among these two values and we want to merge these two sorted arrays into this result array in sorted form then what we do is we simply update the value at ith index for array 1 into this result array at kth index so 2 will come here moving ahead now as we have used this value so we'll increment i by 1 so currently i is 0 i will become 1 And after this if else we will increment k by 1 because we have filled this position here. So now we need to go to next position to get the next element. So k becomes 1. We will check both these two conditions. So 1 is less than 3 and value of j is 0. So 0 is also less than 3. So this both the condition comes out to be true. Now we'll again compare value at ith index for array 1 with value at jth index for array 2. So which is we are comparing 5 with 3. Now here you can see 5 is not less than 3. So therefore this condition comes out to be false. And else part will be executed. So in the else part as 3 is less than 5, we'll simply update value of 3 to the result array. So here we are assigning value stored at jth index for array 2 into result array at kth index. So 3 will come here. Now as we have used the value 3, we will increment j by 1. So j becomes 1. And we are not touching i because we need to still get this value 5 and store it somewhere into the result array. So I will simply point to the same index. We'll increment k by 1 because we have filled its position. So for the new value, we'll simply go to its next index. So k becomes 2. 1 is less than 3. And 1 is less than 3. So this both the condition comes out to be true. We'll compare value at ith index for array 1 with the value at jth index for array 2. So here we are comparing 5 with 4 now. And here you can see 5 is not less than 4. So this condition comes out to be false. And in the else part, as we have found the minimum value is 4, we simply update 4 into the result array by this assignment.
and as we have used this value, we'll increment j by one. And we have filled this position, so we'll increment k by one. K becomes three. Here still i is less than n, and j is also less than m. One is less than three, and two is also less than three. So this both condition comes out to be true. We'll now compare five with nine because those are the values pointed by i and jth index. And here you can see five is less than nine. So therefore, this if block condition comes out to be true. So now it's time to update value five into the result array. And as we have updated value five, we'll increment i by one. So i becomes two, and as we have filled this position, we'll increment k by one. So k becomes four. So still, this while loop condition comes out to be true because i is less than n, and j is also less than m. We compare these two values, seven and nine. We found that seven is less than nine, so therefore this condition comes out to be true. So we simply update value stored at ith index in array one into the value ith kth index for result array. So seven comes here, and then we'll simply increment i by one. So i becomes three. So here you can see now i has crossed the boundary for array one. We have used this position, so we'll increment k by one. K becomes five. So friends, now here you can see that array one is already exhausted. So this condition i is less than n, where three is not less than three. So therefore, this overall condition will come out as false, and this while loop will terminate. So here you can see whenever any of the array gets exhausted, we'll simply break from this while loop, and then our execution point will reach here, where we are encountering two while loops. So friends, here you can see that there can be a chance that array one gets exhausted first, or array two gets exhausted first. So when this while loop will terminate, we are not sure that which array gets exhausted first. So therefore, we have provided these two while loops. So here, let's say for example, array two gets exhausted first. So if array two gets exhausted first, there can be leftover elements in array one. Which needs to go into the result array, so we are providing this while loop, where we are simply traversing i to complete the array one, get those elements from array one, and simply fill it in the result array. Because as both the arrays are sorted, we are simply copying the leftover elements from the respective array into the result array. So this while loop is when array two will get exhausted, and this while loop is when Array one will get exhausted. So currently, for this example, you can see array one got exhausted. So this while loop will not get executed because the condition here is i should be less than n. So three is not less than three. So therefore, this while loop won't get chance to execute because because array one is already traversed completely, and we know that there are leftover elements in array two. Because j is less than m, two is less than three. So whatever elements are left over in array two will simply get copied into the result array, because those elements are already sorted. So we'll simply store value nine into the result array by this assignment. And after doing this assignment, here for this small example, you can see that there was only one element. So we simply Updated one element here, but let's say if there are many elements, and as this arrays are sorted, so we can simply copy those leftover elements directly into the result array, because there are no elements left for array two to get compared with array one, because array one is already exhausted. And same thing goes when array two gets exhausted, and there are leftover elements in array one. So these two for loops are important because they simply copy the leftover elements. 
from their respective arrays to the result array and there can be multiple elements which are left over so therefore we are providing this while loop so at the last step of this while loop we are incrementing j by 1 and k by 1 because we have migrated value 9 into result array so j will now get incremented by 1 j becomes 3 which means now j has crossed the boundary of array 2 and will also increment k by 1 so k becomes 6 so which means k has traversed the result array completely by filling out each and every position so now we'll again compare whether j is less than m or not so here you can see 3 is not less than 3 so therefore this condition comes out to be false which signifies that we have completely migrated all the elements of array 2 to result array so friends finally here you can see that we have merged these two sorted arrays into a result array which is also sorted so finally we'll return result from this algorithm so friends in this video we discussed the algorithm that how we can merge two sorted arrays so in case if you find this information useful then please like comment share and subscribe my channel thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in our previous video we discussed step by step demonstration of how we can merge two sorted arrays in this video we'll actually code the algorithm and we'll test its working but before we start in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel so that you never miss an update so here i have created one class as merge sorted arrays which is having a method as print array which takes in an array and print its elements on the console so we have discussed this print array method in our previous videos so i will simply use this print array method to demonstrate how we can merge two sorted arrays in java so here you can see i will be creating one method as public whose return type would be an integer array because we want to merge two arrays which are sorted and we want to return back the merge sorted array having elements of array 1 and array 2 so the method name i will be giving as merge this method will take four things one would be the array 1 other would be array 2 the length of array 1 and length of array 2 which is being denoted by n and m so here you can see that array 1 and array 2 are already sorted arrays and we want to merge them together so at the first step what we do is as we want to merge them we will simply merge them in the result array so we will create a result array now the size of this array would be n plus m because you want to accommodate the elements of array 1 and elements of array 2 into the result array so the idea behind this algorithm is we create three pointers i which will start from 0 so this pointer will traverse array 1 from start to finish we will create one more pointer which will start from 0 and it will traverse array 2 and we will create one more pointer k which will start from 0 and which will traverse result array so here why we have created this three pointer is because pointer i will traverse array 1 elements one by one and j will traverse elements of array 2 one by one and we will simply compare those two values stored at i and jth index and based on our comparison whichever value will be small we will simply store it into the result array at k index and after we store this value whichever value of that particular array we get as a small will simply increment pointer of that array and after filling the result array at k index we will also increment k by 1 so here in order to perform that 
we provide a while loop and inside that while loop we provide two condition one is i should be less than n and j should be less than m so these are nothing but boundary conditions where we are simply checking that whether i is in the boundaries of array 1 and j is in boundaries of array 2 and we have provided this and condition because in this while loop we are comparing the value stored at ith index with the value stored at jth index for their respective arrays and in case any of this array gets exhausted which means that either i will cross over array 1 or j will cross over array 2 we simply break from this while loop so inside this while loop we are providing a condition as if value at ith index of array 1 is less than value at jth index for array 2 so here it signifies if array 1 element at ith index is less than array 2 element at jth index so if this is the condition then after this comparison this value is the smallest value and as we want to merge these two sorted arrays into a result array and that also should be in sorted form so therefore we simply update the smallest value at the kth index which means storing array one element into result and after we store array one element we have occupied the ith position into the result array so we'll increment i so that we can go to its next index and similarly if this condition is false then in the else part we do the opposite of it we store the value at jth index for array 2 into result because here we know that if this condition is false then value stored at jth index for array 2 will be smaller than this value so we are storing that value into the result array and as we have used the value stored at jth index we will simply increment j by 1 so after storing the minimum value among these two values into the result array we have filled the kth position in the result array so we will also increment k by 1 so that k traverses to an unfilled position so that when this while loop will be executed again we are left with a unfilled position so after this while loop gets terminate there can be two possibilities either array 1 got exhausted or array 2 got exhausted if array 2 got exhausted which means that all the elements of array 2 are now part of our result array and whatever leftover elements are there in array 1 we simply copy it into the result array so for that we'll use the while loop we provide the same condition as i should be less than n because we are simply copying the leftover elements of array 1 now so we copy this and we'll increment k also by 1 after filling the position so here this while loop signifies that array 2 got exhausted and similarly we don't know that which array got exhausted in this above while loop so we need to provide the same while loop for the array 2 as well we provide the condition as j should be less than m this will signify that array 1 got exhausted first
will increment j by 1 and we will keep rest as it is so friends here you see that why we have provided this two while loops is because we don't know whether array 1 got exhausted first or array 2 got exhausted first so if array 2 got exhausted first we are simply copying the leftover elements of array 1 into result and if array 1 got exhausted first we are copying the leftover elements of array 2 into the result using this while loop and why we are simply copying these elements from the respective arrays because those elements are already sorted and we don't have to compare it with any other elements whatever the comparison we need to do we have done it in this while loop so at the end we'll simply return the result array so friend this is the code for merging two sorted arrays now let's test it's working in the main method so here I will be creating two arrays array 1 let's say I provide the value as 0 comma 1 comma 8 comma 10 these four values and here you can see these are sorted in ascending order and similarly I create array 2 let's say I provide value as 2 4 11 15 and let's say 20 so these values are also sorted in ascending order now let's print both this array on the console if I run the code now so here you can see it is simply printing both the arrays on the console Now we will call our merge method. We pass in array 1, array 2, length of array 1, which is denoted by n, and length of array 2, which is denoted by m. So this method will return as the result array. So we'll store it into the result variable and finally we'll print the result array. If I run the code now, so friends here you can see that it returned 0, 1, 2, 4, 8, 10, 11, 15, 20. It merged these two sorted arrays and returned as the result array which is also in sorted form so friends this was all about the code and working of the algorithm now why this algorithm is important because the similar approach is usually used when we actually perform the merge sort which we will be looking into our upcoming lectures so there we will simply use this idea and will perform the sorting of array using merge sort so friends, if you find this information useful, then please like, comment and share this video. And in case if you are new to my channel, then please subscribe to my channel so that you don't miss any new update. Thanks. Have a nice day. Hello everyone. So in this video, we will be looking into a sorting technique. We call it merge sort. So before we start. In case if you are new to my channel, then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update. So what is merge sort? So here you can see that merge sort is a divide and conquer algorithm. So divide and conquer algorithm is very widely used algorithm to solve the problem. Now as per the Wikipedia, here you can see divide and conquer recursively breaks down a problem into two or more sub problems of the same or related type until these becomes simple enough to be solved directly. So when we divide a complex problem into two or more smaller sub problems and we keep on doing it till those smaller problems are easily solved. 
and after breaking this complex problem into smaller sub problems what we do is we solve those smaller sub problems we take their solutions and then combine them to give a solution to the original problem so basically we divide a large problem into various smaller sub problems and we keep on doing it till those sub problems are simple enough to solve and once we solve them we have their solutions so what we do is we take their solution and we combine them so that we get the solution to our original problem so at this step when we are combining the solution of smaller sub problems and getting the solution to our original problem is actually the conquer part of it so let's see how this divide and conquer algorithm fits into mars sort so when we are given an array and we want to sort them what we do is we first apply the divide part now in this step what we do is we take the middle point of the array and divide the array into two halves and once we divide the array into two halves now the algorithm is carried out recursively on these two halves and it goes on till there are no more halves of arrays to divide so we keep on dividing it till there is only one single element left which is not further divided so after this divide step ends what we do is we then conquer and how we conquer is in this step from the bottom we take those smaller half arrays we sort them and merge the divided arrays and get the sorted array so we'll see this divide and conquer with an example to make it more clear so for timing we divide an array into two halves and we keep on dividing them into two halves till there is only single elements are left and those are not pretty much divided so when we pick those single elements those are already sorted so we simply merge them and get the sorted array and we keep on doing this till the complete array is sorted so let's see these two steps with an example so first we will see the divide part so now let's say we are given with this array and we want to sort it in ascending order so in the divide part what we do is here we can see that there are seven elements 2 10 5 3 6 4 and 11 now we simply evaluate the mid position so here is 3 so how we evaluate this mid position is we'll see later but here you can see that as there are seven elements from 0 to 3 we break it down into one array and from 4 to 6 we break it down into other array so here you can see now this was our original problem to solve we break it down into two smaller sub problems and after breaking it down into two smaller sub problems we do it recursively again into this smaller sub parts so here what we do is after breaking it down into two parts we take this part and we further break it down into two parts so this algorithm is pretty much recursive in nature and now as this algorithm is recursive we take this smaller half and we break it down into two halves so here you can see that after breaking this Zero and one, we are left with single single element two and ten. So here algorithm decides that okay, we can't break two and ten further down. So what we do is the divide part is done for this piece. So then we conquer. So in merge sort, a single element is already sorted. And in the conquer step, this is the smallest solution we have. That let's say if the array had only one element. it would have been sorted so now in the conquer part we actually merge them so in one of our previous videos we have discussed that how we can merge two sorted arrays so this is the first sorted array and this is the second sorted array so in the conquer step we merge them and we merge them in such a way that we compare their respective elements one by one and we try to merge them so here we compare 2 with 10 and we simply merge them to get the sorted array so after merging those two sorted arrays we are left with 
a larger sorted array so here 2 and 10 are actually sorted now this conquer is done for this particular step the algorithm then tries to break this part because th as this is a recursive algorithm it breaks it like this first it breaks in 4 then 2 then 1 1 and after merging the smaller subunits it takes the next unit and break it down into smaller pieces so it breaks 5 and 3 like this so 5 and 3 cannot be broken down further so now it conquers it so here it simply compares 5 and 3 and we get 3 and 5 because 3 is smaller so 3 comes here and 5 comes here so here you can see that this is the first sorted array and this is the second sorted array and now we simply merge these two parts because these are solved problems of our smaller sub problems so in the conquer step we actually merge them so after merging these two sorted arrays it looks something like this so 2 is compared with 3 it comes here then 10 is compared with 3 so 3 is smaller so 3 comes here then 5 is compared with 10 5 is smaller so 5 comes here and then 10 goes here and this step is done so now algorithm will pick this part and try to break it down using the divide step so it will break it down like this 6 and 4 and 11 because there are 3 elements and here it will now first pick this part so it will break 6 and 4 like this and then it will merge 6 and 4 so which will become 4 and 6 so the only thing to keep in mind is in the conquer step of merge sort what we are doing is we are merging two sorted arrays and the result is a large sorted array so here you can see that this was sorted array this was sorted array we merged it in such a way that we got a larger sorted array similarly with this we got larger sorted array and as this part was actually sorted and this part was also sorted so we merged these two sorted arrays as well so we got this sorted array and similarly we did here so after sorting 4 and 6 as 11 is the only element left so it goes like this it comes here and then we have two sorted arrays we try to merge it so we get 4 6 11 and now here you can see the algorithm sees that okay we have one sorted array we have another sorted array now we can simply merge these two pieces together like this 2 3 4 5 6 10 11 so here you can see that the final array which got sorted is actually our original problem which we wanted to sort so friends here i will just go back so we'll go through this one more time we saw that this was the problem given to us and we wanted to sort it using merge sort so here we evaluated the midpoint of the array and we break it down into two smaller sub problems recursively so recursively it how it goes is it breaks it down like this and then recursively it goes to here it break it down like this and then it again recursively go here then it break it down 2 and 10 and it sees that okay it can't be further broken down so it tries to merge it so why it tries to merge it because this is the sorted array having only single element and the single elements are already sorted so it treats it as two smaller sub arrays which are sorted and it tries to merge it in the conquer step so it merge it like this 2 and 10 so one thing is important you watch my previous video where we actually saw the algorithm that how we can merge two sorted arrays and the resultant array is also sorted so we will get this sorted array so this recursion ends here it then goes to this side it takes 5 and 3 breaks it down like this it merges 5 and 3 which gives 3 and 5 
so this part is done so once this part is done it sees that okay i have got one larger array here and here and both are sorted so it tries to merge them so we'll get 2 3 5 10 and after doing this part completely it then goes recursively to this part it breaks 6 4 11 into two parts 6 and 4 on one side and 11 on other side it recursively sees that okay i can break this down further it breaks it down 6 and 4 like this it merges them it becomes 4 and 6 and then it goes to this side it sees that okay 11 is only the single element left so it comes here and it sees that okay i have got two sorted errors like this so in the conquer step i will simply merge them so when we'll merge them we'll get 4 6 11 and as we have done this step the algorithm sees that okay this is the one sorted array this is the other it simply merge both of these arrays like this so friend this is the basic idea behind divide and conquer algorithm when we are dealing with merge sort in our upcoming videos we will see all these steps in greater detail we will see the demonstration of the algorithm step by step so that this idea becomes more clear to you that how it is actually done I hope you must have liked this video. In case if you are new to my channel, then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update. Thanks, have a nice day. So friends, before going into the actual algorithm of merge sort, so before we start, in case if you are new to my channel, then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update. We saw that in divide step. We saw that we break the array into two parts or into two sub problems and that we do recursively. So at a high level, I will simply show you the code. So this code we will be discussing in a greater detail with an animation in our upcoming video. But just for understanding that how it works. So when we break the array into two parts, we are not actually breaking the array from here. Let's say from 0 to 3, it goes like this and from 4 to 6, it goes like this. We are breaking it based on the three pointers, let's say low, high and mid. So usually array remains the same and we have something like, let's say low points here, mid points here and high points here. So from low to mid, we consider that this is the sub problem and from mid plus one to high we consider it as a different problem but the array structure remains the same it's only the pointers which decides which is the left part and which is the right part so here you can see in the sort method this method gets called two times recursively so one is for going into left side and one is going to the right side after breaking it based on the mid element and as this sort is recursive in nature so here you can see usually at the start low points to zero and high points to the last index and let's say if we calculate mid so here it will be zero plus six minus zero by two which will give us three so mid comes out to be 3. So for example, let's say we calculate mid as 3. So this division here is done based on calling of these two sorts. So what we do is, so when we call this sort, we pass the ranges from low to mid. So low to mid. So it looks like that we are doing like this. And for the right sub array, it says from mid plus 1 to high. So this is the mid plus one to high. So it looks like this, but the array remains like this only. It's actually the logical division based on low, mid and high pointer. And this we do recursively. So when we call this, we actually get this and it again does the same thing again. 
and here you can see it again recursively calls this so this is low and this is mid and this is mid plus one and this is high so it goes on like this till we can't divide them further so this condition low less than high help us in preventing that so here if you see low and high point to the same so we simply return from this and once we return from this it goes here then this sort is called like this and here similarly this condition help us to make it come back so after these two steps end we actually merge the two sorted arrays so these are the sorted arrays and you can watch my previous tutorial that how we can actually merge the two sorted arrays but in merge sort we actually take the help of a temporary array which help us in merging the two sorted arrays so this we will discuss in a greater detail in our upcoming videos but here we will simply see a high level view of merge how it is actually done so here you can see that we saw that at the last step we take this sorted array we take this sorted array this is the left array and this is the right array and we usually merge it so we do something like this we compare the elements in the respective arrays and we fill out the array like this and this is our answer that we get a sorted array so this is done via merge method now let's see how we can take the help of temporary array and merge it so this is the same thing which we saw in our previous slide that so this is the left part and this is the right part so these are distinguished based on these colors so usually how we merge it we create a temporary array of the equal length and then we first copy all these elements like this so here it looks something like this so after we copy every element like this now what we do is this array is our original array we have took every element in the temporary array now we create the pointers which traverse to left part and the right part and based on our comparison the original array is actually filled so i'll just remove this so here we take i for this left part and j for this right part and how we actually fill is in the original array we start from here let's say k we compare 2 and 4 denoted by i and j so 2 is less than 4 so we know that 2 will take this position like this and we are done with this part so we increment i and we also increment k because we are done with this filling now we compare 3 with 4 and 3 takes this place we are done with this element so we increment i we don't increment j because these values are not filled up and you can watch my previous video where we actually saw that how we can merge two sorted arrays so this is the first sorted array this is the second sorted array and the concept remains the same when we do the merge sort so after filling 3 we increment k and then we again compare 5 and 4 so 4 is smaller so 4 takes this place so we are done with this element so we increment j and here similarly we do the filling so in the next iteration 5 is less than 6 so 5 comes here we increment i we increment k 6 is smaller than 10 so 6 comes here we increment j then 10 comes here and here you can see after filling 
this element also gets filled so now there are no more element left in the left part and here you can see that we have only left with 11 so this goes out of the boundary and whatever the values are left in the right part we simply put it here because they are already sorted so anything which comes after 11 will be let's say 12 14 xyz but it will be greater than 11 so they will come directly like this so we simply copy the elements in the leftover part of the original array so it goes like this so this is the merge at a high level using the temporary array so friend there are two cases which we need to see so the case one is when the left array is exhausted so here you can see after filling 2, 3, 5 into the respective position and even 10 here. Now here left array is exhausted. So we don't touch this now because everything is filled up here. And here you can see as we copied all the elements like this in the original array. If you see 6, 7 and 8, whatever the values are here, those were actually sorted. And when we actually copied into the temporary array, it came it like this only. So here you can see, we don't push it back like this. Because the right array values are already present in the original array in the same order 11, 12, 17. So we do nothing here. Once the left array is sorted, we do nothing because right array is already having the elements here which are already sorted. Now case 2 comes when right array is exhausted. So here you can see 4, 5, 6, 10, 11. These are all exhausted till this point. So after putting 11, J goes out of this array and K comes to this part because we need to fill two more elements and our right array is exhausted. So here you can see that when the right array is exhausted, we have to do something to push left array elements into this 7 and 8 position. So how we do that, we provide a small code which is like this. So here you can assume that mid is this point and I will go till mid and we simply copy the leftover elements into the respective places using the I in kth index. So here you can see in the original array at kth index we are assigning temp of I. So this is the temp and this is the I. So 12 will go to array of k like this and then we increment both i and k so k will go here and i will go here and this while loop will continue and we'll simply put 15 at this position by this assignment so after that this while loop will terminate so friends here we need to keep these two cases in mind that if left array is exhausted we do nothing because when we copied the element into temporary array when the left array got exhausted the right array leftover elements were already present in the original array and dead to in sorted form but in case 2 if right array is exhausted so here if this array is already exhausted and all these elements are present here and there are elements left over in the left part so we need to provide some additional code like this to put it into the respective places so we will see this algorithm in much greater detail in our upcoming video because that is very complex algorithm so I just demonstrated at a high level that how it looks so when we will discuss that algorithm we will see all the details of sort method 
मर्ज मेथड एंड हाउ दिस शॉर्ट मेथड रिकर्सिवली कॉल्स इट सेल्फ एंड बेसिकली डिवाइड द एरे इन टू टू हाफ एंड लेटर वेन द टू हाफ आर नो लॉन्गर डिवाइडेड फर्दर देन हाउ वी एक्चुअली मर्ज देन सो फ्रेंड्स आई होप टिल दिस पॉइंट यू मस्ट हैव गॉट ए हाई लेवल आइडिया ऑफ हाउ मर्ज शॉर्ट वर्क इन अवर अपकमिंग वीडियो वी विल सी अ डिटेल्ड एनिमेशन ऑफ मर्ज शॉर्ट अलगोरिथम विच विल मेक दिस आइडिया मोर क्लियर टू यू यू कैन वॉच दिस वीडियो टू टू थ्री टाइम्स सो दैट यू कैन गेट एन आइडिया of the merge sort at high level i hope you must have liked this video and in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in our previous video we saw at a high level that how merge sort works in java so in this video we will be looking into the algorithm and we will also see the step by step animation of the algorithm so before we start in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so here if you see at a high level we are going to sort this array having five elements so you just need to keep that at a high level how this algorithm works so that when we demonstrate actual algorithm you can relate to it so here we see the array as five elements so we divide the array into two parts based on the mid index so we evaluate the mid index let's say here it comes as 2 so how we break it we usually consider this as low this would be mid and this would be high so low to mid is the left sub array mid plus 1 to high is the right sub array so here you can see that we break it down logically using this three pointers like this low to mid is one side and mid plus 1 to high on the other side so now after dividing the array into two parts we recursively break the left part further down so here this will be our low this will be mid and this will be high so we break it down into these two parts low to mid in the left and mid plus 1 to high on the right part and this algorithm goes recursively and we divide now these two elements so it will be divided something like this 9 5 and here we see we can't further divide 9 and 5 because these are the single elements so these are nothing but our algorithm's base case that we can't divide them further so here you can see when the division ends for this part now is the time to conquer it so here this left sub array is actually sorted because it has only one element and the right is also sorted so now we have two sorted arrays and we try to merge them and we merge them in such a way that the resultant array is also sorted so we simply do the comparison and we come up with the 5 and 9 so this is the merge step so after merging the left side now we go to the right side so we pick 2 2 can't be divided further down so then here you can see we have left sub array and right sub array both are sorted so we try to merge them so after merging it becomes 2 5 and 9 and after doing this part as this is the recursive algorithm we first go to the left and then we go to the right so here you can see for this point we have completed all the left side so now we go and perform the same steps on the right side we break it down into two parts then we go to the left and then we go to right so when we go to right we can't further break it down so here the single element is already sorted we try to break the right side we find that it has only one element so we can't divide them further down so what we do is we try to merge them so when we merge them 
it becomes 3, 4. And here you can see, now we have this 2 sub array which are sorted. So we try to merge them. So 2, 5, 9 and 3, 4. We apply the logic of merging of 2 sorted arrays. And at the end, we will get 2, 3, 4, 5, 9. So just keep in mind that we will perform these steps when we will demonstrate the actual algorithm so that you can relate that how at high level this algorithm works. So here you can see that this is the merge sort algorithm where we have this sort method and this is the array which we want to sort. In our previous video, we also saw that how we can use this temporary array to merge two sorted arrays into the original array. So here when we'll call this method. So let's suppose we want to sort this array having five elements 9, 5, 2, 4, 3. So here this temp array is actually of equal length of our original array. And at the start it mostly contains the default value which is 0. So for timing I have just made it empty. And here you can see that we want to sort this complete array from 0 to 4th index. So we provide low and a high value. So usually at the start low is 0 and high is array dot length minus 1. So this array is of length 5 and if we do minus 1 we get the last index. So low will point to the 0th index and high will point to the 4th index. And here you can see that as it is a recursive algorithm, this sort method internally calls itself again with some different values. So we need to keep the track of the sort method here in the call stack. So we need to keep the track of these four things. One is the line number. So let's say if we are leaving this sort method and calling this sort. So we keep the track of the line number because because when this sort method will end, we need to return back to this method. So this line number will help us that where we actually left and which sort method we left. So we keep the track of the line number here. And three fields, low, mid and high. So these three fields are very important because they help us in dividing the array. And at the end, they also help us in merging the array to make the array in sorted form. So here at the start, there will be one sort method. So here we saw that low is 0 and high is 4. So friends here low should be less than high. So this is nothing but our base case because as we are calling this algorithm recursively, we need to provide a base case so that we come out of the recursion. So in the simple terms, let's say if we have this array 5, 3 and using this two sort method, if we break it down like this 5 and 3. So here you can see at this moment of time, low and high will point to the same index. So when we will call this sort recursively on this element, you will find that low is actually equal to high. So therefore we can't divide this array further. So we actually return and similarly with 3, we return and once we return, then we know that 5 and 3 are two left and right array. So we simply call the merge method and merge them. And this we do recursively for each and every array which we have divided. So we'll see later. So for timing, this is the base case. So currently low is 0 and high is 4. So this condition comes out to be true. In our previous video, we saw that merge sort is divide and conquer algorithm. So this division goes on till our base case is reached 
and once we encounter the base cases then we try to conquer and by conquer we mean we try to sort two sorted arrays which we also discussed in our previous video so this merge method help us in doing that so here we need to divide this sum now in two parts and how we can do that so we try to figure out the mid element and how we can figure out the mid element is by using this formula so here we do low plus high minus low by 2 so here low is 0 plus high is 4 minus 0 by 2 which will give us value as 2 it means this index so usually when you see the merge sort code you will find that this is somewhat different here we do something like low plus high by 2 so basically in the textbooks most of the time you find this low plus high divided by 2 which give us the mid element so why we actually do this here and not this is because here you can see this low and high are basically integer values so usually they have a particular range and if we cross that particular range we actually get the garbage values so if we do low plus high like this so in most of the cases this works but if low value and high values are at the very end of the integer value and if we do sum of it we will actually get some garbage value so therefore if our array is very huge this condition give us the garbage values so we try to avoid this and we use low plus high minus low by 2 because if we do high minus low we will come back into the integer range only so basically this we use to avoid the overflow of integer value so now here you can see that we have calculated mid as 2 so mid becomes 2 here you can see mid is pointing to index 2 so now what it suggest is from low to mid this would be our left part and from mid plus 1 to high this would be our right part so now we are breaking this array into two parts using this three variables which are low mid and high so we are not actually breaking the complete array we are simply dividing the array based on these three values so from low to mid this is our left part from mid plus 1 to high this is our right part and we know that we have to call this algorithm recursively because we need to still break it down further till they are not further divided so here you can see after calculating the mid we are now going into the left side of it to divide it further so we will divide this three elements further so here you can see that we are going from low to mid and as we are leaving this sort method at line number 4 so first we will update the line number here and then we will call the sort method so this sort method will be called so here you can see we pass mid as 2 so this mid for this sort method became high so now there will be one more method on the call stack which is high as 2 because we have called this sort method from 0 to 2 because now we need to further break it down this left array so initially there was complete array now we are trying to break this left array further down so high as 2 and here for this sort method high will come to this point low is less than high we again calculate the midpoint so here midpoint would be 0 plus 2 minus 0 by 2 which is 1 so mid becomes 
we update the mid here it looks something like this so now what it suggests is this boundary again divides the array into two parts so from low to mid we have left and mid plus 1 to high we have right so now again recursively we try to break the left part from low to mid so here we are again leaving this method at line number 4 so we'll update the line number 4 here and here mid is 1 so for the next sort method this mid becomes the high so now there will be one more method on the call stack with high as 1 and for this sort method high will come to this position so low is less than high now we again compute the mid element so here 0 plus 1 minus 0 by 2 which will give us 0 so now mid becomes 0 we update it here so mid points to 0 I'll just remove this so now we have calculated the mid it means we again have one boundary from low to mid which is the one element and mid plus one to high which is the other element so here you can see that now we are again calling sort because currently our array is of two elements and we can still further break it down to one one element from low to mid which is the zero and mid plus one to high which is one to one so we are leaving this sort method at line number 4 so this mid is 0 so here you can see low is 0 and high becomes 0 because we have called this sort method with mid value is 0 and this mid value for this sort method becomes our new high so we'll simply point high to 0 as high is 0 so friends here you can see that now we have reached our base case because we can't divide this single element further so at the start we had this full complete array then we had this small array and then we had this small array and now we are actually having this array so we can't divide 9 further down so it means we have reached our base case and we have to return from here so as you want to return from this sort method the call will reach to this sort method and we need to begin from line number 4 again so we'll see how so this execution point reached here and we know that we had left its previous sort method at line number 4 so we will start from there and when we had left this sort method low mid and high pointed to 0 0 and 1 so we again provide them their own values high becomes 1 mid becomes 0 so it was something like this when we left so now we move ahead so here we are done breaking this left part now this two sort method actually help us in getting the left part of the array and right part of the array and then we merge both of them here to make a sorted array so usually this left and right part are also sorted which we will see later and in the merge method we are actually merging two sorted arrays so we'll see how so now we need to break 5 or mid plus 1 to high further down so we need to leave this sort method now and we need to call this sort again and we are leaving at line number 5 
so we update line number 5 and there will be one more method on the call stack with values as low will be 1 and high will be 1 because when we had left this sort method mid was pointing to 0 and when we called this sort again we provided mid plus 1 so it means our new low becomes 1 and high remains the same so it looks something like this for this sort method that low is pointing to 1 and high is pointing to 1 like this and here you can see we can't divide phi further down so this is our base case so now we have to return from this method and once we return from this method the execution point will reach here and that method will be removed from the call stack so we had left at line number 5 so we start from there and when we left this sort method low pointed to 0 mid pointed to 0 and high pointed to 1 so we provide them their own values like this so we move ahead so friends here you can see that in this algorithm we are actually recursively going down and down and we are dividing the array into two parts so at the end we are only left with single single elements which cannot be divided further which are actually encountering our base case so after this two sort method now it's the time to merge both left part which we got from this sort and the right part which we got from this sort so here you can see 9 and 5 you can think of it a small array having only one element and when array is only one element that array is considered as sorted because there is only one element so now this merge method will take this left part and the right part because they have only single single element and compare these two elements in such a way that both these elements become sorted so that we will see in the merge method so we are leaving this sort method at line number 6 now so we will update line number 6 here and here we have this merge method we pass the array the temporary array low mid and high so because we require all these three values to actually come to know that from low to mid we have left part mid plus one to high we have the right part so these are the three values so in our previous video we saw that how we are actually doing the merge first we are actually copying all the elements from the original array to temporary array and how we are copying it we are only copying that much part which we want to merge so from low to high so here low is 0 and high is 1 it means we are only copying this and this element so it looks something like this we will traverse this for loop quickly so 9 comes here and 5 comes here and this for loop ends so now we have copied the elements like this here and we will now merge these two sorted arrays which is having only single elements left and right so here we actually take three pointers one will point to the left sub array so here i will point to the left sub array j will point to the right sub array because we know that it is starting from mid plus one and k will help us in merging these two sorted arrays back into the original array so we'll see now so i is zero it is pointing to this left sub array so you can think that this array is like this left and right 
J is one, so J is pointing to the right sub array, and K is zero, so K will basically start from low because we are merging these two sorted arrays based on this range. So when we copied this element from any particular range, we need to put it back into that range only. So we are starting from k equals to whatever the value low has. So currently it is pointing to the zeroth index. So here in our previous videos we actually discussed that how we can merge two sorted arrays. So the idea behind this algorithm or this merge method is pretty much the same. Here I will go till it is less than equal to mid. So I will traverse the left part. And J will traverse the right part. So these are the last indexes of these two small arrays. So currently both the condition comes out to be true because zero is less than equal to mid, and J is less than equal to high. So here you can see we have two small arrays of single single element, which are inherently sorted and now we need to merge it in such a way that final array also is sorted so how we do that is we are taking temp value with i index and temp value with j index which is 9 and 5 and we are checking whether 9 is less than 5 or not so 9 is not less than 5 so this condition comes out to be false and the else part will be executed so it means at this position among these two values, whichever is the smaller, will place it there. So currently temp value at jth index is smaller, which is 5. So 5 goes to the kth index of original array. So it goes like this. And here we have placed 5 at its correct position. So we simply increment j. So j becomes 2. But we know that Currently there was only one element, but there could be a possibility that we are trying to merge a very huge array which is equally among the left and the right part, but currently we have only this one element. And as we have filled this position, we will increment k, so k becomes 1. Now here you can see this condition comes out to be false because j has crossed the limits of high as j value is 2 and 2 is greater than 1 so this while loop will terminate and here you can see once the while loop gets terminate we have only placed 5 here we need to place 9 at its correct position so we are providing this small loop and we also discussed in our previous video that once the right array is exhausted we need to provide this small while loop so that all the elements of the left sub array are directly copied back. So they are copied back with this condition which was similar to here. That i should be less than or equal to mid. So currently i is less than or equal to mid. And using this while loop we are simply copying back the element from the ith index to the kth index. So 9 goes here and after placing 9 to correct position we have used this 9 so we will increment i, i becomes 1, we have filled this position so we will increment k also, k becomes 2 and here you can see that we have merged this left and right sub array. So here now this condition comes out to be false. So here you can see after this merge method ends, we sorted left and right. Both were two sorted arrays and we merged them. So we got the result array of two elements which are now sorted. So now we'll leave this method and we'll go back to the 
sort method where we actually left so the point will reach here back we had left at line number 6 which was this part so now here you can see so when we had left low mid and high pointed to 0 0 1 based on the values we kept here so it was something like this so here you can see now this sort method will end because there are no more lines to execute and also you will find it after this merge method ends in the original array we have 5 and 9 actually sorted into the range of low to high so this method will end now and once this method will end it will reach to this point because we had left this sort at line number 4 so we again start execution from line number 4 we provide the respective values to low mid and high So when we had left this sort, this was our condition. So now we move ahead with our execution. So here you can see this sort method actually sorted the left part. So here you can see if this is the line, this array which is our left is sorted now so now we try to go to the right part using this sort method so we provide mid plus 1 and high so mid plus 1 is the range for the right part and it goes till high so now we'll again leave this method at line number 5 so this sort method will be called again with low as mid plus 1 so when we will leave this method mid was pointing to 1 so in the call stack there will be sort method where low will be now 2 which is like this here and high will point to 2 because the high remains at its own position mid was 1 previous to it so for this method it became mid plus 1 so mid plus 1 is 2 and this 2 became our low for this sort method so it means now we are going to the right side recursively to divide that array further down so here you can see we only have this one element so we have encountered our base case so we return from here we reach here we had left at line number 5 so we start from line number 5 and now here you can see we provide these values to their respective variables low was 0 mid was 1 which is at index 1 and this was our line which divided the left and right so this is the left and this is the right so here you can see when we had called merge method previous to that we actually merged two small arrays having single element 5 and 9 and whatever was the result that was sorted then we went to the right and we found it that the right part has only one element so it is already sorted so now this merge method will take a bigger sorted array and will try to merge with the right sub array so this merge method will be called this is our temporary array high is 2 mid is 1 and low is 0 so from low to mid so from low to mid this is the left part which is sorted and from mid plus 1 to high this is our right part now we are actually merging a slighter bigger array so we'll go over this merge method quickly we copy the elements from the original array to the temporary array from low to high 
so 592 will be copied to temp at the respective positions so we'll go over this for loop quickly phi comes here nine comes here two comes here and this for loop will end so friends here you can see that now we have a left part and the right part which are sorted and we need to merge these two sorted arrays and after merging it we need to transfer it back to the original array so this is the boundary for left and this single element is in the right so it's very much similar to what we discussed previous to it i will be traversing the left part and j will be traversing the right part so j will start from mid plus 1 mid plus 1 is 2 and i will start from 0 like this and k will start from the low which is 0 so now we'll again merge these two sorted arrays based on this while loop provided here so i is less than mid and j is less than equal to high so both the condition comes out to be true now we compare the element at ith index with the jth index which is 5 and 2 so 5 is not less than 2 so this condition comes out to be false and into the original array we first place the smallest element which is temp of j so temp of j is 2 so 2 goes here and after using this we increment j so j points to 3 and after filling this position we increment k now here you can see that the right array is exhausted because j value is 3 and 3 is greater than 2 so this condition comes out to be false so here you can see that we actually placed all the elements of the right sub array into the original array but the left sorted array still remains and as it is already sorted we will simply copy it back to the respective kth position using this while loop so i is less than equal to mid we copy 5 to the kth index which is 1 so 5 comes here then we will increment both the pointers because we have filled this position and we have used this element so i becomes 1 and k comes to second index i is less than equal to mid we copy 9 to index 2 we fill this position so k comes here and as we have used this position so i comes here so now this while loop will terminate because value of i is 2 2 is greater than 1 so this condition comes out to be false so friends here you can see now slowly we are merging the arrays and we are actually getting a bigger sorted array so it started with single single element then we got two elements 5 and 9 and now we are getting three elements 2 5 9 so we go back to the sort method where we left so here we left at line number 6 where these were the default values for low mid and high and this was the boundary so here you can see now we have sorted the left part and the right part in such a way that now they are completely sorted 
with this much range so this merge method is ended call will reach here so this is the line number where we left this sort method and the respective values were 0 2 and 4 so high was pointing to fourth index mid was pointing to the second index when we actually left at the first sort so now here you can see we have completely sorted the left side of it now we simply go to the right side using this sort method which is going from mid plus 1 so this range is mid plus 1 to high so when we will call this sort method again mid plus 1 becomes our low so here we will first update the line number there will be one more method on the call stack where low will be 3 because mid plus 1 is 2 plus 1 which became our new low for the right part and high is actually 4 only so we are simply placing this into the respective indexes for this sort method low is less than high we calculate the mid now here you can see first we did this for the left part and we keep on breaking it till we got a single element now we are simply doing it for the right part so now low is 3 plus 4 minus 3 by 2 so this will give us value as 3 because 1 by 2 is 0 and 3 plus will give us 3 so this will give us 3 now so here you can see now we have got our two boundaries low to mid is the left part and mid plus 1 to high is the right part so first we will go to the left part and try to divide the array we will update the line number We'll call the sort method with low as 3 and when we had left this sort method mid was actually pointing to 3 so for this sort method here this mid becomes our high so value is 3 so it looks something like this so we have reached our base case and we can't divide 4 further down which is at index 3 so we return back I'll just remove this so we had left at line number 4 so we start execution from here low mid and high pointed to 3 3 and 4 like this so here this 4 cannot be divided further and as this left part has only one element it is inherently sorted and now we go to the right part via this sort method we update the line number and here we are leaving with mid plus 1 which will become our new low so mid plus 1 is 4 so in this sort method low became 4 and high is actually at its own position 4 so it looks something like this this is our base case because low is actually equal to high it means we can't break 3 further down so we return we had left at line number 5 so we start execution from line number 5 and at that moment low mid and high were 3 3 4 so we'll assign those values back to them 3 so here you can see for the right this is single element array which is the left and this is the right and both are sorted so we simply merge them to make it a bigger array which is also sorted 
so we'll call the merge method so this was the condition when we left the sort and came for the merge so it was 3 3 and 4 so here you can see we are not touching now this part because this left part is already sorted so therefore we have provided this low mid and high because now we will copy the elements from the original array to the temporary array from low to high which is from 3 to 4th index so only these two elements will be copied here we will see it quickly 4 will be copied here and 3 will be copied here because we are simply assigning the value at the ith index of the original array to temp array and this for loop will end so now our task is to merge these two sorted arrays this is the left and this is the right via this temp array so i will be traversing the left part j will be traversing from mid plus one which is the right part and k which will start from the low which is the index three because we don't have to touch this part now we have to only sort in this range like this so here i is three j is 4 because j starts from mid plus 1 and k is 3 i will traverse to the left part j will traverse to the right part and k will help us in merging them to the original array so i'll just remove this stuff so here you can see i is less than mid and j is less than equal to high so the while loop will execute we compare the ith index value with the jth index value which is 4 and 3 so 4 is not less than 3 so the else part will be executed it means we take 3 which is temp of j and we put it into the original array at its correct position because we need to sort this two smaller arrays so 3 comes here We have used this element and we have filled this position. So we'll increment j. j becomes 5, which is now out of the boundary for this smaller right array. We'll increment k. k becomes 4. And here you can see the right array is exhausted completely. So we'll break from this while loop. And then we have provided this value because we need to still place the elements of the left sub array back into the original array. And as the left array is already sorted, we simply copy it back to the original array via this assignment. So i is less than or equal to mid. We assign temp of i to kth index of array. 4 comes here. Then we'll increment i and k because we have used this element i becomes 4 and we have filled this position so we are incrementing k also. So this while loop will terminate now because we are done with our task of placing both the elements into their correct position within their range and here you can see initially it was 4 3 and now it is 3 4 which is sorted in this particular range so we go back and we had left at line number 6 so here you can see current status of array is something like this 2 5 9 3 4 so the left part is sorted the right part is sorted and these were the values for low mid and high when we left so now this sort method will end because there are no more execution steps. 
so now call will reach to the previous sort method we had left at line number 5 and at that moment low mid and high were 0 2 and 4 so this is the very starting point where we left the first sort method so this was the condition so now here you can see we have a larger left array and a larger right array and both are actually sorted so 2 5 9 and 3 4 into their respective ranges they are sorted it means we have two sorted arrays and using this merge method we will merge these two sorted arrays in such a way that the resultant array is also sorted so here one thing this step at every point when we called merge method we did merging of two sorted arrays so at the start we had only one one element then we got two elements then it became three like like this and here it became two and now finally we are merging a left array of three elements and right array of two elements so let's see this merge method now we have updated the line number six here so these are the values for low mid and high zero two four and this is our current original array so now here you can see from low to high we copy all the elements to the temporary array because in the merge we actually do the merging based on this ranges here low is 0 and high is 4 it means from 0 index to 4 we will copy every element to the temp array so we will quickly go over this for loop Two comes here, five comes here, nine comes here. So these are simple assignments. So now this for loop will end. So here why we are copying this element into a temporary array because this temporary array is helping us with this actual merge which we are doing here and it is helping us putting the elements into their correct position in the original array. So here the left array is from low to mid so 0 to 2 is the left array so this is the boundary for left and right array and mid plus one to high is the right array so i will traverse the left array and j will traverse the right array which we already discussed in our previous merge method i is zero j is mid plus one which is three and k is zero because we need to merge this element from the low to high so we are starting k with low ij comes here and k comes here and here you can see this is the boundary for left and the right sorted arrays so we'll quickly go over this step because we have already discussed what it does i is less than equal to mid and j is also less than equal to high we compare the ith and jth index value which is 2 and 3 so 2 is less than equal to 3 so this condition comes out to be true so we are simply copying now 2 to kth index because this is the smaller value among these two so it becomes 2 and here we have used this value so we'll increment i i will become 1 
वी हैव फिल्ड दिस पोर्शन सो विल इंक्रीमेंट के वन इज लेस देन टू एंड थ्री इज लेस देन फोर सो बोथ द कंडीशन काउंट्स आउट टू बी ट्रू विल कंपेयर आई एथ एंड जे एथ इंडेक्स वैल्यूज विच इज फाइव एंड थ्री एंड ईयर फाइव इज नॉट लेस देन थ्री सो दिस कंडीशन काउंस आउट टू बी फॉल्स वी पुट द स्मॉलर वैल्यू एट द के एथ इंडेक्स ऑफ द ओरिजिनल एरे बाय दिस असाइनमेंट सो थ्री कम्स ईयर we have used this value so we'll increment j j becomes 4 we have filled this value so we'll increment k both these condition are still true we'll compare 5 and 4 5 is not less than 4 so this condition comes out to be false So we'll simply put the jth value at kth index of the original array. So four comes here. We have used this value, so we'll increment j. J becomes five. We have filled this position, so we'll increment k. So friends, here you can see now this condition is true, but this condition is false because Five is not less than equal to four. It means the right array is exhausted completely. So this while loop will terminate, and once the right array is exhausted, we know that whatever the elements are left in the left array, those are actually sorted in their respective array. So we simply copy them one by one to the original array using this small while loop so i is less than equal to mid we copy temp value at i at index into the original array at k at index so we are simply assigning 5 to this position we have used this value we'll increment i i becomes 2 we have filled this position so we'll increment k and similarly we'll place the last value at its corresponding index so 9 comes here this value is used i becomes 3 this is filled so k becomes 5 so now this while loop will terminate because value of i is 3 and 3 is not less than equal to 2 so this merge method will end and here you can see now finally we have sorted complete array 2 3 4 5 nine so we go back to the method call where we left the sort and we called the merge so execution point will reach here at line number 6 and this values will be pointing to 0 2 4 and friends here you can see the original array is now properly sorted 2 3 4 5 9 and there are no more lines to be executed after that so this sort method will end so all the method in the call stack has ended and we have got our sorted array so friends this was the complex animation of this merge sort which i depicted based on this call stack i hope you must have got some idea of how it works internally so friends i hope you must have liked this video in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in our previous video we saw the demonstration of the merge sort algorithm via an animation step by step so in this video we will actually code the algorithm and will test its working in the main method so before we start in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update 
so here if you see i have created one class as mer sort which is having print array method which we have already discussed that it is used to print the elements of an array on the console so here we will be creating the method as sort and as we discussed in our previous video that this sort method will take the original array one temporary array which will basically help us in sorting the original array we will take the range from low to high so usually at the start low is 0 and high is actually pointing to the last index of the array because we want to sort the complete array now in this method we provide a condition as low should be less than high now this is basically a base case because this sort method is actually recursive in nature we will see later so in this algorithm we are actually dividing the array into two parts the left part and the right part and we will keep on dividing them till the left and the right part contains only single element because they can't be divided further and when low will be equal to high it means we are having only single element so we need to return from this method because we can't divide the array further down so when low is less than high now we will divide the array into two parts so for that we need to figure out the mid index so here we evaluate mid so we use the formula low plus high minus low divided by 2 so here you can see these are nothing but indexes we can use this formula which will evaluate as the mid index so this formula also takes care of the integer overflow condition let's say our array is huge which we have already discussed in our previous video if the array is very small and it fits into the integer size we can also use this formula low plus high divided by 2 because here you can see why we are using this formula is because these are two integer values and if you are doing addition of it let's say if low and high are at any particular value of integer when we do sum of it it crosses the integer limit so therefore we will get some garbage value so therefore on the safe side we do this we do minus of both the ranges so that the overall value is still in the integer range so after evaluating the mid now as this is a recursive algorithm we'll call sort again so we break it down the array into two parts and the range would be for the left it will be low to mid and for the right it will be from mid plus 1 to high so here you can see this is a recursive algorithm and it keeps on dividing till there are only single elements left which can't be broken further down so after getting to that point as single elements we treat them that they are already sorted because there is only one element from there on we try to merge them together and this merging keeps on going till the final array is sorted so in the merge method we pass the array we pass the temporary array we pass low mid and high why we are passing all the three values is because in the merge based on low to mid that will be our left sorted sub array from mid plus 1 to high will be our right sub array which is sorted and we are simply merging two sorted arrays to get a bigger sorted array so we'll code the merge method now so here you can see we have this original array and we have this temporary array we know the range that it goes from low to high 
लो टू मिड इज अवर लेफ्ट सब एरे मिड प्लस वन टू हाई इज अवर राइट सब एरे सो बिफोर मर्जिंग द टू सॉर्टेड एरेज वी कान डायरेक्टली मर्ज दम इन द ओरिजिनल एरे सो इन ऑर्डर टू मर्ज द टू सॉर्टेड एरेज वी टेक द हेल्प ऑफ दिस टेम्प्रोररी एरे वॉट वी डू इज वी प्रोवाइड ए फॉर लू विच स्टार्ट फ्रॉम लो and goes till high index so what we are doing is now we are simply copying the elements of the original array into the temporary array so this is what we discussed in our previous video in greater detail so here we do temp of i array of i now we have got our range from low to high in our temporary array and we also know that From low to mid, we have the left sub array which is sorted. From mid plus one to high, we have a right sub array which is sorted. And now we need to merge these two sorted arrays such that the resultant array is also sorted. So in one of our previous videos, we saw that how we can merge two sorted arrays. So we will apply the same algorithm here. So for more understanding, you can watch that video. So here. we will create now three variables i j and k so here i will traverse left sorted sub array j will traverse right sorted sub array and k will merge both arrays into original array which is this so if i is traversing the left sorted sub array we know that it should start from the low because from low to mid we have the left part and j should start from mid plus 1 because we know that the right sorted sub array is from mid plus 1 to high and we also know that as we are merging the two sorted arrays within a range from low to high k should also start from low and it will go till high so after creating this three pointers we will now compare each and every element of the left and the right sub array and whichever element is small we try to fit in that element into the original array at kth index so this is the basic idea behind merging two sorted arrays such that the resultant array is also sorted so we have provided while loop and the condition we provide is i should go till mid and J should go till high, and if any of this condition breaks, the while loop will terminate. So here, what this condition suggests is, when we are merging the two sorted arrays, there will be a point where either left array will get exhausted or the right array gets exhausted. So whichever gets exhausted, this condition will break respectively, and we will. come out of the while loop so inside this while loop now we'll try to compare the left arrays ith index value with right arrays jth index value and as these two arrays are already sorted that's why we are doing the comparison with the respective indexes so we do if temp of i is less than equal to temp of j so here it means whichever value is present at the ith index it means the left sub array value is small so at the original array at kth index we will put temp of i and after placing the temp of i we know that left array is one element is at its correct position so we'll increment i and else 
we do the other way round array of k temp of j and we'll increment j by one position because we have taken up one element from the right sub array and here you can see we are actually filling the original array at kth index so after this if else block as kth index is filled up so we also increment k by one position to fill in up the next element so this while loop will again go on like this till any of the array is exhausted so here you can see that now there are two cases which can arise either the left array gets exhausted or the right array gets exhausted so here when the left array gets exhausted all the elements of the right sub array we don't copy it back to the original array because those elements are already at their correct position in the original array because when we are copying the elements from the original array to temporary array and as both the arrays are sorted so the elements of the right sub array which are left over will usually be at their correct position in the original array so this two cases we discussed in greater detail in our previous video now we only need to keep in mind is if the right array gets exhausted first then we need to write some logic to put in the left arrays left over elements into the original array so for that we provide a while loop and the condition is exactly the same because this i is pointing to an index from where the leftover elements are starting and we can simply copy it back to the original array so what we do is we can simply copy it something like this temp of i k++ and i++ so it is a simple loop which is copying the elements at i at index of temporary array into the original array at k at index and after copying it we are incrementing both the pointers so once this method will end the smaller left and right sub array will be sorted and then as it's a recursive algorithm working like this so it keeps on merging the left and the right sub array till the point all the elements are sorted in ascending order so now let's test its working in the main method so here we have created this array 95243 here we will call the sort method we'll pass the array which is our original array and we need to pass a temporary array so which is of length same as our original array so we'll do new int array dot length we pass the low as 0 and high as array dot length minus 1 because at the start low is at the zeroth index and high is at the last index which is array dot length minus 1 and after doing the sort we will print the array and we'll see whether this five elements are actually sorted or not if i run the main method so here you can see it sorted as 2 3 4 5 9 9 now let's suppose if i put one value here as minus 1 if i call it again so here you can see it it sorted in ascending order so friend this is all about the merge sort algorithm so friends i hope you must have liked this video in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in this video we are going to discuss that how we can sort an array having zeros ones and twos so we need to sort an array in such a way that zeros are at the start ones in the middle and twos at the end so this problem is also known as dutch national flag problem because each number basically correspond to one of the colors in the flag so for example zero is let's say given as red 
वन टू व्हाइट एंड टू टू ब्लू सो वेन वी सॉर्ट एन एरे हैविंग जीरोज वन एंड टू जीरोज आर एट द स्टार्ट वन आर एट द मिडिल एंड टू आर एट द एंड सो देर फॉर दिस प्रॉब्लम इज ऑल्सो नोन एज डच नेशनल फ्लैग प्रॉब्लम सो इन दिस प्रॉब्लम वी आर गिवन एन एरे कंटेनिंग ओनली जीरोज वन एंड टू सो लेट से टेक दिस एग्जाम्पल वी एफ जीरो वन वन टू जीरो वन टू सो दीज आर करंटली रेंडम नंबर एंड वेन वी एक्चुअली सॉर्ट देम वी गेट जीरो एट द स्टार्ट वन एंड द मिडिल एंड टू एट द एंड सो इट लुक्स लाइक डच नेशनल फ्लैग लाइक दिस ना अवर टास्क इज टू सॉर्ट द एरे इन ओ ऑफ एन टाइम कॉम्प्लेक्सिटी एंड ओ ऑफ वन स्पेस कॉम्प्लेक्सिटी बिकॉज इफ यू सॉर्ट दिस एरे यूजिंग द लैंग्वेज स्पेसिफिक सॉर्ट मेथड देन द टाइम कॉम्प्लेक्सिटी विल बी एन लॉग एन बट एज वी नो दैट देर आर ओनली थ्री टाइप्स ऑफ नंबर जीरो एंड टू वी कैन लेवरेज दिस आइडिया एंड अचीव ओ ऑफ एन टाइम कॉम्प्लेक्सिटी सो लेट सी हाउ सो फ्रेंड बिफोर वी स्टार्ट द डिस्कशन In case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update So friends here you can see that this is the piece of code which actually does the sorting in o of n time here we have one while loop which does all the trick So in this video in order to demonstrate at a high level that how this algorithm works i have just mentioned the code here In our next video we will see the demonstration of this code step by step. So let's see at a high level how this algorithm will work. Now for example we are given an array of 7 elements from index 0 to 6 and the numbers are 0 1 and 2 so 2 0 2 2 0 1 Now we need to sort this array in such a way that zeros are at the start ones in the middle and twos at the end so this is start this is middle and this is end so friends the basic idea behind this algorithm is we actually use three pointers which is i j and k so here in this algorithm each pointer has a special task to perform so at the start i starts from 0 j starts from 0 and k starts from the last index so i starts from 0 j starts from 0 and k starts from the last index now here you can see that after that we are providing a while loop where the condition we are providing is i should be less than equal to k so here i is our main pointer which will actually traverse the array in this direction and when it traverses in this direction k also traverses in this direction and this loop will go till i is less than or equal to k so once i crosses k this while loop will terminate and our array will be sorted in zeros ones and twos format so here the i is our main iterator of the array now its main job is here we can see at the start we have to provide zeros in the middle ones and at the end twos so whenever i will encounter zero let's say here it is encountering zero so we know that we have to throw zero to the start so basically when zero will be encountered it will be thrown to j and whatever value j will hold it will come at the place of i so zeros will be at the start and j will help us in achieving that when 2 will be encountered i will throw 2 to, to end and to the end we have k so it will throw it to the k and take its value to the ith index so this will achieve this part when i will encounter 1 it will do nothing it will simply traverse ahead because 1 is already in the middle so this is the crux of the algorithm that we have three pointers and three numbers when i will encounter zero it will swap that number with j 
when I will encounter 2, it will swap it with k. And when I will encounter 1, it will just move ahead and keep 1 at that position only. So here you can see at the start the numbers are in unsorted form. So we usually draw 4 regions like this. One region is for zeros, other region is for ones and the third region is for twos. And one region is just to mark which are the unknown elements till now or unvisited elements till now. So at the start all the elements are unknown. So they are marked as unknown and their range is from i to k. So from i to k. So every number is unknown. So every number has tick. Now slowly when I will move ahead, it will try to encounter these numbers and try to explore them. So these tick will come in these three regions marking for the zeros, ones and twos. At the start from i to k all numbers are unknown. From start which is the zeroth index to j minus 1. So j is actually pointing to zero index. If we do minus 1 we will reach here. So currently there is no such area or range. From j to i minus 1 j to i minus 1 which is also unknown area. From k plus 1 to end which is the last index. So if we do k plus 1 we will go out of this. So this is also the unknown area. So at the start all the elements are unknown and all the regions are unfilled. Now we will slowly move ahead and try to fill each and every region. So let's see how we can remove this unknown elements and fill the zeros, ones and twos. And one thing to remember, zeros, ones and twos will be filled in a proper order. Zeros at the start, ones in the middle and twos at the end. So we will see it later here. So here you can see at the start array of i is 2. So this condition is false. This condition is also false. And this condition is true because array of i is equal to 2. So now what I will do, here we saw that whenever i will encounter 2, it will simply swap 2 with the value which k is holding or index k is holding. So when we will do swap, so 2 and 1 which is being referred by i and k in the swap method we will simply swap them. So 1 will come here and 2 will come here. So here our one task is done successfully that we have placed 2 at its proper position here. So 1, 2 is at its proper position and we know that when this while loop will run, one element has become known now. And which is that element which has become known? It's this that 2 is at its correct position. Also friends as we have filled this position we will move k to this direction because for the other 2 which is here for example it should come here right. So k will move to this position and it keeps on moving in this position as many as 2's are encountered because we need to swap 2 with the value of the kth index. So we do k minus minus. So k comes here. Now here you can see as k is here, we know that from k plus 1 to the last index we have 2. So here we will see this range at every moment of this while loop and we will figure out that where this tick will go. So if you see here k plus 1, k plus 1 is this index to the last, to the end which is the same index we have to mark twos because one number is known. So this tick will go away and this tick will come here. Which says that from i to k still the numbers are unknown and only one number was known which is placed at its correct position. We have provided tick here. Now here one thing to notice when we do this swap, two will come here and at this position there could be zero, one or two any of the three number. So we are not sure which number is actually getting swapped here. So I will be at the same position only. We will only move k. 
so this is the one difference so in the next iteration of while loop here you can see now this condition will be false and this condition will be true because area of i is 1 so we discussed when we encounter one we will simply move ahead because ones will be in the middle so we will simply increment i so i will come here and as i will come here here you can see that unknown is from i to k which is this portion now because this number is known from start to j minus 1 we have zeros so j is still here j minus 1 is out of this area from j to i minus 1 we have to mark 1 so j to i minus 1 which is this part we have to mark 1 so this element is known so it will go away and mark will come here because we have found 1 and we have placed at its correct position in this range so these ranges are important it will help us in traversing the array and also relocating the values of zeros, ones and twos. Moving ahead. Now here you can see array of i is zero. So this condition will come out to be true. So here we have discussed that whenever i will encounter zero, it will throw it to j and take its value. So here zero and one will be swapped by this method. 0 comes here, 1 comes here. So here you can see now 1 has actually changed its position. Initially 1 was here, we have marked here. Now 1 has actually changed the position. Then what we will do? We will increment i and j both. So why we are incrementing i? Because here we saw that whenever we encounter i as 1, we simply move ahead. And if you see this range, 1 is always one step behind the i. So range is from j to i minus 1. So whenever i will point to 1, it will simply move ahead. So this is the range that 1 is 1 index behind the i. So we will do i plus plus and j plus plus. So why we are doing j plus plus because we have placed 0 at its correct position. Now another 0 should come here. So we are doing j plus plus. So j comes here. And now if you Again look into this ranges from i to k. These are still unknown. And one number is known which we placed here. And we took 1 and placed here. So from start to j minus 1. Start to j minus 1 we have zeros. So one tick will come here because we have identified one zero. So this will go away. It will come here. And also here you can see that from j to i minus 1, j to i minus 1, this portion is actually our 1. So now this tick will go away and it will come here. Because we have swapped 0 and 1. So 0 is now at the start, 1 is in the middle and 2 is at the end. And in the middle we have unknown elements. So this is how this algorithm works. Let's see further iterations. Now array of i is 2, so this condition comes out to be true. So we know that what we need to do, we need to simply swap this value with k. So 1 will come here and 2 will go there. 1 comes here, 2 goes there. And then we will decrement k. Because the next 2 value should come here. So this position is filled and one more number is now known. So if we mark again from k plus 1 to end, we will mark 2. So k plus 1, this range will be marked as true. So this tick will go away and there will be one tick here. In the middle we have unknowns. Also friend, one more thing that here, why we are moving i when area of i is 0 and we are not moving i when area of i is 2. Because when we are swapping it with area of k, we don't know what value it will be. It can be 0, 1, 2, any value. But when we are swapping it with array of j, which is here, we are sure that there will be only one single value 1. 
because we have started traversing i from the middle and whenever we are encountering two we are throwing it here and whenever we are encountering one we are simply moving i ahead so we are leaving one behind so that will be the only value which will it will be swapped so therefore it makes no sense to keep i in the same place so we move i also with it but here we don't know whether it's zero one or two which is being swapped so therefore we are keeping i at the same place so now in this iteration array of i is one which is this condition so we simply move i ahead i comes here this element is known because one should be in the middle so this thing will go away because unknown is from i to k and i to k is this range this element is known we have to put this element here from j to i minus 1 j to i minus 1 which is these two numbers so one tick comes here Now in the next iteration, array of i is 2. So what we do is we simply swap and move k in this direction. So we are simply swapping 0 and 2. So 0 comes here and 2 comes here. And then we are decrementing k. Because we have filled 2 at its proper position. So we are moving k here. So k comes here. This element is known. It will go away. And it will come here. Because from k plus 1 to end, we have to provide 2. So these are 2's. k plus 1 to end. Now only one element is unknown. So in the next iteration, i is still equal to k. And array of i is 0. So we will simply swap this 0 with the jth element. Here. So 0 comes here. 1 comes here. This is the proper place of 0 so we increment j and as we have placed 1 here we have also seen that whenever we encounter 1 at the ith position we simply move ahead so we are also moving i ahead so i comes here and j comes here so now every element is known so this tick will go away and where this tick will come it will come here because we have just placed 0 at its correct position. So we will mark this as true. And as we have swapped 0 and 1, so this tick will go away and it will come here. So it would look something like this. So now if we match the range, we will see that unknown are from i to k. So i has actually crossed the boundaries. So every element is known now. So it's blank. from start to j minus 1 this is start this is j minus 1 will reach here so this is actually our zeros which is being marked properly from j to i minus 1 we have marked ones so j to i minus 1 so this is the place for ones we have marked it properly from k plus 1 to end, we have marked 2. So k is here. k plus 1 is this. To end, we have all the 2's. Which is what we have ticked here. So friend, this is how this algorithm works. Basically, we need to keep the track of 3 pointers. i is actually doing main work. It is encountering different values at different positions. When it encounters 0, it swaps it with j when it encounters 2 it swaps it with k and when it encounters 1 it does nothing it simply moves ahead so you need to go through this algorithm few times to understand how these regions are getting plot and how these zeros ones and twos are actually segregated that way in our next video we will actually see the detailed demonstration of this algorithm step by step but to demonstrate this in high level I have just used these regions so that when we encounter this algorithm step by step, we can directly come to know that which element is where. So friends, I hope you must have liked this video. In case if you are new to my channel, then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update.
थैंक्स एवन आइज डे हेलो एवरी वन सो इन दिस वीडियो वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस द एल्गोरिथम स्टेप बाय स्टेप दैट हाउ वी कैन सॉर्ट एन एरे ऑफ जीरो एंड टू इन अवर प्रीवियस वीडियो वी सॉ एट ए वेरी हाई लेवल दैट हाउ दिस एल्गोरिथम वर्क इन ऑर्डर टू अंडरस्टैंड दिस वीडियो यू नीड टू वॉच दैट वीडियो फर्स्ट सो लेट सी द डेमोन्स्ट्रेशन ऑफ दिस एल्गोरिथम स्टेप बाय स्टेप So friends before we start in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update here you can see that we are given with a algorithm where the method name is three number sort which takes in an array now this array consists of zeros ones and twos and we need to sort that array in a linear time so let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step Now let's suppose we are given with this array having seven elements, two, zero, two, two, zero, one, one, and we need to sort this array in such a way that zeros are at the start, ones in the middle, and twos at the end. So when we will call three number sort method, we'll pass in the array. So friends, in our previous video we discussed that we can solve this problem using three pointers. I, J, N, K. We also discussed that I is the main iterator, which will traverse from zero to a value less than or equal to K. And we also discussed that how these three pointers help us in sorting the array. So at the very beginning, I starts from zero. J also starts from zero. And k starts from the last index, which is sixth index. Now, as we need to sort this array in linear time, we have provided a while loop, and the condition in while loop is i should be less than equal to k. So here, i will travel in this direction, k will travel in this direction, and when i will cross k, this while loop will terminate. Now at the start, value of i is zero, and k is six. So this condition comes out to be true. So inside this while loop, we have provided three conditions: array of i, which is the value at i-th index. It can be equal to zero, it can be equal to one, or it can be equal to two. So any of this condition will come out to be true. Now here, what we do is, when I will encounter zero, it will throw it to J and take its value. So J is mostly behind I, and when we encounter zero, we know that zero should be at the beginning because we need to sort the array in such a way that zeros are at the beginning. So it's the responsibility of I and J to put zero at the beginning. so whenever i will encounter zero it will throw it to j and take its value whenever i will encounter 2 it will throw it to k and take its value so here k is at the last index and we know that we need to place 2 at the end so i will throw 2 to k and take its value and whenever i will encounter 1 it will do nothing it will simply move one step ahead because the one is already in the middle so j keeps the track of placing zero at the beginning k keeps the track of placing two at the end and i whenever encounter one simply move ahead and do nothing so here at the start array of i is two so therefore this condition comes out to be false this condition also comes out to be false and this condition comes out to be true so we know that whenever i will encounter 2 it will simply throw the 2 to k and take its value it means we are swapping the value with the kth index so we will call swap method we will pass the positions of i and k and here it will swap them So I will be demonstrating swap directly. 
this we have seen many times in our previous videos so when we will swap i and k one will come here and two will go there it means we have swapped value at ith index with value at kth index we have thrown two at the end and after placing two at the end we know that this two is actually at its correct position so now we decrement k because the next two will come here so we do k minus minus so k becomes 5 moving ahead i is still less than equal to k now array of i is 1 so this condition comes out to be false this condition comes out to be true and whenever we encounter 1 we do nothing we simply move i by one position because we don't have to touch one it's already in the middle range so we move i one position ahead i becomes one moving ahead i is still less than equal to k now here you can see array of i is zero so this condition comes out to be true so when array of i encounters zero or i encounters 0 it will simply swap it with j and take its value so when we will swap it with j 0 will come here and 1 will come here so here now 0 is at its correct position because we need to arrange 0 at the start so after placing 0 at its correct position the next 0 should come here so what we do is we increment j and i both and as i is pointing to 1 we know that we need to simply traverse i also by one position so we do i plus plus i becomes 2 and we do j plus plus j becomes 1 so now next zero will come here i is still less than equal to k now array of i is 2 so this condition comes out to be false this condition also comes out to be false now this condition comes out to be true so it means we need to throw this 2 to k and take its value so when we will perform swap 1 will come here and 2 will go there and now 2 is at its correct position here so we'll decrement k so k becomes 4 also friends here you can see that when we are swapping with k we are only decrementing k we are not moving i ahead because when we are swapping it with k whatever value is here there could be three possibilities it can be 0 it can be 1 or it can be 2 so we are not sure that what value we will encounter here so therefore we are keeping i at the same position but when we are swapping it with j we know that there could be two possibilities 0 or 1 so when we encounter 1 we know that we have to move i by one step but when we encounter 0 it means that i and j are pointing to the same index and when we will do swap 0 will come at same position only and then we will move both the pointers together ahead so the maximum time the value which we swap between i and j is 1 so therefore after this swap when i will see that here it is 1 it will simply move ahead by one position but with k we don't do this because we can get three possible values 0 1 and 2 and we are not sure that what value is it is getting swapped with now again i is less than equal to k array of i is 1 so this condition comes out to be false now this condition comes out to be true because array of i is equal to 1 and we know that when we encounter 1 we simply move i by one position because 1 is already in the middle area so we simply increment i by one position i becomes 3 i is still less than equal to k 
now array of i is true so this condition is false this condition is false and this condition will be true so when we encounter 2 we simply throw it to k and take its value so 2 will come here and 0 will come here like this now this 2 is at its correct position so we will decrement k k becomes 3 now here i is equal to k so this condition is still true array of i is 0 so this condition will be true when we will encounter 0 we need to throw it to j and take its value so that zeros are at the start so when we will do swap so 0 will come here and 1 will come here it means 0 is now at its correct position And as we have encountered 1 here, we first move i by 1 position. So i becomes 4. We have placed 0 at its correct position, so we will move j also by 1 position. j becomes 2. So friends, here you can see now this condition comes out to be false because i is actually greater than k. So this while loop will terminate. And here you can see that we have sorted the array in zeros, ones and twos form where zeros are at the start, ones in the middle and twos at the end. So friend, this is all about the algorithm. We usually take the help of three pointers, i, j and k. i and j starts from zeroth index, k starts from the last index. When i will encounter zero, it will simply swap it with j because j's responsibility is to place zeros at the start. When i will encounter 2, it will simply swap it with k because the responsibility of k is to put 2 at the end. And when i will see 1, i's responsibility is to place 1's in the middle. And as i is already in the middle, it will simply move ahead. So, friends, I hope you must have liked this video. In case if you are new to my channel, then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update. Thanks, have a nice day. Hello everyone. So in this video, we are going to discuss about a basic introduction to quicksort. In this video and in upcoming few videos, we will discuss completely about quicksort. So quicksort is a sorting technique where we get a collection of elements and we sort them in ascending or descending order. So in quick sort, here if you see, when we discussed merge sort, we saw that it was a divide and conquer algorithm. So by divide and conquer we mean that let's say if we are given a complex problem, we try to divide that complex problem into smaller sub problems and when those smaller sub problems are not further divided, we try to conquer them and when we conquer each and every smaller sub problems, we reach to the solution of our original problem. So quicksort is also a divide and conquer algorithm. It involves three steps. The first step is the pivot selection. So in pivot selection, what we do is we pick an element from the array and mark it as pivot. Now this pivot element can be the first element, last element or any random element. We just take any element and mark it as pivot. So here, Let's suppose we are given this array and we want to sort this array using quick sort. So as we discussed, the first thing we do is we take a pivot element. Now this pivot element can be the first element, any random element or the last element. So we can take any element as pivot. In this tutorial, we will take the last element as our pivot. So here, the last element which is at index 8, the value is 3, so this is our pivot. So this is the first step, we take a pivot and we can take any element as our pivot. Now after taking a pivot, what we do is, whatever the element we have taken as pivot, 
now we actually partition the array so by partitioning we mean that we reorder the array such that all elements greater than pivot comes after the pivot and all the elements smaller than pivot comes before the pivot the elements equal to pivot can go either side of the pivot so whatever the pivot we took which we saw in our previous slide it was 3 so then we partition the array in such a way that all the elements which are greater than pivot comes after the pivot and all the elements which are smaller than pivot comes before the pivot so we are actually reordering the array and the elements which are equal to pivot can go on either side it can go on the left side or on the right side so why we are doing this partitioning is this is the important step after we perform the partitioning the pivot is actually at its correct sorted position now what it means is let's say 3 is the pivot and these are the remaining elements so all the elements greater than pivot should come after the pivot and all the elements which are smaller than pivot should come before the pivot so here 3 is the pivot so now we'll check 9 is greater than pivot it comes here because as it is greater than 3 we know that all the elements which are greater than pivot will go after the pivot minus 3 is smaller than 3 it comes here 5 is greater than 3 it comes here 2 is lesser than 3 it comes here 6 is greater than 3 it comes here 8 comes here minus 6 comes here 1 comes here and 3 is the pivot so it it is at this position so here you can see these are all the elements which are smaller than pivot and these are all the elements which are greater than pivot we are not concerned about the order of the elements here it's minus 3 then it is 2 then it is minus 6 so we are not concerned about the order here it is 9 5 6 8 like this we are only concerned about the partitioning of this array in such a way that this is the left part which is smaller than pivot and this is the right part which is greater than pivot so why we are actually doing this partition here you can see i'll just remove this so when we actually partition the array based on what we discussed here you can see the 3 was our pivot all the smaller elements are just before the pivot and all the greater elements are just after the pivot and it can be in any order but here you can see that after this partitioning one unique property with this pivot is let's say this is low index and this is high index and this is any jth element so after this partition in this array from low to j minus 1 which is this portion is less than equal to array of j which is our pivot which is less than equal to j plus 1 to high like this so when we do this partition this holds true and if you see when we sort this array so this is the sorted array so the elements are arranged in ascending order but here you see that the difference between this partitioning and this sorted array is the pivot after the partitioning and after the sorting doesn't change its position it's actually at its correct position after the first partition so here if you see 3 was our pivot after partitioning it came at index 4 and if we sort this array you will see that in the sorted array the pivot doesn't change its index 
it will still at be at index 4 so this is one critical information about quick sort that it partitions the array and all the elements which are smaller than pivot comes to the left and all the elements which are greater than pivot comes to the right but this pivot after partition is actually at its correct position even after the array is sorted so this is the second step of quick sort the partitioning step moving ahead now here you saw does this pivot and this partitioning it is actually the divide part of the algorithm where we are actually reordering the array in the partitioning step and now how we will conquer this is based on this recursion step whatever we did above now we recursively apply the above steps on the sub array formed on the left side of the pivot and on the right side of the pivot so these two steps we will apply on all the elements which are lesser than pivot and on all the elements which are greater than pivot recursively so this step which we discussed that after this partitioning the pivot is at its correct sorted position we don't touch the pivot after the partitioning we take the left part of the pivot we take the right part of the pivot and we apply the above steps recursively on the left side and on the right side so here pivot in the sorted array at its correct position like this but when we do the first partition this one particular element is sorted here you can see in the sorted array pivot doesn't change its position and it is at its correct position so we can think from the first partition we have sorted one element and now when we are discussing the recursion part the third step what we do is we take the left side of the partition we take the right side of the partition we leave the partition as it is at its correct position now we apply the same steps of choosing a pivot and then partitioning on the left side of the array and on the right side of the array so this we keep doing recursively till all the elements are at its correct position first partition gives one sorted element if we do this recursively with the left part and with the right part there will be a time that all the elements will be properly sorted and they will be at its correct position so the recursion step is important so these are the three important steps in quick sort pivot selection partitioning and then doing the recursion of these two steps on the left side of the pivot and on the right side of the pivot and when this recursion will end all the elements will be properly sorted and they will be at its correct position so this was the basic introduction of the quick sort at a high level in our next video we will see how we do this pivot selection and the partitioning and after that we will see that how this recursion help us in sorting the array taking the help of this first two steps and applying them recursively so friends i hope you must have liked this video in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in this video we are going to discuss that what is quick sort partitioning in the part 1 of this video we discussed a basic introduction about quick sort so in this video we will be discussing what is quick sort partitioning so friends in our previous video we discussed that quick sort is a divide and conquer algorithm which basically involves three steps pivot selection partitioning and recursion in pivot selection we actually pick an element and mark it as pivot the pivot element can be the first element last element or any random element from the array and the second step is the partitioning step where we reorder the array such that all the elements greater than pivot comes after the pivot and all the elements smaller than pivot comes before the pivot and the elements which are equal can go on either side of the pivot so usually in the partitioning step
we actually get a left part. and a right part and in the middle we have pivot. So once the partitioning is done, pivot is somewhere in the middle. Also we discussed that after this partitioning, the pivot is at its correct sorted position. So here you can see, at whatever index pivot comes after the partition, if we sort this complete array, the pivot will lie at the same index only. So it means after the partitioning, one of the element is sorted. So in the recursion step, we apply this pivot selection and partitioning recursively in the left side and in the right side and we keep on doing that till the complete array is sorted. So in this video we will see that how we do pivot selection and partitioning. So let's say we are given with this array. So here we can choose any element as our pivot but here we choose the last element as our pivot. So 3 is the pivot. And as we discussed in our previous video that after we partition and reorder the array in such a way that all the elements smaller than 3 comes before 3 and all the elements greater than 3 comes after the 3. So it would look something like this. That this part is the left part and this is the right part and this is our pivot. So if you see when this array will get sorted completely. So this is the sorted array. So here you will see that the pivot after the partition was at fourth index and once the array got sorted completely, it was still at the same index. Because when we partition the array in such a way that this condition holds true, which we discussed in our previous video as well. After the partition, the pivot is actually at its sorted position. So now let's see how this partitioning happens. So here is the algorithm to partition the array. So friends before we start, in case if you are new to my channel, then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update. Also please like this video and watch it till the end. So here you can see that let's suppose we are given with this array of 9 elements. 9, minus 3, 5, 2, 6, 8, minus 6, 1 and 3. So when we will call partition, we are actually partitioning complete array. It takes low and a high pointer. So low actually starts from the 0th index and high starts from the last index because we need to partition the complete array. So low starts from 0 and high starts from 8. So when we do partition of the array, the first thing we need is the pivot. So we can select the pivot as the first element, last element or any of the random element in this array. So here we will choose the last element as our pivot. So array value at higher index which is the 8th index will give us our pivot. So pivot is 3, this value, which is at array of high. Now after this pivot selection, what we do is, we reorder this array in such a way that, all the elements smaller than pivot, comes in the left part, then comes the pivot, and all the elements greater than pivot, comes at the right part. So this reordering is done by two variables i and j. Both are starting from low which is the starting index of our array or the starting range of the array from where we need to do the partitioning. So i starts from low which is zero index and j starts from the low which is zero index. So friends now we actually traverse each and every element of this array and we provide a while loop where condition is i will traverse till it is less than equal to high. So friends the basic idea behind this algorithm is why we are creating two pointers. If you see closely then we have these four pointers. So usually from low to 
j minus 1 we actually have smaller elements and equal elements to pivot means all the smaller elements to pivot comes from low to j minus 1 including the elements which are equal to pivot from j to i minus 1 we will have all the greater elements to pivot and from i to high the elements are yet to be traversed so after every execution of while loop you can see these conditions and you can figure out that how this ranges works so at the start from i to high every element is yet to be traversed and low to j minus 1 and j to i minus 1 goes beyond the array so therefore there are no elements in these ranges currently i is less than or equal to high so this condition is true now we are trying to explore the first element which is 9 so here what we do is in one of our previous videos where we saw that 3 number sort or how we can sort 0 and 1 we apply the small part of the same logic here as well so what we do is this 9 which is at array of i and this 3 which is our pivot there can be two possibilities array of i can be less than or equal to pivot or array of i can be greater than pivot so if array of i is greater than pivot it means whatever value we have here it is actually greater than pivot so here you can see we know that greater elements lies from the range j to i minus 1 so when array of i is greater than pivot what we do is we simply move i by one step and if array of i is less than pivot we perform a swap between i and j and then we move j and i simultaneously so you will understand why we are doing this once we perform few of this iterations so at the start array of i which is 9 is greater than pivot so this condition comes out to be false so if array of i is greater than pivot we simply traverse i ahead i becomes 1 and we reach to index 1 so here you can see that why we actually traversed i one step ahead when pivot was lesser than array of i 9 was greater than 3 so greater element should lie from j to i minus 1 so here you can see j to i minus 1 so this element so this is the only range which can help us to figure out that it has the greater elements to pivot you will understand more about these two ranges and these two points when we traverse ahead now i is less than or equal to high so this condition is true array of i is minus 3 minus 3 is less than or equal to pivot so this condition comes out to be true so when array of i is less than or equal to pivot we simply swap the value at i and jth index so after we perform swap we will see why we are actually doing that so these three steps i will be going somewhat fast because we have already discussed how we can do this swapping so minus 3 will come here and 9 will come here Now after this swap, minus 3 has came here, 9 has came here. So here when array of i encounters a value lesser than pivot, it simply throws it into this direction. Because from low to j minus 1, we need to put the smaller and the equal elements to the pivot. So how I can throw it in this direction is by swapping it with j. And after we perform this swap, we increment j and i both. Because this value is placed at its proper position that it is lesser than the pivot 
So now we'll increment j also. So j becomes 1. And as these two elements are already explored, we will increment i as well. i becomes 2. Now our execution point reaches here. And here you can see that from low to j minus 1, we have smaller and equal elements to pivot. So from low to j minus 1, which is this element, this range are the smaller elements to pivot. From j to i minus 1, j to i minus 1, this element is in the range of the greater elements to pivot. So what these two conditions are still holds good. i is still less than or equal to high. So this condition comes out to be true and the while loop will execute. Now 5 is greater than pivot. So this condition comes out to be false. And once this condition comes out to be false, we know that we need to simply traverse i ahead. i becomes 3. So now here you can see this part is smaller elements range. And this and these two elements 9 and 5 are greater than pivot. So it is separated by j and i in such a way that from low to j minus 1 we have smaller elements. From j to i minus 1 we have larger elements. So therefore when array of i is greater than pivot, we simply traverse i ahead, we do nothing. And when array of i is less than equal to pivot, it means we have found one element lesser than pivot. So we simply throw it to the starting range. And we simply shift the larger element range ahead. So here initially 9 was here, which was the larger or the greater elements to pivot. When we did the swap, 9 actually shifted in this direction. So that there could be a place for the elements which are smaller than pivot to come in this direction. So now similarly we will do this for the rest of the elements. From i to high, the elements are yet to be traversed. Currently i is less than equal to high, so this condition comes out to be true. 2 is less than equal to pivot. So this condition is true. So now here you can see, we know that 2 should lie somewhere in this range, at the starting range. And j keeps the track of the smaller elements from low to j minus 1. So at j, we have one greater element. And we need to put 2 somewhere here, so that this 2 comes at its proper position. But here we already have 9. So therefore we do this swap so that 9 can come here and this range of the greater element is still maintained in the middle somewhere. And it simply shifts in this direction. So I'll remove everything. So now we'll do this swap. 2 will come here and 9 will come here. Two came here and nine came here. So the range of greater elements simply shifted in this direction because we need to create a space so that smaller elements can come in this direction. We'll increment j now. We will increment i because this element which was here is actually being traversed. So from low to j minus 1 we have smaller elements range. From j to i minus 1 we have larger elements range or greater elements range. i is still less than equal to high. So this condition is true. 6 is greater than pivot. So this condition comes out to be false. It means 6 is at its proper range. We don't have to touch this. We will do i++. So i simply moves ahead. i becomes 5. Now this element also got into the range of greater elements. 
because from j to i minus 1 we have the greater elements to pivot i is still less than high so this condition is true so the while loop will execute now array of i which is 8 is greater than pivot so this condition is true therefore this condition comes out to be false and as array of i is greater than pivot we do nothing we simply traverse i ahead i becomes 6 and this element becomes part of our greater elements range from j to i minus 1 i is still less than equal to high this condition is true now minus 6 is less than 3 so therefore array of i is less than equal to pivot now we need to throw this pivot in the left direction and we know that j is actually keeping the track of that so this condition is true first we perform swap between i and j so that this minus 6 comes in this range and we simply shift the one of the greater element in this direction so we'll perform this swap using a temp variable So minus 6 came here and 5 came here. So after placing a smaller element at this spot, we will increment j. j becomes 3 because for the next smaller element, this would be the right place. So we increment j as well. And as we have already traversed whatever the value was here at this index we will also increment i so i becomes 7 so here you can see this range from low to j minus 1 we have smaller elements from j to i minus 1 we have greater elements to pivot value of i is 7 so 7 is less than equal to high which is 8 now 1 is less than equal to 3 so this condition comes out to be true we need to throw this 1 because it is lesser than or equal to pivot in this direction so that it can come in this range we simply swap i and j so 1 came here and 9 came here so here you can see when we are actually encountering a value lesser than pivot we are doing this swap and putting that at the starting range and whatever value j is pointing from j to i minus 1 we have greater elements so at j we have one greater elements so we are simply shifting the range which is greater than the pivot just ahead so 9 came here but still if you see the range is intact all the elements which are greater than pivot are in sequence the order will not be maintained but the range will be maintained so now after using this spot we will increment j j becomes 4 and we will increment i because this element is traversed and it got shifted here so we simply traverse i ahead i becomes 8 so here you can see from low to j minus 1 this range is of smaller elements j to i minus 1 this range is of greater elements now for the last time this while loop will execute because i is equal to high so here you can see that now we are actually encountering the pivot itself and this is one critical step because we need to put this pivot at its correct position somewhere between the range of smaller and greater elements to pivots range. So this equal to condition does that and it is very important. So currently array of i is equal to pivot. 
So three is equal to three, which is the pivot. And we can place this three because smaller and equal elements to pivot will lie from low to j minus one, and j is at the spot which can take lesser or equal values to the pivot. So three at index i will be swapped with j. So three comes here, which is our pivot, and six comes here, which is the value greater than to pivot. So after placing an element which is less than equal to pivot at its correct position using j, we will increment j so that next element can come here. But as there are no elements, but still we do this j plus plus, so j becomes five. And we will increment i because we are done with this element. So i becomes nine, which goes out of the boundaries of this array. So this condition comes out to be false because value of i is eight and i is nine. So i is actually greater than i. So this while loop will terminate. And here you can see that in quick sort partitioning, when we do this. Partitioning. At the end, we need to return the index of the partition. That from which index the partition is happened. So here we can see that from low to j minus one, we have smaller and equal elements to pivot. So I will redraw this. Low to j minus one, smaller and equal elements to pivot. J to i minus one. So I value is nine, so J to I minus one, which is still eight. These are the elements greater than pivot, and from I to I, we have traversed all the elements. So if you observe closely, J is actually pointing to a place where the next smaller element to pivot will come. So we will simply return J minus one because we know that from low to J minus one. We have elements smaller and equal to pivot, so three comes here, which is at index four. So we will return the index of the pivot. So in this partition, whatever value we return is actually the index of the pivot after the partitioning, which is j minus one. So index four will be returned. So this is how we do partitioning, and this partition method is very frequently used in the quick sort. Similar kind of logic is used when we do sorting of zero and one, or putting even or odd integers in certain sequence, or we sort the three elements zero, one, and two. So for zero and one, this code is pretty much similar. So this partitioning logic which you are seeing here is very important for many of the algorithms, and this traversal with this range. Is very important to understand because the same logic applies to many of the algorithms. So we will see the partitioning logic, how it applies to quick sort. In our next video, we will see that how this recursion happens, where we apply the same logic of partitioning in the left side of the array, which have smaller elements, and the right side of the pivot, which have the greater elements. So friends, I hope you must have liked this video. In case if you are new to my channel, then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update. Thanks. Have a nice day. Hello everyone. So in this video, we are going to discuss about quick sort recursion. In part two video of quick sort, we discussed that how we can partition an array. So in this video, we will see that how we can perform quick sort recursion. So in the previous video, we discussed about the pivot selection that we pick an element and mark it as pivot. The pivot can be any random element. It can be first element, last element, or any random element. Now, based on what we choose as our pivot, we do the partitioning. We reorder the array such that all elements greater than pivot comes after the pivot. All elements smaller than pivot. Comes before the pivot. 
the elements equal to pivot can go on either side of the pivot and once this partitioning is done based on the reorder of the array the pivot is actually at its correct sorted position so this we already discussed in our previous video so in this video we will be looking into the recursion part where after partitioning the array we perform these two steps the pivot selection and partitioning recursively on the sub array formed on the left side of the pivot which has the smaller elements to pivot and on the sub array formed on the right side of the pivot which has the greater elements to pivot so here about two steps we perform recursively on the left side of the pivot and on the right side of the pivot so let's see at a high level how this recursion looks so let's say we want to sort this array using quick sort so here you can see that this is a small piece of code which does the sorting it takes in an array and it takes in a range that from which index to which index we need to do the sorting and here you can see that the first step we are doing is the partition step and once we get the partition index now we have two arrays one is on the left side of the partition and one is on the right side of the partition so we recursively call the sort method which is the same method from low to p minus 1 which is the left part and from p plus 1 to high which is the right part and this happens recursively because the method is calling itself again and again after the partition we are actually rearranging the array in the partition method in such a way that the element present at the partition index which is the position of our pivot that element is correctly sorted and placed at its proper position so with one partition we can get one element and place that element at its correct position such that that particular element is sorted and we will keep on doing this recursion till low is less than high so this is our base case so at a high level let's see how this recursion looks in our next video we will see the step by step demonstration of this quick sort algorithm but for time being we can just see at a high level that how this recursion looks like so here at the start we need to sort this complete array so this will be our low and this will be our high now low is less than high we call the partition method so in the partition method we take the last element as our pivot like this so 3 is our pivot now after this partition method will end we get the index of the element 3 that where it belongs so in our previous video we saw that how we can perform this partition and we took the same example so in the first partition you will see that 3 comes at index 4 and in the partition the array is rearranged in such a way that all the elements lesser than pivot comes in the left side all the elements greater than pivot comes on the right side so here we are doing the logical division of the array and we are partitioning into two parts left and right so we are not breaking the array it's just for the demonstration purpose that it looks like this if you see the index from 0 to 3 we have smaller elements from 5 to 8 we have elements greater than the pivot so this is the pivot index now after we get the pivot index if we sort this array directly you will see that in the sorted array 3 will be always at index 4 it means when we perform this partition one of the element is sorted and it is placed at its correct position so once it is placed at its correct position we don't touch this element now what we do is we call the sort method on the left side recursively so it goes deep down like this and the range we took is low to p minus 1 so p is the pivot 
and this is p minus 1. So now we will call the sort by taking this left side only this four elements and this will happen recursively. Low should be less than high, this would be our base case. So here when this sort method will be executed for this left array, you can see that this sort method will be executed again. Low will be the same but high will become p minus 1. So this would be our high. Low is less than high. Now we will again call partition method. We will pass in the array. We will pass in low and high. So now in the partition method, only these four elements will be reordered because we are providing the range of low and high in the partition. At the start, low and high were the complete range of the array from 0 to 8. Now this partition method will only partition 0 to 3. So in the partition method, we will first choose the pivot element, which we have discussed that we choose the last element. Now we need to do the reordering such that all the elements lesser than 1 should come on the one side and all elements greater than 1 should come on the other side. So here we will see that the partition method will reorder the array in such a way that it looks like this. This much part are the elements which are lesser than pivot and this much part are the elements which are greater than pivot which is 1. But here we will see the index which we get is 2 because it returns the final position of the pivot. So index 2 will return here in the first partition index 4 was written. So based on this p-1 we took the left side of the array and we did the partition again. So now here if you see if we sort this array completely you will find that 3 is at fourth index which is sorted and after the second partition 1 will be at second index. So this element is also sorted. So now we don't touch 1. Here if you see we again go on the left side from low. So this was our low and this is our p and this is our i. So we again call sort method from low to p minus 1 which is we are taking the left side of the array. So when this sort method will be called again, low will be at the same spot but high will become this spot. So it means now we are actually picking up this two elements and we are trying to sort them and we are trying to apply this logic. So this will be our low and this will be our high. Low is less than high. So it means we have two elements. So we can again do the partitioning of the array from low to high. So in the partition method, we will take the last element as our pivot. And now we will partition the array in such a way that all the elements lesser than minus 6 will go on the left side and all the elements greater than minus 6 will go on the right side. So this partition method will reorder only these two elements now because we are providing the ranges and it will touch the array into these ranges only. So it looks like this. So as there are no elements which are smaller than minus 6, so minus 6 will be the only element on the left side which is at index 0 and minus 3 is greater than minus 6 so this will lie on the right side. So friends here you can see that now this is our low and this is our pivot index. So after we get the pivot index we will again call sort on this one element. We will try to sort its left part from p minus 1. So p is at 0 index. If we do p minus 1 it will go minus 1. So here if you see when we partition the array pivot was at 0th index. It is the only element now. So on the left side of pivot we have no elements. So if we call sort method again passing in low as 0 and high as p minus 1. So it will take the value of the new high as minus 1. So here we will reach the base case and we will simply return from this method because low value is 0 and high value is minus 1. So therefore we can't further divide minus 6 and at whichever index minus 6 will be there that will be the properly sorted position 
for the element minus 6. So now this method is done because when we call sort again we will reach this base case and we will return. So this method will be done. So now this sort method will be executed and we go to the right side of the pivot. It means now we are taking in the elements which are greater than minus 6 which is the only element minus 3. So p plus 1 p plus 1 will be our new low. This will be our low and high will remain the same index. So here if you see we will again encounter the base case low is actually equal to high. So it means we can't divide from low to high further down. So based on this base case this sort method will end and the call will reach here again and the sort method which we called from here this will also get end. So minus 3 will be also at, at its correct sorted position like this. So here with these two sort methods we are going in this direction and then we are going in this direction. So with this sort we went to this direction this is sorted and with this sort we went to this direction which is sorted. So we will return back to the left side and here you can see when we will return back here when we had called sort on this part we went in this direction and as we are returning back from here so we will return from here like this and now when these two elements are sorted we will go in this direction to sort the greater elements to this pivot because we are doing this algorithm recursively. So first the left side is done and once that left side is done we go on the right side. So this side is done completely here. Now we go on this side. So here 2 is the only element left. So this will be sorted because the base case will be fulfilled. For this element low and high will be at the same spot because this is our p and if we are going on the right side we do p plus 1. So p plus 1 will be the index 3 which will be our low and high is already at index 3. So this is sorted like this. So now execution point will reach back here and here you can see left side is now properly done. So it will go back here and now we perform the same steps recursively on the right side of the elements which are greater than 3 which is at index 4. So now we perform the same step on this right side. So if we are going on the right side we are doing p plus 1 we are going on the right side the low will be from p plus 1 to high. So this is p this will be our low and this will be our high because this high has not changed its value. So now we will partition it again based on what we saw here. So 6 will be our the pivot and now when we will partition it it would look something like this. So 6 is properly sorted. Now we go on the left side first. So 5 is the only element left. So it will encounter the base case. This is our p and this is our low. So for the left side if we do p minus 1 to take all the elements which are lesser than 6 this will become our high and as high is equal to low we will return from the recursion and phi will be at its correct position. So we go back like this and then we try to sort the right side. So we call the recursion again by taking p plus 1 to high. So this was high like this and if we do p plus 1 this will be our low now. So now we are actually partitioning two elements. So we take 9 as the pivot. We do the partition. So our pivot lies at the 8th index. There is only one element which is lesser than pivot which is on the left side of the array. And there are no elements which are greater than pivot. So after the partition at whichever position the pivot lies, this is the properly sorted position for element 9 and we are left with only one element. So we first go on the left side like this. We take from low to p-1 because if we do p-1 we will get the left side range. 
so this will become our new high and as this is the only element left low is equal to high so we can't divide or partition this piece of sub array further so 8 will be also at its correct position like this so if i remove everything so here you can see that we are performing the recursion on this array recursively and we are doing the partitioning and with each partition one one element is getting sorted and placed at its correct position so if you try to combine all these indexes you will see that if we sort this array the array would look like if i just plot it here it will look like first minus 6 minus 3 then 1 2 3 5 6 8 and 9 so if you see that this would be our finally sorted array and if you see the indexes of all the elements from 0 to 8 you will see that at 0 we have minus 6 like this at index 1 we have minus 3 sorted index 2 we have 1 at index 3 we have 2 index 4 we have 3 at fifth index we have 5 sixth index 6 seventh index we have 8 and at the eighth index we have 9 so here you can see that how this recursion and this partitioning is helping us to perform the quick sort so friends here if you see at the start we took complete array we took a pivot we did the partitioning all the elements lesser than pivot were on this side and all the elements greater than pivot were on this side then we recursively took the left part we took the pivot and we did the same steps like this then we took the left part again we did the same steps and finally we got minus 6 and minus 3 at 0 and 1 index which are sorted and after taking this left and right part and sorting them this left part was done properly then we picked the right part of this pivot and this was sorted and after we sorted this all the elements were done for the first left sub array then we went to the right part and we did the same steps again we first went on left then we went on the right we first went on the left then we went on the right and at the end you see all the elements are at their proper indexes so if we sort this array you will get this array so friend this was all about the quick sort recursion if you didn't understand any of the recursion logic here in our next video we are going to see the step by step demonstration of the quick sort algorithm there it will make sense that how this recursion is happening where the sort method is again calling this sort method two times after partitioning we go on the left side first and then we go on the right side so we will understand this recursion in our next video with a detailed demonstration i hope you must have liked this video in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in our previous video of quick sort we discussed about the quick sort recursion so now in this video we will see the step by step demonstration of the quick sort algorithm and we will see that how the algorithm works via an animation so this is the quick sort algorithm and we will see the step by step demonstration of the algorithm So friends before we start in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update So in quick sort algorithm we have this sort method which takes in an array which we want to sort and we pass basically a range that from low to high we need to sort So at the start let's say we want to sort this array having six elements 5 2 0 1 6 3 So when we will call sort method we will pass in the array 
द लो विल बी जीरो एंड हाई विल बी एरे डॉट लेंथ माइनस वन विच इज द लास्ट इंडेक्स सो लो इज जीरो विच इज पॉइंटिंग टू जीरो इंडेक्स हाई इज फाइव विच इज पॉइंटिंग टू द लास्ट इंडेक्स सो वी आर टेलिंग दैट वी नीड टू सॉर्ट दिस एरे कंप्लीटली फ्रॉम जीरो इंडेक्स टू फिफ्थ इंडेक्स एंड हियर यू कैन सी दैट दिस सॉर्ट मेथड इज रिकर्सिवली कॉलिंग दिस सॉर्ट मेथड अगेन हियर एंड हियर सो इन ऑर्डर टू डेमोन्स्ट्रेट द रिकर्शन वी आर यूजिंग दिस कॉल स्टैक विच विल हैव द मेथड कॉल्स एंड द स्टेट ऑफ द मेथड स्टोर्ड इन लो पी एंड हाई सो वेन दिस सॉर्ट मेथड विल बी कॉल्ड देर विल बी वन मेथड ऑन द कॉल स्टैक बाय नेम सॉर्ट लो इज एट जीरो इंडेक्स हाई इज एट फिफ्थ इंडेक्स एंड पी इज द इंडेक्स ऑफ द पेवोट विच वी विल बी कैलकुलेटिंग हियर मूविंग अहेड सो हियर वी नो दैट क्विक सॉर्ट इज डिवाइड एंड कॉन्कर एल्गोरिथम सो हियर वी एक्चुअली डिवाइड दिस कॉम्प्लेक्स प्रॉब्लम ऑफ सॉर्टिंग इन टू स्मॉलर सब प्रॉब्लम विच मीन्स दैट वी आर डिवाइडिंग दिस एरे इन टू टू पार्ट एंड वी कीप ऑन डिवाइडिंग द एरे इन टू दिस रिकर्सिव सॉर्ट मेथड बेस्ड ऑन रेंज लो एंड हाई सो वेन लो विल बी इक्वल टू हाई और लो विल बी ग्रेटर देन हाई वेन लो विल बी इक्वल टू हाई सो इट विल बी समथिंग लाइक दिस दैट लो इज इक्वल टू हाई इट मीन्स वी कांट फर्दर ब्रेक डाउन द एरे बिकॉज इट हैज ओनली वन एलिमेंट सो देर फोर वेन दिस कंडीशन विल अराइव वी नीड टू सिंपली ब्रेक फ्रॉम दिस रिकर्शन बिकॉज दिस शॉर्ट मेथड इज रिकर्सिवली कॉलिंग दिस शॉर्ट एंड इट कीप्स ऑन गोइंग सो वेन लो विल बी इक्वल टू हाई और ग्रेटर देन हाई देन वी नीड टू टेल रिकर्शन दैट वी हैव रीच अवर बेस केस and we need to stop the recursion so currently low is less than high low is 0 and high is 5 so this condition comes out to be true so friends in our previous video we discussed that how we actually do the quick sort we first do the pivot selection where we pick up a random element from an array and then we actually partition the array and we partition the array in such a way that the elements which are smaller than the pivot usually lie on the left side and the elements which are greater than pivot usually lie on the right side and the equal elements can go on either side so here this is the first step we actually call the partition method we pass the array we pass the range from low to high so currently we are telling that we need to partition this complete array and in this partition method we actually do the pivot selection and reordering of the array so this method we have discussed in our previous videos in a greater detail you can watch that video to get more understanding but here also we will see that how this partition works so when we will call partition method we are leaving this sort method so the execution point will leave the sort method and the partition method will be on the call stack so before we leave this sort method we need to store the state of this sort method that low was at 0 and high was at 5th index and as we are leaving this sort method we need to keep the track of line number because once this partition method will end we need to begin this sort method from line number 3 only because we are leaving this sort method at line number 3 so here we will update the line number 3 like this which tells that we are leaving this sort method at line number 3 and when we will come back to this sort method we will start our execution from line number 3 and when we will start our execution low will be at 0 and high will be at 5 so we are simply storing the state here so now we'll see this partition method with this array low as 0 and high as 5 so we are partitioning this complete array We have discussed this method in greater detail in our previous videos. You can watch that video so that once we go through it again, you will get more better understanding. So first, we do the pivot selection. We can choose any random element from the array as our pivot. We can choose the first element or any element in the middle or the last element. So here we choose 
the last element as our pivot which is denoted by the end of this range so pivot becomes array of i which is 3 so this is our pivot and after this pivot selection our job is to do this partition elements lesser than 3 will go on one side which is on the left side elements greater than 3 will go on the right side and the elements which are equal to pivot can go on either side so when we perform the partition we take the help of two variables i and j here i and j both starts from low currently low is pointing to zero index so we are not starting i and j from zeroth index we always start it from the low index because currently as we are partitioning complete array low is pointing to zero there could be a chance that we only need to partition these three elements so at that moment low will be a third index so we need to partition of third index to fifth index so therefore we create two pointers i and j both starting from low i is zero because low is pointing to zero j is zero now as we need to partition we need to provide a while loop where we traverse each and every element of the array using the iterator i it goes till it is less than equal to high so this is very important algorithm and it is used in many problems here what we do is we have this four pointers and once we partition the array it looks something like this smaller and equal elements to pivot are on the left side then we have the pivot and then we have the elements greater than pivot so this is the ranges and if we use this four pointers the range varies like this from low to j minus 1 we have smaller elements or equal elements to pivot from j to i minus 1 we have the elements greater than pivot and we have discussed this in greater detail in our previous videos as well from i to high we have elements yet to be traversed so at the start we need to traverse every element so from low to j minus 1 and from j to i minus 1 we don't have any elements because all the elements are yet to be traversed therefore we have provided this condition that this while loop will run till i is less than equal to high so we'll see how this algorithm works and also we need to keep this if condition in mind so here when we are partitioning we need to compare each and every element with the pivot and if it is less than pivot the first thing we do is we simply swap the values at i and j index in the array because as this element is less than equal to pivot it should come at the starting range because we need to partition it that way so we will see how these three steps work and if the element is greater than pivot we do nothing we simply leave the element there and we traverse i ahead so this condition is true i is less than equal to high so in the if condition we check whether array of i is less than equal to pivot or not so we are simply checking whether 5 is less than 3 or not so 5 is greater than 3 so this condition comes out to be false so when array of i is greater than pivot which is our case we simply leave that element there and simply traverse i ahead so i becomes 1 i is still less than equal to high now array of i which is 2 2 is less than 3 so this condition comes out to be true and once this condition comes out to be true we know that we need to swap the values at i and j index it means we need to swap 5 and 2 so here why we are doing this swap is we need to partition the array in such a way that smaller element should come at the starting range then our pivot should come and then the elements greater than pivot should come so when array of i is less than equal to pivot we simply throw the element which is at ith index to jth index and take its value so when we will do this swap 
I will go over these steps quickly. Five will come here and two will go there. So two came here and five came here. And we know that now we need to increment J and I both. So why we are incrementing J is because J has placed one of the smaller elements here. So this space is occupied. So J moves ahead. J becomes one. And we will simply traverse I also ahead because this element is also explored. So I becomes two. So friends, one thing to note here is, irrespective of any of this condition is met, we simply traverse I ahead in both the cases. So therefore, it is written here. Now I is less than equal to high. Array of I, which is zero, it is less than three. So this condition comes out to be true. So we need to throw zero to J and take its value by doing this swap. So zero goes here and five comes here. So friends, here you can see that as five is greater than pivot, the elements which are greater than pivot, they are actually shifting in this direction. But the element which are lesser than pivot, we are simply throwing it to J to put it at that particular index. And J actually holds one of the greater element to pivot. Because from J to I minus one, we have the elements greater than pivot. So J is actually pointing to one of the greater elements than pivot. And once this swap is done, we are simply taking a greater element and shifting it ahead. And by doing this swap, we are creating one space here so that the elements which are lesser than pivot can come here. So therefore we do the swap. We throw whatever the element is at the ith index to J and take its value. So this spot is filled now properly. So we will increment J. So J becomes two. We will increment I. I becomes three. This condition is still true. I is less than equal to high. One is less than three. So this condition is true. So we perform these steps again. So we are performing this swap using this temp variable. So phi comes here and one goes there. And after filling this position with a value smaller than pivot, we move J ahead. So J becomes three. And we have explored the array till this point. So we move I also ahead. I becomes four. So friends, here you need to keep watch on these two ranges from low to J minus one. We have the elements smaller than pivot, which is true. From J to I minus one, we have elements greater than pivot. So this is J I minus one. So five is actually greater than pivot. So this both the conditions are true when we are doing these steps. Now I is still less than equal to high. So this while loop will execute array of I, which is six is actually greater than pivot. So this condition comes out to be false. So when array of I is greater than pivot, we know that this element is greater than pivot and it is at its proper position. So we don't touch this element. We simply move I ahead like this. So still you can see from J to I minus one, we have elements greater than pivot. So therefore, when we encounter a value greater than pivot, we simply move ahead. And when we encounter a value lesser than or equal to pivot, we simply throw it into this direction so that we can perform a swap between I and J. Now I is actually equal to high. So this loop will run one more time. And now here you can see our pivot and array of I are the same elements. So why we are running it one more time is because smaller than or equal to pivot. So we have got a value equal to pivot. So we need to make it lie in the range of low to J minus one. 
so j is holding a value greater than pivot so we do this swap here so 5 comes here and 3 goes there so it means our pivot has landed into its correct position then we will increment j j becomes 4 and we will increment i i becomes 6 so as i has become 6 this while loop will terminate because value of i is 5 so friend this partition method does two things first it returns the index of the pivot which is j minus 1 which is 3 and second it takes in the original array and reorders it such a way that all the elements smaller than pivot are on the left side and all the elements greater than pivot are on the other side so when this method will end we will return j minus 1 which is the index of this pivot from where this partition has happened so the execution point will reach to this sort method and the array has been reordered we have left this sort method at line number 3 so we will start from line number 3 this partition method has written a value of p which is the index of pivot which was 3 so value of p will be 3 like this here so this is what we saw in the partition that all elements smaller than pivot are in this side and greater than pivot are on this side so friends here you can see that if I sort this array directly the sorted array would look like 0, 1, 2, 3, 5 and 6 and here you can see that once this partition is done when we are putting all the smaller elements before the pivot and all the greater elements after the pivot so when we sort this array completely you can see that the index of the pivot remains the same 3 is at index 3 and after sort also it will be at the index 3 because here it's 0 1 2 3 4 5 index so it remains at the third index only so this is one important step in the partitioning that after the partition pivot is actually at its sorted position so now what we do is we don't touch this pivot because it lies at its proper sorted position now our task is to perform this pivot selection and partitioning on the left side of the pivot and on the right side of the pivot and dead to recursively so this sort method will keep on calling itself till the base case is reached so now we call the sort method again and this time we only take these three elements and we try to sort them so here we are calling the sort method we are passing in this array low value will be 0 only high value will become p minus 1 because we are calling this sort method with p minus 1 it means we are taking in this range this is p so this will be p minus 1 so when this sort method will again gets called our high will become p minus 1 so as we are leaving this sort method and we are calling this sort method so first we will update the line number here and we are storing the state of the low p and high so we update line number 4 here and we leave this sort method and again call the sort method so this sort method will be called with low as 0 and high as p minus 1 so this was our p previously p minus 1 which is 2 so here now we are doing the sort from low to p minus 1 so this is the range of our array which we need to sort now so high becomes 2 p minus 1 which is 2 so our new high became 2 low is 
less than high. So now we'll partition only the left side of the pivot, which is the three elements. So we will leave at line number three, this sort method. So this partition method will be executed again. And now we are not taking in complete array. We are taking the array from range low to high, which is zero to two index like this. So this partition method will only touch these three elements. So first we select the pivot, which is the last element of this range. So array of high will become our pivot. So one becomes our pivot. We start the partitioning with a value of i and j is low, which is zero. And as we already discussed how this algorithm works, we'll go over this quickly. We need to keep these ranges into mind and these two conditions into mind. So i is less than equal to high. This while loop will execute array of i, which is two. It is greater than pivot. So we do nothing. We simply move ahead. We do i plus plus. i becomes one. i is still less than high. Now array of i, which is zero, it is less than equal to pivot. It means we need to throw it to j and take its value. So we do this via a swap. So two comes here and zero goes there. So zero goes there. And as j is filled this position properly, we'll increment j. j becomes one. We'll also increment i. i becomes two. i is actually equal to high. So this loop will run one more time to put this pivot at its correct position. Now one is equal to pivot. So we do this swap again. So two comes here and one goes there. Then we increment j, j becomes two and we increment i. So i becomes three and this while loop will terminate because value of i is two and j is three. So three is not less than equal to two. So here you can see that now we need to return the index of the pivot, which is at j minus one, which is this. And here you can see that when we did partition of these three elements, these are actually elements which are lesser than pivot, which is one. And these are the elements which are greater than pivot, which is two. So currently it has only one, one element. So we have reordered the array and we are returning the pivot as one. So execution point will reach here. We know that we have left at line number three. So we start from here. This method returned the value of pivot as one. So P becomes one. Like this. So friends, we know that after doing this partition, we recursively call the sort method again. And this time we go from low to P minus one, which is the left side. And then we go from p plus one to high, which is on the right side. So first we go on the left side. So here you can see this recursion is happening till the array is getting divided. So now when we will leave this sort method, we will first update the line number here, which is four. And then we will call this sort method where low will be zero and the value of high we pass is p minus one. So p minus one will be zero. So this value will go to high and this value will go to low in the next sort method. So we have updated the line number and we have called this sort method again. So it looks like this. 
that this low which was zero, it's zero. P minus one which is zero index, so high becomes zero. So it looks like this. So friends, here you can see now low and high are pointing to the same index. It means that we have left with only one element, and we can't divide this array further down or partition this array further down because we have only left with one element. So therefore, we have reached our base case. So low is equal to high. So this sort method will end, and this sort method will be removed from the call stack, and the execution point will reach here back. So it looks like this. This method was removed from the call stack, and execution point reached here. We know that we left this sort method at line number four, so we start from line number four. And when we had left this sort method, low was at zero, p was at one. High was at two, so we position them back to their respective indexes. High was at two, p was at one, and here you can see that we are done with this left part now. So this sort method is done, and now we go on the right side. So we call this sort method again. Now this time we are. Passing the value of low as p plus one, so p is one, and p plus one is two. So when we go on the right side, the value of low changes, and when we go on the left side, the value of high changes. Here you can see, if we are going on the left, value of high changes. If we are going on the right, value of low changes. So now we will leave this sort method. We first update the line number here that we are leaving at line number five, and we are calling this sort method with p plus one as our low, which is two, and high as two. So there will be one more method on the call stack with low as two and high as two. So it would look something like this. Moving ahead. Here you can see that now we are actually partitioning the elements which are greater than pivot, which is only this element two, which is only one element. As low is equal to high, it means we have reached our base case, and we are telling to this sort method that please stop the recursion and go back. So this method will be removed from the call stack because we can't divide two further down, and the execution point will reach here. So when this sort method was left, we had left at line number five. So we start from line number five, and at that moment, value of low p and high were zero, one, and two. So we give them their respective indexes. So it was like this, and now after executing line number five, there are no more lines left to be traversed. So this sort method will also end. And the execution point will reach to this sort method because this sort method was actually being called by this sort method. So this method will be removed from the call stack. And when we had left this sort method, we had left at line number four. So we start from line number four. And at that moment, value of low was zero, p was three, and high was five. So we give them their respective indexes. So this was the state when we had left this sort method. So here, this sort method is done. It means, so it means that when we had done our first partition, the pivot came out to be index three, and in this sort method, we went to the left side of the pivot, and we did the sorting. And here you can see these three elements are sorted. So we had done with this method. Now our task is to go on the right side. Call sort method again recursively. We pass the value of low as p plus one because we need to now go in this direction, and high remains the same. 
So here we are leaving this sort method. We'll update line number here, which is five, and we are calling this sort method, passing in low value as p plus one, which is four. So it looks like this. Low becomes p plus one, which is four. So it looks like this. Low is less than high. It means we have two elements. It means we can divide this two elements further down. So we call the partition method again. We pass in the range from low to high. We are telling we need to partition the array of these two elements only. So this is our range. So when we are calling this partition method, we first update the line number here, and we have stored the state already in low and high. So line number three comes here. We leave this sort method. We call this partition. We need to partition from low to high. That is in this range. We are not touching this side because we have already done the sorting and partitioning of these elements. So we are now only touching these two elements. Array of high will be our pivot. So first we are doing the pivot selection. So five becomes our pivot. We create two pointers i and j, which start from fourth index. And then we perform the same step which we have discussed already. We provide a while loop, and the condition is i should be less than equal to high. We need to keep four things in mind. These two ranges. And these two conditions. So array of i, which is six, it is greater than pivot. So we simply traverse ahead. We do nothing. We do i plus plus. I becomes five. I is equal to i. So this condition is true. Now array of i is five, and five is our pivot as well. So therefore, when array of i is equal to pivot, we need to throw whatever value is at ith index to j and take its value. So we first perform the swap. So six comes here and five goes there. We have placed five at its correct position, which is our pivot position. So we increment j. And then we increment i. So now this while loop condition comes out to be false because value of i is six and high is five. So we simply return the pivot index, which is at j minus one. So j minus one, which is the fourth index. So we return four from this partition method, and we have also reordered the array in such a way that. All the elements lesser than pivot are on its left side. So currently, there are no elements which are lesser than pivot because we are not touching this side. We are touching from low and high. So from low to j minus one, low to j minus one, we have elements smaller than or equal to pivot, which is true. And from j to i, which is six minus one, which is only this element. Having a value greater than pivot, so we simply return index four from here. So the execution point will reach here. We had left this sort method at line number three, so we start it from line number three. The partition method returned the value as four. We have placed four here, so p becomes four. Now we go on the left side of the pivot from low to p minus one. So here you can see low and p are pointing to the same element. So when we call this sort method, we first update the line number, which is four, and then there will be one sort method on the call stack.
so here when we had left this sort method we call this sort method from low to p minus 1 so when we did p minus 1 our high became 3 so here you can see that low is actually greater than 3 so it means we have reached our base case and which makes sense because there are no elements on the left side of the pivot to be divided further down so we simply return from this method and the execution point will reach here we had left at line number 4 so we start from line number 4 and low p and 5 had values as 4, 4, 5 so we give them their respective values 4, 4 and 5 and now we go on the right side of the pivot which is at p plus 1 to high so p plus 1 is index 5 so first we update the line number here because we are leaving this sort method and then we are calling sort so there will be one more method on the call stack with p plus 1 as our new low which is 5 and high remains 5 only so it looks like this so here we can't divide this 6 further down it means we have reached our base case low is actually equal to high so this if block will not be executed so the condition in if block comes out to be false and we simply leave this method so this method will be removed from the call stack and the execution point will reach here we had left this sort method in line number 5 so we start from line number 5 and at that moment low p and high were at 4, 4 and 5th index so we reassign them their indexes like this and as there are no more steps left to traverse for this sort method so this sort method will also be removed from the call stack and the execution point will reach here so when we had left this sort method we had left at line number 5 so we start from line number 5 and at that moment low p and high were at 0, 3 and 5th index like this and also friends here you can see that after line number 5 we have no statements to execute so this sort method will also be removed from the call stack so friends here you can see after every method got removed from the call stack we have actually performed the sorting of the array we have used the quick sort and we have sorted the array so friend this was all about the step by step demonstration of quick sort algorithm where this sort method recursively calls this sort method one is when it goes on the left side of the pivot which is the smaller elements and one when it goes on the right side of the pivot which are the greater elements to pivot in this partition method we do the pivot selection and reordering of the array in such a way that smaller or equal elements are on the left side then our pivot comes and then the elements greater than pivot comes so this steps we do recursively till all the elements are sorted so friend this was all about quick start algorithm i hope you must have liked this video in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in this video we will be discussing a coding problem squares of a sorted array in java so if you see in this problem we are given an integer array which is sorted in ascending order so here you can see this is the input minus 4 minus 1 0 3 and 10 so it's sorted in ascending order now what we need to do is we need to return an array of integers such that we need to square them and whatever is the outcome we need to simply return that array so for example the output would be 0 1 9 16 and 100 
सो हाउ दिस आउटपुट केम इज आफ्टर स्क्वायरिंग ईच एंड एवरी नंबर यू विल सी द एरे विल बिकम माइनस फोर इन टू माइनस फोर विल गिव अस सिक्सटीन माइनस वन इन टू माइनस वन विल गिव वन जीरो इन टू जीरो विल गिव जीरो थ्री इन टू थ्री विल गिव नाइन टेन इन टू टेन विल गिव हंड्रेड सो दिस इज द एरे विच विल बी जनरेटेड आफ्टर वी स्क्वायर ईच एंड एवरी एलिमेंट ना द कॉम्प्लेक्सिटी पार्ट इज वी नीड टू सॉर्ट दिस एरे एंड रिटर्न फ्रॉम द मेथड सो आफ्टर वी सॉर्ट दिस पार्ट इट विल बिकम जीरो वन नाइन सिक्सटीन हंड्रेड सो फ्रेंड्स द ब्रूट फोर्स अप्रोच वुड बी वी सिंपली स्क्वायर द एरे सो इट विल बिकम लाइक दिस सिक्सटीन वन जीरो नाइन हंड्रेड एंड देन वी अगेन यूज एरेज डॉट सॉट वी पास इन द एरे एंड वी गेट दिस रिजल्ट एरे बट दिस इज अ ब्रूट फोर्स अप्रोच विच इज नॉट वेरी इफिशियंट सो इफ यू सी एट द लास्ट टाइम इफ यू सॉर्ट द एरे द टाइम कॉम्प्लेक्सिटी विल बी एन लॉग एन सो विच इज नॉट गुड वी नीड टू सी दैट वेदर कैन वी डू इट इन ओ ऑफ एन बिकॉज दिस ऑपरेशन आर कॉन्स्टेंट एंड इफ यू इट रेट ईच एंड एवरी एलिमेंट वंस we get o of n time complexity so let's see the algorithm and its demonstration step by step so here is the algorithm so here you can see it is only taking one for loop and we are not sorting the array anywhere so let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step but before we start in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update so we'll call this method we pass in the array so let's say if we take this array minus 4 minus 1 0 3 and 10 so the length of the array is 5 so at the start we simply calculate the length of the array by doing array dot length and we store it in integer variable n so n will become 5 now as you want to square each and every element and return this array all together in a sorted form we'll first create our result array so this result array will store all these elements squares in sorted form so we'll create this new array we pass in the length as 5 so it will look something like this so these are the default values of the integer array so here the idea is we take two pointers i and j so i will start from 0 and j will start from n minus 1 which is the last index so it would look something like this that i is pointing to zero index and j is pointing to the last index which is 4 So here, if you see, when we do the squares of any negative number, we usually get the result in positive side of the numbers. So therefore, this problem becomes complex because if suppose our array had only positive numbers, then this problem would have been straightforward. We just do the squares, and as the array is already sorted, the squares would have been in sorted form. But here, as we are including these negative numbers, here you can see. Three is greater than minus four, but if we take the squares of both the numbers, minus four into minus four, we'll get sixteen, and three into three, we'll get nine. So before doing squares, minus four is less than three, but after doing square, this number sixteen is actually getting greater than nine. So it means when we will return the result of the squares in sorted form. This minus four square will come after three squares because nine will come before sixteen. So this algorithm becomes very tricky to find the exact position of these negative numbers among the positive numbers. So what we do is we try to fill this result array from the end. So here we create a for loop where k starts from n minus one. so k is starting from 
because value of n is 5. So it means we will try to fill this result array from the last. Why we are doing it from the last because this is the extreme point where we are sure that what value will come. So for example, this array sorted. So here will be the smallest number and can be negative and here will be the largest number. So if we do square of these both numbers and we try to compare them, we will get one value for sure which will be greater than overall all the numbers squares and we can simply put it here. So let's say for example, if we take minus 4 and 10. So minus 4 into minus 4 will give 16. 10 into 10 will give 100. So if we compare 16 with 100, we are very much sure that 100 is greater than 16 and any number in the array won't get bigger than 100 because we are actually comparing the extremities of this array. So here let's say if it would have been minus 11, if we would have done the square, we would have got 121 and 10 square is 100. So we are very much sure that if we are comparing the extremities, we will get a square which will be the largest among all the numbers and we can safely put it in the last index. So this idea will be more clear when we will actually see the demonstration of this algorithm. So I'll just remove this. So here k is value is 4 and it is greater than or equal to 0. So this condition is true. So here you can see why we created these two pointers and we pointed at the extremities because as the array is sorted in ascending order, the element square won't be necessarily sorted in ascending order. So here what we do is, we take the absolute value of the value at ith index and the absolute value at the jth index. So what this absolute method returns is, let's say if the value is minus 4, it will give us 4. Let's say if the value is minus 1, it will give us 1. Let's say if the value is 10, it will give us 10. So it gives the absolute value without the sign of it. So here we are actually comparing the numbers without their sign and why we are doing it because this negative sign when we do square this becomes minus into minus becomes positive and we actually do the square of the number which will give us 16 so it's plus 16 so this minus doesn't play any role in the square part but as these numbers are sorted and we can encounter negative values as well so therefore we are comparing the absolute values of the start and the end. So here if you see the math dot absolute value of i will be 4 and j will be 10 is not greater than 10. So this condition comes out to be false. So the else part will be executed. So this actually signifies that we can safely take 10 do its square and place it into the end of the result array because we are very much sure that this value can be safely placed here because we have compared it with the extreme left value. So here we do 10 into 10 which is 100 and we simply put it into the result array at kth index. Now after placing it, we know that we have used this value. So we'll simply decrement j. So j becomes 3. Now we'll simply decrement k because we have used this place. And k is still greater than or equal to 0. So friends, here you can see the importance of doing math.absolute. We are actually discarding this negative signs. And as the array is sorted, we are comparing the extremities of i and jth index and whichever will be the greater number that square will come directly here. So here math dot absolute of array of i will be 4 and math dot absolute of array of j will be 3 only. So 4 is greater than 3. So this condition comes out to be true. 
so we simply assign the square of this value minus 4 into the result array at kth index so minus 4 into minus 4 will give us 16 so we'll simply assign 16 here and as we have used this minus 4 will increment i So I will point to index 1, will decrement k because we have used this spot, k is greater than or equal to 0. Now we will do math dot absolute of minus 1 which will give us 1 and math dot absolute of 3 which will give us 3. So this condition comes out to be false because 1 is not greater than 3. So we can safely put 3's square here which will be 9. We have used this spot. So we will decrement j now. So j becomes 2. We will decrement k because we have filled this spot. k becomes 1 and 1 is greater than or equal to 0. Now we do mat dot absolute of minus 1 which will give us 1 and mat dot absolute of 0 which will give us 0. So 1 is greater than 0. So this condition comes out to be true and what we do is we simply assign minus 1 into minus 1 which is 1 into this spot. We have used this spot, so we will increment i, i becomes 2, we will decrement k, because we have used this spot, so k is equal to 0, so this condition still comes out to be true, and here we are left with only one element, so 0 is not greater than 0 because math dot absolute value of 0 is 0 so this if lock condition comes out to be false and we simply assign 0 into 0 which is 0 to this spot so it becomes 0 now we have used this spot so we will decrease j so j becomes 1 which will point here will decrement k because we have used this spot. So k becomes minus 1. It means it has gone outside of the boundaries of the array. Therefore this condition will come out to be false. And here you can see at the end we will simply return the result. So this is the result where we have squared each number and after squaring each number you can see the result array is still sorted and we have used this algorithm without using arrays.sort so the time complexity of this algorithm is o of n so we'll simply return the result so friends i hope you must have liked this video in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update. Thanks, have a nice day. Hello everyone. So in our previous video we saw a problem. Squares of a sorted array. We saw the animation of the algorithm step by step. So in this video we will actually code the algorithm and will test its working in the main method. So before we start, in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update. So here in our array util class, I will be creating one method as public static will give a name to this method as sorted squares. So this method will take in an array. And what this method will do is, it will do the square of each and every element of the array 
and whatever the array it will return that array will also be sorted and this array is already sorted so in our animation video we saw that we can solve this problem using two pointer technique so here first we will create an integer variable n this will store the length of the array then we will create one pointer i which will start from the zero index and one pointer j which will start from the last index so the last index will point to array dot length minus one now as we want to return a sorted array so we'll create a result array the size will be the same as our input array now here what we will do is we'll provide a for loop and inside that for loop we will try to fill this result array from the end so here we will start from k equals to n minus 1 because n minus 1 is the last index and it will go to when k is greater than or equal to 0 k minus minus so from k n minus 1 it will go to 0 and with each iteration it will get decrement by one position so friends here you can see that this array is actually sorted array so if i take this example so here you can see that this array can contain negative values so if the array contain only positive values this problem would have been very easy we would have just done the square of each and every number and simply place it into the result array at their respective indexes but as this array contains the negative elements also so here for example let's say it was given something like this so we can't directly do the square of each and every number and put it into the respective position because this will result something like this minus 4 into minus 4 will give 16 minus 1 into minus 1 will give 1 0 into 0 will give 0 and 3 into 3 will give 9 so here you can see we can't directly just square the numbers and put it into the respective position because this array is not sorted and we want to return the sorted array so one thing is we just square and at the end we just do the sorting explicitly and return but that would be a very bad algorithm time complexity wise because we are actually using the sorting technique so in this algorithm using this for loop we will try to sort this array properly so that it would look something like this that 0 should come here then 1 then 9 and then 16 so usually in order to do that what we can do is we try to compare the absolute extreme values so whichever value is greater we do their square and we simply put it into the last index and similarly we go on doing like this so for example if we do the absolute value of minus 4 we will get 4 and we see that 4 is greater than 3 so it means if we do 4 into 4 or minus 4 into minus 4 we will get 16 and we can safely place 16 at the end and after filling this position we just come to this position and after using this minus 4 we just shift here so in the next iteration we simply compare the absolute value of minus 1 which will give us 1 and we'll compare 1 with 3 and we see that 3 is greater than 1 so we simply do 3 square and we put 9 at this position and similarly we keep on doing like this so here the main idea is to take the absolute values of the extreme values try to compare them and whichever is the greater do their square and put it into the result array at the index which is starting from the last index which is n minus 1 so here we provide a condition as if math dot absolute of array of i so we have created these two pointers one would be at the start another would be at the end if it is greater than 
मैथ डॉट एब्सोल्यूट एरे ऑफ जे सो वॉट वी कैन डू इज इफ द एब्सोल्यूट वैल्यू आई एथ इंडेक्स इज ग्रेटर देन एब्सोल्यूट वैल्यू ऑफ जे एथ इंडेक्स देन इन अवर रिजल्ट एट के एथ इंडेक्स वी विल असाइन एरे ऑफ आई इन टू एरे ऑफ आई सो वी आर डूइंग द स्क्वायर ऑफ दिस नंबर एंड वी आर असाइनिंग इट टू द रिजल्ट एरे आफ्टर डूइंग दैट वी नो दैट वी हैव यूज फॉर एग्जाम्पल वी हैव यूज दिस पोजिशन ऑफ द आई सो वी सिंपली इंक्रीमेंट आई बिकॉज वी नीड टू नाउ टेक अनादर वैल्यू बिकॉज वी आर डन विद दिस वैल्यू लेट से फॉर एग्जाम्पल एंड एल्स देन वी कैन सिंपली असाइन एरे ऑफ जे इन टू एरे ऑफ जे एंड एज वी आर असाइनिंग एरे ऑफ जे एंड इट इज बेसिकली स्टार्टिंग फ्रॉम द लास्ट इंडेक्स सो इट सिग्निफाइज दैट वी हैव यूज दिस वैल्यू फॉर एग्जाम्पल एंड नाउ वी नीड टू गो वन स्टेप बिफोर टू इट सो वॉट वी डू इज वी डू जे माइनस माइनस एंड आफ्टर द फर्स्ट इटरेशन ऑफ फॉर लुक इन अवर रिजल्ट एरे लेट सपोज इफ यू टेक दिस एग्जाम्पल सिक्सटीन गॉड ऑक्यूपाइड एट दिस प्लेस so we are doing k minus minus because now we need to fill this position we have filled this position now we need to fill this and with each iteration we will fill one one position and at the end we will simply return the result so friend this is the algorithm now we will test its working in the main method so here i will be using this array which we discussed in our slide as well here we will get the result array we will call sorted squares we pass in the array and at the end we'll simply print the array and if i run the main method so here you can see That we got the answer at zero, one, nine, sixteen, hundred. So this zero came from this zero. This one came from minus one. Nine came from three. Sixteen came from minus four, and hundred came from ten. And how it came? We simply squared them, and using this for loop, we actually placed them at their respective position so that. the final array is also sorted so friends i hope you must have liked this video in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in this video we are going to discuss a problem rearrange sorted array in max min form so let's see what this problem is and how to solve this So in this problem we are given a sorted array of integers in ascending order now we need to rearrange the array in such a way that the first position will have the largest number which is the rightmost number the second will have the smallest second will have the smallest which is the first number the third will have the second largest so the third number will be second largest and it will go on so fourth number will be second smallest and here it will be third largest third smallest and then fourth largest so friends the only constraint is that we can't create a new array and do this rearrangement we need to solve this problem in o of 1 extra space so here if we create a new array of same size which would be our result array then this problem becomes simple because then we can create one pointer here and one pointer here and we can alternatively put the elements in the array and return so the space complexity of the problem will become o of n because we are creating a new array and then we are putting the elements in max min form so if we are using o of one extra space it means we need to modify the same array and return it back so let's see how we can solve this problem in o of one extra space 
let's suppose we are given with this array which is sorted 2 3 5 6 8 9 and our output array will become like this 9 2 8 3 6 5 so 9 is the largest 2 is the smallest 8 is the second largest 3 is the second smallest and so on so as the array is sorted we know that we can get the largest element if we start from this index which is the max index so this pointer max index will help us in giving the largest then second largest then third largest and so on and the smallest elements will be given by min index so here both these pointers will help us in giving largest and smallest numbers second largest and second smallest summer so min index will travel in this direction and max index will travel in this direction and here we will have a iterator i which will travel one one element in this direction because we have to solve this problem in o of one extra space we can't create a new array and simply put the elements in alternate fashion so somehow we need to modify the original array only so we create this pointer which will travel in this direction and try to fill the elements in this form also friends here you can see in the output array 9 being the largest so if I write here largest if you see the indexes of the largest elements 9 is at 0 then comes the second largest 8 which is at 2 third largest at 4 so for this simple array if I write the indexes it would be 0 2 4 and for the smallest it is 1 3 and 5 so the indexes would be 1 3 and 5 so here if you see we need to arrange this array in max min form and to place the elements in respective indexes we have this idea that the largest numbers will be placed at even indexes and the smallest number will be placed at odd indexes so this is one thing we need to keep in mind so this iterator when it will travel in this direction at whichever index it is we will first deduce that whether it is an even index or odd if it is an even index then we will take the help of max index take that value and somehow place it at the index denoted by i and if the i is at odd index then we will take the help of min index take that value and somehow place it where i belongs so i will write here max index min index so we need to keep this information in mind that the largest will be at even index and will be placed with the help of max index which will be starting from the last index the smallest will be at odd index the numbers will be provided by min index starting from the zeroth index min index after placing one one smallest element will travel in this direction and max index after placing the largest element will travel in this direction so if you closely observe between these two arrays you will see we need to arrange the array in max min form so at the start when i will be at zeroth index here we know that we need to put 9 at the first spot so as we can't create a new array we need to put 9 somehow here but here you can see we have already 2 because 2 will lie in this index after the output but 2 will see there is a 3 and if you see 3 will lie in this index here and when we will place 3 here it will see that it has 6 because 6 will lie in this index here and it has 8 so 8 will lie in this index and similarly if you see we can't directly replace the elements because it has already one element which we need to place it at its correct index so that it looks in max min form so friends the trick to solve this problem is instead of storing 9 directly here what we can do is we take 9 we take 2 we apply some formula and generate let's say an integer let's say we combine 9 and 2 in such a way based on such formula and we get a number x so we will store x here instead of 9 so why we are storing these numbers is so as we are storing a combination of number based on a formula now let's say if I take an example here 
we have 8. Now this 8, we need to somehow place it index to here. Like this. So let's say to this number I denote it as A. And this number, let's say I denote it as B. So we'll take B and A and apply some formula and generate a number X. So this X we will store here. Instead of 8 directly, we will store a number X which will be a combination of B and A. 5 and 8. Now why we are storing both the numbers is in the output array 8 should come here but 5 will be lost. So we need to prevent both the numbers because if I put 8 directly here then 5 will be lost and we can't figure that what we need to place at this index because 5 should come here in the output array. So this x we store in such a way we will see the formula later. This x we store in such a way that it will help us in giving A back and B back. So that after storing X here in the resultant array at this index we will somehow deduce A and when we will reach here we take that X and we can somehow deduce B so that we can place phi directly here. So this is very important that we are using some formula here and storing a number X and this X will help us in generating A and B back. So here what we do is, as the array is sorted, the last index will be the maximum value. We will take a variable which is greater than our largest number. So here what we can do is, we can simply do 9 plus 1. Let's say 10. We are going to last index, we are taking that value and adding 1. We will see why we are doing that. So friends, the formula we use to store two numbers is, let's say if the i is an even index. We need to store the largest number and that largest number will be given by max index here and the max we have is 10. So let's say if we are at index 0 and we need to place 9 here like this. So if I use this formula, so at this index what we will store, we will store the whatever the value here we have which is the 2 which is important for us because this is our let's say b. So we take 2. We take the number which we are shifting, which is 9. We do modulus by 10, which is 9 divided by 10 will give us a remainder. And we do multiply by 10. Now here you can see, it will give us 2. The remainder is 9 into 10. The number is 92. So at array of 5, we are storing the number 92. It was 2. And we are storing 92. So here if I write number 92. So here you can see this number is our x. And how we can deduce a and b back is 92. The max which we took. Let's say if I divide 92 by 10. So we will get 9. Which is our a. And if I do 92 mod 10. We will get the remainder. Which is 2. So here you can see this largest number which we are taking, it is generating a number which is storing our both the integers, the number which you are shifting here and the number which is already here. So we can deduce 9 and 2 back. So now let's see how this algorithm will move ahead. So this mod, you will understand when we reach here. So now I will come here and we assume that max index somehow has placed this value here. So the max index will now come at index 4 to take the second largest value. Like this. So now i is at odd index. So now we will use the formula for odd index. We will take the help of min index. The formula is pretty much same. Only the value in array for max index and min index is changing here. So now here you can see that this step will be more clear to you why we are doing this modulus. So at index 1, we need to put the smallest number we are taking this formula. So we take the value here which is 3 because we don't want to lose this value. And here you can see, we will take the value at min index. So currently if I take the value at min index, it is not 2. 2 is gone, we have 92. So I will simply write 92 mod 10 into 10. 
Now you will understand and why we are doing first mod is because there could be a chance that we get an overridden value. So here we have 92 and we know that from x we can deduce our overridden value which was 2 and the number which is transferred here. So 92 divided by 10 will give 9. 92 mod 10 will give remainder which is 2. So here therefore we are first taking this remainder so that first we get the original value. And even if this value is not overridden, let's say it were 2 only. So 2 mod 10, this will again give us 2 only. So here, so here this formula is important that we are doing mod with the max value. First to deduce our original number and then we are simply multiplying it by 10 so that something like this can happen. So 3 plus 2 into 10, the remainder is 2. So it will give 23. So here this number 23 is suggesting that that we will store 23 here and now this value is overridden. 23 comes here and what it is telling is it is storing two numbers the number which is getting shifted here and the number which was already here. So we will go over this quickly now because we have a fair amount of idea what we are doing. So for 2 it is an even so we use this formula. So we take the value 5 plus we are using this formula. Value at max index is 8. So we are doing 8 mod 10 into 10. So here you can see that this value is not overridden. So therefore even if we do mod 10 we get the same value back. So 5 plus 8 into 10 which is 85. So we are storing 85 here for this index i and then i will come here and this max index will come here and as we have used this 2 also here so we will move the main index to here. So now as i is at 3 which is odd index we need to take the smallest value we move min index in this direction because we assume that we have placed 2 here somehow. The step which we did previous to 85 while we placed 23 here. So min index used this value and it shifted here. Now at this spot what we do is we are taking this formula because value of i is 3. So here we take 6 23 like this the remainder would be 3 it will give 36 so here now this value will become 36 this has been overridden and this has also been overridden so these are the now original values at these spots now after taking the help of min index min index will come here We will move i ahead and now value of i is 4, we will take the largest number and we will use this formula. So 8 plus the value at max index is 36 mod 10 into 10. So this will give us 8 plus 6 into 10, it will be 68. So we are storing 68 here. So this 8 will be overridden with 68. So this value will be overridden and max index will come here. Because it has used this value. I will go here and at the last index being an odd index we will take that value 9 because we are using this formula. We are taking the value 9 then plus value at min index which is 85 because min index is pointing to index 2 so 85 mod 10 into 10 9 plus 5 into 10 so this will give us 59 so we are storing 59 so i'll just remove this now everything so now instead of these numbers we have a combination of numbers so let's say if I denote this number as x 
and we need to get back B and A. So we know that will give us A, will give us B. We know this formula already. So now we will iterate this array one more time. And now what we do is, we need to store 9 here, which is our A. So what we do is, 92 divided by 10 will give 9. So 9 comes here. Here, 23 divided by 10, 2 comes here. And similarly, 85 divided by 10 will give 8. 36 divided by 10 will give 3. 68 divided by 10 will give 6. 59 divided by 10 will give 5. So this is how this combination numbers will give us output array, which is our answer. So friend, these are the formulas we need to keep in mind. And now let's move ahead and see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step. So we have method arrange max min, which takes in an array. And here you can see that we are not creating any additional array. So this problem is solved in O of 1 space complexity. So friends, before we start, if you want to master algorithms and data structures, then you can subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update. So we call arrange max min, we pass in the array. So this is our original array, which is here. And this is our resultant array which is our output array. So here as we will modify this array, this number will be getting overridden. So to understand what the previous number was, you can refer this array because this is our original array. Moving ahead, we create a max index starting from the last index array dot line minus one array dot line this six minus one will give five. So max index will start from here. Because this max index will give us the largest, then second largest, then third largest and so on. We'll create a min index starting from zero. This min index will give us smallest, then second smallest and third smallest and so on. So as the array is sorted, we have created two pointers starting from very extreme ends. And then we will evaluate a max value, which we already discussed that we simply take the value at the last index, which is the maximum because this array is sorted. We do plus one. So max will become 10. And now we will apply the for loop where we are traversing I in this direction, starting from zero and going till fifth index via this condition. So currently I will start from zeroth index. 0 is less than array dot length which is 6. So friends, in our previous slide we discussed that first we evaluate whether this i is at even index or at odd index. So if i divided by 2, if it gives remainder as 0, it means it is an even index. And if i mod 2 doesn't give us a remainder 0, it means it's an odd index. So currently value of i is 0. So I mod 2 will give remainder as 0, which means that we are at even index. And as we are at even index, we know that we need to place the largest numbers, which will be given by max index. At odd index, we will put the smallest numbers that will be given by min index. So here we are using the same formula. So as i is at zeroth index, we are taking the help of max index to take the maximum value and place it here. So we will store a modified number here, which is the combination of this and this number. So we will take two plus value at max index, which is nine mod 10, which is our max into 10. So this will give us 92. So we store 92 here. And then we decrement max index, assuming that max index has placed 9 at its proper spot. So the max index will come at index 4, like this. We will increment i. i comes at index 1. 
Now I mod two will give remainder as one. So therefore we know that one is an odd integer. So the else part will be executed. So now here we will take the help of min index to get us the smallest numbers. The formula is pretty much the same which we already discussed in our previous slide. Here we will take this number, which is three. We will take the number at min index, which is ninety-two. We will do mod ten. Multiply by ten. We are doing mod ten is because we need to get back the original number which was two. So ninety-two mod ten will give us two because we need to put two here somehow. So in the output array, here you can see two will come here. So at this index we need to place two. So therefore from ninety-two first we are deducing two via this modulus. So three plus. Two into ten. This will give us twenty-three. So twenty-three will come here. So now we assume that min index has taken two and somehow placed it at its correct spot. So this value and this value we assume that we have used up. So we increase min index value so that we can get a second smallest value now. Min index becomes one. We will increment i. I comes at index two. I mod two, which is two mod two, which will give us zero. So it means two is even index. So we apply the formula. We take this value, phi plus. Now we take the value of max index because we need to put eight somehow here. So eight mod ten. Five plus eighty. It will give us eighty-five. So eighty-five comes here. Now we will decrement max index because this value is used up. Max index becomes three. So it means we have used up this value now. We will increment i. I comes at third index, which is odd index. So this condition will fail because Three mod two will give us remainder as one, which is not equal to zero. And here we will take the help of min index and take the second smallest value now. So we will take this value, which is six. We take twenty-three. We'll do mod ten because at index three, you see the number we are shifting is now three should come here in the resultant array. So first we need to deduce this three back. So twenty three mod ten will give remainder as three, which was our original number here, and then we do multiply by ten. So this will give us six plus thirty, thirty six. So thirty six comes here, and now we assume that we have placed three here properly somehow. So this number will be used up, and min index will come to this spot. So we'll increment min index like this. We'll increment i. I comes to this spot. Now value of i is four, which is an even index. So this condition comes out to be true. We take the value eight, and here we will take the help of max index because we need to put the max value here. So first we will deduce what number we need to shift. So we'll take thirty six mod ten into ten. This will give us six into ten sixty eight plus sixty will give sixty eight. So sixty eight comes here, and then we have used this six also. So we will decrement max index now. It will come at index two now. We will increment i. I becomes five. Five is still less than six. Five mod two will give a remainder as one, so therefore the else part will be executed. And here we will take help of min index. So at min index, the original value was five, and we know that five needs to be come here. So first we need to deduce five out of eighty-five. So we'll use this formula. We take nine here plus. 
सो दिस फॉर्मूला विल हेल्प अस इन गेटिंग फाइव बैक सो विल टेक एटी फाइव मॉट टेन इंटू टेन दिस विल गिव नाइन प्लस फाइव इंटू टेन विच इज फिफ्टी नाइन सो फिफ्टी नाइन कम्स हियर एंड देन वी विल इंक्रीमेंट मिन इंडेक्स because we have used this value also so now when we will increment i i will become 6 and 6 is not less than 6 so therefore this for loop will terminate now which makes sense because we have used up all the values so now this is our modified array at the start we have taken this array which was our original array we transformed it into this array and now our task is to transform this array into this array so for that we are using this for loop and we have already discussed how we can do that is let's say if we take 92 we know that we have stored both the numbers the number which was getting shifted here and the number which was already here we can deduce both the numbers so let's say if i denote 92 as x so here x will give us a via x by max which is our 10 here and x will give b via x mod max so if i take 92 if i do 92 by 10 will get 9 which is our a if i do 92 mod 10 it will give us 2 which is our b and our task is to store the largest element here we know that we can get it via division so we iterate this array back from i equal to 0 it will go till the last index so we'll go over this formula quickly because it is very simple so i is 0 now at the same spot we are taking 92 dividing it by max which is 10 and storing it back at the same index only so here it will come 92 divided by 10 will give 9 like this moving ahead i becomes 1 23 divided by 10 will give 2 we increment i again i becomes 2 85 divided by 10 will give 8 we increment i i becomes 3 36 divided by 10 will give 3 will increment i 68 divided by 10 will give 6 will increment i 5 is still less than 6 because array dot length is 6 so this for loop will execute one more time for the last index 59 divided by 10 will give 5 and now when will increment i it will go beyond the boundaries of array so this for loop will terminate and here you can see after this for loop will terminate our algorithm will also end and here you can see that now we have got our output array which is in max min form and one thing to notice we have modified the same array which we received so therefore we have used o of 1 extra space so friends in order to understand this problem more you need to go over this video 2 3 times to understand these formulas which is helping us to store two numbers instead of one and then here we are deducing one of the number out of it so this x is giving b here and a here so friends i hope you must have liked this video in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update thanks have a nice day Hello friends welcome to my new data structures and algorithm in java tutorial series video friends in this tutorial we will discuss about the introduction to graphs so friends what is a graph so friends below you can see a figure it represents a graph here it contains few nodes say 1 2 3 4 5 <laughs> and these five nodes are connected through some lines So a graph is a non-linear data structure used for storing the data. So we can store the data inside a graph, but it's not a linear data structure like arrays and linked lists.
सो फ्रेंड्स इट इज़ अ सेट ऑफ वर्टिसेस सो हियर यू कैन सी वन टू थ्री फोर फाइव आर नथिंग बट वर्टेक्स ऑफ द क्राफ्ट एंड इट ऑल्सो हैज अ कलेक्शन ऑफ एजेस दैट कनेक्ट अ पेयर ऑफ वर्टिसेस सो हियर यू कैन सी टू वर्टेक्स आर कनेक्टेड बाय एन एज सो इन अ ग्राफ इफ यू टेक एनी टू वर्टेक्स एंड इफ यू वॉन्ट टू कनेक्ट दैम वी जस्ट प्रोवाइड एन एज सो हियर यू कैन सी बिटवीन दिस फाइव वर्टेक्स देर आर सिक्स एजेस वन Two, three, four, five, and six. So, in simple terms, we can represent a graph as set of vertices and a collection of edges that connects a pair of vertices. So, friends, why graphs are important? So, here you can see. So, friends, here you can see a graph which is nothing but social networking site. So, in computer applications, graphs helps us to implement social networking sites such as Facebook and Twitter. and we can term it as social networking graph so friends here in this social networking graph the names of people which you can see here is ankit john bill kathy and max we can see them as the vertices of this social networking graph so if we consider an example of facebook then friendship between two people can be represented as an edge of the graph so here you can see bill is friend to kathy and kathy is friend to bill so therefore there is a link between them which, which is nothing but friendship link so we can represent this graph where people are the vertices and the friendship link between them is nothing but the age another application of the graphs would be the web content over the internet so friends let's suppose we are having few web pages as google.com udemy.com youtube.com twitter.com and facebook.com and let's suppose from google.com there is an edge to udemy.com so this edge is nothing but a link and similarly let's say from udemy there is one link which can take us to facebook.com and from facebook to twitter and from youtube to twitter and vice versa so here we can take this web pages as the vertices of this graph and the links as the edge between these vertices so friends in computer application this web content can be represented as a graph where web pages are nothing but the vertices and the edge which connects between them is nothing but the link so friends this was the introduction to graph in our upcoming tutorial we will discuss the graphs into further detail i hope you like this video thanks have a nice day hello friends welcome to my new data structures and algorithms in java tutorial series video friends in this tutorial we will discuss how we can represent a undirected graph so one of the way in which we can represent a graph is adjacency matrix so friends first of all what is an undirected graph so here in the figure you can see five nodes 0 1 2 3 so these nodes are nothing but the vertices of the graph and you can see here an undirected edge so here between the vertex 3 and vertex 4 there is an undirected edge so what is an undirected edge the undirected edge doesn't have any direction so if suppose we are on vertex 3 then we can go to vertex 4 and if suppose we are on vertex 4 then we can go to vertex 3 and as there is no direction between the two vertices so a graph which has this two way edges are termed as undirected graph so if we take an example then social networking graph which we discussed in our previous tutorial is nothing but an undirected graph so let's suppose in a social networking graph there is a set of vertices which is nothing but the names of people so let's suppose john is a friend to max so here john and max are nothing but the vertices of the graph and the friendship between them is nothing but the edge of the graph so here if john is friend to max then it implies that max is also friend to john so it is nothing but an undirected graph so here john is friend to max is same as max is friend to john so this social networking graph can be seen as an undirected graph where edges are undirected they don't have any direction moving ahead so friends graph can be represented by a two dimensional array which is nothing but a matrix so let's suppose we are given this undirected graph where zero is connected to one one is connected to two two is connected to three and three is connected to zero so in order to represent this graph in a data structure we usually use the matrix 
which is nothing but a two dimensional array so friends here if you see there are four vertices so therefore we create a four cross four matrix so this four cross four matrix goes from indices 0 to 3 and this matrix is nothing but a 0 1 matrix so why we call it a 0 1 matrix because in order to represent an edge between two vertices we just provide a 1 which signifies that there is an edge between the two vertices so friends here you can see from 0 to 1 there is an edge so when we want to represent an edge in matrix we follow this rule that the first vertex is the row and the second vertex to which this edge is going is the column so if I take an example then between 0 and 1 there is an edge so in the graph we can represent it as from 0 to row to 1 column there is an edge which is nothing but 1 similarly if we are at node 1 and if you want to go to node 0 then there is an edge so from the first row to 0th column there is an edge and as it is an undirected graph therefore we can go both ways from 0 to 1 and 1 to 0 so let's suppose if you want to go from 3 to 2 so from the third row second column there is an edge which can be represented as 1 and similarly it is an undirected graph therefore from 2 we can go to 3 so from the second row to third column there is an edge also here you can see that from node 3 to node 1 there is no edge therefore from the third row to first column there is no edge therefore we have represented it as 0 because it signifies there is no edge between 3 and 1 so in the matrix wherever you want to represent an edge we usually put 1 and wherever we want to represent a no edge then we put 0 so friends here we use the matrix to represent an undirected graph I hope you like this video thanks have a nice day hello friends Welcome to my new data structures and algorithm in Java tutorial series video. Friends, in this tutorial we will discuss the adjacency matrix implementation of an undirected graph. So friends, in our previous tutorial we discussed what is an adjacency matrix and how we can represent an undirected graph into it. So friends, in this tutorial we will see how we can implement an adjacency matrix to represent an undirected graph through a demonstration so friends let's suppose we are given an undirected graph with four vertices as 0 1 2 3 where 0 and 1 are connected through an edge 1 and 2 are connected through an edge 3 and 2 are connected through an edge and 0 and 3 are connected through an edge so friends using this code here we can actually represent this undirected graph into a form of matrix so let's see this demonstration step by step so in our previous tutorial we discussed that using a matrix we can represent that a graph so here in our java class graph we are having this adjacency matrix and in the constructor we are initializing this adjacency matrix with the number of nodes in the graph there is a method add edge which takes two parameters let's say u and v so here suppose if you want to add an edge between 0 and 1 so 0 would be u and 1 would be v so through this code we can add an edge between u and v so we'll see its demonstration step by step so let's suppose in our main method first we initialize the graph with the number of nodes so here you can see there are 4 nodes so we are passing the number as 4 here So now the execution step goes into the constructor of graph where nodes is having value of 4. So in the constructor we simply initialize an object of matrix by providing the value of row and column as the value in the nodes which is nothing but 4. So after execution of this step it will create a two dimensional array which is nothing but a 4 cross 4 matrix. So it would look something like this so here it will be represented as an adjacency matrix which is a 4 cross 4 matrix moving ahead so friends here you can see that from 0 to 1 there is an edge 
so by calling add edge method we pass 0 and 1 because we want to create an edge between 0 and 1 here we simply apply this rule that between a row and a column we just provide a 1 which represents an edge so if you want to represent an edge between 0 and 1 so 0 will represent a row and 1 will be representing as a column so between 0 and 1 there would be an edge which will be represented by 1 so let's see how so as the value of u is 0 and v is 1 so here in order to represent an edge between 0 and 1 in the matrix 0 comma 1 we provide a value as 1 so in the matrix 0 and 1 we just provide a value of 1 so it would look something like this so this represents an edge between 0 and 1 which is 0 row and 1 column moving ahead so friend in the second step what we do is as this graph is undirected graph there is no direction between the edge therefore we can see it something like as there is an edge between 0 and 1 and we can also see it as there is an edge between 1 to 0 so friends this information we need to store into the matrix so in the first step 0 to 1 we provided a value as 1 so similarly in the second step from row 1 to 0th column we will provide a value as 1 so it would look something like this so in an undirected graph basically an edge represents a two points into the adjacency matrix because because if we are at vertex 0 then we can go to vertex 1 because there is an edge and if we are at vertex 1 then we can go to vertex 0 through this edge so therefore in the matrix this edge represents these two points that from 0 to 1 there is an edge and from 1 to 0 there is an edge moving ahead now we want to add an edge between 1 and 2 so we simply pass the parameters as 1 and 2 so into the adjacency matrix to row 1 and column 2 we need to provide a value 1 to represent an edge so it would look something like this moving ahead now similarly we have to provide an edge from row 2 to column 1 so we provide a value as 1 so this represents an edge between row 2 and column 1 moving ahead similarly vertex 2 and vertex 3 are connected through an edge therefore in the matrix from the row 2 and column 3 will provide a value as 1 moving ahead and similarly from the row 3 to column 2 will provide a value as 1 because if you want to traverse from third node to node 2 we know that there is an edge and that can be figured out through this matrix that we can directly figure it out that from row 3 and column 2 is there any edge or not so if the value is 1 we can come to know that there is an edge moving ahead and the last edge is between vertex 3 and vertex 0 so it would be represented as row 3 and column 0 which is this value will provide a value as 1 moving ahead and finally from the row 0 to third column will provide a value as 1 so friends this is how we can represent an undirected graph into a matrix and also one point to note that as it is an undirected graph therefore for each edge there will be two values of 1 into the graph which will be actually demonstrating a two way graph here from 0 to 1 there is a way and similarly from 1 to 0 there is a way so into the matrix we represented it something like from 0 to column 1 there is an edge and from 1 row and 0 column there is an edge so friend this is how we can represent a graph in the form of a two dimensional array which is nothing but a matrix in my next tutorial we will actually code this algorithm into the eclipse 
I hope you like this video. Thanks. Have a nice day. So friends, here I have created one class by name graph, which is having a main method. So into this class, we'll code the implementation of graph through adjacency matrix. So first, we'll create an integer variable. and we'll give it a name as v so this v is nothing but a number of vertices in the graph we'll also create one more integer variable we'll name it as e so this e would be number of edges in in graph We'll also create a two dimensional array, which would be our adjacency matrix and it would represent a graph. So, wait. so it would be a two dimensional array. And in the constructor, we'll initialize these three values. So this graph constructor takes in number of nodes so here if simply we can assign nodes value to v and as we are in the constructor of graph therefore value of e would be equal to 0 because till now there are no edges into the picture and finally we'll initialize the matrix with the number of nodes so if suppose the graph is four nodes therefore this should be a four cross four matrix we'll also create an add edge method which will actually add an edge from u to v and vice versa therefore here simply we can do is to u a row and v a column will assign a value of 1 which represents an edge and vice versa will do from v to u because it is an undirected graph so therefore for every edge in the matrix there will be two points which will be representing an edge after adding the edge will increment the count of edge by one so it would be e plus plus so friends in our main method we'll create a graph and add an edge between few nodes So we'll create an instance of graph and we'll provide a value of 4. So this will actually create a graph of 4 nodes and also it will create an adjacency matrix which is of 4 cross 4. So we'll actually create a graph which we saw in our previous tutorial. We'll add an edge from 0 to 1. then from 1 to 2 then from 2 to 3 and finally from 3 to 0 so friends here we have added 4 edges which we actually saw in the slide of our previous tutorial here I will create one method which will give us the string representation of this graph and I will name it as two string so first we will create a string builder
will append v which would be vertices e would be our edges and then we'll simply provide a for loop now this for loop will iterate over each and every vertex and inside this for loop will append and now we will provide one more loop which will iterate over the adjacency matrix for a particular vertex so here we will append so here we are simply printing the matrix so sb and finally we will return sb.2 string so here we will simply print g and if i run this code now so friends here you can see that there are four vertices as we have passed the value into the graph as four and there are four edges because we have created four edges from zero to one one to two two to three and three to zero and below is the string representation of this graph which is nothing but our adjacency matrix so this matrix we discussed in our previous slide you can refer that slide and you can come to know that it represents the same matrix which we discussed so friends in this tutorial we saw the implementation of the graph using an adjacency matrix i hope you like this video thanks have a nice day hello friends welcome to my new data structures and algorithms in java tutorial series video friends in this tutorial we will discuss the representation of an undirected graph through adjacency list friends in our previous tutorial we discussed about the representation of undirected graph through adjacency matrix so in this tutorial we will discuss one more way to represent a undirected graph that is through adjacency list so this adjacency list is nothing but an array of linked list so friends let's suppose we are given a undirected graph having four nodes 0 1 2 3 and from zero vertex there is an edge to vertex 1 from vertex 1 there is an edge to vertex 2 and from vertex 2 there is an edge to vertex 3 and finally from vertex 3 there is an edge to vertex 0 so friends this undirected graph can be represented as an adjacency list which is nothing but array of list so here you can see there are four nodes so we create an array of linked list having the size as 4 so here you can see each and every index hold a linked list and what this linked list contains friends let's suppose we are on vertex 0 and there is one edge to vertex 1 and one edge to vertex 3 so friends these two edges from the vertex 0 is represented as in the array index 0 the linked list which it holds has node 1 and node 3 so this structure tells us that from node 0 there is an edge to 1 and there is an edge to node 3 similarly if you can see from vertex 2 there is an edge to vertex 1 and vertex 3 so in order to represent this structure at index 2 we have node 3 and node 1 so it signifies that from 2 there is an edge to 3 and from 2 there is an edge to 1 similarly here you can see that from 
we have one edge to two, which is this edge, and from three, we have one edge to zero, which is this edge. So, friend, this is one more way to represent an undirected graph. That is by using an array of linked list. So, the length of this array is same as the number of vertices in the graph. So, friends, in our upcoming tutorial, we will discuss more about adjacency list. We'll see its code and working through animation. I hope you like this video. Thanks. Have a nice day. Hello, friends. Welcome to my new data structures and algorithms in Java tutorial series video. Friends, in this tutorial, we will discuss about the implementation of the undirected graph using adjacency list. So, friends, in our previous tutorial, we discussed about the representation of an undirected graph through an array of linked list. We also discussed that how this undirected graph can be represented into an array of linked list. So, friends, in this tutorial, we will look into the code and see its demonstration step by step. So, here is the code to implement a graph using an array of linked list. So, we will see the working of this code step by step through animation. And we will see that how we can represent this undirected graph into an array of linked list. So let's start. So in the step one, we initialize a graph and we pass in the number of vertices the graph can have. So here if you see this undirected graph has four nodes, therefore we are passing the value as four. So into the constructor, the value of nodes is four. So in the first step, what we do is we have taken this instance variable which is nothing but an array of linked list. So we initialize this array of linked list with the number of nodes. So it would look something like this. That here you can see an array of linked list. So as currently the linked list is not being initialized so they point to null. Moving ahead. So then we provide a for loop and we iterate over each and every vertex. And to this array of linked list, it will initialize the linked list to each and every index. So as i starts from 0, therefore at 0th index, it will initialize a linked list. So it would look something like this. Currently linked list is empty and head is pointing to null. Moving ahead. Then i becomes 1. And similarly at the index 1, it will initialize a linked list. Moving ahead, i becomes 2. So the index 2, it will again initialize a linked list. And similarly at the index 3, it will initialize a linked list. So now i becomes 4, therefore the condition in for loop comes out to be false because 4 is not less than 4. So friends here we have created an array of linked list and to each index we have a separate linked list. So here you can see from vertex 0 to vertex 1 there is an edge. So we will call this add edge method and we will pass the value as 0 and 1 stating that there is an edge between 0 and 1. So friends value of u is 0 and value of v is 1. And also in our previous tutorial, we discussed how we can represent an undirected graph into an array of linked list. So what we do is, as there is an edge from 0 to 1, therefore at the 0th index linked list, we add 1. So first we get this linked list at the 0th index and add 1 to it. So it would look something like this. That at the 0th index linked list, we are adding 1. Moving ahead. And similarly, as this is an undirected graph, therefore, from vertex 1, there is an edge to vertex 0. Therefore, the linked list at vertex 1 will add the value 0. So, it would look something like this. So, here it represents that from 0, there is an edge to 1. So, the linked list at 0 index has an edge to 1. And similarly, here you can see from the vertex 1, there is an edge to vertex 0. So, it is represented by the linked list at index 1 has a value 0 which signifies that there is an edge from 1 to 0 moving ahead 
then we can also see that there is an edge from 1 to 2 so we call this add edge method by passing 1 and 2 so in the first step what we do is the linked list at index 1 we add the value 2 so it would look something like this moving ahead and similarly the linked list at index 2 we will add value 1 so at index 2 we will add the value 1 so it would look something like this moving ahead now there is one more edge from the vertex 2 to vertex 3 so this can be demonstrated as to the linked list at index 2 we will add the value 3 so here to a linked list at index 2 we will add the value 3 so it would look something like this moving ahead and as it is an undirected graph therefore to the linked list at index 3 we will add the value 0 to so it would look something like this moving ahead so in the last step there is one more edge from the vertex 3 to vertex 0 so we will pass the value as 3 comma 0 so in the first step what we do is the linked list at index 3 we will add the value 0 so it would look something like this moving ahead and similarly the linked list at index 0 we will add the value 3 so friend this is the code to implement an undirected graph through an array of linked list here you can see that each and every node is been represented by an index of this array and in order to represent an edge we simply add those values into the linked list of that particular index so here you can see that from 0 there is 1 edge to 1 and 1 edge to 3 so at the linked list at 0 index we are adding 1 and 3 so this is a type of a metadata which can help us to know that okay from 0 there is an edge to 1 and from 0 there is an edge to 3 and similarly if I take this vertex 2 there is an edge to 1 and there is an edge to 3 so the linked list at index 2 has 1 and 3 so friend this is how we actually represent a graph into an array of linked list in my upcoming tutorial we will actually code this implementation into Eclipse and see it's working I hope you like this video thanks have a nice day so friends in our previous tutorial we actually discussed about the implementation of an undirected graph through adjacency list so in this tutorial we will code that implementation into Eclipse so here I have created one class by name graph having a main method so here in the graph class we will first create an array of linked list we will import the linked list from java.util we will also create an integer variable and we will name it as v so this integer variable will be having a value of number of vertices in the graph so it represents number of vertices and similarly we will create one more integer variable and we will name it as e so this integer variable will be having a value of number of edges in graph we will also create one constructor and to this constructor we will pass the number of vertices the graph can have so we'll give this integer a name as nodes so here what we can do is as v represents the number of vertices in a graph so we'll simply assign the value of nodes to it and as this graph is getting initialized so the value of e will be 0 because currently there are no edges and finally we'll create an instance of array of linked list so this dot adj equals new linked list 
and will pass the value of nodes to it. So after creating an instance of array of linked list, currently each and every index of this array will point to null because the linked list has not been initialized. So we will provide a for loop and we will iterate over each and every vertex and we will create a separate linked list for each and every index of the array. So adj of v so friend in this for loop we are iterating over each and every vertex and as we have created this array of linked list therefore we need to initialize a linked list for each and every index moving ahead we will create a method as add edge So this method takes in a two value. Let's say we give the name to it as a u and v. So by calling this add edge method, what we are doing is we are creating an edge between u and v. Friends, in our previous tutorial we saw that in order to create an edge between u and v, we have to provide the value of v into the linked list of u, and similarly we have to provide a value of u into a linked list of v. So here what we do is into the linked list of u we add the value v and similarly into the linked list of v we add value u and finally we increment the value of e by 1 because it signifies that an edge has been placed between u and v therefore we are incrementing the e by 1 so friends in the main method we will first initialize the graph with the number of nodes so friends in our previous tutorial we saw an undirected graph which had 4 nodes so we will initialize this graph with 4 vertices so we provide a value as 4 and then we'll add an edge from 0 to 1 and then from 1 to 2 and then from 2 to 3 and finally from 3 to 0 So friends here we have created one graph of 4 nodes and we have added 4 edges. So friend in order to test its working I will create one method as two string. So friend this method will return back as a string representation of this graph. So in the first step I will be creating a string builder. So to this string builder first I will append vertices and edges and then we will provide a for loop and we will simply iterate over each and every vertex so here to string builder will append v so friends here in the for loop we are getting each and every value of vertex so friends as we are looping over each and every vertex we have the vertex value we will provide one more for loop which will bring back the linked list associated with that vertex and will iterate over it and print its content. So here we will provide one more for loop. 
so in order to iterate over a linked list associated with a particular vertex what we do is we simply pass the value of that vertex and we'll get the linked list associated with it so here if i have taken example then we have added an edge from 0 to 1 and there is one edge from 3 to 0 therefore when we call the linked list associated with vertex 0 we'll get the two values one is the value 1 and one is the value 3 because those two values are there in the linked list so in this for loop we'll simply append the value present in the linked list for that particular vertex and finally we'll append one line break and we simply return the string representation of the string builder so friends in our main method we'll now sys out the value of g and we'll run this code So friend here you can see the graph has 4 vertices and 4 edges because we have initialized the graph with 4 vertex therefore the value of v is 4 which is the number of vertex and as we have added 4 edges we are getting the value of the number of edges as 4 and here in the two string representation of it what we are doing is we are iterating over each and every vertex that is from 0, 1, 2 and 3 and here you can see that there is an edge from 0 to 1 and 0 to 3 therefore from the vertex 0 there is an edge to 1 and there is an edge to 3 and similarly from vertex 3 there is an edge to 2 and there is an edge to 0 there is an edge between 2 and 3 and 3 and 0 so into the linked list of this third index there are values 2 and 0 which represents that there is an edge between 3 and 2 and 3 and 0 so friend this is how we actually represent a graph through an array of linked list I hope you like this video thanks have a nice day hello friends welcome to my new data structures and algorithms in java tutorial series video friends in this tutorial we will discuss the breadth search of an undirected graph so friends breadth search is nothing but a traversal or a searching technique which we apply to the graphs to visit each and every node of the graph so here breadth search is also known as level order traversal so let's suppose we are given a graph of say 5 nodes where 0 1 2 3 are connected by an edge and 4 is connected to 2 by an edge so therefore what do we mean by level order so suppose if you are starting from 0 then this is at level 1 so this will be visited first and then here you can see that from 0 3 and 1 are connected so these both nodes are at level 2 so after 0 1 and 3 will be visited because they are at level 2 and then you can see that from 3 there is an edge to 2 and from 1 there is an edge to 2 so therefore the node 2 is at level 3 so after visiting 1 and 3 2 will be visited because it is at level 3 and then here you can see node 4 is connected to 2 now this is at level 4 so therefore 4 will be visited after 2 so 0 is at level 1 1 and 3 are at level 2 2 is at level 3 and 4 is at level 4 so using breadth search technique we can traverse the graph level by level so friends here is the algorithm for it so friends in this algorithm we usually use q data structure so this data structure is nothing but FIFO data structure which means first in first out so the element inserted into this data structure first will be first to be removed from the queue so we are using q because it will help us in traversing the nodes of a graph level by level so friends we apply the same algorithm while we are traversing the tree but there is a slight catch in the graph 
because in the graphs it may contain a cycle which you can see here so therefore we need to keep the track of the nodes which are been visited so we usually keep the track of the nodes into a boolean array so friend let's see the working of this algorithm step by step so we'll start with the value 0 so in this method we'll pass the source node as 0 so in first step what we do is we create a boolean array whose size is equal to the number of vertices in the graph so this vertices is nothing but the instance variable which we discussed in our previous tutorial so here you can see in this graph there are 5 nodes therefore we'll create a boolean array by name visited having a size of 5 so it would look something like this and as it is a boolean array so initially all the values inside this array is marked as false and we have marked it false because initially we haven't visited any node of the graph moving ahead we'll then create a queue data structure now this queue data structure will help us in traversing the nodes of a graph level by level so it would look something like this so here in our previous tutorial we also discussed how queue data structure works so you can watch my those tutorial to get more in depth of how queue works so it's simply a FIFO data structure where element inside it first will be first to be removed moving ahead now friend as we are starting from zero so we will mark the visited index as true that we have visited this node in the array we'll make it true and here we will mark it that we have visited this node so friends after we visit the node we simply put that node into the queue so as we have visited 0 we will put the 0 into the queue so it would look something like this moving ahead so friends as we want to traverse each and every node level by level then we will apply a while loop and we will check whether queue is empty or not so currently you can see queue is not empty because there is one value inside the queue so the condition in while block comes out to be true so in the first step we simply pull this element out of the queue which is 0 and we will assign it to the integer variable u so it would look something like this and it will be assigned to u moving ahead will simply print this element on the console that it is visited so 0 is printed on the console so here in breakfast search after visiting any particular node we then go towards its adjacent nodes so here you can see the node adjacent to 0 are 1 and 3 and in our previous tutorial we saw the representation of a graph through adjacency list so now we'll apply a for, for loop which will traverse the adjacent nodes of 0 so here if we look the adjacency list of graph then the node adjacent to u would look something like this that in the adjacency list 0 is connected to 1 and 0 is connected to 3 so here 0 is connected to 1 and 0 is connected to 3 so now we will traverse each and every adjacent nodes of 0 so we will start with 1 so here v becomes 1 and the first step will check that whether one is already visited or not so here in the array we see that value of index one is false therefore it's not visited so in the if block first we'll mark this node as visited by providing a value of true to index one of this boolean array so it would look something like this and here we'll mark it as visited and after marking the node as visited we'll simply put it into the queue so we'll put 1 into the queue so it would look something like this moving ahead now v becomes 3 we check whether 3 is visited or not so here in the boolean array 3 is not visited so we will first mark 3 as visited by making the value as true that we have visited this node and then we will simply put 3 into the queue moving ahead 
now as we have visited all the adjacent nodes of zero therefore this for loop will terminate and we will come back to our while loop and we will check whether q is empty or not so here you can see q is not empty so we will pull from the q so one will be pulled out so it would look something like this and u will have value as 1 we will print 1 on the console that we have visited it so friends now we will actually traverse the edges and nodes of 1 which is nothing but 0 and 2 because they are connected to 1 and if we look the adjacency list of 1 then it would look something like this that 1 is connected to 0 and 1 is connected to 2 so now in the for loop we will iterate over these two elements so we will start with 0 so v becomes 0 we will check whether 0 is visited or not so here you can see 0 is already visited therefore we will simply skip this if block and then now v becomes 2 we check whether 2 is visited or not so here you can see 2 is not visited so we will first mark the value at index 2 as true that we have visited this node and also we are marking it as we have visited this node moving ahead and then we will simply put the 2 into the queue so it would look something like this moving ahead now friends here you can see we have visited each and every adjacent nodes of 1 so therefore the for loop terminates and then we will come back to our while loop which check whether q is empty or not so q is not empty we will pull the first element from the q which is 3 so it would look something like this and we'll assign its value to u so u becomes 3 moving ahead we simply print 3 on the console that we have visited it and friends then we'll provide a for loop which will iterate over the adjacent nodes of 3 so here you can see the adjacent nodes of 3 are 0 and 2 so if we see the adjacency list of 3 then it would look something like this that 3 is connected to 0 and 3 is connected to 2 so now we will visit the adjacent nodes of 3 and we will start with 0 so v becomes 0 we check whether 0 is visited or not so here you can see that 0 is visited so we simply skip this if block now v becomes 2 and we check whether 2 is visited or not so here you can see 2 is already visited therefore we simply skip the if block so friends there are no more adjacent nodes to 3 so therefore this for loop will terminate we will come back to our while block we check whether q is empty or not so q is not empty we pull the first element from the queue which is 2 so it would look something like this and we will assign it to integer variable u so u becomes 2 and then we will simply print the value of u on the console that we have visited it so friends now we will actually traverse the adjacent nodes of 2 so here you can see the nodes adjacent to 2 are 3, 1 and 4 because they all are connected by 2. So if we look the adjacency list of value 2 then it would look something like this. That 2 is connected to 3, 2 is connected to 1 and 2 is connected to 4. So therefore now we will traverse each and every adjacent nodes of 2. So we will start with 3. So V becomes 3 moving ahead 
we will check whether three is already visited or not so here you can see in the visited array at index 3 the value is already true and it's already visited therefore we simply skip this if block now v becomes 1 we know that we already visited 1 therefore we will skip this if block now v becomes 4 and here we will check whether we have visited 4 or not so we haven't visited 4 because the value at index 4 in the visited array is false so in the first step what we will do we will mark this value as true that we are visiting it moving ahead and then we will simply offer 4 into the queue so it would look something like this so friends now there are no more adjacent nodes left to be traversed so this for loop will terminate we will again check whether queue is empty or not so queue is not empty will pull the first element out of the queue which is 4 so it would look something like this and we'll simply assign this value to u so u becomes 4 we'll print this value on the console and then we'll simply traverse the adjacent nodes to 4 so here in the diagram you can see the adjacent nodes to 4 is only 2 so if we see the adjacency list of index 4 so it would look something like this that there is only one node which is adjacent to 4 so v becomes 2 we will check whether 2 is visited or not so here you can see 2 is already visited because the value at index 2 of the visited array is true so we simply skip this if block and here we already visited all the nodes adjacent to 4 so therefore this for loop will terminate we will check whether q is empty or not so currently you see q is empty therefore condition in while block comes out to be false so friends here you can see that we have visited each and every node of this graph using breadfast search algorithm and you can see in the output that we have visited all the nodes level by level so we started with level 1 which is 0 so we visited it then we went to level 2 where there were 1 and 3 so we visited those two nodes then we went to level 3 where the only node was 2 so we visited 2 and then we went to level 4 where the only node was 4 so we visited 4 so friends this was the demonstration of the algorithm now let's go to Eclipse and see the working of this code. In our previous tutorial we actually saw the demonstration of breadfast search algorithm in Java. So in this tutorial we will actually code that algorithm and see its working. So friends in my previous tutorial I have created one class by name graph and we represented graph using an adjacency list. So friends in order to understand more about graph you can watch my previous tutorials. So in this tutorial we will actually code the breadfast search technique. So here I will be providing one method by name bfs and as we know that this method will take a source value which would be nothing but a starting point from where we will actually start our bread first search so in the first step what we do is we actually create a boolean array which will actually keep the track of the visited nodes I'll give the name as visited and friends here you can see that to this graph we are actually storing the number of vertices into this instance variable v so the size of this boolean array would be v 
moving ahead and then we'll simply create a queue so we'll import it from java.util package friends moving ahead we'll mark the source node as visited by assigning a value true to the visited array at index s and then we'll simply offer s into the queue which we actually discussed in our previous tutorial then we'll simply provide a while loop and inside this while loop we place a condition that whether q is empty or not so this while loop executive q is not empty so in the first step what we do we simply pull an element from the queue and after pulling the element from queue we simply print it on the console so friends whatever the element we have pulled from the queue then we simply traverse its adjacent nodes which we actually discussed in our previous tutorial so we'll provide a for loop which will traverse the adjacent nodes to u so let's say we give it as v and in order to get the adjacent nodes to u we simply bring the adjacency list at index u so friend in order to understand this more you can watch my previous tutorial that what is adjacency list and how we can fetch the linked list associated with an, any particular index moving ahead we will check that whether v is visited or not so if it is not visited then we'll simply mark it as visited by assigning the value as true and then we'll simply offer it to the queue so friends in our previous tutorial also we discussed that this boolean array is kept to keep the track of the visited nodes we are using this queue which will help us in traversing of this graph level by level so what here we do is we actually visit a particular node at level and after visiting it we go to its next level so friends this is the algorithm for the breadcrumb search now let's test its working so here you can see we have already created a graph of four nodes so here we will apply this breadcrumb search to the graph which we saw in the slide so that slide had five nodes so i will provide a value of five here and here you can see that there is an edge from 0 to 1 1 to 2 2 to 3 and 3 to 0 so we'll provide one more edge from 2 to 4 which we actually saw in the slide and then we'll finally call the breadcrumb search method and let's say we are giving the source node as 0 so if i run this code now so friends here you can see it printed 0 1 3 2 4 and we also know that as we have started from 0 so this was at level 1 and from 0 1 and 3 were connected which we actually saw in the previous tutorial so they printed after that 2 was connected to 1 and 3 so then 2 was printed and finally 4 was connected to 2 so 4 got printed so here you can see that we have traverse each and every node level by level I hope you like this video. Thanks. Have a nice day. Hello, friends. Welcome to my new data structures and algorithms in Java tutorial series video. Friends, in this tutorial we will discuss depth for search of an undirected graph. So, friends, in our previous tutorial we actually discussed breadcrumb search traversal of a graph. 
So in this tutorial, we'll discuss the iterative way to perform depth for search traversal of a graph. So friends, here you can see that we are given an undirected graph. So by undirected graph, we mean that that edges that don't have any direction. So if you are on any particular node, let's say zero, then we can go to one. And if you are on one, then we can go to zero. So the edges don't have any direction. Therefore, this is an undirected graph. So here you can see the algorithm to perform depth for search of an undirected graph. So let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step. So friends, whenever we perform depth for search on an undirected graph, we usually pass in the source node that from where we need to start the depth for search. So let's say we start our depth for search from zero. So the value of S will become zero. So friends, whenever we traverse any undirected graph, we usually keep the track of its node through a Boolean array, which actually tells us that which node is visited and which node is not. Because here you can see the graph may contain a cycle and we don't want to visit any particular node more than once. Therefore, we keep the track of each and every node into this Boolean array. So whenever we initialize this array, we actually pass the size as the number of vertices. So here you can see the number of vertices are 5. So this Boolean array will look something like this. That here each index represent a node. And at the start, each and every value in this Boolean array is false because we haven't visited any of the node till now. Moving ahead. So friends, in order to perform depth for search in an undirected graph, we usually take the help of stack. So the stack data structure is nothing but LIFO data structure, which means last in first out. So the element inserted last into this stack will be the first one to be removed. For more detailed information about the stack, you can watch my previous tutorials. So here in this step, we'll simply create a stack of integers. So currently stack is empty. Moving ahead. So here first we push the source node into the stack. So zero will be on the stack. Moving ahead. So friends, whenever we want to perform depth first search of an undirected graph, we are providing a while loop and inside this while loop, we are providing a condition that whether stack is empty or not. So when the stack is not empty, this while loop executes. So currently you can see stack is having one element. Therefore stack is not empty. So the condition in while block comes out to be true. So in the first step, what we do, we simply pop the element from the stack and we'll assign it to an integer variable u. So it would look something like this, that zero will be popped out and it will be assigned to an integer variable u. So u is having value as zero. Moving ahead. So then we actually check that whether we have actually visited zero or not. So here in the visited array at zeroth index, we see the value. So currently you can see the value is false. Therefore we haven't visited this node. So the condition in if block comes out to be true. And in the if block we simply mark the value at index zero as true. That we are now about to visit this node. And we'll simply print it on the console. So zero is printed on the console. Moving ahead. So friends in depth for search, what we do is whenever we visit any particular node, then we look for its adjacent nodes. So here the adjacent nodes of zero are one and three. And in our previous tutorial, we also discussed about the adjacency list. So the adjacency list of zero would be a link list having the values as one and three. So it would look something like this. The adjacency list of zero will have values as one and three because these two nodes are adjacent to zero. 
For more information about the agency list, you can watch my previous tutorials on graph. So here we are providing a for loop which will iterate over each and every element of this adjacency list. So we'll start from 1. That value of v becomes 1. And in the for loop we'll check whether we have visited v or not. So value of v is 1. And the value at index 1 is false. Therefore we haven't visited this node. So the condition in if block comes out to be true. So in the if block we simply push 1 on the stack. Moving ahead. After visiting 1, we go to 3. So now v becomes 3. We check whether we have visited 3 or not. So here in the visited array at index 3 the value is false. Therefore we haven't visited this node. So the condition in if block comes out to be true and we'll simply push 3 on the stack. Moving ahead. So friends now we have traversed each and every element of this adjacency list. So this for loop will terminate and the call will reach back to this while loop. So in the while loop we will again check whether stack is empty or not. So here you can see stack has two elements therefore it's not empty. So the condition in while block comes out to be true. So in the first step we will simply pop an element from the stack and will assign it to u. So u will hold the value as 3. Moving ahead. We then check whether we have visited the value 3 or not. So here you can see in the visited array at index 3 the value is false. Therefore the condition in if block comes out to be true. So in the if block first we mark the value at index 3 as true. That we have visited this node. And then we will simply print it on the console. Which signifies that we have visited this node. So friends after we have visited 3. We look for its adjacent nodes. Which is 0 and 2. So the adjacency list of 3. Will look like that it has values 0 and 2 which are adjacent to 3 and will provide a for loop and will iterate over each and every element adjacent to 3 so we will start with 0 so v becomes 0 we will check whether we have visited 0 or not so here you can see the value at index 0 is true therefore we have visited this node so the condition in if block comes out to be false. Now v becomes 2. We check whether we have visited 2 or not. So here you can see the value at index 2 is false. Therefore we haven't visited this node. So the condition in if block comes out to be true. And we will simply push 2 on the stack. Moving ahead. So friends we have visited each and every adjacent nodes to 3. So this for loop will terminate. And the call will reach back to this while loop. We again check whether stack is empty or not. So here you can see stack is not empty because it contains two elements. So the condition in while block comes out to be true. In the first step, we'll simply pop an element from the stack and we'll assign it to u. So here, u will become 2. We check whether we have visited 2 or not. So here you can see the value at index 2 is false. Therefore, we haven't visited this node. So the condition in if block comes out to be true. And in the if block, first we'll mark the value at index 2 to be true that we have visited this node now and then we'll simply print 2 on the console moving ahead 
so friends after visiting this node we actually look for its adjacent nodes which is 3 1 and 4 so the adjacency list of node 2 will look something like this that it has 3 values 3 1 and 4 because these 3 nodes are connected to 2 and we will iterate over each and every element of this linked list so we will start with 3 so here v becomes 3 we check whether we have visited 3 or not so here you can see the value at index 3 is true therefore we have visited the node 3 so the condition in if block comes out to be false and now v will become 1 we check whether we have visited 1 or not so here you can see the value at index 1 is false therefore we haven't visited 1 so the condition in if block comes out to be true and we will simply push 1 on the stack and now v will become 4 we will check whether we have visited 4 or not so here you can see the value at index 4 is false therefore we haven't visited this node so the condition in if block comes out to be true and we will simply push 4 on the stack so friends here we have visited each and every element adjacent to 2 therefore this for loop will terminate and the call will reach back to this while loop we check whether stack is empty or not so here you can see stack is not empty because it contains 3 elements so the condition in while block comes out to be true we pop the element from the stack and will assign it to u so the topmost element of the stack is 4 so 4 will be popped out and the value will be assigned to u so u will have 4 we check whether we have visited 4 or not so here you can see that value at index 4 is false therefore we haven't visited 4 so the condition in if block comes out to be true and in the if block first we will mark the value at index 4 to be true that we have visited this node and we will simply print it on the console So friends after visiting node 4 we will look for its adjacent nodes. So here you can see the adjacency list of 4 will look something like this. That the linked list will have only one element which is 2 because only 2 is connected to 4. And here we are providing for loop so that we can iterate each and every element adjacent to 4. So we will start with 2. So here v will become 2. and we check whether we have visited 2 or not so here you can see the value at index 2 is true therefore we have already visited this node so the condition in if block comes out to be false and also friends here we have visited each and every element adjacent to 4 therefore the for loop will terminate and call will reach back to while loop we again check whether stack is empty or not so here you can see stack has two elements therefore it's not empty so the first step will simply pop the element from the stack and will assign it to u so the last element inserted in the stack is 1 therefore 1 will be popped out so u will now have value as 1 moving ahead we check whether we have visited 1 or not so here you can see the value at index 1 is false therefore we haven't visited 1 so the condition in if block comes out to be true so in the if block we will simply mark the value at index 1 to be true that we have visited this node now and we will simply print it on the console
and then we'll provide a for loop so that we can traverse our adjacent nodes to one so friends after visiting the node one we'll look for its adjacent nodes which is nothing but zero and two so the adjacency list of one will look something like this that node adjacent to one is zero and two so we'll provide a for loop and we will iterate each and every element adjacent to one so we'll start with zero so v becomes zero we'll check whether we have visited zero or not so here you can see the value at index zero is true therefore we have already visited zero so the condition in if block comes out to be false now v becomes two and we'll check whether we have visited two or not so here you can see the value at index two is true so the condition in if block comes out to be false and also friends we have visited each and every node adjacent to one so this for loop will terminate and the call will reach back to this while loop we again check whether stack is empty or not so here you can see stack has one element therefore it's not empty so in the first step we'll simply pop an element from the stack and we'll assign it to u so one will be popped out and u will have value as one then we'll simply check whether we have visited one or not so here you can see the value at index one is true therefore we have already visited the node one so the condition in if block comes out to be false we again check whether stack is empty or not so here you can see stack is empty so the condition in while block comes out to be false and while block terminates so friends here you can see using this depth first search algorithm we have visited each and every node of the graph so friends in this tutorial we actually saw the demonstration of this algorithm now let's go to eclipse and see the working of this code hello friends in our previous tutorial we actually discussed the depth first search algorithm of an undirected graph so in this lecture we'll actually code the algorithm and we'll test its working so friends in our previous lectures we actually created one class by name graph and we have implemented the graph using the adjacency list we also discussed the breadth first search algorithm so in this tutorial we'll actually discuss the depth first search algorithm so here we will be creating one method as public void dfs and we also know that the depth first search will start from a source node so s will represent the source node so friends in our previous lecture we actually saw the demonstration of the depth first search step by step so friend in the first step we'll simply create a boolean array we'll give it a name as visited and we'll initialize this boolean array with a size equal to the vertices of the graph so friends here we have created this boolean array which will keep the track of the nodes which we have already visited because while traversing a graph there may come a situation where graph contains a cycle so in order to visit a particular node only once we usually create this boolean array which will keep the track of the nodes which are visited and then we'll create a stack so we'll import the stack from java.util package so friends we are using this stack which will help us in performing depth first search and its significance we already discussed in our previous lectures so after creating the stack we'll simply push the source vertex 
on the stack and then we'll provide a while loop so in this value we'll provide a condition that whether stack is empty or not so this while loop will keep executing with a condition that whether stack is empty or not so the stack is not empty this while loop will keep on executing so inside this while loop as we discussed in our previous lecture that we pop the element from the stack and we'll assign it to u and then we simply check that whether we have visited u or not so if we haven't visited you so the condition in if block comes out to be true so first we'll mark the value at index u to be true that we have visited this node and we'll simply print u on the console so friends after visiting you we simply provide a for loop which will iterate over each and every element adjacent to u so friends here after visiting any particular node we look for its adjacent nodes and we can get the adjacent nodes through the adjacency list and we'll simply iterate each and every element of this adjacency list one by one so in the for loop we simply check that whether the adjacent node to u which is v has been visited or not so if the node is not visited we simply push it on the stack and this we do for each and every element adjacent to the already visited node so friend this is the code to perform dead first search over an undirected graph now let's test it working in the main method so here you can see we have created a graph with five nodes and we have added the edges between the nodes say from 0 to 1 1 to 2 2 to 3 3 to 0 and 2 to 4 so this is the same graph which we discussed in our previous lecture so here in the main method we simply call the dfs method and we'll pass the value of the source node as 0 that we have to start our def for search from the node 0 so if i run the code now so friends here you can see it printed each and every node of the graph in the following order first it printed 0 then 3 then 2 then 4 and then 1 so this is the same output which we discussed in our previous lecture while demonstrating this algorithm step by step so friend this is how we actually perform a depth first search over an undirected graph i hope you like this video thanks have a nice day hello everyone So in this video we will be looking into the recursive depth first search algorithm to traverse an undirected graph So in our previous video we actually saw the depth first search using the iterative approach So in this video we will see that how recursive algorithm works So here you can see that this is the algorithm which is recursive depth first search Here you can see this dfs is calling itself here making it recursive in nature so let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step but before we start in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update in our previous video where we discussed about the iterative approach we used the stack data structure to traverse the graph and in our previous algorithm where we saw breadth first search and depth first search iterative 
there we were given with a source vertex and from there we started our dfs but usually the graph is given in form of like this so here you can see 0 1 2 3 4 they are connected together and there is one more node which is 5 so this vertex is not connected with rest of the elements so basically a graph is provided like that that there could be components which are basically disconnected so we need to visit this graph and it's each vertex so here we actually use this for loop which traverses each and every vertex and help us visiting the vertex using depth for search so let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step so here as the algorithm is recursive we will keep the track of the dfs method which is getting called on a call stack and here you can see when we are calling dfs on any particular vertex v after visiting it we try to traverse its adjacent nodes one by one so those adjacent nodes we denoted by w and if they are not visited we call the dfs again we pass the w value to it because we want to not traverse the adjacent vertex to v so when this dfs will be called this w will become our new v so we need to keep that in mind while traversing our call stack so at the start we simply call dfs so one method is on the call stack now friend as this graph can be connected and can form a cycle so when we perform dfs this visited array which is boolean help us in knowing that which which nodes are already visited or which which vertex are already visited so this capital v we already discussed in our previous videos that that this represent the number of vertexes so currently we have six vertex from 0 to 5 so we created a boolean array of six elements we start from v equal to 0 so v is 0 we first check whether v is already visited or not so currently we see at index 0 vf false so therefore it's not visited so we call dfs and as we are leaving this dfs at line number 5 we update line number here so now there will be one more method on the call stack with vs 0 and the visited array you can see here so when we call dfs on any vertex the first thing we do is we mark that vertex as true that we have visited it so we mark it as true and here you can see we made it yellow and by visiting the node we mean processing the node so here we are simply printing it on the console so zero will be printed now we look for the adjacent nodes to vertex zero so this adjacency list we discussed in our previous videos so this adjacency list is an instance variable which holds all the vertex and their corresponding edges so when we do adjacency of zero it has two elements one and three because these two elements are adjacent to zero and they are connected so it looks like this so after traversing zero we try to traverse is adjacent nodes so we can start from any node so here we pick 3 so here you can see w becomes 3 we check that whether 3 is visited or not so here you can see 3 is not visited so we call recursively depth for search on 3 so this 3 which is w when we will call dfs again it will become our new vertex to visit and here you can see we are leaving this dfs on line number 15 so we need to update line number here because once this dfs will finish we should know that from where we need to start this dfs so we update line number 15 here 
and there will be one more method on the call stack with our new v as 3 so you can think of it something like this we are going like this moving ahead v becomes 3 we mark 3 as visited like this and then we print it on the console and then we look for the adjacent elements to 3 so if we see the adjacent elements to 3 we will get 0 and 2 so the adjacency list of 3 will give us 0 and 2 now we need to visit 0 and 2 because those are adjacent to 3 so we can start with any node so we pick 0 so w becomes 0 we check whether 0 is already visited or not so here you can see 0 is already visited marked as yellow so this condition comes out to be false so now we go with vertex 2 so w will become 2 now we check whether 2 is visited or not so here you can see 2 is not visited it is marked as false so this condition comes out to be true and now we again call dfs with w as 2 we are leaving at line number 15 so first we update line number here there will be one more method on the call stack where v will become 2 because now we need to traverse 2 so we first mark 2 as visited like this then we print it on the console 2 and then we try to traverse its adjacent vertices so here you can see adjacent to 2 is 3 1 and 4 so the adjacency list will give us 3 4 1 so we can start with any node so we start with 3 so w will become 3 here we check whether 3 is visited or not so here you can see 3 is already visited so this condition comes out to be false we then take 4 w becomes 4 we check whether 4 is visited or not so 4 is not visited so then we do the dfs on 4 so we call dfs with ws4 we first update the line number here because we are leaving this dfs now so there is one more method on the call stack with our new vertex to visit is 4 so v becomes 4 we first mark index 4 as true because we are about to visit it we print it on the console so 4 gets printed and now we check for the adjacent elements to 4 so here you can see the elements connected to 4 is only 2 so its adjacency list will have only 2 so we try to visit 2 now so w becomes 2 we check whether 2 is visited or not so here you can see 2 is visited so this condition comes out to be false and here you can see the adjacent elements of vertex 4 is all visited so now this for loop will terminate and this dfs will also get terminate and our call will reach to that dfs which actually called this dfs because we are done with the all the adjacent elements of vertex 4 so this method will be removed from the call stack and the execution point will reach here and we know that we had left this dfs at line number 15 
so we start our execution from line number 15 and when we left this dfs the value of v was 2 and the value of w was 4 so it means we were traversing the adjacent elements of 2 and v just visited 4 so if we see the adjacency list of 2 we visited 3 already then we went to 4 so we are done with 4 also so now our time is to visit 1 so w will become 1 in the next iteration 1 we check whether 1 is visited or not so 1 is not visited so this condition comes out to be true and we call dfs again with w as 1 so we update the line number 15 here there will be one more method on the call stack with v as 1 we mark vertex 1 as visited we print 1 on the console so this is also visited and now we actually check the adjacent elements of 1 so here you can see it has 0 and 2 0 and 2 so we start with 0 w becomes 0 0 so here you can see 0 is already visited so this condition comes out to be false then we go to vertex 2 w becomes 2 and 2 is also visited so this condition comes out to be false so here you can see all the elements adjacent to vertex 1 are visited so this for loop will terminate and this dfs method will be removed from the call stack An execution point will reach here. So we start this DFS from line number 15 and we were actually traversing vertex 2 and the recent adjacent element we visited was 1. So W becomes 1 and V becomes 2. So if we see the adjacency list of 2, we are done with 3, 4 and 1. So in the next iteration, this for loop will terminate because there are no more adjacent elements to vertex 2. So now this DFS will end. And call will reach to its previous DFS. We will start from line number 15. And we had left this DFS when value of V was 3 and the recent adjacent element to 3 which we tried to visit was 2 so v is 3 w is 2 so if we see the adjacency list of 3 here you can see 0 we already visited and we went to 2 and 2 also we visited so now this dfs will end for vertex 3 execution point reached here we start from line number 15 and when we left this dfs we were actually visiting the adjacent elements of vertex 0 and the recent we visited was 3 so v is 0 and w is 3 and if you see the adjacency list of 0 so here you can see the recent element we visited was 3 so now we go with the vertex 1 so w becomes 1 1 we check whether 1 is visited or not so here you can see this visited array is helping us to not to visit the vertex again because 1 is already visited it is marked as true so this condition comes out to be false so now we are done with the adjacency list of 0 so this DFS will end 
and this method will be removed from the call stack and we go back to the starting dfs method where we left at line number 5 so we start from line number 5 and we are done with visiting zero vertex so here you can see this for loop will now help us in visiting 5 because when we started with 0 all these nodes were directly or indirectly connected with 0 so we visited everyone using the DFS so this file is not connected to any of these vertices so using this for loop we will visit phi as well so we'll increment v v becomes 1 so vertex 1 is visited so we do nothing v becomes 2 so 2 is visited we do nothing v becomes 3 3 is also visited so we do nothing 4 is also visited and now v becomes 5 so here 5 is not visited so we call dfs on vertex 5 we update the line number and here we call this dfs with 5 so here it should be 5 because we are leaving this dfs when vertex v was 5 so now we call dfs on vertex 5 we mark vertex as visited this is visited now we print it on the console and then we try to visit the vertex 5 adjacent elements so here you can see there are no adjacent elements to vertex 5 so this for loop will terminate and this dfs method will be removed from the call stack and we go back to the previous dfs at line number 5 where v was 5 and then we increment v it becomes 6 so now this for loop will terminate and everything will be removed from the call stack so here you can see in this order we visited each and every vertex of the graph and here using this for loop we even visited vertex which were disconnected so friend this was all about the recursive depth first search i hope you must have liked this video in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in this video we are going to discuss that what are connected components in an undirected graph so friends here you can see that we are given a graph having six nodes from 0 to 5 now here if you see that we have three connected components so one is having nodes 0 1 and 3 which is this connected component another connected component is 2 and 4 and the third connected component is a component having only one node which is 5 so usually with a graph we are given a graph in the form of connected components so one such query comes is that we need to evaluate that in a graph how many connected components are there so in this graph we have three connected components and also one such query comes is we are given with two vertices let's say 0 and 2 and we need to find whether 0 and 2 are connected or not so here you can see 0 is in the first connected component and 2 is in the second connected component 2 is connected with 4 0 is connected with 1 and 3 so 0 and 2 are not connected so such queries are given so usually in real world let's say we can think of this connected components as a graph of a small region where these three nodes form a road this two forms another road and there could be a query that whether this road is connected with this road or not and similarly for other applications 
we can think is network connections. We just need to query whether this connection and this connection are connected or not. So such queries can be handled via connected components. So in this video, we are going to see the algorithm that how we can figure out the numbers of connected component and how we can figure out whether any node is connected to another node or not. So here is the algorithm and here we are using the same graph which we discussed in our previous slide. So let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step. So friends before we start in case if you want to master data structure and algorithm you can subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update. So here you can see that to find the number of components and to find whether any of the vertices are connected or not we need to process each and every node. So here what we do is we apply the depth first search. Now this algorithm is recursive in nature. Here you can see depth first search is again calling here itself. So it's a recursive algorithm. So therefore we will maintain the calls to the DFS in the call stack and we need to keep the track of the vertices we are visiting. So at the start we call DFS. Now when this method starts execution there will be one method on the call stack by name DFS and now this method will start its execution. So we are storing the state of V, W and count for this DFS and this we will do for each and every recursive calls here because when we are calling this DFS from this DFS this method will store the state into the call stack and then it will again call DFS. So once this DFS will end the method will return to this DFS and we will assign back the values of the variables from where this DFS left. Moving ahead. So friends here you can see that as we are calling this DFS on an undirected graph there could be a possibility that this graph contains a cycle like this. So what happens is we create a boolean array visited. Now this boolean array will help us to check whether any of the vertices are already visited or not because let's say if we visit 0 then 1 and then 3 then from 3 if we go to 0 this boolean array will help us knowing that 0 is already visited. So in order to keep the track of visited node we create a boolean array and here in our previous videos we know that the capital V is nothing but number of vertices. So currently we have 6 vertices from 0 to 5. So this boolean array will have 6 vertices from 0 to 5 index and each index corresponds to a node in a graph. So at the start all the values of the visited array will be false because no node is visited as of now. Now we will create yet another array which we will call component id. We will see its significance later but here you can see this component id will store the id of any particular component in the form of integer. So you can think that as we have three components here. So this component id for 3, 0, 1 will store let's say an id of 0 for example. For 2 and 4 it will store 1 and for 5 it will store 2. Now this will state that we have three components 0, 1 and 2. Node 3 belongs to 0 component, 0 belongs to 0 component and 1 belongs to 0 component. So that will be evaluated with this component id. And similarly 2 will belong to component 1, 4 will belong to component 1 and 5 belongs to component 2. So there could be so many nodes in a graph. So this component id will denote a group of nodes which will be represented by an id. So we will see its significance later. So this array would look like this. That at the start for all the vertices the value will be 0 or what we can do is we can also initialize this array as a wrapper of integer. So every value will be null stating that the nodes are belonging to no component at the start. Moving ahead. Then we will create a count variable. Now our task is to first count number of connected components and our second task is to return true 
or false for a query that whether x and y are connected or not so we are using this algorithm to figure out these two problems so we are creating a count variable which is suggesting that how many connected components are there in this graph so at the start in this dfs method count will be zero because we are yet to start the processing of this graph also friends here you can see in this method we are creating this three things visited array component id array and count so usually for this two queries we take this three variables at the class level so that we can use them directly in any of our methods but here for time being i have created this three variables in the method itself so that i can demonstrate the algorithm that how it works so this three things you can create outside of the method at the class level we can make this variables as instance variables so for timing you can think that these are part of the method itself and for the actual dfs algorithm we are actually passing them directly into the method or else if they are at instance level we don't need to pass them like this now we will start the processing of graph from vertex 0 and it will go till it is less than the number of vertices which is 6 we need to go from 0 to 5 so at the start v is 0 so we update 0 here now the first thing we check is whether v is already visited or not so here you can see as we are starting the processing of the graph v is not visited here value at 0 index is false so therefore this condition comes out to be true which means we can apply the depth first search on vertex 0 now so here now this dfs will be removed from the call stack and this dfs will be called so first we update line number here because we are leaving this dfs now so we are leaving at line number 7 so that when this dfs method will finish we come back to this dfs and we start the execution from line number 7 itself and we assign this values back to v so now there will be one more method on the call stack and the execution point will reach to that dfs with v as 0 count as 0 because we are passing count 0 and v 0 we will see what this w is here and visited array and component id array you can refer here now when we will call dfs on any particular node what we do is we first process that node and how we can process that node is we can perform any typical algorithm on that particular node and we first mark that node as visited that we are done visiting this particular node so in the visited array at zero index we simply assign a value true stating that we have visited node zero like this we have visited this node and here what we can do is we can either process some algorithm on top of this node we can print this node and we can do anything on this node based on the algorithm we are trying to process and now what we do is this count variable which we have passed into the dfs here this count variable will help us in finding the id of the component so as we discussed that this three nodes belong to component id 0 this two belongs to 1 and this belongs to 2 so this id can be anything so here what we are doing is we are taking the count only as our id so in the component id array at vertex 0 we update count as 0 like this now after visiting a particular node what we do is we recursively visit its adjacent nodes so in our previous video we have discussed that what this adjacency list is this is actually a list we are passing a vertex 0 because value of v is 0 and we are asking to return its adjacent nodes so it would look something like this i'll remove this so here this list states that 0 is connected to 3 and 1 and it is denoted in the form of an adjacency list you can watch my previous videos to understand more about this 
so here what we are doing is we are iterating the nodes one by one so zero is connected to three and one so we can process these nodes in any order so this for loop will process one one node so at the start value of w will be three let's say we are taking three to visit like this now we need to visit three so what we do is first we check whether we have already visited three or not so here at index three we have a false value it means we haven't visited three so now our task is to recursively call dfs with w will become our new v in the next dfs call and we are applying this dfs now for vertex three because we haven't visited this vertex so before calling this dfs we know that we are leaving this dfs at line number 18 so we'll update line number first here like this and then this dfs will be called so there will be one more method on the call stack like this an execution point will execute this dfs here w was 3 when we call this dfs it becomes our new v so you can think it is going like this so now we are applying this dfs on vertex 3 we have passed count as 0 as we are directly propagating the count to this dfs so v becomes 3 now we know that we haven't visited 3 so we will first visit 3 by marking the index 3 as true like this that we have visited 3 now and in the component id array at index 3 we will assign the value 0 because value of count is 0 like this now this 0 is actually telling us that this 0 and 3 are actually connected because their ids are same after visiting 3 we will visit its adjacent nodes so we will iterate the adjacency list of 3 and it has only one node 0 because 3 is connected only to 0 so at the start w will be 0 like this and now as we are processing the adjacent nodes of 3 we first check whether 0 is already visited or not so here you can see at index 0 we have value true it means we have already visited 0 so this condition comes out to be false and here you can see for vertex 3 there are no more nodes adjacent to 3 left to be traversed so this for loop will terminate and after this for loop gets terminated this dfs method will also get terminated and this dfs will be removed from the call stack and execution point will reach to this dfs and here we know that we had left the previous dfs at line number 18 so we start from line number 18 at that moment v was at 0 so v will come back to 0 w was at 3 and if we see the adjacency list of 0 we have processed one of the adjacent nodes of 0 which is 3 now in the next iteration we will pick 1 and we will apply dfs on 1 because we need to visit 1 and then visit its adjacent nodes recursively so w becomes 1 here we check first that whether 1 is already visited or not so at index 1 we have a value false it means 1 is not visited so we will call dfs again and we are leaving this dfs at line number 18 so we will update the line number here 18 there will be one more method on the call stack as we have called this dfs with w as 1 this w will become our new v here for this dfs so it will go like this and count will go with a value 0 only the first step we do is we mark the vertex 1 is visited so at index 1 we mark it as true like this that we have visited 1 now in the component id array at index 1 we put the value of id as 0 which suggests that 0 1 and 3 are connected 
Now after visiting one, we will visit its adjacent nodes recursively. So if we call the adjacency list of one, you will see that it is connected only to zero. So we have only one vertex. So W will start from zero. We'll first check whether zero is already visited or not. So here you can see zero is already visited in the visited array. At zeroth index, we have true. So this condition comes out to be false, and there are no more vertex adjacent to one left to be traversed. So this for loop will terminate, and this DFS method will also get terminated and removed from the call stack. So execution point will reach here. We had left the previous DFS at line number eighteen, so we'll start from line number eighteen. At that moment, v was zero, and w was one, and v was zero. It means we were visiting the adjacent nodes of v. We visited three, and we have visited one recursively. So now there are no more nodes in the adjacency list of zero to visit. So this for loop will terminate, and this DFS method will also get end, and it will be removed from the call stack. An execution point will reach to this DFS, which we left at line number seven. So V start from line number seven. At that moment, V was at zero. So here you can see that after performing the DFS on any of the node, here we started with zero. It recursively visited its neighboring nodes. So once this DFS will end, we know that we have visited one component fully. So now. What we do is we simply increment count, so our count becomes one. Now this count is suggesting that we are done processing of one connected component, and we have found one connected component, so count becomes one. We'll increment v. V becomes one. Now it means we are going to the vertex v and trying to apply DFS on vertex v. So first we check that whether one is already visited or not, because there could be a possibility that its previous vertex or any of its previous vertex must have visited one, because one must have been connected to that vertex. So here you can see one is already visited. So this condition comes out to be false. We will increment v. V becomes two. We check. That whether two is visited or not. So here at index two, we have a value false. It means two is not visited. So we can apply the DFS now on vertex two. So we are leaving this DFS at line number seven, and we are calling this DFS with v or vertex as two. So there will be one more method on the call stack with v as two. And count as one. First, we mark two as visited, like this. So here I am just representing it with a different color. In the component ID, at index two, we put one. Now here this count was increased, so our ID also increased, which also help us in figuring out that two belongs to a different component. Now our task is to visit the adjacent nodes of two recursively. So two is only connected to four. So adjacency list of two will have only node four. So we'll start with four first. W becomes four. We first check whether four is visited or not. So four is not visited. So we call this DFS with W as four. So this four will become our new v in the next DFS call. So first we update line number here because we are leaving this DFS, and there will be one more method on the call stack. So the w which was in previous DFS becomes our new v, and count is propagated directly. We first mark four as visited. Here, like this, and in the component ID array, add vertex 
फोर वी असाइन ए वैल्यू वन दिस सजेस्ट डेट टू एंड फोर आर पार्ट ऑफ वन सिंगल कंपोनेंट बिकॉज दे हैव सेम कंपोनेंट आई डी नाउ विल ट्रेवर्स द एडजस्ट एंड नोट ऑफ फोर सो एडजस्ट एंसी लिस्ट ऑफ फोर विल हैव ओनली वन वर्टेक्स विच इज टू सो डब्ल्यू स्टार्ट फ्रॉम टू we first check whether 2 is visited or not so here you can see index 2 we have value true so 2 is already visited so this condition comes out to be false and this for loop will terminate because there are no more nodes adjacent to 4 left to be traversed and this dfs method will end and execution point will reach to previous dfs we start from line number 18 at that moment v was at 0 so v comes back to 0 w was 4 which suggests that we were visiting the adjacency list of 2 which was this we know that we recently visited 4 and there are no more adjacent nodes to 2 left to be traversed so this for loop will terminate and this dfs will be removed from the call stack an execution point will reach to previous dfs we start this dfs at line number 7 at that moment v was at 2 so it suggests that we just finished one more dfs on one of the vertices which was 2 and it must have marked its connected vertices in the visited array so we'll increase the count now because we are done processing the second connected component so count becomes 2 will increment v so v becomes 3 now we need to apply this dfs again on vertex 3 but first we check whether 3 is already visited or not so here you can see 3 is already visited so this condition comes out to be false we increment v v becomes 4 4 is also visited so this condition comes out to be false will increment v v becomes 5 so here you can see vertex 5 is not visited so this condition comes out to be true so now we'll apply dfs on vertex 5 so we are leaving this dfs at line number 7 so we update line number 7 here and there will be one more method on the call stack with vs5 and count as 2 now the first thing we do is we mark 5 as visited like this and in the component id array at index 5 we assign a value 2 because value of count is 2 now here it suggests that this 5 belongs to a different component because value of count has changed now we'll visit the adjacent nodes of 5 so here you can see in this connected component we have only one node and 5 is connected to no other node so therefore this for loop will terminate and this dfs method will also end execution point will reach to this dfs we start from line number 7 and vs5 so after this dfs is done we know that we have just visited one more connected component so we increase the count count becomes 3 will increment v v becomes 6 and we know that we have only nodes from 0 to 5 so this for loop will terminate and this dfs will be removed from the call stack so now here you can see if you see in the visited array we have visited all the elements in the component id array you can see 0 0 and 0 are at indexes 0 1 and 3 which suggests that 0 1 and 3 are connected if you see 2 and 4 they have a same value 1 1 it means they are connected and here if you see at index 5 we have 2 it means it's a connected component having only one vertex so friends here you can see that if we take out this three 
variables as our instance variable and we can provide one method as something like public int get count of connected components so this we can return the value of count like this so this will solve our first query the second query we can provide a method as public boolean and we can give the method name as is connected and to this method we pass x and y so here we can simply return comp id of x whether it is equal to comp id of y so let's say if we pass x y as 0 comma 2 so this is our x and this is y so the value at index x which is 0 we have 0 and value at vertex 2 have 1 so here you can see we are comparing whether 0 is equal to 1 or not it means this condition comes out to be false and we return false stating that 0 and 2 are not connected now for example if we pass 3 and 1 like this so 3 is x and y is 1 so comp id of 3 we are checking it with comp id of 1 so this will give value 0 and this will give value 0 so both the values are equal and this condition is true so we simply return true stating that 3 and 1 are connected and they are part of the same component so friends this was all about the connected components in an undirected graph i hope you must have liked this video in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in this video we are going to discuss a problem number of islands now let's move ahead and see what this problem is and how to solve this so here we are given an m cross n matrix like this which is 2d binary grid so binary grid we mean that we have this matrix having only ones and zeros now in which ones represent a land so you can think wherever we have one it actually represent a land and zeros as water like this now our task is to return the number of islands now what do we mean by island so as per the definition in the problem you can see an island is surrounded by water so this is the one thing that an island is surrounded by water and second is formed by connecting adjacent lands horizontally or vertically so this is a land this is a land so one thing is there should be a connection horizontally or vertically and second they should be surrounded by water like this and we may assume all four edges of the grid are surrounded by water so beyond this grid here you can think that there is only water it means that it has zeros so here we have zero here we have zero here we have zero so here this three ones form an island because this three are connected horizontally and vertically and they are surrounded by water this single one forms one island because it is also surrounded by water and this one also is surrounded by water so the answer is 3 we have three number of islands we don't have to consider this diagonal relationship as per the problem we need to look horizontally or vertically so here you can see that how we can solve this problem is if you look closely then we are given with a graph indirectly here if i plot this one so this is one node and the node adjacent to it is also one so we can think that there is a connection via this edge horizontally like this and there is a edge vertically because we need to consider vertical edge also 
so this forms another connection like this so you can think this island in the form of this graph and if we look closely to it it's look like this one 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 like this so you can also think that we are given with this five nodes of a graph that they are connected horizontally and vertically and if there is a vacant space here it means that it is surrounded by water so in one of our previous videos we discussed about connected components so this forms one connected component this forms another connected component and this forms another connected component and we also discussed that how we can process a connected component and we also discussed that how we can find the number of connected components so this problem is very much similar to that so in the connected components problem we applied the dfs which is a depth first search so here also we'll apply the same so the only difference is there we had this actual nodes connected by edges and here we are taking this adjacent lands horizontally or vertically in the form of edges so keeping these constraints in mind let's move ahead and see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step so friends before we start in case if you want to master data structures and algorithm you can subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update now this is the algorithm to find the number of islands we are given with a matrix where we have only ones and zeros and they are provided in the form of a character and here we need to return the number of islands in this grid so here we have created integer variable number of islands and at the end we are returning this number of islands so let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step we call the number of islands method passing in the matrix which is our grid now let's say we take the same example where we are given with this matrix and we know that we have three islands here one is this island another is this and the third one is this now let's see how we can find out the number of islands and we also know one property that lands should be connected vertically or horizontally so this can be treated as a vertex of graph and this can be treated as an edge so this is a horizontal edge and this is a vertical edge so friends here you can see that wherever we will find land we need to apply depth first search on top of it so that we can figure out at how much deep that connection is via this property now here we are given this m cross n matrix so this m cross n represents row and column so the number of rows which is m is given by grid dot length which is 4 we have four rows 1 2 3 and 4 with a index of 0 1 2 and 3 similarly we have four columns denoted by n so this is first column second third and fourth column with a index of 0 1 2 and 3 so friends when we apply def first search here we know that we need to consider horizontal and vertical relation so here let's suppose we are given with this sort of graph let's say here we have this one so it must look like this so if we are applying def first search on top of it we know that once we visit any particular node then we visit its neighboring nodes recursively so usually in the graph we can encounter this cycles so here let's suppose we have visited this node then we go to this node we visit this and let's say if you are going to this node and we are visiting then here we are visiting but if we go back here this node we have already visited so this is a rough example to just demonstrate that when we return back to this node we know that we have already visited this node but how we can mark that we have visited this node because when we will reach to this node then the algorithm will keep on visiting this node again and again so we have a cycle so in order to keep the track of the visited nodes we create a boolean array 
or here you can see that we have created a visited matrix here as the graph is given in the form of a grid and here each index represents a vertex so therefore we have to create a matrix of m cross n which will actually help us to figure out that which nodes are visited and which are not so it looks something like this it's a boolean matrix so at the start every node is unvisited being denoted by f which is false as we need to return number of islands so we initialize this integer variable with 0 because at the start we haven't found any island so the number of island is 0 so friends when we apply def first search on a graph we visit each and every node of that graph so here each index value can be considered as a node of a graph so here you can see that we have 16 such vertex and they are given in the form of matrix m cross n so we need to apply this two for loops to travel each and every vertex and apply the def first search on top of it to figure out the number of islands so here i will traverse the rows and j will traverse the columns m denotes our rows n denotes the columns so at the start i is 0 j is 0 so it means that we are on index 0, 0 like this also friends as we need to find the number of islands we can apply the def first search on the nodes which have values as 1 because zeros represent water so when we encounter water we need to skip the water and once we found even one of the land then we can apply def first search on top of it with an only condition that this one should not be visited because there could be a possibility that if we are going in this direction then we are coming back then going down and they are going up so there could be a possibility that we encounter the nodes which are already visited so which is being tracked by the visited 2d array so the only condition we need to keep in mind is that in the visited array at 0 comma 0 we should have false value it means this node should not be visited and the value of this node should be 1 if we encounter zero then we will simply skip this element because this denotes a water so here at the start we found one which is a land and this land is not visited so therefore we can apply def first search on top of this one considering the graph horizontally and vertically so when we will apply dfs on top of this grid at index 0 comma 0 it would look something like this that this method will now call dfs method like this so here we have this grid and this visited 2d array we pass the row as 0 comma 0 so on the call stack there will be one method dfs having row as 0 and column as 0 because we found one and that is not visited so here we are maintaining this call stack because this algorithm is actually recursive as we are applying the dfs we know that it's a recursive algorithm where we actually process any node and then we try to process its adjacent nodes recursively so therefore this algorithm is recursive so in order to keep the track of this method calls we are maintaining a call stack this is our base case to stop this recursion we will see this later so now at the start we are processing a value at a index 0 comma 0 in this grid matrix because we have found one land denoted by 1 and which is not visited so here you can see this is our base case now as we will apply this def first search horizontally and vertically in all the directions because this land can be connected to another land so let's say we have a land here if above this land we have another one here we have another one and here we have another one and below we have another one so this land if you see it is connected like this like this like this like this so we need to go in four direction to figure out the extent of this island because we are given in the problem that we need to see in the horizontal and in the vertical direction so here in the normal dfs where we are given with a vertex we visited a node and then we visited its adjacent nodes recursively here the adjacent nodes as we discussed will be given by this four directions which is up left right 
and down. So currently what this base case says that after processing any node, if we are going to a level above, let's say if we are going to top of this one, then we are going outside the boundaries of this matrix because beyond 0, 0, the index doesn't exist in the matrix. So yeah, this is the base case that we may go out of the matrix. So if row is less than 0 or column is less than 0, then we simply return from the DFS method. So this is our base case. The another conditions are if row and column goes beyond this or this, then also we need to return. And the last two conditions are, let's say if we are on this node and if we go to right. So here we are finding a water which is being denoted by 0. We only keep the track of the lands which are connected adjacent and as soon as if we find a water, we simply return back. So here if this grid at a row and column, if the value is 0, then we will simply return. And one last thing is, let's say if we have visited this one, we went here. For this one also, we need to go up. So we'll go back to this one. But here we know that we just visited this node and came here and then we are going up. So if in the visited 2D array at row and column, if we find any true value, then also we need to return because we have already processed the node. So these six conditions are very important because they form our base case. We should not go beyond the boundaries with this first four conditions. We should not go in the water with this condition and we should not go to a land which is already visited. So at the start, we are within the boundaries of this matrix because we are at 0, 0. This vertex is not visited and the value is 1 which is not 0. So therefore all the conditions comes out to be false. So which suggests that we have found one land. And now as per the DFS, we will visit this land and in the visited 2D array we will mark it as true like this. So friend, one property of DFS is after visiting any particular node, we visit its adjacent nodes recursively and we know that in order to find the adjacent nodes to one, as per the problem, they should be horizontal or vertical. So we need to apply this DFS horizontally and vertically. So it means we have to go in four directions, left, up, right and down to visit the adjacent nodes of 0, 0 recursively. So here if you see, if we are in particular row, let's say 0, 0, here we can travel in any direction. So what we are doing is we are going first to left, then up, then right and then down. So here when we are going left, it means we are going in this direction. So currently here you can see that whichever box is yellow, that is our current row and column, which is 0, 0, this. If you want to go in the left, it means we are going in this direction. So when we are going in this direction to the left, row actually remains the same. Here you can see value of row is 0, so it remains the same. As we are going on the left, the value of column decreases by 1. So here we have column 0, here it can be minus 1, because we are going in this direction. Similarly, if you are going up, let's say we are here and if you are going up, here row is 2, now it becomes 1. So here row is actually decreasing but column remains the same. So when we go up, row decreases, column remains same. When we go right, let's say if you are here, if you are going in this direction, so row remains the same and column actually increases from 1 to 2. So we do call plus 1 and if you are going down, Let's say if we are going down from here to here. So row was 1, now it became 2 because we have reached here. So row is actually increasing and column remains the same. So this four direction we need to keep in mind. If we are going on the left, column decreases. If we are going up, row decreases. If we are going on the right, column increases. If we are going down, row increases. So this four direction we need to keep in mind because for any particular land, we need to see its horizontal and vertical adjacent nodes to figure out whether it has land or water. So we need to call this DFS four times because we need to visit a particular row and column in four directions. Going left, then going up, 
then going right and then going down. So first we will go left where row remains the same and, and column decreases by 1. So here you can see that we are leaving this DFS at line number 8 and we are calling this DFS. So first we will update the line number here 8 that we are leaving this DFS at line number 8. So once this DFS will end we will return back to this DFS. But we need to keep the track of the line that from where we left this DFS. So this line number 8 will help us knowing that we had left this DFS at this line. So we'll start our execution at this line. And whatever the value of row and column will be, we'll assign those values back to the row and column. So now here you can see this method will be called where row will remain same and column will decrease by 1. So there will be one more method on the call stack like this. Here row remains the same and column decreased by 1. So it became minus 1. It means we are going to the left. So here we went outside the boundaries of this matrix where column became lesser than 0. So it means we have encountered a base case. So we simply need to return back to 0, 0. So this DFS will end because we are now returning back. So this method will be removed from the call stack. Execution point will reach here. We'll start from line number 8. And we have visited the left side. And we came back to 0, 0. So we are coming back to 0, 0. And now we know that we are done with the left. We need to go up. So when we go up, row decreases and column remains the same. So we are leaving this DFS now at line number 9. So we'll update 9 here. So there will be one more method on the call stack where row will decrease from 0 to minus 1 and column remains the same. So here you can see now we went to outside the boundaries of this matrix in, in upper direction. So now row has become less than 0. So therefore we need to return from this DFS. So we will come back to 0, 0. We will start from line number 9 here and we will come back to 0, 0. And now we go towards its right. So when we go towards right, column increases. So here it will increase from 0 to 1 because we are going to the right direction and row remains the same. So we execute this DFS and we leave this DFS at line number 10. There will be one more method on the call stack where row remains the same and column increases by 1 because we are going towards right. So now here you can see we are going to 0, 1. So we reach to this index which is 0, 1. So now we are within the boundaries of this matrix. So first 4 condition comes out to be false. This condition in the visited 2D array we have false. So this comes out to be false and we know that at this index 0, 1 we don't have 0, we have 1, so therefore this condition also comes out to be false. So here you can see all the conditions came out to be false because we are within the boundaries. This value is not 0 and it is not visited. So it denotes that we have found an adjacent land which is being denoted by 1 and it is not visited. So first thing we do is we mark this as visited like this. And as we know that how DFS works, now for this vertex, we will visit its adjacent nodes recursively. So now for value 0, 1, we will apply the DFS into 4 directions. So for this node, first we will go to left. We will update line number 8 here. We will have one more method on the call stack. And as we are going on the left, column decreases. So column was 1, it decreased to 0. Row remains the same. So it means we have reached back to this land. Here you can see this node is within the boundaries of this grid but if you look in the visited 2D array at row 0, 0, we have already visited this node because we are actually applying the DFS from this node only. We reached to this node and then we are coming back to this node. So we have already visited this node. So though this condition is false that we are encountering a land here. But we have visited this land already. So we'll simply return from this DFS and this DFS will be removed from the call stack. Execution point will reach here and to whichever DFS we were, 
we simply start from line number 8 here we know that v were at 0 comma 1 so v were at 0 comma 1 so we return back to this node like this and for this node we just went to its left and came back so now we'll go up so first we update line number here because we are leaving this dfs so now there will be one more method on the call stack we are going up so row will decrease so from 0 it will become minus 1 like this it means from 0 comma 1 now we have went to outside the boundaries of this matrix so it means row is less than 0 so we need to return back because this condition comes out to be true it means we are returning back to 0 comma 1 now so this method will be removed from the call stack we will reach to this method we simply start our execution from line number 9 here and at that moment row was 0 and column was 1 so we come back to this 0 comma 1 like this so with this line we went up and then came back so now we'll go towards right so first we update the line number here which is 10 because we are leaving this dfs we are going towards right now so there will be one more method on the call stack as we are going on the right column will increase so from 1 it becomes 2, row remains the same. So we are going towards right, it means we are going to 0, 2 here. And here you can see that we have found a water. So we need to simply return from this node because we have found water. And this is actually stopping this land to go beyond that. So we have encountered a water, so we will simply return back. This method will be removed from the call stack. Execution point will reach here. We'll start our execution from line number 10 because we had left at line number 10. So we come back to 0, 1 because when we left this DFS, we were at 0, 1. So we came back to 0, 1. So we visited left, up, right. So now we'll go down here. First we update line number here, which is 11. Then we will call this DFS again. There will be one more method on the call stack. If we are going down, row will increase. So from 0 it become 1. Column remains the same. Here. So we will simply return because we have found the water here. Which is 0. So we simply return back. This method will be removed from the call stack. Execution point will reach here. At line number 11. At that moment we were at 0, 1 because now we are returning to 0, 1 back like this. So here you can see that for this node we went to its left, up, right and down. And after that we are done with this node. So after 11 this DFS will end. It means this DFS will end. So this method will be removed from the call stack. And we go back to its previous DFS. That we had left at line number 10. So we start from line number 10. And the value was 0, 0. So we are actually returning back to 0, 0. Like this. Because we went to its right when we visited 0, 1. Here you can see that we executed DFS. We went to right. And now we are coming back. So we have came back to 0, 0. So for this node, now we need to go down. So we'll update the line number here. 11. There will be one more method on the call stack. We are going down so row increases so it became 1 from 0 and column remains the same. It means we are going down. We came here. We are within the boundaries of this matrix so first 4 condition comes out to be false. This land is not visited because value is false here and we have actually came to a land. So it means all the conditions comes out to be false. It means we are on a valid land which is adjacent to our previous land. So first we mark this land as true. So in the visited array at 1 comma 0 we put a value true like this. So we are putting this value true because in case if we return back to this node we can come to know that we have already visited this node. Now friend there could be a possibility that here we have 1 or here we have 1. So as we have reached to a land now we need to apply the DFS to its adjacent nodes as well because 
let's say if here we have 1 and then we have 1 then 1 1 1 so this land would have expanded till the last row and last column so we need to apply this dfs now for this node in the four directions left up right and down to figure out whether this land is also surrounded by any other land or not so now first we go to the left so it means we are going in this direction now so we update line number here 8 there will be one more method on the call stack where column will decrease it becomes minus 1 and row remains the same so it means we have went outside the boundaries of this matrix where column became minus 1 which is less than 0 so this condition comes out to be true and as it is a or in all the conditions so if any condition comes out to be true we simply return so we simply return back to 1, 0 here so this method will be removed from the call stack we reach here at 1 comma 0 and we start our execution from line number 8 we just went to the left of 1 comma 0 so we are returning back to this node like this so now we actually go up so first we update line number here which is 9 and then we are leaving this dfs so there will be one more method on the call stack we are going up so row decreases so from 1 it became 0 so it means we have reached here so friends here you can see that from this node we actually went here so for this node this one is also adjacent so when we reached here we know that we have already visited this node so how we can figure this point out is we can simply look in the visited array at 0 comma 0 we find a value true so we are in the boundaries of this matrix so first four conditions comes out to be false but here you can see this condition visited row column this comes out to be true so it means this land is already visited we need to come back so we simply return from this dfs execution point will reach here we'll start from line number 9 and at that moment we were at 1 comma 0 so we come back to 1 comma 0 because we are returning from 0 comma 0 back to 1 comma 0 here and for this node we just went to up and came back so now we go towards right we update line number 10 here there will be one more method on the call stack so we are going now towards right here where value of column will increase So from zero it became one. We reached here. So in this DFS we are now at one comma one. So we reached here. Now here we have encountered a water. So this condition comes out to be true. So we simply return. Because as we are encountering water, we need to return back. This method will be removed from the call stack. We come back to previous DFS. We start from line number ten. so we come back to 1 comma 0 like this and now we go down we just visited the right now we go down so we first update line number here which is 11 that we are leaving this dfs at line number 11 and now there will be one more method on the call stack we are going down so row will increase so from 1 it became 2 and column will remain same so with this dfs now we reach to 2 comma 0 here and as we have encountered a water here so this condition comes out to be true so we simply return back so this method will be removed from the call stack execution point will reach here we start from 11 and at that moment we were at 1 comma 0 so we come back to 1 comma 0 here and for this node we visited its left up right and down and after that this dfs will end so for this node we have visited its all the directions so this will be removed from the call stack we reach back to this dfs we start from line number 11 and at that moment we were at 0 comma 0 so we come back to 0 comma 0 here so here you can see that we started our dfs with this index 0 comma 
and after traversing recursively all its adjacent node we are returning back to 0, 0 which means that we have visited left up right and down so the last direction we visited was down here and we came back so after this line this dfs will end which signifies that we have visited all the lands connected horizontally and vertically so we'll return from this dfs so this dfs will be removed from the call stack and we will simply go back to the method which called this dfs at the start here and this is our condition as of now that we have visited this one this one and this one and we have found one connected component which is our island so we'll increase the number of islands value because we have just found one island so it becomes one moving ahead so now we are done with this node 0 comma 0 so we'll increment j j becomes 1 we go to 0 comma 1 here because there could be a possibility that from here only another land starts or another island starts so here first we check that whether the value is 1 or not so here you can see the value is 1 but we also check that whether we already visited this land or not because in our previous dfs we started here then we visited this land and then we visited this land so we know that we have already visited this land because value is true here so therefore this condition comes out to be false because we are going only to those lands which are not visited here we have just visited this land in our previous dfs so this condition will prevent going into another dfs call so the condition in if block comes out to be false now we'll increment j j becomes 2 so we are on 0 comma 2 here you can see that we have landed on water so it means we need to skip this element because we need to identify an island so an island can only be found by a land which is 1 so if we are landing on water it that it means that we need to skip this node and proceed ahead so this condition comes out to be false because value is 0 here so friends here you can see that now we will go somewhat fast because whenever we encounter 0 we'll simply move ahead because this conditions will come out to be false so we'll increment j j becomes 3 will simply skip because we have landed on water so now we'll increment j so j will go beyond the boundaries of this matrix so this condition comes out to be false so this for loop will terminate and the execution point will reach to the upper for loop because now we need to process the second row so first we increment i i becomes 1 so now we are processing this row we are done processing this row so we start from j equal to 0 so it means now we are on 1 comma 0 we noted we have found one land denoted by 1 so this condition is true but we also know that we have already visited this land so this condition comes out to be false we'll increment j j becomes 1 so now we are processing this value at 1 comma 1 So friends here you can see this 0 this 0 0 0 0 this phi will be skipped because we are landing on water and as we are traversing this matrix we will now encounter five waters so we will go over this somewhat quickly so this is a basic traversal of matrix we have found water so this condition comes out to be false j becomes 2 this condition comes out to be false j becomes 3 this condition comes out to be false so now we are done processing the row 1 so we go to row 2 we'll increment i i becomes 2 we'll start with j equal to 0 so we are at 2 comma 0 now this condition comes out to be false j becomes 1 this condition comes out to be false because we are landing on water so we need to skip it 
j becomes 2 so friend now here you can see that we are on a particular land because this condition comes out to be true and if we go to the visited area at i comma j which is 2 comma 2 here we have a false value it means we haven't visited this land so both the condition comes out to be true so it means as we have found a new land we'll apply dfs on top of it to actually figure out its adjacent lands horizontally and vertically so this dfs will be called with 2 comma 2 so on the call stack there will be dfs with row as 2 and column as 2 like this so now we'll apply the same algorithm which we applied to this node we are in the boundaries of the matrix visited is false and the value at this row and column is 1 so all the condition comes out to be false so first we mark this land as visited by assigning a value true to the visited 2d array at 2 comma 2 now we simply go to left of 2 comma 2 so when we go left row remains same and column decreases so we are leaving this dfs so first we update line number here which is 8 now on the call stack there will be one more method by name dfs where row remains the same and column decreases so we are at 2 comma 1 now it means we are going towards the left of 2 comma 2 which is 2 comma 1 here we know that we have landed on water so we simply return so this dfs will end execution point will reach here so this dfs we had left at line number 8 so we start from line number 8 we have encountered the water so we simply return so we come back to 2 comma 2 because at this moment row and column were at 2 comma 2 so we come back to 2 comma 2 now we go up so first we update the line number here which is 9 there will be one more method on the call stack if you are going up row decreases column remains same so row became 1 from 2 it means we have went here 1 comma 2 here you can see that we have landed on water again so we simply return so we come back to 2 comma 2 now this method will be removed from the call stack we'll start from line number 9 we come back to 2 comma 2 and now we are going towards right so first we update line number 10 here there will be one more method on the call stack if we are going towards right row remains same and column increases so from 2 it became 3 and we are going to 2 comma 3 now here here you can see that we have again found a water so we simply return to 2 comma 2 we start from line number 10 we return back to 2 comma 2 and now we simply go down so first we update line number 11 here because we are leaving this dfs at line number 11 there will be one more method on the call stack we are going down so row will increase so from 2 it became 3 and column remains the same we are at 3 comma 2 and here you can see we have found a water so we simply return back to 2 comma 2 this method will be removed from the call stack we return to this dfs at line number 11 so we return back to 2 comma 2 and here you can see that we have visited all the adjacent nodes of this land so this dfs will end now because there are no more lines to execute so now we'll go back to the method which actually called this dfs at 2 comma 2 so this is the condition so here you can see after we finish visiting all the lands adjacent to this land horizontally and vertically we know that we have found one more island so we'll increase the value of number of islands which becomes 2 now we'll increment j j becomes 3 so here you can see this is a water 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 so for the next four iteration we'll simply skip these values so we'll go over this quickly 
this condition comes out to be false now we are done with processing the row 2 so this for loop will terminate will increment i i becomes 3 because now we are processing the last row we'll start from j equal to 0 this condition comes out to be false j becomes 1 this condition comes out to be false j becomes 2 this condition comes out to be false and at the end j becomes 3 that we have found a land which is actually not visited because value is false it means that now we can apply dfs on top of this land so we'll call dfs we pass the value of i and j which is 3 comma 3 there will be one method dfs with row as 3 and column as 3 like this we are within the boundaries of the matrix and we haven't visited this land so all the condition will come out to be false so we will first mark this land as visited by assigning a value true in the visited array at row 3 and column 3 and now we'll perform the same steps we go left up right and bottom so we'll go over this quickly because we know that we are performing the same steps what we did here and here so we need to keep this thing in mind when we are going to the different directions so first we are going left so we update line number here there will be method on the call stack we are going left so column decreases so from 3 comma 3 it became 3 comma 2 we have reached here now this is a water so we'll simply return back to 3 comma 3 we start from line number 8 we come back to 3 comma 3 and now we actually go up we update line number here and there will be one more method on the call stack as we are going up so row will decrease so it became 2 comma 3 now we reached here this is the water so we return back to 3 comma 3 we start the execution on line number 9 we come back to 3 comma 3 because value of row and column is 3 comma 3 in this dfs now we go towards right we update line number 10 here because we are leaving this dfs and there will be one more method on the call stack we are going towards right so column will increase so here you can see that we have gone outside the boundaries of this matrix so value of column is actually equal to grid of 0 dot length which is equal to 4 it means we are outside the boundaries of this matrix so we'll simply return we return back to 3 comma 3 we start the execution at line number 10 like this and now we simply go down so we update the line number here 11 as we are going down row will increase and we have went outside the boundaries of this matrix so here now value of row is equal to grid dot length which is 4 so we'll simply return we start the execution from line number 11 and we return back to 3 comma 3 and after that there are no lines to execute so this dfs will also will be removed from the call stack and we go back to a method which called this dfs at row and column 3 comma 3 so this is the condition so we know that we have visited one more island so we'll increase the value of number of islands so it becomes 3 will increment j so j will go beyond the boundaries of this matrix so this for loop will terminate and as we have visited the last row will increment i so i will also go beyond the boundaries of this matrix it means we have visited a complete matrix and at the end 
after visiting all these islands will simply return the value 3 because there are three islands this this and this here you can see we have visited this this and this so friend this was all about that how we can solve the number of islands problem i hope you must have liked this video in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in this video we will discuss about hashing data structure and we will see a basic introduction to hashing so friends before we start in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel so that you never miss any update so what do we mean by hashing so before discussing that we will see that why we actually need a concept called hashing so usually when we need to perform any search operation we have few options such as linear search where what we do is let's suppose we are given with this array of 10 elements and let's suppose we want to search for a particular element for example let's say 10 so in linear search what we do is the value which we want to search which is 10 we compare it with each and every element of this array and when we reach here we find that 10 is there in this array and we simply say the value 10 is found in this array also let's suppose if we want to search for a value let's say 20 so what we need to do here is we need to compare 20 with each and every element of this array and after comparing with the last element if we don't find 20 in this array then we simply return that 20 is not found so here the problem is in case if the key which you want to search is not present in this list or array then the time complexity basically goes to o of n because we need to compare the key with each and every element and then only we can come to know that whether the key is present in this array or not so this is one problem with the linear search the other form of search we have is binary search now in binary search what we have is let's say we are given with this array of 10 elements in binary search the array we have is already sorted so here you can see here the elements are sorted in ascending order so when the elements are sorted in ascending order we basically use this property to make this search quicker so for example let's say if we want to search for an element 8 so here we don't compare the key which we want to search with each and every element of this array as we know that the array is already sorted we take the lower index which is 0 we take the higher index which is 9 and using these two indexes we try to find the mid index so here we simply do 9 plus 0 divided by 2 which give us 4.5 and if we take the integer value the mid value will come to 4 so what we do is whatever the value is at index 4 which is 10 we simply check that whether 8 is less than 10 or greater than 10 we know that 8 is less than 10 so it must be lying somewhere to the left of mid index because here we know that the elements of array are already sorted so what we do here is we simply discard the right sub array completely because we know that searching in elements after 10 will never give us 8 8 will only come before 10 so we simply discard the right sub array so after discarding the right sub array our array becomes from 0 to 4 where we take 0 as the lower index and 4 as the higher index we do 4 plus 0 divided by 2 we get 2 as mid index so whatever the value is at mid index which is 5 when we compare 5 with 8 we know that 8 is greater than 5 and as the array elements are sorted we simply discard the left sub array because we know that 8 must be lying to the right of 5 so now after we discard the left part our array becomes of 3 elements from 2 to 4 and then we again find the mid index we do 4 plus 2 which is 6 and if we divide it by 2 we get 3 so whatever the value is at third index which is mid we see it is 8 
we come to know that we have found our key and here you can see that compared to linear search binary search works pretty much faster when the array elements are sorted so friends with binary search with each iteration we simply discard half of the array because we know that the element which we want to search can be found at three places one is at the mid index or it can be on the left sub array or on the right sub array so if it is on the left sub array we simply discard the right sub array and if it is on the right sub array we simply discard the left sub array so here you can see on each iteration we are discarding half of the array so the time complexity of binary search comes out to be o of log n which is pretty much faster than o of n but here the problem still remains which is is there any data structure or is there any search technique which give us a time complexity of o of 1 because searching an element in linear search takes o of n which is not feasible for the search operation and for the binary search takes o of log n but here we have this constraint that element should be sorted which is usually never the case we have always elements in unsorted form and if we want to sort them we need to apply sorting algorithms whose complexity can reach to n log n so after we sort the elements then our search becomes faster and we get o of log n so how can we achieve a time complexity of o of 1 so if you see one solution is if we take array data structure now why array because array can be used to provide o of 1 searches using indexes so let's suppose if we are given with these elements 6 1 3 597 if you want to search in these elements and we want that the search should be of o of 1 time so what we can do is among this elements we will see which is the highest element which is 9 so what we can simply do is we can create an array whose last index is 9 which means we create an array of 10 elements where the last index is 9 and what we do here is we take 6 and we store 6 at 6th index 1 at first index 3 at index 3 5 at index 5 9 at index 9 7 at index 7 so we simply store all these elements into their respective indexes in an array and let's suppose if we are given let's search for a value 3 so what we can do is we simply go to third index of array by accessing the array with index 3 and we see whether 3 is there or not so this operation takes time complexity of o of 1 because we can access array elements directly so here at third index we see that there is a value 3 so our answer is found and let's say if we want to search for zero so what we do is we go to zeroth index and we see there is no value so our answer is not found so friends here you can see that arrays can give us a time complexity of o of 1 when performing the searches using their indexes so the time complexity of this scenario will be o of 1 which is pretty much fast so let's suppose we take one more example let's say we are in a classroom and we have this 30 students so what we can simply do is we can assign a roll number to each and every student and we can create a data structure which is array of size 30 where last index is 29 and we can assign the indexes to each and every student and let's suppose we are storing a student object on each and every index so here when the students are sitting in a classroom the teacher can directly go to a particular seat let's say 5 and let's say the teacher has a device where she can directly type 5 and gets the information for the student that the student name is john these are his marks in particular subject and all of the information for the student john and similarly if she searches for 29 she can get the information for tina so here also we can use array data structure 
and we can get the time complexity of O of 1. So to this type of storage, we simply call direct addressing. Moving ahead, now whatever the example we saw, there array was a perfect data structure for searching in O of 1 times. Now where the problem will still arise is, let's say, if we want to store Aadhaar card number, which is of 12 digits, or you can also take an example of storing the social security number in an array. So here, if you see that Aadhaar card number is of 12 digits and it gives an identity of a particular citizen of India based on his Aadhaar number. So the problem is if we take an array to store the Aadhaar card number, then if you want to store this big number into an array, which is nothing but direct addressing with its index, then there would be a huge array to store all the other card numbers. So this is one problem that we need to create such a huge array where the other card number matches the index of that array. And the second problem is, let's say if the other card number is designed with 12 digits and we have created a huge array to store the other card number and let's suppose we have only distributed 10 to 12 other card to the people and if we try to store those other card numbers into the array then after storing we will see that most of the memory of the array elements will remain unutilized and wasted. So this is the problem with arrays where we can't use direct addressing because we need to store such a huge number. So to basically address these problems hashing was introduced. Now what is hashing? So here you can see that hashing is a technique which is used for storing, retrieving and removing the information as quick as possible. And how do we perform the hashing is? Here it is a process of converting a arbitrary size key into a fixed size value. So here what we are simply saying is let's suppose we have our keys which are huge let's say the other card number or social security number. So what we can do is we can't directly store the key into the respective indexes of the array because that problem we discussed in our previous slide. So what we do is we take that particular huge key and we try to convert that key into a fixed size value and how we perform this conversion is this conversion is done by a special function which we call hash function. So we will discuss hash function in our upcoming videos. But for timing we can think that let's say if we have array of 1000 elements and we want to store a 12 digit other card number. So what we do is we take the other card number which is of an arbitrary size or a huge size. We pass that number to our hash function and this hash function will give us a fixed size value. Let's say if you are taking the size of the array where we want to store the other card number is of 1000, then it will give us a fixed size value between 0 to 1000 and we can simply use that fixed value and store that particular other card number. So this conversion of a large key into a fixed small size is done via hash function. So we will discuss this hash function in detail in our upcoming videos. So for timing you can simply think that hashing is a technique which is used for storing, retrieving and removing the information as quick as possible and the operation which hashing supports such as storing, retrieving and removing an information have average runtime complexity of O of 1. So friends in this video we saw that why we actually require the hashing technique or why we require a hashing data structure because we need average runtime complexity of O of 1 when we want to store, retrieve or remove any particular piece of information. So in our next video we will see that what are hash functions and how it helps in converting a huge size key into a fixed size value. So friends in case if you find this information useful then please like this video and if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel so that you never miss any update. Thanks have a nice day. Hello everyone. 
so friends in our previous video we discussed about what is hashing so in this video we will see that what are hash functions so friends before discussing about hash function in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel so that you never miss any update so in our previous video we saw a basic definition of what is hash function so a hash function simply takes an arbitrary size key and provides fixed size value also called as index so here using an hash function we can take a key of any size and once we pass that key to hash function it returns us back a fixed size value which we also called as index now this fixed size value is basically small and can be taken up as index and using that index we can store the key which we want and also by using this hash function we can even retrieve that key so we'll see the importance of hash function more in our upcoming videos so for this video you can simply think of hash function is let's suppose we are given key of any size what we do is we simply pass this key to our hash function and whatever key we passed hash function return as a index which is of fixed size now using this index value what we actually do is we simply store this key into a smaller size data structure and we can perform storing retrieving and removing of this key very fast we will see those implementation details later in upcoming videos so for timing you can simply think that to our hash function we pass in a key and it returns back as a smaller fixed size value index we will see its usage in greater detail in our upcoming videos so friends a hash function can be of any type you can basically write your own hash function where what you do is you simply take a key and it should return you back a smaller fixed size value so that you can use that fixed size value and store that huge key into a data structure so that the retrieval storing and removing of that particular key becomes faster and how does hash function help us in achieving a time complexity of o of 1 we will see later in upcoming videos so one such typical hash function which is mostly used in hashing data structure is modular hash function so what this hash function does is the modular hash function simply takes a key and a size now what it returns is remainder by dividing key by size so usually the remainder which hash function return us back is used as an index to store the key in an array of the provided size so here you can assume that key has a large value which cannot be taken up as an index of an array which we discussed in our previous video that it creates the problem so what hash function will help us in doing is let's say we take a smaller size array so when we pass the key and the size hash function will return the remainder by dividing key by that size and whatever the remainder is returned that remainder is taken up as an index to store the key in an array of provided size so here you can see instead of using an array for direct addressing which we discussed in our previous video here what we do is we simply take an array of smaller size and let's suppose the key has a very large value now how we can store that key into the array of small sizes we simply take the key we divide the key by the size and whatever the remainder we get that will be taken up as an index to store this particular key so let's see how modular hash function help us in storing large keys into a smaller size array so here we usually take the hash function as h of key which is the hash function which takes in a key and usually returns us back an index and this hash function can be any implementation you provide but here we are simply discussing the modular hash function so here we take the key we do modulus by size which is key mod size now this modulus operator always returns us back the remainder when we divide the key by size so here let's say these are our keys 
which we want to store. Now here you can see the keys are 5, 1, 10, 26 and 99. So we can't take an array of length 100 to store only 5 elements for the direct addressing. So what we do is, we simply take a smaller size array, let's say of 10 elements. Now size of this array is 10. Now how we store these keys into this array is, we take the key, we pass into the hash function. So here 5 modulus 10 which is 5 is the key, modulus size which is 10. So if we divide 5 by 10, we get remainder as 5 because 5 is not divisible by 10. So the remainder we get is 5. So here we simply take this key, go to the fifth index. Here this is the index which it returns. So we go to the fifth index and we store 5. Now we take 1. So 1, when we divide 1 by 10, we get remainder as 1. So we take this key, go to index 1 and store 1. Now we take key as 10. So when we divide 10 by 10, we get remainder 0 because 10 is divisible by 10. So here you can see that here 10 cannot fit into this array if we take it as a direct index. So this hash function is helping us to get a smaller index. So when we do 10 mod 10, we get 0. So here what we do is, we simply go to the 0th index and we store 10 here. Similarly, if we take a value 26, if we do 26 mod 10, it means if when we divide 26 by 10, we get the remainder as 6 because the 20 gets divisible by 10 and we get the remainder value as 6. So here we go to 6th index and we store 26 there. And similarly when we take 99, when we do 99 mod 10 or when we divide 99 by 10, we get remainder as 9. So here we go to 9th index and we store the value 99. So friends here you can see that here instead of doing the direct addressing of the key with array index, we are using a simple hash function and whatever is the value of key we don't care. We simply divide it by the size and whatever the remainder comes out, we simply take that as an index and we store those values at that particular index. So friends here we used the modular hash function to store these key elements into an array of fixed size. So similarly we can search a particular key based on our hash function. So if we take this example, let's say if you want to search whether 26 is present or not. So when we were storing this value in this array, we used modular hash function. So similarly when we want to search, what we do is, we take the value which we want to search, we pass to our hash function, it returns us back an index. We simply go to that index and we simply see that whether that key is present or not. So here in this case, 26 goes to the hash function and the hash function returns us the remainder as 6. So we go to the 6th index, we see there is a value. We compare this value with the key which we want to search and we see that 26 is present. So now here you can see the hash function is helping us store the keys which are very large in size and here you can see that for storing 99 we didn't take an array of 100 size elements. We simply took an array of 10 elements and we stored these values in the array. So friends here hash function can be implemented in many different ways. So one of the most popular hash function which we saw here was modular hash function. Now friends one more problem arises here is as we are mapping large keys into a smaller fixed size array, there could be a possibility that let's say if you want to store one more value as 109. So when we do 109 mod 10, we get remainder as 9. And when we go to 9th index for storing 109, we already see that there is a value 99. So now there is a problem that what do we do with initially stored 99 value because in array, we can store only one value at a time. So we will see these problems in greater detail in our upcoming videos. 
the idea which you are seeing here is using a smaller array and storing the larger size keys this data structure if we implement in such a way using a hash function such data structure are basically called as hash table so in our upcoming video we will see what is hash table so friends i hope you find this information useful and in case if you find this information useful then please like this video and if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel so that you never miss any update hello everyone so in this section we will discuss about a basic introduction to hash table in our previous video we discussed about what is hashing and what are hash functions so in this video we will look into a data structure which is hash table and we will see the concepts which we discussed in our previous videos like hashing and hash function and we'll see how they are used to implement a hash table so before we start in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel so that you never miss any update in one of our previous video we discussed that array can be used to store retrieve and remove an information with a time complexity of o of 1 based on indexes but we also saw that array had a limitation while implementing the direct addressing strategy via indexes so we introduced the concept of hashing now based on those concept when we implement a hash table we basically take a generalized form of an array so internally the data structure for implementing hash table is pretty much an array but it is used with the concepts of hashing and hash function now what do we do with the hash table is the data is stored in the form of key value pair so in our previous video we discussed that how a key is passed to a hash function and an index is written so based on the index we store this key value pair so basically in a hash table we simply put the data in form of key value pair where we take the key we pass it to the hash function and hash function returns as an index so this index is nothing but an index of an array where we simply store our key value pair so this key can be a huge key but our hash function takes that key and returns us back a fixed and a small value which is nothing but an index of our array now what we do is we take that index and we store the key value pair in the array and the primary operations which are supported by hash table are first is the put which takes in a key and a value now what does this operation does is it adds the key value pair against a unique key so here our key is unique and if we try to add a different value with the same key then that value gets updated and the older value will be removed so here the key is unique because this key usually goes into this hash function and based on the hash function calculation a index is returned and on that index this key value pair is stored similarly after storing when we do get then the value is returned for that provided key so here this key goes into the hash function a index is returned and based on this index whatever the value is stored in the array that value is returned for that provided key and the third operation is remove where we pass the key so what it does is it removes the key value pair from the hash table so these are the three primary operations supported by hash table and here if you see all these three operations use a hash function and we will discuss all these three operation in greater detail in our upcoming lectures these all three operation internally use the hash function which takes in a key returns as an index and based on the index put get and remove operations are performed so all these three operations are pretty much fast the average running time of all this operation is o of 1 and if you see in our java collection framework we have a hash map class which is pretty much same as the hash table class so if we want to deal with key value pair then we simply use hash map class and if we want to deal with only keys then we use hash set so here if you want to store 
any data in form of key value pair then we simply take the help of hash map class in java which is nothing but an hash table but if you only want to deal with the keys and not with the value then we simply use the hash set class and the idea behind both the classes to store the keys remains the same which we discussed here so friend let's see a simple hash table where we have provided with the hash function as key mod size and size is nothing but the length of this array so this array is the internal data structure to implement a hash table so we simply call it a hash table only now let's say if we want to store these key value pairs in this simple hash table so what we do is let's say key is 5 and the value is john so when we try to store this key value pair in a simple hash table what we do is we take the key we pass it to hash function and this hash function returns as an index so we simply go to that index and store this key value pair so for example 5 mod 10 so when we divide 5 by 10 we get remainder as 5 so this is our index which is being returned by the hash function so here we simply go to the fifth index and we simply store key value pair so this array can be taken up as array of key value pairs which can be our own type object which takes key and a value now if you want to store one comma tom so 1 divided by 10 gives remainder as 1 so here we go to the first index and we store 1 comma tom if we want to store 10 comma james we do 10 mod 10 so we get remainder as 0 so we go to the zeroth index and store 10 comma james there for this key value pair we get 6 as the remainder so we go to the sixth index and we store 26 comma tina for this key value pair so if we divide 99 by 10 we get remainder as 9 so we go to the ninth index and we store 99 comma sana there now if you take the last value 105 mod 10 will give a remainder as 5 so friend this is a simple hash table so now here you can see if we try to go to fifth index here you can see that we already have this value phi comma john now the problem is what should we do with this key value pair so whenever this kind of situation comes where we are simply storing key value pair in a particular index and we already encounter a key value pair there this concept in hash table is called as collision because now there is a collision between these two values that what should we do so friends here you can see that these kind of situation usually arises when we implement a hash table because here you can see the size of this hash table is only 10 and the keys which we are trying to store is more than 10 so usually after storing few values a hash table simply encounters this collision frequently so this is a simple hash table So in our future video we will see that how this hash table can be implemented to resolve these collisions and also friend there are strategies to resolve these collisions which we'll discuss in our upcoming videos So friends I hope you find this information useful and in case if you find this information useful then please like this video and if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel so that you never miss any update Thanks have a nice day Hello everyone. So in our previous video we discussed about a simple hash table. We saw what hash table does and we also saw that when we use hash function to store the key value pair in a hash table there will come a situation when there will be a collision. So in this video we will see that how we can resolve that collision using a collision resolution technique which we call as separate chaining. So in our previous video we saw a simple hash table where we had this array of key value pair and of size as 10 our hash function was key mod size where we divided key by size 
and whatever was the remainder we use that remainder as an index to store these keys with its values in this array so 5 mod 10 gave value as 5 so at the fifth index we stored 5 comma john at the first index we stored 1 comma tom at the zeroth index we stored 10 comma james because when we do 10 mod 10 or when we divide 10 by 10 we get remainder as 0 on the sixth index we stored 26 comma tina on the ninth index we stored 99 comma sana and when we encountered a value as 105 so our hash function returned us a value as 5 because when we divide 105 by 10 we get 5 as the remainder so when we went to fifth index we saw that there is already a value stored 5 comma john at fifth index so this resulted in a collision which we discussed in our previous video now in this video we will see that how we can resolve this collision using a strategy called as separate chaining So friends what we do in separate chaining is in case if we encounter a collision let's say when we try to store 105 on the fifth index we already found that value as 5 comma john so what we do is when this collision occurs then at the fifth index we simply store both the values in a list so that list is nothing but a simple linked list where whenever we encounter a collision we simply add that element in that list which belongs to that particular index so when we try to store many values which are huge in a small fixed size array then there will be a situation where we encounter frequent collisions so we simply add those elements into the list which belongs to that particular index so when this list grows it looks like a chain so therefore the resolution strategy is separate chaining where with each index we create a separate chain or linked list to store the values which are getting collided so let's see an example so friends in our previous videos when we discussed about the linked list we saw that how we can create a singly linked list doubly linked list and circular singly linked list so if we take the example of singly linked list we saw that there is a head from where basically the singly linked list starts and each node basically points to the next node in the list and the node which is at end points to null so here instead of taking the array of key value pair what we do is we take the array of hash nodes so here if you see let's say if you want to store phi comma john we first pass the key into the hash function we get the index which is 5 so instead of directly storing at this index we create a hash node so this hash node is pretty much similar to the singly linked list list node where we had a data and a reference to the next node so here we simply add one more value which is the key so here our hash node has three attributes one is the key other is the value and the third is the reference to the next hash node in this list or chain when some collision occurs so this terminology you can simply take it as hash node so in our upcoming videos we will discuss in greater detail what is hash node now let's say if we want to store one comma tom so at the first index we store one comma tom in a form of a hash node at the zeroth index we'll store 10 comma james and similarly the other values but when we encounter 105 comma mary so our hash function is returned a index as 5 so here when we go to index 5 we see that there is already a hash node available having key as 5 value as john now here we have encountered a collision so what we do is as this hash node can be treated and converted into a 
list or chain what we do is we can use its next reference and we can simply store 105 as key value as mary and its next is pointing to null so here whenever we encounter a collision we keep on adding those elements in this chain which we also say that it's a form of a linked list so by separate chaining technique we can resolve these collisions and we can store the values in the form of a linked list when any collision occurs so we'll see the importance of this hash node and this linked list in our upcoming videos when we will implement a hash table using the separate chaining technique so friends i hope you have find this information useful and in case if this information is useful to you then please like this video and if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel so that you never miss any update thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in this video we will discuss that how we can represent a hash node in a hash table so in our previous video we discussed about one of the collision resolution technique which was termed as separate chaining and when we discussed about the separate chaining we saw that how we can remove the collisions via a hash node and create chains where one hash node is pointing to other hash nodes so let's see the structure and representation of a hash node in a hash table but before we start in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel so that you never miss any update so here a hash node class in hash table consist of three data members now the first one is the key so the key is basically a unique value which help us in storing the data and here this case simply represent a generic type in java the second data member is value which is the actual data which is being stored in a hash table in a location which is being computed by the key and the hash function so here v simply signifies the generic type it can be any type so k and v can be any type and the third data member is hash node next so it simply refers to the next hash node in a chain of hash nodes so chain of hash node is nothing but a list of hash nodes which help us in resolving the collisions where one hash node simply refer to the other hash node and they form a chain so here these are the three data members and if we see the symbolic representation of it then hash node consists of three things the key which is unique and which help us in storing the value via hash function and the hash node simply points to the next hash node in a list when there is a collision so here hash node is very much similar to the list node which we discussed in our singly linked list videos the only difference is in the list node there was value and a reference to the next node but here in hash node we also store the key so we will see why this key value pairs are stored and how the primary operation in a hash table are implemented and if we see a representation of it it looks something like this that it has a key value and a reference to the next hash node in the list of hash nodes so friend this is how we actually represent a hash node in a hash table so usually when we implement a hash table then the hash node is nothing but a private class inside a hash table which help us in implementing the operations which are being performed by hash table so those operation we will discuss in detail in our upcoming videos i hope you must have liked this video and in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in our previous video we actually discussed about that how we can represent a hash node in a hash table so in this video we will see that how we can implement a hash table via separate chaining collision resolution technique so here in order to implement a hash table i will be creating few videos which will be in series so you can consider it as a part 1 of how to implement a hash table
बट बिफोर वी स्टार्ट इन केस इफ यू आर न्यू टू माई चैनल देन प्लीज सब्सक्राइब टू माई चैनल सो देट यू नेवर मिस एनी अपडेट सो फ्रेंड्स इन ऑर्डर टू इम्प्लीमेंट अश टेबल वी विल फर्स्ट लुक इन टू सम ऑफ द टर्मिनोलॉजी विच वी विल बी यूजिंग फ्रीक्वेंटली इन अपकमिंग वीडियोज टू अंडरस्टैंड डिफरेंट पार्ट ऑफ हैश टेबल सो हियर एज यू ऑलरेडी डिस्कस दैट हैश टेबल इज नथिंग बट ए जनरलाइज फॉर्म ऑफ एन एरे नॉ लेट्स एफ यू टेक द एग्जाम्पल ऑफ दिस एरे हुज लेंथ इज टेन एंड हैविंग इंडेक्स वैल्यू फ्रॉम जीरो टू नाइन सो वैन इम्प्लीमेंटिंग अ हैश टेबल वाई आर सेपरेट चेनिंग कोलिजन रिजोल्यूशन टेक्निक वी डिस्कस डेट वी एक्चुअली यूज द हैश नोड सो हियर इन ऑर्डर टू स्टोर की वैल्यू पेयर वी सिंपली टेक दिस एज एन एरे ऑफ हैश नोट्स सो टू दिस एरे वी सिंपली कॉल इट एज बकेट्स एंड वी डिनोट इट समथिंग लाइक दिस दैट ईच कंटेनर एट अ पर्टिकुलर इंडेक्स इज टर्म्ड एज बकेट एंड दिस एरे बेसिकली स्टोर्स हैश नोट विच हैज की वैल्यू पेयर एंड अ रेफरेंस टू द नेक्स्ट हैश नोट and here we will also create a variable which would be number of buckets so this number of buckets is nothing but the length of buckets array which is also called as capacity of hash table so for example if we want to store a key value pair let's say our keys of integer type having value as 10 and a value of string type which takes in a value as james and if we want to store at zeroth index what we do is the zeroth index bucket simply points to a hash node storing key value and has a reference to next node so currently if there is only one element then the next node will point to null similarly let's say at index 1 if we want to store a key value so it would look something like this so here you can see that way we are storing this key value pair is via hash function which we already discussed in our previous video and which we will be discussing in our upcoming videos also that here you can see the key is 10 and here let's say if we take the hash function as key mod the number of buckets which is also the length of this array then we get 10 modulus 10 which will give us a remainder 0 and whatever we get from the hash function it is nothing but our index so at the zeroth index you can see that we have stored a key value pair like this and similarly at fifth index we are storing a key 5 with a value as john so here 5 when divided by 10 gives remainder as 5 only so at fifth index we are storing a key as 5 and we usually term it as hash note which we have already discussed now let's say if you want to store a key of 105 so when we divide 105 by 10 we get remainder as 5 which would be the value returned by our hash function so if we go at index 5 we will see that there is already a value so there is a collision so in order to resolve this collision we are taking help of hash nodes because here you can see that the third data member is nothing but a reference to the next hash node so here we can use the next reference to store this key value pair which also corresponds to fifth index so here when we store this key value pair in form of a linked list the first element is simply treated as head and this linked list is also termed as chains because we are discussing separate chaining collision resolution technique and which is being implemented via chains so here when a collision is encountered the key value pairs are stored in a form of chain and this chain can be the way you want to implement you can simply add the newly inserted node at the end or at the beginning or you can insert in a sorted form like based on the keys that 5 comes before 100 and 5 comes later and then 205 305 something like that so you can insert multiple key value pair which is also called as hash node in a way which you want and similarly we can store other values like this also friends here you can see that length of this array is 10 which is also a value stored by number of buckets and which is also called as capacity 
of our hash table but here you can see that this hash table currently has 1 2 3 4 5 and 6 hash nodes so the size of the hash table is 6 because it has hold 6 key value pairs and the capacity is of 10 so this is the difference between the capacity and size so when we talk about size you can think of it the number of key value pairs inside a hash table and when we talk about capacity number of buckets or length of buckets we are simply talking about the array length so friend these are the few terminologies which are being associated with hash table so here when we implement a hash table you can see that we have three members here one is the buckets array which is of type hash node the second value is number of buckets which is also the capacity of our hash table and the third variable is size which is the number of key value pairs being stored in a hash table so here you can see that hash table as a constructor which takes in a capacity so when we create an object of hash table we need to provide that what's the capacity of our hash table it means we are providing that how many buckets the hash table will have and here you can see that internally our hash table is using hash node class so which we already discussed that it has a key and a value and a reference to the next hash node so here you can see that we are taking key as integer and value as string so this can be any generic type so for the understanding and demonstration i will be using the key as integer and the value as string so basically most of the things remain same when we take any generic type of key and value so here after taking key as integer and value as string and the third member is a reference to the next hash node which help us in storing the key value pair in a chain when the collision occurs so here what we do is at the start we simply call and create a instance of hash table and let's say we pass capacity of 10 to our hash table so it looks something like this that capacity value is 10 and in the hash table constructor what we do is we assign the capacity to number of buckets so it becomes 10 and then we create an array of hash node and we provide the capacity so it looks something like this that internal data structure is array of type hash node it is being termed as buckets and each compartment here you can see is a bucket which holds the hash nodes in a form of a chain so here when we create this array at the start every index or bucket points to null because there are no hash nodes currently into this array of hash nodes so at the start size remains zero because we currently don't have any key value pairs inside this hash table so size is zero so friends in this video we saw a initial implementation of a hash table via separate chaining collision resolution technique in our upcoming videos we will see that this hash table has many operations where we put a key value pair we remove a key value pair and we can get a value based on a key and there are many other operations which we will be looking into our upcoming videos so this is just a basic and initial implementation of a hash table so now let's go to our intellij id and we'll simply code this part into the id i hope you have find this information useful and in case if you find this information useful then please like this video and if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel so that you never miss any update thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in our previous video we discussed about a initial implementation of hash table we saw the structure of hash table and we also saw that how it uses hash nodes internally now in this video we'll simply code for the internal structure of hash table and in upcoming videos we will see the different operations performed by hash table and then we'll test its working in the main method so here i have created one class as hash table 
Now, as we discussed, hash table will consist of few instance variables. One is array of hash node, which we term as buckets. And as it is using the hash node class internally, here we will create a inner class hash node. And as we already discussed, that this hash node class will have three members. One would be our key. So this can be generic type. The second member would be value. And this can also be any generic type. So here for the demo purpose, I'm using the key as integer and value as string. And the third member would be the reference to the next hash node. And it will have a constructor, which will take two things. key and a value. We will assign the key to this dot key and value to this dot value. So here the hash table consists of an array of hash node which we called as buckets. It also has an integer variable number of buckets which is also capacity and it also has an integer type size which is nothing but number of key value pairs in hash table or number of hash nodes in a hash table. So basically in a hash table, the number of hash nodes represents the size of the hash table. And here we will provide a constructor to our hash table class. So when we will create an instance of hash table, it will simply call the parameterized constructor providing a default capacity. So here we will create one more constructor which will take a capacity. So here we can provide a customized capacity by calling this constructor and if we call this constructor it will create a hash table with a default capacity of 10. So here what we'll do is to number of buckets we will assign the capacity and now number of buckets is holding the capacity so what we'll do we will create the array of hash node whose length would be the value stored in the number of buckets. So here when we will create the instance of hash table, let's say with the capacity we provide. So the number of buckets will hold that capacity and the array of hash node will be of size which represents the number of buckets. And usually at the start when there are no hash nodes in a hash table, the size will be zero. So this is what happens when we first initialize or create the instance of hash table. Now here you can see that this is the initial implementation of hash table. So in a hash table there are many operations. So one of the operation is 
that we want to know the size of the hash table that how many key value pairs are there so we provide a method as size and here we simply return the size one more method we provide is boolean we check whether the hash table is empty or not so we provide the method as is empty and here if size is equal to 0 then we return true stating that hash table is empty and if size is not equal to 0 we are returning false so friends in our upcoming video we will look into the primary operations of a hash table which is put which basically put a key value pair in a hash table so the parameters are key and value so this method basically takes in a key value pair and it simply puts that key value pair in our hash table so we will discuss about this method in greater detail in our upcoming videos so this is one of the primary operations the other operation is get so this method simply takes in a key and returns the corresponding value associated with it so for time being i am simply returning null to compile this method so here whatever the key value pairs are stored in hash table so if you want to get any value associated with a key we simply pass key here and we get its corresponding value and one more method is remove where we pass the key and that key value pair will be removed and the value associated with that key will be returned so when we call get the key value pair remains in the hash table we only get the value out of the hash table but when we do remove that key value pair is completely removed from the hash table and its corresponding value is returned so here these are the three main operations which are being performed by hash table and all these three methods have a time complexity of o of 1 which is the average time complexity of a hash table so friend this was basic and initial implementation of a hash table in our upcoming videos we will see all these primary operations in great detail so friends in case if you find this information useful then please like this video and if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel so that you never miss any update thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in our previous video we saw a basic implementation of a hash table we saw that hash table internally has an array of hash nodes and we also saw the representation of an hash node which contains key value and a reference to the next hash node so after creating a basic structure of hash table in this video we will see that how we can put a key value pair in a hash table and the strategy which we will be using for collision resolution would be separate chaining so friends before we start in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel so that you never miss any update so here you can see that in our previous video we saw a basic structure of hash table where we can create a hash table by providing in a capacity which also signifies the number of buckets in a hash table so when we will call this line here you can see the hash table internally uses an array of hash node which we call as buckets and at the start each hash node at a particular index points to null so friends when we try to put a key value pair into the hash table there are various scenarios which comes into picture so the one scenario is when we take the key and we pass it to our hash function 
then that hash function returns us an index. So what we do is we simply go to that index and see that whether the hash node is pointing to null value or to any other node. So in case if it is pointing to null, then we simply insert key value pair in a form of a hash node and we simply assign that hash node to that particular index. And in case if there are multiple hash nodes already present, then what we do is we first check that whether that key is already present in the sequence of hash nodes or not. And if the key is already present, then we simply update the value. We don't insert a new key value pair. And one more use case is let's say if there are multiple nodes, but the key value pair is not present. So what we do is we simply create the hash node from the key value pair which we want to insert and we simply insert that hash node at the beginning of the list which is being formed by the hash node at a particular index. So currently you see all the hash node at a particular index is pointing to null. It means that each list which will be getting formed at a particular index starting node is null because there are no key value pair currently in this hash table. And at the start, we have this number of buckets value as 10 because we are providing the capacity to be 10. And currently as there are no elements, so the size is 0. Now let's say if you want to put a integer key and a string value. So here key is 105 and value is John. So at the start, here you can see that key is very long and we need to accommodate this key somewhere in this small buckets array so that when we put this key value pair and when we want to find that key value pair it should be pretty much fast. So what we do is we simply pass this key to our hash function. So here we will take the example of modular hash function which will take the key and will simply divide the key by buckets dot length or number of buckets and whatever is the remainder that would be our index which will be written by this method. So we are using this method as our hash function, which is nothing but the modular hash function. So if we divide 105 by 10, we get the remainder is 5. So that 5 will be written from this method and will be our bucket index. Now what we do is we simply access the hash node at this bucket index. So we go to the fifth index and we access this hash node. So currently you can see it is pointing to null. So which simply means that there are no hash node at this index. And as this is pointing to null, it will signify that head is pointing to null because at this index we are storing a hash node. So this hash node has next reference which can store other hash nodes. And if there are many hash nodes, then the first hash node is always our head. So this is also what we already discussed when we discussed about the singly linked list where we normally had a list node with a value and a reference to the next node. So here the only difference with hash node is it has key value pair and a reference to the next hash node. So here you can see currently head is pointing to null which means at this index there is no hash node. So what we can do is we can increment the size because we can directly put this key value pair here at this point. So first we create the hash node with key as 105 value as John and when we create a new hash node the next always points to null. So friends now what we do is whenever we insert this key value pair or hash node into this buckets array we can use different strategies. One would be that we can insert this node at the beginning of the list or we can insert this node at the end of the list or we can store this node based on some sorting logic such as the ascending order of the keys. So there are various strategies by which we can insert this node. So here we will be simply inserting this node at the beginning of the list. So friends in our previous videos we have seen that how we can insert a node at the beginning of the list or a singly linked list. So here the concept remains exactly the same. Now here you can see as head is pointing to null. So at the first step what we do is as we want to insert this node at the beginning of the list and there could be a possibility that there are already nodes here. 
as currently there is no notes but there could be a possibility that head is pointing to a chain of nodes so at the first step what we do is we simply assign node next value to head because we want to insert this node at the beginning of the list so if node next is pointing to head then only this node will be at the beginning of the list but currently head is pointing to null so node next is already pointing to null and then what we'll do is this hash node which is pointing to the head will break this link and will try to point it to our hash node which we want to insert so it would look something like this this null value goes away and this node will be inserted now let's say we want to insert a key as 21 and a value as tom so the bucket index would be 1 because 21 mod 10 will give remainder as 1 so we simply access the hash node at index 1 we see it is pointing to null so it is the same case like what we saw here so we simply increment the size by 1 and then we put the key value pair in the form of hash node so now here you can see that our hash table has two key value pairs therefore the size is 2 now let's say we want to insert a key value pair as 31 comma sana so here now this case is when there would be a collision so how this separate chaining strategy comes into picture we will see now if we do 31 mod 10 we get remainder as 1 so our bucket index is 1 so we simply go and access the hash node at index 1 so we see that there is already a hash node at this index so now here is a collision so the way we insert this key value pair now is we create the separate chains in a form of list so that's why we have created this hash node which has a next reference so that the chain of nodes can be added with ease so at the first step what we do is to whichever hash node this index is pointing that would be our head so this is the first step now what we do is as we don't know that how many nodes are there and there could be a possibility that this key might exist already in this hash table so what we do is we start from the head we compare its key with the key which we want to insert and if that key is already present then we simply update its value we don't add a key value pair in this hash table we simply update the value so that case we will see later but now here you can see head dot key is 21 and the key which we want to insert is 31 so therefore they are not equal so what we do is we move head to its next node because so let's say if there are five nodes then we need to compare all the five nodes key with a key which we want to insert because we don't want to insert a key which is already there so we simply move head to its next node by assigning head dot next to head so now here you can see head is pointing to null it means that this key is not present and we can safely insert this key value pair at this index at the beginning of the list and as we are adding this key value pair we will increment the size by 1 and then we will bring head to its first position again now we will create our hash node with this key value pair so key is 31 value is sana and its next is pointing to null so here now we are inserting this node at the beginning of the list so what we saw already here so at the first step what we do is as we want to insert this node at the beginning of the list we simply assign the value of head to node next so that node next currently pointing to null should point to head so it looks something like this that now node next is pointing to head and as node next is pointing to head now we can safely break this link and we can assign this reference to our newly created node so it would look something like this this link will go away and now there will be a reference to this hash node from this index so it would look something like this 
so here there is a reference from this index to this node which you want to insert and from this node there is a reference to the list of nodes which were already there so currently there is only one node but there could be a chain so when we rearrange this it would look something like this that node is inserted at the beginning of the list and this node simply shifted by one position so friends now here you can see let's say if you want to insert a key value pair where key is already present so here we have this three nodes we are trying to insert key value pair where key is 21 and value is mary so when we will divide 21 by 10 we get remainder as 1 so our bucket index become 1 so we simply access the hash node at this index and the first hash node is our head and if there is a hash node already present so now our first task is to verify that whether this key is already present in this hash table or not so the way we do it is we do head dot key which is 31 here we compare it with our key so here you can see they are not equal so what we do is we traverse head to its next node via this reference so now we again compare head dot key so here you can see it's 21 and our key which we want to insert is also 21 so therefore they are equal so what we do is by this check we came to know that key is already present so we don't have to insert a new key and increase the size what we do is we simply update the value when we actually put a key value pair so here instead of tom now the value will become mary So friend this was all about this video in our next video we will see the code for adding this key value pair in a hash table via animation i hope you must have liked this video and in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in our previous video we saw a demonstration via an animation that how we can put a key value pair in a hash table using the separate chaining collision resolution technique so in this video we will see the code for that and we will see its demonstration step by step with an animation so friends before we start in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update so when we create the instance of hash table this is what we discussed that at the start what happens that all the hash nodes on each index points to null so which means that on each index we have a list of nodes and the starting node is basically our head which is being pointing to null and here you can see when we start as we are providing the capacity of 10 it means we are creating the array of hash nodes with a length as 10 which is nothing but our number of buckets and size is 0 so let's say if you want to put a key and a value as 105 and john so we call the put method we take key as 105 and value as john so in our previous video we discussed the idea that how we can insert this key value pair there are many use cases which we will be seeing later so each use case at the start what we do is we take the key and we pass it to our hash function which gives us an index and we take that index and we try to insert the key value pair in the form of hash node into this bucket array so here you can see the get bucket index method is nothing but our hash function so here we are using the modular hash function where we are taking the key we are dividing it by number of buckets and whatever is the remainder we are returning it from this method which would be nothing but our bucket index so when we pass 105 as key and if we divide 105 by 10 then we get 5 as the remainder so the bucket index is 5 now what we do is we try to access the hash node at this bucket index so which is 5 so here you can see it points to a hash node having value as null so here you can see it is referring to a null value 
so it means at this index there are no hash nodes so we can directly insert this key value pair and as the starting node is pointing to null we are creating a hash node by name head which points to the first node at this index which would be null so head is pointing to null so friends here you can see that on each index there can be multiple hash nodes which are connected via the next reference which hash node has and when we discuss singly linked list we saw that the starting node is head so here we are simply referring head as the starting node of the singly linked list which will be formed by the chain of hash nodes so here why we need this head is because in this while loop at this particular index there could be a possibility that let's say there are many nodes so in this while loop we are checking that whether the key is already present or not so here you can see as head is pointing to null it means that this key value pair is not present so we exit from the while loop and as key value pair is not present we can simply add this key value pair in the form of hash node so first we increment the size so now size become 1 and now here you can see that let's suppose at this index there could have been multiple nodes connected via next reference so in this while loop there is a possibility that head might travel to some of the nodes to check whether the key is present or not so after this while loop we bring back head to the first node by again assigning the hash node at bucket index so head will again point to null and now as we want to insert the node so first we create the hash node with key value pair which we want to insert so it would look something like this key is 105 value is john and its next is pointing to null and it is being referred by node now as we want to insert this node at the beginning of the list which is starting from head what we do is we simply assign the value of head to node next because we want to insert this node just before the head which would be the beginning of the list so node next should point to head so we are simply assigning value head to nodes next so currently node next is already pointing to null and now as we want to insert this hash node in this bucket array so at this index whatever the reference would be we simply assign it to the node so at the bucket index we are simply assigning the value of node so it would look something like this as node is pointing to this node now this hash node will point to the node which we want to insert so here you can see that we have inserted one hash node and from now onwards there would be multiple hash nodes on this index in case some collision will occur so let's put one more key value pair their key is 21 and value is tom so size is already 1 key is 21 value is tom we first calculate the bucket index from our hash function so when we'll call get bucket index we pass in the key so 21 when divided by 10 will give remainder as 1 so the bucket index will become 1 So now what we do is we simply try to access the hash node at this bucket index. So when we call buckets and we pass bucket index as one, we are accessing this value. So here you can see that the hash node which it refers is null. So it means that there are no nodes in this list here. So head will point to null. now we will simply check whether 21 is present in list of nodes at this index or not so currently its head is pointing to null this condition in while loop will come out to be false and we know that this key value pair is not present so we'll simply increase the size by 1 because now we are simply adding key value pair into this bucket array so size becomes 2 and we already discussed that head might travel in this while loop to some of the nodes to simply compare whether 21 is present or not so we simply bring back head to the starting of the list by again assigning 
the hash noted bucket index. So head will again point to null. We'll create the hash node with key as 21, value as Tom, and next pointing to null. And as we want to insert this node at the beginning of the list, first we assign the value of head to nodes next. So head is pointing to null. So here node next will point to null. And then we will simply add node into this bucket array by assigning the value of node at the bucket index. So it would look something like this. That now it will point to the node which we want to insert. So friends here you can see that we have added two nodes now. Now let's say we want to add one more key value pair where key is 31 and value is Sana. So this is the case where we will actually see the collision and we will see the importance of this next reference. So key is 31 and value is Sana. We calculate the bucket index 31 divided by 10 will give remainder as 1. So bucket index will become 1. We will access the hash node at this bucket index which is at index 1 and to whichever node it is pointing our head will point to that node because that would be our starting of this list. So head will point to this node. So now we'll see that whether 31 is present in this list of nodes or not which is at this index. So currently you see head is not equal to null. So there could be a possibility that this key and value might exist already in the buckets array. So in the while loop we check whether head dot key which is 21 is equal to 31 or not which is the key which we want to insert. So this condition comes out to be false because 21 is not equal to 31. It means this key value pair is not present for this node. So what we do is we simply traverse head to its next node because there could be possibility that this list can contain let's say n number of nodes. So we have to compare the keys for this n number of nodes by traversing head 1 1 position with each iteration. So we simply assign head dot next value to head. So head dot next is pointing to null. So now head will point to null. We check whether head is equal to null or not. So head is equal to null. So this condition comes out to be false which signifies that this key value pair is not present in this buckets array. So we can safely insert a key value pair. So this condition comes out to be false and while loop will terminate. So rest of the steps remains the same. As we are now inserting this key value pair, we will increment size by 1. So size will become 3. And here you can see that head has already traversed into this list of nodes. So we again bring back head to the starting point of the list by again assigning the hash node at bucket index, which is our first hash node. So it would look something like this. Head comes back to the first position. And why we are bringing head to the first position is because we are trying to insert this key value pair in the form of hash node at the beginning of the list. So we usually need the head for that which is nothing but our first hash node of the list. So here we are simply creating the node with key value pair. So key is 31 value is Sana and its next is pointing to null which is being referred by node. And now as you want to insert this node at the beginning of the list which means let's say there are n number of nodes already here and if we insert this node our node should come before head which is having key as 21. So the node having key as 31 should insert before before the node having key as 21 which is nothing but our head. So what we do is we can't directly break this link and assign it to our node because if we break this link this chain will go away. So first we need to hold this chain. So how we can hold this chain is we assign the value of head to nodes next. Because we want to insert this node before the head. 
so node next should point to head so after this assignment it would look something like this that node next is pointing to a node to which head is pointing and then we can simply break this link and assign it to our newly created node so it would look something like this this link will go away and there will be a link from this index to the hash node which you want to insert so if we rearrange this structure it would look something like this that the node which you want to insert is at the beginning of this list which is just before the our old head so friends now let's see one last use case where the key is already present so here you can see if we put key as 21 and let's say value as mary so here if the key is already present we don't put the key value pair in the buckets array we simply update the value and that we do with the help of this while loop so let's see how key is 21 value is mary the bucket index will come out to be 1 because 21 divided by 10 will give remainder as 1 so bucket index is 1 so we simply access the hash node at this bucket index which would be nothing but our head so head will point to this node we check whether head is equal to null or not so here you can see currently head is not equal to null so in the while loop we simply check whether key 21 is already present or not so that is done via this if condition we simply check head dot key is equals our key or not so 31 is not equal to 21 so this condition comes out to be false and we simply traverse head to its next node by assigning head dot next to head so via this reference head is traveled to its next node because we want to compare each and every key present at this index with our key because there could be a possibility that 21 is already present in this list so after this assignment we again check whether head is equal to null or not so we encounter one more hash node so head is not equal to null but now here you can see head dot key is 21 it is equal to our key 21 so this condition comes out to be true which means that key is already present in our bucket array so we don't increment size here what we do is we simply assign the value as mary to head dot value so head dot value is tom which will be updated by mary so here we are simply updating the value with the recent value old value is discarded and the size of the hash table remains the same because key is already present and after updating the value we simply return from this method so friends here you can see that we saw various use cases that how we can insert a key value pair in the form of hash node in a hash table we saw that how we can add a key value pair we also saw that how we can update a key value pair we also saw that what happens when there is a collision and we also saw the importance of our hash function that it can take a large key and provide us with a small index so that we can add this key value structure into this buckets array so friends i hope you must have find this information useful and in case if you have find this information useful then please like this video and if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in our previous video we saw that how we can put a key value pair in a hash table we also saw different use cases which comes into picture when we actually put a key value pair in a hash table so one use case is if the key is not present we simply put the key value pair and increase the size and the second use case is if the key is present then we don't put the key value pair we simply go to that key and simply update the value for that key 
So if the key is present, then we simply update the value. We don't add the key value pair in our hash table because key is already there. So here before we start, in case if you are new to my channel, then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update. So here you can see that our hash table internally has an array of hash nodes which we call as buckets. It also has the capacity which is nothing but buckets dot length and it also has size which is nothing but the number of key value pairs in a hash table or we can say the number of hash nodes which this array holds. We also saw that how internally hash table uses hash node class. So here it has key value pair and a reference to next node. So for our implementation we can take any key value pair but here I have taken key as integer and value as string. We also saw about the size method which returns the number of hash node in our buckets array and if size is equal to zero is empty method will return true. Now we'll see the implementation of the put method which takes in a key and a value and we'll see that how we can put this key value pair in our hash table. So at the start we simply provide simple edge cases where we simply check that if key is equal to null or value is equal to null then here either we can return from this method or we can throw an exception. Let's say I throw illegal argument exception saying key or value is let's say null. So friends here you can provide your own edge cases. So this is one of the simple edge cases I am providing. Now here in order to put this key value pair in our hash table the first thing we do is we try to evaluate bucket where we can put this key and value. So for that we will be using modular hash function. So here we first evaluate bucket index. So we will call our hash function whose name is get bucket index and we pass our key to it because this key can be a very huge key and in order to accommodate a huge key in simple or small size array we need a hash function which takes in the key and returns us a smaller index value so that we can use that index and put this key value pair. So here I will be creating one private method as get bucket index which will return us back the index value for this key so it will take key and here I am using the modular hash function so we will simply return key mod divided by number of buckets and whatever is the remainder that will be returned from this method. Here we all can also use buckets dot length instead of number of buckets. So after getting the bucket index we will try to access the hash node which is at that bucket index. So we do buckets we provide the index to it and whatever the hash node it will return it will be the head of the list which this index is holding. So that would be our hash node and it will be head. So after getting the head what we do is we can't directly put this key value pair in our hash table. We first try to search each and every element present at this bucket index which is the list whose first node is referred by this head. So what we do is we simply provide a while loop and we provide the condition as head should not be equal to null. So if head is not equal to null then first thing we do is we try to search for our key because in case if our key is present then we don't put this key value pair in the hash table we simply update the value corresponding to this key. So if head is not equal to null we provide if condition we check head dot key equals the key which we have passed to this method and if it is true what we do is we simply update the value associated with this head node 
with our value. So here you can see that we are using this head to simply traverse the list at this index, and we are comparing the head key with the key which we have passed. So this case handles if the key is already present in our hash table. So after we update the head's value with the new value, we simply return from this method because we don't want to add this key value pair again. So if this condition is false, what we do is we traverse head to its next node by assigning head dot next value to head, and this is important because let's say we have found a list of hash nodes which is being referred by head. So we need to compare this key with each and every node which is being referred by this head. So therefore we have provided this while loop, and as soon as we have found our key. we are updating its value and returning from the method without adding this key value pair and if we are not finding it then we are simply traversing it to its next node so there would be a condition when head will reach to the end of the list so at that moment this while loop will terminate and at that moment if while loop terminates it means that we never found our key so we can now directly add this key so what we do in the first step is as we are adding the key value pair in the hash table we will increase the size by 1 and also friends here you can see that we can add this key value pair in the form of hash node and that hash node we can insert the way we want so here we will be inserting this hash node at the beginning of the list so in order to get the beginning of the list what we do is there could be a possibility that in this while loop the head must have traversed so what we do is we simply do this step again and we make head reach to the first position by again assigning a hash node at this bucket index so after this step now head is pointing to the first node of the list and we want to insert this hash node before head so the first step we do is we create the hash node let's say we give name as node and here we provide the key and the value so here it looks something like this key value and its next is pointing to null so now how we can insert the node at the beginning of the list is we simply assign head to node dot next here you can see head is pointing to the first node of the list and we want to insert this node just before that so it means its next should point to head so this is the first step and the last step is hash node at this bucket index is currently pointing to head so we need to break that link so here what we do is we do buckets bucket index and we assign the value of node to it so friends here you can see the hash node at this bucket index was initially pointing to head and as we inserted our node just before the head now hash node at bucket index is pointing to node which we want to insert and node next is pointing to the head in order to keep the rest of the nodes intact So this is how we can put a key value pair in a hash table. Now let's see it's working in the main method. So here we'll create a main method. First we will create the hash table. Let's say we provide the capacity as 10 which means number of buckets will be 10. And now what we do is we simply put few values let's say we put 105 comma let's say tom we put 21 sana and now what we do is let's say we do table dot we print the size So if I run the code now, 
so here you can see it printed two now what we do here is we again call table dot put and here we are again providing a key which is already there and this time we are providing the value as harry so if i run the code now the size should remain the same so here you can see it came out to be 2 and here if i debug this so here you can see if you open buckets array that 105 was added at index 5 based on our hash function where we divided 105 by 10 and remainder was 5 so if i open this you will see the value as tom and key as 105 and next pointing to null because you only inserted one value if i open the index one here you will see that we have only one value as next is pointing to null but here you can see the updated value is harry initially it was sana now it became harry and here we simply updated the old value with the new value and let's suppose if we add something like 31 Dinesh and if I rerun it so here you can see 31 divided by 10 will give index 1 so if I open index 1 you can see the 31 is inserted at the beginning of the list and now here you can see initially it was 21 so now 31 got inserted before that and its next is now pointing to 21 so this is how we actually put a key value pair in our hash table i hope you must have find this information useful in case if you find this information useful then please like this video and if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update hello everyone so in our previous video we saw that how we can put a key value pair in a hash table using the separate chaining collision resolution technique and in this video we will see that how we can get a value by key in a hash table so friends before we start in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update so friends let's suppose we are given with this hash table having buckets array where number of buckets is 10 which is the length of this hash node array and the size is 3 because we have inserted 3 key value pairs in the form of hash node and where we have detected a collision there we have inserted the nodes in the form of chains here index 1 is nothing but our bucket index which correspond to this list whose index is 1 which is being generated by the hash function by providing a certain key so friends here you can see the advantage of searching a value corresponding to a key in this hash table is it is very much fast so for example let's say if you want to search for key 105 so here you can see that the number of buckets in the buckets array is only 10 and we are storing a huge value in this buckets array so after storing these values in the form of chains there one question arises that how we can get that value because storing is easy but how we can get a value corresponding to a key and that too very much fast so here as we discussed the way we put the key value pair into the hash table using the hash function the same way we use the hash function and deduce the index and try to search for a key so here you can see that size is 3 so inside this bucket array there can be thousands of elements in the form of key value pairs so how hash function help us in searching our particular key value pair fast is let's suppose if we call table dot get and pass in a key as 105 so via this method we are asking that please get us the value corresponding to this key so here what happens is key is 105 so at the start what we do is we pass this key to our hash function 
and hash function provide us with an index and we try to search only in that particular index so this type of searching makes our data structure very much efficient in searching so here our hash function is we pass the key so here we can take any hash function which we like but here i am taking this modular hash function where we are simply taking the key we are dividing it by buckets dot length or number of buckets and whatever is the remainder that we are simply returning which will be treated as our index so if we divide 105 by 10 we get remainder is 5 so our bucket index is 5 so it means that this key can only present in the chain of nodes corresponding to index 5 so we simply access the hash node at index 5 and to whichever node it is pointing that would be our head because there can be multiple hash nodes in this list so the first node is usually our head so we simply point head to it and now our task is to search for our key so here we do head dot key which is 105 we try to compare it with our key and if they are equal then we simply return its value which is john so friends here you can see there are so many elements but with just simple hash function we quickly searched for our key so this is the simple case where our first node became the key which we want to search so after this let's say we search for 21 so key is 21 if we divide 21 by 10 we get remainder as 1 so our bucket index will come 1 so we directly go to index 1 and we will try to access its first node so head will point to the first node via this link and here what we do is we simply compare head dot key which is 31 with 21 so they are not equal it means for this node the key is not present but there are other nodes in this chain so what we do is we simply traverse head to its next node via this reference so head comes to this position and now we again do head dot key we compare 21 with our key and we see that we have found our key so what we do is we simply return the value as tom now let's suppose if we want to search for a key which is not present in this hash table for example if we call table dot get and we pass the key as 88 so here we see 88 is not present so key is 88 when we will divide 88 by 10 we get remainder as 8 so the bucket index becomes 8 we go to the 8th index and try to access the hash node which it refers so here you can see the head will point to null which simply signifies that this key is not present in this hash table so we simply return null from this hash table so friend these are the simple use cases where we can get a value by key in a hash table in our upcoming video we will see the code to get a value corresponding to a key from the hash table and we will see the demonstration of the code via an animation i hope you have find this information useful and in case if you find this information useful then please like this video and if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in our previous video we saw a animation that how we can get a value by key in a hash table so now let's look into the code with an animation but before we start in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update so here the example which we discussed in our previous video we will use the same example and we will see that how it works via this code so let's say if you are calling get method and passing in the key so here key becomes 105 and here you can see currently our bucket has three nodes 
in the form of key value pairs so the size is 3 so at the first step if you want to get a value corresponding to a key the first thing we do is we try to find the bucket where that key might belong so how we can do that is we simply call our hash function we pass the key to it and it will return us back the index so when we will call get bucket index passing in the key it will return us back the index by simply taking in the key dividing it by the buckets dot length or number of buckets and whatever is the remainder it will return us back that index so here we can use any hash function and here i have used this modular hash function which is taking the mod of key and buckets dot length and returning us back the remainder so when 105 will be divided by 10 we get remainder as 5 so the bucket index is 5 for this key it means that at index 5 this key will be present or it might not present moving ahead now as we have figured out the index so we try to access the hash node at this index so we do buckets and we pass in the index so this will return us a hash node which would be nothing but the head of our list of nodes which can be there on this index so head will point to this hash node because this is the first hash node in a list of hash nodes now how we can search for our keys we provide a while loop and why we are providing this while loop is because here you can see there is only one hash node but there could be a possibility that there are n number of hash nodes so we need to compare each and every hash nodes key with the key which we want to search so we are simply checking whether head is equal to null or not so if head is not equal to null it means that there are nodes present at this index so we provide a if condition and we simply check whether head dot key which is 105 whether it is equal to the key which we want to search so here you can see this condition comes out to be true because 105 is equal to the key which we are searching so the if condition comes out to be true and we simply return head dot value because we have find our key and we want to return its corresponding value so we simply return head dot value so john will be returned now let's say if you want to search for a key which is somewhere in between of this list at a particular index so here we are calling get method with key as 21 so at the first step what we are doing is we are calling the hash function get bucket index we are passing in the key so this method will return us an index where we can search for this key so when 21 will be divided by 10 we get remainder as 1 so the bucket index will be 1 so now we'll simply access the hash node at this bucket index and that will be our head so at index 1 we have this hash node so head will refer to it we provide a while loop because here we are having a list from which we want to search our key so we simply check whether head is equal to null or not so here you can see head is not equal to null so this condition comes out to be true we provide a if condition that if head dot key equals key which means that we have found our key so currently head dot key is 31 we compare it with 21 so this if condition comes out to be false because 31 is not equal to 21 so we simply move head to its next node by assigning head dot next value to head so head is pointing to this node its next is pointing to this node so via this reference we will simply traverse head to its next node we again check whether head is equal to null or not so head is not equal to null we check head dot key which is 21 whether it is equal to the key which we are searching so yes head dot key which is 21 is equal to 21 which we are searching so this condition comes out to be true and we will simply return the value corresponding to this key which is tom now friend let's say if you want to search for a key which is not present in this hash table 
सो वी कॉल गेट मेथड वी पास इन द की एज एटी एट सो की इज एटी एट वी कैलकुलेट द बकेट इंडेक्स वी डिवाइड एटी एट बाय टेन एंड वी गेट द रिमाइंडर इज एट सो द बकेट इंडेक्स विल बी एट सो वी एक्सेस द हैश नोड वाई द बकेट इंडेक्स विच इज दिस नोड विच वुड बी अवर हेड नाउ सो हेड इज पॉइंटिंग टू नल एंड देन वी आर प्रोवाइडिंग दिस वाइल लूप बिकॉज देयर कुड बी अ पॉसिबिलिटी दैट इट कंटेन्स द चेन ऑफ नोट्स सो हियर यू कैन सी द कंडीशन हियर इज हेड शुड बी नॉट इक्वल टू नल बट हियर हेड इज इक्वल टू नल इट मीन्स दैट की विच वी आर सर्चिंग इज नॉट प्रेजेंट इन दिस हैश टेबल सो एट द एंड वी आर सिंपली रिटर्निंग द नल वैल्यू विच सिग्निफाइज दैट एटी एट इज नॉट प्रेजेंट इन दिस हैश टेबल सो फ्रेंड्स आई होप यू आर फाइंड दिस इंफॉर्मेशन यूजफुल एंड इन केस इफ यू आर फाइंड दिस इंफॉर्मेशन यूजफुल देन प्लीज लाइक दिस वीडियो एंड इफ यू आर न्यू टू माई चैनल देन प्लीज सब्सक्राइब टू माई चैनल एंड क्लिक द बेल आईकॉन सो दैट यू नेवर मिस एनी अपडेट थैंक्स एव अस डे हेलो एवरी वन सो नवर प्रीवियस वीडियो वी सॉ एन एनिमेशन दैट हाउ वी कैन गेट अ वैल्यू वायर्ड्स की फ्रॉम अ हैश टेबल सो इन दिस वीडियो वी विल एक्चुअली कोड द अलगोरिथम एंड विल टेस्ट इट्स वर्किंग इन द मेन मेथड सो बिफोर वी स्टार्ट इफ यू आर न्यू टू माई चैनल देन प्लीज सब्सक्राइब टू माई चैनल एंड क्लिक द बेल आईकॉन सो दैट यू नेवर मिस एनी अपडेट सो हियर इन अवर प्रीवियस वीडियोज वी सॉ अ इनिशियल इम्प्लीमेंटेशन ऑफ हैश टेबल and we saw that how we can put a key value pair in hash table which internally uses the hash function which is nothing but get bucket index and here the hash function which we are using is modular hash function which is using this modulus operator now in this video we will see that how we can get a value by providing its key so when we saw the implementation of put we provided this h case that key or value if they are null then we simply throw illegal argument exception saying key or value is null and as we are not putting any null key or null value when we will do get we simply provide this check again and here we'll simply check if the key is null then we throw illegal argument exception saying key is null so this is the simple edge case which we are providing and now how we can get a value associated with this key which we are passing to this method because in hash table internally it is using buckets array of type hash node so how we can find our key and return its corresponding value we basically use the hash function which takes a key and return us back an index and corresponding to that index we try to search our key so here you can see we first evaluate the bucket index where this key might lie because there could be a possibility that this key is not present in our hash table so what we do here is whatever the key we are passing we call get bucket index method we pass the key to it so this is our hash function so it will return us back the index where this key might lie so after getting the bucket index what we do is we try to access the first node of the list which corresponds to this index so here we simply access buckets we pass the bucket index it will return us back the hash node which would be the starting node of the list of hash node so we are assigning it to head now after getting the head our task is to find the key so for that we are providing this while loop and here we are providing the condition as head should not be equal to null so friends here you can see this is exactly what we did in put and also we provided while loop where we were simply searching for that key and if key was found we were simply updating its value so here i will simply copy this and will paste it here 
सो द ओनली चेंज वी डू हियर इज इफ वी फाइंड अवर की देन वॉट वी डू इज वी सिंपली रिटर्न हेड डॉट वैल्यू बिकॉज वी वॉन्टेड द वैल्यू एसोसिएटेड विद दिस की सो वी सर्च फॉर द की एंड वी चेक दैट वेदर एनी की इज मैचिंग टू अवर की और नॉट सो इन द इफ ब्लॉक वी प्रोवाइडेड द कंडीशन इफ हेड डॉट की इज इक्वल टू अवर की देन सिंपली रिटर्न इट्स वैल्यू एंड इफ इट इज नॉट देन सिंपली मूव हेड टू इट्स नेक्स्ट नोड बाई असाइनिंग हेड डॉट नेक्स्ट टू हेड सो फ्रेंड्स हियर वेन वी आर एक्सेसिंग द हैश नोट एट दिस बकेट इंडेक्स देर कुड बी अ पॉसिबिलिटी दैट दिस हैश नोट विल पॉइंट टू अदर हैश नोट एंड देर कैन ऑल्सो भी पॉसिबिलिटी दोज हैश नोट पॉइंट टू अदर हैश नोट सो वी आर एक्सेसिंग द हेड वी आर कंपेयरिंग द की इफ की इज मैचिंग देन वी आर रिटर्निंग द वैल्यू एंड इफ की इज नॉट मैचिंग वी आर सिंपली गोइंग टू इट्स नेक्स्ट नोड एंड डूइंग द सेम स्टेप्स अगेन सो फ्रेंड्स इफ द की इज प्रेजेंट इट्स कॉरेस्पॉन्डिंग वैल्यू इज रिटर्न एंड इफ इट इज नॉट देन वी आर सिंपली रिटर्निंग नल हियर नाउ लेट्स टेस्ट इट्स वर्किंग इन द मेन मेथड हियर इन अवर प्रीवियस वीडियो वी एडेड फ्यू कीज along with its values so if i run the code now you will see there would be three keys so it printed the size of the hash table as 3 because the key values pairs are 3 105 21 31 and 31 here this 21 was already present so when we call put the sana was replaced with harry so it simply updated the value it never inserted a new key value now here what we do is let's say if we do table dot get and say return me the value associated with key 31 and we print it so if i run the code now it should print dinesh so which is corresponding to key 31 so now if we do table dot get and pass the key as 21 if i run the code it should print harry because harry is the updated value for key 21 and last let's say if we print a key which is not present let's say 90 if i run the code now so it should print null so it is returning null So friends in this video we saw that how we can get a value associated with its corresponding key i hope you have find this information useful and in case if you have find this information useful then please like this video if you are new to my channel then please subscribe my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in our previous video we saw that how we can get a value from a hash table via its key now in this video we will see that how we can remove a key from a hash table so basically we will see the demonstration of remove method which takes in a key and it removes that key from the hash table and also returns its corresponding value back to us so before we start in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update so let's suppose if we are given with this hash table having three hash nodes where size is equal to 3 now let's suppose if we want to remove a particular key so what we do is we are given with a key we first try to find the index associated with that key via our hash function then we go to that index and we try to search for that particular key in case if we find that key then we simply remove that node from the corresponding list of that index and if we don't find the key we simply return null so here you can see that there are various cases which needs to be handled while removing a key the first case is what if the key is not present so we simply return null the second case is let's suppose the key is in the middle somewhere so when we find that key we can't directly delete this node because if we delete this node directly then there are other nodes associated with this node which will also get deleted so what we do is let's suppose if we want to delete this key 
then when our node will reach to this point we compare the key and we find that we need to delete this node we have to break this link so in order to break this link we need to somehow access this node and this is accessed via a temporary node which is previous to our current node which we want to delete so here after we find the key which we want to remove the previous node will help us in removing this node so what we do is as previous is pointing to this node we have to break this link and make a link from this node to current's next because we don't want to remove the nodes after that so we simply assign current's next to previous next so this link will go away and this link will point to current's next which would be the leftover nodes after we remove this node so friend this is also one case where the key which we want to remove is in the middle of this list so for that we simply keep the track of its previous node which we will see later so let's suppose if we want to remove a key having value as 105 so at the first step we pass this key to our hash function which takes the key divided by buckets dot length which is the number of buckets and return us back the remainder of it because here we have this modulus operator so whatever the remainder is returned that is nothing but our index where we can find that particular key so if we divide 105 by 10 we get remainder as 5 so the bucket index becomes 5 we simply access the hash node at bucket index 5 so this will be our head so as head is pointing to the first node at the start we assign a null value to our previous node so this previous will simply track the previous node to our head we will see why it is needed later in this video so currently previous is pointing to null now using the head we will simply search for our key which we already discussed in our previous videos so we do head dot key which is 105 we compare it with our key so here head dot key is equal to the key which we want to remove it means we have to remove this hash node so what we do is as previous is pointing to null it means we want to remove the first node of the list so currently head next is pointing to null so there could be a possibility that there are n number of nodes after that so it means that we want to remove the first node from the list so what we do is in order to remove this node we have to first break this link so that there is no reference to this node and it can be freed up but we can't directly break this link because there could be nodes after that so these nodes which can be after the head will also be removed so what we do is so first we decrease the size so size becomes 2 and now what we do is if we do head dot next we will get the remaining hash nodes in the form of chain and as head dot next is pointing to the nodes after that if we assign head dot next value to buckets at this index so this node can be freed up and this reference will point to whatever the head dot next is pointing so currently it is pointing to null so what we do is if previous is null which means that we want to remove the first node of the list so here we will assign head dot next value to bucket index 5 so it would look something like this head dot next is null so this link will be removed and it will point to null and now we can simply remove this node and we can return head dot value which is john so it would look something like this now let's say if you want to remove key as 21 so 21 divided by 10 will give remainder as 1 it means the 21 key can be present at index 1 so we access the hash node of index 1 so this would be our head at start we assign null value to previous now here first we search for our key so we do head dot key which is 31 we compare it with our key which is 21 so here you can see 31 is not equal to 21 so what we do is before moving head to its next node in order to search for the key we first assign 
the value of head to previous because we need to keep the track of the previous node so that in case if we find a key then we can use its previous and break the link so that the key which we have searched can be removed easily so here as head is pointing to this node now previous will point to this node and we will simply traverse head to its next node via this link now we again compare head dot key which is 21 with our key so here you can see that we have found our key so our task is to now remove this node but there could be a possibility that after this node there are many other nodes so what we do is as we want to remove this node first we decrease the size so size will become 1 and we simply check whether previous is pointing to null or not so here you can see previous is not pointing to null it means that our key is lying somewhere in the between of this list because if previous would have point to null then we would have sure that head is pointing to the first node of the list but as previous is pointing to this node so what we do is we simply assign head next value to previous next so why we do that because we need to first break this link so when this link will be broken then this node will have no reference so this can be garbage collected but there is one problem head dot next will refer to other nodes as well so those nodes will also be removed if we break this link directly so what we do is head dot next will point to the nodes after that so we simply assign head dot next value to previous next so instead of previous next pointing to head it will now point to heads next so this node can be freed up so it would look something like this this link will go away and as head dot next is pointing to null so it will point to null so now this hash node can be removed easily we will return the value tom and then we will simply remove it now friend let's say we are given with these two nodes and we want to remove 31 so what we do is we do 31 divided by 10 which gives remainder 1 so bucket index is 1 we simply access the hash node at index 1 we give it a value as head because this is the first node of the list we will assign previous a value of null and then we compare 31 which is head dot key with our key so that we can search for that particular key which we want to remove so here you can see head dot key is equal to the key which we want to remove it means we want to remove this key so first we simply decrease the size so it will become 1 because we are removing this key now and after that we need to break this link so that this node can be freed up but if we remove this link directly then all the nodes in this list will be removed we only want to remove this node and keep all the nodes after that intact so what we do is how can we access all the nodes after that is we simply do head dot next and if we do head dot next we reach to this node so here we break this link and we assign a value of head dot next to it so now this link will go away and it will point to this node and the nodes after that so here we are simply assigning head dot next value to buckets array at index 1 so it would look something like this this link will go away and it will point to this node and once the method will end this node can be safely removed and we can simply pass the value associated with this key so after it gets removed it would look something like this so here there could have been multiple nodes after that so we have kept that list intact and we have removed the node from the middle so this is also one of the use case now let's suppose if we are given with this hash table with two nodes and we want to remove a key which is not there in this hash table so key is 88 if we divide 88 by 10 we get bucket index is 8 we access the hash node at index 8 so here it is pointing to null which means that key is not present in this hash table so we simply return null So friend, these are the cases which are involved when we actually remove a key from our hash table. 
I hope you find this information useful. And in case if you find this information useful, then please like this video. And if you are new to my channel, then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update. Thanks. Have a nice day. Hello everyone. So in our previous video, we saw that how we can remove a key from hash table via an animation. So in this video, we will see the algorithm via an animation, and we will see that how it works step by step. So before we start, in case if you are new to my channel, then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update. So here you can see that this is the algorithm to remove a key from the hash table. So let's see the demonstration of it step by step. We will take the same use cases which we discussed in our previous video. So when we will call table dot remove and pass the key as one zero five, the remove method will be called with the key one zero five. Now at the first step, what we do is we search for that key, and how we can search for that key is first we get the bucket corresponding to this key. So we call our hash function get bucket index. We pass in the key, and it returns us back an index by dividing key by buckets dot length or number of buckets, and return us back the remainder because it has this modulus operator. So here, if we divide one zero five by ten, we get remainder as five. So this method will return us the bucket index as five. Now what we do is, we have got the bucket index. And we know that key one zero five will lie at this bucket index, so we simply access the hash node at this index, which is five here. So the first hash node is nothing but our head, and there could be n number of hash nodes. So head will point to the first hash node. Now, in order to keep the track of the previous hash node, we simply assign it with the null. And why we keep the track of the previous hash node, we will see later. So we are providing this while loop, which is pretty much same what we saw in our previous videos, that we are trying to search the key first. So currently head is not pointing to null, so this condition comes out to be true. We check whether head dot key, which is one zero five, is it equal to the key which we want to remove? So here you can see this if condition comes out to be true. So what we do is, as soon as we find the key which we want to remove, we simply break from this while loop because we have found our key and now it's time to remove that key. So when we break from this while loop, it will come here, and here we encounter one use case that head could point to null, so which we will see later. So currently head is pointing to a hash node which is not null, so this condition comes out to be false. So now here you can see, as we want to remove this node, we will first decrease the size by one. So size will become two. And after that, we encounter a if else block, which is very much important because here if previous is not equal to null, so this is the if condition. If previous is equal to null, it means we are trying to remove the first node of the list. Let's say if we take this example, and if head is pointing to this. So previous will point to null. So it means we are trying to remove the first node of this list. And if previous is not equal to null, it means the key which we have found is somewhere in the between of this list. So that use case we'll see later. So currently you can see previous is pointing to null. So our if condition comes out to be false, and the else part will be executed. And here we want to remove this node from the list. So what we do is, and we know that this is the first node, which is being referred by bucket array at bucket index. So in order to free this node, we need to remove this link. We will assign head dot next value to bucket array at bucket index. So the hash node referred by bucket index, which is this, instead of pointing to this node, it will simply point to head dot next, because we want to remove this node, and this node can also have other nodes. So we can't directly break this link. We simply assign head dot next value to 
this index. So currently for this use case, you can see head dot next is pointing to null. So here we simply break this link and we assign head dot next which is null. So it will point to null. And here you can see after this method gets end. First we return the value associated with it, which is John. And once this method will end, this node will be garbage collected. So it would look something like this. Now let's suppose if you want to remove a key 21. So first we'll find its corresponding bucket. So 21 divided by 10 will give remainder as 1. So the bucket index is 1. So we simply access the hash node at bucket index 1, which is this node. And there could be a list, so we assign head to this node. Because this is the first node of the list. We create a hash node previous and at the start we assign a null value to it. And now as we want to remove the key 21, so we search in this list using this while loop. So currently head is not equal to null. If head dot key equals the key which we want to remove, then this if condition will come out to be true. So here head dot key is 31. It's not equal to 21. So the condition in if block comes out to be false. So this is the key. We are comparing it with 21. And as this condition is false, we will reach here. So usually we search for the key in complete list. So for this node, the key didn't match. So before going to its next node, by assigning head dot next to head, what we do is we simply keep the track of this node. Because let's say if we find this key here, then we can use the previous node and we can simply remove this link here so that this node can be freed up. So before moving head to its next node, we assign the value of head to previous. So it would look something like this. And now we simply move head to its next position by assigning head dot next to head. So head dot next is pointing to this node. So via this link, head will now point to this node. Head is not equal to null. If head dot key equals the key which we want to remove. So head dot key is 21 and 21 is equal to 21. So this condition comes out to be true. And here we know that we have found our key which we want to remove. So we simply break from this while loop. We first simply check whether head is equal to null or not. If head is equal to null, then we simply return null. So currently head is not equal to null. It means we need to remove this key. So we first decrease the size by one. Size becomes one. And now here you can see previous is not equal to null. Previous is pointing to this node. Therefore, this condition comes out to be true. So why we provide this check is if previous is equal to null, it means we are trying to remove the first node of the list. And if previous is not equal to null, it means the key which we have found is somewhere in the middle of the list because previous is providing that information to us. So in the if part, what we do is we need to remove this link and we can't directly remove this link because head dot next may point to the other nodes. So what we do is we simply assign head dot next value to previous next. So it would look something like this that now previous dot next is pointing to null. And why we did that because let's suppose if there are n number of nodes after that and we want to only remove this key, we don't want to touch other nodes. So to whatever value head dot next is pointing previous dot next should point to that node. But here it is null, so previous dot next is pointing to null. We will return the value tom and this node will be removed from the hash table. Now friend, let's suppose if you want to remove a key as 31. So we calculate the bucket index 31 divided by 10 will give remainder as 1. So 1 will get written from our hash function. So bucket index becomes 1. 
we access the hash node at this bucket index and to whichever node it is referring that will assign to head so head will point to this node at the start we do previous equals null and then we search for our key so we check whether head is equal to null or not so head is not equal to null so the while loop will start then we provide a if condition to search for that key so if head dot key equals the key which we want to remove head dot key is 31 and the key which you want to remove is also 31 so this condition comes out to be true it means we have found our key we break and then we check whether head is equal to null or not so head is not equal to null it is pointing to a key which we want to remove and before removing the key we decrease the size by 1 so size becomes 1 and now here you can see previous is pointing to null so the else part will be executed and in the else part you can see that why we are doing head dot next in use case one head dot next was pointing to null but here you can see there is possibility that head dot next is pointing to other nodes so we can't directly break this link so to buckets array at bucket index we assign the value head dot next so now this link will be removed and as we are assigning head dot next to it this will point to this node because head dot next is this node so it would look something like this that we are assigning head dot next value which is this node to buckets array at bucket index so now here you can see this node can be freed up easily by returning the value sana and if we rearrange it it would look something like this so here we removed a node and we saw the importance of doing head dot next because we can't directly break the link this link we need to assign it head dot next so that it should refer to the remaining nodes of the key which we want to remove so friends one last use case is this use case where we want to remove a key which is not there in this hash table so we'll calculate bucket index 88 divided by 10 will give remainder as 8 so bucket index is 8 we access the hash node at this index so here it is pointing to null which means head will point to null we create previous and we assign a null value to it here head is pointing to null so it means this condition comes out to be false and here as head is equal to null it means that size remains the same and key is not present so we simply return null so in this video we saw that how we can remove a key from a hash table and we saw the demonstration of the algorithm step by step I hope you have find this information useful and in case if you have find this information useful then please like this video. If you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update. Thanks have a nice day. Hello everyone. So in our previous video we saw that how we can remove a key from a hash table and we saw the working of the code through an animation now in this video we will actually code the remove method which takes in a key and return us back the value associated with the key which we are trying to remove so here in our previous videos we saw how we can put key value pair how we can get a value corresponding to a key so now we will see that how we can remove the key so friend at the start I will simply copy this part so here if you are passing key as null then we are simply throwing an exception saying key is null so this is the illegal argument exception which states that key is null so this is the simple edge case 
and now in order to remove a key what we do is we pass this key to our hash function and this hash function will return us a index where we can search for this key and once we find that key we simply remove it so it will return us back the bucket index after getting the bucket index we access the hash node at that bucket index and as that index is pointing to a hash node which is the starting point of the list corresponding to this bucket index we give a name to it as head so friends here you can see that these two steps are being used in get method also and in put method also now what we do is in order to remove a key let's add this index if i simply copy this part and here at this index let's say we have this list of hash nodes something like key s21 value as tom now let's say it has three nodes something like this where key 31 has value harry and key 41 has value let's say sana now head is pointing to this node because this is the first hash node of the list now our task is to remove this key so let's say if we want to remove the key as 31 and head is pointing to this so first we will search our key by traversing head to each and every node and if we find the key let's say if we find the key 31 so somehow we need to access this hash node because this link needs to be removed in order to free this node and if we free this node directly then all the nodes after this node will also be removed so what we need to do is as head as traverse to this node so first we simply keep the track of its previous nodes so wherever head will go we will keep a reference to its previous node which is very important while removing a key from the hash table so if head is here and key matches so previous will be here so to previous next we have to break this link so to previous next we need to assign head next because we need to keep this nodes intact we will assign head dot next value to previous next head dot next is this node and the nodes after that it will be assigned to previous next so this link will go away from this node to this node and then we can simply remove this hash node so for that what we do is at the start we create a previous hash node we assign it a value as null because as head is pointing to this node at start we are doing previous as null so now what we do is we search for the key so for that we provide the while loop and here we will use the same while loop which we did in the get so here we are providing the condition as head should not be equal to null and if head is equal to null it means we have traversed this complete list and we didn't find our key and if head is not equal to null what we do is we compare head dot key with the key which we want to remove and after we find our key what we do is we simply break from this while loop because after this while loop head will point to the key which we want to remove let's say here 31 so head will point to this key because this condition matches so let's say if we take this example and if we want to remove a key as 31 so in this while loop head will first check it with 21 this condition comes out to be false then we go to its next node head will come here 
it is not equal to null then we'll compare head dot key which is 31 with the key which we have passed to this method so as soon as we find our key head is pointing to this node and here what we do is before moving the head to its next position what we do is how can we keep the track of this previous node is we first assign head to previous so previous and head will point to this node and then we simply traverse head to its next node so previous is a step behind the head and why we are keeping previous just behind the head is because let's say we have searched for the key which we want to remove so we break from this while loop and as soon as we break from this while loop previous is here and head is here so after this while loop what we do is we first check that if head is equal to null or not so if head is equal to null it means we didn't find any key in this list because this while loop would have terminated when head would have pointed to null which is the last node next so if head would have reached here it means we haven't found our key so we are simply returning the null value and if head is not equal to null then the first thing we do is we decrement the size by 1 because now we are about to remove the key so here now two condition arises one is at the start previous is pointing to null and head is pointing to let's say 21 and what if if you want to remove 21 only so in that case we are simply removing the first node of this list and how we can come to know that is the first node only is via the previous because if previous is null and after this if block we can come to know that head is not equal to null so it means head must be pointing to this node only and which means we have to remove this key so here we provide the if condition and we check that previous is equal to null or not so if previous is equal to null and if our code has reached here it means head is also not equal to null which signifies this head is pointing to the first node so in the else part what we do is we have to remove the first node and it is being referred by this the hash node at bucket index is the first node so here what we do is we simply reassign this value to something like we do head dot next so it means that our buckets array at this bucket index was pointing to a hash node to which our head was also pointing and now we need to remove this node so head is pointing to this node if we assign head dot next to this then this node will be removed easily and now our buckets array at bucket index will point to this node because 21 would be removed so this is the small change which we do if previous is pointing to null and if previous is not pointing to null now let's say if we want to remove 31 so head will point to this and previous will point to this so now instead of doing this stuff what we do is we do previous dot next and we assign head dot next to it so here you can see head dot next remains the same as previous is not equal to null it means we can't use this stuff because this is only used in case if we want to remove the first node of the list but if we want to remove let's say a node in the middle then previous will help us in removing that so head was pointing to this and we want to remove this and previous was pointing to this so to previous next we assigned head next this value so now this hash node next will point to this hash node and this hash node can be removed easily so this step does that so after this reassignment head is still pointing to this so at the end what we do is we simply return head dot value and once this method will get terminated 
This head is our local variable, so it will be garbage collected. So friends, what we did in the remove method, we took the key, we evaluated the bucket index where this key might lie. The starting hash node we denoted it with head. We created previous, and at the start we provided a null value to it. And now in the while loop, we try to compare each and every key with the key which we want to remove. Because if we don't compare, then we will not able to get which node we want to delete. So as soon as we found the key which we want to delete, we break from this while loop and we perform the assignments here. But let's suppose if the key is not found for the first iteration, then what we do is we have to move head to its next node. But if we move head to its next node, we can't delete this node. We need to keep the track of its previous node as well. So before moving head to its next node, we are assigning the value of head to previous, and then we are moving head to its next node, so that when we will find any key in the middle, we have reference to a node before that, so that we can reassign its next pointer. Here you can see we are reassigning it. So if the key which we want to remove is at first node. Then we simply assign head dot next value to buckets array at this bucket index, and if it is somewhere in the middle or end, then we have this previous reference. We simply assign head dot next to previous next, and finally we return head dot value. And once we return head dot value, this method gets terminated, and the node gets freed up. So now let's test it's working in the main method. So here you can see. Let's suppose we have this. Three keys, one zero five twenty one thirty one. And if I run the code now, you will see size will come as three because there are three hash nodes or key value pair. Now what we do is, let's say we remove twenty one, and we print its value on the console. So here you can see it printed Harry because Harry was associated with key twenty one. Now let's say if we want to remove thirty one. So now if I run the code, you can see it printed Dinesh. And if I print the size of it. So here we have removed two nodes. So it should print one. So it has printed one. So here you can see only one zero five remains in the hash table because we have removed twenty one and thirty one. So here, if I simply copy this part, so here before removing these two values. We add hash table something like this. This is three, Dinesh, twenty one, Harry, and let's say if I remove this for time being. So this was our hash table at index one because we are removing twenty one and thirty one. So if we evaluate the Bucket index twenty one divided by ten will give remainder as one. So this is for the index one. We first added twenty one using put, and then we added thirty one. So thirty one came before twenty one because we are inserting the hash note at the beginning of the list. So this was the situation. So when we removed twenty one, head started with this note, then it reached here, and previous reached here. So twenty one matched with our key, and at the end, what we did? Previous next was assigned with heads next, which is null, and then we removed thirty one. So this node was removed, and when we printed the size, it printed one. Only this key value pair exists, and we removed these two key value pairs. So friends, I hope you have find this information useful. 
and in case if you have find this information useful then please like this video if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in this video we are going to discuss a problem contains duplicate so friends before we start in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update so here in this problem we are given an integer array and our task is to return true if any value appears at least twice or return false if every element is distinct so let's understand the problem with an example now let's suppose we are given with this integer array having elements as 1 2 3 1 1. now our task is to return true if any value appears at least twice so here you can see that one appears at two places therefore we return true and return false if every element is distinct so here you can see in the second example the array is 1 2 3 4 so all the elements are distinct therefore we have to return false so here our task is to check whether the array contains duplicates or not now let's move ahead and see how we can solve this problem via various techniques so let's suppose we are given with this array 7 3 1 4 1 1 and we know that one appears at least twice therefore we know that it contains duplicates so the first way to solve this problem is a very brute force approach where we take each element and compare it with the rest of the elements in the array and we figure out whether the element is duplicate or not so when we try to solve this problem we take a pointer i and let's say the value is 7 we take another pointer j and we compare the values at i and jth index so at the start 7 is compared with 3 they are not equal so j moves to the second index 7 is not equal to 1 so j moves to third index 7 is not equal to 4 so j moves to the fourth index 7 is not equal to 1 so therefore we figure out that 7 is unique among these elements so after that i moves to 3 and j points to index after i because 7 is already being compared with 3 in the previous iteration so 3 is compared with 1 they are not equal so j moves to third index 3 is compared with 4 they are not equal so j moves to the fourth index 3 is not equal to 1 so therefore we come to know that 3 is also unique in this array so we increment i now i comes to the second index so j starts from the third index 1 is compared with 4 so they are not equal so j moves to the fourth index now here 1 is equal to 1 so therefore we come to know that there are duplicates in this array and one is appearing at least twice so therefore we return directly true from the method so if we see via this approach we need two for loops one for i and one for j so using these two for loops we can figure out whether the array contains duplicates or not so the time complexity of this method is o of n square because this approach contains nested loops so this is not very efficient solution now can we reduce the time complexity from o of n square to less than that so one thing we can do is we can actually sort this array so when we sort this array in ascending order the elements will rearrange something like this 1 1 3 4 and 7 and now after sorting we can use one for loop to check whether the neighboring elements are equal or not so if they are equal we just return true and after the loop ends if we didn't find any duplicates then we can return false so via this approach when we are sorting the array the time complexity comes out to be n log n 
so this is a better approach and time complexity now is there any other way where we can reduce this time complexity so we'll look into that so in order to reduce the time complexity what we can do is we can use an additional data structure so let's say if we are using a hash set the property of hash set is it only contains unique elements now what we can do is we can iterate over this array we can take one one element and we check whether the hash set contains that element or not if it doesn't contain then we simply add it to the hash set and if hash set contains that value then we are sure that it contains duplicates so for example the first value is 7 we check whether hash set contains 7 or not so it doesn't contain so we put 7 into the hash set then we check for 3 whether the hash set contains 3 or not so it doesn't contain so we put 3 into the hash set then we take 1 So one is not in the hash set, so we put one into the hash set. Then we take four. Four is not in the hash set, so we put four into the hash set. At last, we get one. So when we check whether one is there in the hash set or not, we come to know that one is already there. So therefore, we directly return true. That we have found a duplicate. Now let's say instead of one, there would have been six. so we would have checked whether 6 is there in the hash set or not so it was not there so we put 6 into the hash set and after that there are no elements in this array to be traversed so at the end we would directly return false that there are no duplicate elements in this array now by doing this the time complexity is we are iterating this array once so time complexity becomes o of n but space complexity increases because we are using an additional data structure so the space complexity is o of n but this is the much better approach because the time complexity is reduced now let's move ahead and see the animation of this algorithm step by step so this is the code where the method name is contains duplicate we pass in the array So at first, when we call contains duplicate method, we pass in the array. Now let's say if we are given with this array having values as one, three, five, four, one. So at the first step, what we do is we create a hash set. So this is our set. Now as we discussed, we just iterate each and every value once. So we provide a for loop. where i starts from zero index like this and i goes till nums dot length so here the array contains five elements 1 2 3 4 so nums dot length is 5 so it goes from zero index to fourth index so currently zero is less than 5 so this for loop executes now has set has a method contains when we call this method it actually returns true or false if the element is present in the hash set it returns true and if the element is not present it returns false so nums of i is nothing but the value at zeroth index so we check whether set contains one or not so here you can see set doesn't contain one so set dot contains will return false because this element is not present so we add this element into the set so one is added into the set now we increment i so i becomes 1 one. one is less than 5 we check whether value 3 is present in the set or not so set dot contains return false because 3 is not present so we simply add 3 into the set we increment i so i becomes 2 and 2 is less than 5 so this for loop will execute now nums of i is nothing but value present at second index which is 5 so we check whether set contains 5 or not so set doesn't have 5 so it returns false so we simply add 5 into the set like this we increment i i becomes 3 3 is less than 5 so this for loop will execute 
we check whether value at third index which is 4 present in the set or not so this actually returns false because 4 is not present into this set so we simply add 4 into the set will increment i i becomes 4 4 is less than 5 so this for loop executes now here value at ith index is 1 and when we check whether 1 is present in the set or not so 1 is already present in the set so set dot contains return true so it means we have found a duplicate in this array because 1 we inserted into the set at the beginning and again we found a 1 so set dot contains return true because 1 is already present in the set so it means that our array contains a duplicate so this if block is executed so here we directly return true which states that our array contains the duplicate now let's say if our array doesn't contains the duplicates so instead of 1 we put a 6 so after placing 1 3 5 4 into the set the last element would have been 6 and if we do set dot contains 6 so it returns false and if block doesn't get executed so we simply add 6 into the set now when we increment i i becomes 5 and 5 is not less than 5 so therefore this for loop will terminate so at the end we directly return false stating that our array doesn't contains duplicate it contains unique elements so friends in this video we discussed the problem of contains duplicate i hope you must have liked this video thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in this video we are going to discuss about a very important topic which is intervals so in this video we are going to see a basic introduction to intervals and we will also see what are overlapping intervals now this is a very important topic for the coding interview there are questions asked on the concept of overlapping intervals so let's move ahead and see what are intervals and what are overlapping intervals so friends before we start in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update so first we will see a basic introduction to an interval so usually an interval is actually a range which is represented by two numbers something like 5 comma 8 6 comma 10 so an interval is a range where two numbers are involved now that two numbers are termed as start and end so here 5 will be our start and 8 will be our end so these two numbers are basically start and end of the interval which actually represent a range now usually when we talk about interval they are correlated with time now when it is related with time this start and end can be any unit of time it can be milliseconds seconds minutes so here let's see the time interval of few tasks let's say task a has a time interval of 1 comma 3 b has time interval of 4 comma 5 c has time interval of 8 comma 10 d has time interval of 9 comma 11 so if we take a time axis like this now here it could be seconds milliseconds nanoseconds it can be anything so let's say if we want to plot this task on this time axis and we take it as seconds so it suggests that task a has start time of 1 and it has end time of 3 so if we plot task a on this time axis it would look something like this that a task starts from 1 and ends at 3 so it means if we take it in the form of seconds task a takes 2 seconds to complete from 1 to 3 if we plot b it starts with 4 and ends on 5 so it takes 1 second if we plot c so the start is 8 and end is 10 so it takes 2 seconds to complete and if we plot d so it starts at 9 and ends at 11 so it also takes 2 seconds so usually this time intervals represent a range let's say for a task or for a process and mostly the coding interview problems 
are given with these intervals so here we saw that an interval has two numbers start and end now let's see how we can represent this interval in form of a code so the interval representation looks something like this that there is a class interval now this is a custom class which we will create which has two properties start and end so this start will represent the starting point of the interval and end will represent the ending point of the interval so any interval takes only two numbers start and end and if we want to create an interval we have provided this constructor which takes in a start and end and initialize a particular interval with these numbers so this is how we actually represent an interval class so now let's move ahead and see the concept of overlapping intervals so what are overlapping intervals so let's say if we have interval something like 1 comma 5 and another interval as 2 comma 6 so if we plot these intervals it looks something like this this is 1 this is 5 and let's say 2 is here and let's say this is 6 so here if you see this is the first interval with 1 comma 5 and this is the second interval with 2 comma 6 so now if you closely look they are actually overlapping in this region from interval 2 to 5 so this actually suggests that these two intervals are actually overlapping with each other in this region 2 comma 5 so for an overlapping intervals we actually require two intervals at minimum let's say if we denote it by a and b so there will be some relationship between these two intervals so the first relationship would be that a and b do not overlap so it means a starts and ends here and b starts and ends here so here if we take an example let's say 1 comma 3 and 4 comma 5 so this is one interval and this is another interval but they don't overlap If we have interval something like one comma three and three comma four, then that will overlap because the end time of first interval is equal to start time of another interval. But here there is a gap between these two, so they don't overlap. The another thing would be A and B overlap, but B ends after A, so it would look something like this: that A starts here and ends here, and B starts here and ends here. so here b is ending after a and this is our overlapping interval so if we take an example let's say 1 comma 4 and 3 comma 6 so here you can see these two intervals actually represent this condition that a interval starts from 1 and ends at 4 and b starts at 3 so it means this is 1 this is 4 this is 3 and this is 6 here b is ending after a so we can visualize these two intervals like this the third would be a completely overlaps b so it would look something like this that a is actually overlapping b completely so if we take an example it could be like 1 comma 6 for a and b could be 2 comma 4 so here 1 6 2 and 4 so it says that a is completely overlapping b so this could be one such case so the fourth case is a and b overlap a ends after b so this is pretty much same as this but here it looks something like this here b was ending after a but here a ends after b so this two are pretty much same only the names of the intervals have changed b completely overlaps a so this is pretty much same as a completely overlaps b so it would look something like this here a was completely overlapping b and now here b is completely overlapping a so here we just need to change the order of a and b so if this was a and this was b so here a would be 2 comma 4 and b would be 1 comma 6 rest everything remains the same and the sixth case is b and a do not overlap so this is pretty much same as a and b do not overlap so it looks something like this So friends these are the six cases where we can demonstrate the overlapping intervals 
सो फॉर अ सिचुएशन वेयर दिस ओवरलैपिंग इंटरवल्स कम वी एटलीस्ट नीड मिनिमम ऑफ टू इंटरवल्स एंड देयर कुड बी मेनी इंटरवल्स लाइक ए बी सी डी विच कैन ओवरलैप विथ ईच अदर बट वी एक्चुअली रिक्वायर मिनिमम ऑफ टू सो फ्रेंड इन दिस वीडियो वी कवर्ड वॉट आर इंटरवल्स एंड वॉट आर ओवरलैपिंग इंटरवल्स इन अवर फ्यूचर वीडियोज वी विल सी फ्यू प्रॉब्लम रिलेटेड टू ओवरलैपिंग इंटरवल्स I hope you must have liked this video. In case if you are new to my channel, then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update. Thanks have a nice day. Hello everyone. So in our previous video, we discussed about what are intervals and what are overlapping intervals. So now in this video, we will look into a problem of merge intervals. So friends, before we start, in case if you are new to my channel, then please subscribe to my channel. and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update so if you look at the problem you are given with a list of intervals you need to merge all the overlapping intervals and return a list of non overlapping intervals so let's see it via an example let's say we are given with a list of intervals like 2,6 1,3 8,10 8, and this intervals can be in any random order so we need to merge only those intervals which are overlapping to each other and at the end we have to return a list of all the non overlapping intervals so the output would be 1,6 and 8,10 now how this output came we'll see in a diagram so let's say we have this time axis and we have this intervals 2,6 1,3 and 8,10 we will plot these intervals on this time axis so first we will take 2,6 so the start is at 2 and end is at 6 so this interval takes 4 unit of time Now let's have time axis is in seconds. So this will take four seconds. If we plot one comma three, it would look something like this. One is the start and three is the end. And after that we will plot eight comma ten. So it looks like this. So this is two seconds interval, and this is also two seconds interval. So here if you see this one comma three and two comma six are overlapping to each other. so this is the area where they are overlapping so it means we have to merge all the overlapping intervals so if we merge these two intervals together we will get a bigger interval whose start will be 1 and end will be 6 so here as these two are overlapping intervals when we will merge these two you can simply take this first interval and put it on the top of the second interval and that will be our merged interval so it looks like this the start will remain the same because this interval came first and the end will actually depend that which interval has the maximum capture duration so here in this case the first interval is completed at third second and the second interval is completing at the sixth second so we will take the max of 3 and 6 and it merges to 1,6 so this is the merged interval because these two intervals are overlapping to each other but here if you see 8 comma 10 as we have only three inputs 8 comma 10 is not overlapping with any of these intervals and we have to return a list of non overlapping intervals so 8 comma 10 will remain as it is like this so therefore our answer is 1 comma 6 and 8 comma 10 if this 8 comma 10 would have been 6 comma 10 or 5 comma 10 then our answer would have been one complete merged interval of 1 comma 10 so let's move ahead and see how we can solve such problems so for the overlapping interval in our previous video we saw the different use cases that when two intervals are overlapped with each other what happens so one such condition is a and b do not overlap so it looks something like this that there is a gap between these two intervals so we can't merge them now if a and b overlap but b ends after a so it would look something like this now here one thing we are assuming is a will always come before b so this diagram will make sense that b ends after a and if a and b overlap it would look something like this a completely overlaps b so it would look something like this but still a is coming before b b completely overlaps a in a case that both have same start time so b is completely overlapping a but a should come either before b or it can start at the same time so therefore we are taking this assumption and we will come to know later why it's important 
So this is one such case where B will completely overlap A, but as A should either start at the same time as B or before B, this would be one such use case. Now we will see all these cases and why they are important. So with the first case when A and B overlaps and B ends after A, so this is the case. So when we will merge these two intervals A and B and let's say result we denoted by a C. Now as we are merging these two intervals A and B, here you can see the range of C which is start and end would be A start and B end. So here you can think of any two intervals, but one thing is sure both of the intervals either will start at the same time or one of the interval would be coming first. So whichever interval is coming first, its start will become C start and the value of C end will depend on the maximum expansion of any of this interval. So here you can see as B ends after A, B's end value will become C's end and after merge it will look something like this. So let's say if A starts from 1 and ends at 3 and B starts from 2 and ends at 5. So here you can see this is the overlapping part. So when we will merge these two intervals, let's say we put A on the top of B. So it will become something like it starts from 1 like this and ends at 5. So this is the merging. We will see another use case. Let's say A completely overlaps B. So in this case, if we merge these two intervals, let's say we put A on top of B. So it would look something like this. That C start becomes A start because this is the start of the interval. And as A completely overlaps B, C's end will become A's end like this. So this is one such use case. If we look at the third use case where A start is actually equal to B start and B ends after A. So in this case if we merge both these intervals it would look something like this that if we put A on top of B the C start will be either A dot start or B dot start it will be same but the end will be B's end because this is the start and this would be the maximum value till both the interval goes. So in all these three use cases. One thing to keep in mind is we are assuming A will either start before B or at the same time of B. So C start will be equal to A start. This is sure. And C end there will be a condition that we will take max of A and B end. And whichever is the maximum value that will be assigned to C's end. So in this case here you can see A end is 3 and B end is 5. So C end becomes 5. Here you can see A completely overlaps B. So A end is greater than B's end. So therefore C end becomes A end. And similarly here as B is completely overlapping A. So B end is having a greater value than A ends. So whichever is the maximum that gets assigned to C end and that will be our merged interval. Now one thing we discussed that A should start before B or at the same time. But if we look into the problem, we are given the intervals in random order. Let's say 10, 19, 3, 4, 1, 2 and let's say 2, 3. Now we have to merge all overlapping intervals. So one thing we need to keep in mind is we have to first sort all these intervals based on their start time. Once we get the start time, this condition will come into picture that one of the interval is starting before the other. And once we sort it based on the start time, all the intervals start time will be in ascending order. So we can directly compare one with the other and see if they are overlapping with each other or not. So in order to solve this problem, the first thing we need to do is we need to sort the intervals based on the start time. So this condition will come into picture that A dot start will be less than or equal to B dot start. So here A dot start in this case is less than B dot start. In this case also it is less than B dot start. But in this case A dot start is equal to B dot start. So this condition is important. So when we will sort these intervals, the merging becomes easier. Here if you see, let's say if you want to merge these two elements, we know that A dot start is before or equal to B dot start. So C dot start will directly becomes A dot start because A is coming before B. But C dot end which we discussed here, 
its value will be depend on whichever interval is going to greater time span so it would be max of a dot end and b dot end so here in this case a dot end was smaller than b dot end so c became b dot end in this case if we merge these two elements then b dot end was lesser than a dot end so when we merge it become a dot end and similarly here b dot end is greater than a dot end so therefore on merging c end becomes b dot end because we have to take the maximum of a dot end and b dot end so these two conditions are very important and once we do the merging of let's say two intervals we can keep proceeding ahead with all the overlapping intervals and we can check which are overlapping intervals and we can merge them so friend let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step so we have this merge method which actually merge the overlapping intervals and we are given with a list of interval and our task is to merge the overlapping intervals and return a list of all non overlapping intervals because once we merge all the overlapping intervals they all become non overlapping so first we will call the merge method we pass in the list of intervals so it would look something like this that this is the list of interval 7,9 2,6 1,3 and they are in random order so the first thing we have to check that whether interval size whether it is less than 2 or not so if it is less than 2 it means list has either zero elements or one element it means there is only one interval or zero interval so we don't have to merge anything we have to simply return the same list back so this is one h case so currently interval dot size is 3 therefore it is not less than 2 now in order to compare whether all these intervals are overlapping to each other what we need to do is we have to sort all these intervals based on their start time so that we can come to know that whether there is any overlap or not so the list has a sort method which takes in a comparator and comparator has a comparing int method which actually returns a comparator now in this method this is a static method so in this method we are simply telling to take each interval and sort it based on the start time so this comparing int method will take this intervals list will sort it based on the start time so the intervals will become something like this 1,3 2,6 7,9 so start time so 1 is less than 2 2 is less than 7 so it has sorted based on the start time moving ahead now as we need to return a list of all non overlapping intervals we will create a result list like this so currently it's empty now as we have sorted the intervals based on the start time we will compare the adjacent intervals so that we can check whether they are overlapping or not so in order to compare all these intervals the first thing we do is we simply take the first interval as it is so this is the time axis and the first interval is 1,3 so if we plot it here it looks something like this now our task is to compare this 1,3 with 2,6 and check whether anything is overlapping or not so for that we will create two variable start and end we will see its significance later so to the start variable we will assign first dot start because we are starting with this interval so start becomes 1 because first dot start is 1 end to end variable we will assign first dot end so first dot end is 3 so we are simply taking this two intervals start and end as 1,3 and now as we have to compare it with other intervals we will take all these intervals in a for loop and we will start with 1 because 0 is already taken so this is 0 this is 1 and this is second index so we will start i from 1 so it would look something like this that we are now picking up 2,6 and i is less than intervals dot size 1 is less than 3 so this condition comes out to be true now you can think start and end represents first and in the for loop currently we are on 2,6 so this becomes our current interval and this can be treated as previous intervals so from this list we will get that interval by calling intervals dot get will pass the value as 1 so we will get 2,6 so this will be assigned to the current like this and if we plot it here you can see 2,6 now our task is to simply check whether 2,6 is actually overlapping with any of the 
previous intervals or not so we will check whether current dot start is less than equal to the end so we are not doing first dot end because there could be many intervals before this current interval and start and end will represent just the previous interval which are being merged or non overlapping we will see its importance later so we are simply comparing current dot start whether it is less than equal to end so here you can see value of end is 3 current dot start is 2 so this is the start for current it is less than end so it means that there are overlapping intervals and if you see why this example 1 comma 3 is actually overlapping with 2 comma 6 so this condition comes out to be true which means we have to merge these two intervals now so once you merge these two intervals let's say the result interval is c so we also saw that c dot start was equal to a dot start which always remains a dot start because a is either starting before b or at the same time as b so here our start will remain one only it won't get changed but c dot end will become the max of a dot end and b dot end so here this is the condition for that that we are simply taking the maximum value of current dot end which is the current interval and value of end which is the value of its previous intervals which is 3 so if we do 3 comma 6 max we get 6 so here you can see our start will remain the same but end will change to 6 now because we are merging this two overlapping intervals so end will become 6 moving ahead so here you can see one reason of picking start and end in a different variable is as we have merged these two intervals start became 1 and end became 6 and there could be a possibility that once we move ahead in the array there could be another intervals like this so here in this case all these interval will get merged together so therefore only the end will get expand till the intervals are overlapping and start will remain the same so therefore we have created this two variables which are doing those things these two variables are keeping the state of the previous intervals which are merged or which are yet to merge so now will increment i i will become 2 2 is less than 3 so this condition comes out to be true now this is our current interval 7 comma 9 so when we will do intervals dot get 2 we will get 7 comma 9 as our current interval like this so now our task is to merge current with previous already merged intervals so we have to check whether 7 comma 9 is overlapping with any of the previous intervals or not so that value is actually hold by start and end so here if we see current dot start is this value and current dot end is this value so here you can see current dot start is 7 and value of end is 6 so it means current dot start is not less than or equal to end because value of end is 6 and current dot start is 7 so here you can see there is a gap between these two intervals therefore they are not overlapping with each other so this condition comes out to be false so the else part will be executed and in the else part as we have already found one gap in between these two intervals and this interval we can now safely merge these two intervals because when we go ahead these two intervals will not be get affected and we can simply merge them and add it to the result so in the result we are adding new interval start comma end so we are creating a new interval of start and end which is 1 comma 6 and we are adding it to result so it would look something like this that it is merged like this and it is added to result list moving ahead so once we have merged this two intervals and there is a gap between the current and this merged interval now our task will be to focus from 7 comma 9 to rest of the elements ahead we have to forget this merging now because we have already merged 
these two intervals and there are no more intervals which can get merged to these two intervals so therefore we have to forget this part now and as you have started with 1 comma 3 at the start because that was the first interval now we have to start from 7 comma 9 thinking it is the first interval so therefore now start will become current start we will assign the value of current dot start which is 7 to start and end will become current dot end which will become 9 so this is now our fresh interval and if there are more intervals after 7 comma 9 this 7 comma 9 will be compared with this intervals and these intervals are already merged and they are added to the result list so we don't touch them now moving ahead we will increment i so i will become 3 and i is not less than 3 therefore this condition comes out to be false and for loop will terminate because there are no more elements left to be compared with this 7 comma 9 so this for loop will terminate and one thing to notice as soon as this for loop will terminate whatever the value start and end will hold that will hold an actual interval which also needs to be added to the result so here you can see 7 comma 9 was the single most interval left and there are no more intervals left which can be merged with 7 comma 9 so this 7 comma 9 also needs to be added to the result list so at the end we have to add the 7 comma 9 also to our result list because this is a non overlapping interval so we do result dot add new interval and we pass the value of start and end which is 7 comma 9 so it would look something like this that this is also one such non overlapping interval and our task was to merge all the overlapping intervals and only return the non overlapping intervals so 1 comma 3 and 2 comma 6 got merged to 1 comma 6 and 7 comma 9 didn't get merged with any of the interval so it came out as 7 comma 9 so these two are our answers 1 comma 6 and 7 comma 9 so at the end we will simply return the list of interval which is our result list so friend this was all about the problem how to merge an overlapping intervals and return back all the non overlapping intervals i hope you must have liked this video in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in our previous video we actually saw the problem of merge intervals so in this video we will actually see one more problem insert interval so friends before we start in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update so in this problem we are given with a list of non overlapping intervals which are sorted by their start time we are also given with a interval which we need to insert into the list at a valid position in such a way that if that interval overlaps with any of the intervals which are given in the list then we have to merge all those intervals and return back a list of mutually exclusive intervals which means we need to return back a list of intervals which are different and non overlapping so let's see an example let's say we are given with this list of intervals 1 comma 3 5 comma 7 8 comma 10 now they are non overlapping and sorted by their start time and let's say we are given with this new interval 4 comma 9 our task is to insert this 4 comma 9 into this list in such a way that if this new interval overlaps with any of the interval given in this list we have to merge it with new interval and return back a list of mutually exclusive intervals so the output is 1 comma 3 and 4 comma 10 now how this output came let's see via diagram so this is our time axis and if we plot all these intervals on this time axis it would look something like this 1 comma 3 5 comma 7 8 comma 10 we have to insert 4 comma 9 so it will go from 4 to 9 so here you can see this 4 comma 9 doesn't overlap with 1 comma 3 so 1 comma 3 doesn't get affected by insertion of 4 comma 9 because they are not overlapping so 1 comma 3 will be part of our answer because it's mutually exclusive so this is the first part now here you can see when we will insert 4 comma 9 it will affect 5 comma 7 and also 8 comma 10 
So as 4 comma 9 is completely overlapping 5 comma 7, if we put 5 comma 7 on top of 4 comma 9, that means merging of these two intervals will not get affected because 4 comma 9 is already overlapping completely 5 comma 7. But in this case, 4 comma 9 is ending at 9 and 8 comma 10 is ending at 10. So if we put 8 comma 10 on top of 4 comma 9, the region will get expanded till 10 and as 4 is less than 8, so start will remain the same but end will change because 4 comma 9 is overlapping with 8 comma 10 and when we merge these two intervals, we take the end time of both the intervals and we see which is the maximum. So here 10 is the maximum. So the merge interval will be something like this. It would be 4 comma 10. So the next output is 4 comma 10. Now let's move ahead and see some of the concepts behind this insertion and merging. Let's say we are given with these two intervals. We need to insert A. So A and B are non-overlapping. So it means we can simply insert A without touching B. So we simply insert A. Now let's say A and B are overlapping. So when we will merge these two interval, their area will be from here to here. So this is the start of A and this is the end of B. So if we take this interval as C, then we have to keep a formula as C. Start time will become the minimum of A dot start. and b dot start and the end time will become the max of a dot end and b dot end. So this condition comes into picture if they are overlapping. So here you can see, let's say if we give it a value as 1, 4, 3, 6. So we know that when we will merge these two intervals, the minimum of 3 and 1, so c will become 1 and maximum of 4 and 6 will be 6. We know that the area of this merging will be 1 comma 6 because we have to accommodate both the intervals. So this formula comes handy. Minimum of A dot start and B dot start. A dot start is 1. B dot start is 3. So minimum is 1. And C's end will become max of A dot end and B dot end. A dot end is 4. B dot end is 6. So C's end will become 6. So this interval will expand from 1 to 6. So C becomes A dot start which is this and B dot end which is this. Similarly here A completely overlaps B. So if we apply this formula, the C will become A dot start because A dot start is coming before B dot start and C dot end will become A dot end because it is coming after B dot end. We have to take the max value. And if this is the scenario, then by applying this formula, C start will become B start and C's end will become A's end. So this would be the area of the C interval. And if B completely overlaps A and if we want to insert A, so by applying this formula, C start will become B start and C end will become B's end. So this is how we actually insert and merge the intervals together. Now let's see why an example, if we have these four intervals which are non-overlapping sorted by their start time and we have to insert a new interval 4 comma 9. So if we plot all these intervals on the time axis, it would look something like this. 1 comma 3, 5 comma 7, 8 comma 10, 11 comma 12. Our task is to insert 4 comma 9. So here as we want to insert this new interval from 4 to 9, there will be three region around this 4 comma 9 which will get affected when we will insert this new interval. So one region is just before 4 which is this. Another region is this between 4 to 9 and the third region is just after 9. So here we are taking the region 1 as just before 4 not even equal to 4. And here just after 9, not even equal to 9. Because if any of the interval touches this boundary like this, then they also need to be merged because they are overlapping with each other. And so we need to keep this condition in mind that in region 1, 
we have to simply check for less than intervals in region 3 it should be greater than the end time and in this region if they overlap we have to directly merge them so how we can solve this type of problem is we have to take these three regions first we have to take all the intervals which are part of region 1 and all the intervals which are part of region 1 will satisfy this condition that their end time let's say this part is less than the new interval start time it means they are not overlapping there is a gap so this less than condition is helpful if they become equal then they actually overlap and we have to merge them so first we cater for less than condition and we figure out what are all the intervals which are not touching 4 comma 9 so those intervals we directly take into our result list because they are not touching 4 comma 9 and they are not overlapping 4 comma 9 so let's say if there are n number of intervals before 4 so we have to check each interval's end time and check whether it is less than the new interval start time. If it is less than the new interval start time, we know that they belong to this region. So after placing all the elements of region 1, we come to region 2. Now here what we check is, let's say if we take this example. So here if this interval has to belong in region 2, what we do is, we take its start time and we check whether it is less than or equal to the new interval's end time. Now here we are checking for this condition less than or equal to. So let's say phi is less than 9. So it means this interval belongs to region 2 because we have already excluded the region 1 intervals. And if any of the intervals is left, if this condition satisfies that phi is less than 9 or equal to 9, then this region, even if it expands beyond 4 comma 9, it will still overlap with 4 comma 9. And why we are taking this equal condition is because let's say instead of 8 comma 10 we have 9 comma 12. So 9 is the start time and if 9 is equal to new intervals end time. So still it is overlapping with this interval and we have to merge them. So it still belongs to region 2. So this is the main condition. For region 1 all the intervals end time should be less than new intervals start time so they will completely belong into this area and they will be non overlapping in this region they will overlap so we have to simply check the interval start time and we have to check it is less than equal to the new intervals end time if that is the condition they still overlap and we have to merge them so here if you see 4 comma 9 overlaps 8 comma 10 because 8 is the start time and it lies before 9 because 8 is less than equal to 9 so therefore when we will insert this interval it will affect 5 comma 7 and 8 comma 10 and we know the formula that how to merge the two intervals together which we saw in our previous slide. So after we add all these elements into the list whatever elements are remaining these are out of the boundaries of this 4 comma 9 which is the new interval which we want to insert. So we can directly add them into the list. They won't get affected by the insertion of this new interval. So after merging 5 comma 7 with 4 comma 9 and 8 comma 10 with 4 comma 9 it will become something like this. So our overall answer becomes 1 comma 3, 4 comma 10 and 11 comma 12. So the algorithm is something like this. We have to skip and add intervals that come before the new interval to the result list. So all the intervals of region 1 which are coming just before the new interval we have to simply add onto the list. We have to merge all the intervals that overlap with the new interval. So this interval and this interval, they are overlapping with this new interval. So we have to merge it with this new interval. We have to add that merged interval into the result. So this is the interval which gets merged. We add this into the result. And finally we insert the remaining intervals to the result. So these are the remaining intervals. There can be many intervals like this. We have to just insert them to the result because they are non-overlapping and mutually exclusive. So this region covers this part. This region covers the overlapping part and this region covers all the remaining elements. So all these regions will be captured by a simple while loop in the algorithm. So let's move ahead and see the algorithm. So this is the algorithm. So this while loop is for the region 1 where we simply skip the elements which just come before the new interval. 
this while loop is covering the intervals which are getting overlapped with the new interval and this while loop is just adding the remaining intervals so let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step we'll call the insert method we'll pass the list of intervals and a new interval which we want to insert which is 2 comma 6 so let's say we have list of interval as 0 comma 1 3 comma 5 6 comma 7 9 comma 10 and we need to insert 2 comma 6 so if we plot all these intervals on the time axis it would look something like this 0 comma 1 3 comma 5 6 comma 7 9 comma 10 we need to insert 2 comma 6 which is from time 2 to 6 moving ahead so here we are just simply checking for the base cases that if list is null or empty we simply return the list so currently list is not empty and it is not equal to null so for the new interval you can think that it's a valid interval as we have to return the list of mutually exclusive intervals we will create a result list which is currently empty now as we need to traverse each and every element of this intervals list will create an integer i starting from zero index so first we are picking zero comma one now in this while loop we are checking that whether zero comma one when this two comma six will be inserted into the list of intervals will this get affected or not so first we check whether i is less than intervals dot size we are simply checking whether value of i is less than interval dot size which is 4 because as we are traversing each interval one by one there would be a time that i will completely traverse all the elements so we need to break from the while loop at that moment so currently i is less than intervals dot size the other condition we check is we get this interval so we do intervals dot get i so we get 0 comma 1 and as we discussed we will check its end time with the new interval start time and we check whether this interval's end time is less than new interval start time because if it is less than new interval start time it means they are not overlapping there is a gap between so intervals dot get i is this interval if we do dot end we get one we check whether one is less than new intervals dot start so new interval dot start is two so one is less than two so it means this condition comes out to be true which signifies that 0 comma 1 doesn't overlaps with 2 comma 6 and we can simply skip this element and add it to the result list because this won't get affected by insertion of this new interval so 0 comma becomes part of the result now we will increment i i will come to the index 1 So i is less than intervals dot size which is 4. Intervals dot get i which is 1 which is 3 comma 5. Now we are at 3 comma 5. We check whether this intervals end is less than new intervals dot start. So here this interval dot end which is 5. We check whether it is less than new intervals dot start which is 2. So this condition comes out to be false which suggests that all the intervals which were just coming before new interval have already been part of the result and once we reach on this interval this condition comes out to be false which actually states that 3 comma 5 will either lie in the area of new interval or beyond that but it won't lie here in the region 1 because this condition came out to be false so ideally this while loop will terminate which signifies that all the intervals which were coming before new interval have been added to the result list and we can move ahead with the another while loop i is less than intervals dot size now here we actually check for the second region that whether 3 comma 5 is overlapping with 2 comma 6 or not and we already discussed how we can do that is intervals dot get i which is this interval we simply check its start time which is 3 we check whether it is less than or equal to new intervals dot end so 3 is less than equal to new intervals dot end which is 6 so which is true so it means these two intervals are overlapping which is being proved by this condition 
and so the condition in while loop comes out to be true so first we will get this interval 3 comma 5 we assign it to current like this moving ahead now as we need to merge 2 comma 6 with 3 comma 5 so we know the formula that if we merge two intervals let's say a and b and let's say result interval is c so it becomes c start becomes min of a dot start b dot start and c's end will become max of a dot end and b dot end so here this two are the same conditions and here c is our new interval only we are simply merging 3 comma 5 into the new interval only so new interval start will become the minimum of current start which is this and new interval start which is 2 so minimum of 3 comma 2 will give 2 so new interval dot start will become 2 which is already 2 so this won't get changed now new interval end will become max of a dot end and b dot end so current dot end and new interval dot end we take max of it so current dot end is 5 and new intervals end is 6 so if we take max of it we get 6 which is assigned to new intervals dot end so new intervals end doesn't get changed because it is already 6 so it means we have merged this two intervals and the resulting interval is same 2 comma 6 because this new interval completely overlapped the current interval moving ahead now we are done with this interval also so we'll increment i i reaches to 6 comma 7 so here i is less than intervals dot size now here if we do intervals dot get i we get 6 comma 7 so friends here you can see that why this less than equal to is important this 6 comma 7 is starting where this new interval is ending so it means they are still overlapping because because the interval start which is 6 is actually equal to new intervals end which is also 6 so therefore they are overlapping and we have to merge this two intervals as well we can't exclude 6 comma 7 because it is just overlapping with 2 comma 6 so this condition is important so the overall condition in while loop comes out to be true we do intervals dot get i the interval 6 comma 7 will be assigned to current like this and we have to merge these two intervals now so we'll use the same formula the new interval dot start will become the minimum of current dot start which is 6 and new interval dot start which is 2 so minimum will give 2 so new interval dot start will become 2 which is already at 2 now new intervals end will become the max of current dot end and new interval dot end so max of current dot end which is 7 and new interval dot end which is 6 so it will give 7 so here is the one critical step that new interval dot end will become 7 now because after merging this two element the new interval will expand to 7 like this that we have merged this two intervals moving ahead we will increment i i becomes 9.10 i is still less than intervals dot size because value of i is this is 0 1 2 3 3 is less than 4 intervals dot get i which is 3 will give 9 comma 10 and here you can see this 9 comma 10 is actually belonging to the third region so therefore it start if we compare it with new intervals dot end so 9 is less than equal to new intervals dot end which is 7 so this condition comes out to be false it means 9 comma 10 is the remaining element and it doesn't overlaps with 2 comma 7 so we can directly add this 9 comma 10 and all the elements after that 
via this while loop. So this condition comes out to be false. So here you can see that before adding 9 comma 10 into the result list, we have to also insert 2 comma 7, which is our merged interval into the result, which is actually merging 2 comma 6, which was our new interval with 3 comma 5 and 6 comma 7. So after this three intervals merge, we get 2 comma 7. So this is one important step. We have to add this new interval into the result. So it will become like this. And now using this while loop, we will add the remaining interval into the result. So i is still less than intervals dot size. And as this condition reached this while loop, we are sure that all the remaining elements will be non overlapping with this new interval. So we can directly add 9 comma 10 to the result. We do result dot add and we pass in intervals dot get i which is 9 comma 10. So it looks something like this. And then we increment i. So i goes beyond the boundaries of this interval list. And now this while loop condition comes out to be false because value of i is 4 and interval dot size is also 4. 4 is not less than 4. So this condition comes out to be false. And at the end, we simply return the result which is 0, 1, 2, 7 and 9, 10. 0, 1 doesn't overlap with this new interval and 9, 10 also doesn't overlap with this new interval. 3, 5 and 6, 7 were merged with 2, 6 and became 2, 7. So this was the answer. So friend, this was all about the algorithm. I hope you must have liked this video. In case if you are new to my channel, then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update. Thanks. Have a nice day. Hello friends. Welcome to my new data structures and algorithms in Java tutorial series video. Friends, in this tutorial we will discuss about the try data structure. We will discuss about what is a try and what are its real life applications. So friends, what is a try? So here you can see the word try actually came from the word retrieval. So the main purpose of this data structure was to retrieve the stored information very fast. So basically in real life application, we actually store the collection of strings inside the try. And whenever we want to get that string, we can retrieve that string very fast. Below you can see the symbolic representation of a try data structure. So here you can see that green circles are nothing but the try nodes. And multiple try nodes actually form a try. And also you can see the topmost node is actually empty, which is being pointed by the root. So root actually points to an empty try node. And from the root, the other words originate. So here you can see, let's suppose if we store these four words into a try data structure, then here we actually start from the root, which is an empty try node. And let's say for an example, as we want to store a word dog, then we simply create three try nodes, storing one alphabet into it and the try node pointing to others in sequence. So friends, here you can see that from root, we pointed to node D, then from D we pointed to node O, from O to G. So friends, after storing G, we know that dog is in the try. So we mark the last node in yellow color, stating that this is the end of the word. For example, if we take hat, then from root, we point to H, from H we point to A, and from A we point to T. Now as T is the end of the word, we usually mark it in the yellow color. Moving ahead. Friends, if we talk about the applications of a try data structure, then here you can see the one application would be the autocomplete of the words. So friends, you must have searched something on the Google search engine. So there, as soon as you type something, the search engine suggests the complete word to you. So this autocomplete feature is basically implemented with the help of tries. Moving ahead. The other application would be the search contacts in phone. 
So friends, in your smartphone, whenever you want to search any particular contact, you just type the initial letters of the person name and the application automatically suggests the name of the persons. So this application is also implemented with the help of try data structure. Also friend, one more application would be the spell checking. So here you can see that many editors such as word pages implement this spell check. So here what happens whenever user types any wrong spelling, the application auto suggests the correct spelling. So here you can see the spelling is wrong. Therefore the application is suggesting the correct spelling so that user can select from one of these option and correct the spelling. So friends, this was the introduction to the try and also its applications. In our upcoming tutorial, we will discuss more on how to implement a try, the try node and other methods which try supports. Thanks, have a nice day. Hello friends, welcome to my new data structures and algorithms in Java tutorial series video. Friends, in our previous tutorial, we actually discussed about a try data structure and also about its usage in real life applications. So in this tutorial, we will actually see how we can represent a try node in Java. So friends, what is a try node? So friends, in our previous tutorial, we actually discussed that the try data structure most of the time store the collection of strings. So here a try node basically represents a single alphabet of the word. So here you can see if you take an example of dog, so this green circle having the word as D is nothing but a try node. And let's say in order to store a word dog, which has three alphabet, we actually need three try nodes, which is one for each alphabet. So here you can see the topmost try node is empty, which is being referred by root. And all the words which you want to insert into the try originate after that. So here let's take an example of word head and let's say we want to store the head into this try data structure. So from the root we need to create three try nodes storing three alphabets such as H, A and T. So here you can see we have created three try nodes. From root there is a link to H, from H there is a link to A and from A there is a link to T. And as T is the end of the word Therefore, we are marking it in the yellow color. So friend, let's see about the representation of a try node in try. So a try node class in try consists of two data members. So here you can see a try node has two data members. So the first data member is nothing but an array of try node, which are nothing but the children of that particular try node. So here it's an array which refers to other try nodes in try and also they are called as the child nodes of a particular try node. So friends here you can see in the most of the applications we actually store the English words therefore the size of the array is usually taken as 26 because there are 26 alphabets in English language. So here if you take an example of this try node there here you can see that there is one link to D and there is one link to H and similarly it refers to the other letters of English alphabets and that referring is done through an array which actually refers to other try nodes and let's say if we are on any particular try node and it refers to other try nodes then those are nothing but the children of that try node so here the try node array is nothing but the first data member which a try node holds. So if we talk about the second data member, so it is nothing but a boolean value which signifies that a word has ended or not. So here you can see in this symbolic representation of try, we know that dog is a complete word. So here you can see from D it goes to O and from O it goes to G. Now we need to pass some information to this node so that we can come to know that that this word is in the try and it is the end of the word. So usually in the symbolic representation we mark this node in the yellow color stating that it is an end of the word. 
but in java we actually create a boolean value so this value is set as true when a word is inserted completely so friends we will discuss more about these two properties in upcoming tutorials so that we can understand more about the representation of a try node in try so friends let's see the demonstration of a try node so friends if we take an example of hat so we can see how it gets represented into java because here you can see the symbolic representation and here you will see the actual representation so at the top there is a root which is empty so in java we represented something like that a try node root points to an empty try node which has an array of size 26 because we have this 26 alphabets from a to z and when we actually initialize a try root points to an empty try node so here you can see the default value of is word is false and also you can see the size of array is 26 and each index points to a different try node but here when we initialize this root they all point to null value now let's suppose we want to insert h so in order to insert h we need to create a try node and from h we need to refer that so here it looks something like this that we have created one try node and from h we are simply pointing to this try node so this represents that there is a children to the root whose value is h and its default value is false because this is not the end of the word and then we actually insert a so here you can see that a points to null so then we create a try node and we simply provide a link from a to this try node stating that there is a children which points to a and finally let's say we insert t so it would look something like this that initially t was pointing to null but then we created a try node and we simply provided a value of this try node into this index so t points to this try node and friends here you can see as this is the end of the word we simply mark the boolean value to be true so friends here you can see if you are storing the english words then each try node will actually point to the other 26 try nodes so that they can store a particular word so here we actually saw that root which is an empty node it points to h h points to a and a points to t and also when all the other values of this array points to null because there are no more words inserted here so here you can see that all other links points to null and also friends here you can see that this is an array so 0th index points to a 1th index points to b 2nd index points to c and similarly 25th index points to z so how this mapping is done we will discuss later so for now you can keep an information that a particular try node has an array which refers to other try nodes and whose size is basically 26 if we are taking the english words and it also has other property which tells that whether a particular word has ended here or not so friends in our upcoming tutorial we will actually discuss more about this try nodes and how this linking is done and how this mapping is done of english alphabet to the index of an array till then have a nice day hello friends welcome to my new data structures and algorithms in java tutorial series video friends in our previous tutorial we actually discussed about the representation of a try node in java so in this tutorial we will actually see how we can implement a try in java friends in our previous lecture we saw about the representation of a try node in try that a try node has two data members one is the try node array which actually points to the other try nodes and which are also called as child nodes of that particular try node and we also discussed that if you are taking the english words then the size of this array is 26 because the english language contains 26 alphabets 
Also, friends, the second data member is nothing but a boolean value, which indicates the end of the word. So we set this value as true when we know that word is inserted completely. So we will discuss about these two data members in depth in our upcoming lectures. So friends, let's see the implementation of the try class. So friends, here try will be implemented using the try note class, which we actually discussed in our previous tutorial. You can also see that root try node is at the top of the try, which has empty value, and it has a try node array, which actually refers to other try nodes. So here you can see if you are working with English alphabets, then there are twenty six links. And these links actually point to other try nodes, signifying that there is a letter into a try, or they actually point to null. So, friends, in the try class, we actually create an instance variable of try node, and we give it a name as root. And whenever we initialize this try class, we simply create an empty try node. And then, using that root try node, we actually insert the other try nodes, signifying that there are letters. Into this try. Moving ahead, friends. Now here we will discuss about the character and the index mapping. That how it is done. So friends, as here you can see that it is an array of try node. An array has indexes. So in order to store these English alphabets, we usually take the values of the index and we map it to the alphabets. So here into this array, we are not actually storing these values. We are actually using the indexes, and we are figuring out the alphabets. So here you can see a points to zeroth index, b points to one hundredth index, c points to second index, and similarly the rest of the alphabets. So how this mapping is done? Let's see this demonstration through a code. So here you can see a char in Java is nothing but a sixteen bit value. Which starts from zero and goes till sixty-five thousand five hundred thirty-six. So here we are creating a char value, which points to a. And let's say if we typecast it to an integer value, then it prints ninety-seven. So this ninety-seven is nothing but the ASCII value of this character a. And let's say next step from a, we minus the char value a, it prints zero. Similarly, let's say we define another value h, and if we subtract the char value a from h, it prints seven, because from a h is seven step ahead. And similarly, if we define a value z, and on the console if we print z minus the char value a, it prints twenty five, which signifies that z is twenty five values. Away from A. So, friends, here you can see that we can actually map the character with an index value by using a formula that whatever the letter we pass, and if we subtract the value A, we will actually get the index value. So, for example, if we pass A, and if we minus A from it, we get zero. If we pass H, and if we minus A. We get value seven. If we pass Z, and if we subtract A, then we'll get the value twenty-five. So, friends, in try, as we are referring to this array, we are implicitly mapping the index value to character. We are not actually storing these characters, but any particular index value, we are simply mapping it to a character. So, friends, this implicit character to index mapping. We will be using in our upcoming tutorials when we will actually insert a word into a try, and when we actually search for a particular word in try. Also, friends, in our previous tutorial we actually saw this demonstration. So let's look it one more time to make it more clear. So here you can see the root try node is empty, and whatever the values we will be storing, we will be actually storing into the childrens of the root. We won't be storing any value inside this root because this root is also type of try node, which refers to other try nodes through this array. 
which are nothing but the child of this root so let's say we want to insert h so what we do is we simply traverse through the h index we see that its value is null so then we create a try node like this and then we'll simply refer its value into this index moving ahead let's say we want to store a so as soon as we have inserted a value h and after that we have to insert a so we use this link to traverse to this try node and then we go to a and we see that it's pointing to null so then we create a try node and whatever value it has we simply put it into this index and similarly after a we go to t so from this try node after inserting a we simply traverse to this try node we go to the index which maps to t and we see that it has null value so we'll simply create one try node and whatever the value this object will hold into the memory we'll simply store it into this index because here a particular try node actually refers to other try nodes so here this try node is actually referring to this try node from the index whose character value is t also friend t is the end of the word which is marked here as in yellow so what we do is we simply set the boolean value of is word to be true which signifies that we have completely inserted the word hat into this try so friend in this tutorial we actually saw the implementation of a try that it is made up of a try node now let's go to eclipse and implement a try hello friends in our previous tutorial we actually discussed about how to implement a try we also discussed that how a try node is represented into a try so in this tutorial we actually code the basic implementation of a try data structure so here i have created one class by name try having a main method so let's start our implementation so friends in our previous tutorial we discussed that a try is implemented by try node class so first we'll create a inner class and we'll give the name to it as try node also friends we discussed that a try node has two data members one is try node array which are nothing but children of this try node the other data member is a boolean value which signifies that this try node is nothing but end of the word so we'll give it a name as is word we'll also provide a constructor to this try node and inside this constructor we will initialize this try node array with a size as 26 because here we are storing english words so these words are from a to z also the value of is word is by default false so we set its value to be true when this try node is actually an end of the word also friend we discussed that a try contains an instance variable whose type is try node which is nothing but the root of the try data structure so this try node which is root will point to other try node through this try node array we'll also provide it a constructor so whenever we initialize a try class we simply create the instance of try node and we'll assign it to root so here root is empty so here whenever we initialize a try class root points to the try node which is empty and after that we insert a particular word character by character which this root points 
so friend this is how we actually implement a try using this try node class also friends in our upcoming tutorial we will see that how we can insert a particular word into this try we will also discuss that how we can search for a particular value that whether it's there in this try or not so friends in our upcoming tutorial we will actually see how we can insert a word into this try and we will also see that how we can search for a particular word into this try so friends I hope you like this video thanks have a nice day hello friends welcome to my new data structures and algorithms in java tutorial series video friends in this tutorial we will discuss how to insert a word in try so friends let's see a demonstration of how to insert a word in a try friends in our previous tutorial we discussed that whenever we initialize a try class root points to an empty try node because in the constructor of the try we create a new try node and we simply assign it to the root now for example let's say we want to insert a word as cat so here you can see the word cat has three characters c a and t and as we are using the english alphabets we will initialize this try node array with a size of 26 where index 0 will correspond to a index 1 will be corresponding to b and index 2 will be corresponding to c and similarly index 25 will correspond to z friends we also know that each character in this word will be represented by a try node so using this root so first we will insert c from the root so here what we do we go to index 2 which maps to character c and we will see that whether try node at index 2 is null or not so currently as root is empty the try node at index 2 is null therefore in order to insert the character c first we will create a try node and after creating this try node we will simply refer it from the index 2 which maps to c also friends once we insert this try node using this link we simply traverse to this position and after reaching to this try node now we will insert a so what we do is we simply go to the index 0 which maps to a and we'll see there whether it's null or not so currently you can see that it points to null so in order to insert a we'll again create a try node and after creating the try node we'll simply refer to this try node from index 0 which maps to a also friends once we have inserted this try node using this link we will simply traverse to this try node and then we will insert the character t so when we reach to this try node we simply traverse to an index which maps to t and we will see that whether it's null or not so here you can see it points to null so in order to insert t we will first create a new try node and then we will simply refer to this try node from the index which maps to t also friends once we insert this try node using this link we will simply traverse to this try node and after we reach to this try node we see that there are no more characters left to be inserted so we also know that this is the end of the word so in order to mark cat as the end of the word what we do to this try node we simply assign the value as true so this value signifies that when you reach to this try node this makes end of the word and it also signifies that cat is in the try friend let us take one more example we will insert a word sun so when we call the insert method we will start from the root and as we want to insert s we simply reach to index which maps to s and we will see that whether it is equal to null or not so here you can see it points to null 
therefore in order to insert the character s we'll first create a try node and we'll simply refer to this try node through this link from the index which maps to s and after we insert this try node we simply traverse to this try node through this link and once we reach to this link we'll now insert the character o so here we go to index which maps to o and we'll see whether it points to null or not so here you can see it points to null so in order to insert o we'll again create a try node and we'll simply refer to this try node through this link from index which maps to o and then we'll simply traverse to this try node and after we reach to this try node we'll now insert n so we simply traverse to an index which maps to n and we'll see whether it's equal to null or not so here you can see it points to null therefore in order to insert n we'll again create a try node and after we create a try node we'll simply refer it through this link from index which maps to n and also friends here you can see now this word is inserted completely so using this link when we reach to this try node we'll now simply mark this boolean value to be true which signifies that this is the end of the word moving ahead now friends let's suppose you want to insert a word so so here you can see we have already inserted sun and the word so is prefixed to sun so let's see how we'll insert so into this try so we'll start from the root we go to index which maps to s and we'll see whether it points to null or not so here you can see this time it's not pointing to null and it is pointing to a try node which signifies that there is a character s into this try so we'll not create a new try node and we'll simply traverse to this try node and then we'll insert o so here we'll reach to index which maps to o and we'll see that whether it points to null or not so here you can see that this index doesn't point to null and it points to a try node which signifies that there is a character o into this try so what we'll do we we'll simply traverse to this try node now using this link and once we reach to this try node we see there are no more characters left to be inserted so in order to mark this word so that it is present into this try what we'll do we'll simply assign a value true which will signify that this is the end of the word and the word so is present into this try so friends this boolean value is very important which let us know that whether the particular word is present into this try or not also friends if we see the symbolic representation of this try then it looks something like this that root is empty and from root there are three words c a t t is the end of the word and sun s o n where n is the end of the word and also so where o is the end of the word so basically this try has three words moving ahead friends whenever we insert into a try there are few use cases which we will look one by one so the first use case is let's say we have an empty try and now we are inserting a completely new word so when we say an empty try it means root is pointing to an empty try node and let's say we insert a word as cat so from root we will first insert c so it would look something like this then we'll traverse to c and now we'll insert a so it would look something like this and then we'll traverse to a and finally we'll insert t so it looks something like this and then we will traverse to t and we know that now we have inserted this word completely therefore we will mark t as the end of the word by making it in yellow color so this was the use case one now friend the second use case is when we want to insert a word into this try and this try contains already many words but the word which we want to insert has no prefix to this word so the new word which we are inserting is completely altogether new 
to all the words inside this try so here let's suppose you want to insert sun so here you can see that sun doesn't have any prefix to cat so this is an altogether completely new word into this existing try so we'll see how we can insert sun into this try so we'll start from the root and first we will insert s so it would look something like this that there is now another branch which takes in a word s from the root because friend we also discussed that root has a try node array which points to all the english alphabets so in this try node array from the index which maps to c there is a word and from the index s we will start inserting our new word so after we insert s we will simply traverse to s and then we will insert u so it would look something like this and after we insert u we simply traverse to u to insert n so it would look something like this and once we insert n we will simply traverse to this node and here we also know that we inserted this word completely therefore we will mark this node as the end of the word by making it in yellow color friend use case 3 is insertion with word which is having a common prefix so here you can see in our try there is already one word there and let's say we want to insert a word there so here you can see both these words have common prefix so the letters t h e is also present here t h e so these three letters are common to this both words so let's see how we can insert there into this try so here we will start from the root and we will see that whether t is present or not so here you can see t is already present so we will simply traverse to t and once we reach to t we see whether h is present or not so h is already present so we will simply traverse to h after that we will see that whether e is present or not so here e is present so we will simply traverse to e and now we will see that whether i is present or not so here you can see i is not present so here from e there would be another branch coming out we will create a new try node i and we will simply link to this new try node from e so it would look something like this that from e there is a link to a character i and once we insert i we will simply traverse to i and we will finally insert r so we will check whether r is present or not so here you can see r is not present so we will create a new try node and we will insert r and finally we see here that it is the end of the word so we will simply mark r as the end of the word also friends one final use case would be that insertion with word already present into the try so here let's suppose our try consists of a word daddy so it has five nodes which points to d a d d y and let's suppose we want to insert a word dad so we know that dad is already present into this try but we need to perform some work to make sure the dad is inserted into this try so what we do is we start from the root we see whether d is present or not so d is present so we'll simply traverse to d we check whether a is present or not so a is present so we'll simply traverse to a we check whether d is present or not so d is present so we'll simply traverse to d and as we know that we have inserted this word completely so one last thing we do is we simply mark d as the end of the word by making the boolean value is word to be true so friends in this tutorial we actually saw the demonstration of how we can insert a word into a try through all the possible use cases in our next tutorial we will actually see the code to insert a word into a try i hope you like this video thanks have a nice day hello friends welcome to my new data structures and algorithms in java tutorial series video friends in this tutorial we will discuss how to insert a word in try friends in our previous tutorial we actually saw a demo 
of how to insert a word in try by seeing the different use cases so friends in this tutorial we will actually see the working of this algorithm step by step so friends below you can see the code to insert a word into a try so let's see its demonstration step by step so friends whenever we initialize a try we know that root points to an empty try node because in the constructor we simply create a new try node and we will simply assign it to root so root will point to an empty try node now let's say we want to insert a word cat so here string word will point to cat so here we are simply seeing the string word in the form of character array the C is at index 0, A at 1 and T at 2. So we'll see how we can insert cat into this try character by character. Also friends in our previous tutorials we discussed that we always start from the root when we are inserting any new word. So in the step 1 what we'll do we'll simply create a temporary node current and whatever the node root points we'll simply assign it to current. So it would look something like this that current points to a node which root refers. Moving ahead friends now we will provide a for loop because we need to iterate each and every character of this word and we have to insert into this try. So we will start from the 0th index and we will iterate this for loop till index 2. So the condition we place in the for loop is I should be less than word dot length. So here word dot length will be nothing but 3. So as we are starting from 0, we need to traverse till 2. Moving ahead. So in the for loop what we'll do, we'll first take the character at index 0. So we'll simply call the caret method of the string. And we will take the character at index 0. Because currently the value of i is 0. So the care C will point to character C. Also friends in our previous tutorial we discussed that how we are mapping this index with an actual character. And we saw that if you are subtracting A from any particular character we will get the index value. So here the value stored in C is C. And when we will subtract A from it we get the index value. So here index becomes 2. So in the try node array, index 2 maps to character C. So using this current try node, we will see in the children array which is nothing but the array of try node. And we will see the value at index 2. We will check whether value at index 2 is null or not. So here you can see, currently value at index 2 which maps to C is null. Therefore the condition in if block comes out to be true which means that c is not present into this try and now we will insert c into this try so the first step we do is we simply create a new try node and we will simply assign it to a temporary try node also friend as we have created this new try node we have to link the try node at index 2 which maps to c to this try node so what we do is we simply assign the value of node to current.children at index 2 which maps to C so it would look something like this that now there is a link established from root to this try node from the index 2 which maps to C moving ahead and also friends in our previous tutorial we also discussed that as soon as we insert a try node we simply traverse to that particular node so here we'll simply assign the value of node to current. So now current will point to this try node. Moving ahead. So after incrementing value of i, i becomes 1. So the character at index 1 is a. So value of c becomes a. We will evaluate the value of index by subtracting a from the value stored in char c which is nothing but a. 
so when we'll do a minus a we get the value as 0 which makes sense because index 0 will map to a character a moving ahead now as current is pointing to this try node we will check into its children array that at index 0 whether its value is null or not so currently you can see the value at try node which is at index 0 points to null therefore condition in block comes out to be true so in order to insert a we'll first create a new try node and we'll simply assign it to a temporary node and in order to insert this try node in try what we'll do we'll simply assign the value of node which is this try node to current dot children at index 0 so here it would look something like this that now there would be a link from index 0 to this try node then we'll simply traverse to this try node by assigning value of node to current so now current will point to this try node moving ahead now after incrementing value of i by 1 it becomes 2 so now we will insert the value at index 2 which is t into this try so value of krc will become t then we will evaluate the index of the character t so we will simply subtract a from t so it will give index value as 19 so in the f-block we will again check that value at index 19 is equal to null or not so here you can see the value at index 19 of this try node array which maps to t is null therefore condition in f-block comes out to be true now in order to insert t we will first create a new try node and we will simply assign it to a temporary node moving ahead and now we will assign the value of node to this try node array at index 19 which maps to t so it would look something like this the try node at index 19 will now point to a newly created try node and finally we will simply traverse current to this newly created try node by assigning the value of node to current so it would look something like this that current will now point to this newly created try node now after incrementing the value of i by 1 i becomes 3 so the condition in for loop comes out to be false because 3 is not less than 3 so here we simply take an exit from this for loop and also friends in our previous tutorial we discussed that the last step we do is we simply mark the boolean value is word to be true stating that this is the end of the word so we'll simply assign the value true to current dot is word so it becomes true moving ahead now friend let's suppose we want to insert a string sun so we'll again call the insert method by passing in word as sun so it would look something like this so as we are inserting a new word we'll start from the root so we'll create a temporary node current which will start from the root and then we'll simply iterate each and every character of this word using this for loop so in the first step we'll insert s so c will have value as s we will evaluate its index position by subtracting a from s so index will become 18 then we'll provide a if block and we'll check that into this try node array at index 18 what's the value whether it's pointing to null or not so here you can see currently it is pointing to null so the condition in if block comes out to be true so in order to insert s we'll first create a new try node and we'll assign it to a temporary try node 
and as we are inserting this new try node into the try, we'll simply assign the value of node to this try node array at index 18, which maps to S. So it would look something like this: that the try node at index 18, which maps to S, now points to this newly created try node. Moving ahead. So after this assignment, we'll simply traverse current to this newly created try node by assigning the value of node to current. So it would look something like this. That current will now point to this newly created try node. So after incrementing the value of i by 1, i becomes 1. So now we'll insert O. So value of care C will become O. We will evaluate its index position by subtracting A from O. So it would give index as 14. Now as current is pointing to this node, so we will check that value of try node array at index 14 which maps to O whether it's null or not. So currently you can see this value is pointing to null. Therefore the condition in if block comes out to be true. Now in order to insert O into this try, first we'll create a new try node and we'll assign it to a temporary try node. And as you want to insert this new try node into try, we'll simply assign the value of node to this try node array at index 14 which maps to O. So it would look something like this. Moving ahead. Then we'll simply traverse current to this newly created try node by assigning the value of node to current. Now after incrementing i by 1, i becomes 2. So now we'll insert the value n. So the value of care c will become n. We will evaluate its index by subtracting a from n. So it would give index as 13. So in the if block we'll simply check that value of this children array at index 13 which maps to n is null or not. So currently you can see this value points to null. So the condition in if block comes out to be true. So in order to insert n into this try, we'll first create a new try node and we'll assign it to a temporary node. And then we'll simply assign this newly created node to the index 13 of this try node array which maps to n. So it would look something like this. And then we'll simply move current to this newly created try node by assigning the value of node to current. So it would look something like this. So after incrementing the value of i, i becomes 3. So the condition in for loop comes out to be false. And then we will exit from this for loop. So friend, as you inserted the word sun completely into this try, the last step we do is we simply assign the value true to current dot is word stating that this is the end of the word. So it becomes true. Now friend, let's suppose you want to insert a word cab. So here you can see that we have already inserted word cat and cab has a prefix CA which maps to CA of cat. So we'll see how we can insert cab into this try. So we'll call the insert method by passing in word as cab. So word will have the value as cab. We'll start from the root by creating a temporary try node by name current and we'll assign a value of root to it. So it would look something like this. And then we'll provide a for loop which will iterate over each and every element 
of the word so we'll start from c we'll evaluate its index position by subtracting a from c so index become 2 so into this children array and we will see that whether value at index 2 which maps to c is equal to null or not so here you can see the value is not null because it is pointing to a trinode therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false which tells us that c is already there into this try so the else part will be executed so in the else part will simply traverse current to a trinode which this trinode array holds at index 2 which maps to c so it would look something like this moving ahead Now after incrementing i by 1, i becomes 1. So now we will insert a. We will evaluate its index position by subtracting a from a. Which gives index as 0. Then in the if block we will check that what's the value of children array at index 0. So here you can see that it is not equal to null and it is pointing to a try node. Therefore, the condition in if block comes out to be false and the else block will be executed. And in the else block, whatever the value this trinode array at index 0 is referring will simply traverse current to that trinode. So it would look something like this that current will now point to this trinode. Now, after incrementing i by 1, i becomes 2. So now we will insert B. Then we will evaluate index position of B by simply subtracting A from B. So it would give index as 1. And now we will provide an if block and we will check the value of this trinode array at index 1 which maps to B that whether it's null or not. So here you can see that it is pointing to null. So the condition in if block comes out to be true. Now in order to insert B, we'll first create a new trinode and we'll assign its value to node. And then as we have to insert this trinode into the try, we'll simply assign the value of node to this trinode array at index 1 which maps to B. So it would look something like this. And then we'll simply traverse current to this newly created trinode. So after incrementing i by 1, i becomes 3. So the condition in for loop comes out to be false because 3 is not less than 3. So this for loop will exit. And in the last step, we'll simply assign the value of true to current dot is word which states that this is the end of the word moving ahead so friend now let's cover the last use case by inserting a value so so here you can see we have already inserted a word sun and the new word which we are inserting is so 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 is already there into this try but we need to provide some additional info to this try so that it can come to know that so is actually a word. So we'll simply call insert method again by providing a word as so. We'll start from the root by creating a temporary try node by name current. We'll provide a for loop which will iterate over each and every value of this word. So first we'll insert S. We'll first evaluate its index position by subtracting A from S. So index become 18. Now we'll provide an if block and we'll check the value of this trinode array at index 18 which maps to C. So here you can see that value is not equal to null. 
so the condition in if block comes out to be false so the else block will be executed and in the else block whatever the node this children array at index 18 is pointing will simply traverse current to that node so it would look something like this moving ahead after incrementing the value of i by 1 it becomes 1 so now we'll insert o we will evaluate index of o by subtracting a from o so index is 14 now we'll again provide an if block and we'll check the value in this try node array at index 14 so here you can see the value is not pointing to null it is pointing to a try node therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false and the else block will be executed so in the else block whatever the value this try node array at index 14 is pointing will simply traverse current to that try node so it would look something like this Now after incrementing i by 1, i becomes 2. So the condition in for loop comes out to be false because 2 is not less than 2. So the for loop exits. And here is the most important part. That as current is pointing to this try node. And we have inserted this word completely into this try. We will mark the is word property of this try node to be true. Stating that this is the end of the word. So by assigning the value true to this try node we are telling try that the word so is in the try. So at the later point of time whenever we perform a search over in this try this boolean value will help us return a value true or false that whether a particular word is present into a try or not which we will be seeing in our upcoming tutorials. So friends in this tutorial we actually saw the demonstration of how to insert a word into a try step by step. Now let's go to Eclipse and see the working of this code. Hello friends in our previous tutorial we actually discussed how to insert a word in a try and we saw the demonstration of the algorithm step by step. And also in our previous tutorial we created one class by name try and we implemented try with the help of try node class. So in this tutorial we will actually code a method which will insert a word into a try. So here I already created one method as insert which takes in a word and whose return type is void. So we need to insert this word into the try. So let's write the code for it. So in the first step we simply check that whether word is equal to null or not and also we'll check that word is empty or not because if word is equal to null or empty then we'll simply throw illegal argument exception saying invalid input So friends these are the basic edge cases and also friends in our previous tutorial we discussed that we will be storing the english words into the try. So we have taken the size of this try node array to be 26. So here we will be dealing with lowercase letters. So we will convert the word to lowercase. And also friends before calling insert method we actually initialize this try class so root points to an empty try node. So whenever we insert any word we basically start from the root. So we'll create a temporary try node and we'll assign a value of root to it. Now we'll provide a for loop 
which will iterate over this word character by character so we'll start this traversing from zero to a value less than word dot length and inside this for loop we will insert this word character by character so we will first fetch the character at the value i by calling the caret method of the string after getting the character value we will evaluate its index position by subtracting care a from the value which c holds so this will give us back the index position of this try node array that where we want to insert this particular character so after getting the index position we will provide an if block and inside this if block we will provide a condition that try node array to a try node which current points and at its index value which we just evaluated we will check whether it is equal to null or not so if this value is null therefore we know that this character is not inserted into try so in order to insert this character into try we will first create a new try node and we will assign its value to a temporary node and after creating this new try node we will assign its value to the try node array at the index which we just calculated and after inserting this try node into a try we will simply traverse current to this newly created try node by assigning the value of node to current also friend if the value is not equal to null then we will simply provide an else block and in this else block we will simply traverse current to a value this try node array holds at the index so friends after inserting this word character by character after the for loop we will simply assign the value of is word to be true stating that this is the end of the word so friend this is the code to insert a word into a try so in order to call this insert method in the main method we will first create the instance of try so when we will create the instance of try into the try constructor the root will be initialized to an empty try node and then we will simply call the insert method by passing in few values say cat cab sun and so so these are the values which you actually discussed in our previous tutorial so at last i will simply print values inserted successfully if i run this code now you see it printed values inserted successfully also friends in our upcoming tutorials when we will actually perform the search we can actually test the working of this insert method that whether these words are inserted properly or not so friend in this tutorial we actually discussed how to insert a word into a try 
आई होप यू लाइक दिस वीडियो थैंक्स एवं नाइस डे हेलो एवरीवन सो इन दिस सेक्शन ऑफ कोर्स वी विल बी डिस्कसिंग अबाउट डायनेमिक प्रोग्रामिंग एंड वील सी दैट हाउ वी कैन सॉल्व द प्रॉब्लम रिलेटेड टू डायनेमिक प्रोग्रामिंग so in this lecture we'll simply see that what is dynamic programming with a simple introduction so friends what is dynamic programming so if you visited the website kora there was a question asked on how you can explain what is dynamic programming in a simple manner and to that question a guy named jonathan paulson gave an amazing reply so what analogy is demonstrated so let's say we write something this on a sheet of paper and we ask that what's that equal to so your answer would be you will simply count each one as 1 plus 1 2 2 plus 1 3 3 plus 1 4 4 plus 1 5 6 7 8 8 so you simply reply 8 Now let's say if we write one plus to the left of it, and we ask, "What about that?" So you will be quickly replying nine. So initially you took some time to just add all those numbers, but when we simply added plus one to the left of it, you straight away replied nine. So how would you know it was nine so fast? So our basic answer would be. that we simply added one more and we didn't need to recount everything again because we remembered this result which is equal to 8 and we simply added plus 1 which became 9 so friends here you can see the dynamic programming is just a fancy way to say remembering stuff to save time later so here what we do is let's say we calculated these values and when we added plus 1 we didn't need to count everything again and we knew that all these values were added to 8 and we simply added plus 1 and we gave the answer as 9 and let's say if we do 2 plus to it then we wouldn't have counted everything again we would have straight away replied 11 because 9 plus 2 gave us 11 so friends here dynamic programming also works the same let's say when we solve any small problem So what we do is we simply store that result and when we encounter that same problem again we simply take that stored result instead of recalculating the values in the problem So friend this is how dynamic programming works Let's say we are given a problem to solve so what we do is we simply break that problem into smaller problems we solve those problems and we store the result of those problems so while building up the solution to the last problem if that smaller problem comes again we don't recalculate it we simply use the value which we already computed so what it does is it simply saves our time and the problem takes less time to compute what the exact value is so friends when we discuss dynamic programming in the world of algorithms it is basically a technique in which a complex problem is solved by first breaking it into smaller sub problems second solving those sub problems and simply storing their results and third reuse those stored results if sub problem occurs or overlaps again so what it means that we are simply avoiding solving that sub problem again and finally using solutions to smaller sub problems to build up the solution for the complex problem so friend as we saw an example in our previous slide that when we counted all the ones we came to know that they are equal to 8 so what we did was we simply remembered that all these ones were equal to 8 and when we added plus 1 we straight away came to an answer that now it's equal to 9 so here also we break the problem into smaller sub problems and we simply store their results so that when those sub problems comes again 
we simply use that stored results so that our time is saved and we are not recomputing those values and finally using these steps we build a solution to the complex problem so friend if we use dynamic programming then we can solve a complex problem very fast by simply breaking down into smaller sub problems remembering the result of those sub problems and while building up the solution to complex problem if those sub problems are coming again then we simply use those stored values instead of recalculating those sub problems again and finally coming to a solution for the complex problem so friend this is how we use the dynamic programming as a tool to optimize an algorithm so friends in our next lecture we'll take a problem we will solve it without dynamic programming we'll see the problem associated with it and then we'll introduce dynamic programming and we'll see that how fast it makes the algorithm hope you like the lecture thanks have a nice day hello everyone so friends in our previous lecture we discussed about what is dynamic programming so in this lecture we will discuss more about dynamic programming and its relationship with recursion we will see how recursion and dynamic programming go hand in hand so here if you see we mostly use dynamic programming to provide an optimization over recursion so here let's say we use recursion to solve any problem so usually it happens that when we solve a recursive problem we tend to make the code inefficient which means using recursion we can solve the problem but what it happens is the problem is solved but it tends to take more time so in our previous lecture we discussed that how dynamic programming usually help us to solve a complex problem by breaking it down into smaller sub problems and then solving those sub problems and while solving those sub problems what we do is we simply store the result of those sub problems and whenever that sub problem comes again into picture we usually extract the stored result and we reuse rather than computing it again and again so similarly when we solve any recursive problem what we do is we simply break it down to smaller sub problems and we solve those sub problems and we store those results so whenever that sub problem comes back into picture we usually use the stored result of that sub problem and we avoid recalculating the solution to that sub problem so by doing that a recursive problem gets optimized so if we see the basic definition of dynamic programming is basically taking recursion plus memorization so here we tend to solve a problem recursively and when we solve the sub problem we usually memorize those solutions and later point of time if that sub problem comes again back into picture we use the memorization solution rather than again calculating those sub problems so friends in order to explain what is the problem with using recursion directly and what's the advantage of bringing in dynamic programming with recursive solutions we'll see an example so we'll take the example of fibonacci series so what is fibonacci series so as per the definition it is a series of numbers in which first two numbers are 0 and 1 after that each coming number is the sum of the two preceding numbers so if we go by this definition then this is the formula which comes out so here first two numbers are 0 and 1 so here you can see the fibonacci of 0 is 0 and fibonacci of 1 is 1 which means that first two numbers are 0 and 1 after that each coming number is sum of the two preceding numbers so let's say I want to calculate the Annette Fibonacci number. So in order to calculate the Annette Fibonacci number, what I can do is I can simply do the sum of the n minus one eighth Fibonacci number and n minus two eighth Fibonacci number. So which means that we are simply doing the sum of 
the two preceding numbers and getting the current number. So here you can see this is the Fibonacci series of first few numbers where the first two numbers are 0 and 1 which is this. So let's say we want to calculate what's the Fibonacci number 2. So the Fibonacci number 2 is the Fibonacci number 1 plus the Fibonacci number 0. So here you can see the Fibonacci number 1 is 1 and Fibonacci number 0 is 0. So if we do 0 plus 1 we get the number 1. If you want to calculate Fibonacci number 3, we simply take the two preceding numbers which is 1 and 1. So when we do 1 plus 1, we get 2. And similarly, 1 plus 2 will give 3. 2 plus 3 will give 5. 3 plus 5 will give 8. 5 plus 8 will give 13. And 8 plus 13 will give 21. So this is how the series goes. If you want to calculate any Fibonacci number, we simply take the preceding two numbers, we do the sum of it and we get the number. So this is the basic formula to calculate the Fibonacci number. So friends, in our next lecture, we'll take this example of Fibonacci series and we'll see that how plain recursion in calculating the Fibonacci number is less optimized and then we'll see that how we can bring dynamic programming more optimized. I hope you like this video. Thanks, have a nice day. Hello everyone. So friends, in our previous lecture, we discussed that how recursion and dynamic programming go hand in hand. And we also discussed that dynamic programming provides an optimization to recursion problems. And we also discussed about the Fibonacci series and we saw that Fibonacci series is nothing but a series where first two numbers are 0 and 1 and after that each number is the sum of two preceding numbers and we saw that we can calculate the Fibonacci number using this formula. So in this lecture we will take the example of Fibonacci series and we will see that how recursion is less optimized when solving the problem of the Fibonacci number and then we will see that how we can use dynamic programming to make this recursion problem highly optimized. So friends, in order to calculate the nth Fibonacci number, this is the basic algorithm which uses the recursion. So here you can see that we are using this formula to calculate the nth Fibonacci number. So you can see that when value of n is 0, we are simply returning 0. When the value of n is 1, we are returning 1. And in order to calculate the nth Fibonacci number, we are recursively calling this fifth function with the value of n-1 and n-2 and we are simply doing the sum of it to get the value of nth Fibonacci number. So here you can see that we are calling this method recursively by passing n-1 and whatever is written from it we are storing in a integer variable left and then we are calling recursively the fifth function with a value n-2 and we are simply storing it in the integer value right and finally we are doing the sum of it because we know that we need to do the sum of the two preceding numbers so which is these two numbers we are doing left plus right and we are simply returning the result. So this is the plain recursion without using any dynamic programming. So we'll see step by step how this algorithm goes. So let's say we want to calculate the fifth Fibonacci number. So then you can see that the fifth function will be called where n will be equal to 5. So we have called fib of 5 then we move ahead n is equal to 5 therefore the condition if block comes out to be false we move ahead n is not equal to 1 therefore the condition if block comes out to be false so we move ahead and here you can see now we are again calling the fifth function with the value as n minus 1 which is nothing but 
फाइव माइनस वन फोर एंड वी आर गोइंग टू कॉल दिस फिफ्थ फंक्शन रिकर्सिवली सो इट वुड लुक समथिंग लाइक दिस दैट द फिफ्थ फंक्शन विल बी कॉल्ड अगेन विद द वैल्यू ऑफ एन एस फोर लाइक दिस एंड देन विल मूव हेड एन इज नॉट इक्वल टू जीरो सो वी मूव हेड एन इज नॉट इक्वल टू वन सो वी सिंपली मूव हेड and then we again call the fifth function with the value as n minus 1 which is 4 minus 1 so it would look something like this the fifth function will be called with the value as 3 like this we move ahead the condition in if block comes out to be false because n is not equal to 0 Similarly, n is not equal to one, so we move ahead. And here we again call the fifth function with the value as three minus one, which is two. So it would look something like this. The fifth function will be called with the value as two. N is not equal to zero, so we simply move ahead. N is not equal to one. so we move ahead now we are again calling the fifth function recursively with a value as 2 minus 1 which is 1 so it would look something like this the fifth function will be called again with a value as 1 like this so n is not equal to 0 so we simply move ahead but now you can see that n is equal to 1 which is this so we have encountered a base case where we want to return 1 now so here fib of 1 is actually 1 so 1 will be returned from this fib of 1 to fib of 2 so it would look something like this as we have left the fib of 2 at this point we'll start executing from this point where now left will get the value as 1 because we have returned 1 and now we'll move ahead so here you can see that n is 2 and when we do n minus 2 and call the fifth function again so it would look something like this that it will call fib of 0 so it would look something like this now n is equal to 0 so now we'll simply return 0 from here so it would look something like this that 0 will be returned to fib of 2 and as we have left fib of 2 here we are again coming back to this point and finally we'll return left plus right which is 1 plus 0 which comes out to be 1 so from fib of 2 we'll simply return 1 and as we have left fib of 3 at this point we'll start executing now from this point here n is 3 we'll again call the fib of 3 minus 2 which is 1 So now fib of one will be called again. It would look something like this. N is not equal to zero. N is equal to one. So we'll return one from here. And as we have left fib of three from this line, we'll start executing from this line. And we'll simply return left plus right. which is 1 plus 1 so from fib of 3 we are simply returning 2 to fib of 4 so we know that we had left fib of 4 at this point so we'll start executing from this line and then we'll call again this fifth function recursively with a value as 4 minus 
which is two. So now fifth function will be called with the value as two. So it would look something like this. So n is not equal to zero. So we'll simply move ahead. N is not equal to one. So we'll simply move ahead. And then from fib of two, we are again calling the fifth function recursively, because in order to calculate the fib of two, we need to do the sum of two preceding numbers, which is fib of one and fib of zero. So first we are calling the fib of one, because two minus one is one. So it would look something like this: the fib will be called with the n as one, and it would look something like this. So we will now again calculate fib of one. We know that n is not equal to zero, so we'll simply move ahead. And here we know that n is equal to one, because we are calculating fib of one. So the condition in if block comes out to be true, and we are simply returning one. So one will be written to fib of two. And we had left fib of two from the left side, so one will be stored in left, and then we'll simply move ahead, and then we'll go to its right by calling fib of n minus two. So fib of two minus two is zero. So we'll simply call fib of zero again. So it would look something like this: that now we are going to its right. So here we know that n is equal to zero. So we'll simply return zero from its right. So we'll go back to fib of two, and as we are returning it from the right, we start our execution from this point, where n is equal to two now. So finally, we'll simply return left plus right, which is one plus zero. So fib of two. Will be returning one to fib of four from its right. So as we are returning it from the right, we'll start executing from this point that we had left fib of four from the right side. So right will be having the value as one, which we have returned it from fib of two. And finally, we'll return left plus right, which is two plus one from the fib of four, which is three. So this three will return to fib of five, which we had left from the left side. So we'll start our execution from this point, where n is five now. And now we'll go to its right. By again calling fib of n minus two, which is five minus two, which is three. So fib of three will be called again. N is not equal to zero. N is not equal to one. Now we'll go to its left, because in order to calculate fib of three, we need to calculate fib of two. And fib of one, so we'll call fib of n minus one, which is three minus one two. So it would look something like this. N is not equal to zero. N is not equal to one. And in order to calculate fib of two, we'll first call fib again recursively by passing two minus one, which is one. So it would look something like this. N is not equal to zero. Now here n is equal to one. So we'll simply return one from fib of one to fib of two, like this. And as we have left fib of two from its left, we'll start our execution from this point. 
and we'll simply store one to the left because this is what is returned from fib of n minus one. And now we'll simply go to its right by calling fib of n minus two, which is two minus two, which is fib of zero. So it would look something like this: that fib of zero will be called again. And here n is equal to zero, so we'll simply return zero. So as we are returning it from the right side, we'll start our execution from this point because zero will be stored in right. And finally, from fib of two, we simply return left plus right, which is one plus zero. So one will be returned. From fib of two, and as we have left fib of three from its left, we'll start our execution from this point, and one will be stored in the left. Then we'll go to its right again by calling fib of n minus two, which is three minus two, which is one. So fib of one will be called again. N is not equal to zero. N is equal to one. So we'll simply return one. So one will be returned to fib of three. And as we are returning it from the right, we'll start our execution from this point, where one will be stored in right. And finally, from the fib of three, we'll return left plus right, which is one plus one, which is equal to two. So two will be returned from the fib of three to fib of five. And as we have left fib of five from its right, we'll start our execution from the right, where two will be stored in right. And finally, we'll simply return left plus right from the fib of five, which is three plus two, which equals to five. So, friends, the fifth Fibonacci number has a value of five, which we have returned finally from fib of five. So, friends, here you can see that we use plane recursion to calculate the fifth Fibonacci number. So, this solves our problem. But here you can see that it is very less efficient code. As you can see, that we are calculating fib of five, fib of four, fib of three, fib of two, fib of one, and fib of zero. But here you can see the boxes in blue color are recalculated again. So, for example, here you can see that fib of three we calculated the value as two, and here we again calculated the value. Of Fibonacci three as two, so we went inside again this tree, which you see here. And similarly, you can see that Fib of two we calculated here, then we calculated here, and then we calculated here. And similarly, Fib of one we calculated here, 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 and here. And same as Fibonacci zero, we calculated it here, here, here. So here you can see the boxes in green were the actual calculation which we wanted to calculate. But as we were using this recursion, we need to again recalculate everything here again in the blue boxes. So this makes this algorithm very less efficient. So what dynamic programming says is, when we were computing Fibonacci of three, Fibonacci two, one zero, what if we stored those values somewhere? And later point of time, when we wanted to recalculate Fibonacci three, two, one zero, we could have used those values directly without going into again recalculating those values. So as per the dynamic programming definition, a complex problem. Is solved by making it to smaller sub problems. We store those sub problem results somewhere, and when we get those problems again, like here, 
here, here, here. Instead of recalculating those thing again and again, we can simply use the stored result and we can solve this problems very fast. So here you can see the dynamic programming basically provides an optimization to the recursion and as we saw in the definition that it is basically an optimization over recursion plus dynamic programming is nothing but recursion plus memorization. So here we use recursion but somewhere we memorize the solutions and we store it somewhere so that when those sub problems comes again into picture we usually use the stored solutions rather than recalculating them again and again. So using this technique dynamic programming provides an optimization over recursion. So friend in this lecture we saw that how plain recursion can be a problem in solving a complex problem. So friends in the upcoming lecture we'll see the demonstration of how we can use dynamic programming to use recursion with memorization and we'll see that how we can solve the problems such as Fibonacci series very fast. I hope you like this video. Thanks. Have a nice day. Hello everyone. So friends in our previous lecture we saw an example to calculate the nth Fibonacci number and we saw that how we can solve the problem using recursion and we also saw that when we use recursion in calculating the nth Fibonacci number the problem was solved but the solution was very less efficient. So friends in this lecture we will discuss that how we can identify that a particular problem comes under dynamic programming. So usually dynamic programming problem has few characteristics. So one of the characteristics is optimal substructure. So what do we mean by optimal substructure? So here you can see that a given problem has optimal substructure property if optimal solution of the given problem can be obtained by using the optimal solution of its sub problems. So which means we are given a complex problem and we want to solve that problem and if that problem can be solved by breaking it down into smaller sub problems and using the solution of those sub problems and obtaining the solution to the complex problem gives the problem a property known as optimal substructure. So in our previous lecture we saw that how we can calculate the nth Fibonacci number and we also saw that how we can solve the problem of nth Fibonacci number by using the formula as if you want to calculate the nth Fibonacci number you need to find the sum of its preceding Fibonacci numbers which is Fib of n-1 and Fib of n-2. So here you can see the complex problem has been broken down into smaller sub problems which again gets broken down into more smaller sub problems which we saw in our last lecture. Therefore as an example we can say that if you want to calculate the nth Fibonacci number we can calculate by breaking it down into smaller sub problems. Thus this problem has optimal substructure. So in our last lecture we saw that in order to calculate the nth Fibonacci number we can use the recursion and we can solve this problem. So while using recursion we saw that if you want to calculate let's say the fifth Fibonacci number. So here in order to calculate the fifth Fibonacci number we break this problem into two sub problems by first calculating the fourth Fibonacci number and the third Fibonacci number. So we further broke this problem into sub problems and similarly it goes on like this. So finally when we reach to a point that a problem cannot be divided further. So we usually encounter the base cases which is n is equal to 0 and n is equal to 1. And then using the result of those base cases we solve the sub problems. Then we use the solution to solve the bigger sub problem 
and doing this we finally solve our main problem so here you can see that this complex problem has a property of optimal substructure where a complex problem can be solved by breaking it down into smaller sub problems and using its solutions to solve the main problem so this one property optimal substructure helps us to identify that whether a problem can be a dynamic programming problem or not so friends in our next lecture we'll see that there is one more property combined with this property makes a problem a dynamic programming problem so we'll discuss that property in our next lecture i hope you like this video thanks have a nice day hello everyone so friends in our previous lecture we discussed that how to identify a particular problem that whether it is a dynamic programming problem or not we saw the dynamic programming has few characteristic so one of the characteristic which we discussed in our last lecture was optimal substructure so in this lecture we'll see that there is one more characteristic which basically help us to identify that whether a particular problem is a dynamic programming problem or not so here the other characteristic is overlapping sub problems so what is overlapping sub problems so friend let's suppose we are given a problem and we want to identify that whether the given problem has overlapping sub problems property or not so we can simply identify the overlapping sub problems property by first taking the problem and breaking it down into smaller sub problems and solving those sub problems to get the solution of main problems now what this overlapping sub problems means so let's say if our solution of a given problem is obtained by solving the same sub problems multiple times so friends few lectures back we saw that when we solved the nth fibonacci number problem using recursion there we saw that in order to solve the nth fibonacci number we first broke it down into smaller sub problems using recursion and when we were building up the solution back by solving the smaller sub problems we saw that those smaller sub problems were encounter multiple times so here the example of calculating the nth fibonacci number has few sub problems which are overlapping to each other so here you can see that in one of our previous lecture we calculated the nth fibonacci number using recursion and here you can see that in order to solve the fifth fibonacci number we broke it down into smaller sub problems something like this by using this properties that nth fibonacci number is equal to n minus 1th fibonacci number plus n minus 2th fibonacci number which is nothing but taking the sum of previous two fibonacci numbers so friends here you can see that when we solve this problem so in this diagram you can see the boxes which are in blue color are basically the smaller sub problems which have occurred multiple times so for example you can see that when we want to calculate the third fibonacci number we calculated second fibonacci number first fibonacci number and again to get the value of second fibonacci number we broke it down into smaller sub problems by calculating the fib of 1 and fib of 0 if we see the tree of fib of 3 this much you can see that we have recalculated this tree here again and also if you see the tree of fib of 2 which is this much portion we have recalculated it here and here and similarly fib of 1 we have recalculated it here here and here and same goes with fib of 
we have calculated it here 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 so friends here you can see that when we solve this problem by breaking it down into smaller sub problems we encountered that this problem has multiple overlapping sub problems here this same problem overlapped with this this sub problem overlapped with this and this thus the problem to calculate the nth fibonacci number has overlapping sub problems and also friends you can see that it also has optimal sub structure where we are breaking it down into smaller sub problems and solving those sub problems to get the solution to the main problem so friend a problem is considered to be a dynamic programming problem when it follows the two properties the optimal sub structure which we discussed in our last lecture and overlapping sub problems which we are discussing now so friends in our previous lecture we also discussed that this solution is very less optimized because we are recalculating the values of the sub problems multiple times so for example let's say we calculated fib of 3 which has value 2 now what if if i store this value somewhere and let's say when i encountered fib of 3 again instead of going to this deep tree i can just return 2 so i don't have to calculate this tree again similarly with fib of 2 if i store the value as 1 i can avoid recalculating this sub tree and this sub tree thus you can see that if i calculate the values in green box once i can store those values and simply i can reuse whenever these values are required again therefore it's a perfect example of demonstrating that nth fibonacci number is a dynamic programming problem so friends in our next lecture we'll see that how we can store these values somewhere and can reuse them again whenever the same sub problems occurs multiple times so friends i hope you like this video thanks have a nice day hello everyone so friends in our previous lecture we discussed about the two main characteristic of a dynamic programming problem which was optimal sub structure property and overlapping sub problems property so friends till now we saw that how we can solve a problem using recursion so in this lecture and in upcoming lecture we'll see that how we can solve a problem using dynamic programming so friends there are two approaches to solve a dynamic programming problem the first approach is bottom up approach so what do we mean by it in bottom up approach we try to solve smaller sub problem first use the solution to build on and arrive at the solution to bigger sub problems so this simply means so let's say if you want to solve a complex problem so instead of solving the complex problem at once what we do is we start with the smaller sub problems we try to solve those sub problems we use those sub problem solution to arrive at a solution to the bigger sub problems and this way we try to solve the bigger sub problems and finally reach to the solution of our main problem so the bottom up approach is also called the tabulation method because in this approach when we solve the smaller sub problems we usually store the result of those smaller sub problems into a table and when those smaller sub problems are encountered again then we simply use the values from the table to arrive the solutions to the bigger sub problems and this way solving the chain of sub problems we reach to the solution of the main problem therefore the solution is built in a tabular form by using the solutions of smaller sub problems iteratively and generating solutions to bigger sub problems so friends in our previous lecture we saw that when we used recursion and when we solved the nth fibonacci number problem 
we saw that it was less efficient code because we were recalculating the sub problems again and again so instead of recalculating the sub problems again and again what we do is we store the results of those sub problems in a table and when those sub problems are encountered again we simply use the values of those smaller sub problems from the table itself without going to solve those sub problems again and again so friends now let's look at the demonstration of bottom up approach that how we can use the tabulation method to memorize the solutions of the sub problems and reuse them later when those sub problems are encountered again so here you can see that in this example we are simply calculating the nth fibonacci number and this time instead of using recursion we are using the bottom up approach which is nothing but solving it via one of the methods of dynamic programming so let's say we want to calculate the fifth fibonacci number so here when we call this function fib the value of n will be 5 So in the first step, what we do is we simply create a table, which is nothing but an array, to store the result of the smaller sub problems. So when we want to use the result of those sub problems again, we can simply refer this table, pick up that value, and simply reuse. So friends, here we will simply create a table of length n plus one. We will see why we are taking the length as n plus one. so it would look something like this that there will be an array by name table having six elements from 0 to 5 and we are using n plus 1 because we know that array starts from 0 and if you want to calculate the fifth fibonacci number the value of fifth fibonacci number will be stored at the fifth index of the array so therefore we are using n plus 1 moving ahead So friends as we know that fibonacci series starts with 0 and 1 so here you can see we are simply assigning the value as 0 and 1 to the 0th index and the 1st index so we are assigning 0 to the 0th index and then we are assigning 1 to the 1st index moving ahead So friends here you can see that we want to calculate the fifth fibonacci number which is this but we are starting from the bottom by using this base cases therefore this approach is also called as bottom up approach because we build our solution by traversing from the bottom and we move up and finally we reach to our solution So friends here you can see that we have calculated the value at zero the index and at the first index so now what we do is we provide a for loop we start from the second index and this for loop will go till the value of i is less than equal to 5 so here you can see i becomes 2 and as i is equal to 2 here we can see that i is less than equal to 5 therefore the condition in for loop comes out to be true and the for loop executes also friends we know that how we can calculate the fibonacci number we simply do the sum of its two preceding numbers so here what we are simply doing we have already stored the result of zeroth index and the first index and when we want to calculate the second fibonacci number we simply do the addition of the first preceding number which is i minus 1 and the second preceding number which is i minus 2 so this is nothing but we are doing the sum of its two preceding numbers because in this table we are actually storing the fibonacci series and when we want to calculate the second fibonacci number we simply do the addition of its two preceding numbers which is 0 and 1 so here you can see the value stored at table i minus 1 which is 2 minus 1 index has value 
and the value stored at table i minus 2 which is 2 minus 2 has the value 0. So we'll simply add 1 plus 0 and store the value 1 at the second index here. So these are the two preceding numbers which we will add and store at this position. So now the value at second index becomes 1. Moving ahead. Now we'll increment i, so i becomes 3. And now we want to calculate the value at the third index. So we'll simply do the sum of its two preceding numbers with i minus 1 and i minus 2. So i minus 1 gives the second index value and i minus 2 gives the first index value. We'll do its sum which is 2 and we'll store 2 at the third index. So value 2 is nothing but the third Fibonacci number. Moving ahead. Now when we increment i by 1, i becomes 4. And now we want to calculate the value of the fourth Fibonacci number which is stored at fourth index and this value can be obtained by doing the sum of its two preceding numbers which is at index 2 and 3 which can be obtained by taking the value of the table i minus 1 plus i minus 2 so i minus 1 gives the value at third index i minus 2 gives the value at 4 minus 2 which is the second index so we'll do its sum 1 plus 2 becomes 3 we store 3 at the fourth index moving ahead now we'll increment i by 1 so i becomes 5 and then we'll simply calculate the fifth Fibonacci number by doing the sum of its two preceding numbers which is nothing but i minus 1 which is 5 minus 1 equal to 4 the fourth index and i minus 2 which is 5 minus 2 which is 3 and that is nothing but value stored at third index so we'll do the sum of these two values which is 2 plus 3 equal to 5 and we'll store the 5 at the fifth index And now we'll increment i again. So i becomes 6. But here you can see that 6 is not less than or equal to 5. Therefore the condition in for loop comes out to be false and for loop terminates. So friends we simply return the value stored at 5th index which is nothing but our 5th Fibonacci number which is 5. So friends here you can see that in our previous lecture we used recursion to solve the nth Fibonacci number problem and we saw the solution was very less efficient because we recalculated the values of the sub problems again and again. So here what we did we simply created a table to store the results of the sub problems and when we wanted to use the values of the sub problems again we simply refer this table, use those solution and build up upon the solution to the main problem. So here we started from the bottom which is from the 0th index and the 1st index and as we knew that the first two number of Fibonacci series are 0 and 1, we simply used those two values to come up with the second Fibonacci number. Then we used the first Fibonacci number and the second Fibonacci number we did it sum we got the value of the third Fibonacci number and similarly we got the value of fifth Fibonacci number so friends here you can see that using this tabulation method we are storing the results of the sub problems 
and we are not recalculating the values of those sub problems we are simply referring to this array we are taking out the values and we are simply using to build up upon the solution to the main problem so this is a bottom up approach to solve the problem of calculating the nth fibonacci numbers so friends now let's go to eclipse and see the demonstration of this code i hope you like this video thanks have a nice day hello everyone so friends in this lecture we'll see how we can code a program to find the nth fibonacci number using dynamic programming and in this lecture we'll use the bottom up approach so friends in our previous lecture we saw the algorithm of how to find the nth fibonacci number using the bottom up approach we saw its animation and here in eclipse we'll actually code the algorithm and using this main method we'll see it's working so here we'll create one method as public which will return us back the nth fibonacci number so int will give the method name as fib which will take the value of n for which we want to find the fibonacci number so friends for the positive values of n we need to return the nth fibonacci number from this method and as we are discussing the bottom up approach using dynamic programming we know that this approach is nothing but a tabulation approach where we create the table and store the results of the sub problems and when those sub problems comes again into picture instead of recalculating them we simply reuse the values stored in the table so here we'll create an array we'll give it a name as table and the size of the array would be n plus 1 because as array is indexed from 0 and we are using this table to store the individual fibonacci number so in order to get the nth fibonacci number we need to create a table which can store n plus 1 items so that it will start from 0 to n and at the nth index we will have our nth fibonacci number also friends what we discussed in our previous lectures that the first two numbers of the fibonacci series are nothing but 0 and 1 so table at the 0th index will have value as 0 and table at the first index will have value as 1 and also friends we discussed that in fibonacci series if you want to know the current number you just need to do the sum of its two previous numbers so here we have this first two numbers if we do sum of these two numbers we'll get the second number and similarly using this approach we can come to know that what is the nth number so we are simply storing the fibonacci numbers in this table array so we have used the zeroth index and one index so now we'll start from the second index we are starting from the second index and as here you can see the table has size of n plus 1 so we'll provide a boolean condition here that if i is less than equal to n just iterate this for loop we'll do i plus plus so friends here you can see the advantage of creating a table array what we can do is simply let's say if you want to calculate the ith fibonacci number we simply do the sum of its two previous numbers and whatever the values computed from this 
equation we simply store it into the table at ith index so does this table help us in computing the nth fibonacci number from the bottom which is from the 0th index to the nth index so we have this first two values as index 0 and 1 the second value is computed by adding this value and this value which is i minus 1 and i minus 2 and storing it into the second index and similarly the third index will be calculated by adding the value at second index and the first index so this loop keeps on going ahead and ahead taking previous two values doing their sum and storing it into the current ith position and finally when this loop terminates the final value will be stored in the table at the nth index which we also saw in our previous lecture using the animation so we'll re simply return that value so here first we'll create the object of fibonacci number class we'll provide a sysout to print the nth Fibonacci number. Let's say we want to print the sixth Fibonacci number. We simply call the method fib and we'll pass the value as six. And now we'll simply run the program. So here you can see the six Fibonacci number is eight. So which is something like this. That series starts from zero, one. And then the rest of the values are calculated by using the sum of its two previous numbers. So zero plus one gives one. One plus one gives two. 2 plus 1 gives 3, 3 plus 2 gives 5, and 3 plus 5 gives 8. So the 6 Fibonacci number which comes out is 8. So friends, this was the demonstration of code to find the nth Fibonacci number using dynamic programming with a tabulation method which is nothing but bottom-up approach. I hope you like this video. Thanks, have a nice day. Hello everyone. So friends, in this lecture we will discuss about the top-down approach. So in our previous lecture we saw that how we can solve a problem using dynamic programming with a bottom-up approach. And in this lecture we will see that how we can solve a problem using top-down approach. So what is top-down approach? So this method is also called as memoization. So what it means is that in this method we break the large problem into multiple sub-problems. Each of the sub-problems are solved and solutions are remembered. So by remembering the solutions we treat it as a memorization and the term given to it as memoization which means that something we are remembering to reuse it later. So how does it work is, if the sub problem is solved already, we simply reuse the answer. So here you can see that we are solving the sub problems and its solutions are remembered. So later point of time, if that sub problem comes again into picture, we simply reuse the remembered answer. Or else what we do is, we simply solve the sub-problem and store the result. Which simply means that we are remembering the solution somewhere. Thus it memorizes the solution of the sub-problem to avoid the recomputing the value if sub-problem is encountered again. So friends, in our previous lecture we also saw that, that when we are doing recursion, we can solve the problems 
by breaking it down into multiple sub problems and if those sub problems are encountered again then instead of recalculating it again we simply store the solution of that sub problem and when those sub problems are encountered again we simply use those solutions rather than computing them again and again does it bring the optimization to our recursion so here we'll see a program to find the nth fibonacci number using top down approach so here you can see this is the algorithm where we need to find the nth fibonacci number and here we are also passing an integer array which will simply help us in memorizing the solutions of the sub problems and we will frequently check this integer array to see if those sub problems are solved already or not so if those sub problems are not solved we proceed ahead we solve those problems and we store it into this integer array and if the sub problems are solved already we simply reuse the solution so this memo array help us in remembering the solutions so that we can reuse those solutions if the same sub problem is encountered again does it provides the optimizations to our recursive solutions so friend as this is the recursive solutions we'll also see the demonstration using the call stack so let's say we want to calculate the fifth fibonacci number so we'll simply pass an empty array with the sizes 5 plus 1 which is 6 because we know that the indexes of array are starting from 0 and this memo table will store our fibonacci numbers from 1 to 5 so the value stored at the fifth index will be our answer so therefore we are creating an array of size 6 so in the first step it would look something like this that we have an array of size 6 having the default value is 0 and on the call stack you will see the fifth method has started its execution with the value of ns 5 and with the integer array shown here having all the values as zero so friends here you can see that as we are using the top down approach we are starting from the fifth index which is the topmost index and then we are going to the bottom in the bottom up approach we started from the zeroth index and we went till the fifth index but here we are starting from fifth index and we are going to the bottom So here we are simply checking if the value at fifth index is zero or not. So here you can see the value at fifth index is zero, which in terms of this problem, it is not solved. So the condition in if block comes out to be true, and we need to calculate this value. So first we check whether the n is less than two or not. So here you can see the value of n is five, which is not less than two. So the condition if block comes out to be false, and the else part gets executed. So here we also know that in order to calculate the fifth Fibonacci number, we need to do the sum of its two previous numbers, which is the number stored at third index and the fourth index. So in order to do that, we simply call the fifth function again, passing in the memo array. and the value is n minus 1 because we need to calculate this value and this value and then do the sum of these two values to get this value so here you can see that now this fifth function is called recursively and we are leaving this fifth function on the call stack at line number 6 so we'll simply add the line number 6 here so the later we can come to know that from which point we need to restart this fifth function so we have left this function and on the call stack there will be one more fifth function with this memo array and the value of n is 4 because we are passing n minus 1 so 5 minus 1 gives 4 so this function will be executed with n equal to 4 we check that whether value at fourth index is computed or not so we know that it is equal to 0 therefore it's not computed so then we go ahead and compute it 
फोर इज नॉट लेस देन टू सो द कंडीशन इन इफ ब्लॉक कम्स आउट टू बी फॉल्स एंड नाउ इन द एल्स ब्लॉक इफ यू वॉन्ट टू कंप्यूट द वैल्यू एट फोर्थ इंडेक्स वी नीड टू कंप्यूट द वैल्यू एट सेकेंड एंड थर्ड इंडेक्स डू देयर सम एंड गेट द वैल्यू एट फोर्थ इंडेक्स सो फ्रेंड्स यू कैन सी दैट फर्स्ट वील नीड टू कैलकुलेट द वैल्यू एट थर्ड इंडेक्स सो विल अगेन कॉल द फिफ्थ फंक्शन passing in the array and the value is n minus 1 which is 4 minus 1 equal to 3 and we also know that we have to leave this fifth function at line number 6 so we'll simply store the line number here and then the fifth function will be called again and on the call stack you can see we have left this fifth function and we have started executing this fifth function With the value of n as three, we check whether the value of three is computed or not. So here you can see the value of n is equal to zero. Therefore, it's not computed. We check whether n is less than two or not. So three is not less than two. And here, in order to calculate the value of the third Fibonacci number, we need to first calculate. the values of its two preceding numbers so we again call the fifth function passing it the integer array and the value is 3 minus 1 which is 2 and we are leaving this function at line number 6 so the fifth function will be called again with the value of n as 2 so on the call stack there will be another fifth function with the value as 2 we will see the value at second index is computed or not so here it is equal to 0 therefore it's not computed we check whether 2 is less than 2 or not so 2 is not less than 2 so we'll start executing the else part and here also in order to calculate the value at second index we need to first calculate the value of its two preceding numbers do their sum and get the value of second index so first we'll go to the n minus 1 part which is 2 minus 1 which is equal to 1 so here now fifth function will be called again so we are leaving this fifth function at line number 6 so we'll store the line number here and then fifth function will be called again with the value of n as 1 so on the call stack it would look something like this we see that value at first index is computed or not so here you can see it is equal to 0 therefore it's not computed and we proceed ahead now we check whether n is less than 2 or not so here you can see the n is less than 2 because the value of n is 1 so friends here you can see that why we have provided is if, if block so we know that the fibonacci series starts from 0 and 1 so we are simply checking that whether n is less than 2 or not if it is less than 2 we are simply storing the value of n to the memo of n so here value of n is 1 so at the first index we are storing the value as 1 so it would look something like this so 1 is stored at 1th position so after this step finally we return the value stored at first index so friends here you can see that why we are returning this value one here because we call this fifth function from this fifth function and we left at line number 6 so at line number 6 we had to calculate the value of 1 and then we have to calculate the value of n minus 2 and then do the sum of these two values to get the value at second index So therefore, we have calculated the fib of n minus one, which is one. So we are simply returning the value one from this fib function to this fib function. So it would look something like this. This fib function will be removed from the call stack, and the call will go to this fib function. And we also know that we had left at line number six. 
so we'll start executing from the line number six and whatever we return from this method will be stored in the left which is nothing but one moving ahead now here you can see that when we are executing this fifth function the value of n is two we have computed one of its previous value which is n minus one and now we have to find the value n minus two so that we can do the sum of these two values and get the value at the second index so therefore now we'll again call the fifth function to calculate the n minus 2th value so here you can see that now we are again calling fifth function and we are leaving this fifth function in line number 7 so we'll simply update the line number 7 so that we can come to know the letter that at which line we left this function so we updated the line number And now this fifth function will be called with the value as n minus 2, which is 2 minus 2, which is equal to 0. So it is called for fifth of 0. And here we check if the value at 0 index is computed or not. So it is equal to 0, therefore it's not computed. We check whether n is less than 2 or not. So 0 is less than 2. Therefore, condition if block comes out to be true. And finally, we'll store the value of n, which is 0, to this memo table as index 0. So here, as index 0, we'll simply storing the value as 0. Because we know that the Fibonacci series starts from 0 and 1. So if the value of n is less than 2, we simply store that value into its index. So now we'll simply return this value because we need to get this value here. So this fifth function will be removed from the call stack and zero will be returned from here. And we know that we had left at line number seven. So we'll start executing from the line number seven. And this fifth function has returned a value zero. So we'll store that value in the right. So 0 will be stored at the right. So friend, now you can see that in order to calculate the second Fibonacci number, we need to do the sum of its two previous numbers. So we have got the sum of its two previous number as 1 and 0. We'll do the sum of it and we'll store at the second index. So 1 plus 0 is 1. So we'll simply store the value 1 here. And then from this fifth function, we'll simply return the value stored at second index because value of n is 2, which is nothing but 1. So 1 will be returned from this method and this method will be removed from the call stack. And now we'll start executing this fifth function and we know that we had left at line number 6. So we'll start executing from the line number 6. And we also know that we had returned the value 1 from this fifth function. So 1 will be stored in the left integer variable. Moving ahead. Now we have calculated the n minus 1th value, which is this. And we need to calculate the n minus 2th value, which is this, in order to get the third Fibonacci number because value of n is 3. So we have computed one value. We need to compute the other value. So here the fifth function will be called again with the value as n minus 2, which is 3 minus 2, which is 1. And we know that we are leaving this fifth function in line number 7. So we'll simply update the line number 7 here. So the fifth function will be called again with the value of n as 1. Here now we have to calculate the value of the first Fibonacci number. So now here you can see the advantage of using this memo table. We are checking that whether value at first index has been calculated or not. 
so this sub problem has been encountered again because we have already calculated the value at first index which is 1 so by providing this simple check that whether memo of n is equal to 0 or not so we have already calculated this value so we don't have to recalculate it again here or here so therefore storing this results of the sub problems gives us an optimization over the recursion here so instead of calculating it again here we are simply returning the value stored at the first index so we are simply returning memo of 1 which is 1 so this fib function will return the value as 1 and we know that we had left at line number 7 so we'll start executing from this line and as the return value is 1 the value stored in write would be 1 and finally we can come to know the third Fibonacci number by simply doing the sum of its two preceding values which is 1 and 1 and we'll simply store that value at the third index so 1 plus 1 is 2 so we'll simply store the value 2 at the third index we move ahead and we'll simply return the value 2 from this fib function so this method will be removed from the call stack and it will go to its previous fib function which we had left at line number 6 so we'll start executing from the line number 6 and we know that we had written the value of 2 from this swift function so it will store in the left and now we'll simply calculate the fib of n minus 2 to get the value of the right part so on the call stack we are leaving this fifth function at line number 7 so we'll update the line number 7 this fifth function will be called again and on the call stack we will call fib with the value as 4 minus 4 minus 2 which is 2 moving ahead we'll simply check in this table that whether this sub problem which is fib of 2 has been solved or not so we are simply checking this memo table and we are simply checking at the second index whether the value is 0 or not so here you can see we have already solved this problem and stored its result therefore we don't have to recalculate it again so we are simply returning the value stored at the second index which is 1 and we are returning the value 1 from this fifth function to this fifth function and as we know that we had left this fifth function in line number 7 we'll start executing from the line number 7 and then we'll simply store the value written from this function which is 1 into the right variable finally we'll do some of these two numbers and we'll store it in the fourth index because in order to calculate the fourth Fibonacci number we need to do the sum of its two preceding numbers which is at index 2 and 3 stored in left and right so 2 plus 1 gives 3 so we'll simply store 3 at the fourth index and finally we'll return the value 3 from this fifth function to this fifth function and we also know that we had left this fifth function in line number 6 so we'll start executing from the line number 6 we return the value 3 from this fifth function we'll simply store it into the left integer variable 3 and now in order to calculate the fifth Fibonacci number which is our actual main problem we had calculated one of its preceding value which is n minus 1 here we just need to calculate n minus 2th value this value and then we can do the sum of its 
two values and get the solution to our main problem so here we'll again call fifth function passing in a value as n minus 2 which is 5 minus 2 equal to 3 and we are leaving this fifth function at line number 7 now so we'll update the line number 7 so this fifth function will call with the n as 3 and friends here you can see the advantage of this memo table that we have already calculated the third Fibonacci number because value stored at third index is not equal to zero therefore we don't have to recalculate it again and again using this code so finally we'll return the value stored at the third index which is 2 and we'll simply return from this method and go to its previous method And we know that we had left at line number 7. So we'll start executing from the line number 7. And as 2 is returned from this fifth call, we'll simply store it into the right integer variable. And then as we want to calculate the fifth Fibonacci number, we got the fourth Fibonacci number and the third Fibonacci number stored in left and right. We'll do its sum and we'll store at the fifth index. So three plus two gives us five. So five is stored at the fifth index. And finally, from this fifth function, we'll return the value stored at the fifth index, which is our actual answer. The fifth Fibonacci number has the value of five. So we are simply returning the value five. And this metal will be removed from the call stack. And hence our problem is solved. So friends, here you can see that we started from the top. We moved to the bottom. Therefore, it's top-down approach. And we also know that we have used this memo array, which helps us in memorizing the solutions of the sub-problems. So that those sub-problems, when encountered again, are not recalculated again. So we are simply storing those sub problems result here. And when those sub problems are encountered again, we don't have to compute it again. We simply take that value from this memo table and reuse it again. Therefore, using this memo table to our normal recursion, we are providing an optimization. And we also know that dynamic programming is nothing but the optimization to our recursive problems. So friend, in this lecture, we saw the top down approach of dynamic programming that how we can use that approach and solve a complex recursive problems efficiently. Now let's go to Eclipse and see the demonstration of this algorithm. I hope you like this video. Thanks. Have a nice day. Hello everyone. So friends, in our previous lecture, we saw the animation for the top-down approach that how we can solve the problem related to finding the Fibonacci number using dynamic programming by top-down approach. So in this lecture, we'll code the algorithm to find the nth Fibonacci number using top-down approach. So here in Eclipse, you can see that few lectures back, we saw the bottom-up approach and this approach is also a method in dynamic programming. So in this lecture, we'll see the top down approach. So first we'll create a method, which will return us back the nth Fibonacci number, which is an integer. And let's say the name of the method is fib. Now, as we discussed in our last lecture, that to this fib function, We pass in a memo array which help us in storing the solutions to the sub problems and when those sub problems are encountered again instead of recalculating it we just go to this integer array into that particular index we pick up that value and reuse it 
Thus, this integer array helps us in optimizing the recursion solutions. So, this method also takes the value of n for which we want to find the Fibonacci number. So, friend, in order to find the nth Fibonacci number, what we simply do is we simply first check that whether the memo of n is equal to 0 or not. So, what it means that we are using this array to store the Fibonacci series and as you want to calculate the nth Fibonacci number, we simply check that this array at index n is equal to 0 or not. So, if it is equal to 0, we come to know that the nth Fibonacci number has to be calculated. So, inside is if condition, we provide a if block where the condition is if n is less than 2, then what we do is we simply assign the value of n to the integer array at the index n. So, why we do this? Because we know that the first two numbers of Fibonacci series are 0 and 1 and as the array starts from 0th index, so this value will be stored at 0th index and this will be stored at the first index. So, we simply check whether n is less than 2 or not. So, if value of n is 0, then 0 is stored at 0th index and if the value of n is 1, then 1 is stored at the first index. And if n is not less than 2, then in the else part what we do is, so here we know that the Fibonacci series has property, the current number is sum of its preceding two numbers. So, based on these two properties, what we come to know that if we want to calculate the nth Fibonacci number, we need to know its two preceding numbers which is n minus 1 and n minus 2. We do its sum and we get the current number. So, here let's say current number which we want to calculate is nth number. So, what we do is, we first calculate the fib of n minus 1. So, we call this fib function recursively which we also discussed in our previous lecture. So, whatever the value it returns, we store in the left and then we again call the fib passing in the memo array and pass in n minus 2 because if you want to calculate the nth Fibonacci number, we need to know the n minus 1th Fibonacci number and n minus 2th Fibonacci number and once we know these two values, we can do their sum which is left plus right and as we know left plus right, we simply store this value at the nth index because we know that this integer array basically stores the Fibonacci numbers and as we want to calculate the nth Fibonacci number, we simply store the left plus right at the index n and finally, we return the answer which is the value stored at the nth index. So, friends here you can see that this line is very much important because because this line checks that whether the sub problem is solved again or not. So, here what we do is if the memo of n is equal to 0, we come to know that the value at the nth index is not been solved. So, what we do is we go into if block and we calculate the value of nth index and we simply store it here. And what if the memo of n is not equal to 0, then we know that we have already solved this problem. So, then we simply return 
the value stored at nth index also friends in our previous lecture we saw the animation that how this line helps us in optimizing the recursion so that we don't have to solve the sub problems again and again and as we start from the value of n and then we slowly go to the bottom by doing n minus 1 n minus 2 and then again recursively moving down therefore this approach is also known as top down approach because we start from the top and then go to the bottom and as we go to the bottom we encounter these base cases where the first two values we store as 0 and 1 and after getting these two values we build up upon the solution and finally we get the nth fibonacci number so friend now let's see the demonstration of this code in the main method so first we'll initialize the fibonacci number class and let's say we want to find the sixth fibonacci number so here the value of n would be 6 and as we are calling this fifth function we need to pass an empty array whose size would be n plus 1 which is 7 because we want to store the fibonacci numbers from 0 to 6 and finally we need to return the value at index 6 so as we are going from 0 to 6 we need to initialize the array of size 7 so we simply pass an empty array of size 6 plus 1 and if i run the code now so we get the answer as 8 because here you can see that in the array it will be stored in this format 0 1 would be the starting values then we do the sum of these two values we get this value then we do sum of 1 plus 1 we get 2 then 2 plus 1 we get 3 3 plus 2 we get 5 5 plus 3 we get 8 so friend this is how we can use dynamic programming to solve this problem to find the nth fibonacci number and using this top down approach we have solved this problem very efficiently and whatever the solution we get is highly optimized so friends i hope you like this video and in case you have any problem you can watch my previous lecture where we go through this code step by step using the animation and in our next lecture we see different problems associated with the dynamic programming thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in this video we will be looking into a problem maximum sum sub array and we will be looking into a specific algorithm which was provided by cadenz to solve this problem So before we start in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update So here in this problem we are given with an array with some random elements and it can have negative elements as well We name it usually maximum sub array sum So here in this problem what we actually do is we try to find any sub array such that if we do the sum of the elements of that sub array and whichever is the maximum sum we simply find that out so for example let's say if i take these two elements so a sub array is actually a smaller piece of array of the bigger array and the elements are contiguous so if we do sum of these two elements we will get 7 so this is one such sub array one property of sub array is that it should be contiguous so for example 2 we can't take 2 4 5 do their sum and find the maximum sum because 3 is missing so a sub array is actually a smaller array which is contiguous so here we saw that 
वन ऑफ द सब एरे हैज सम टू बी सेवन नो देर कैन बी मल्टीपल सब एरे सो वी नीड टू फाइंड द मैक्सिम सम ऑफ एनी पर्टिक्युलर सब एरे एंड वी सिंपली वॉन्ट टू रिटर्न दैट सम सो ये रोकन सी इफ यू टेक दिस सब एरे फोर थ्री माइनस टू एंड सिक्स वी विल गेट फोर प्लस थ्री माइनस टू प्लस सिक्स so it will give us 11 so this is one such sum so we try to find that whether this array has any other sub array whose sum is maximum or not so here if you see if we take this three elements 7 plus minus 1 plus 6 so it will give us 12 so it means we can discard this sum and this would be our answer so 12 is the maximum sum of any sub array so in order to find such sum the brute force way would be that we try to create each and every sub array we do their sum and we see which is the maximum sum so usually this approach is not good so there is one such algorithm which was provided by cadenz which actually traverses this array once and figures out what is the maximum sum sub array so here how we actually solve this problem is we usually create two variables current max and the best sum or maximum so far now what this two variables denote we'll see later and this algorithm we try to traverse from left to right so at the start we encounter four now what we do here is let's say if our array had only one element four so the maximum sum would have been 4 only and we would have written from this array saying that 4 is the max sum so here you can see we will be traversing this array one element at a time and let's say at this index for example we will be storing two things current max and the max so far so what this two variables denote is that at index 3 what is the current max sum and as we have traversed this array we would have encountered many sub arrays so among those sub arrays which what's the max so far or what's the best sum so these two things we keep track while traversing from left to right also when we traverse the elements one by one at each element the element usually ask two questions that should i become part of the current sub array which will give us the maximum sum or should i start my new sub array so here we'll look into the demonstration and what these two questions actually mean so here if you see at the start we encounter 4 at index 0 so 4 will ask that should i become part of the current sub array so here if you see current sub array is empty because there are no element as this is the first element only should i become part of the current sub array so that sum is maximum so at the start both these questions as there is only single element both this question correspond to the same thing if 4 becomes part of the current sub array it would be something like this or if 4 starts a new sub array it would be something like this so usually at the start the current max is 4 and it has been formed by this sub array and we simply take 4 as the max so far being formed by this sub array now we'll go to the first index so at this index 3 will decide should i become part of the current sub array so here if you see current sub array is 4 so if it becomes part of the current sub array so sub array will become 4 3 3 and sum will become 7 or it will decide that should i start a new sub array so if it decides new sub array sum will become 3 so among these two questions 3 will see that it's better to become the part of the current sub array because we are getting a maximum sum among these two sums 
so three will become part of the current sub array. So the sub array will go something like this. These two elements are there, and the current max at this point would be seven, which is being formed by four and three. So here you can see now this max so far, this seven is greater than four. So this max so far will be updated to seven. Stating that it has been formed from the elements four and three. Moving ahead, now we encounter minus two. I'll just remove this. So minus two will think should I become part of the current sub array? So if it becomes part of the current sub array, the sum would be seven. Because seven is the sum of the current sub array plus minus two, which will give it a value as five, or it will decide should I start a new sub array. So if it starts a new sub array, the sum will become minus two, because we will be discarding this sub array if we are starting a new sub array from here. So minus two sees that okay, uh, if I become part of the current sub array. The sum will be five, and if I start my own, we get minus two. So it's better to go with the current sub array and get the sum of five. So here, at this position, the sum will become five. It has been formed by four, three, and minus two. And this five is actually smaller than seven. So max so far will remain this only. It means that though we have taken up minus two into this sub array, but the sum is not actually greater than the maximum sum so far or the best sum. So the best sum will actually remain this. So let's say if we had only this three elements in the array, so the current max would have been five. And our answer would have been seven, stating that we usually take four and three, and we will get the max sum. We will discard minus two from the best sum. And also here one question arises: Why we are taking minus two into the consideration here? Why we are actually adding minus two? Because because there could be a possibility. Let's say the current number is here is six, so there could be possibility here number is thousand. If we don't take Minus two, then our current sub array will start from this because the sub array is contiguous, and if we are not taking any element, it means we are discarding the previous sub array. So the sum would have become hundred thousand if we have not included minus two. And now, if we include minus two, so here you can see the sum came out to be five, and let's suppose here would have been thousand. So we would have included thousand also and got one zero zero five, so which is much way better than thousand. Therefore, we simply include minus two based on these two questions, because we are not sure what comes after this minus two. It could be any negative value or it could have been any maximum value. So it's better to include minus two into this sub array. So now our sub array reaches like this: that it has included everything four, three, and minus two. I will remove this. So now we encounter six. So here six will decide that okay, should I become part of the current sub array? So if it becomes part of the current sub array, so the sum will become five because the sum is five plus six, which will give us eleven. Or it decides should I start a new sub array? So if it discards this previous sub array and starts a new sub array from here, so the sum will be six only. 
सो द एलिमेंट सिक्स विल डिसाइड ओके आई विल गो विद द करंट सब एरे बिकॉज दिस गिवस द मैक्सिम सम सो हियर द करंट मैक्स विल बिकम इलेवन विच विल बी द एडिशन ऑफ दिस फोर एलिमेंट्स ऑफ द सब एरे सो नाउ हियर यू कैन सी दैट दिस इलेवन एक्चुअली बीट्स सेवन सो मैक्स सो फार विल टेक द मैक्सिम सम इज इलेवन बिकॉज इट विल फिगर आउट दैट ओके नाउ आई नीड टू इंक्लूड फोर थ्री माइनस टू एंड सिक्स टूगेदर बिकॉज दिस इज गिविंग मी अ मैक्सिम सम मूविंग आइड विल रिमूव दिस सो नाउ सिक्स एज बिकम पार्ट ऑफ अवर सवेरे नाउ वी इनकाउंटर माइनस ट्वेल्व सो माइनस ट्वेल्व विल डिसाइड शुड आई बिकम पार्ट ऑफ करंट सवेरे सो द करंट सवेरे इज दिस सो इलेवन प्लस माइनस ट्वेल्व विल गिव अस माइनस वन और इट डिसाइड शुड आई स्टार्ट माई न्यू सवेरे सो इफ इट स्टार्ट इट न्यू सवेरे द सम वुड बी माइनस ट्वेल्व सो माइनस ट्वेल्व सीज दट ओके माइनस वन इज ग्रेटर देन माइनस ट्वेल्व सो इट्स बेटर आई शुड बिकम पार्ट ऑफ द करंट सवेरे सो हियर नाउ अवर करंट मैक्स बिकम माइनस वन बींग फॉर्म्ड लाइक दिस बट दिस माइनस वन इज वेरी मच लेस देन इलेवन सो मैक्स सो फॉर विल रिमेन द सेम That let's suppose if our array would have ended here, so the answer would have been eleven, which is being formed from the elements four, three, minus two, and six. So this is the significance of max so far. It keeps a track of the maximum sum of any subarray so far. So I'll just simply remove this. And here, minus twelve comes with the current subarray. Now we encounter seven. So seven will ask, should I become part of the current subarray? So it sees the current subarray is this, and its sum is minus one. So minus one plus seven will give us six. Or it decides, should I start my own new subarray? So if it starts its own new subarray, it has to discard this subarray. And if it starts a new subarray from here, like this, so the sum will be seven. So this element thinks that okay, I should not go with the current subarray because it is giving a sum only six. But if I start my own, it will be a maximum sum of seven. So here is the critical step where the current element decides that okay, I won't go with the current subarray. I will start my own subarray. Which is a new subarray. So here we simply discard this subarray because current max will now be seven, and it will be formed by only digit seven. But this seven is less than eleven, so the max so far will remain the same. So now this subarray is actually discarded, and a new subarray will start from seven. So now we encounter minus one. So minus one decides that okay, should I become part of the current subarray? So seven plus minus one will give six. Or should I start my own subarray? So the sum will be minus one if it starts its own subarray. So it decides that okay, I will be part of the current subarray because it is giving me a maximum sum. So here, now our current max will become six because minus one has decided to go with the current subarray. Seven comma minus one. Okay, but this six is less than eleven. So our max so far will still remain the same. Now 
मुविंग अहेड सो नाउ अवर सबेर हैज टू एलिमेंट सेवन एंड माइनस वन सो नाउ द लास्ट एलिमेंट कम्स विच इज सिक्स सो सिक्स आज शुड है बिकम पार्ट ऑफ करंट सब एरे सो सिक्स प्लस दिस सिक्स विल गिव सम एज ट्वेल्व और शुड है स्टार्ट ए न्यू सब एरे सो इफ इट स्टार्ट ए न्यू सब एरे द सम विल बी सिक्स सो दिस सिक्स डिसाइड इज ओके आई विल गो विथ द करंट सब एरे बिकॉज इट इज गिविंग मी ए मैक्सिमम सम इफ आई कंपेयर दिस टू वैल्यूज सो हियर नाउ करंट सम विल बिकम ट्वेल्व सेवन माइनस वन सिक्स सो दिस विल बी इंक्लूडेड लाइक दिस एंड नाउ यू कैन सी ट्वेल्व इज एक्चुअली ग्रेटर देन द मैक्स सम सो फार सो मैक्स सो फार विल सी दैट ओके आई नीड टू नाउ डिस्कार्ड दिस बिकॉज वी ए फाउंड वन मोर सब एरे सम इज एक्चुअली मैक्सिमम फ्रॉम द करंट मैक्स सो फार विच इज ट्वेल्व formed by 7 minus 1 and 6 and here there are no more elements left so the answer would be our max so far which is 12 so this will get written so friends in this video we saw that how we can solve the maximum sum सबेरे प्रॉब्लम यूजिंग कडेन्स अल्गोरिथम इन अवर नेक्स्ट वीडियो वी विल एक्चुअली सी द डेमोन्स्ट्रेशन ऑफ द अल्गोरिथम स्टेप बाय स्टेप दैट हाउ वी कैन यूज द कोड एंड कम अप विद दिस लॉजिक वी विल सी इट वाय एन एनिमेशन इन अवर अपकमिंग वीडियो आई होप यू मस्ट हैव लाइक दिस वीडियो एंड इन केस इफ यू आर न्यू टू माई चैनल देन प्लीज सब्सक्राइब टू माई चैनल थैंक्स हैव अ नाइस डे Hello everyone. So in our previous video, we discussed about the idea behind how the Cadence algorithm work in finding the maximum sum sub array. So in our previous video, we actually discussed the idea behind the algorithm. We saw that how current max and max so far, or the best sum, help us in determining the maximum sum sub array in this given array. And we also saw that we traverse the array. and on each element the element decides that should it be part of the current sub array or should it start a new sub array so now let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step so here you can see that we have been provided with an algorithm which is the cadence algorithm so usually the method name is max sub array sum it takes in an integer array and finds us a maximum sum for any sub array in this array So let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step. So before we start, in case if you are new to my channel, then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update. So at the start, let's say we provide an array as what we discussed in our previous example. So usually at the start, the first element. is simply taken as max so far and the current max so max so far is 4 this value and current max also becomes 4 now the algorithm basically starts with second element so here i starts from 1 and goes till array dot length so here array dot length is 8 so i will travel from 1 to 7 because 7 is less than 8 now on this point 3 has two choices either it should become the part of the current sub array so the current sub array is this or it should start its new sub array so as we discussed in our previous slide what we do is we take current max and we add the value stored at the index of i and we assign it to the current max 
so here we are simply taking the current element value and we are adding it with the current max and assigning it to the current max so it means 3 decided to go with the 4 it means 4 plus 3 will give us 7 so 7 is assigned to the current max so current max becomes 7 now why we directly assigned it because in the next step this current max is actually compared with the with the elements value so this is our second question that should I start my new sub array here this part was where element decides to go with the current sub array and in this if block there is our second question that should I start my new sub array so if current max is less than the value of the current element then we simply assign this value to the current max so here 7 is compared with 3 because array of i is 3 so whichever is the bigger value is simply assigned to the current max so 7 is the bigger value among these two values so current max remains the same so friends here you can see that when element decides to be a part of current sub array we simply add it to the current max and here we are simply assigning it to the current max because in the next step we will reassign it if current max is less than the current element value which means that 3 has decided to create its own sub array so this is actually our question 1 and this is actually question 2 so, so whichever wins that value is assigned to the current max and if this condition comes out to be false then we do nothing with the current max because we have already assigned current max plus array of i to current max which is 4 plus 3 equal to 7 to current max so now this value is included in the sub array so the current max is 7 being formed from the sub array 4 comma 3 which is these two elements and now we'll simply compare this sum current max sum with the maximum sum so far so if max so far is less than current max we simply assign the current max value to the max so far because current max actually beats the maximum sum so far so here max so far is 4 and current max is 7 so this condition comes out to be true and max so far becomes 7 so here this is current max and this is max so far so at the start it was 4 then it became 7 taking in 4 comma 3 moving ahead now we'll increment i by 1 so i points to the second index now this minus 2 has two questions that should I become part of the current sub array so we simply take their sum current max plus array of i it means we are including array of i so here it will become 7 which is the current max plus minus 2 so 7 which will give us 5 so current max will become 5 and then this element simply asks that okay can I start my own sub array so this check actually decides that that if current max which is 5 so if it is less than array of i value which is minus 2 so array of i value is simply assigned to current max so currently so this condition comes out to be false because 5 is greater than minus 2 then we simply check whether max so far is less than current max or not so why we are doing this check is we are simply keeping the track of the maximum sum so far so if at any step current max becomes greater than max so far it means we have found the maximum sum so far so we simply assign current max to max so far so as of now max so far is 7 and current max is 5 therefore this condition comes out to be false because 7 is not less than 5 so here the current max will become 5 
taking in 4, 3 and minus 2 and max so far will remain same. So now we'll increment i and here you can see this element has been included in the current max subarray. So friends here you can see as we know that each element asks two questions whether it should become part of the current subarray by simply adding its value to the current max or they decide to create their own subarray. So this piece of code decides that. So you can also think this piece of code as something like current max equals. We can also write something as math dot max and the two values would be current max plus array of i or array of i. So whichever is the maximum value we simply assign to the current max. So this is question 1 and this is question 2. That should I become part of the current subarray? If that is maximum, that value is assigned to the current max. Or if element decides to create its own subarray, so it's simply its value is assigned to the current max. So either we can do this or we can do this. That first we directly assign current max plus array of i value to current max and then with this if block we reassign the array of i value to current max if the value at i index is actually greater than the current max. So it means this value is greater than current max plus array of i. So this value will be assigned or else we have already assigned this value to current max here. So now value at i index is 6. So we simply assign 5. plus 6 which is 11 to current max. So current max becomes 11. And then we simply decide that whether current max which is 11 is less than the value 6 or not. So if it is less than 6 then we simply reassign current max to the array value at add index. So this condition comes out to be false because 11 is greater than 6. So here 11 is our current max. We have taken these four values. Now we'll simply compare that whether the maximum sum so far is less than current max or not. So here you can see 7 is less than 11. It means we have found a new max so far. So we simply update current max to max so far. So it becomes 11, 4, 3, minus 2 and 6. So it means we have found a subarray of max sum as 11 having these 4 elements. So now we'll continue with the rest of the elements. We'll increment i. So i will now point to the fourth index. So here array of i is minus 12. So here we are simply adding current max which is 11. It will give us minus 1. So current max will become minus 1. And then this element will decide that can I start my own subarray. So it will compare its value which is this part with the current max which is minus 1. So minus 1 is greater than minus 12. So this condition comes out to be false. And the current max which is minus 1 is actually less than max so far. So this if condition also will come out to be false. So max so far will remain 11 which makes sense because a subarray whose maximum sum is 11 is being found from these four elements. So here we simply write 11 only 4, 3, minus 2 and 6. 
moving ahead so here minus 12 has been included in the current sub array I will now point to index 5. Current max will become minus 1 plus 7, which is 6. So, this is the part when array of i decides to go with the current max. And then it checks, okay, can I start my own sub array? Because my own value is 7 but if I go with the current sub array the current max is 6 so therefore it decides that it's better I create my own sub array because if I create my own sub array I will give a sum of 7 and if I go with the current sub array the sum will be 6 so therefore this condition decides that the current max is 6 and it is actually less than 7. So the current max will become 7 by simply assigning array of i to current max, which signifies that 7 has decided to go and create its own new sub array. So current max becomes 7. So now this sub array will be removed. And from here, a new sub array will start and here we will simply denote 7 by taking in only 7 and this current max doesn't beats the max so far so this condition comes out to be false now we'll go to the next element which is minus 1 So here minus 1 will be added to the current max. It will give 6. So current max will become 6 now. And now this minus 1 will see that if I become part of the current sub array which is this. I am getting sum as 6. If I start my own sub array. I will get sum as minus 1 because because this is the only element so it sees that okay it's better to go with the current sub array so this condition comes out to be false because current max which is 6 is actually greater than minus 1 so here now our current max is 6 taking in 7 and minus 1 together now this 6 doesn't beats the 11 so it remains the same now we'll increment i so now i will point to the seventh index and here this current sub array has included minus 1 with it Now we will simply add the value 6 which is this value with the current max. So 6 plus 6 is 12. So current max will become 12. And this 6 also checks that if I start a new sub array from here what's the sum. So this is the only element so sum is 6. So it doesn't beats the actual current max. So this 6 decides to go with the current sub array by adding itself to the current max. So this condition comes out to be false because current max is 12 and it is greater than 6. So now this element is included in the current sub array. So the current max is 12 taking in 7, minus 1 and 6. And here you can see that this current max 12 actually beats the max so far. So this condition comes out to be true because max so far is less than current max. So it means we simply update the max so far which is 12. 
so this value is assigned to the max so far stating that this sum was made from this sub array it becomes 12 will increment i so this for loop will exit because now value of i is 8 and 8 is not less than array dot length it is equal to array dot length so it means we have traversed this array completely and at the last we will simply return 12 because this is the maximum sum so far created by a sub array this 7 minus 1 and 6 So this 12 is returned. So friends, here we saw that there was one sub array 4, 3, minus 2 and 6, which actually gave the sum as 11. So this sub array was max so far for most of the time. And at the end, this sub array whose total sum came out to be 12 became the max so far. So 7, minus 1 and 6, which gave the sum as 12, was the maximum sub array sum, which we finally returned from this method. So friend, this is how the cadence algorithm work. So here one more question arises that why we are actually taking in the negative values in the current max, like we did here. We included minus 2 and the current max became 5 from 7. Because here you can see that current max value is 5 after including minus 2. If this value would have been let's say 1000. So in the next iteration, if we have included 1000, we would have got 1005 because we will be adding 5 to 1000. But if we would have discarded this value, so from this part, a new sub array would have been started which only would have given 1000 so we are not sure what next element is coming up so therefore we have included minus 2 because this value is less than this value so therefore we have included minus 2 also because we are not sure what is coming up there could be a very large maximum value which would have raised this sum to 1005 and if we would have discarded minus 2, so this sub array would have been ended here and a new sub array would have started here, which only could have given a sum as 1000. I hope you must have liked this video. And in case if you are new to my channel, then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update. Thanks, have a nice day. Hello everyone. So in our previous video, we saw that how cadence algorithm help us in finding the maximum sum of a sub array in a given array. We saw the demonstration of the algorithm step by step. Now in this video we will actually code the algorithm and will test its working in the main method. So if you want to understand the algorithm more, you watch the previous videos to this where the algorithm is being explained in a very detailed manner. So let's see the code of the cadence algorithm. So before we start, in case if you are new to my channel, then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update. So here we will be creating one method as public static. We'll give it a name as max sub array sum. So this method will take in an array and will return the maximum sum of any sub array. So its return type is integer. So here code wise this algorithm is simple but to actually understand the concept behind it is very much complex and you can watch my previous videos to it to understand more. So in this algorithm we simply create two variables. One is current max and we simply assign the first value to it which is the value stored at 0th index. 
and the other variable is max so far we also assign it a value of what the first element is holding so here we are assuming that array has at least one element so the algorithm basically starts from second element from i equal to 1 and i goes from 1 to array dot length so in our previous video we discussed that when we are encountering the current element this current element basically asks two questions that should I be part of the current subarray which is the current max or should I start my own subarray so these two questions basically decides what will be the value of current max so at the start we simply assign array of i to current max so this is the question one where the element becomes part of current sub array so here we have taken the sum of current max and the value of the array at ith index so this satisfied question one and we simply assign it to current max so in the next step we can't directly go with the current max value with this sum this element will also ask a question that can i start my own sub array by taking my own value so here we simply compare current max with array of i so if array of i is greater than this current max so it means that this element has started its own sub array because this value has been assigned to current max so here this is the question 2 where element decides to start its own sub array so after evaluating the current max what we do is we compare it with max so far so if this current max beats our max so far so we simply assign current max to max so far so friends you can watch my previous video to understand more about this logic that usually at each iteration we ask these two questions and based on these two questions current max value is decided and if this current max value is greater than max so far so we simply assign current max to max so far and at the end we simply return max so far because after this while loop will terminate whatever the value max so far is holding it decides the maximum sum of any sub array in this array so now let's test its working in the main method so this is the array which we discussed in our previous video as well in the slide here we'll simply call max sub array sum method we pass in the array and if i run the main method so here you can see it return the maximum sum as 12 so which is being found by this sub array 7 minus 1 and 6 if we add all of these three values we'll get sum as 12 so friend this was all about the cadence algorithm I hope you must have liked this video. In case if you are new to my channel, then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update. Thanks, have a nice day. Hello friends, welcome to my new data structures and algorithm in Java tutorial series video. Friends, in this tutorial we will discuss the famous two sum problem in Java. 
so here the problem is something like we are given an array of integers and we need to return the indices of the two numbers such that they add up to a specific target so if we take an example then let's say we have this array of integers 2 11 5 10 7 8 10. and let's say we are given a target as 9 so we need to return the indices of two numbers such that they add up to this target so here the problem states that we need to find two such numbers into this complete array which will add up to the target so if you take the above example then the solution would be the element at 0th position is 2 and the element at 4th position which is 7 so they add up to the target so we need to return the indices of it so we need to return 0 and 4 so 0 is the index position for the number 2 and 4 is the index position for the number 7 so let's move ahead and see the demo of the algorithm so friends let's say we are given the array of integers and we are denoting it with the variable name as numbers so here the array elements are 2, 11, 5, 10, 7, 8 which we saw in the previous slide and below are the index position of it and if you see the below is the algorithm for finding two such numbers which add to make a specific target now let's say we are given a target as 9 and we want to find two such numbers which add to make the number as 9 so we know that 2 and 7 make up to 9 so in order to find those two numbers the below is the algorithm for it so let's quickly see the demo of it so as we need to return the indices of it we will store it in the integer array of having two elements so we need to return the indices of two such numbers so we'll store it into the result array so it would be something like this so first we'll create a hash map we'll see what the significance of this hash map is so here we are encountering a for loop which traverses the complete array so in the first iteration i value is 0 and numbers dot length is 6 because, because we have the 6 integers as 2 11 5 10 7 8 so we'll traverse this array from 0th index to 5th index and currently for the first iteration i points to 0 so i would be pointing to the 0th index of the numbers array so friends the basic idea behind this algorithm is like we will traverse each element one by one and we'll store the element into hash map with its index value so that on traversing this complete array we'll take a particular number we'll subtract it from this target and we'll find that whether this contains in the map or not so instead of adding these two numbers and making it to a target we'll just subtract that particular number from the target and we'll look up into this hash map and we'll see whether that particular number is there or not so let's see how it works so here if you see we have this target is 9 and we have this number at i position which is number at i position is 2 so what we'll do we'll just check whether the, our map contains 9 minus 2 which is 7 into this hash map or not so currently the map dot contains key will comes comes out to be false because the hash map is empty and if you do a reverse of it then this condition in if statement comes out to be true therefore what we'll do we'll just put the number at ith position along with its index so moving ahead now i becomes 1 and if you see the i points to the index at first position and also 1 is less than 6 therefore this for loop will be executed so now we'll again check whether target which is 9 and we'll subtract the number at ith position so if we subtract 11 from 9 we'll get minus 2 and we'll check whether minus 2 is a key in this hash map or not so currently minus 2 is not a key into this hash map therefore this condition map dot contains key comes out to be false 
and the if you make a reverse of it then it then the if condition comes out to be true therefore the if statement will be executed and we'll simply put the number at ith position along with an index value so we'll put 11 and 1 so 11 is the number at ith position and value is the index position which is 1 so basically friends we are putting these numbers so that we can have a quick lookup into this hash map and we can come to know that whether, whether there is a number whose addition with this current number will make the target as 9 so moving ahead so now i becomes 2 and it will point to the second index of the array so we'll again check whether target which is 9 minus number at ith position so number at ith position is 5 so we'll check whether 9 minus 5 which is 4 is present in this hash map or not so number 4 is not present in the hash map therefore this condition map dot contains key comes out to be false and if we do the reverse of it it comes out to be true so the if condition comes out to be true and we'll simply put the number at the position along with the index value in the hash map so we'll store 5 with 2 so 5 is the number at the position which is 2 and 2 is the index value moving ahead now i becomes 3 so i will point at the third index and we'll again check whether map contains target minus number at ith position so target is 9 and number at ith position is 10 so we'll check whether 9 minus 10 which is minus 1 is there in the hash map or not so currently it's not there so map dot contains key comes out to be false and if we do the reverse of it it comes out to be true so if block gets executed and we'll simply put the number at ith position and the index value in the hash map so we are storing 10 along with this index value I'm moving ahead so now i becomes 4 and here it points to the fourth index now friends we'll again check whether map dot contains key target minus number at ith position so target is 9 and number at ith position is 7 so we'll just check whether 9 minus 7 which is 2 present in the hash map or not so if you see when we do 9 minus 7 it comes out to be 2 and 2 is present in the hash map so it means that the first number is 7 and the other number is 2 so when we do 2 plus 7 we'll get 9 so it's like a fast lookup into the hash map so currently 9 minus 7 which is 2 is present in the hash map therefore the map dot contains it comes out to be true and the uh, and if we do a reverse of it it comes out to be false so it means we have found our two numbers which will add up to make a specific target and now as you want to return the indices of those two values so first indices would be the current value of i because 7 is one of the number so we'll store the index value and the result array at the first position moving ahead and we need to store the index of the number 2 so what we'll do we'll just do a map dot get target minus number at ith position so we are simply doing 9 minus number at ith position which is 7 so 9 minus 7 which comes out to be 2 and we are passing the key as 2 and we are getting the value out of it from the hash map so it comes out to be 0 and we are storing it into the result array so these are the two indices which we found which is 0 and 4 and finally we'll just return the result so friend this was the one of the way by which we can find the two numbers whose sum makes up to a specific target value and suppose if you don't find any number then we can simply 
either return a result array having the indices at 0 0 or we can throw an exception like illegal argument exception so friends this was the demo of the algorithm now let's go to eclipse and see the working code so friends let's code the algorithm what we saw in the slide so here I have just created one class by name to sum and it has one method the main method so let's say I give the method name as public static to sum so the return type is the integer array because it will return back as the indices of the two numbers and the method takes in an integer array which is the numbers array and it also takes an integer by name target so in this method first we'll create a result array so this result array will store the indices of the two numbers and then we'll create a hash map which will store the integers as key value pair so map so we can simply give the name as map new hash map we'll just import it now we'll create the for loop so we'll iterate the complete array from 0 to numbers dot length so this will basically iterate the each and every element in the numbers array so in the for loop our first condition would be if map dot contains key and here will provide target minus numbers at the eighth position so we'll just we'll we'll just check whether the map contains the target minus number at the eighth position key and if it doesn't contain then we'll simply put map dot put the number set ith position with its index value and in the else now the else part will come when we have found the two numbers so we'll just populate the result array say at one we'll put the index and at zeroth position we'll put map dot get target minus numbers at ith position and finally we'll just return the result and if suppose we haven't found the two numbers then we can either throw an exception okay. we can throw an exception say illegal argument exception the string is two numbers not found so friend this is the code for finding the two numbers which add up to make a specific target now let's see is working in this main method so here first we'll create the numbers array so I will populate the values I had given in the slide 2, 11, 5, 10, 7 and 8 now as and result array will be written therefore created integer array variable by name result and I will just call 
टू सब मेथड बाई प्रोवाइडिंग द नंबर सेरे एंड लेट से वी गिव टारगेट एज नाइन एंड लेट से वी प्रिंट बोथ द इंडेस इज सो द टू इंडेस आर रिजल्ट जीरो प्लस रिजल्ट एट वन पोजिशन सो फ्रेंड्स लेट्स रन दिस जावा कोड सो फ्रेंड्स यू सी द टू इंडेक्स आर जीरो एंड फोर सो एट जीरो विल विल फाइंड अ नंबर हैविंग द वैल्यू इज टू एंड एट इंडेक्स फोर वी एव फाउंड सेवन सो इफ वी एट टू एंड सेवन वी गेट द वैल्यू इज नाइन so friend this was a tutorial about two sum problem i hope you like this video please like comment share and subscribe my youtube channel thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in this video we will be discussing about the two sum problem in java so in one of our previous video we have actually seen the solution to two sum problem where we used a hash map so in this video we will be looking into yet another approach to solve the two sum problem so before we start in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update so here if you see we are given an array of integers let's say having different values 2 11 5 10 7 8 now the integers in this array are not repeated and we are also given a target let's say 9 so in this problem we have to write a function where this array and this target will be given and we want to return a pair of numbers such that they add up to a specific target which is 9 so here if you see 2 plus 7 will give the value as 9 which is equal to our target so we need to simply return 2 and 7 in a form of integer array so let's move ahead and see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step so here's the algorithm which we will be using to find the pair of number which is equal to our target so the method name is two sum it is taking in an array and a target and it is returning an integer array so at the first step we usually call two sum method by passing in the array and the target is 9 so this method will start its execution this is the array having values as 11 2 0 10 7 6 so these are six elements from index 0 to 5 and the target we are providing it as 9 so we want to find a pair of number such that if we sum them we get the value 9 moving ahead so here if you see as this numbers are in random order so in order to find the pair 2 and 7 which will be resulting to our target we have to compare each element of this array to another element but doing so will be the time consuming algorithm so what we do in the first step is we try to sort this array we will see its significance later so after we sort this array here you can see the elements are arranged in ascending order 0 2 6 7 10 11 moving ahead now we'll see the significance that why we sorted this array so in order to solve this problem what we actually do is we actually take two pointers one is the left pointer and one is the right pointer so the left pointer usually points to index 0 and the right pointer usually points to the last index of this array so here if you see we will be creating a variable left we'll assign a value 0 to it 
so this zero signifies the index so it would look something like this that left is pointing to index zero moving ahead we will create a right variable we will assign the value as array dot length minus one so if you see array dot length value is six and if we do minus one we will get five so right will point to fifth index moving ahead now what we do is as we want to return the pair so we create a result array which will only take two values so this is the result array so by default the values will be 0 0 because we are taking the integer array moving ahead now here we actually did two things first we sorted the array in ascending order then we created two pointers left and right now what we do is we provide a while loop and inside this while loop we provide a condition as left should be less than right so here if you see left is at 0th index and right is at 5th index so left is less than right now using these two pointers what we do is we try to find out the pair so first number will be denoted by left and second number will be denoted by right so these two pointers will help us in pointing both the pairs so the condition is left should be less than right in the while loop so at the start this while loop will execute because left is less than right now at the first step what we do is we take the value associated with the left pointer and with the right pointer and as we want to find the pair sum we usually do their sum so here if you see we do 11 plus 0 which will give us 11 so sum will be 11 now what we do is we try to compare our sum with target to simply check that whether sum is equal to target or not so here if you see target is 9 and our sum is 11 so 11 is not equal to 9 it means this is not a valid sum so basically when we do this comparison there are three possibilities sum is equal to target sum is less than target or sum is greater than target so sum is not equal to target so the else part will be executed and now here we will be checking whether sum is less than target or not so here if you see sum is 11 and target is 9 so 11 is not less than target now why we have provided this condition is because so here if you see that when we sorted this array in ascending order now the advantage will come into picture at these two steps so if 11 is not equal to 9 which means sum is not equal to target so there are two possibilities either sum is less than target or sum is greater than target so here currently 11 is greater than target and as we have this array in sorted form in ascending order we know that we need to reduce this sum by 2 or whatever value so that it is equal to 9 so we have two choices either we traverse left this side or we go right this side so here you can see if we go left this side we will get a value greater than 0 and if we go in this direction to right we will get a value which is lesser than 11 and we want to reduce this sum so here we can't go in this direction by moving left to this position because in the next iteration when we will do sum we will get 11 plus 2 which will give us 13 2 and 11 will give us 13 and 13 is way more far than 9 so we have only one choice to make that we reduce the sum by moving right into this direction so here these are the two checks which we perform so sum less than target so this condition comes out to be false because sum value is 11 and target is 9 so the else part will be executed where you will see the significance that why we are doing right minus minus because we need to shift right to this position which means 
from fifth index we need to move to fourth index so we'll simply decrement value of right so it would look something like this right becomes 4 and now it will point to the fourth index i'll simply remove this now again our execution point will reach here we will check whether left is less than right or not so left is less than right so the while loop will execute we will again calculate the sum by taking in the values at left and at right pointers. So now our values would be 0 plus 10. So these are the values. It will give us a value of 10. So sum will become 10 now. We will compare sum to the target. So here we can see that sum is not equal to target. So the else part will be executed. We will again check whether sum is less than target or not. So here you can see 10 is greater than 9. So therefore this if condition will come out to be false. Because we can't move left to right because if we move left to right then we'll get a value which will be more than 9 which is like 10 plus 2 which will give us 12 which will make us more far from the target. So what we do is we simply shift right by decrementing it by one position because we know that as the array is sorted if we move right to this position we will get a number lesser than 10. So the else part will be executed. Now right will point to 3 which is the third index. We'll again check in the while loop whether left is less than right or not. So left is less than right. We'll again do the sum. So this time it would be 0 plus 7 which will give us value 7. So sum becomes 7. We compare sum with the target. So sum is not equal to target. Now again our else block will be executed. So here you can see now that sum is actually less than target. So initially sum was actually greater than target so we moved right pointer in this direction because we wanted to decrease the actual sum but now sum is actually less than target. So what we need to do is if we move right again to this point so when this while loop will execute again we will get 6 plus 0 which is like we are going to a more lesser value than target. So if sum is less than target, we need to increase the sum so that we reach the target. So the only way we can increase the sum is by moving left to this point because we know that here its value is 0 and this array is in ascending order. So whatever value we'll get after that will be greater than 0. So this condition is for that. So else if part will be executed and we'll simply increment left by one position. So left becomes 1. Now it will point to the first index. Moving ahead. We will check whether left is less than right or not. So left is less than right. We will take their sum at their respective indexes. So it will be 2 plus 7 which is 9. So sum will become 9. So friends here you can see now sum is equal to target. So it means we have reached to a point where we can simply return this pair because we have found a pair whose sum is equal to our target. So this if block will be executed because this condition came out to be true. So in the if part what we do is one value is 2. So we'll simply assign the value stored at left pointer to the zeroth index of the result. So this 2 will come here and then we'll simply assign the value stored as right pointer to the first index of result. So here 7 will come to the first index. So we have found our pair which is if we do the sum of 2 plus 7 we will get 9 which is the value equal to our target. 
So at the last step, we will simply return the result integer array. So friends, here you saw the significance that why we sorted the array. Because if the array is not sorted, then we need to compare each element with every other element. So this would have given us a time complexity of O of n square, which is a not a good time complexity. So we actually sorted the array so that we know that the first element is the smallest and the last element is the largest. So when we do the sorting, we usually go to n log n time complexity and then using this while loop, we simply do one iteration and we find the pair using this two pointers. Because as the numbers are sorted, left starts from here and right starts from here. And then we simply take these values stored at right and the left pointer. We do their sum and we try to compare it with our target. So if the sum is less than target, what we do is we simply shift left by one position. We simply moved right to this direction by incrementing or decrementing respective variables. So friends, I hope you have liked this video. In case if you are new to my channel, then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update. Thanks, have a nice day. Hello everyone. So in our previous video, we saw an animation that how we can solve the two sum problem in Java. Now in this video, we will actually code the algorithm and we will test its working in main method. So before we start, in case if you are new to my channel, then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update. So here you can see that I have created one class as array util. And in one of our previous video, we saw the two sum problem. In that video, we discussed one of the solution to solve the two sum problem. We basically took the help of a hash map and we solved the problem. Now in this video, we will see one more way to solve this problem. So let's suppose I create one method here as public static to sum to because we are discussing the second approach here. So this method will take in an array where we will be provided with different numbers and those numbers will be unique and we will be also provided with a target and usually there will be one such pair which will be equal to the target. So we need to find that pair and after finding that pair we will simply return it in the form of an array of length 2. So in our previous video we discussed that how we can solve this problem. We took the help of sorting and two pointer approach. So the first step we do is we sort the array. So using arrays dot sort, we will pass in the array. So we'll get the sorted array. So here you can see this arrays class in Java has a sort method where if we provide the array, we get the sorted array in ascending order. So here you can use your own sorting algorithm or we can use the sorting algorithm provided by Java. Now after sorting this array, what we'll do is we create two pointers. One is the left pointer, which starts from 0th index of this array. And one is the right index, which usually start from the end of the array. So if you want to know the last index of an array, what we can do is we'll simply call array dot length. So this will give us complete length. And if we do minus one, we'll get that particular index because array starts from zero index and goes to 
array dot length minus one index. Now after creating these two pointers, as we want to return the pair of numbers whose sum is equal to target, we will create an array. We'll name it as result, and this array will be of size two because it will take two numbers. Now after creating this array, we have these two variables left and right. Now these two variables will help us in finding that pair of numbers whose sum is equal to the target. Now here we will provide a while loop, and as left starting from zeroth index and right is starting from the last index, this while loop will go on till left is less than right. If left becomes right, then we'll simply break from this while loop. So in the while loop, what we'll do is we'll first calculate the sum of the values stored in the left and the right index. So we'll do array of left plus array of right. Now in our previous video, we discussed that after calculating the sum. we try to compare it with the target so there are basically three possibilities so the first possibility is if sum is equal to target it means we have found our target and we'll simply store the both the values array of left and array of right into this result and we'll simply return the result so here what we'll do is result at the zeroth index we'll simply store array of left and at the first index we'll store array of right because these two are the numbers when we did the sum of it it became equal to our target so we are storing both these values into the result array and here we are simply returning result now this is the first condition when sum is equal to target there could be two more condition that sum could be less than target or sum could be greater than target so friends here is the significance that why we actually sorted the array if our sum is less than the target then what we do is we need to increase our sum in the next iteration so here we simply increment left by one position so let's say if, if i take this example here let's say the sorted array comes out to be 0 2 6 7 10 11 so here you can see left will be pointing to 0 and right would be pointing to 11 so if we do sum of it we will get values 11 and let's say our target we want is 9 so here we know that 0 plus 11 which is our sum is greater than target so what we do is we need to reduce the sum so we have two possibilities either we traverse left towards the second value or we can traverse right towards the second last value so here currently sum is 11 but if we traverse left to the second position in the next iteration our sum will become 2 plus 11 which will give us 13 so we are going way more far than the target so here our only possibility is we move right to the second last position because in the next iteration if we do the sum we will get 10 plus 0 which would be 10 so 10 is pretty much close to the target so these are the if else provided for that so if sum is less than target then we need to increase the sum so that it matches target and the only way to increase the sum is by incrementing left so that left can go to the higher values and if sum is greater than target then we need to reduce the sum so for that what we need to do is we need to decrement right because as the array is sorted if right is pointing here 
let's say to 11 if it goes to the second last position we will get a value which is lesser than 11 so here we'll do write minus minus so after this while loop will terminate what we can do is we can simply return a dummy integer array or we can throw an exception like we did here the two numbers not found so now let's test it's working in the main method so let's suppose we are provided with this array and here what we do is we simply call to sum we pass in the array and let's say we pass in the target as 9 and we'll simply print the array so if I run the main method now so here you can see it returned two values 2 and 7 so if we do 2 plus 7 we will get our target as 9 so friend this was all about solving two sum problem using the sorting and two pointer technique I hope you must have liked this video. In case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel. Thanks have a nice day. Hello everyone. So in this video we will be discussing is subsequence problem in Java. So first we will see what is a subsequence. So before we start. In case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update. So usually a subsequence of a string is actually a new string which is formed from the original string only and how it is formed by deleting some or no characters and only thing to keep in mind is we should not change the order of the remaining characters so what it means now let's see via example let's suppose we are given with the original string a b c d e and we are given a sequence a c e now we have to find whether a c e is a subsequence of a b c d e or not so here you can see if we delete b and d and we don't change the order of the remaining elements we actually get a c and e so therefore a c e is a subsequence of a b c d e if we look into a e c so it is not a subsequence of a b c d e so here a e c is present in a b c d e but if we remove b and d the remaining characters doesn't form A, E, C. It actually forms A, C and E. So the only thing we need to keep in mind is the order of the elements shouldn't get changed. So here C is actually coming before E. But here E is coming before C. So therefore the order of the element has changed. So therefore A, E, C is not a subsequence of A, B, C, D, E. Now if suppose we were given a string is a b c d e so here you can see by deleting some or no characters so if we were given this string this string also is a subsequence of a b c d e because we are not removing any characters and we will be getting the same string back so this is a subsequence of a b c d e So one other way to look into subsequences, we simply see in this direction in both the string and we see whether those characters come into this order only or not. So here first we encounter A and here we see we have got A. So we move ahead. Now we see C. So here is B. So we simply move ahead. We encounter C. So we simply move ahead, we see E and here we see D. 
so we simply discard it and we move ahead and at the last we find e so therefore ace is a subsequence of a b c d e now here we see a a so we move ahead we go to e we go to b so these two are not equal so we discard it we go here we see e and c we discard this we go here we find d and e we discard this we come here we find e so e and e matches so now we move here but here you can see complete string is exhausted and there are no more elements therefore we come to a conclusion that a e c is not a subsequence of a b c d e so we will be applying this similar algorithm to solve this problem so here you can see this is the algorithm where we will be provided with the original string and a sequence we need to simply find out whether this sequence is actually a subsequence of this string or not so let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step so we'll call this subsequence method by passing in two strings one is the original string and other is the sequence and here you can see the return type of this method is boolean so we will either return true or false so at the first step a b c d e is our string and the sequence is a c e so we are figuring out whether a c e is subsequence of a b c d e or not so this is our original string and this is the sequence so here you can see that we have represented a string in a form of a character array so in java string class has this method character at where we pass in an index and we get a particular character present at particular index so if we pass 1 we will get the character as b so we can use this method to simply get a particular character at a particular index we can also use to char array method which actually gives us the character array and then we can perform our logic on this character array but here i will be simply using this char at method and we will see the string in a form of a character array moving ahead now what we discussed in our previous slide that we simply look into this direction in both the string so for that we create two pointers i and j so i will simply traverse into the original string and j will traverse into the sequence now we want to simply check whether a c e is present in this particular order into a b c d e or not so for that we have provided a while loop where the condition is this while loop will continue till i is less than string's length so here string length is 5 and j should be less than sequence length so here i will be traveling from 0 to 4 and j will be traveling from 0 to 2 because the length of the sequence is 3 so this is the condition we need to keep in mind so why we have provided this condition is i should be less than string dot length is so if i goes beyond the length of the string then we need to break from this while loop because there are no more characters left to be compared and similarly with the j if j travels beyond the sequence then it simply signifies that we have found our sequence and we should simply break from this while loop because this original string can have n number of elements and as we have found our sequence we should break from this while loop because we don't want to go further into the string so at the start i is less than 
and j is less than 3. So this condition comes out to be true. The first step what we do is we simply compare the character at ith index with a character of the sequence at jth index. So it means we are simply comparing this character with this character. So j is pointing to sequence so and j is also referring to the index 0. So this character is compared with this character. Now if they are equal, so currently a is equal to a. So this condition comes out to be true. Now what it signifies is one of the sequence character is matched. So now we can safely move j to the next index. So we do j plus plus. So j becomes 1. Moving ahead. And after that we do i plus plus because now our second character should match with the rest of the string which is this because this is already being matched. So we do i plus plus. So i points to index 1. Moving ahead i is less than 5 as 1 is less than 5 and 1 is less than 3 because j is pointing to 1. So both condition comes out to be true. We again check whether character at ith index of string is it equal to the char at jth index of the sequence. So it simply means we are comparing b with c. Now here you can see b is not equal to c. Therefore this condition comes out to be false. Now as this condition comes out to be false, we don't increment j because there could be a possibility c might come up later in the string. So therefore condition in this flow comes out to be false. And we only increment i. So we don't touch j, we only increment i. So i becomes 2. So I'll just remove everything. Now we again check whether i is less than 5. So this condition comes out to be true. And we also check whether j is less than 3. Because sequence dot length is 3. So both this condition comes out to be true. We compare the respective characters at ith and jth index. So here we are comparing c with c. Because i and j are pointing to these two indexes. So here you can see c is equal to c. So this condition comes out to be true. It means our second character actually matched with the character in the original string. So we'll simply increment now j by 1 because because we have matched our character and now we simply move to the next character. So j becomes 2 and will increment i because this character is already matched. So i becomes 3. Now here 3 is less than 5 and 2 is less than 3. So both condition comes out to be true. We compare the characters at these respective indexes. So it means we are comparing now D with E. So here you can see D is not equal to E. Therefore this condition comes out to be false and we don't increment J. And here as we discuss why we don't increment J because later in the string there could be E coming up. So here you can see E is here but, but if here the character would have been different. So there could be a chance that E might have come later. So we don't increment J, we only increment I. So I becomes 4. So I'll just remove this. So 4 is less than 5. This condition is true. 
and 2 is less than 3. So this condition is also true. We will compare E and E which is this character with this character. So this comes out to be true. So we will increment J because our character is matched. So J becomes 3. It means now J has crossed the limits of sequence. Moving ahead, we will increment I. So I becomes 5. It means I has also crossed the limit of the string. So now here you can see value of I is 5 and 5 is not less than 5. So this condition comes out to be false. So the overall condition comes out to be false. So this while loop will exit. So friends here at the last step this condition is pretty much important because if value of j is actually equal to the sequence length it means j has traversed the sequence complete and we have found our element. So currently j value is 3 and sequence length is 3. So 3 is actually equal to 3. Therefore we will return true because j is equal to sequence dot length and this expression returns true as 3 is equal to 3 because when j will equal to the length of the sequence it means it has traversed a c and e completely so here we are returning true so now we'll see one more example let's say we call a b c d e with the sequence a e c So we'll go over this example quickly. I is 0 and J is also 0. Here string length is 5 and sequence length is 3. Both the condition comes out to be true because I is less than 5 and J is less than 3. We compare the characters at the respective indexes of their respective strings. So we are comparing A with A which is true. So we will increment J. J becomes 1 and we will increment I. So I will become 1. Both this condition is true because I is less than 5 and J is less than 3. We will compare B with E by this expression. So B is not equal to E. So this condition comes out to be false. We won't increment J because there could be possibility E might lie somewhere after B. So we'll only increment I. I becomes true. Both the condition comes out to be true. I is less than 5 and J is less than 3 will compare C with E now. So this condition comes out to be false. We will increment I. I becomes 3. I is less than 5 and J is less than 3. We will compare D with E. So they are not equal. So we will simply again increment I. I becomes 4. I is less than 5. J is less than 3. Now we will compare E with E. So they are actually equal. So it means the if lock condition came out to be true. So we will increment J. So J becomes 2. And we will increment I. So I becomes 5. So this is the important moment, this i has become 5. It means i has crossed the boundaries of this string. So here, value of i is 5 and string length is 5. So therefore this condition comes out to be false. So this while loop will exit. So friends, here you can see now, 
value of j is 2 and sequence length is 3. So this condition is very much important to figure out whether all the characters of the sequence were traversed or not. So here you can see j is 2 and 2 is not equal to 3. Therefore a e c is not a subsequence of a b c d e. So we'll simply return false. So friends I hope you must have liked this video. In case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel. Thanks have a nice day. Hello everyone. So in our previous video we discussed the problem of is subsequence where we were given two strings one was the original string another was a sequence and we need to find out that whether that sequence is actually a subsequence of that original string or not. So before going through this video you watch that animation so that you get an idea that how we can find out that whether a sequence is a subsequence of any other string. So in this video we will actually code the algorithm and will test its working in the main method. So before we start in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update. So here you can see that I have created on class as string util and inside that class we will be creating our method public static will give it a name as is sub c quince. Now this method will take two strings one is the original string and other is the sequence. So we need to find out whether this sequence is actually a subsequence of this string or not. So the return type would be a boolean. So in our previous video where we saw the animation we actually used the two pointer technique where we created two pointers i and j. So i usually traverse the string and j traverse the sequence and usually we traverse both from left to right and we simply try to compare the character present at that particular index which is being denoted by i and j into their respective strings. So we provide a while loop and inside this while loop we provide the condition as this while loop will go on till i is less than strings length and j is less than sequence length because as we are traversing this two pointers from start to finish if any of the pointer crosses the limit of their respective strings we simply break from this while loop. So inside this while loop we simply compare the character at i and jth index of their respective strings. So here we do if caret i is it equal to sequence dot caret j so if they are equal so here let's say if we take the string as a b c d e and let's say we take the sequence as a c and e so here you can see that j starts from 0 and i starts from 0. So we are simply comparing the first element. If they are equal it means we have found one of the character of the sequence into the original string. So we simply increment j by 1 because now we try to compare the next element into the original string and after this if block we always increment i by 1 position because 
we have matched this character with this character. Now C and E will be compared with the rest of the string. So in the next iteration, you will see that B is compared with the C via this condition. So this condition comes out to be false because B is not equal to C. So we don't increment J. We only increment I because there could be a possibility that C might come later in the string because we are trying to find out the subsequence here. So we always increment I irrespective whether we have found our element or not because if we have found our element here, then we increment i because we have to compare the rest of the sequence with the rest of the original string. And if we don't find the matching character, which is here, where we are comparing b with c, so this condition comes out to be false. So we try to only increment i because there could be a possibility that next character should match with the sequence character at j index. So this loop goes on and at the end what happens either this condition comes out to be false or this condition comes out to be false or both condition comes out to be false. So this while loop will terminate. So after this while loop will terminate we simply return is j is equal to sequence dot length or not. So why we are doing this is because let's say if this condition comes out to be false. It means j is equal to sequence dot length which signifies that if j is equal to sequence dot length we have found our subsequence. We have found that this sequence is actually a subsequence of this string because we have traversed each and every element and we have found them to be true. And at the last increment of j, it will actually reach to the sequence dot length. So if j is equal to sequence dot length, it means this sequence is actually a subsequence of our original string. And let's say friend, if we provide a, e, c, so this a would have matched with this a, this e would have matched to this e. And after that, J would have remained to C because our original string would have been exhausted here as I would have become equal to string dot length. So at that moment of time, this condition would have come out to be false, which says that AEC is not a subsequence of ABCDE. So friend, this is the algorithm which help us in determining that whether any sequence is a subsequence of the original string or not. So now let's test its working in the main method. Here we will simply print is subsequence. Let's say we pass the string as a, b, c, d, e and we pass a, c and e. If I run the main method now You will see it came out to be true. Now let's say if I run it with A, E, and C, so it came out to be false. So why? Because A, E, C, though it's present in A, B, C, D, E, but the order of elements which constitutes the property of subsequence is not matched. Here you can see C is coming before E but here E is coming before C. Therefore this cannot be the subsequence of this string because the order matters in the subsequence. So friends I hope you like this video and in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel. Thanks have a nice day. Hello everyone. So in this video we will be discussing first non-repeating character problem. So this is a very famous interview question which is being asked by many companies. So we'll see what this problem is and we will see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step. So here you can see 
that we are given a string s which only has lower case letters now we need to return the index of first non repeating character first non repeating we mean is the unique character which occurs first and if it doesn't occurs or doesn't exist we can return minus 1 so we need to return the index let's see with an example suppose the string provided is code for code so here you can see the answer is fourth index the first non repeating character is f and is found at index 4 so let's see how we actually traverse the string from left to right because we need to find the first non repeating character so here you can see if you see c c occurs here as well so this is not a unique character we check o is here and here at three places so o is also not unique we see d d is here and here so d is also not the unique character or first unique character e is here also so e is not the first unique character now we see f so here you can see f is not present in the rest of the string so f is the first non repeating or unique character in this string and the index is let's say 0 1 2 3 4 so 4 is the answer now let's suppose we are provided with string as a a b b so here you can see a occurs twice and b is also occurring twice so it doesn't have any non repeating character so we simply return minus 1 now let's see the algorithm for it and its demonstration step by step so here you can see this is the algorithm to solve first non repeating character problem so before we start in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update so here let's say we call this method first non repeating character we pass the string as race cars so here the string is race cars something like this so friends the basic idea behind this algorithm is we actually take the help of a hashing data structure which is a hash map which basically has key and value so here key is unique which is our character and the value is a integer which will actually hold the count of the character occurring in the string and why we are taking a hash map is because if you see somewhere here we are doing get now this get operation when we pass any character will return as the count for that particular character and this happens in o of one time if we don't use hash map then the algorithm will take multiple for loops and will increase the time complexity so therefore to get the character count very fast we use this hashing data structure which is our hash map so we'll see its significance when we see the algorithm step by step so first we will create a map having key and value of type character and integer so here i am simply demonstrating it as key value pair but internally this map uses a hash function to store this key value pair such that the retrieval becomes faster you can watch my videos on hashing data structure and hash map but here i will be simply demonstrating it with the values so here we have this string race cars now what we do is as we need to find out a single character which is first non repeating we first take this string we call two char array method on it and this will return us a character array so this method is present in a string class so it put look something like this that we have got our character array where this array at each index holds one character like this moving ahead now what we do is we iterate over each and every character one by one and we put it the character into the map and we put it such a way that if that character is not present we put one and if the character is present we take that value first and we add one to it so we'll see how this line works 
but here you can see that we are putting the character because key is the character and as the integer what we are doing is we are calling hash maps method get or default so when we do map dot get or default if this character is already present then its corresponding value is returned and we simply add one to it and we put it back into the map and if the character is not present then we return a default value so it's like get or default so for the default value here you can see we provide zero which signifies that the particular character if it is not present in the map it means just return the count as zero and why we are doing plus one and putting it back into the map you will get more when we will see the working of this for loop so here this for loop will iterate each character one by one so it will start with r here we will put r and here you can see the map is empty it doesn't have r so the default value of 0 is returned and when 0 is returned we do plus 1 to it so it becomes 1 and we put it into the map so here it would look something like this we put r as our key and value as 1 so this one signifies that character r occurred one time as we are traversing from left to right so at this moment r has occurred one time so therefore we are returning this 0 because we are adding 1 to it so if r again comes up we will do map dot get or default we will get actually 1 because r is already present as a key so we add 1 to it which means the count of r is 2 we extracted 1 and we added 1 to it so the count became 2 and if the value is not present we add 1 to the 0 and put it back into the map moving ahead now it will pick the second character which is a it checks whether a is present or not so a is not present in the map so it simply returns the default value 0 we add 1 to it and we put a as a key and value as 1 so it goes like this it takes c now and similarly it puts c as a key and 1 as a value because c is also not present in the map so get or default will return 0 as a default value now it takes the fourth character which is e we put e also as 1 because the count is still 1 now it takes c so here you can see when we will do map dot get or default now this time 0 won't be returned because c is already present and with a value as 1 so this 1 will be returned and we'll simply do plus 1 and we put c with value as 2 so this complete expression gives us 2 for c so here it becomes 2 and which makes sense because till this point we have encountered c two times so we are simply storing the frequency of the character in the value field moving ahead now it will pick a a is also present so it will take this value it will add one to it and it will insert it back so it will become two it will pick r So R also becomes 2 and at the end it picks S. So here S is not present. So therefore the default value 0 will be returned. We do plus 1 and we put S with 1. So now this for loop will end. So friends here you can see this is the character frequency map. So why we have done this is to simply count the number of occurrence of a particular character. So here you can see R occurred two times here and here. A occurred two times here and here. C one here and one here. And E and S occurred only once here and here. So now the next for loop will help us in deciding which is the first non-repeating character. So here 
we will again iterate the char array from zero index to the end so initially i is zero and i is less than char dot length which is eight so char dot length is eight so we pick the first character we provide the index zero so r will be picked and now we'll simply call map dot get and we pass the character so when we do map dot get we will get its corresponding value because we are passing in the key and this map will return us back the value associated with this key and dead to an o of one time which is very fast so that's why we were using hash map so here when we do map dot get r we will get the value as 2 so here you can see 2 is not equal to 1 it means r cannot be our first non repeating character because it has value 2 so we move ahead with the next character i becomes 1 1 is less than 8 we take the next character which is a as index 1 because value of i is 1 we do map dot get a so we pass in the key as a and we get value as 2 it means a cannot be our first non repeating character we move ahead i becomes 2 2 is less than 8 we pick c now we do map dot get c we get the value as 2 2 is not equal to 1 so therefore c can't be our first non repeating character because it has value 2 it means it has occurred two times we'll increment i to 3 we'll pick now e now here you can see when we do map dot get e we get a value as 1 so 1 is equal to 1 it means this condition comes out to be true and which signifies that we have found our first non repeating character because we were traversing this for loop from this end and whichever value we found to be 1 we simply return its index so here whatever the value i will have will simply return it back so the answer would be 3 So now let's see this example one more time with values a b a b. So we'll quickly go over it. String is a b a b. We create a hash map like this. We convert this a b a b into character array by calling two char array. So it comes out to be like this. Now we'll iterate each and every character and we put its frequency as a value in this hash map. So we start with a, we check whether a is present or not by this, it is not present so we return the default value as 0. Whatever value is returned we add 1 to it and we put a into the hash map. So the value would be 1 signifies that a has occurred one time. We go with the b and similarly b will have 1 because b is not present in the map we take a and we see a is already present so we get this value out we add 1 to it and we put it back so 1 plus 1 will give 2 and we put 2 back into the hash map we take the last character b we see b is also present so we do 1 plus 1 and add it back. So occurrence of b is also 2. Now this for loop will end. So here you can see looking into the hash map a occurred 2 times here and here. b occurred 2 times here and here. So here we can see that in this string no character has appeared once. So this for loop will help us in figuring that out. 
we will start with i equal to zero index. We go till cares dot length. So cares dot length is four. Zero is less than four. We take first element which is a. So we do map dot get a. We pass the a. We get value as two. So here we can see that two is not equal to one. So this condition comes out to be false. We increment i. I becomes one. One is less than four. We take the first index character, which is b. I'll remove this. We do map dot get b. We pass the key b. We get value as two. So here two is not equal to one. So this condition comes out to be false. I becomes two. Two is less than four. Now we take the second index value, which is a. We do map dot get a. It returns two. Two is not equal to one. This condition comes out to be false. And similarly, we do for the last character. We take b. We do map dot get b. It will return two. Two is not equal to one, so this condition comes out to be false. So here now I will become four, and four is not less than four, so this for loop will end. And once this for loop will end, if we haven't written anything from this condition, at the end we know that there are no characters in this string which are unique. So we simply return minus one. So friends, here we saw two examples. In one, we found the first non-repeating character, and in other, we didn't found any non-repeating character. So if I go to the previous slide, so here you can see that when we did race cars, we actually saw that E and S both had a count one, but here E occurred before S. So therefore, this e was the first non-repeating character, not s. So this is one thing we need to keep in mind that we need to find first non-repeating character. I hope you must have liked this video. In case if you are new to my channel, then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update. Thanks. Have a nice day. Hello everyone. So in our previous video, we saw the detailed demonstration of the algorithm to find first non-repeating character in a string, where we were given a string in lower case letters, and we wanted to find the index of the first non-repeating character in it. So in case if you want to understand more, you can watch my previous video. So in this video, we will actually code the algorithm and will test its working in the main method. So before we start in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update So here in string util class I'll be creating the method as public static will give the method name as first non repeating character so this method will take a string and it will return the index which is of integer type for the first non repeating character so friends here in order to find the first non repeating character we first iterate this string completely and we figure out the character frequency that how many times a particular character has occurred so for that we are using the map whose key is character and value is integer which is the count of that particular character that how many times it has occurred so we can give it a name as character frequency map new hash map now we want to iterate each and every character of the string one by one 
so for that we take the string and we convert it into character array by calling to char array method then we provide a for loop so here we will iterate one one character in each iteration now here what we do is as we want to count the character frequency that how many times it has occurred what we do is we do character frequency map dot put we put the character as key and the value we put is we first check that whether this character is present in the map or not so we do it by method get or default we pass the key to it if that character is present the value corresponding to it will be returned and if that character is not present so we can return a default value because the method is get or default so we need to pass the default value to it which is let's say if the character is not present we want it should return 0 so here you can see default value is 0 and what we need to do is let's say if the string has a character a which is not present so here we have encountered a so we need to put the count as 1 because a has occurred once so we'll do plus 1 to it and let's say next time for example let's say our string has something like a b a so for this map will have a as a key and value as 1 now when this a will again occur so this get or default will return the previous value which is 1 and we will add 1 to it so now map will have a as a key and value as 2 because a occurred two times so this we do for each and every character and after doing that we provide another for loop and we iterate this char array once again and now as we want to find the first non repeating character and we are starting from zeroth index so whichever character value in this character frequency map will have one it means when we are traverse this character array completely that particular element was the one which had only occurrence one and which was the first non repeating character so here what we do is we take the char from the ith index we provide a if check if the character frequency map we do get we pass the character and if the value returned is 1 it means this is our character which is first and non repeating so we simply return its corresponding index which is i and if we don't find any such character whose frequency is 1 then at the end we simply return minus 1 so now let's test it's working in the main method here we will call first non repeating character let's say we pass the string what we saw in our previous video race cars so here you can see it should return 0 1 2 3 3 because e is the first non repeating character why because r a and c have occurred two times in this string so if i run this so here you can see it returned 3 and let's say if we put a string which doesn't have any unique character so here a has occurred three times b has also occurred three times if i run it it should return minus 1 and let's say we provide a value here as e so now we have e as a character which has occurred only once 
and it's the first non repeating character so if i do run it we will get its index as 6 because 0 1 2 3 4 5 so e is at sixth index now let's say if i do in between i do f so now f is our first non repeating character because e comes later so now it should return 3 so it comes out to be 3 so 0 1 2 and 3 so friend this was all about the algorithm to find the first non repeating character in a string i hope you must have liked this video in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update thanks have a nice day Hello everyone. So in this video, we will be discussing a problem that how we can remove vowels from a string. So here we are given with a string, and we need to remove the vowels from that string and return that string. And the string only contains the lower case letters. So if we talk about vowels, then there are five vowels: a, e, i, o, u. So let's suppose we are given with this string. What is your name? So the output would be this a i o u a and e. This will be removed because those are vowels, and this string will be written like this. So now let's see the demonstration of the algorithm step by step that how we can remove the vowels from a string. So before we start. in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update so here you can see that this is the algorithm to remove vowels from a string so now let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step with a example so we'll call remove vowels method we'll pass the string as ice cream so here string would be ice cream so here you can see that it has vowels like i e e and a so here in order to remove the vowels from this string we take each character and we see whether it's a vowel or not so for that first we create a set which we denote as vowels and this set will only have the characters so this is a set of a e i o u and why we are taking it as a set because here you can see that we are using for loop we are iterating over each character of this string and we are checking whether this particular character is present in this vowel set or not so this contains method is very fast and it has an average time complexity of o of 1 which is nearly constant so therefore we are using set in order to know more about set and hashing data structure you can watch my series on hashing so after creating the vowel set we will be creating a instance of string builder now why we are taking string builder is because when we will be removing the vowels from this string we will be creating a lot of intermediate strings so to avoid that we are basically using string builder so string builder class is provided by java which actually deals with the operations perform over the string and which help us in generating a string without giving a performance hit moving ahead now this string has a method to char array in java so when we call this method we will get a character array so this ice cream will be separated out in a form of a character array so it would look something like this that this is the character array going from index 0 to 8 because it is taking ice cream one single character at a time so now we'll traverse each and every character one by one using this for loop so this for loop tells that it iterate over each character present in the char array 
so when this for loop will start ch which is the character it will point to the first character which is i so ch is i so we take this character and we search into our vowel set that whether it contains ch or not so here you can see vowel set has character i so it means this is a vowel and we don't want to include this into our final string so what we do is here you can see the condition as vowels dot contains will come out to be true and if we negate that it will become false so this condition comes out to be false and we will simply skip i because it is a vowel so now we'll go to the second character which is at index 1 so ch will become c we check whether c is present in the vowel set or not so vowels dot contains will return false because c is not present and if we negate that this will become true it means c is not vowel so we need to include this c into our final string so this condition comes out to be true so string builder has a method append where we will simply append the character c so it would look something like this that c comes into the string builder moving ahead we will go to the third character which is e now e is a vowel so vowels dot contains e will come out to be true and this condition after negating becomes false so therefore we will skip e because e is a vowel moving ahead now the fourth character is actually a empty string or a blank character so ch will point to this empty thing or space so this condition vowels dot contains will come out to be false and if we negate that it will come out to be true because this is not a vowel so we will include this so we'll simply append the space moving ahead the fifth character is c so we will simply include this because c is not a vowel so c gets appended now sixth character is r so vowels dot contains r comes out to be false because r is not a vowel if we negate this overall condition comes out to be true it means r is not a vowel and we need to include this so we'll simply append r the seventh character is e so e is a vowel so vowels dot contains will return true and if we negate it this condition will become false so we'll simply skip e because e is a vowel now we will take the eighth character which is a a is a vowel so we need to skip it and at the last we will take m so m is not a vowel so this condition is false and overall condition after negating becomes true so we need to include m because m is not a vowel so we have included m and after m there is no more character left so this for loop will terminate so here you can see at the end whatever we collected into our string builder if we do two string we will get a string like this and we'll simply return it from the remove vowels method
So friends, in this video we saw the algorithm to remove vowels from a string. We took the help of the set and string builder to remove the vowels and return the final string without these vowels. I hope you must have liked this video. And in case if you are new to my channel, then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update. Thanks, have a nice day. Hello everyone. So in our previous video, we saw an animation and we discussed the problem that how we can remove the vowels from a string. So in this video, we will be actually coding the algorithm and will test its working in the main method. So before we start, in case if you are new to my channel, then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update. So here we have created one class as string util and inside that class, I will be creating one method as public static, we'll give it a name as remove vowels. This method will take a string. And this method will return back as a string without vowels. So the input is a string with vowels. What we get in return is a string without vowels. So here basic idea behind this algorithm is we iterate over this string character by character and we figure out that which character is vowel and which character is not. So how can we figure that out? First we will create A set of vowels using set dot of method. Now this method will simply take the characters. So we can provide the vowels as a, e, i, o, u. Also here this string will only contain the lowercase letters. So we have only provided the lowercase vowels. Now after creating the set of vowels, what we can do is we will create string builder class. So this string builder class will help us in creating the string which we want to return. And this string builder class is performance efficient. It has many utility methods by which we can manipulate the string. Now in order to iterate the input string character by character, what we can do is we will call to char array method. Now this method basically return us a character array. So after getting the character array, we will provide a for loop. where we will simply iterate over each character one by one. So what we do is we provide a if condition. If vowels contains the character. So if vowel contains the character, it means this character is actually a vowel and we don't want to include it. But if it is not a vowel, then we need to include that character into our final string. So here what we do is we do the negation of it. So if character is present into this set, this will return true. And if we negate it, we will we are simply skipping the vowel. And let's suppose character is something like C, B, J, K, for example, when we will call vowels dot contains this, let's say C. So it will return false. This condition will come out to be false. And if we negate it, it becomes true, which means that if there is C, then we need to include that into our string. So we'll simply append the character to our string builder class. So basically when we will encounter any vowel, this part will be skipped because vowels dot contains will return true. And if we negate it, this condition comes out to be false and this part is skipped. So after doing this for each and every character, at the end we'll simply return sb.toString. So this string builder 
will simply append only the characters which are not vowels and at the end when we will call to string it will convert everything into the string and it will return so this is the algorithm now let's test its working here we'll call remove vowels and let's say we provide string as ice cream and if i run it so here you can see all the vowels are removed i e e and a everything is removed and rest of the string is returned also friends why we are using this set is because when we do contents on a set this is a very faster operation the average time complexity of this operation is o of 1 so basically it signifies that in o of n time we can simply find out the vowels from the string and remove it so friends i hope you must have liked this video in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in this video we are going to discuss that how we can reverse an integer in java So here, let's suppose we are given an integer x. Now we need to return x with its digits reversed. So if you see an example here, let's say if we are given with the integer as one, two, three, four. So our output should be four, three, two, one. We are simply reversing the digits of this integer. Similarly, if we are given an integer which is negative one, two, three, four, so it should return Negative four three two one. So the sign should be there, with only digits being reversed. And let's say if we see example three, here we are given an integer, which is nothing but integer dot max value, which is two one four seven four eight three six four seven. Now when we reverse this integer, we get seven four six three eight four seven four one two. so here you can see that this is the integer's max value and if we reverse it this value may overflow the integer range so we need to encounter this use case as well that when we are reversing the max or the min value or any value of the integer which on its reversal may overflow we need to encounter that use case as well So let's move ahead and see the demonstration of the algorithm step by step. So here you can see that we are given with a method as reverse, and we are passing in the number which we want to reverse. So this method return type is long. Now why we have kept the return type as long is because there may be a chance that let's suppose this int value is maximum, or any number which on its reversal. may overflow the integer's maximum range or minimum range so therefore in order to fit that particular range we are taking a long value which will be returned from this method so here this long is basically handling our overflow case because when we cross the integer's range the data type which can handle that overflow range would be the long So now let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step. Let's say we want to reverse a negative number one, two, three, four. So here the number will be minus one, two, three, four. So here, okay, the first thing we do is we simply check that whether this number is negative or not. So if we provide this condition, then whether number is less than zero or not. So if number is less than zero. the is negative will have value as true currently number is less than 0 so the value of is negative will be true by this condition and why we are evaluating whether number is less than 0 or not because when we are reversing the digits we need to take its absolute value without the sign we'll see this later so for time being 
we just evaluate whether number is less than zero or not. If it is less than zero, then we simply multiply it with minus one to make it a positive number. So now number will become one two three four. So here minus one two three four into minus one will give one two three four. This minus minus becomes positive. Moving ahead. Now in order to store the reverse, we are taking in a long value. And why we are taking it as a long value is because because this integer value number, if we reverse the digits of it, there may be a chance that this number may overflow the maximum or minimum range of the integer. So therefore, in order to accommodate this overflow condition, we are taking it as long because any value which crosses integers max or min range can be fit into the long variable. So at the start reverse is zero. We will create the last digit integer value. So this integer value will hold only one single digit, which would be the last digit, which we will see later here. So friends, in order to reverse this integer value, these are the three main critical steps we need to perform in a while loop. This is one of the approach to reverse the integer value. Now there can be one more approach. We can simply take the string value of this number, convert it into the character array, and then we simply reverse the characters in that particular array. So that could be one case, but here we are taking the help of modulus operator and the division operator. Because this modulus operator is very important when dealing with numbers. So here we will discuss what actually this modulus operator does and division operator does. So currently number is greater than zero. So this while loop will execute till number is greater than zero. When number will be equal to zero or less than zero, then this while loop will terminate. So friends here you can see that in order to reverse this number one, two, three, four, it should become four, three, two, one. So what we need to do is we need to first take the last digit, bring to this position, then second last digit, bring to this position, third last to this position and fourth last to the last position. So these are the things we need to do. So how we can extract the single single digits from this number is we can take the help of modulus operator. So here you can see, let's say we want to divide 12 by 10. So 10 is the divisor, 12 is the dividend. And in normal mathematics, when we divide 12 by 10, we get quotient as one and the remainder as two. So here, this remainder is nothing but the result of the modulus operator, which you see here. And this one is nothing but the result of the division, which we do here. So using the simple mathematics, we will evaluate the reverse of this number. And also friends here, you can see that in order to get four, when we divide any number by 10, whatever the remainder we get that would be our last digit. So here if we divide one, two, three, four, let's say if I do one, two, three, four, and let's say I divide it by 10. So one, two, So here you can see that this is our quotient and this is our remainder. So when we are divided 1, 2, 3, 4 by 10, we get the remainder as 4, which is nothing but our last digit. And the quotient would be the remaining digits just before the last digit. So this is the crux of the algorithm that when we divide any number by 10, the remainder will give the last digit 
and the quotient will give the remaining digits so here when we take the remainder of the number which is 1 2 3 4 in the last digit will have value as 4 because this is our remainder here moving ahead now friends as we have extracted the last digit this would be our first digit when we do the reversal so here if i reverse 1 2 3 4 we get 4 3 2 1 so this would be our first digit now so in order to make it first digit what we do is whatever the value reverse will hold we will simply multiply it by 10 and we will add the value stored in the last digit we will see the importance of this part later so currently reverse is 0 so 0 into 10 will give 0 and when we will add 4 to it we get reverse as 4 so reverse will become 4 this part will be clear in the next iteration moving ahead now as we have extracted one digit we need the rest of the digits now and how we can get the rest of the digit is the quotient of this division so when we will do number divided by 10 we get the quotient as 1 2 3 so the new number will become 1 2 3 moving ahead So number is greater than zero. One, two, three is greater than zero. So this condition comes out to be true. Now we need this last digit. So what we need to do is we need the remainder. So when we will divide one, two, three by ten, because this is our new number. So here we'll get ten, one. so here you can see when we divide 1 2 3 by 10 we get remainder as 3 and the quotient as 12 so this is a similar approach when we divide any number by 10 the last digit is our remainder and the remaining digit is our quotient so now last digit will become 3 because we need 3 to simply append it here somehow moving ahead so friends now as we have got 3 as last digit and we need to append it here we can't directly add this 3 to the reverse what we do is whatever the value reverse will hold if suppose this is 4 and if i multiply it by 10 we will get 40 and then if i add the last digit which is 3 we will get 43 which is the stuff we want if it reverse 1 2 3 4 we should get 4 3 2 1 so 4 and 3 should be next to each other so this is the important step here that when we are multiplying the reverse by 10 we are simply shifting the digit by one place and we are adding the last digit to it so that both these numbers are next to each other so this is the important step so here now reverse will become 43 what we discussed here and as we are done with the digit 3 we need the remaining digits so the remaining digits we get by number divided by 10 which will give us the quotient so number will become 12 the number is still greater than 0 so this condition comes out to be true now we will take the last digit and how we can get the last digit is we divide the number by 10 so this is our remainder and this is our quotient 
सो अवर लास्ट डिजिट इज टू बिकॉज नंबर मॉड्यूलस टेन विल गिव द रिमाइंडर एज टू सो टू विल बी असाइन टू द लास्ट डिजिट एंड नाउ हाउ वी कैन अपेंड टू जस्ट आफ्टर थ्री इज वी नीड टू क्रिएट वन स्पेस हियर एंड हाउ वी कैन क्रिएट द स्पेस इज वी सिंपली मल्टीप्लाइड बाय टेन वी गेट फोर थर्टी एंड देन वी सिंपली एड टू टू इट विच इज अवर लास्ट डिजिट वी गेट फोर थ्री टू सो दिस इज द स्टेप विच हेल्प अस इन अपेंडिंग द लास्ट डिजिट टू द रिवर्स सो आफ्टर दिस लाइन गेट्स एग्जीक्यूटेड रिवर्स विल बिकम फोर थ्री टू विथ दिस मल्टीप्लीकेशन एंड एडिशन मूविंग आइड वी आर डन विथ टू एंड नाउ वी सिंपली नीड वन सो अवर न्यू नंबर विल बिकम द न्यू क्वेश्चन बाय नंबर डिवाइडेड बाय टेन सो वील गेट द न्यू नंबर इज वन नंबर इज स्टिल ग्रेटर देन जीरो सो दिस कंडीशन कम्स आउट टू बी ट्रू Now we need the last digit, but here you can see one is the only digit left. So here, when we will divide one by ten, we get remainder as one and quotient as zero because one is not divisible by ten. So one will be our remainder and quotient will be zero. So now last digit will become one. This and here, how we can append this last digit to four three two is four three two into ten. It will give us four three two zero. We will do plus one. We get four three two one. So this is our last digit. so by this two operations the reverse will become 4321 and now we'll simply assign number divided by 10 value to number so here you can see when one got divided by 10 the quotient was zero which is the result of our division so zero will be assigned to the number so number became zero so now here you can see this while loop will terminate because number is equal to 0 and not greater than 0 so this while loop will terminate and here is the important step that why we are providing this condition is because we have used up all the digits of the our original number and we have reversed it so therefore this condition is very important that number should be greater than 0 because when number will be equal to 0 it means there is no value left in the number to be reversed and at the last we simply check whether our original number was negative or not so our original number here was negative so if it is negative then this condition will be executed we will simply multiply reverse by minus 1 So four three two one into minus one will give minus four three two one. So minus four three two one will be returned from this reverse method. And if is negative would have been false, then we would have simply returned the reverse. So friends, this is how we actually reverse an integer value. There are three steps to remember. first we need to evaluate whether the number is less than 0 or not the second is we need to take this data type as long because when we reverse a bigger integer value there may be a chance that its reversal may overflow the integer value so if we take integer here then this reverse will only hold the garbage value which we don't want so in order to accommodate the large overflow integer value we will store it in the long because long can accommodate that value the other thing is this simple mathematics here which is very important when we divide any number by any value whatever is the remainder if we want to achieve 
the remainder directly we can use the modulus operator which is here and if we want to access the quotient we can simply take the value of the division here and using this three steps we have actually performed the reversal of this integer so friends i hope you must have liked this video in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in this video we are going to discuss a lead code problem remove element so friends before we start in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update so in this problem we are given an integer array and we are also given with a integer value now our task is to remove all the occurrences of that value from the integer array and that to in place so what do we mean by in place is let's say if we take this example and this is our input array and this is the value given to us which is 3 now our task is to remove all the occurrences of this value from this array that to in place so it means that we have to modify the given array in such a way that we have to remove all the occurrences of this value we can't use additional data structure or an additional array for this removal whatever operation we need to do we have to perform in the given array itself and in this problem after removal of all the occurrences of the value it is okay that order of the elements may change so for example in the second array when the value is 2 you can see after removing the 2 we are getting 0 1 4 0 3 now here we can also return something like 4 1 0 0 3 so the order of the elements may get changed but our task is to just remove all the occurrences of the given value and finally we have to return an integer value which is a count of the elements which are not equal to the given value so here in the first example you can see the array is 3 2 2 3 and the given value is 3 so after removing 3 we are only left with 2 2 so the output would be 2 because there are two values 1 and 2 similarly here let's say we are given with this array and the value is 2 so after removal of all the occurrences of 2 we get 1 2 3 4 5 so our output should be 5 now here we have to do two task first is we need to return the count of the values which are not equal to well so which is our k and the second task is we have to actually perform this removal in place in the given array so we have to remove all occurrences of well in array and that to in place so we have to perform this two task now if we look into the problem this is the problem on lead code we have to do this two task so whatever the array is given to us we have to modify the same array and we have to return the total number of elements which are not equal to this value so for example in the first s case if the val is 3 and the array is 3 2 2 3 so we know that after removing 3 the number of elements which are not equal to val is 2 1 and 2 so here if i directly return let's say 2 so this test case should get passed but if i run the code so here you can see that we have returned 2 which is our output but we haven't modified the array in place so the lead code editor will also check our the given array that we have removed all the occurrences of the given value from the given array now let's see how we can approach the solution of this problem So, for example, let's suppose we are given with this array, zero, one, two, two, three, zero, four, two. Our task is to remove all occurrences of two. The output should be five because the total number of elements which are not equal to two are five. One, two, three, four, five, and the remaining element is shown blank because the test case doesn't look beyond our output, which is five. So, here how we can approach this problem is we can use two pointers. Let's say i and j. so let's suppose if this is our array and we have to remove all the occurrences of 2 so this is our well now here two pointers will move 
थ्रू आउट दिस एरे इन सच ए वे दैट वन इज स्लो पॉइंटर एंड अनादर इज फास्ट पॉइंटर सो लेट से दे बोथ स्टार्ट एट जीरो इंडेक्स एंड ये लेट सपोज जे इज अवर फास्ट पॉइंटर एंड आई इज स्लो पॉइंटर सो जे विल ट्रेवल ईच एंड एवरी एलिमेंट थ्रू आउट दिस एरे सो इट्स जस्ट फॉर इट्रेशन एंड हियर आई विल मूव स्लोली एंड इट्स मेन पर्पज इज टू एक्चुअली रिमूव ऑल द अकरेंसेस ऑफ द गिवन वैल्यू सो वंस इट रिमूव द अकरेंसेस ऑफ द गिवन वैल इट विल देन मूव अड स्लोली सो हियर इट हेल्प्स टू रिमूव द एलिमेंट सो हियर वॉट डू वी डू इज एज जे इज इटरेटिंग ओवर कंप्लीट एरे वी सिंपली कंपेयर द वैल्यू एट जे इंडेक्स विद द वैल्यू वी वॉन्ट टू रिमूव एंड आई इज एक्चुअली हेल्पिंग अस टू रिमूव दैट वैल्यू सो हियर इफ द वैल्यू एट जे इंडेक्स इज नॉट इक्वल टू टू इट मीन्स वी हैव फाउंड एन एलिमेंट विच वी नीड टू कीप इन द एरे सो वी सिंपली टेक दैट वैल्यू एंड असाइन इट टू द आयत इंडेक्स एंड देन वी एक्चुअली इंक्रीमेंट आय सो लेट सी वाई एन एग्जाम्पल सो करंटली द वैल्यू एट जे इंडेक्स इज जीरो इट इज नॉट इक्वल टू टू सो जीरो इज नॉट इक्वल टू टू सो इट मीन्स दैट वी हैव फाउंड अ वैल्यू विच वी नीड टू कीप इन दिस एरे एंड वी नो दैट आई विल हेल्प अस इन कीपिंग दैट वैल्यू इन द एरे सो एट द स्टार्ट वी विल असाइन जीरो to the i index so this value stays here and we increment i to the next index so i comes here and j is actually traversing the array so it will also get incremented now we again check that value at j index 1 whether it is equal to 2 or not so 1 is not equal to 2 so we assign the 1 to i index it means the same value is assigned to this index and we move ahead so i moves to this index and j also moves to the second index now here the value at j index is 2 and 2 is actually equal to 2 so here we know that we have to remove this occurrence so i will actually point to the same index because its task is to actually remove this element so when the value at j index is equal to our value which we want to remove we don't move the i index we only move the j index because i is actually helping us to remove this value so here i stays at the same place and j moves so j comes here now again here the value at j index is 2 and 2 is equal to 2 and we have to remove this occurrence why are taking help of i th pointer so here i stays at the same place and j moves so j comes to the fourth index now value at j index is 3 and 3 is not equal to 2 so it means we have to move this value here so that this occurrence can be removed so when we move 3 here it would look something like this that 2 is gone and 3 comes here and after the assignment i will move to its next index because its task is to remove all the occurrences of the given value and j usually moves ahead so it goes to fifth index now here that j index value is 0 and 0 is not equal to 2 so therefore we will assign this value at the ith index like this and here now value will become 0 and now both the pointers will move ahead now here value at jth index is 4 so here 4 is not equal to 2 so therefore we will assign this value at the ith index so it would look something like this so 3 will be gone and here it will be 4 and both the pointers will move ahead so i will come here and j will come here so now the value at jth index is 2 and 2 is equal to 2 so we do nothing here we simply increment j so now j is traversed complete array and here you can see the ith index will be our answer because this is the last place where we need to remove an element but we didn't find any more elements so after removal of 2 our output came out to be 5 so if we put the index at 0 1 2 3 4 and 5 so this 5 is nothing but a value which is pointed by the ith index and this would be our answer because till this point all the occurrences have been removed and after that there were no more elements 
to be removed so therefore we have achieved two tasks one is we are returning the output as 5 and another is we have modified the array in place and we have removed all the occurrences of 2 so in this problem the basic idea is we are using these two pointers i and j the purpose of j is to simply traverse the array compare the value at j index with the value we want to remove and the purpose of i is to actually remove the element via assignment when we actually find a value at j index not equal to the value which we want to remove now let's move ahead and see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step so friends before we start in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update so here this is the code and let's say we are given with this array which we discussed in our previous slide we are calling remove element method passing in this array and the value is 2 for which we want to remove all the occurrences in this array so we have nums array and the val as 2 now we are creating this two pointers i and j so here i starts from 0 and as we know that the purpose of j is to simply traverse the array and compare the value at j index with the actual value we want to remove so we are using a simple for loop here so j starts from 0 So at the start j is zero, and nums dot length is eight, because we have eight elements one two three four five six seven eight, and zero is less than eight. So this for loop will execute. And as we already discussed, we have to simply provide one if check that whether value at j index whether it is equal to val or not. So currently value at j index is zero, and zero is not equal to two. So therefore, this condition comes out to be true. It means that we have found a value which is not equal to two, and which we need to keep in the array. So the way we keep in the array is via ith pointer. So we simply assign nums of j to nums of i. So nums of j is zero is assigned to nums of i, which is at zero index. So this value is assigned to the same index, like this. and the actual purpose of i is to actually remove the elements and keep only those elements which are not equal to 2 so after putting a value which is not equal to our given value we move i to the next index like this we will increment j j comes to index 1 and 1 is less than 8 so this for loop will execute we again compare the value at j index with the given value So the value at j index is one, and one is not equal to two. So therefore, we have again found a value which is not equal to the value which we want to remove. So the condition in if block comes out to be true, and we simply assign value at j index to value at i index. So one is assigned to the same index because i and j are pointing to the same index. And after putting a value which is not equal to two, we simply increment i. we increment j so value of j is 2 and 2 is less than nums dot length which is 8 so this for loop will execute we again compare the value at j index with the given value so here 2 is actually equal to 2 so the condition in if block comes out to be false whenever we are encountering a value which we want to keep in the array at that time we are doing this assignment and as soon as we are finding a value at the j index equal to the value which you want to remove we do nothing and we simply increment j so i will actually remain at this position because in the future there could be a values which we want to migrate to this index because we want to remove this 2 so let's say in future there is 3 0 4 so 3 should come here and this 2 should get removed so this i should stay at the same place so now value of j is 3 3 is less than 8 so this for loop will execute now value at j index again is 2 and 2 is equal to 2 so therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false and we do nothing we again increment j value of j becomes 4 4 is less than 8 so this for loop will execute now the value at j index is 3 so here 3 is not equal to 2 so it means we have found a value which is not equal to the given val and we need to keep this value in the array and this index is not the right place for the value 
so therefore this i will actually help us in shifting of this three from here to here via this assignment so the condition if block comes out to be true we assign the value of j index which is three to i index so now this two will go away and this three will come here like this and after placing 3 at its correct spot now it's time to move i to the next index because in the future there could be more values which can come here so we simply increment i value of i becomes 3 we increment j j becomes 5 5 is less than 8 so this for loop will execute now value of j index is 0 and 0 is not equal to 2 so this condition comes out to be true so it means we have to shift this zero to its correct position which is being denoted by i so here we simply assign value at j index to value at i index so zero comes here with this assignment and after placing zero at its correct spot we will simply increment i we will increment j J becomes six. Six is less than eight, so this for loop will execute. So value at J index is four. Four is not equal to two, so therefore this condition comes out to be true. And we simply shift this value four at index i. So four comes here via this assignment, and then we simply increment i because we have placed four at its correct spot. we increment j j becomes 7 7 is less than 8 so this for loop will execute so now here value at j index is 2 2 is actually equal to 2 so therefore the condition in if block comes out to be false so we do nothing and we simply increment j so value of j becomes 8 and 8 is not less than 8 so therefore this for loop will terminate and at the end we'll simply return the value which is being hold by i which is 5 because this was the last place where we couldn't remove the occurrence and before that we have removed all the occurrence and as the array starts from 0th index we have to return a value which is the total number of elements which are not equal to our given val so here we had 0 1 3 0 4 which were not equal to 2 and if we count them we have 1 2 3 4 5 so whatever value i holds that will be our answer so we we'll simply return 5 and we have also modified the array in place by removing all the occurrences of our given value which is 2 so friend this was all about the remove element problem i hope you must have liked this video thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in this video we are going to discuss a lead code problem remove duplicates from sorted array so friends before we start in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update so in this problem we are given with an integer array and the array is sorted in non decreasing order so as a input we are given with an integer array and the integer array is sorted in ascending order now as the array is sorted in ascending order there may be duplicates now our task is to remove the duplicates and that to in place so by in place we mean that we cannot use additional array or any other data structure we have to modify the same array and we have to remove the duplicate such that each element appears only once so for example let's say we have this input array 1 1 2 so the array is sorted and here we have one duplicate which is 1 so we have to remove this duplicate such that only one occurrence of an element occurs such that the element appears only once so after removal of the duplicates we get two numbers 1 and 2 and this one is removed so our output is 2 and the array is modified like this 1 2 and whatever elements are left over those are ignored and one more thing we need to keep in mind is the relative order of the element should be kept the same so we have to modify the input array in such a way that let's say we have 1 1 and 2 so at the start there should be 1 and 
and after that two should come it should not be like this 2 comma 1 because we have to maintain the relative order of the elements so let's say if you are taking the second example now if we remove the duplicates from this sorted array so here we have two zero so one is removed because the element should appear only once after zero if we see the relative order the next number is one and we have three ones so we have to remove this two ones and we need to keep only one occurrence of one and after that we have two twos so we have to remove one two and we have to keep only one two then we have two threes so we have to remove one three and at the end we have four so four is itself unique so after the removal of duplicates if we count the unique elements so we get one two three four and five elements so our output is five and we have to modify the array in place so at the start zero comes then one comes then two then three and then four so the relative order is maintained and the rest of the elements are just ignored so let's move ahead and see how we can solve this problem so suppose we are given with this array 0011122334 now our task is to remove the duplicates and keep only one occurrences of the element so let's say our array is 0011122334 so here first property is the array is sorted in ascending order so it means whatever duplicates we have they are very adjacent to each other so second property is duplicates are adjacent to each other now how we will solve this problem is we will take two pointers i and j so here j will traverse each and every element of this array so therefore it's a fast pointer and i will move slowly so it's a slow pointer now the purpose of j is to basically iterate the array and compare the duplicates and the purpose of i is to actually remove the duplicates so as soon as i removes the duplicates from this array it will move slowly one step at a time and j will simply traverse the array once so here both the pointers will start from first index i and j so i start from first index because the zeroth index already contains a unique element and the next unique element should come here so i starts from here and its main purpose is to remove the duplicates and after removal of duplicates it simply moves ahead now similarly j starts from first index because it actually compares current element with previous element so that it can figure out that these two numbers are duplicates so what it does is we simply compare value at jth index with value at j minus 1 index so therefore we have to start from the first index so as soon as j moves ahead we simply compare the current element with its previous element to figure out whether they are duplicates or not so at the start value at jth index is 0 and j minus 1th index is also 0 so here 0 is equal to 0 therefore this condition comes out to be false so whenever this condition comes out to be false we actually do nothing and we simply traverse j to its next index so j will come to the second index now value at j index is 1 and j minus 1th index is 0 so 1 is not equal to 0 so this condition comes out to be true so whenever this condition comes out to be true it means that we have found a unique element because the element just before that is different from this so whenever this condition comes out to be true it simply means that when we compared this two elements they were not equal so the current integer is actually a unique integer which we need to keep in the array so what we do is when this condition comes out to be true we simply assign
value at jth index to value at ith index because the purpose of i is to actually remove the duplicates and we know that zero is a duplicate here so we simply assign value at jth index to value at ith index so after this assignment one comes here after this assignment we know that the next unique element should come here so we simply traverse i ahead so i comes here and j will move to the third index so purpose of j is to simply traverse the array one element at a time and compare the current integer with its previous integer so now value at j at index is 1 and value at j minus 1 at index is also 1 so they are equal so this condition comes out to be false and we know that once this condition comes out to be false we do nothing and we move simply j one step ahead because we didn't find any other unique element so that we can replace it with ith index we simply move j one step ahead now again value at j index is 1 and value at j minus 1 at index is also 1 so it means this condition comes out to be false and we do nothing we simply traverse j one step ahead now here value at j at index is 2 and value at j minus 1 at index is 1 so 2 is not equal to 1 so therefore this condition comes out to be true so when this condition comes out to be true we know that we have found a unique element which we need to keep in the array and we know that we are using this ith pointer to simply put this value in the array so once this condition comes out to be true we perform this step so value at jth index we simply assign it to value at ith index so this 2 comes here and this one which is duplicate gets removed so 2 comes here and after this assignment we do i++ because the next unique element will come here so i comes here and j traverse ahead now value at jth index is 2 and value at j minus 1 at index is also 2 so this condition comes out to be false so therefore we do nothing and we simply traverse j ahead now here value at jth index is 3 and value at j minus 1 at index is 2 so 3 is not equal to 2 it means we have found one more element which is unique and which we need to keep in the array once this condition comes out to be true the correct place for this 3 is we simply assign the value at jth index to value at ith index so this 3 comes here so this one goes away and 3 comes here and after this assignment we simply increment i because the next unique element should come here so i moves here and j moves here now the value at jth index is 3 and j minus 1 th index is also 3 so therefore this condition comes out to be false so we do nothing we simply traverse j to the next index j comes here now value at jth index is 4 and value at j minus 1 th index is 3 so 4 is not equal to 3 so this condition comes out to be true it means we have found one more unique element which we need to keep in the array so we simply assign this value to nums of i so this 4 will come here and this 1 will go away and after this assignment we move i one step ahead and j also one step ahead so now j is actually traversed till the end of the array and we know that we have removed all the duplicates till this point and if we count the number of elements we have 1 2 3 4 5 so our output would be 5 and here as this is an array so this is 0 index first second third fourth and this is fifth so we simply return the value which is stored in i which is 5 and rest of the elements can be ignored so this array can be ignored our task was to remove all the duplicates such that each element appears only once so now let's move ahead and see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step
सो फ्रेंड्स बिफोर वी स्टार्ट इन केस इफ यूर न्यू टू माई चैनल देन प्लीज सब्सक्राइब टू माई चैनल एंड क्लिक द बेल आईकॉन सो देट यू नेवर मिस एनी अपडेट सो यर दिस इज द कोड एंड लेट्स ए वी आर गिवन विद दिस एरे विच इज सॉर्टेड इन असेंडिंग ऑर्डर एंड आवर टास्क इज टू रिमूव द डुप्लीकेट्स नाउ एज द एरे इज सॉर्टेड द डुप्लीकेट्स विल बी एडजस्टेंट टू ईच अदर सो वेन वी कॉल दिस मैथड द फर्स्ट थिंग वी डू इज वी क्रिएट दिस टू पॉइंटर्स आई एंड जे वेर जे इज अवर फास्ट पॉइंटर इट ट्रेवर्स द एरे फ्रॉम इंडेक्स वन टू इंडेक्स सेवन एंड आई विल स्टार्ट फ्रॉम वन बिकॉज दिस जीरो इज ऑलरेडी एट इट्स करेक्ट प्लेस एंड यूनिक सो वी डोंट टच द जीरो इंडेक्स एंड वी स्टार्ट फ्रॉम द फर्स्ट इंडेक्स सो वी स्टार्ट जे ऑल्सो फ्रॉम द इंडेक्स वन एंड वाई वी आर स्टार्टिंग फ्रॉम जे इक्वल टू वन इज वी सिंपली कंपेयर द करंट एंड द प्रीवियस एलिमेंट सो वी स्टार्ट फ्रॉम इंडेक्स वन एंड जे विल ट्रेवल टिल नम्स डॉट लेंथ सो नम्स डॉट लेंथ इज एट सो वन इज लेस देन एट सो दिस कंडीशन कम्स आउट टू बी ट्रू एंड द फॉर लूप विल एग्जीक्यूट नाउ इन द फॉर लूप वॉट वी डू इज वी सिंपली कंपेयर द टू एडजस्ट एंड वैल्यूज विच इज द वैल्यू एट जेथ इंडेक्स एंड द वैल्यू एट जे माइनस वन एथ इंडेक्स एंड वी चेक वेदर दे आर डुप्लीकेट्स और नॉट सो करंटली वैल्यू एट जेज इंडेक्स इज जीरो एंड जे माइनस वन एथ इंडेक्स इज ऑल्सो जीरो सो दे फॉर दिस कंडीशन कम्स आउट टू बी फॉल्स बिकॉज बोथ द वैल्यूज आर इक्वल सो वेन बोथ द वैल्यूज आर इक्वल इट मीन्स वी हे फाउंड अ डुप्लीकेट एंड वी डू नथिंग वी सिंपली इंक्रीमेंट जे जे बिकम्स टू टू इज लेस देन एट सो द फॉर लूप विल एग्जीक्यूट वैल्यू एट जे माइनस वन एथ इंडेक्स इज जीरो एंड वैल्यू एट जेथ इंडेक्स इज वन सो जीरो इज नॉट इक्वल टू वन सो दिस कंडीशन कम्स आउट टू बी ट्रू इट मीन्स वी हैव फाउंड वन यूनिक एलिमेंट विच वी नीड टू कीप इन द एरे बिकॉज द एडजस्ट एंड एलिमेंट्स आर डिफरेंट इट मीन्स दिस वैल्यू इज द फर्स्ट एंटीजर विच इज यूनिक सो वी नीड टू कीप दिस वैल्यू इन द एरे सो द इव फ्लॉक विल एग्जीक्यूट एंड वी नो दैट इंडेक्स आई विल एक्चुअली हेल्प अस इन प्लेसिंग दिस वैल्यू एट इट्स प्रॉपर पोजिशन सो वी सिंपली असाइन नम्स ऑफ जे टू नम्स ऑफ आई सो वन कम्स हियर एंड वी नो दैट नेक्स्ट यूनिक एलिमेंट शुड कम हियर सो वी सिंपली इंक्रीमेंट आई सो आई बिकम्स टू वी इंक्रीमेंट जे सो जे बिकम्स थ्री थ्री इज लेस देन एट वी कंपेयर दिस टू वैल्यूज नाउ एंड वन इज नॉट इक्वल टू टू सो दे फॉर दिस कंडीशन कम्स आउट टू बी ट्रू इट मीन्स वी हैव फॉन्ड वन मोर एलिमेंट विच इज टू विच इज यूनिक इन दिस एरे एंड विच वी नीड टू एक्चुअली कीप इन द एरे सो द कंडीशन इन इव लॉक कम्स आउट टू बी ट्रू एंड वी असाइन दिस वैल्यू टू नम्स ऑफ आई बिकॉज आई इज एक्चुअली होल्डिंग दैट प्लेस वेर वी कैन ओनली इंसर्ट अ यूनिक एलिमेंट सो वाई आर दिस असाइनमेंट टू कम्स हियर and next unique element should come here so we simply increment i i becomes 3 we increment j j becomes 4 4 is less than 8 so this for loop will execute so now we are comparing this two values so condition in if block comes out to be false and we do nothing we increment j J becomes five. Five is less than eight, so the for loop will execute. And now we are comparing these two elements, so the condition in if block comes out to be false. We simply increment J. J becomes six, and six is less than eight, so this for loop will execute. and now we are comparing these two elements so 2 is not equal to 4 so this condition comes out to be true and we have found one more element which is 4 which is unique and which we need to keep in the array so the if block will execute and how we will keep this value 4 in the arrays we simply assign value at j index to value at i index so this 4 will come here and we know that the next unique element should come here 
so we simply increment i i becomes 4 we simply increment j j becomes 7 7 is less than 8 so this for loop will execute now we will compare these two elements so here both the elements are equal it means we haven't found any unique element so the condition in if block comes out to be false we increment j so j becomes 8 and 8 is not less than 8 it means we have traversed all the elements of this array so this for loop will terminate and here you can see whatever the value i is holding that will be our answer so if we count the unique elements we have 1 2 3 4 and here we can see as the array starts from 0th index so whatever the value i is holding which is 4 will give the total number of elements which are unique in this array which is 4 so we simply return 4 from this method so that is our answer and we have also modified the array in place so friend this was all about remove duplicates from sorted array i hope you must have liked this video thanks have a nice day hello everyone so in this video we are going to discuss a very famous interview problem which is threesome problem so in this problem we are given an array of distinct integers now our task is to print all such triplets such that they add up to a specific target and the triplet should be ordered in ascending order so let's say we are given an array of integers now these are actually distinct integers 2 4 3 7 1 8 9 0 we need to print all such triplets such that they add up to a specific target so we have been provided with the array and a target value the triplet should be ordered in ascending order so we need to find three numbers such a way that when we add them we get a target of six and that two number should be in ascending order so for example 0 plus 2 plus 4 will give 6 and here 0 2 and 4 are in ascending order 1 plus 2 plus 3 will also give us 6 1 2 3 are in ascending order so we need to find all such triplets with sum up to a specific target and they are ordered in ascending order so let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step So here this is the algorithm where method name is threesome we are given an array and a target. Let's say we are given with an array having 6 elements 2 4 3 7 1 0 and a target let's say 6. So when we call threesome method we pass the array and the target as 6. So friends, basic idea behind this algorithm is first we sort the array second we use three pointers so when we sort the array we can print the triplets in ascending order so that is one of the use case and the second use case is when we sort the array we can use three pointers which can provide us three numbers which add up to a specific target and that too with a optimized time complexity so here the three pointers we use are i j and k which we will be seeing later here so these three pointers will give us three different numbers from the array we will take up their sum and print it on the console if sum is equal to target. So let's see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step. So in the first step we are actually sorting the array in ascending order. So 2, 4, 3, 7, 1, 0 will be sorted and it will become 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 7. Moving ahead. Now as we discussed that we will be using three pointers 
I, J and K. So for I, it will start from zero and it will go to array dot length minus two. So we will see why we are taking minus two later. But it will start from zero and it will go to index three, which is array dot length six minus two four. So here less than means that it will go till three. We will see later that why we are taking array dot length minus two. So currently, I will start from zero. It means it will be pointing to the zeroth index of the array. Now, as we need to find the three numbers which are distinct, so the J pointer will start from I plus one. So here, whenever this for loop will start with any value of I, J will start from a Value just ahead of it. So value of J will start from one, and we will take the K pointer. We will start it from array dot length minus one. It means the third pointer will start from the the last index, which is array dot length six minus one, which is five. So K will start from five. We will see its significance that why we are starting it from array dot length minus one. Moving ahead, so friends, as we have now pointed i, j, and k to three different indexes, we will try to find out the sum of these three numbers, and then we will figure out whether they are equal to the target or not. So this for loop will actually help us in traversing i. And this while loop will help us in traversing J and K. So as we want to find the three distinct numbers, we have provided a while loop, and the condition is J should be less than K. So here J and K will traverse through this array. J will traverse in this direction, and K will traverse in this direction, covering up the elements. So this while loop will go till J is less than K, because if J will be equal to K. Both J and K will point to the same number, which we don't want. So J should be less than K. In the first step, what we are doing is we are calculating the sum of array at ith index, at jth index, and at the kth index, because we need to find out the triplets. So I, J, and K will provide us that triplet. So when we do sum of zero, one. And seven, we get eight. So sum will become eight. Now we simply check whether sum is actually equal to our target or not. So our target is six, and sum we want is eight. So this condition comes out to be false. So here, as i is fixed at zero index, we have sorted the array in ascending order. It means. Whatever value will come after one will be greater than one, and whatever value will come before seven will be lesser than seven, because the array is sorted. Now, when we compared sum with target, we found out that sum is actually greater than target. Sum value is eight, and it is greater than target. So somehow we need to reduce the value of sum in the next iteration so that it matches the target. So what we do is we provide these two conditions. We check whether sum, if it is not equal to target, we check whether it is less than target or it is greater than target. So currently, if sum is greater than target, it means we need to reduce the sum. So here array is sorted, i is fixed. The only option we have is to move j this direction or k this direction. If we move i this direction, in the next iteration when we will do sum, the sum will become zero plus two plus seven, which will give us nine, which is actually more than the current sum and which we don't want. So let's say if we move k this direction, so k will come here, and if we do sum in the next iteration, we will get zero. Plus one, plus four, which will be equal to five. 
which is actually reducing the sum to get it more closer to 6. So here as the array is sorted, when sum is greater than the target, we actually move k to this direction so that in the next iteration, the sum will become closer to 6, which is our target. And if sum is less than target, then we move j to this direction because that will only increase the sum and then it will match our target. So currently, sum is greater than target. So this condition also comes out to be false. So the only option we have is when sum is greater than target, we move k to this direction because in the next iteration, it will help us in minimizing this sum. So here, the condition is if sum is greater than target, move k left. If sum is less than target, move j to right. So currently sum is greater than target. So we will move k left. So k will become 4. We are simply moving it one position here. j is still less than k. So this condition comes out to be true. We will evaluate sum again. 0 plus 1 plus 4 will give sum as 5. So sum will become 5. We compare whether sum is equal to target or not. So sum is not equal to target. So this condition comes out to be false. And as the condition has come out to be false, we provide these two conditions. We check whether sum is less than target or sum is greater than target. If sum is less than target, then we move j to right because if we move j to right, we will get a value higher than the current value of array at jth index. And when we will do sum in the next iteration, we will get 0 plus 2 plus 4, which will be equal to 6. So here, when we need to reduce the sum, we move k to this direction. When we need to increase the sum so that it matches the target, we move j to this direction. So currently sum is less than target. We need to increase the sum. So we do j++. j becomes 2. So j comes here. j is less than k. Now we'll again evaluate the sum. So 0 plus 2 plus 4 will give sum as 6. So sum will become 6. So here you can see when we provide this condition that whether sum is equal to target or not. So this condition comes out to be true. It means we have found one of the triplet which is 0, 2 and 4 whose sum is equal to the target. So we are simply printing the value at ith index, jth index and kth index on the console. So it will print 0, 2, 4, 0, 2, 4. And as i is fixed, j value is used up, k value is used up. So here what we do is we increment j and we decrement k because 0, 2, 4 is already being found. If we only increment j, it will come to this position. So 0 plus 3 plus 4 will never give us a sum of 6 because 0, 2, 4 has already given us the sum of 6. And as these are the distinct integers, here value cannot be 2. It can be only greater than 2. So therefore, if we increment j, we also decrement k because we will never find any such pair if it would have been duplicated values and here would have been 2 then we have incremented only j so we would have found another triplet 0 2 and 4 but here as these are the distinct integers 
therefore when we increment j we will never find any such other triplet whose sum will be equal to target so 0 plus 3 plus 4 will give us sum as 7 so therefore to keep k at this position is also useless so we decrement k also so first we'll increment j j becomes 3 and then we decrement k Now here you can see j is actually equal to k. So therefore this file loop will terminate because we need to find a triplet which is unique. So j and k cannot be pointing to the same number and bringing up the sum. So this file loop will terminate. So the call will reach here. Now we will simply increment i by one position by i plus plus so i will become 1 now we have seen all such pairs which can form a triplet with a value as 0 and we have used up index 0 so when we will start i from 1 we will not go behind the value of i because that we have already seen so the new j value will be i plus 1 which is 2 and k we will take as array dot length minus 1 which is the last index j is less than k we will take some of these three values value at i th index j th index and k th index we will do their sum so 1 plus 2 will give 3 3 plus 7 will give 10 so sum will become 10 it is not equal to target sum is not less than target so this condition also will come out to be false sum is greater than target an array is sorted so if we move k to left we will get a smaller number so that in the next iteration this sum will be reduced and can match to the target because currently sum is greater than target we need to reduce this sum Currently the value is 7 which is being used up in forming the sum. If we shift k this side we will get a lesser value. So in the next iteration our sum will be more closer to target. So therefore we are decrementing k. So k becomes 4. j is less than k. We again do the sum. So 1 plus 2 will give 3. 3 plus 4 will give 7. So sum will become 7. So here you can see why we moved k to this direction is in this iteration we actually reduce the sum from 10 to 7. Sum is still not equal to target. Sum is not less than target. So we need to reduce sum further down. So we simply do k minus minus. So k will become 3. j is less than k, j value is 2 and k value is 3. So j is less than k. Now we will do sum of these three values 1 plus 2 plus 3 which will give us sum as 6. So sum is equal to target. It means we have found one more triplet. So we will print it on the console 1 2 3 1 2 3 and then we simply increment j and decrement k. So j will become 3 and k will become 2 like this. Now this while loop will terminate because j is actually greater than k. We will increment i again. i will become 2. We have used up these elements. So our j pointer will become i plus 1 which will start from third index and k will start from the last index. j is less than k. 
we will take the sum of these three indices at their respective array positions. 2 plus 3 plus 7 will give sum as 12. Sum is not equal to target. Sum is not less than target. It is actually greater than target. So we need to reduce the sum. And when we reduce the sum, we simply decrement k. k will become 4. j is less than k. The new sum will be 2 plus 3, 5 plus 4 will give 9. So sum is reduced, but still it is greater than target. So sum is not equal to target. Sum is not less than target. It is actually greater than target. So we again decrement k. So k will become 3. So here you can see j and k are now pointing to the third index. So therefore this while loop will terminate. Because j is actually equal to k. Because we need to find triplets which are unique. So all these pointers should point to a different values of the array. We will increment i. i becomes 3. We have used this position. So here you can see, if we calculate array dot length, we will get 6. If we do minus 2, we will get 4. So i is still less than 4 because it is pointing to third index. And here you can see that why we have provided this condition is because we need to give space for the other two pointers as well. One can occupy this position, other can occupy this position. If I would have traveled all the way across the array, say for example, if I would have reached here, so J would have started from here. And k would have also started from here. Which we don't want because we want j should be less than k. So at least we need to give space for two elements. So therefore we are taking it as i should be less than array dot length minus 2. We are doing minus 2 because one slot will be taken by j and other slot can be taken up by k properly. So this condition is still true that i is less than array dot length minus 2. So j will start from fourth index. k will start from the last index. j is less than k. We will do the sum. 3 plus 4 plus 7 will give 14. Sum is not equal to target. Sum is not less than target. If we want to reduce the sum, we have to decrement k to reach here. So k will become 4. And as we have decremented k, j and k are pointing to the same index. So therefore this while loop will terminate. And again when we will increment i, i will become 4. So 4 is not less than array dot length minus 2. 6 minus 2 is array dot length minus 2 which is 4. 4 is not less than 4. So therefore this for loop will terminate. And once this for loop will terminate, our method will also get terminated. And whatever we have got as a triplet, we have printed on the console, which is 0, 2, 4, 1, 2, 3. Which are the three numbers which add up to a target of 6 and they are in ascending order. So friend, this was all about the threesome problem. Where we use the technique of sorting and three pointers to figure out which are those triplets which add up to a target. I hope you must have liked this video. In case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update.
थैंक्स एवर नाइस डे हेलो एवरी वन सो इन दिस वीडियो वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस ए प्रॉब्लम प्रोडक्ट ऑफ एरे एक्सेप्ट सेल्फ सो लेट सी वॉट दिस प्रॉब्लम इज एंड हाउ टू सॉल्व दिस सो इन दिस प्रॉब्लम वी आर गिवन एन एरे ऑफ इंटीजर्स वी नीड टू रिटर्न एन एरे रिजल्ट सच दैट वैल्यू एट इंडेक्स आई इज एक्चुअली इक्वल टू द प्रोडक्ट ऑफ ऑल एलिमेंट्स ऑफ एरे एक्सेप्ट द एलिमेंट एट इंडेक्स आई सो इन द रिजल्ट एरे लेट से एनी इंडेक्स आई वी नीड टू स्टोर द प्रोडक्ट ऑफ ऑल द एलिमेंट्स of the given array leaving the element at that respective index so when we are doing the product the values are given in such a way that product fits in the 32 bit integer one constraint is the algorithm should run in o of n time and without using the division operator so let's understand the problem with an example let's say we are given an array having four elements 1 2 3 4 now in the result array we need to store the product of all the elements of array in such a way that let's say if we are on index 1 so this is 0 index this is 1 this is 2 and this is 3 so let's say at index 1 we have value 2 so in the result array we need to store at index 1 product of all the numbers in this array excluding 2 so for example at index 0 we have 1 so we can directly do the product of rest of the elements 2 into 3 6 6 into 4 is 24 so we can directly place 24 here we haven't included 1 into the product now for index 1 at index 1 we are storing the product of rest of the elements excluding 2 so 1 into 3 is 3 3 into 4 is 12 so we are storing 12 here for index 2 we will exclude 3 we will take the product of rest of the element which is 4 into 2 8 8 into 1 8 so we are storing 8 here for the last index we will exclude 4 and we will take the product of rest of the elements 1 into 2 is 2 2 into 3 is 6 so we are storing 6 here so in this problem in the result array at any particular index let's say this index we are storing the product of rest of the elements excluding the element at that particular index so friends we don't have to use the division operator or else the problem would have been very simple we could have multiplied all the numbers so for example if we take the product of all the numbers we will get 24 Now let's say if we want to fill for the index one excluding two, so we would have directly divided it by two. It would have given twelve, and we would have placed twelve here. So we don't have to use the division operator. And secondly, we need to solve this problem in O of n time. So here you can see if we use two for loops. The nested for loops. the time complexity will be o of n square so the first for loop will traverse the element one by one and the inner for loop will travel rest of the elements take their product and store it at the respective index of the outer for loop iterator so the time complexity would have been o of n square so we need to solve this problem in o of n time so now let's see the algorithm and the demonstration of that algorithm step by step So friends before we start in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update Now here we will call find product method we will pass this array having four elements 1 2 3 4 So so friends how we will solve this problem in o of n time is we will traverse this array two times one in this direction and other in this direction and let's say this is our result array so when we will traverse in this direction let's say if we take the example of index 
दिस एलिमेंट नाउ एट दिस इंडेक्स वी नीड टू एक्सक्लूड थ्री एंड स्टोर द प्रोडक्ट ऑफ रेस्ट ऑफ द एलिमेंट्स बट हियर यू कैन सी एट इंडेक्स टू वी आर डूइंग द प्रोडक्ट ऑफ दिस टू एलिमेंट्स विच इज ऑन द लेफ्ट साइड and all the elements on the right side and excluding 3 so when we will traverse the array from the left side in the result array we will store the product of the left part of the array and when we will traverse from the right side we will include the elements of the right part of this index so when we will traverse from the left we will do the product of the left part store it here and when we will traverse from the right side we will take this value whatever value is stored here we will do their product and we will place it here so in the left part we are doing 1 into 2 we will place 2 here and when we are traveling from the right we will take the value 4 multiplied with 2 and store 8 here so this we will do for all the elements at the respective indexes and finally we will get the result array so first we are traveling from the left direction so at the start we are creating a temporary variable assigning it a value of 1 we will see its significance later so temp is equal to 1 we will create the result array like this and as total length of array is 4 we will initialize the result array with array dot length which is 4 now we will start the for loop from index 0 and go till the end of the array so at the start i will be equal to 0 which is pointing to the zero index now as we discussed when we are traveling in left direction we will store the product of the left side elements so currently for index 0 there are no elements in the left side and here we have created a temporary variable assign it a value 1 so we will directly store one here which is the value stored in temp because there are no elements in the left part of index 0 and we also know that anything multiplied by 1 will give the same result so therefore we are initializing temp with 1 so here we will get value as 1 moving ahead now for the next index let's say for 2 we need to take the product of the left part so here as we are assigning temp directly to the result at a particular index here what we are doing is we are taking the product of temp with the previous value and then we are storing it in the result array so for the next iteration we have to take product of the left part currently here we have only one element which is 1 so we are multiplying temp with the value stored at index i which is index 0 so temp becomes 1 because 1 into 1 gives 1 you will understand more about this step when we move ahead so now we'll increment i i becomes 1 now as temp is storing the product of the previous elements we will directly take the value of temp and store it in the result array at ith index so 1 will be stored here because value of temp is 1 so friends the next iteration i will reach here so for index 2 we need the product of left side we need product of 1 and 2 so temp already has product of this part here we will multiply it with array of i which is we will multiply it with 2 and we will get the product of this two elements and that product we can safely store here because when we are traversing from the left side for this particular index we will only store the product of these two elements and currently as you have already stored the value of temp into result i which is 1 here 
if we multiply temp with current element we will get the overall product of these two elements so the new value of temp will be 2 into 1 which will give us 2 we will increment i i becomes 2 and we know that temp already has the product of its two previous values which is 1 into 2 so we will first directly store 1 into 2 which is 2 at index 2 of the result array so this step does that so 2 comes here now when we will move to the next element we need to include 3 also in the product because for index 3 which is this index we need to take the product of these three elements we already know the product of these two elements which is stored in the temp if we multiply it with 3 which is the current element at index i we will get the product of three elements previous to third index so therefore we are multiplying temp with the current index value of array which is 3 here so 3 Into two will give six. So ten becomes six, which makes sense because one into two into three will give six, which we can use directly in the next iteration. So we'll increment i. I becomes three. So in the result array at third index, we will first directly store the value of ten. which is 6 so here you can see for third index the product of its previous values is 6 1 into 2 into 3 6 and we are storing 6 here and as we are traveling from the left side we are only looking in the elements which are on the left part of the particular index so as there are no more elements left this product makes no sense so temp into array of i 4 into 6 will give 24 so temp will become 24 but it is of no use because there are no elements going further so we'll increment i i will become 4 and this for loop will terminate because 4 is not less than array dot length which is 4 so when we had traverse from the left side in this direction we stored the product of the left part so now we'll again initialize temp with 1 so temp becomes 1 and now we will traverse from the right side so here i starting from array dot length which is 4 minus 1 which will give us 3 which means we are starting from the third index and this loop will go till i greater than or equal to 0 so friends we also discussed that let's say if we want to fill for index 2 we need product of these two elements and whatever the product will come which is 2 here we will multiply it with the right side elements which is 4 here so 2 into 4 will give 8 and we will store 8 here so in the result array we are already having the product of the left part of each index now we simply need to take the value of the right part do their product and whichever value is stored here we simply need to multiply it with that value so now that thing we will do when we are traversing from the right side so at the result array at the ith index so currently we are at the third index whatever value is stored is actually stored of the product of its previous numbers and as index 3 has no elements to its right we will simply multiply whatever value is stored here into temp which is 1 and store it back into the result array so for index 3 at result of i we will take 6 which is this value we will multiply it with temp which is 1 which will give us 6 and we will assign 6 back to index 
at the result array. So it will remain six. So here we are doing the same steps. For index two, we need product of its elements which are on its right side. So temp value is one. We will multiply it with four, and we will get the product of its right side elements. So temp becomes four. We will decrement i. So i will come at index two. Now at this index, you will understand the algorithm more. What we are trying to achieve is in the result array for index two, we need to store the product of the elements excluding index two, which is three. So one into two, which is on the left part. Excluding three and taking in remaining element, which is on the right part. So one into two will give two, two into four, which will give us eight. So we need to store eight here. Now, in the result array, we are already having the product of the left part, which is two here. We need to simply multiply this two with the product of its right part. So currently it's four, which is stored in the temp. So result of i which is two multiplied by four, which is temp. So value stored at result of i multiplied by temp will give the actual product of all the elements excluding this index, because temp is already having product of its numbers on the right side. So two into four will give eight. And we will assign eight back to the result array at index i, so eight will come here. Now we will multiply three with temp, which will give us twelve, and we'll assign twelve to temp. So why we are doing it? Because in the next iteration, so when we will decrement i, i will come to index one. Now for this index, we already have the product of its left element here in the result array. We need the product of its right part. Previous value of temp was four, and we multiplied it with three, which gave us value as twelve. So temp is currently having value twelve, which is the Product of all the elements on the right side. So, for filling the value of index one, we need product of the left side, which is one, which we already calculated. We will exclude this element, and we need the product of the right side, which is already stored in the temp. So, value at result array the ith index, which is one, will give product of the left part. Temp will give product of the right part. When we will multiply them, we will get one into twelve, which is twelve. So one into twelve, which is temp, will give twelve. So twelve will come here. And for the zeroth index, we need product of the right part. So temp already has product of three and four, which is twelve. We will multiply it with the two, which is the array element at index i. So temp will become twenty-four. We will decrement i. So i will come as index zero. Now at index zero, we need to simply put the product of all the elements on the right side. Their product with Product of the elements on the left side. So left side doesn't have any value because we have value is one here. We will take value one, multiply it with value of temp, which is twenty-four, and we will assign it back to the result array. So here it will come twenty-four, and then we will evaluate temp again, which actually is of no use because we have already 
filled all the positions here. So the new value of temp will be temp which is 24 into array of i which is 1 which will give 24. So now we will decrement i and this for loop will terminate because value of i will become minus 1 and minus 1 is not greater than or equal to 0. So this for loop will terminate and at the end we will simply return the resultant array. So friends the basic idea behind solving this problem is we need to do two traversal one is from the left side and one is from the right side. When we are traversing from the left side we will only see the elements which are on the left part of any particular index. We will do their product and we will store that value in the result array and that will be done from the left part. Now when we are traversing from the right part, let's say for index 2, when we had completed from the left part, we had product of these two elements. So in the result array, the value would have been 2 because 1 into 2 will give 2. When we are traversing from the right side, we need product of the right part. So currently as there is only one element which is 4, we will take 4 multiplied with 2 which will give us 8 and we will store 8 back here. And this we will do for all the elements. So it's very simple for any index i. This is left part. This is right part. We are excluding the current element left into right and whatever we get value we will store back it here in the result array. So we are excluding this part. We are taking left part. We are taking right part product. We are doing their product and storing back at the respective index. So friends I hope you must have liked this video. In case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update. Thanks have a nice day. Hello everyone. So in this video we are going to discuss sliding window maximum problem. So let's move ahead and see what this problem is and how to solve this. So in this problem we are given an array of integers and we are given a sliding window of size k. So it means we are given with this array and a value k which is the size of sliding window. Now this sliding window is moving from very left of the array to very right. So this sliding window is starting from 0th index having a size of 3 and it is moving from left to right. And as it is moving from left to right we can only see that many numbers. So at the start we can see only 44, 77, 33. So it means we can only see k numbers of the array at a time. And this sliding window is moving into this direction by 1 1 position. So first we will see 44, 77, 33. Then we will see 77, 33, 44. Then we will see 33, 44, 88. And at the last we will see 44, 88 and 11. So for this array with the sliding window of size 3, what we need to find is for every window which we saw. So we need to find max among this 3. And then sliding window will move ahead. So then it will see this 3 elements. And then we have to find the maximum among this 3. So which is 77 again. So similarly till the end we need to find the maximum in the sliding window. So this is the output for this array having the sliding window of size 3. Now how this output came. Here you can see in the first sliding window 44, 77, 33. The max value among this 3 element is 77. So for this sliding window the max is 77. Then this sliding window will move ahead. So 44 will go out and this 44 will come in. So now among this 3 elements 77, 33, 44, 77 is max. So in this sliding window the max would be 77. Similarly sliding window will move ahead. Now we have 33, 44 and 88. So among this 3 elements 88 is max. And at the end the sliding window will reach to the end of the array. 
so among these three elements 44 88 and 11 the max is 88 now let's move on and see that how we can solve this problem suppose friends we are given with this array and we need to find the max in the sliding window so here in order to solve this problem there are various solutions so one such solution is is to find the next greater element of each and every element in this array so the problem of next greater element we already discussed in one of our previous video you can watch that video to understand more about this algorithm in this video i will be demonstrating the next greater element problem as well so here actually what we do is for each and every element you see here we find its first next greater element towards right so if you see for 44 if we look in this side we just see the first next greater element to 44 so currently 77 is greater than 44 so it becomes the first next greater element of 44 like this then we look at 77 if we look in this direction 33 is less than 77 44 is less than 77 88 is greater than 77 and it is first next greater element towards right of 77 So here 88 becomes the first next greater element to 77. Similarly for 33, if we look in this direction, 44 and 88 both are greater than 33, but the first next greater is 44. So the answer will be 44. For 44 it will be 88. For 88 here we have only 11. So therefore there is no element in the right of 88 which is greater than 88. so in our previous video we discussed that we simply return minus 1 because there are no elements greater than 88 towards its right and similarly with 11 as it is the last element there are no elements after that so for 11 also our answer becomes minus 1 so in that video this was our output and our answer so we will use the same algorithm here but there will be a slight difference so here you can see below i have written the next greater element of each and every value of this array so in our previous video in the next greater element array we actually return this as our output but now instead of this as our output first we will evaluate the indexes of this elements and we actually store the indexes in the next greater element array so for example for 77 if you see has index 1 so instead of storing 77 we will store 1 like this so these are the indexes of this next greater elements so for example for 77 our answer was 88 so if you see 88 is at index 4 so we are storing 4 here i'll remove this here if you see for 33 its next greater is 44 which lies at index 3 so we are storing index 3 for 44 the next greater is 88 which lies at index 4 so we are storing 4 here and for 88 there is no greater element towards its right so therefore as we are storing indexes here here if you see the last index is fifth index so we are storing a greater value to 5 which signifies that we have gone out of the boundaries of this array so we are simply storing 6 so this 6 is nothing but array dot length which signifies that for 88 there was no greater element towards its right and for 11 as well so we are storing 6 6 and the value we are taking as minus 1 and minus 1 here we need to store an index which is out of the boundaries of this array so that we can justify that for 88 there is no greater element towards its right and for 11 there is no greater element towards its right so we are storing the index is array dot length so here you can see if we are on at index 0 for example we see there is a value 44 now if we go to the index 0 of next greater element array we see there is a value 1 this value is only for demo purposes i have written here but actually we will be playing with this value and this value so at 0th index we have 44 and we need to find its next greater element So what we do is we simply go to this array. We see there is a value one, and we know that this is actually an index. So what we do is 
we simply go to the original array at index 1 and whatever value here it is we simply say that this value 77 is next greater to 44. So it goes like this from here first we go here and then we go here to find the next greater. Now similarly if you want to find that what's the next greater to 33 we simply go to index 2 we see there is a value 3. So we go back to index 3 and we find 44 and we know that 44 is next greater to 33. So friends our problem is to find the maximum in the sliding window. So how this next greater element array is helping us in finding that is Let's say for example, this is our sliding window. Here we have taken k as 3. And let's say, after evaluating the maximum of the sliding window, the sliding window reached here. And now let's say we want to find the max among these three elements. And we actually know that it is 88. So here what we do is, the step 1 is, from where our sliding window is starting, we take that element. So currently it is 33. We take 33 and assume that it is the max in this sliding window. And here you can see it is at index 2. But we know that 33 is not the max in this sliding window. So what we do is, this is our assumption. In the second step what we do is, we simply go to the next greater element array at index 2. And we see there is an index 3. Which means that if we go to index 3, we will find an element which is greater than 33. So here what we do is, if you see, the window is starting from index 2 and the value of k we are taking as 3 for example. So we know that this window will go till 2 plus 3 minus 1 which is till 4th index, this index. So we are taking 3 elements because value of k is 3 from index 2 to 4. So starting is 2, this is our k and if we do minus 1 we will reach the last index. So when we find 3 here, we first check whether this index is in the range of the sliding window or not. So here you can see 3 actually lies in the range of sliding window. So this point suggests that there is an element greater than 33 and it lies in this sliding window which is 44. So therefore, this 33 which was our assumption is wrong and now what we do is we simply go to this element 44 and assume that now it is our maximum. So we reach here at the 44 but still we are not sure that 44 is max or not. So what we do is we simply go to the index 3 which is of 44 in the next greater element array. Here we find a value as 4 which is the index 4 and we also see that 4 is actually in the boundaries of the sliding window which suggests that at index 4 there is a next greater element to 44 and this element is also in the range of the sliding window. So our assumption that 44 was max is also wrong. So now what we do is we simply now go to 88 here and we assume that now 88 is our max. But now what we do is we simply go to the index 4 here. And we see we have value as 6. And then what we do is we take this 6. And before going to the 6th index, which is out of this array, what we first check is whether this 6 is in the boundaries of this sliding window or not. So the maximum range of this sliding window is 4. And we know that the next greater element 288 is at index 6, which is out of the boundaries of this sliding window. It means let's say at index 6 here, we have one element 100, like this. So here for 88 we know that if we go to the index 6, we will find 100. But this 100 is not lying in this sliding window and we need to find the maximum in the sliding window. So we know that for 88, its next greater is 100, but it is lying at index 6. It is not in this sliding window. So it means we are 100% sure that 88 is max in this sliding window. So therefore we use this algorithm and we can come to know that 88 is max in this sliding window. So this approach we do for every sliding window. 
like this and what we do is we take the first element we assume it's the max in this sliding window but to confirm that we take this index we go to the next greater array at index 2 we pick the index of the next greater to 33 which is this index and the element is 44 and as the index is 3 we check whether this index 3 is actually in the range of the sliding window here it is from 2 to 4 and 3 actually lies between 2 to 4 so therefore we know that 33 cannot be our max in this sliding window because there is one more element in this sliding window which is greater than 33 which is 44 and similarly with 44 we found that its next greater is 88 and this 88 is also lying in this sliding window range so then we came to 88 and for 88 we found that its next greater is at index 6 here index is out of the range of this array but let's suppose even if the index is had any value let's say 100 but we know that we have to find the max in this sliding window and the next greater to 88 is 100 which is out of this window so therefore our answer would be 88 for this window so friends here is the importance that why we are actually storing the indexes instead of actual values because this window of size k is actually dealing with the indexes and we need to find the index of the elements next greater so therefore instead of storing the actual values in this array which we also saw in the previous video we are actually storing the indexes now the algorithm is very much similar but the only difference is instead of these numbers of next greater we are actually storing their indexes so let's move ahead and see the demonstration of the algorithm step by step so friends before we start in case if you want to master algorithms and data structures you can subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update so here we will call the max sliding window method by passing in the array so this is our array and the sliding window size is 3 so value of k is 3 so here the return type of this method is list because we need to return the max of sliding windows among this array which we will store and we will return so here at step 1 what we are doing is we are simply calling next creator element method we are passing in the array so this algorithm we have already discussed in our previous video i will also demonstrate one more time because the only difference is we are storing the indexes in this array not the actual values so when this method will be called this is our array so at step 1 we will create the result array now this result array will store the next greater elements so now as we need to find the next greater elements of this array what we do is we take the help of stack so first we create a stack so stack is leafo data structure which means the element inserted last will be the first to be removed so we will use this property and we will figure out the next greater element of all these elements so now we will provide a for loop where this i will start from the last index which is array dot length minus 1 and i will go till it is equal to 0 it means it will travel in this direction and it will reach till index 0 and i will help us in placing the next greater element of each and every index so we are starting from the last index because it will make our job easy to find the next greater element towards right so first we are actually finding the next greater element of 11 so as 11 is the last index and we know that there is no next greater element to 11 so here we are providing this if block we will discuss this later which says that we first check whether stack is empty or not so currently stack is empty it means this condition comes out to be false and actually this stack will hold the next greater elements in the stack for the remaining array so as 11 is the last element we know that stack must be empty because there are no greater elements towards its right so we first check whether stack is empty or not so if stack is empty 
we simply put array dot length into the result of i. Why we are putting array dot length is because array dot length is six, and six suggests an index which is not in this array, which also suggests that for eleven there is no next greater elements towards its right. And we will also see that how this index will help us in later in the algorithm when we will find the max in the sliding window. So after the if else block, now this eleven can be a next greater element for the remaining array. So for example, instead of eighty eight, let's say if the value would have been nine. So for nine, eleven would be the next greater element because nine is less than eleven, and eleven is the only element. Towards its right, which is greater than nine. So therefore, we will push index five. It means we are pushing eleven on the stack, like this. So I will also write the values beside the index. We are actually storing the index in the stack because we need to get a result in the form of indexes. And you can assume that we are actually storing the values like eleven. Moving ahead. We will decrement i. Now stack is not empty. So the first thing we do is we provide a while loop. Now inside this while loop, what we are doing, we are first checking whether stack is empty or not. So stack is not empty. So this much condition is true. This condition is very important. Here what we are doing is we are first taking stack dot peak value. So if you see stack dot peak is five, and if I do array Of five, and then I do whether it is less than equal to array of four. It means we are comparing whether eleven is less than equal to eighty-eight or not. So this condition comes out to be true. So the while loop will execute, and what it will do is this eighty-eight will simply pop eleven out of the stack because we had placed eleven in the stack, thinking that there could be a lesser value here. For which eleven could become the next greater element, but as soon as we figured eighty-eight, this eighty-eight will discard this eleven, because for the remaining array, even if we have any value here, its next greater element will reach till eighty-eight, and it won't go beyond because eighty-eight is already greater than eleven, and eleven cannot be the next greater element of any of the element in the remaining array. Let's say if we had nine here, for example. So for nine also the next letter would become eighty eight. Let's say if we had ten here, so for ten also it would be eighty eight, and let's say if we had eleven, so for eleven also it would be eighty eight. But there would be no such value here for which eleven can become the next letter element because we have found one element which is already greater than eleven. So therefore the job of a greater value here is to remove the smaller values out of the stack. Because now they won't contribute in the next greater element, so first we pop five out of the stack. So now stack becomes empty. So this while loop will terminate. We check whether stack is empty or not, and we know that if stack is empty, it means for this value eighty eight, we didn't find any element which is greater than eighty eight because stack is empty. 88 will pop out the smaller elements and will stop till there are elements which are greater than 88 and those elements will lie for sure in the stack but if stack is empty after this while loop then for 88 there is no greater element towards its right so we simply put array dot length which we had placed for 11 which suggests that for 88 also there are no greater element towards its right moving ahead So now 88 can become the next greater element for remaining array till here. So we'll push the index of 88 here, which is 4, which corresponds to 88. We'll decrement i. I comes at index 3, and now we are figuring out the next greater element to 44. Stack is not empty, so this condition comes out to be true. in the while loop stack is not empty and first we will take the stack dot peak which is 4 so array of 4 we will compare whether it is less than equal to array of i which is 
थ्री सो हियर वी आर सिंपली कंपेयरिंग वेदर एटी एट इज लेस देन इक्वल टू फोर्टी फोर और नॉट सो दिस कंडीशन कम्स आउट टू बी फॉल्स विच सजेस्ट डेट फोर्टी फोर कैन नॉट पॉप एटी एट आउट ऑफ द स्टैक बिकॉज फोर्टी फोर इज लेस देन एटी एट एंड वी कांट पॉप एटी एट आउट ऑफ द स्टैक बिकॉज एटी एट कैन बिकम द नेक्स्ट क्रेटर एलिमेंट ऑफ द रिमेनिंग एरे सो हियर फॉर एग्जाम्पल फॉर सेवेंटी सेवन इट्स नेक्स्ट क्रेटर इज एटी एट ओनली सो देर फॉर इफ ए वैल्यू इज स्मॉलर इट कैन नॉट पॉप दिस एलिमेंट आउट ऑफ द स्टैक एंड इफ वैल्यू इज ग्रेटर इट कैन पॉप द एलिमेंट आउट ऑफ द स्टैक सो दिस कंडीशन वी नीड टू कीप इन माइंड सो फोर्टी फोर कैन नॉट पॉप दिस एलिमेंट आउट ऑफ द स्टैक बिकॉज दिस कंडीशन केम आउट टू बी फॉल्स एंड नाउ वी सिंपली चेक वेदर स्टैक इज एम टी और नॉट सो स्टैक इज नॉट एम टी सो द एल्स पार्ट विल बी एक्सिक्यूटेड एज स्टैक इज नॉट एम टी विच सजेस्ट डेट देर वुड बी सम एलिमेंट इन द स्टैक विच इज ग्रेटर देन फोर्टी फोर बिकॉज फोर्टी फोर कुड नॉट पॉप दैट एलिमेंट आउट ऑफ द स्टैक एंड डेट एलिमेंट विल बी फॉर श्योर ग्रेटर देन फोर्टी फोर सो एट द रिजल्ट ऑफ आई वी स्टोर स्टैक डॉट पीक विच इज द इंडेक्स और इनडायरेक्टली वी आर स्टोरिंग एटी एट सो वी आर स्टोरिंग इंडेक्स इन फोर एंड देन वी विल पुट वैल्यू ऑफ आई विच इज थ्री ऑन द स्टैक लाइक दिस बिकॉज दिस फोर्टी फोर कैन बिकम द नेक्स्ट ग्रेटर एलिमेंट फॉर द रिमेनिंग एरे सो फॉर एग्जाम्पल फॉर थर्टी थ्री एटी एट इज ऑल्सो नेक्स्ट ग्रेटर एलिमेंट फोर्टी फोर इज ऑल्सो नेक्स्ट ग्रेटर एलिमेंट बट फोर्टी फोर इज द फर्स्ट नेक्स्ट ग्रेटर एलिमेंट टू थर्टी थ्री देर फोर वी कॉन्ट डिस्कार्ड फोर्टी फोर वी हैव टू पुट इट ऑन द स्टैक लाइक दिस विल डिक्रीमेंट आय आय कम्स टू इंडेक्स टू स्टैक इज नॉट एम टी इन द वाइल लुक स्टैक इज नॉट एम टी एंड इफ यू डू स्टैक डॉट पीक वी विल गेट थ्री सो एरे ऑफ थ्री वी आर चेकिंग वेदर इट इज लेस देन इक्वल टू एरे ऑफ आय विच इज टू सो वी आर सिंपली चेकिंग वेदर फोर्टी फोर इज लेस देन इक्वल टू थर्टी थ्री और नॉट सो दिस कंडीशन कम्स आउट टू बी फॉल्स विच मेक्स सेंस बिकॉज थर्टी थ्री कैन नॉट पॉप फोर्टी फोर आउट ऑफ द स्टैक बिकॉज फोर्टी फोर is next greater to 33 and which is at the peak of the stack so therefore this while loop will terminate stack is not empty so this condition comes out to be false in the else part whatever is at the peak that will become the next greater to 33 so here we are storing stack dot peak which is 3 which suggests that we are storing a value 3 which is the third index value which is 44 this and then we will push 2 on the stack like this so let's say if we had 11 here so for 11 33 would have become the next greater element so therefore we can't discard 33 we have to push it on the stack so 2 comes here which is the index of 33 will decrement i stack is not empty so friend now here one critical step comes stack is not empty in the while loop we are checking array of 2 whether it is less than array of 1 or not so we are checking whether 33 is less than 77 or not which is true and we have already discussed here that if we find any value which is greater than the peak value of the stack this value will simply pop the element out of the stack because if we see the remaining elements in this direction let's say if we had more elements here 33 cannot become the next greater element for the remaining array because for the remaining array 77 can become the probable next greater element but 33 cannot because 33 is less than 77 and we need to find the next greater element so let's say if we had 2 here or let's say 33 here So for thirty three also the next greater would become seventy seven, and for no value here, thirty three can become the next greater because, so for example if we had eighty seven, so for eighty seven the next greater, if it is not seventy seven, then it will be eighty eight, but we are hundred percent sure it won't be thirty three, because thirty three is already lesser than seventy seven, so therefore, this condition comes out to be true, and seventy seven will pop thirty three out of the stack. because now we can safely discard this value it will play no role in finding the next greater element 
2 is popped out of the stack. Stack is still not empty. And here if you see this condition, we are checking array and passing stack dot peak which is 3. We are checking whether it is less than array of 1 or not. It means we are now checking 44 is less than 77 or not. So this condition comes out to be true. It means 77 has rights to pop 44 also out of the stack because 44 also will not be contributing in the next letter element because we have found already one value which is greater than 33 and 44. So first we have popped out 33. Now we are popping out 44 which is at index 3. So 3 will be popped out like this. Stack is still not empty. So now here array of stack dot peak which is 4 we are checking whether it is less than array of i so we are simply checking whether 88 is less than 77 or not so this condition comes out to be false because 77 cannot pop 88 out of the stack because 88 can become a probable next greater for the remaining elements in the array and in fact for 77 88 is the next greater element so therefore 77 will not be able to pop 88 out of the stack. So this while loop will terminate because this condition comes out to be false. Stack is not empty. So in the result array, we are simply putting stack dot peak. So if stack dot peak is not empty and whatever is at the top will become the next letter element for the current value which is 77. So we are storing 4 here which suggests that if you go to index 4 you will find 88 which is the next greater to 77 and similarly we will push 1 on the stack which is we are pushing 77 on the stack like this we will decrement i i comes to 0th index stack is not empty this condition also comes out to be false because 44 cannot pop 77 out of the stack because it is lesser than 77. So this while loop will terminate. Stack is not empty. So for 44 the next greater element would be whatever the element is on the peak of the stack which is index 1 value 77. So we put stack dot peak at the result array at ith index like this. And we push 0 on the stack. And if you decrement i, it goes beyond the boundaries of this array. So therefore, this for loop will terminate because i should be greater than or equal to 0. So then we will simply return the result which is actually storing the indexes of next letter elements. So this NGE array will have the indexes and I have just written the values for these indexes below that. So 44 is at 0th index, if we go to 0th index of next greater element array, you will find 1, which is the index. So if we go to index 1, you will find 77. So I have written 77 directly here, so that you can just relate that at 4, we have 88, like this. At 3, we have 44, like this. So now as we need to collect the max in sliding window, we create a list by name result like this. So this is a list of integers. And here you can see that now we will start the for loop from i equal to 0 from here. And this for loop will go till array dot length minus k. Why it is going till it is less than equal to array dot length minus k is if you see array dot length which is 6 if we do minus k which is 3 in our case. So it will give 3. So it suggests that i will go till index 3 because now in this for loop we are actually calculating the max in the sliding window and the last window will start from when i will be equal to 3 because the value of k is 3. So this window will go till this index from 3 to 5 and beyond that this condition will come out to be false and we will break from this for loop. So I will travel till index 3 because the last window will be this window. 
which will actually cover the last window which is the last three elements of this array and beyond that we don't have to go so i will travel till it is equal to 3 so when i is equal to 0 we are looking at the first window which will be from 0 to k minus 1 which is 0 plus 3 minus 1 which is 2 so it will grow from 0 to 2 so this is the first window of size 3 and now our target is to find the max in this window with the help of this next greater element array so as we have already discussed what we do is in the first step the element which is the beginning of this window we assume that it is the max in the sliding window so we are creating an integer value j which is our assumption that it always starts from the first element of this window so we are assuming 44 is max in this sliding window which is being denoted by j so j is also pointing to zeroth index like this because value of i is starting of this window from zero so j is also starting from zeroth index and now as we discussed that we need to confirm this assumption so what we do is we are providing this while loop and the condition in this while loop is for 44 which is at index 0 we simply go to this index we see there is 1 so we take this 1 out and then we are checking whether this 1 whether this lie in the range of this sliding window or not so here if you see if I do i plus k 0 plus 3 so this value will give 3 1 is less than 3 so it suggests that 444 which is at index 0 if we go to the next greater element array at index 0 we are finding a value 1 which suggests that 444 its next greater element lies at index 1 which is value 77 and this 77 is actually if you see it is in the range of our sliding window it means our assumption that 44 is max in this sliding window is false because the next greater element to 44 is 77 and this 77 is also in this sliding window so therefore now j will simply travel to index 1 because now our next assumption is 77 is the max in this sliding window so here we are doing that thing only 1 is less than 3 so this condition comes out to be true it means the next greater element for j which is 44 is 77 which is at index 1 and this one is lying in this sliding window so j will simply travel to that index which is the next greater element array of j which is 1 so it means j will directly shift to 1 suggesting that now our assumption is 77 is max in this sliding window so after this assignment j comes here and our assumption that 44 is max in this sliding window comes out to be false and now our new assumption is 77 is max in this sliding window but as this is a while loop we have to confirm that so now we are again checking that next greater element array of j which is 1 which is 77 which is our assumption we are going to this index we are finding a value 4 so now what we are doing this is giving us a value 4 so we are checking whether 4 is in this sliding window range or not and how we can figure out whether 4 lies in this sliding window is we know that sliding window starts from i so if we do 0 plus 3 it will give 3 and we have to do less than that so it will go till second index which is the first three elements from 0 to 2 but here 4 which we evaluated from this part that 77 if we go to this index next greater element array of j is 4 so this 4 is we are checking whether it is less than 3 or not so this condition comes out to be false which actually proves that 77 is max in this sliding window because the next greater element to 77 is 88 which is at index 4 which is actually beyond the boundaries of this window which proves that whatever element comes after the 77 in the sliding window will be lesser than 77 so therefore now this while loop will terminate because this condition comes out to be false 
and we have found the first max in the sliding window where window is starting from 0 and going till index 2. So in the result, we have to store 77 and 77 lies at array of j. So here you can see our assumption was correct here. So 77 becomes our first max in the sliding window. Moving ahead, now we'll increment i. So i will come here at index 1. Now which suggests that our sliding window will shift by one position ahead. So we are done with this value and sliding window will shift by one position ahead like this i plus k minus 1. So 1 plus 3 will give 4 minus 1 will give index 3. So it will take three values index 1, index 2 and index 3 because the size of this sliding window is k which is 3. And now we'll apply the same logic. We assume that the first value of this sliding window is maximum and j will point to that value. So i and j at the start are pointing to index 1 which is 77. So our assumption is 77 is max in this sliding window. Now to confirm that what we do is next greater element array of j. j is pointing to 1 so it means we are going to this index now. And here we are finding a value as 4, which means that at index 4, we have 88, which is the next greater element of 77. And here you can see 88 is next greater to 77, but 88 is not in the sliding window range. It is just outside the sliding window range. Therefore, we are 100% sure that whatever the elements are here, which is 33 and 44, they will be 100% sure lesser than 77, which means for this window, 77 will become our max because the next greater element to 77 is 88, which is at index 4 and it is lying outside the boundaries of this sliding window. So this condition, this part will give 4. We check whether it is less than i plus k which is 1 plus 3 which is 4. So 4 is not less than 4. So this condition comes out to be false. It means that our assumption at the start only that 77 is max in this sliding window comes out to be true. So in the result list, we will simply add the value at jth index. So array of j is 77. So it becomes like this. So we'll increment i, i comes to index 2, so our sliding window will shift ahead from 2 plus 3 minus 1 which is from 2 to 4th index and now our task is to find the max in this sliding window. So now you will understand more about the problem in this step. We assume that 33 is our max in this sliding window which is being pointed by i. So j starts from i which is 33. So this is our assumption. So now we will confirm this assumption based on this while loop. What we do is j is pointing to index 2, i is pointing to index 2 and we are assuming that 33 is max in this sliding window. So what we do is we just check that at index 2 in the next greater element array which index lies. So we find 3. And if we go to index 3, you will find 44, which is actually lying in this sliding window. So it means the next greater element to 33 is 44 and it is also lying in this sliding window. Therefore our assumption that 33 is max in this sliding window comes out to be false. And this condition comes out to be true because next greater element of array of j, which gives us value 3, we are checking whether this 3 is actually lying in the sliding window or not via this comparison. So we are checking whether it is less than i which is 2 plus 3. So we are checking whether 3 is less than 5 or not. So this condition comes out to be true which suggests that the next greater element to 33 which lies at index 3 is actually in the boundaries of this sliding window. So this condition comes out to be true and in the while loop j simply shifts to 44 because our new assumption is 
फोर्टी फोर इज मैक्स इन दिस स्लाइडिंग विंडो सो आई रिमेन्स हियर एंड जे कम्स हियर लाइक दिस एंड नाउ अगेन वी नीड टू कन्फर्म वेदर फोर्टी फोर इज मैक्स इन दिस स्लाइडिंग विंडो और नॉट सो वॉट वी डू इज जे इज पॉइंटिंग टू थर्ड इंडेक्स सो वी सिंपली गो टू द थर्ड इंडेक्स वी फाइंड अ वैल्यू फोर वी चेक वेदर द वैल्यू इज इंडेक्स फॉर विच इज एटी एट डज एटी एट लाई इन दिस स्लाइडिंग विंडो और नॉट सो हियर इफ यू सी एटी एट इज लाइंग इन दिस स्लाइडिंग विंडो बट दिस कंडीशन इज एक्चुअली हेल्पिंग अस फिगर दैट आउट फोर शुड बी लेस देन वैल्यू ऑफ आई इज टू टू प्लस थ्री फोर शुड बी लेस देन फाइव सो दिस कंडीशन कम्स आउट टू बी ट्रू इट सजेस्ट दैट द नेक्स्ट रेटर एलिमेंट टू फोर्टी फोर विच इज दैट इंडेक्स फोर हियर इज ऑल्सो पार्ट ऑफ दिस स्लाइडिंग विंडो सो द कंडीशन इन वाइल्ड लुक कम्स आउट टू बी ट्रू एंड अवर अजम्पन दैट फोर्टी फोर इज मैक्स कम्स आउट टू बी फॉल्स सो नाउ जे विल सिंपली शिफ्ट टू एटी एट वाई दिस असाइनमेंट एंड नाउ वंस अगेन वी नीड टू कन्फर्म वेदर एटी एट इज मैक्स इन दिस स्लाइडिंग विंडो और नॉट If we go to this index, you will see the value is six, which suggests that for eighty-eight there are no greater element towards its right because the last index is five, and therefore we were storing array dot length here, which suggests that there are no elements greater than eighty-eight. So here this condition six should be less than five comes out to be false. So this while loop will terminate, and we will simply add eighty-eight into the result list like this. So for the third window, eighty-eight becomes the max. Will increment i, and i is actually equal to array dot length minus k, which is three. So this loop will run one more time because the sliding window will shift by one position, and now it will cover all the elements of the array. We assume forty-four is max. So j is pointing to forty-four. we go to this index we see the next greater to 44 is lying at index 4 which is 88 here so we are simply checking whether 44 is max in this sliding window or not so this will give us value 4 we are checking whether it is less than i plus k which is 3 plus 3 4 is less than 6 so this condition comes out to be true because Because 88 is next greater to 44 and it is lying in this range, so therefore J simply shift to 88 now via this assignment, like this. And now we'll again confirm whether 88 is max in this sliding window or not. So we go to this index, we find six, we check whether it is less than i plus k, which is three plus three. So this condition comes out to be false. It suggests that the next greater element to 88 is beyond the boundaries of this array, and our sliding window is still the last index. So our answer is 88. So this while loop will terminate, and to the result list, we will add array of j, which is 88. So 88 comes here. So we'll increment i. So i will come here. But here you can see, this condition comes out to be false because there is no more window left of size three. So therefore, the for loop will terminate, and at the end we will return our result list storing the max in the sliding window, which is seventy-seven, seventy-seven, eighty-eight, eighty-eight. So the first seventy-seven is from here to here, which is this value. The second seventy-seven is from Here to here, the eighty-eight is from this window to this window, and the last eighty-eight is for last window, which is from here to here. So, friends, this was all about the sliding window maximum problem. I hope you must have liked this video. In case if you are new to my channel, then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update. Thanks, have a nice day. Hello, everyone. So in this video we are going to discuss a problem maximum sum sub array of size k now let's move ahead and see what this problem is and how to solve this 
So here in this problem, we are given an array of integers like this, and we are given a value of k which is an integer value. Now this k value you can treat it as a sliding window of size k. Now this sliding window is moving from very left of the array to very right, and it is moving one one position in this direction. So at the start, if the value of k is three, it means the sliding window is taking in first three elements. and this three elements also form a sub array of size k now our task is to find maximum sum of any contiguous sub array of size k now contiguous means that the element should be next to each other and we need to take a sub array of size k only we need to evaluate their sum and whichever sub array has the maximum sum we need to return that sum so let's say if you are given With this input array, and sliding window is of size k, which is three. So our output would be sixteen. Now how this sixteen came is. Let's say our first contiguous sub array of size k is from zero index to second index. So it is zero, one, two, three, four, and five. From zero to two, we have a window of size k. This is our sub array, and the elements are contiguous to each other. Now if we take the sum of these three elements. we will get a value 12 now after that what we do is we move the sliding window to right by one position so 2 goes out of the sliding window and 5 comes into the sliding window so now our three elements are this 7 3 and 5 if we do the sum of these three elements we get the sum as 15 then we move the sliding window ahead by one position so 7 goes out of the sliding window and it comes into the sliding window so now this is our sliding window if we do sum of this three elements we get sum as 16 and at the end the sliding window moves by one position and reaches to the end of the array and this is our sliding window if we do sum of the three elements the sum is 14 so here you can see we had six elements and if our sliding window is of size 3 we saw there were four sub arrays of size 3 from 0 to 2 from 1 to 3 from 2 to 4 and from 3 to 5 and their sums are 12 15 16 and 14 so among this four sums 16 is the max so our answer should be 16 it means we are telling that we have found one sub array having three elements 3 5 and 8 if we do their sum we get a maximum sum of 16 and here window size is whatever the value of k so friends now let's move ahead and see that how we can solve this problem so let's suppose we take this array and value of k is 3 it means the sliding window size is 3 and it also means that at a time we can only see three elements in the array and for those three elements we do their sum and we keep on doing their sum for all the sliding windows and whichever sum is the maximum we simply return that sum now here you can see one way to solve this problem is let's say we take a for loop and inside there we take another for loop so the outer for loop let's say it's point to zero index and the inner for loop will take three elements because value of k is 3 so it takes 2 7 and 3 and do their sum So let's say j goes from zero to two and do their sum. So we get a value as twelve. Now after evaluating the first window, I will simply travel to this index, and j will take the next three elements. So this, this, and this. If we do their sum, we get fifteen. And similarly, it keeps on going till I reaches here. for the last window and do the sum and as we are evaluating the sum for each window like this we compare that which is the maximum sum and at the end we simply return that sum so for 3 5 and 8 this window the sum would be maximum which is 16 so if we solve the algorithm using two for loops this problem is very easy to solve So this solution is roughly time complexity of O into n into k.
because we are traversing the array and each time we are taking k elements so the time complexity is o of nk so this time complexity is not efficient we need to solve this problem in better time complexity let's say of o of n so if i remove everything so here with this approach i was here and then we picked three elements did their sum and then we moved i here and we then picked the three elements so here if you see that for the first sliding window 7 and 3 were part of the sum for next sliding window this sliding window 7 and 3 were part of the sum again and only 5 was included and 2 was excluded so we did the sum again for these two elements and similarly for the second window we took the sum of 7 3 and 5 like this but when we went to the third window we again took the sum of 3 5 so this much part we are doing the sum again in the for loop so this is actually increasing our time complexity now how to solve this problem in a better time complexity is here you can see what we do is as we need to take the sub array and it should be of size k so for the first window we take the sum directly we simply add 2 7 and 3 and we get sum as 12 so this is our first window where we do the sum directly now what happens is we shift the window to right by one position because we need to take now the next sub array from index 1 to 3 so when we do this shifting what happens is the window in blue becomes our new window and the window in yellow was our old window but here you can see in both this window 7 and 3 were included in the sum so let's say if we do 2 plus 7 plus 3 we get 12 and then we shift the window ahead we do 7 plus 3 plus 5 and we get sum as 15 so here you can see with this nested for loops we were evaluating this sum again which was in the middle of both the windows now if we stop calculating this sum again and again we will get a better time complexity here you can see when window was here we did a normal sum because we need at least k size window so at the start we are doing the sum normally 2 plus 7 plus 3 we got 12 now when this window shifted ahead for the next sum here you can see two goes out of the window so if you see the blue window two went out of the window and five comes into the window so five comes into the blue area and two went out of the blue area because our current window is from index 1 to 3 of size k now here you can see we know the sum of first three elements which is 12 now as we are moving window ahead two goes out of the window we know that sum is 12 if we do minus 2 our sum will be 10 which is the sum of these two elements and if we add only 5 to it we get 15 which is the sum of our next three elements which is in the blue area so using this property will reduce the time complexity of the algorithm so now what we do is we simply perform three steps first we take sum of first k elements which is 2 plus 7 plus 3 so let's say it give value as 12 now as we are shifting the window to the next element so that we can evaluate the next window sum what we do is we don't have to recalculate 7 plus 3 plus 5 what we can do is we already know 7 plus 3 is already in the sum in the 12 we just subtract the element going out of the sliding window so the element which is going out of the sliding window is 2 so we are subtracting 2 to get the sum of the remaining elements in the previous window which is 7 plus 3 which is 10 and the third step is as 5 is getting into the window here we simply add the new element coming in the sliding window so we are simply adding 5 which is our new element to 10 to get 15 So if you see 7 plus 3 plus 5 will give 15, which is the sum of our 
next window which starts from 1 to 3 and similarly this window goes on like this one one element goes out of the window and new element comes into the window so the element which is going out of the window we simply subtract from the sum and the new element which is coming into the window we simply add that we also compare 12 with 15 then with 16 then with 14 and at the end we will figure out that 16 is the maximum sum in the sub array of size k so this would be our answer and also friends here you can see the value of k is 3 which is very small so here you can see these are only two elements coming let's say value is k is 100 so if one element goes out of the stack we don't have to calculate the 99 element sum again and again we can simply subtract one element and add another element and we will get the sum of the next 100 elements so this makes our algorithm efficient now let's move ahead and see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step so before we start if you want to master data structures and algorithm then you can subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update so here is the algorithm the method name is max sub array sum which takes in the array and a value k which is the size of our window so this is our array and value of k is 3 it means we are taking a sliding window of size 3 as we want to evaluate the maximum sum in a sub array of size k we create an integer variable max sum because we need to return a integer value from this method so here at the end we will return the max sum so we initialize a variable max sum with 0 then we create a variable window sum so as we want to take the sum of sliding window of size k so let's say this is a sliding window of size k so for this three elements whatever their sum will be we store in the window sum and similarly for the next window sum we store in the window sum so we create a variable window sum having value 0 at the start now we create an integer value start which will start from the 0 index so this value is basically an index value like this that the initial value is 0 for start variable we will see its significance later that why we have created this start and now we provide a for loop and inside this for loop we will do the window sum we will compare the window sum of different windows of size k and whichever is the maximum sum we simply evaluate here so what we do is we take an integer variable end we initialize it with 0 and this end will go till array dot length so array dot length will be 6 so end will go till the last index which is fifth index so here end will start from the zero index so in our previous slide we discussed the three steps the first step is we simply take the sum of first k elements because the first window is of size k so at the start we need to include the first k elements so that we can get a sum so here you can see the first window of size k will go from index 0 to 2 so it means for this window we will straight away calculate the sum because we need to return the maximum sum of a sub array of size k so we need at least k elements to evaluate the sum and then compare with the next windows so this if condition if you see here will help us achieving that so value of end which is 0 is less than 6 so this condition comes out to be true now to our window sum as we need to evaluate the sum of first three elements this will get stored in the window sum because this is our first window so what we do is to window sum we add array of end which is the first element which is 2 so here initially the value of window sum is 0 plus we are doing array of end which is 2 we are adding the first element and assigning it to window sum so window sum will become 2 like this and here you can see 
that we need to evaluate the sum of first k elements. So this condition, if and is greater than or equal to k minus one, it means we are saying k minus one is two because value of k is three. If and is equal to two or greater than two, then this if condition will come out to be true. So at the start, value of and is zero. So zero is not greater than two or equal to two. So it means this if condition comes out to be false, and this if block won't get executed. So here you can see if and comes to index two here, at that moment two will be. This condition will come out to be true. So it means when and has reached here, we have evaluated the sum of first k elements already. Here we added the first element, then we will add seven, and then we will add three. So at that moment and will be at index two. And when and will reach here, then only our main algorithm will run, and then it will keep on running for every window. We will see that later. So currently, this condition comes out to be false because zero is not greater than equal to two. We will increment and. So and comes to index one. We take window sum two. We add array of and, which is seven. And we will assign it back to window sum, so window sum will become nine. Now this is the sum of first two elements. We need at least first k elements to start comparing for the maximum sum. So this condition, one is greater than equal to two, still comes out to be false. We will increment and and comes to index two. We take window sum which is nine. We simply add three to it, so it becomes twelve, like this. And now here you can see that our first sliding window is from index zero to two. It means we have taken the sum of first k elements, which is two plus seven plus three, which is twelve. And now here you can see, and is it index two? So value of and is two. And it is greater than or equal to k minus one, which is three minus one, which is two. So this condition comes out to be true. So now if block gets executed, so here as we have calculated the sum of first k elements, it means we know the sum of first sliding window of size k, which is twelve. At the start, max sum is zero. So now what we do is we simply compare max sum and window sum, and which is the maximum. Between these two, we simply assign to max sum. So here, what we are doing is, as we have calculated the sum of first k element, which is the first window. Initially, max sum is zero. So you can think of this condition is like we are doing if window sum is greater than max sum, then to max sum we are assigning window sum. Like this. So currently, max sum is zero, window sum is twelve. So window sum is greater than max sum. So this tells us that we need to discard this max sum, and our new max sum will become twelve. So max sum value will become twelve, like this. So as we discussed in our previous slide, that after evaluating the sum of first k elements, this sliding window will shift ahead to get. The sum of next k elements, so two will go out of the window and five will come into the window. So we also know that the second step we discussed that we need to subtract the element which goes out of the window. So here we are doing the same, and here you can see this start is actually helping us to know which is that first element of that window. We know that start. We initialize with the zero, and end move till the index two. So if you see, our window is from start to end, having three elements. Now when this window will shift ahead, at whichever value start is pointing, that will go out of the sliding window, which means two will go out of the sliding window. So what we are doing is, we are not recalculating the sum now. So here now what we are doing is, we are simply subtracting the element which is going out of the sliding window. So we are taking the window sum and we are simply subtracting 
द एलिमेंट विच इज एट स्टार्ट इंडेक्स विच इज टू सो ओवर विंडो सम विल बिकम ट्वेल्व माइनस टू विच इज टेन लाइक दिस एंड दिस विंडो सम विल हैव द सम ऑफ दिस टू एलिमेंट्स सो फॉर द नेक्स्ट विंडो वी डोंट हैव टू कैलकुलेट दिस विंडो सम अगेन वी कैन सिंपली रीयूज दैट सो नाउ एस टू वेंट आउट ऑफ द स्लाइडिंग विंडो सो फॉर द नेक्स्ट स्लाइडिंग विंडो इट विल स्टार्ट फ्रॉम इंडेक्स वन सो वी सिंपली इंक्रीमेंट स्टार्ट सो स्टार्ट कम्स एट इंडेक्स वन विल इंक्रीमेंट एंड एंड कम्स टू इंडेक्स थ्री विच सजेस्ट दैट नाउ अवर न्यू विंडो विल बी फ्रॉम स्टार्ट टू एंड like this which means this three elements and we know that when we shifted this window here two went out of the window and five came into the window so here you can see five came into the window so our third step was we add the element which comes in so we are simply adding five to our previous evaluated window sum which is 10 so it becomes 15 it means with just one sum we now have the sum of these three elements we didn't evaluate it 7 plus 3 again we just added 5 to our previous calculated sum which give us 15 this condition comes out to be true because value of end is 3 3 is greater than equal to 2 and here you can see our window sum is 15 max sum is 12 we simply compare these two values and if window sum value is greater than max sum we simply assign that value to max sum so here we are taking these two values which is 12 and 15 and whichever is the max among these two we are assigning it to max sum because we need to return the maximum sum of a sub array of size k so we just evaluated the sum of second sub array of size k and we simply compared it with the max sum so we got 15 from this sub array so our max sum will become 15 from this statement like this and now after we did the sum of this sliding window from here to here we know that now this sliding window will move ahead and 7 will go out of the sliding window which is which is the element to which start is pointing so this will go out of the window and we know that we need to subtract the element which goes out of the sliding window so that for the next sliding window we can evaluate the sum easily so window sum is 15 we do minus 7 so it will give 8 and once 7 will go out of the sliding window we know that now next sliding window will start from index 2 so we do start plus plus so start will come at index 2 we will increment end end comes to index 4 which means now our window will start from index 2 to 4 like this now yes 7 was excluded from the sliding window and 8 was included in the sliding window because this sliding window shifted by one position so 3 and 5 remained there and 8 was included we know that we need to add that value which comes in so here we are doing the same thing we are adding the value 8 into the previous calculated sum so 8 plus 8 will give 16 this condition is true because 4 is greater than equal to 2 the max sum is 15 and this window has a sum of 16 8 plus 5 plus 3 will give 16 we know that we have found one window whose sum is 16 which is greater than the previous max sum so whichever value is greater among this two values we simply assign to max sum so max sum will become 16 now we are done with this window so now for the next window three will go out of the sliding window and one will come into the sliding window so if three is going out of the sliding window we are taking the sum which is 16 and we simply subtract three so it becomes 13 and as our new sliding window will start from index 3 we simply do start plus plus so start comes at index 3 we'll increment end end comes to index 5 it means now our sliding window is from index 3 to 5 this is our last sliding window and one was added to this sliding window so we simply do window sum which is 13 plus 
which gives 14. We assign this 14 back to window sum. So window sum will become 14. This condition is true because value of end which is 5 is greater than equal to 2. Now our max sum is 16 and window sum is 14. So here you can see the max sum is 16, window sum is 14. So we already have a maximum value in max sum. So max sum will remain to the 16 only because 14 is less than max sum. And now for the next sliding window, we simply remove phi from the sum. So it becomes 9. We do start plus plus because next window will start from index 4. But here you can see if we do end plus plus, so end will go out of the boundaries of this array, which also suggests that there is no window left of size k now. So therefore this for loop will terminate. And here you can see at the end we are returning the max sum as 16. So which is our answer? So which came from this sub array of size k? 3 plus 5, 8, 8 plus 8, 16. So friends here you can see we used only one for loop and we evaluated the maximum sum of a sub array of size k. We need to keep these three steps in mind that at the start we do the sum of first k elements and then based on this condition we do our rest of the steps that one element goes out of the window and one element comes into the window. So the element which goes out of the window which is array of start we subtract from the window sum and in the next iteration of for loop which is our next window we simply add the element which just comes into the sliding window and therefore this property help us in evaluating the sum in a very efficient way. We don't have to recalculate the sum of every k elements. So friends this was all about the problem. I hope you must have liked this video. In case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update. Thanks have a nice day. Hello everyone. So in this video we are going to discuss a problem longest substring without repeating characters. So let's move ahead and see what this problem is and how to solve this. So in this problem we are given a string like this. Our task is to find the length of longest substring without repeating characters. So first of all let's understand what is a substring. So let's suppose if we are given a string like this. Test. So here a substring is a part of the string in which we will take out the sequence of characters and those sequence of characters should be contiguous. It means they should be next to each other. So the property a substring has is first it should lie within the string. So it lies within the string. Second the sequence of characters which we are taking those should be contiguous. which means they should be next to each other. So for example if we want to find that how many substrings are there in this string. So if we start from t, one substring would be t, other would be te, tes, test. Here you can see this substring should be within the string and it should be contiguous. It means they should lie next to each other. So we can't take a substring like tt, one t here and another t here we need to take a part of a string which is contiguous. So if we start from E, it would be E, ES, EST. If we take it from S, it would be S, ST. And if we take the last T, it would be like this. So if the length of the string is let's say N, so the total number of substring would be N into N plus 1 by 2. So here N is 4. So if we put 4 here, we will get 4 into 4 plus 1 by 2, which is 4 into 5 by 2, which is 10. So here you can see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So we need to keep in mind a substring should lie within the string and the part of the string that we are taking, 
इट शुड बी कंटिन्यूस सो अवर टास्क इज टू फाइंड द लेंथ ऑफ द लॉन्गेस्ट सब स्ट्रिंग इन सच ए वे दैट कैरेक्टर शुड नॉट बी रिपीटेड सो इफ यू टेक दिस एग्जाम्पल हियर ए बी सी एज लेंथ थ्री बट एज सुन एज ए कम्स वी गेट अ रिपीटिंग कैरेक्टर सो वी डिस्कार्ड दिस ए एंड इफ यू टेक बी सी ए द लेंथ इज थ्री बिकॉज आफ्टर डेट वी हैव फाउंड वन बी एंड बी इज रिपीटिंग इन बी सी ए सो वी डिस्कार्ड दिस बी नाउ वी स्टार्ट फ्रॉम सी so c a and b length is 3 we can't move ahead because we have found a repeating character c so we discard this c and then we find a b c and again we find a b so length remains 3 so after we find this b we can discard this a and b together because they won't contribute to the longest substring now so c and b will take two characters and then we find a repeating character so we discard this c and b and at the end we will find one b so the length of the longest substring without repeating character is 3 it can be found from a b c b c a c a b a b c that's it because after that we are getting a substring of length 2 like b c c b and at the end we are getting only one b similarly in this example we have a string b b b b so the longest substring without repeating character would be 1 because all the characters are repeating here pw becomes 2 because we have found one w here which is repeating so we'll discard this p and w then we'll go here and then we will find one w so this length is 3 and as soon as we find w we discard this w and then we start our substring from k we will find k e w which is length 3 So the length of the longest substring without repeating character is three. So let's move ahead and see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step. So before we start, in case if you are new to my channel, then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update. So here is the algorithm to find the length of the longest substring without repeating characters. So method name is length of longest substring. It takes in a string s. and returns the length of the longest substring without repeating characters so let's say when we call this method by passing this string so s will become like this p w w k e w so if we see this string internally it will be a character array like this so friends the basic idea behind this algorithm is we create a hash map like this where key is the character and value is the integer So here as we need to find the length of the longest substring without repeating characters what we are doing is we will store the character along with its index into this map so that when we encounter a repeating character we simply look up into this hash map and we simply figure out that when that repeating character last occurred so that we can start our new substring search from a index just after that so you will understand more later in the algorithm as we want to return the length of the longest substring without repeating characters we will be storing it in the max length so at the start max length will be 0 like this so as we want to identify the length of the longest substring without repeating characters we will process each character one by one from left to right so let's say if we take these two characters p and w so the length of this substring is 2 So in this algorithm we will take the help of two variables start and end so this start and end will be actually referring to the indexes so let's say for p w let's say start is here and end is here so if you see closely start and end basically forms a window like this which has some characters so this window is starting with this start variable and ending with this end variable and those are pointing to the indexes so if we want to know the length of this substring we can use the formula as end minus start plus 1 as these are pointing to the indexes it would be 1 minus 0 plus 1 so we'll get the answer as 2 which is the length of this substring so you can treat this as a window 
from start to end why we are using this two pointer is we need to identify the length of the longest substring without repeating characters so we need to put start at a point from where we are evaluating the length of the longest substring and we will move end in this direction so that as soon as we encounter a repeating character we stop end there itself and using start and end we can figure out the length of that particular substring with this formula so we will understand more when we proceed ahead so as we haven't processed any of the node so start will point to zero index like this and as we discuss we will move end into this direction and starts from zero because now we are processing this first character and end will go till the last index which is 5 so in the string class we have a method caret where if we pass any index it will return back the character at that particular index so if we call s dot caret 0 because end is at 0 index we will get a value as p which we will be storing in the right care like this so here we are asking the string to return the character at this index which is 0 index which is p and that p we are storing in the right care like this so as end is moving in this direction we have denoted it by right care so now the first thing we do is we simply find whether right care is present in our hash map or not so we provide this if condition map dot contains key where we pass the right care and if the map contains that key it will return true we will understand more about this part later so currently map dot contains key will return false because this key is not present in the hash map so here for the first care we know that it's a substring and it doesn't have any repeating character and we also know that in the hash map we put the care along with its index so we are putting care along with its index so it would look something like this p and we are putting value as 0 which is end so here you can see currently our window is here where start and end are pointing to only single character and our max length is 0 because we haven't processed any character so with this formula we will identify the number of characters in this window so end minus start plus 1 so it would be 0 minus 0 plus 1 so the length of the substring is 1 we are comparing it with max length that whichever is the max we will directly store in the max length because at the end we have to return the max length so for this small substring the max length will become 1 because here it is 0 and this gives value as 1 so whichever is the max we are storing in the max length so we will increment end so why we are incrementing end because with the combination of p and w we can get a substring which is of length 2 and it doesn't have a repeating character so therefore start will remain at index 0 only and we will move only end in this direction so first we will get the character at index 1 now so right care will become w like this we will check whether w is present in this map or not so this condition comes out to be false and we will simply put w along with its index in the hash map so it would look something like this now here max length is 1 and if we use this formula 1 minus 0 plus 1 it will give the value as 2 so here you can see that we have a window of length 2 which is a substring pw which doesn't have a repeating character so this will give value as 2 so now our max length will change it will become 2 will increment end so end will come to index 2 so first we will identify the character at index 2 which is w so right care will become w 
सो फ्रेंड्स यू कैन सी दैट अवर हैश मैप एक्चुअली कंटेंट्स डब्ल्यू सो वेन वी विल कॉल मैप डॉट कंटेंट्स की विल पास द कैरेक्टर एज डब्ल्यू इट विल रिटर्न अ वैल्यू ट्रू सो दिस इफ कंडीशन कम्स आउट टू बी ट्रू बिकॉज वी हैव डब्ल्यू ऑलरेडी इन द हैश मैप इट मीन्स वी हैव फाउंड अ रिपीटिंग कैरेक्टर एंड वी कांट इंक्लूड दिस डब्ल्यू इन टू दिस सब स्ट्रिंग सो यर नाउ वॉट वी डू इज टिल दिस पॉइंट वी हैव फाउंड द लेंथ ऑफ द लॉन्गेस्ट सब स्ट्रिंग एज टू विच इज पी डब्ल्यू बट एज सुन एज वी इंकाउंटर डब्ल्यू वी कांट इंक्लूड दिस डब्ल्यू हियर बिकॉज वी विल हैव अ रिपीटिंग कैरेक्टर सो वी नीड टू मूव दिस स्टार्ट आफ्टर डब्ल्यू सो दैट वी कैन डिस्कार्ड वन ऑफ द डब्ल्यू एंड हाउ वी कैन डू दैट इज एज डब्ल्यू इज प्रेजेंट इन दिस हैश मैप एट इंडेक्स वन वी विल फर्स्ट गेट दैट इंडेक्स इट विल बी वन सो दिस इंडेक्स विल बी रिटर्न एंड वी हैव टू जस्ट स्टार्ट आफ्टर दिस इंडेक्स सो वी विल एड प्लस वन एंड करंटली स्टार्ट इज एट जीरो इंडेक्स सो वी विल टेक द मैक्स ऑफ स्टार्ट एंड दिस वैल्यू सो टू इज ग्रेटर देन जीरो सो नाउ अवर स्टार्ट विल गो टू द इंडेक्स टू लाइक दिस विच सजेस्ट दैट वी हैव फाउंड डब्ल्यू ईयर सो द नेक्स्ट लॉन्गेस्ट सब स्ट्रिंग विल इंक्लूड अनादर डब्ल्यू सो वी नीड टू डिस्कार्ड दिस डब्ल्यू एंड स्टार्ट जस्ट आफ्टर दैट सो देर फॉर वी आर लुकिंग अप इन टू द हैश मैप टू सी वेन दिस डब्ल्यू अकर्ड लास्ट एंड देन वी स्टार्ट फाइंडिंग अ न्यू सब स्ट्रिंग फ्रॉम अ इंडेक्स जस्ट आफ्टर डेट विच इज वन प्लस वन बिकॉज डब्ल्यू वॉज फाउंड एट इंडेक्स वन सो स्टार्ट कम्स हियर सो इट मीन्स वी कैन सिंपली डिस्कार्ड दिस टू कैरेक्टर्स एंड स्टार्ट फाइंडिंग द लेंथ ऑफ द लॉन्गेस्ट सब स्ट्रिंग फ्रॉम इंडेक्स टू नाउ सो एज वी आर स्टार्टिंग फ्रॉम इंडेक्स टू बिकॉज स्टार्ट इज पॉइंटिंग टू इंडेक्स टू वी विल पुट डब्ल्यू अलॉन्ग विथ इट्स इंडेक्स इन द हैश मैप सो दिस वैल्यू विल बी ओवर रिटर्न टू टू and for this single substring we know that max length is 2 which we already found as pw so 2 and minus start plus 1 so 2 minus 2 plus 1 will give 1 so 1 so the length of the longest substring without repeating characters till this point will remain 2 we will increment and and comes to index 3 At index three, we have a character k, so right char will become k. K is not present in this hash map, so this condition comes out to be false. So we will simply put k with index three into our hash map, like this. The max length is two. End is at index three and start is at index two. So three minus two plus one, it will give two. So the max length will still remain two because this part is two. And math dot max will return a maximum value between these two. So two will be assigned to max length like this. Will increment end. End becomes four. The character at fourth index is e. So right char will become e. E is not present in this hash map so this condition comes out to be false so we will put e into this hash map along with its index like this so here you can see max length is 2 and minus 2 plus 1 it will give 3 so this part will give 3 so here you can see we have found one substring w k e without repeating characters which has a length of 3 so therefore now our max length will change because math dot max will return a value 3 when it's compared with 2 so max length will become 3 which suggests that we have found one substring of length 3 without repeating characters will increment and and becomes 5 the character at fifth index is w so right char will become w so friends here you can see that w is present in this hash map so this condition comes out to be true and here what we are doing is with this map dot get right char we are just figuring out 
that when this w occurred last in this character array so this hash map will bring us that index that w occurred at index 2 so which suggests that whatever the substring we found till this point we can't include w because if we include w that will be a repeating character so in order to include w for the rest of the string we have to discard this w so for that we need to know the index so when we identify that index we simply shift start to a character ahead then what we find from this map dot get right care so here it gives 2 so we simply just shift by one position by adding plus 1 start was at 2 so map dot max among 2 and 3 will give value as 3 so start will now come to index 3 like this we suggest that our new substring should start from this index so now we simply put w into the hash map along with its index so the index value will be updated here it will become 5 and here you can see max length is 3 and minus start plus 1 so 5 minus 3 plus 1 will give 3 so this comes out to be 3 which suggests that one more substring is kew which is longest and without any repeating character but among this two lengths both are same so the max length will still remain 3 only so now we'll increment and so end goes beyond the boundaries of this char array so this for loop will terminate because end should go till it is less than s dot length so at the end we will simply return a value 3 so friend let's suppose here if we had a value like a so this for loop would have run one more time so here this a is not in this hash map so we simply put a here like this a with the index 6 and here our max length would have changed initially it was 3 and minus start so 6 minus 3 plus 1 would have given 4 so this would have become 4 and our answer would have become 4 which would suggest that the longest substring without repeating character is kewa so friend this was all about this problem we can solve this problem by keeping a sliding window of variable size which has a range from start to end and whatever the characters are between start to end those number of characters will give the length of that particular window and we can use this hash map to figure out the repeating characters so that we can start our new window from a different index by making a lookup into the hash map for the character which just got repeated so friends one important thing to discuss is that why we are using math.max and we are taking whichever is the max from the start and from this statement so in order to understand this let's suppose we are given with this string pwwp so the example which we took was like this so in our previous example till this point everything remains the same the wb placed last in the hash map at index 2 and after that we went to k so instead of k now we are going to p so we will see what the difference is so when we will increment end end will come to index 3 so here instead of k now we are taking the right char as p by this and here you can see that map actually contains p at index 0 so this condition comes out to be true so friends here you can see that if we only provide this condition if we do map dot get right care will get value as 0 and if we add plus 1 to it will get 1 so we can't discard this p and start from index 1 because then our substring will have wwp and here currently the max length is 2 so when we will do end minus start plus 1 so end is 3 and this start will come here so minus 1 plus 1 so our answer will be 3 so at the end we will return max length as 3 so which is wrong because here we are playing with the indexes and this algorithm doesn't know that we have encountered a w here and this 
is a substring with a repeated character. So one thing to keep in mind is, if our start is at index 2, and we have found one character, which is at index 3, and when we look up this character in the hash map, if that character comes beyond our start, which is the current case at 0, so this p last occurred at index 0. So we don't have to consider this p or this index because currently we are processing this substring from start to end and this p has occurred in this region. So therefore if we do map.get right care, we get index 0. If we add plus 1, we get this index 1. But our start is already at index 2 here. So therefore we are doing this math.max because we have to assign the maximum value between these two statements to start. So if start is already ahead of this statement, then we don't shift start back. We keep the start at that point only. So this is the one important thing to consider for this algorithm. Now after this statement start remains at index 2 and we simply put 3 here and here the max length is 2. If we do end minus start plus 1, we will get 3 minus 2 plus 1, which is equal to 2. So this is the length of that substring. So when we will do math.max, our answer will be still 2. Because here you can see the longest substring without repeating character is 2. This or this. So therefore this is the important condition to keep in mind. So friends, I hope you must have liked this video. In case if you are new to my channel, then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update. Thanks, have a nice day. Hello everyone. So in this video, we are going to discuss a problem, symmetric tree. So let's move ahead and see what this problem is and how to solve this. So in this problem, we are given with a root of a binary tree like this which actually holds this complete tree. Now our task is to check that whether this binary tree is mirror of itself, which means we need to check whether this binary tree is symmetric around its center or not. So let's suppose we are given with this binary tree and we need to check whether it's a symmetric tree or not. So for this binary tree, if we draw a line like this, so this line is nothing but a line of symmetry. So around this line, if a binary tree is a mirror image of itself, then we consider that binary tree as a symmetric binary tree. So usually when we talk about symmetrical images, let's say if I take a rectangle and if I want to find out whether it's a symmetrical image or not, what we can do is we can create a line of symmetry and if we rotate the image like this around this line of symmetry, Let's say I denote this as A, B, C and D. So if we rotate this image around this line of symmetry, you will see that A will come over B and C will come over D. So if that is the case, then this shape is a symmetrical shape. So if any shape is rotated around its line of symmetry, if the left part superimposes the right part, then that shape is a symmetrical shape. So here you can see for this binary tree, the line of symmetry goes from the root and we have to determine whether this binary tree is a mirror of itself. That is, we need to check whether it's symmetric around its center. So this is the center. So if we rotate this binary tree, you will see that after the rotation, 2 will come over this 2, this 4 will come over this 4 and this 3 will come over this tree. So we can come to know that this binary tree is symmetric around its center because one will remain there itself. And if we take this example, here you can see that 2 will superimpose 2. But as we are rotating this binary tree around the line of symmetry, when this 2 will superimpose this 2, this 3 will come like this. It will not superimpose this 3. So therefore, this is not a symmetric binary tree because as we are folding this binary tree around this line of symmetry, when this 2 will superimpose this 2, this child at right will come towards the left of it 
and so this three is not superimposing this three. So therefore, we can consider that it's not a symmetrical shape. Also, one thing to note here is the symmetrical shape is actually equidistant from the line of symmetry. So this two and this two both are at a equal distance from the line of symmetry. This four and this four both are equidistant from the line of symmetry, and similarly this three and this three. But here you can see this two and this two are equidistant from the line of symmetry. This node three and this node three are not equidistant from the line of symmetry. Therefore, it's not a symmetric binary tree. So, friends, the basic idea behind this algorithm is: if I remove this, so let's say if we are on root, and this root has only one tree node, like this. So, therefore, we can directly consider that it's a symmetric binary tree because we need to find whether the binary tree is symmetric around its center. So, this is the center. If this root is null then also we will return true that it's a symmetric binary tree so here now if binary tree is given like this so after the root if we are going on the left so we will reach to this node and if we look into the mirror then this left should be equal to this right so that we can come to know that till this point the image is symmetric now when we reach here and here if we are going towards left then in the mirror it would look like we are going like this towards right so we land here we compare these values and we know that till this point also the tree is symmetric now if we go towards right so in the mirror it would look like we are going towards the left and we reach to node 4 and we compare its values so those are same so 2 is equal to 2 3 is equal to 3 and 4 is equal to 4 and after that there are no more nodes so we can consider that this is a symmetric binary tree so here let's say if we are going towards left then in the mirror we are going towards right so we reach here we compare those values they are equal so now here we have a null value if we are going towards left then in the mirror image we are going towards the right so here we have reached to the null value but here we have reached to a actual node having value as 3 so when we will compare them they won't be equal so we can directly come to know that this is not a symmetric binary tree so one property to remember is if we have mirror here and if we are going towards left then in the mirror image you are going towards right and if we are going towards right then in the mirror image we are going towards left so similar technique we will apply over the binary tree to figure out whether it's a symmetric or not so now let's move ahead and see the demonstration of this algorithm step by step so let's say if we are given with this binary tree and we need to check whether it is symmetric or not so when we will call this method is symmetric by passing in the root it would look like this that root is pointing to this binary tree and this method will return a boolean value stating that this binary tree is symmetric or not so here the first thing we check that whether root is equal to null or not so if root is equal to null then we can directly return true because there is no binary tree and there is no node so the binary tree is actually symmetric around its center so we are returning true so this condition comes out to be false because root is pointing to a node having value as 1 so friends we will use stack data structure to figure out whether this binary tree is symmetric or not so here we will initialize a stack like this so stack is a lifo data structure where the element inserted last will be the first to be removed and we will use this property to figure out whether the binary tree is symmetric or not so we will see that later so here you can see if root is not equal to null it means there is one node till this point the tree is symmetric and let's say if i draw the line of symmetry 
like this. So we know one of the property of this line of symmetry is, let's say on this side, if we are going towards right, then in the mirror image it would look like that we are going in this direction. And similarly if we are going in this direction, then in the mirror image it would look like we are going in this direction. So therefore in the stack what we are doing is, we are pushing root dot right, which is 2. So it means if we look into its mirror image, then we need to put this 2 into the stack as well. Because we know that on this side if we are going towards right, it means on this side we are going in this direction. So therefore we need to compare this 2 with this 2. So if we are going towards right on this side of mirror, then we are going towards left on this side of mirror. So we are putting both the 2's into the stack so that we can pop them out in pair and compare them. So this thing we will do in the while loop. We will check whether stack is empty or not. So currently stack is not empty. So the condition in while loop comes out to be true. So here this two. So here first we place the right one. So this is the right one and this is the left one. So we will create two nodes n1 and n2. We will pop the nodes from the stack and assign it to n1 and n2. So first we'll pop 2 out which is on the left side and assign it to n1. Then we will pop the right one and assign it to n2. So after getting n1 and n2, we need to compare these two nodes now. So the first thing we are checking is whether n1 and n2 both are null at the same time or not. So if both n1 and n2 are null simultaneously, then we will continue with the while loop. So let's say this is our line of symmetry and let's say this is our node 1 and this is our node 2. So here both of them are null. It means the symmetric property holds true for both of this node. So we will simply continue. But here you can see n1 is pointing to 2, n2 is pointing to 2. So both of this condition comes out to be false. And then this condition is very important because it will directly return false that whether the tree is symmetric or not. So here we check that whether n1 is equal to null and n2 is equal to null. So if both of the conditions are true that n1 is null and n2 is null, so we can continue. So if this condition comes out to be false, which suggests that there could be a chance that either n1 or n2 can be null. So if n1 is null, we directly return false. Because here we have already checked whether n1 and n2 both are null simultaneously or not. So if this condition came out to be false, we are simply checking first that if n1 is equal to null, then we can directly return false. Or if n2 is equal to null, we can directly return false. Because this two cannot be null simultaneously based on this condition. Or if their values are not equal. So currently n1 is not equal to null, n2 is not equal to null n1 dot well which is 2 is actually equal to n2 dot well. So this condition also comes out to be false which proves that till this point the tree is symmetric and this 2 and this 2 are actually equidistant from the line of symmetry. So we simply move ahead and now what we do is as we are on n1 and we are done checking these two nodes n1 and n2. Now what we do is if we want to proceed ahead in the binary tree to figure out the rest of the elements are symmetric or not, we know that if we are going towards left from this 2 to 3, then in the mirror image it would look like we are going towards right. And if we are going towards right, then in the mirror image it would look like we are going towards left. So these two nodes are symmetric. So now we have to compare n1's left with n2's right and n1's right with n2's left and if those are equal then we keep on doing this thing till the complete binary tree is empty. So here in the stack what we are doing is we are pushing n1's left which is 3. So this is the first node like this and as we need to put them in pairs so that we can pop them out and compare. With n1's left, we need to put n2's right. 
like this. So n two's right is three. So this is second. And then we will put n one's right, which is null. And along with we will push n two's left, which is the mirror image of n one's right. So null will come like this. This is the fourth push. Stack is not empty. So now we will pop in pairs and we will compare them. So when we will do stack dot pop, fourth node null will be popped out, which is n two's left, which is four. So n one will point to n two's left. Like this, and then we will pop one more element, which is three, which is n one's right. So n two will point to n one's right, like this. So here you can see that now we are actually comparing the mirror images nodes, comparing n one and n two, which are actually symmetric nodes across this line of symmetry. So if n one is null. And n two is null, then we will simply continue. So currently n one is null and n two is null. So which proves that till this point, the tree is symmetric. So we will continue. Stack is still not empty. We will pop the node, which is n two's right. So now n one will point to n two's right, which is this node. And then we'll pop one more node, which is n one's left. So n two will point to n one's left. And now we'll simply compare them. So here you can see that we are using the stack data structure, which is popping the elements in pairs, and we have pushed in such a way that this is the line of symmetry. That if we are pushing any node in the left side, then in the mirror image, we have to push. the right side node so that we can compare them and come to know that whether they are symmetric or not so n1 is not equal to null and n2 is also not equal to null here you can see n1 is not equal to null or n2 is also not equal to null n1 dot val is 3 n2 dot val is 3 so 3 not equal to 3 comes out to be false because 3 is equal to 3 so this condition comes out to be false so it means that till this point the tree is symmetric and now what we do is we perform the same steps on this node and this node so first we will push n one's left so n one's left like this so if we are pushing n one's left we are going to the left so on this side we have to take its corresponding node on the right side like this So we are putting n two's right, which is also null. Then we will push n one's right, which is this null. And correspondingly, we have to push n two's left, like this. Stack is not empty. We will pop this null value, which is n two's left. And assign it to n one. So n one will come to n two's left, like this. We will pop this null, which is n one's right. So n two will come to previous n one's right here. So here you can see n one is equal to null and n two is equal to null at the same time. So therefore, we will simply continue. Stack is still not empty. So now we will pop both the nulls. So first we will pop n two's right. So n one will point to previous n two's right, which is this. And we will pop this null also, which is n one's left. So previous n one was here. Its left is this. So n two will point to previous n one's left. n1 is null and n2 is null simultaneously so therefore this condition comes out to be true 
so we'll simply continue which suggests that this null and this null is symmetric this null and this null is symmetric stack is empty it means there are no more nodes in the binary tree to be traversed so we'll simply return true stating that across this line of symmetry this binary tree is symmetric so friend let's suppose we are given with this binary tree now this is the line of symmetry and we need to check whether this binary tree is symmetric or not so we will perform the same steps till this while loop root is not equal to null we will create a stack root is not equal to null so we will push roots right on this side along with roots left which is a mirror image of this node in this side so two will come and this two will come stack is not empty we will pop two from the stack and assign to n1 like this we will pop another two and assign it to n2 like this n1 is not equal to null and n2 is also not equal to null so this condition comes out to be false n1 is not equal to null n2 is not equal to null n1 dot well which is 2 is equal to n2 dot well so this condition also comes out to be false and then we will simply push n one's left which is null so till this point the tree is symmetric and for this node and this node we have to check whether its child are symmetric or not so if we are putting the left part on the stack then on this side we are actually pushing n two's right which is three and then we are pushing n one's right which is three and its corresponding n two's left like this stack is not empty we will pop null n two's left so n one will come to n two's left here we will pop this three which is n one's right so n two will go to n one's right like this so n1 is equal to null and n2 is not equal to null so one of them is null but other is not null so we can't continue so this condition comes out to be false now here you can see as we need to compare these two nodes and they should be equal this condition proves that n1 and n2 both are not null but there could be a chance that n1 is null or n2 is null so if any of the node came out to be null we can directly return false because instead of null we actually need a node 3 here so that this binary tree can be symmetric till this point but as it's a null value here so this condition comes out to be true and as it's a or operator here we can directly return false so from here only we will return false stating that this is not a symmetric binary tree so friend this was all about the symmetric binary tree i hope you must have liked this video in case if you are new to my channel then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss any update thanks have a nice day